This is Audible. This is Secret Puck, Campus Nights, Book One, written by Rebecca Jenshack, narrated by Joe Arden and Vanessa Edwin. August, Chapter One, Ginny. What are you doing here? I ask my brother through a small crack in the door. He leans his large frame against it, widening the gap and keeping me from closing it on him. I'm checking on my favorite sister. I'm your only sister. He pushes a big shoulder against it, and I give up on trying to keep him out. Crossing the small dorm room in three steps, I resume my position on the bed. Have you left the dorm at all this weekend? He follows me and takes a seat at the end of my bed. Hey, Ava. My roommate Ava is on the phone with her boyfriend, Trent, but waves and blushes when Adam acknowledges her. I'm enjoying my last days of summer vacation, I tell him as I pull my hair down from the messy bun and attempt to make it look like I haven't been rocking this same hairstyle for three days. It's the day before classes start, and the only things going on around campus are parties and new student activities, neither of which have sounded appealing enough to get dressed and leave my room. He picks up the package of cheese and peanut butter crackers I'd been devouring when he knocked. This looks like the opposite of fun. And you bailed on my party last night. A party with a bunch of your teammates? Yeah, no thanks. You can't sit in here moping forever. Brian did you a favor. Long-distance relationships in college suck. Next to no one survives them. Plus, the guy was a tool anyway. Don't let it ruin college. College is awesome. My heart cracks a little more at the reminder that my ex-boyfriend, who should be with me at Valley's starting our freshman year together, decided at the last minute to go to Idaho instead. It wasn't entirely his fault. He got the offer after they'd lost their second-string quarterback to an injury. Brian became their new second-string, and I was cut from his roster altogether. Adam nudges my arm with his elbow. Come on, let's grab lunch or come over and hang at the apartment. Meet my roommates. You don't need no man. There's plenty of fish in the sea. What kind of pep talk are you feeling? I smile. Of course, you think there's plenty of fish in the sea. You have a new girlfriend every semester. Exactly. I speak from experience. I don't think it'll be that easy for me. My brother is a hockey player, tall and muscular, and I guess objectively he's attractive. He certainly has no problem finding girlfriends, if that's any indication. He has perfect hair, I'll give him that. I've had hair envy my whole life. Where my dirty blonde is stuck somewhere between straight and curly, his is lighter, thick, and the longest strands hang perfectly at the nape of his neck. How about lunch? He asks. It's tempting, really. If anyone can make me feel better, it's Adam but I'm not sure I want to feel better yet. Being single is a wonderful and liberating thing. Single and ready to mingle. I'm every woman. Put your hands up. Truth hurts. There are so many songs about it, I can't even list them all. But the thing about the single girl anthem, it's usually born out of a lot of tears from the last heartbreak. The girl power and celebration of singledom only comes after you've cried your eyes out and burned every item that belonged to the last man who did you wrong. I'm still somewhere between the two, but I catch Adam's drift. It's probably time to re-enter the land of the living. I let out a cleansing sigh. Tomorrow. Breakfast tomorrow, I promise. I need to help Eva get our room organized. I glance over to the boxes stacked on top of my desk that I still haven't unpacked. Adam doesn't look convinced. I said I promise. He holds his pinky out and I roll my eyes but link it with mine. I'll swing by on my way to the dining hall. You've got an eight o'clock, yeah? I nod and groan. I am so not a morning person. Yeah, but you don't. Preseason workouts this weekend next at six. I'll be heading over to eat around that time anyway. Six o'clock in the morning? Yeah, in the morning. The deep chuckle that follows makes me smile. He stands and ruffles my already messy hair. Stop it, I swat at his hand. He knows I hate it when he treats me like I'm 12. In his mind, a three-year age gap makes him so much wiser. 
Be ready at a quarter till, he says as he moves to the door. I'd hate to have to bang on the door and wake up the entire hall. God, you're obnoxious, I say, but he's already gone. I get up and shower, hoping it washes away some of the lingering sadness along with the cracker crumbs. Back in my room, I look around it with fresh eyes and cringe. Ava's side is organized and decorated with bright colors. And then there's my side. Even I can admit it looks a little depressing. Okay, a lot. White concrete walls, gray bed frame, and desk. The only color is my pale yellow comforter. After I'm dressed, I finally unpack. I didn't bring a lot of personal items because so many of them reminded me of Brian. I fill the closet with my clothes and shoes, organize all of my school stuff on the desk, and I tape up a few pictures of my family and friends from high school on the wall. Standing back, I survey the results. It's a start, and I feel a little more ready to face the world tomorrow. I flip on the small bedside light and crawl under the covers to sleep. I pick up my phone out of habit. Nothing good ever happens from scrolling your phone after midnight. All of my friends from high school are posting selfies and tours of their new college dorms. There's Brian, handsome as ever, in blue and orange. The college campus is in the background, and he's lined up beside a group of big guys I assume are other football players based on their size. They hold beers and smile looking at the camera. He's obviously having no problem enjoying college without me. That same handsome face I've known my whole life. We were neighbors, childhood friends, and then high school sweethearts. I close my eyes and the last conversation I had with him replays in my mind. I don't understand. What do you mean you're not going to Valley? We're supposed to leave in three days. We lie on my bed, and I'm still in that post-sex high, so it takes me a few seconds to realize he's serious. His heavy weight on top of me suddenly feels claustrophobic. I got a call from the coach at Boise State. One of their incoming freshmen got into a car accident. He's out all year, maybe longer. But we've been planning on going to college together for two years, and Idaho is, like, a long way from Arizona. How is this going to work? He hesitates and runs a hand over his jaw while he studies me with an embarrassed look on his face. Oh my god, you're not just telling me you're going to Boise. You're ending this? I motion between us. I don't think it would be fair to either of us to go to college with unrealistic expectations. You said it yourself, Idaho is a long way from Arizona. When we come back for holidays or summer vacations, we can pick up where we left off. You'll always be my perfect girl, Ginny. His gaze drops from my face to my cleavage and continues doing a long sweep of my naked body. The least a guy can do is avoid staring at your boobs while he breaks up with you. Or pull out. But I think we should give ourselves the freedom to explore and have fun while we're apart. Why would you break up with the perfect girl? That doesn't make any sense. I mutter quietly to the room, swiping a rogue tear. I didn't give him the satisfaction of seeing me cry then, and I'm not going to let him ruin my first day of college tomorrow. I force a smile as I reimagine all the amazing things college will bring without Brian. For starters, I don't have to do anything I don't want to. I can be absolutely selfish with my time. Truthfully, I have no idea what that looks like anymore, but I'm ready to find out. I put in my earbuds, hit play, and fall asleep with Beyonce on repeat. The next morning, Ava and I get ready for classes. She's got the TV hooked up and Vampire Diaries Season 1, Episode 1 playing. Feels right somehow. The first season of everything starting today. Our room finally looks like two excited freshmen live here. Ava's side is a little more personalized, Photos of her and Trent, her boyfriend, take up most of the wall above her bed. My roommate is in a serious relationship with her high school boyfriend, who was going to college upstate. It was something else we'd shared when we first connected over the summer, being in serious relationships. They don't seem concerned about the distance, although it's not nearly as far as Idaho. 
Ava's been on the phone or texting him the better part of the last week since we moved in. She's nice, and I think we'll be great roommates. I guess since she's in a relationship, at least I won't have to worry about her bringing random guys back to the dorm. Because I'll be starting college single and not exactly thrilled about the opposite sex, it'll be nice not to worry about that. Do you want to come to breakfast with us? I ask as I'm preparing to leave. No, thanks. She shakes her head, making her short black hair toss around her heart-shaped face. I'm going to video chat with Trent on our way to our first classes. A little pang of jealousy hits me, but I push it aside and head downstairs to meet Adam. Excited energy floats in the air. Blue and yellow banners hang on the front of the dorms, welcoming us to the new school year. Students are already out in droves, heading off to classes, backpacks strapped to their shoulders, coffees in hand. They walk mostly in groups to their destinations. Those who don't have earbuds in or stare down at their phones. The Valley Campus is truly beautiful. When we dropped Adam off before his freshman year and I got a look at the campus for the first time, I knew that it's where I wanted to go to college too. The buildings are mostly old and historic looking, green grass makes it feel a little less like the desert, and there's a huge fountain in the middle of campus. Ginny, Adam calls out, catching me by surprise while I'm lost people watching. Hey, I turn to see him and his friend and teammate, Rhett, with him. You remember Rothros? Adam asks and runs a hand through his still damp hair. Even wet, it looks better than mine. Rat grins and steps forward with his hands shoved in his pockets. Hey, Ginny, good to see you again. Welcome to Valley. Rat Rothrus is a giant man-boy. He's tall and built. His legs are like tree trunks. Seriously, his thighs could crush my head. But he's got this baby face and pouty mouth that keeps him from looking too intimidating. He's also got a really great Minnesota accent that I absolutely love. He and Adam have been teammates and roommates since their freshman year, so I've met him a few times over the years, and he came home with Adam once last semester for a weekend. Hey, Rhett, good to see you too. He grins a little shyly. Are we ready? Adam asks. I'm starving. My dorm doesn't have its own dining hall, so we cross the street to Freddy Dorm to eat. I follow Adam and Rhett inside, and we fall into the long line of people entering the dining hall, scanning their student ID cards as they go. The smell of burned toast hangs in the air as we shuffle inside the busy dining room. Rhett heads off at a near jog for food, but Adam hangs back with me. Grab food and then meet us at the big table in the right corner. You can't miss us. With that, he rushes off too. I do a lap while I check out the food options. Five or six different stations are set up with varying breakfast foods, ranging from yogurt to omelets and everything in between. I decide on waffles, get at the end of the line, and pick up a tray. The guy in front of me drums his fingers on the back of his tray impatiently. His fingers are long and strong looking, somehow just really attractive. I let my gaze move up to his forearms and appreciate them in the same way, tan and toned. The gray t-shirt he's wearing hugs his back and the short sleeves are snug against his biceps. Muscular, but not too beefy. When it's finally his turn, he sets the tray down and grabs a plate. With his profile to me, I take in his straight nose and sharp cheekbones. Dark, messy hair that I have the ridiculous urge to run my fingers through sticks up on his head. I think maybe I spent too many days in my dorm room crying over Brian. I'm flat out gawking at this point, but it's a little hard not to. This guy is attractive without even getting a front view. He has this whole look about him that feels like he didn't bother glancing in the mirror this morning. Actually, now that I think about it, it's a little frustrating that I spent 20 minutes taming my hair while he rolled out of bed and managed to look like that. Damn. Welcome to Valley, Ginny. He proceeds to fill his plate with four waffles. These aren't the size of the small, frozen waffles that you pop in the toaster. They are huge, bigger-than-my-head waffles. He grabs a second plate and fills that one with bacon and eggs farther down the line. He glances between his plates and the food still left on the warmers ahead like he might not be finished. 
I chuckle and he glances back at me. My breath hitches when his blue eyes meet mine. Not blue, a thousand shades of blue. He gives me a sheepish smile. Can you hand me another plate? His deep voice washes over me, vibrating my insides. He's a lot to take in, but I do, not able to stop myself. His hair isn't only dark brown, it has hints of lighter strands, too. It's like no part of him could decide on being one thing, and instead he's made up of varying shades and depths. He has an athletic build, tall but not towering over me like Brian did. My ex was six foot four, which made him a great height to see over a mass of bodies on the football field, but not so great for kissing without standing on my tiptoes. I'm standing here wondering if I could kiss this guy flat-footed. And he asked me a question. Are you serious? He doesn't bat an eye, so I grab another plate and hand it to him. Thanks. I fill my plate with one waffle like a reasonable human and continue to scoot down the line behind him. He's added four pieces of toast and a handful of grape jelly packets to the third plate, and he's still eyeing the food ahead of us. Are you feeding a family of bears? One side of his mouth pulls up. Just one very hungry dude. We reach the end of the line, and he slows like he's waiting for me. He eyes my tray. Barely 400 calories on that plate. How are you going to make it to lunch? Somehow I think I'll manage. We start walking, both in the same direction. Are you following me? I ask when we've walked shoulder to shoulder for three steps. No, I think you're following me. We reach the table where Adam and Rhett are seated with a group of guys. Yo, Heath! One of the guys calls to him. It takes a couple of seconds for my brain to catch up. You're a hockey player? I frown while I try to place him. I've only met a few of Adam's teammates, but I've been to several games, so I'm surprised I don't recognize him. His brows pull together studying me, maybe trying to place me as well. Not a fan of hockey? I think you're at the wrong table, then. Adam stands and puts a protective arm around my shoulders. She's not a fan of any men at the moment. Kill me now. I stare down at my white tennis shoes as Adam introduces me. Guys, this is my baby sister, Ginny. It's her first day. The group offers their hellos and grunts of acknowledgement. They've all got several plates of food in front of them, like Heath, and are shoveling it in like they haven't eaten in days. I take a seat, and so does Heath, across from me. Did you come to the games last year? He asks as he pours syrup over his waffles. Yeah, a couple. Why? I don't recall seeing you. This makes me laugh. In a crowd of cheering fans, how could he possibly remember? I don't recall seeing you, either. He leans across the table with a cocky smirk. I was the one doing all the scoring. Chapter 2 Jenny I eat my breakfast, staying mostly quiet while the guys talk back and forth. They complain about the workout this morning and talk up the season. I've gotten good over the years at tuning out hockey talk. I catch Heath staring at me an uncomfortable number of times. Uncomfortable because I only know he's staring at me because I'm staring at him, too. Oh, and he eats every one of the giant waffles, plus the rest of his food. Where's your first class? Adam asks me as we're finishing up. Um, the humanities building, I think. He nods and sits back in his chair. You know where it's at? Want me to walk you? I resist, rolling my eyes. Yes, I'll be fine. Humanities building? Heath asks. I'm walking that way. Standing, I put on my backpack and then pick up my tray. I've got it, really. I glance at my brother. See you later. And then I give a little wave with my free hand to the rest of the table. As I'm dropping my empty tray, Heath steps up beside me. Adam Scott's sister. I don't see the resemblance. Thank you, I think. He's still following me when we get to the exit. There's really no need. I know where I'm going. Okay. He shrugs one shoulder. See you around, Ginny Scott. The way he says my name is taunting and playful and has my tummy doing weird, excited things. 
Hopefully not if I want there to be any food left to eat, I say before he can leave. I should walk away now, but there's a bizarre chemistry between us, and something about him makes me feel the best I have in days. We stand a foot apart, grinning at one another and forcing people to go around us. He snaps out of it first. Better get here early for lunch, then. That's when I get in my big meal for the day. Your big meal? I can't help but laugh. That was nothing. I burned those calories before you woke up this morning. Presumptuous much? Maybe I'm a runner or a soccer player. His gaze sweeps over me slowly and I hold my breath. Are you? N no. He laughs and takes a step away. Noon. That's what time I eat lunch, in case you want to get here early or join me. He gives me his back before I come up with a witty response. I can't decide if that was flirty banter or him really asking me to have lunch with him, but I figure it's best not to dissect it too much and not to show up at noon. I might be ready to sing all the single girl anthem songs, but I am not ready to start planning my schedule around cute boys. No matter how very, very cute they are. The only thing I've made any sense of from my breakup with Brian is that I need to figure out who I am and what I want, make my own friends. Over the two years Brian and I dated, I grew farther and farther apart from my other friends. To the point, I really don't have any good girlfriends to call up and cry on their shoulder. This is my fresh start. I find English composition easy enough. It's a big class in a room with long rows of seats, many of which are already taken. I take a spot in the middle, trying not to appear too eager or too much like a slacker. I don't mind English, but I'm not a fan of being called on in class, either. After English, I have algebra, and I'm not quite as confident about where the building for it is located. The Valley campus is pretty big, and the number of people walking around makes it hard to get my bearings. I slip my thumbs around the straps of my backpack and fall into the crowd of students, hoping I look like I fit in and don't have freshmen stamped on my forehead. I'm backtracking to find Moreno Hall when my front pocket vibrates. I pull out my phone and move off the sidewalk onto the grass so I don't get trampled. Adam. Get lost yet? I glance up at the building that is most definitely not Moreno Hall. Me. Of course not, but say I was looking for Moreno Hall. Adam. Hang a left just past the engineering building. It's on the corner. Big fancy ass looking building. Can't miss it. A minute later, he follows up. Adam. Find it? Me. I would have found it on my own eventually. Adam. I'm sure. Hurriedly, I pocket my phone and head to Moreno Hall. By the end of the day, I'm exhausted, but even more excited about the semester. All of my classes seemed okay, I met a few girls on our hall, and Ava and I spent the late afternoon walking around campus and soaking in all the first-day excitement. I don't even think about Brian until we get back to the dorm and I'm lying on my bed listening to Ava and Trent share first-day stories. I consider texting him for all of a millisecond. I don't hate him. Maybe I should. It'd probably be easier to get over him that way, but despite the awful way he ended things, I don't totally blame him for taking a great opportunity, and I'm working on not blaming him for not even wanting to try to make it work. Of course I don't text him, mostly because I don't think I can handle hearing how awesome everything is on his end. Not when the most notable part of my day was watching a table of jocks devour food like they hadn't eaten in months. Over the next few days, I don't have any more hockey team run-ins, which might be in part because Ava and I stock up on noodles and have lunch in our room most days, and when I do go to the dining hall, I avoid the back table. My brother's teammates all seemed nice, but I'm not interested in continually being referred to as Adam Scott's baby sister. Adam texts me every day to check in and invites me over to his place to hang out. I finally give in and agree to dinner Thursday night. Are you going to the dorm social tonight? Ava asks that afternoon as we're hanging out in the room. I'm watching a new makeup tutorial and she's letting me practice on her. I know a lot of people like to use themselves as a model, but I've never been one for wearing much makeup. Putting it on other people, though, makes me insanely happy.
Can't. I'm having dinner with my brother. Tomorrow night? I've heard several fraternities are having parties. Trent is coming to town this weekend. I meant to ask you how you felt about him staying in the dorm. If it makes you uncomfortable, we'll get a hotel. He's coming to visit already. She grins wide, and the raspberry red color I've put on her lips looks fantastic. Yeah, we've worked it out so we can visit each other almost every weekend this semester. I hadn't given much thought to what we'd do when he was visiting. I grab a gloss, and she parts her lips to let me coat them with a little shine. He should stay here, of course. Cool, thank you. Trent was stressing about coming up with the money for a hotel. The only one in town that's reasonably priced looks like it also rents by the hour. She pulls her mouth down into a grimace. But it'll be fun. You'll like him. I'm excited to meet him. What are you guys going to do? I'm not sure. Maybe the football game? Maybe skipping it to make out? She blushes. I nod, suddenly imagining a weekend of trying to ignore the sex sounds coming from the other side of the room. Adam picks me up after he's done with classes for the day. I smile when his familiar jeep comes into view. He stops at the curb outside of my dorm, and I hop in. How's the first week? He asks as he drives toward his apartment. Good. I think I'm finally getting a feel for the campus. It's sort of confusing. All the old buildings look the same. And what's up with the floor numbering in Emerson? He chuckles lightly. How long did it take you to figure out there are two second floors? Long enough that I was late to class. He'll have it memorized in no time, and then you'll be laughing at the newbies getting lost. You're laughing at us? Of course we are. He winks. I think I might need to find a group to join or something. I didn't do a lot of extracurricular activities in high school. I hung out with friends, I attended sporting activities, and was always happy to cheer on my school. But there wasn't anything I cared about enough to dedicate my hours before or after school. Was that? Adam asks as he pulls into the parking lot of the apartment complex. Everyone here seems to be into something except me. The girls on my hall are great, and I've met a few people in class, but they've all got a clique of people interested in the same things. The girls rushing sororities, the jocks, the nerds. I swear it's worse than high school. He nods. I guess that's true. I never thought about it before. That's because you came to college already in one of those cliques and with an instant group of friends. What about your roommate? Ava's great, but she has a boyfriend at another college. I get the feeling she'll be spending a lot of her weekends visiting him or him visiting us. I scrunch up my nose. He's staying with us this weekend. Did you find somewhere else to crush? No. Why? It's my room, too. Ginny, trust me. You need to find someone on your floor who will let you stay in their room this weekend. Your dorm room is tiny, and they're going to be naked and going at it. That sounds hella uncomfortable for everyone. Unless you're into that sort of thing. Now he scrunches up his face. Don't tell me if you are. I'd like to continue to believe my baby sister is asexual. I snort laugh, but then everything he's saying hits me. You're right. I can't stay there. He nods. There's always someone leaving on the weekends. Ask around and see who's heading out of town, and we'll let you crash in their room. This is a thing. Seriously? I lived in a suite, so it wasn't that big of a deal. I'd just crash on the couch in the living room. Ugh, I should have been a jock. Then I would have a ready-made click, and I wouldn't be getting kicked out of my own room. You're welcome to stay at my place. I'll figure it out. I appreciate him, but there has to be another option. Adam's apartment isn't far from campus, and if the number of vehicles with Valley University bumper stickers and license plate holders is indicative of how many students live here, then I'd say it's a lot. He leads me up the stairs to the second floor unit. Where is everyone? I ask as we walk into the quiet living room. Campus or the gym. He drops his backpack on the couch. We have preseason workouts twice a day this week. I'm gonna change real quick. He heads into one of the bedrooms off the living room. Where do you want to eat? He calls through the open door. I don't care. Wherever you want. I walk around the apartment, scoping out my brother's living arrangements. There are three bedrooms, Adam's, and then two on the opposite side of the unit. 
In the middle is an open concept area that has a kitchen, dining, and living room. The place isn't that big, but it's a pretty nice setup and feels huge by comparison to my tiny dorm room. In the living room, there's a matching couch and chair in a light brown leather. A coffee table, its top made of old hockey sticks, sits in front of the couch. The only artwork on the walls are a few jerseys and a hockey poster of the Bruins, Adam's favorite team. The entire apartment is cleaner than I would have expected. A few empty Gatorade bottles on the kitchen counter, a football, and a hockey stick, which I can't help but note is a random combination of sporting goods, lying in the middle of the floor in the living room, and a couple of stray articles of clothing on the backs of the chairs at the dining room table. Adam reappears as I'm looking inside their empty refrigerator. Where's all your food? We haven't gone shopping yet. What do you eat? He fills a glass with tap water and chugs it before responding. We mostly eat on campus or we go out. We have a small kitchen in the locker room, too, that is restocked every few days. Can I use your bathroom before we go? I head toward the one that is near his bedroom. Use the other one. He points to the bathroom on the opposite side of the apartment. The light is out in mine. I need to get new bulbs. How do you see to shower or pee? I ask. I leave the door open. Boys are weird. Instead of going to a restaurant, Adam and I go through a drive through and eat in his Jeep while he takes me all around Valley, showing me frat row and some of the popular college bars and restaurants. Have you heard from Mom and Dad? He asks. Are they back from their trip? They get back tomorrow, I think. Our parents went on some fancy romantic vacation to Mexico. Initially, I'd been bummed that they weren't going to be able to drop me off at college, but I'm glad they missed seeing me all sad and teary. The day Adam and I arrived on campus, I dropped my things in my room and then fell onto my new bed and sobbed. Poor Ava must have thought I was nuts. I'm really glad you're here, I admit. He grins. Me too. I get to spend the last year of college with my baby sister. You have to stop calling me that. I'm not a baby. His mouth pulls into a wider smile. Come over this weekend and crash at my place. You'll avoid listening to your roomie's sex sounds and I'll introduce you to everyone. People are always coming and going from our apartment. It'll be good to meet more people here. Hell, maybe I'll throw a party. You never let me come to your parties in high school and now you're practically begging me. I find this quite redeeming even though now I don't actually want to go. Back then I would have killed to hang with you and your friends. High school was different. No one here cares if you're a freshman or senior or if you go to college at all. Plus, I want to see that you're settled. I know the shit with Brian was rough. I groan and Adam laughs. Only one condition. Promise me that you won't get wasted and make an ass of yourself in front of my teammates. I'm captain this year and I need them to respect me. I promise, I say as I roll my eyes and toss a fry in his direction. Chapter 3. Heath Carry me. My legs are donezo. Maverick leans his sweaty, heavy frame against me. Get the fuck off. I'm barely standing on my own. I wobble and take a seat in my stall. The first week of hell training is done, and we survived. Mostly. Coach Myers likes to start out the year with a shit ton of conditioning and weight training. We won't even be allowed to step on the ice for another two weeks. My buddy falls into the seat next to me and pulls a t-shirt over his head. Want to grab a drink at Prickly Pear? I can't. Scott's called a house meeting. I say, annoyed and loud enough so Adam can hear me. 4.30, don't be late, Adam says sternly. The rest of the guys are scared of him, being our team captain and all, but I know better. He's all talk. I push his buttons on a regular basis, and I'm still standing, despite him having a good three inches and fifteen pounds on me. Maverick and I stop for alcohol to restock for the weekend. When we get back to the apartment, we settle into the couch for our house meeting. I've only lived here for a month, and this is the second meeting Adam has called. It looks to be a long year. At least I have Mav for entertainment. He lives downstairs in a single apartment, but he spends way more time here than his own place. His French bulldog, Charlie, lies at his feet, staring up at him with adoring eyes. Charlie is pretty much the only one who looks at Maverick like that. He's a total jokester and softy, 
but his size and tattoos intimidate most people. Adam and Ralph Russ wander out of their respective rooms. Ralph Russ grabs a wooden chair from the dining table and Adam takes a seat in our leather recliner. He eyes the bottle in Maverick's hand. Dude, really? Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, Mav tisks. You can't speak until you have the bottle. New house rule. He hands it to Adam with a smirk. Take a shot, Captain, my Captain. You don't even live here. Adam takes a long swallow of the MD-2020 anyway and grimaces. That shit's nasty. I haven't had Mad Dog since high school. Ironically, that's the last time I got called to a family meeting, too, Mav points out, taking the bottle back. Yeah, well, feel free to leave since, again, you don't live here, but this won't take long. Three things. He holds up his fingers like he's talking to children. I glance over at Mav as he runs a hand along his tattooed chest where he's spilled on himself, and a trail of alcohol trickles down to his shorts. Okay, maybe we're more like overgrown toddlers than functioning men. Maverick and I like to have fun, so sue us. We show up on the ice where it matters. Number one, Adam goes right into it. We looked like shit out there this week. Mav holds up a finger, takes a drink, and then speaks. We're not even on the ice yet. Give it time. Adam starts to respond, but not before Mav hands him the bottle and he begrudgingly takes another sip. No, it's my last year and I'm not taking any chances by waiting for ice time. I think we should invite the guys over. Party. Good call, I say and find the bottle thrust into my side. As I'm taking a drink, Adam shakes his head. No, not a party. Well, okay, a party, but no girls. Just the team. You want us to spend our nights with a bunch of sweaty guys now, too? We're already spending long days in conditioning together. The only thing that got me through the week was the promise of a weekend of fun. I'm not sure more time together is the answer. Girls, Mav says. The answer is always girls. Let's get the freshmen laid. That's actually not a bad plan. Ralph Russ speaks up for the first time. The bottle is passed to him, and he fingers the label as he finishes. Maybe they just need to let off a little steam. Adam frowns, and the vein in his forehead becomes noticeable. Never a good sign. We party all the time. The guys don't need our help finding chicks. This is about coming together as a team. You're going to go all weekend without your latest girlfriend? Mav asks Adam pointedly. Adam always has a girlfriend. I can't remember the current one's name. Hannah? Holly? I don't understand why he doesn't stay single. It isn't like he, or any of us for that matter, need the relationship label to get laid. But no, Adam Scott is the full boyfriend experience. He doesn't only hook up or go on a few dates. He wastes months on these girls, going all in with dates and sleepovers. Just not for more than six months or so at a time. He's an odd duck. Ralph Russ, too. He's been dating the same girl since high school, and she lives in freaking Nebraska. Why have a girlfriend you never see? The only perk of having a girlfriend is getting laid on a regular basis, right? I'm really asking. I have no idea. Maria and I broke up, he says with a shrug. And it's just for tonight. Maria. Wow. Definitely off there. What happened to Heather? Mav asks. Ah, yes, Heather. My memory isn't failing me yet. They broke up in May. Keep up. Ralph Russ reaches out for the mad dog again, but Maverick holds it up and shakes the empty bottle. Fuck. We went through that fast. Fine. Party tonight. No girls, Mav says and looks to me. I'm the last holdout. It's one night, man. What are the other two things on the agenda? We'll circle back, I say with a smile, and Mav chuckles. Nice, circling back. I think my dad used that the last time we talked. His dad is a big executive, suit and tie, phone permanently attached to his ear. Rich as sin, but kind of a prick, so we have a bit of fun at his expense with our corporate speak, or jargon, if you will. Adam interrupts our joking, which, to be fair, is probably the only way to get us back on track. Number two. Heath, you have to walk your dates out the door, like personally see that they make it outside. He looks to Rhett, who's turning a nice shade of red. Mav gasps dramatically with a hand to his chest. 
Charlie at his feet lifts her head to check on her owner. Heath would never. He's a true gentleman. It was one time, and I did walk her out. I glance at my flushed roommate. The memory of him all bedhead and in his boxers kicking out a half-naked Kimberly still makes me smile. I just didn't lock the door behind her. How was I supposed to know she was going to come back and try to work her way around the apartment? I mean, seriously, is it my fault that she broke into our place and slipped into bed with the guy? Apparently nothing is sexier or more challenging for a girl than a guy in a real committed relationship. And Ralph Russ is as loyal as they come, even though he barely sees his woman. It drives girls crazy. Seriously, he could have any chick he wanted. He might be onto something. Not that I have any plans to try his method. Mine's working just fine. Maverick sets the empty bottle on the coffee table and heaves a sigh. Are there any items on your list that don't revolve around our dicks? No one speaks. Adam raises his brows and keeps his sharp stare on me. Agreed. I will walk them out. I'm almost positive I can remember to do that. Definitely can tonight, since I'll be spending it with my hand, apparently. Next item on the agenda, Mav prompts. Adam looks a little nervous, pausing before he speaks. This can't be good. My sister is crashing here this weekend, so best behavior. He stands. What the hell? What happened to no chicks? I ask. She's my sister, not the same thing. Depends. Is she hot? Mav asks, totally serious, which makes the vein in Adam's head protrude. Yes. Yes, she is. I keep that to myself. I'm not scared of Scott, but I'm not an idiot. If he knew my unfiltered thoughts on his little sister, I'd be neutered in my sleep. Nah, actually, he'd probably do it when I was wide awake. Can't really blame him. Ginny Scott is sexy as hell, and all my thoughts about her are dirty. Long blonde hair, light brown eyes, and her legs. Those long legs are the things dreams are made of. Best behavior. Adam pulls his phone out and walks toward his room. Meeting adjourned then, eh? Mav says, and then looks to me. I'm gonna need a copy of the minutes on my desk by end of business. I'm right on top of that, sir, I say and give him the middle finger. What the hell are we going to do tonight? Mav looks seriously defeated as he runs a hand through his dark hair. Halo? Ralph Russ lifts an Xbox controller. Why the fuck not? He pets Charlie and grabs the controller with the other hand. I get up and take a step toward my room. I'm going to shower and touch base with myself. Mav cackles. Not as good as circling back, but good wordplay. Mariah or Ariana for inspirational music? It's definitely a Mariah kind of day, I decide. Mav hums as I walk by. Santa baby or heartbreaker? I shake my head. Fantasy. Always fantasy. Later, I close my door so I can hear Nathan on the phone over the noise in the living room. A few guys have already made it over. I hope Scott's right and this is what we need. He might be a pain in the ass, but he's not wrong about us needing to play better together. It's his last year, so I get the extra pressure to make it the best before he's done. He's not interested in playing professionally, so this really is it for him. How does it feel to be back? Not as good as it would feel to be practicing with the Coyotes right now, I say as I take a seat at my desk. He snickers. Soon enough? Eh, I grunt. I've never been much for living in the future, even now that it's set. I signed with Arizona's professional team over the summer. Three more years at Valley, and then I'll get paid to play hockey. It still hasn't really sunk in. How's everything in Florida? Good. Busy between the team and all the wedding plans. It's gotten nuts. Did you get to save the date? I did. I pick up the thick paper invitation on my desk. June, huh? You really think you can continue to not screw this up for another ten months? God, I hope so. I don't know what I'll do if she wises up before then he says in a teasing voice. I can hear his fiancée Chloe in the background taunting him back, but can't make out her words. Tell her I said hey and thanks for the giant box of stuff. This one's got Chloe written all over it. A gift card to the Olive Garden? Nathan speaks away from the phone. Busted. Totally called you out on the Olive Garden gift card.
Take a nice girl to dinner, Chloe yells. You hear that? My brother asks. Yeah, I got it. They've been sending me packages every month since my freshman year. Each one is different and contains shit ranging from razors, body wash, homemade oatmeal raisin cookies, my favorite, to new clothes and cologne. And then there's the gift cards. Each month, a hundred dollars or more from random places. Since I refuse to take money outright from Nathan, they find creative ways to be generous. I don't really need it. I have a full-ride scholarship for hockey and a part-time job that helps with anything else, but that's Nathan, always trying to take care of me. All right, well, I won't keep you. Chloe and I are headed to the beach. Stay out of trouble. I groan and tilt my head back. With a chuckle, Nathan says, I'm proud of you, but what kind of big bro would I be if I didn't remind you not to screw up? You've got more than ever on the line. Oh, I don't know. The cool kind, maybe? Have fun. I'll call you next week. Let me know if you need anything. Oh, and call mom. She said she hasn't heard from you in two weeks. Been busy. Mm-hmm. Weak excuse. Later, Heath. Bye, Heath, Chloe says in the background. Bye, guys. Talk to you later. Chapter 4 Ginny Trent arrives late Friday afternoon and Ava is brimming with excitement. She introduces me and then recaps a list of facts about the guy. Facts she's already told me several times. I feel like I know him better than I know Ava at this point. She's told me that much about him. Maybe a little too much. I'm going to show him around campus and then we're going to the football game. Do you want to come with us? She's practically beaming with happiness, and I have a twinge of sadness that this could be me and Brian if he weren't in freaking Idaho. She leans into his side, and Trent wraps an arm around her waist. His fingers slip under the hem of her t-shirt, and he kisses her forehead. It's obvious how much they've missed one another by the touchy-feely display in front of me, and I'm starting to understand just how imperative it is I get the hell out of here. I haven't even been able to bring myself to watch porn since Brian broke up with me. I certainly can't handle a full-on romantic display with a side of orgasms. No, thanks. You two enjoy. My brother is having people over, so I'm going to go hang with them. You two will have the place all to yourself tonight. It was really nice to meet you, Trent. I shower and get ready, hesitant to head over to Adam's before the party gets going. I appreciate that he always looks out for me, but I want to find my own friends at Valley, too, and if I run over there every time I need an escape, I'm going to spend the next year as Adam Scott's little sister instead of Ginny Scott. So tonight, I need to find some friends. I text Adam to make sure he's there before driving over. Adam. Yep, just hanging out at the house. You coming over? I warned the guys to be on their best behavior. Me. Yes, but please don't make it weird. I know you and your friends are disgusting. You don't need to warn them like I'm some sort of delicate flower. I ignore the rest of his messages that pop up, telling me he's only looking out for me or whatever. Having an older, overbearing brother is a real pain sometimes. The apartment is easy enough to find, and I carry my backpack with a change of clothes and toothbrush up to the second floor door and knock. You must be little Scott. A guy with a shit ton of tattoos on full display thanks to his bare chest greets me with a goofy smile. I'm Johnny Maverick. Jenny. He pulls the door wide and I enter. A bunch of guys I don't recognize are standing around the apartment. For real, it's like I just entered the men's locker room with the way they all stop what they're doing and stare at me. Adam's head pops up from the kitchen and he hustles forward. Did you find it okay? Yeah, I have this thing called Maps on my phone. I spot Rhett in the living room, and he lifts a controller in greeting. Hey, Jenny, good to see you again. I wave awkwardly. They're all still staring. Adam shuts the door, and I follow him into the living room. He points to the guy who answered the door. You met Maverick. Ignore any and everything, he says. He scoffs. I am hilarious and awesome. That's Liam, Jordan, and Tiny. Hey, they say in unison. Want something to eat or drink? My brother asks and goes back to the kitchen. I'm okay for now. There's an empty seat next to Maverick, 
so I head for it and sit down. Where's Payne? One of the guys asks him. Still showering and jerking it to Mariah, probably. Maverick stills, looks to me, and clears his throat. Shit, sorry. I laugh and wave him off. Good for him, and Mariah. I like you. Maverick puts his arm around me on the back of the couch, but it's in a friendly way that doesn't feel like he's hitting on me. Hands off! Adam's deep voice bellows from the kitchen. Maverick rolls his eyes, and I'm glad he's not so easily intimidated by my brother. It was a real issue in high school before Adam graduated. He would look at guys the wrong way for talking to me, and they'd scamper off too afraid of him. He stands and looks down at me. You need a drink? A smoke? Yeah, I think I might need a drink after all. The party, or what's arrived of it, moves outside on the deck of the kitchen off the apartment. It's nice out. Still hot, like August nights always are in Arizona, but a nice breeze and the cold drink in my hand helps. Even Adam seems to relax as the guys kick back with their beers. It's just the guys on the team, but it's early. I'm going to get another drink. I head inside to the bathroom and have to use the flashlight on my phone to see anything. Why my brother hasn't changed the light bulb is beyond me. I can't really see much in the mirror, enough to make out my French braid is mostly still intact. In the kitchen, I rummage through the refrigerator looking for something besides beer, but it's that or wild turkey. Definitely no. As I turn, movement catches my eye and I jump in surprise. You scared me. He grins, hand gliding through the wet hair sticking up on his head like he ran a towel through it and said, fuck it. He looks me over carefully. I'm frozen. My tongue feels heavy or too wide for my mouth or something. Hey, Jenny. Hi. I look around dumbfounded. I'd expected to run into him, but not half naked. Do you live here? Well, I don't usually walk around in my boxers at other dudes' houses. He looks to the ceiling and a smirk pulls at his lips. Well, not often. I had been actively avoiding the wall of nakedness in front of me, but now that he's acknowledged it, I can't look away. The only thing he wears are a pair of gray boxer briefs that hug his huge thighs and, oh my god, Jenny, do not look at his crotch. Shit. Too late. I tear my gaze away from the bulge and up to his abs. Forget a boring six-pack, Heath has ridges and lines that wrap around his midsection. I follow the line to his chest and biceps. It shouldn't be possible for someone to look this good naked. And oh my God, stop looking already. Adam comes through the door before I can make words come out of my mouth. Pain, fucking finally. We thought you drowned in there. Adam tosses his empty in the trash and grabs another beer, his face hardening as he gets a good look at him. Dude, what the hell? Put some clothes on in front of my sister. Relax, I didn't know she was here yet. Heath's tone is agitated, rightfully so. Pants, dude, now. Adam, I admonish. And no hitting on my baby sister. His demeanor relaxes slightly and he punches Heath playfully in the arm, although it seems a little harder than necessary. Are you coming back outside? Adam asks me, pausing at the door that leads to the deck. I'll be right there, I assure him. Heath brushes by me, the heat of his body licking flames up my arm, and grabs two beers from the fridge. He hands one to me. So I hear you're sleeping with me this weekend. Um, what? I hear you're sleeping at our place this weekend. He leans a hip against the counter and pops the top off the beer. Right, yeah, my roommate's boyfriend is in town for the weekend. Lucky for us. I doubt you guys will even know I'm here. One chick among 27 guys? Plus, it's you. You're kind of hard to miss. His eyes drop to my mouth. One chick? Please. Actually, I'm surprised there aren't girls over already. Are you hiding an orgy in your room? He laughs. It's a deep, playful tone that lights up my insides. <laughs> I wish. He pushes off the counter. Your brother has banned girls from the apartment tonight. What? Why? That doesn't sound like Adam. Team building or some shit. Just you and the team, Ginny Scott. No, absolutely not. 
Adam said he was going to introduce me to people, not hang with his bros. With a light chuckle, he lifts his beer and takes a drink, making me realize I haven't touched mine. I'm going to kill him. Well, that I want to see. I better get dressed. He winks and heads down the hall on the opposite side of the apartment from Adam's room. I'm finally able to take a breath again. Holy mother of all that is good, he's a lot. I head outside and take a seat next to Adam. No girls? What the hell? I thought you wanted to introduce me to people. He looks conflicted on how to respond. I will. I am. He motions around the party. People besides your teammates, Adam. I flail my hands around. Girls! Yeah, let's get some girls over here. Someone says, and Adam scowls at them over my head and then drops his gaze back to me. Please? I ask quieter. I'm sure your teammates are great, but I don't want to hang with a bunch of dudes all weekend. Shit, Jenny, I didn't even think about Brian and what it might be like to be around a bunch of guys. He rubs at the back of his neck. All right, yeah, let's have a real party. That wasn't exactly what I'd meant by not wanting to hang out with a bunch of dudes, but if it gets girls over here, I will keep my mouth shut and let him think it's my sad, I hate all of mankind, broken heart speaking. On it, Maverick says and pulls out his phone. Chapter 5 Heath A knock brings my attention to the door and Scott's head peeks in. Hey, I'm going to run to the store to get more alcohol. You need anything? Are you sure I'm allowed out of my room? I ask. I still haven't bothered to get dressed. I sat down at my desk to check in with work and got distracted. Sorry, man, I'm a little protective of her. She's been through a lot. I nod and open my top desk drawer and pull out the stack of gift cards. Where are you going? Dude, what all you got there? He laughs and walks closer. Gift cards to pretty much every place you can think of. His eyes widen. You're coming with me. Bring your stash. I don't know what his sister said to him, but in an hour's time, our place has become packed with guys and girls. Good work, Jenny. Adam and I head out and make several stops getting booze and food. When we're on our way back, I finally decide to broach the subject on my mind. So, your sister's smoking hot. I'm messing with him, sort of. She is smoking hot, but I'm only sharing this information to get a rise out of him. As predicted, he pins me with a hard stare. I meet it and smile, letting him know I'm not intimidated. Off limits, pain. Relax, I'm giving you shit. I don't do the whole girlfriend thing like you. We've only talked a few times. She's nice. She is. I worry about her. She doesn't know a lot of people at Valley yet, and I want to introduce her to everyone, but she's off limits. Friend zone only, man. I know how you are. Ouch. I'm a perfect gentleman, thank you very much. Just because I don't date the same girl for months at a time doesn't mean I treat them any worse. Is there some sort of big brother gene that makes you all giant, overprotective assholes? I'm serious. She just got out of a relationship and she doesn't need another guy screwing her over. We pull up to the apartment and grab the bags to carry inside. Before we enter the apartment, Adam stops and regards me seriously. You'll help me keep an eye on her? Make sure the rest of the guys don't mess with her? She doesn't need a babysitter, man, and I'm no nanny. His mouth pulls into a thin line and I cave, some part of me understanding his concern. I can't imagine having a little sister around my teammates and friends. I will keep an eye out, but I'm not going to lord over her like some sort of protector. Normal, friendly, keep an eye out, not whatever you've got going on there. I lift one of my arms, bringing the grocery bags with it, and motion to him in his moody intensity. Good enough, I guess. I barely get the beer to the fridge before people are grabbing for it. I take two and spot the object of my and Adam's conversation sitting on the couch watching Maverick and Ralph Russ play Halo. Hey, I say as I take a seat next to her and hold out a beer. Her hair is in an elaborate-looking braid, the end hanging over one shoulder. She takes the can hesitantly. Thanks. Where's mine? Maverick teases. In the fridge? He holds a hand to his chest and pretends to be appalled. When you're as hot as Ginny, I'll start being your beer bitch too. She rolls her eyes as she pops the tab on her beer, 
but there's a faint blush to her cheeks. Genevieve, Adam calls from the kitchen and lifts a beer and a silent offering. She holds up the one I gave her so he can see she's already got one. Genevieve, Mav asks. I thought your name was Ginny. Ginny is short for Genevieve. That's rad. Why would you ever go by anything else? He says her name again, slowly. Genevieve. Adam couldn't pronounce it when I was born. Mav and Routhrus bust up laughing. He was three, she adds, sticking up for him. Routhrus wins, like he always does, and Mav looks to me. I'm done getting my ass kicked. Do you want to play? Nodding, I hold a hand up and he tosses the controller to me. I nudge Ginny. What do you say? Ralph Russ holds his out to her and she takes it. Have you played before? I grew up with Adam. What do you think? She sits forward and places her beer on the coffee table and straightens her shoulders. She's taking this seriously, looking determined and sexy as hell. I set out with the goal of taking it easy on her, but Ginny doesn't need it. A few of the guys on the team crowd around to cheer her on and voice their hope of me getting my ass kicked. I win, just barely, and everyone boos. Thanks a lot, guys. Real team spirit. Do over, she demands. I'm not confident I can pull off a victory twice, so I hesitate. We lean forward and grab our beers at the same time. I take a long drink while she sips and then grimaces. What was that face? I stare at her cute little mouth and pink lips wet from the beer. Do you actually like the taste of beer? She asks. I wouldn't drink it otherwise. Why didn't you say something? I'm trying to learn to like it. It seems to be what everyone drinks here. She takes a longer drink as if to prove her point. Be right back. I find Jordan and trade a $20 gift card for a 12-pack of his hard seltzers. Two more people have taken over the game, so I motion for Ginny to follow me and lead her out to the deck. Try this. Thank you. She takes it and I lean back against the railing. There are a lot of people out here, but no one is paying us any attention except her brother. Big Brother Radar, I guess. Dude needs to chill. I turn so his big-headed scowl isn't in my peripheral. There's no pleasing the guy. He wanted me to look out for her. I am, yet he still seems displeased. I don't remember seeing you last year. You were really at our games? A few of them. This time when she takes a drink, she smiles. Much better. She plays with the end of her braid. I was at the Colorado game and Arizona State and whoever you guys played for parents' night. I think back to that game for a second. Western Michigan. Right. Her smile lifts higher. I can't believe I didn't see you. Her phone is stuck in the front pocket of her jeans and I nod toward it. Let me see your phone. She hands it over without question and I program my number in it and send myself a text so I have hers. A lot of people come to the games. Plus, it wasn't like I was sitting on the bench with the team. Do you guys notice anyone in the crowd? We notice hot girls. Maverick butts into the conversation and puts an arm around her shoulders. You're hot, little Scott. She blushes and I hand her phone back. Mav holds on to her and takes a step away from me. I'm stealing her. Ginny here has a lot of people dying to meet her and you're hogging her pain. I do? Ginny asks, sounding a little hopeful. Oh yeah, Mav nods. Come on, you need a tour guide. Okay, yeah, that'd be great. She glances at me. You probably want to hang out with your friends anyway. She lifts her seltzer. Thanks for this. Any time, Genevieve. I wink and tug the end of her braid. She follows Mav and I head inside, grab another beer and take a seat back on the couch next to Routhrus's giant frame. I've got winner. Chapter 6 Jenny True to his word, Maverick introduces me to everyone. He has a shirt on now, but the tattoos that cover both arms all the way down to his fingers are still visible, and I can spot a hint of his chest ink peeking out the top of his t-shirt. He leads me to where Liam and Jordan are standing. Liam and Maverick look like polar opposites. Where Johnny Maverick is dark-haired and covered in tattoos, Liam is blonde and clean-cut. He's even wearing a polo shirt. 
Even though I met him earlier, this time when Maverick introduces me, Liam extends a hand for me to shake. Ginny, really nice to meet you. Same. His politeness catches me by surprise, but I slip my hand into his giant palm and squeeze. Roadrunner? Jordan asks, handing a blue shot glass out to me. I take it and sniff. What's a roadrunner? It's like a blue kamikaze, he says and continues passing out shots. I don't bother asking what a blue kamikaze is. My experience with alcohol is pretty limited. My high school bestie always grabbed a bottle of white wine from her parents' wine refrigerator, and we'd drink that when we went to parties or had sleepovers. I never paid much attention to the label. None of it was great, but it was better than beer. Jordan lifts his, and the rest of us mimic the movement. I watch the others drink first. No one grimaces, so I take a sip. It's good. Sweet. I smile and then drain the rest of the glass. We're off to meet more people, Mav tells them, pulling me away. He stops every couple of steps to make introductions and share the bottle of Mad Dog he's carrying. He's funny and kind of ridiculous, saying whatever pops into his head. Or maybe not, but if he's holding back at all, I don't want to think about the thoughts left unsaid. Total douche, he says after we're done talking to one guy that I think he said was a neighbor. I laugh. Then why did you introduce me to him? Gotta know which ones to stay away from. The next time he stops, it's in front of a girl standing by herself, her face hidden behind her phone. Dakota, baby, I missed you all summer. You missed having someone to bum laundry detergent and junk food from. She looks up and over the device at Maverick. She's pretty. Big, ice-blue eyes and strawberry blonde hair that hangs in loose waves around her shoulders. She looks sweet, but the playful glare she gives Maverick makes me believe she could cut a bitch with words alone. That gaze slides to me and softens. Hey. Dakota lives in the apartment next door. I'm her favorite neighbor. He tips his head to me. This is Scott's little sister, Jenny. Hey there. I wave three fingers around my drink. Where's Reagan? Maverick asks. Then to me. Her roommate, the nicer of the two. Dakota flips him off. She'll be here. She was still getting ready. Ginny, you're a freshman? Did the seltzer give it away? She lifts her cup. We've got a better variety at our place if you want something else. These guys only know cheap beer and hard liquor. Thank you, that's really nice. Of course. Dakota's phone pings and she smiles at the screen. Wardrobe emergency. I should go make sure Reagan's not buried under a pile of dresses. Do you want to come with me and scan our booze? Maverick nods his approval and smiles like a proud parent who set up their kid on a successful play date. You two have fun. Don't tell her any lies about us, Dakota. Lies would be less incriminating. Dakota lets us into her apartment across the breezeway from the guys. Help! A muffled voice calls from one of the bedrooms. A girl with hair the color of honey pulled up in curlers rushes out wearing a silky robe. I don't know what to wear. Dakota laughs. This is Jenny. Jenny, that's my neurotic but lovable roommate, Reagan. Hey, she says, breathless, cheeks pink. Green's a good color on you, I tell her and motion to the emerald color of her robe. She's right. Put on that green dress with the crisscross back. Reagan smiles, deep dimples popping out. Oh, right. I forgot about that one. She disappears back into the room. Dakota moves to the kitchen, and I hang out in the living room, looking around. I like your apartment. It's decorated with lots of black and white with pops of dark pink, old Hollywood movie posters, and cute furniture. It's a smaller version of my brother's, but the same basic setup with bedrooms on either side of the living area. Thanks, she says, and I join her in the kitchen area. Pick your poison. A wide selection of alcohol is spread out on their kitchen counter. Wine, red and white, hard lemonade, vodka, Captain Morgan, and a bunch of mixers. I settle on half a cup of white wine. After all the mixing, I'm a little nervous to drink too much. So, you're Adam Scott's little sister? She asks with a smirk once we both have a fresh drink. I am, yeah. You know him? 
Everyone knows him. He's Adam Scott. Reagan appears in green with her hair down, looking like she walked out of a salon. If I could make that sort of transformation in five minutes, I'd probably get dolled up more often. Do we have a winner? Dakota asks. Reagan holds her arms out to her sides. I think so. You look great. I glance down at my jeans and tank top. I'm underdressed by comparison. Dakota's in a skirt and t-shirt with tennis shoes, but her makeup and jewelry give it all a much more put-together look than my casual outfit. Do you guys always dress up like this for parties? Dakota responds first. This is my basic uniform, but that one? She nods toward her roommate. Has her eye on a boy. Reagan makes a face at her, but smiles. Oh, someone at the party? I ask. One of the hockey guys? Yeah. She takes a seat next to me. She won't say which one. I've got money on Liam. He's got that nice guy vibe, but something about him screams that he's probably not afraid to get down and dirty in the sheets. Dakota pours white wine into a cup and hands it to Reagan. Liam? Really? Reagan asks with a shake of her head. He's not my type, and I'm not saying who because I don't want to jinx it. Well, he'd be a fool to turn you down, I tell her honestly. Reagan is the kind of pretty that you wish only existed on the pages of a magazine or on TV. She takes the drink and sighs. I'm nervous, which is ridiculous, right? Who gets nervous about going to a party where there are crushes? It's like junior high all over, except without the zits and braces. Thank God. I've been trying to talk to this guy for a long time. I get all weird and shy around him. Well, shyer than normal. You're going to knock his socks off. Trust me, Dakota says. And if not, you get to come home to me. Have you guys been roommates for a long time? I ask. It's easy to see how close they are. They tease, but it's with a smile and none of the catty, fake compliments that some girls do to one another. Since our freshman year in the dorms, Reagan answers. Dakota was all fast-talking and no-nonsense, and I think I spent half of the first semester completely terrified of her. Dakota laughs. <laughs> it's true. She said maybe three full sentences until she saw me crying over the notebook. She was sobbing. Those old people get me every time. They smile at one another, and then Reagan adds, We moved out as soon as we could last year. Even though Reagan and Dakota are two years older than me, we fall into an easy camaraderie. They tell me more about their time in the dorms together, and they ask me about Ava and how my first week went. When we finally fall silent, my cheeks hurt from smiling. I can see it, Dakota says, looking me over closely. You've got the same eyes and smile. This makes Reagan look between us, and when her brown eyes land on me, they narrow as she studies me. Same eyes and smile as who? Jenny is Adam's sister. Adam Scott? She asks, eyes widening through thick black lashes. Man, it really pains me that even someone as beautiful as Reagan has this reaction about my brother. At least my high school friends hid their fascination with him better. That's the one. My phone buzzes in my front pocket and I pull it out. That's him, checking in. He's a total pain in the ass. I type back a response, letting him know I'm next door. Everyone ready? Dakota asks. Reagan and I nod. Dakota leads the way. Let's do this. Hanging out with Dakota and Reagan is fun. They know everyone, and after the initial shock of finding out I was Adam's little sister, they haven't made me feel like the other Scott. Speaking of the popular Scott, when I finally spot him, he's in the corner with his arm wrapped around a girl I haven't met. He leans down and whispers in her ear, and she giggles and tips her mouth up to let him kiss her. Gross. Seeing my brother in action? Really not cool. What do women see in him? I huff. I mean, honestly. I turn to Reagan and Dakota. Dude, your brother's hot. Dakota shrugs. Sorry. I scrunch up my face and walk toward him. He comes up for air when I clear my throat. Ginny, he pulls the girl tighter to his side and then nods to Dakota and Reagan. 
I see you two met my sister. Yeah, she's way cooler than you. What happened? Dakota deadpans. Tough crowd. Adam tilts his head to the girl still clinging to him. Guys, this is Taryn. Hey, her red lips pull up into a big smile. Your brother's told me so much about you. Oh, really? I ask, surprised since he's never mentioned her, but I smile because I'm not an asshole, and it isn't her problem my brother jumps from girl to girl. Well, it's nice to meet you. I give Reagan and Dakota a save-me look, which they interpret quickly and make excuses for us. How does he already have a new girlfriend? Neither of them answers, not that I expected them to. It's the hot thing, Dakota says, and the hockey thing. We should hang out tomorrow, Reagan offers. Are you coming to the pool party? Dakota asks. What pool party? Oh, yeah, you should definitely come. Reagan smiles. I freaking love her dimples. It's at the White House. It's a big back-to-school party they have every year. Everyone will be there. I'm in. And just like that, I'm pretty sure I've made two new friends here. Chapter 7 Ginny the next morning, I'm sitting outside on the deck, FaceTiming with Reagan and Dakota, recapping last night. I had so much fun, and I'm excited to hang out with them again today. Adam comes out, shirtless, hair matted from sleep, and a giant bottle of Gatorade in hand. Morning. Hey. He takes a seat next to me with a big, tired sigh, and glances to the phone in my hand with a smile. Which reminds me... Reagan, what happened with that guy last night? Oh, nothing. She bites at the corner of her lip, making one dimple dot her cheek. It was stupid. He's dating someone else. I didn't realize until last night. Moving on. How is that possible? You're gorgeous. Did you tell him you were into him? She shakes her head. I angle the phone so she can see Adam. Would you tell her that she needs to tell this guy so he can break up with his girlfriend to date her? He chuckles and Reagan's eyes go wide. Oh my god, Chinny, Adam, you absolutely do not need to- She's right. He nods and smiles at my new friend. Guy must be crazy. See? Told you. She covers her face with her hands like she's embarrassed. I'm going to hang with Adam for a bit. Hurry up and get over here. Dakota says, popping her head in front of the screen for a second. I'll be over soon, I promise. Looks like you made some friends, Adam says as I hang up the phone. I did. Thanks for letting me crash in your room last night. No problem. The couch wasn't too bad. That might have had something to do with the girl that was on it with you? Probably so. He agrees. Do you girls want to ride over to the party together? Sure, sounds good. I stand and stretch. See you later. I knock at Dakota and Reagan's and then open the door. Hello? In my room, Reagan calls. Dakota sits on the bed and Reagan tosses two giant handfuls of swimsuits onto the comforter. I pulled all my suits for you to choose from, Reagan says. I didn't bring a bathing suit from the dorm, so I'm thankful she's letting me borrow one, but holy crap. That is a lot of options, she nods happily. I shower and pull my hair into a braid. I go for a low-cut pink one-piece suit and my own cut-off shorts and sandals. I'm waiting on Dakota and Reagan's couch while they finish getting ready when I get a text. Hottest guy on campus. Did you leave without saying goodbye? Sad face. Me. Who is this and how did you get this number? Hottest guy on campus. Name is self-explanatory. It is self-explanatory, sadly. I met dozens of people last night, but Heath is the only one I can recall with any detail. There's a hotness about Heath that goes beyond types and is more universal truth. Hottest guy on campus. Back at the dorm? Me. No, actually, I'm next door waiting for Dakota and Reagan so we can leave for the pool party. Are you going? Hottest guy on campus. Depends. Are you going to be there in a bikini? I glance down at my very covered midsection. Me. Guess you'll have to come to find out. 
Despite Heath's texts that sound anxious to see me, he isn't around when Dakota, Reagan, and I meet Adam and Rhett in the parking lot to catch a ride over. We pile into Adam's Jeep and drive the few blocks to the pool party. Adam parks along the street and points. That's Ray Fieldhouse. The student fitness facility is inside, and a lot of the teams have private workout rooms there, too. Where's the rink from here? I ask, trying to get my bearings. The Valley U campus is big, and I'm still not sure where everything is. Couple of blocks west, Red answers. I sling my beach bag over my shoulder and follow the guys up the sidewalk. Whose house is this? I ask once we get to our destination. I was expecting an apartment with a community pool or an old house with a tiny yard and pool. This is none of that. This is the White House, Adam remarks. Guys from the basketball team live here. We walk around to the back of the giant white house, aptly named, to the pool party going on outside. The pool itself takes up half the large yard, and the other side is grassy with a volleyball net set up. There are people everywhere. Everywhere. The scene looks like something straight out of a spring break video. Music pumping loudly, girls lounging on rafts, guys chilling with beers in hand, a co-ed volleyball game. Even in my tiny shorts and my cleavage pushed up to my ears, I'm grossly overdressed. And where does one stow a bag in a place like this? Something tells me I'm not going to need any of the things I packed. Sunscreen, towels, bottled water, three pairs of sunglasses— on the plus side, there are entirely too many people in the backyard of the White House to feel uncomfortable or self-conscious about my giant bag. My thoughts only stray as far as my next step. We squeeze through behind Adam and Rhett's large frames to the keg. I'm introduced to more guys from the hockey team, some I recognize from last night. Tiny? I can't help but ask of the guy who is anything but. Your name is Tiny? Tiny, I find out once I have a beer in hand, is a nickname because Tony Wakalsinski is the shortest player on the team. And I guess in comparison with Adam, who's at least five inches taller, I can sort of see it. I know how sensitive boys are about inches. Maverick finds us and joins the circle. Today he's wearing a brightly colored Hawaiian shirt left open to reveal his chiseled abs and tattoos. He lifts the bottle of Mad Dog in his hand. Shut. The other girls pass, but I'm feeling adventurous, so I take it and tip it back, letting some of the sweet liquid slide down my throat. I grimace. It's so sickly sweet that I chase it with beer, which doesn't really help since I'm not a fan of it either. All right, let's not get my baby sister shit-faced. Adam takes the bottle and takes a drink three times as big as mine as if he's trying to drink at all, so I won't. Anyone see pain? He's supposed to be bringing reinforcements. Maverick reaches for the nearly empty bottle and gives it a shake. No clue, Adam says. Thought he was with you. When Taryn shows up with her friends, that feels like my cue to leave. Mingle? I ask Dakota and Reagan. We make a circle around the party and head inside to check out the drink selection. This is not what I thought of when you guys said pool party. It's more bikini party unless you're brave enough to get in the pool, Reagan says. What's wrong with the pool? Going into the pool is the equivalent of posting an I'm here to get laid sign on your forehead, Dakota says. Which, if you're into that, it's totally fine, but don't say I didn't warn you. She holds up the vodka in invitation. Drink? After we swap out our beer for vodka and tonic, we head back outside. We sit on lounge chairs on the patio near a mister and watch the people in the pool. Some love matches, or rather hookups, are being made, while other people are being hilariously blown off. Dakota drills me with 20 questions while we people watch. Now that we've spent a little time together, she holds nothing back, but somehow the way she pries is endearing. So, no boyfriend? Reagan asks, leaning forward with her elbows on her knees. No, I say with a scowl. Dakota laughs. <laughs> oh, there's a story. Not a good one. Water drips onto my toes, and I look up to see Maverick leaning over and shaking his head on us. Bad dog. 
Dakota scolds him. I'm laughing as I dodge him, continuing to get us wet, when my gaze falls to a guy approaching from behind him. Ah, there he is, Maverick says, taking a seat next to me. Payne, where the hell have you been? Been around. His dark blue eyes land on me. He's got a 12-pack of hard seltzer under one arm, and my stomach flips. He pulls a bottle of Mad Dog out of his pocket and hands it to Maverick. Trade you. He motions with his head, and Maverick stands, giving up his seat and taking the bottle. He smells like soap and sun and wild dreams. Dreams you shouldn't allow because they're so out of reach, but you can't help but want. Dreams you don't speak of, but that live in the darkest corner of your mind. Swim, anyone? Maverick asks. I shake my head, as does Reagan. Oh, why not? Dakota stands, looks to me, and shrugs with a smirk. I'm going to find the bathroom. Do you want to come? Reagan asks me, then glances between me and Heath. I'm good. Heath opens the case and holds out a can. Drink? As I wrap my hands around the cold can, he holds tight and leans in. You look good. Do you want to skip this party and go make out? I laugh, but heat rushes to my core at the thought. Pass. You want to not skip this party and just make out right here? Definitely pass. I pull the drink from his hand and pop the top. After I've taken a long drink, I ask, Does that usually work for you? Honestly? I nod. Every time. I roll my eyes. What is wrong with women? I'm really good at making out. His stare darts to my mouth. I have no doubt. You and I are going to be just friends. Friends? His brows raise. I don't have girlfriends. You do now. Chapter 8 Heath Looks like the Scots are on the same page anyway. Friends? With Ginny? I can't stop staring at her lips. That's not a thing friends do, I don't think. When Reagan comes back from the bathroom, I'm disappointed at the prospect of sharing Ginny, but Reagan takes off her cover-up and tosses it on the lounge chair. I'm going in the pool. Anyone want to join me? Really? Ginny asks, and she and Reagan share some sort of look I can't decipher. Only live once. Coming? Ginny shakes her head and Reagan heads to the pool. You know it's a pool party, right? I ask when it's just the two of us again. She gives me an annoyed look and motions to her chest, covered by the swimsuit. But, uh, I might get lost a little too long staring at her chest. Also, not something a friend does. Something against swimming? No, I love to swim, but... She pauses. Dakota said the pool was where people go to find hookups. I try real hard to keep from smiling too big. Sweet, innocent Ginny's not looking for a casual hookup. I could have guessed that. It shouldn't make me happy because it also means I won't be hooking up with her, but for some reason I'm glad that no one else will be either. What do you want to do? I ask her. We've got people watching, which we're perfectly positioned for now. We could play one of the many party games, flip cup, beer pong, all the usuals. There's volleyball. I'm still offering up making out in case you want to rethink that one, or we can go to the pool and I'll swat the swarms of boys away so you can swim without being harassed. She rolls her eyes. Swarms? I mean, look at you. Yeah, swarms. And you're going to be my protector. Totally self-serving, I tell her honestly. How's that? I like spending time with you. She glances to the pool and I can see the longing there. Come on. I stand and take off my t-shirt. Her eyes flit over my chest and abs before she gets up and carefully removes her shorts and sandals. The light pink suit she's wearing dips low in the front and cuts up on her hips. Ginny's thin and her frame is small, but her boobs did not get the memo because they're disproportionately bigger. Thank fuck for disproportions. We enter the pool at the shallow end. A lot of people are swimming or hanging out near the edge, but I managed to snag a floaty for her. She leans her upper body onto it and we go to the middle of the pool. 
The water comes up to my armpits and I dip down so it covers my shoulders and I'm at eye level with Ginny. Her gaze darts around, taking it all in, but I see the exact second that she relaxes into the blue floaty and decides to be in the moment with me. I grab a hold of the floaty and let my legs drift underneath me. Music pumps through the speakers, and I close my eyes behind my sunglasses, soaking it in. Good tunes and a bunch of people hanging out, talking and laughing. Not a bad way to spend a Saturday. Not bad at all. You look pretty comfortable in here, she says. I open my eyes to see her skim her fingers across the water. This your typical hangout? Are you trying to ask if I use the pool to find my hookups? Do you? Don't knock it till you try it. She laughs, her lips pulling wide and flashing her straight white teeth. Maybe I will. Anyone you suggest? She lifts her head and glances around the pool. Just say the word. I find myself staring at her lips again. They're full, the lower ones so plump I want to trace it with my thumb and my tongue, and they're this perfect pink color. I'm not dating for a while. Boys suck. Why is it when girls get their heart broken, they go off men entirely? A guy gets his heart kicked in and he moves on to the next. Chicks aren't like that. Well, women are smarter. It takes you guys longer for your small brains to catch up and be broken hearted. A chuckle escapes from my lips and she smiles. I got out of a relationship right before I came to Valley. Might have heard something about that. Ugh, really? Adam told you about Brian? Not by name, but he did mention that you'd recently gotten out of something. He's worried about you. Wants me to look out for you. Her mouth gapes and her shoulders tense. Is that why you're... No, fuck no. Her hair is in another braid today, and I finger the end and tug it gently. I thought we established that I like hanging out with you. Same. Her body melts back into the raft and those perfect pink lips pull apart. How do you and my brother become roommates? I get the hockey connection, but you don't seem like the best of friends. Cheap rent, I tell her honestly. I wanted to move out of the dorms, but couldn't afford a place on my own. Your brother and I are cool. We're not the best of friends, as you said, but we get each other. He's a good captain. It's hot out, and there's really no escape from the sun in the middle of the pool, so we get out when Ginny's shoulders start to burn. Inside the house, we find Adam and his new girlfriend sitting with Maverick and a brunette he introduces as Maddie. Ralph Russ is there, too, with his phone in hand, no doubt texting his girlfriend. Little Scott. Maverick greets her as we take a seat. She bristles at the name, which I totally get. Since Nathan went to Valley 2, I've often been called Baby Pain, and that shit gets old really quick. She has a name, man, I tell him. His brows raise slightly, but he nods. Yeah, I know. Just messing around. Do you want something to drink? I ask her and stand. She nods, and I head outside to where we left our stuff. Dakota and Reagan are sitting in the lounge chairs we abandoned. Where's Jenny? Reagan asks. I grab the alcohol and all our clothing. Everyone's inside. I motion with my head and they follow. Got a crush on Ginny? Dakota asks with a tease to her voice. It's not like that. What is it like? She presses as we walk toward the house. She's cool. Cool? So you don't want to sleep with her? Of fucking course I want to sleep with her. She's beautiful and fun, and if I had standards, she'd exceed them. She's Scott's sister. She nods in understanding. He would kill you. Better get your shit unlocked then. It's written all over your handsome face. Inside, Liam has slid into my spot and a few others have crowded around the table. When Ginny sees me approaching with her things, she stands. Oh, thank you. I take her seat while she pulls on her shorts and steps into her sandals. The end of her braid swings forward into my face. Back and forth, all hypnotic-like. Reminds me of that movie Office Space, and I'm going deeper and deeper, way down into Ginny. When she's ready to sit, I crowd Liam and make room for her on half the seat. As she settles in, I wrap an arm around her to keep her from falling off. She smiles at me, all sun-kissed skin and smelling like chlorine and something twists in my gut. Heath? My name being called draws my attention to a group of girls walking up to the table. Hey, Kimberly, how are you? 
Good, good. She glances around the table, stopping on Routhrust for a few seconds longer than the others. He gets real busy staring at his phone. I don't get it. I get loyalty. I respect him for that, but if he wants a girlfriend, why not find one he can actually see? And fuck. Kimberly's stare finally finds its way back to me. What have you been up to? You didn't call. Jenny giggles quietly next to me and I squeeze her waist playfully as I answer. School, hockey, the usual. Well, let's hang out later. I give her a non-committal head bob. See ya. Friend of yours? Jenny asks with a smirk when she's gone. Never seen her before in my life. I wink and she giggles again. Her face is soft and sincere when she pulls away. Go. You don't need to keep an eye out for me just because my brother asked you to. I'm good. I thought I told you. I know what you said, but it's a party and... We're friends. Her insinuation is clear. She and I aren't happening. Go. She shoves at my shoulder playfully. I stand, though I don't know why. I don't want to hang out with Kimberly. All right, you know where to find me. I tug her braid one last time and head off to the pool. Chapter 9 Ginny The more I drink and the darker the sky gets, the more relaxed I feel. We moved back outside now that it's cooled off. I can feel the slight burn on my skin from earlier, and the breeze makes goosebumps dot my arm. Adam and Taryn are sharing a lounge chair next to me and Reagan. Dakota and Maverick are both in the pool. Maverick's tossing a beach ball back and forth with the girl he's been hanging out with all afternoon, and Dakota's full-on making out with some guy Reagan tells me is a basketball player. Liam sits on the ground between us. He's attached himself to my side. I can't tell if he's hitting on me or if he's another one of the guys Adams asked to keep an eye out for me. His approach is much more subtle than Heath's, and damn it if I don't prefer Heath's cocky playfulness to Liam's politeness. I find him in the pool. He's leaning against the side, and the girl I all but pushed him into hanging out with is next to him. She's facing him, her back to me, but I have a clear view of Heath. He smiles and holds a beer in one hand. They're not touching, at least that I can tell, but they're standing close. He laughs and his stare moves past her to me. It isn't the first time he's caught me staring in the last hour. I know he's all wrong for me. Dakota and Reagan have filled me in on all the guys and what they said about Heath is exactly what I expected. He hooks up, he's all for the fun, but he doesn't date, and he's never had a girlfriend that they're aware of. The reasons to not hook up with him are many, not the least of which is him being my brother's roommate and teammate. And if I'm totally honest, I'm not 100% over Brian. I think it's mostly turned into anger at the way he ended things and missing the idea of what I thought college would look like. We were supposed to be doing all of this together. But if we had, I wouldn't have met Dakota and Reagan, and I already can't imagine that. You're staring, Reagan says, nudging me with an elbow. I know, it's pathetic. She's beautiful. Do you know her? No, not really. I've seen her around. With Heath? She nods. If it's any consolation, I don't think it's serious. I think it's a lack of options and similar goals. Is the goal not going home alone? She laughs. Yeah, pretty much. And Heath's a hot commodity, especially now that he's been drafted. Drafted? Like to the NHL? It clicks before she answers. I remember Adam saying something about one of his teammates being drafted, but I didn't realize it was Heath. Heath and Maverick both already signed with teams. Standing, she slips into her shoes. Come on, I see Rhett playing flip cup. I take one last look at Heath, and our eyes catch again. I tear my gaze away first this time and stand. Let's do it. College is awesome. A-W-E-S-O-M-E, awesome.
Reagan and Dakota's laughter is a hazy sound as they help me into Adam's bed. I put a glass of water on the nightstand and your phone on the desk. Do you want help getting changed or at least out of those shoes? I think it's Reagan who asks. My eyes are shut and their voices are surprisingly similar. No, it's fine. This way I'll be ready to go to classes in the morning. No getting ready. Voila. Voila. I mean, voila. Tomorrow is Sunday, sweetie. How did you get so drunk? Dakota asks. I can tell it's definitely her this time. The little snort laugh she does gives her away. I'm not drunk, just tipsy and tired. Now I see the family resemblance. You're as stubborn as your brother. Last time Adam got drunk, he swore he was fine until he fell down the stairs on the way to the bar. I'm too tired to laugh, but the image in my head of my bossy and always in control brother tumbling down a flight of stairs is hilarious. Okay, night, Jenny. Sleep tight. Their footsteps retreat, and one of them flips the overhead light off before the door shuts. Wait, I call, not loudly enough. I groan and sit up, prying open my eyelids. A small strip of light underneath the door is the only thing saving me from total darkness. I get up and look for my phone, but I can't see anything. I flip the light on and take a deep breath. I still don't see my phone, but now I need to pee. I stumble out into the empty living room. Rhett came back at the same time as we did, but he must have gone to bed. I hurry into the bathroom and close the door, then fumble with the light switch. Only nothing happens. Damn Adam and his inability to change a freaking light bulb. It's really dark in here, and my pulse quickens. I find the door handle, turn and yank, but nothing happens. It's a standard turn lock, but no matter which way I turn, it doesn't seem to do anything, and my breathing gets more erratic with each failed attempt. Oh my god, this can't be happening. I close my eyes to try to trick myself into believing it isn't as dark as it is, but I'm already panicking too much to fool myself. I bang on the door. Little help in here? I wait for a few seconds before I try again, this time louder. Rhett's room is all the way across the apartment, and I have no idea if anyone else is home. I didn't see Heath when we left, and Mav was going to catch a ride with Adam and Taryn. Help! I slide down onto the floor before my legs can give out and continue banging with both fists. I try counting to focus on something else. One, two, I'm fine. Everything is fine. Three, four, someone will come home any second now. My hands fall to my lap and I suck in deep breaths. All the fuzzy edges from the alcohol are gone and I'm entirely too sober and aware that I'm trapped in a very dark, small room. Hot tears roll down my face. I yell as loud as I can through the crying. Help! Jenny? Heath's voice on the other side of the door makes me cry harder. Are you okay? I can't get the door open. The handle rattles. It's locked. I know it's too d dark to see, but I can't get it open either way I turn it. Could you get at him? Jenny, I'm going to kick the door open, but I need you to move back out of the way. Maybe step into the shower. Oh, okay. I crawl on my hands and knees and sit inside the tub, hugging my knees. Are you away from the door? Y yes. A second later, the cheap wood door slams in and against the wall, and the light from the living room pours in. Heath stands in the doorway, frozen as he takes me in, then rushes toward me. Are you all right? I nod even as I shiver and hug my knees tighter. He's quiet, and I'm all too aware of my ragged breaths filling the silence between us. I close my eyes and concentrate on taking slow and even breaths. One, two, three. Everything okay? Rat asks in that heavy Minnesota accent. I'm so embarrassed. I wonder if it's possible to never see any of Adam's teammates ever again. Can you get her a glass of water? Heath asks Rhett. My eyes fly open as my space is invaded, and Heath climbs into the tub in front of me. He doesn't exactly fit, and his long legs are bent and flank me on either side. His hands raise to my shoulders, and he strokes me gently. Deep breaths in through your nose. Yep, Epic proportions of embarrassment. Here you go. 
Rhett reappears with water in a big green plastic cup. Heath takes it and thanks him while I smile awkwardly. Uh, you guys good? Rhett shifts uncomfortably. Should I call Adam? I think he went with Maverick and Taryn on a taco run. Heath's fingers continue to stroke my arms and back. I've got her. That's all the convincing Rhett needs to get the heck out of my bubble of crazy. I'm fine. Really, you can go now, I say, chest still rising and falling too fast. Go back to the girl in your bed. You're not fine. You're having a panic attack. And there's no one in my bed. I left right after you. He hands me the cup of water. Try to take a sip or two. Sometimes forcing your brain to do something else helps. I do as he instructs, and the cool liquid does seem to help a tiny bit. Enough that I can better appreciate the man in front of me. He's shirtless, his ab muscles defined even as he sits. Blue basketball shorts hang on his hips, but his bare calves press against my back. When I finally feel the sharp edges of my fear dissipate, I finish the water and let out a long, cleansing breath. I'm sorry. For what? A ghost of a smile tugs at the corner of his mouth. His arms wrap around me again, and he rubs my back softly. For getting myself locked in, for that, I point toward the busted door. The trim hangs away from the wall where the lock pushed it away from the frame. That's nothing. Don't even worry about it. Are you feeling better? I nod. I want to go to bed. Okay. He moves his legs and groans. I think I might be stuck. Standing, I offer him my hand. He smiles goofily as he places his calloused palm in mine, and I attempt to help him up. Somehow we manage to get him upright, and he's so close my breathing picks up all over again, but for a completely different reason. He notices, and his brows furrow. Are you sure you're okay? I'll be fine. This kind of thing happened before? He asks, and then adds, When you've been drinking? I nod, refusing to meet his concerned blue eyes. I just need some sleep and to wake up and pretend this never happened. As gracefully as one can in this situation, I step out of the tub and glance at the burned-out light bulb over the vanity. How many hockey players does it take to change a light bulb? He follows me out of the bathroom. I walk to Adam's open bedroom and face him. Well, this was humiliating and awful. Pretend it never happened. His lips twist into a playful smile as he reaches out and squeezes my hand. Night, Jenny. In Adam's room, I flip the overhead light on and shut the door. And then I climb into bed and somehow sleep through the night. When I wake up, Adam is on the couch sleeping with Taryn curled up next to him. The rest of the house is quiet. I tiptoe to the bathroom and reach for the light before I remember— Except this time, the bathroom floods with light, and the door frame is fixed. It turns out it takes one hockey player to change a light bulb, and I have a very good idea which one it was. Chapter 10 Heath I'm lying in bed fully dressed when Maverick sticks his head in my room. Time to stop touching yourself and go get fondled by the elderly instead. I sit up and swing my legs onto the floor. Was that Mariah I heard while I was playing Xbox with Ralph Russ? He questions, dark eyebrows raised, and a playful smile on his lips. It's weird when you listen in, man. Just looking out for you. How thoughtful. We meet the rest of the team at the assisted living home. Coach's mom lives here. As such, this is where a good portion of our community service hours are done. At least once a semester, he drags us out here. Today, we're doing some outdoor landscaping. Manual labor shit that sucks balls, but in truth, I enjoy it more than going inside the place. It smells like old people, which makes sense, but I don't need reminders that we are all going to die, and if we are lucky, get to stink up the world on our way out. I learned that lesson the hard way when my dad died at 41. He didn't even get a chance to enjoy that mothball and shit stench. He'd gone out looking fit and healthy and smelling like aquadigio. I was 14 and thought he was invincible. 
Desert Rose is a massive place, so many residents, that I have to wonder if there are any old people left in Valley who aren't living here. The grounds are well cared for, flowers and shrubs trimmed to make Mother Nature look like a Monet painting. We're probably more of a hindrance than a help to the crew since they clearly have it under control, but the old people enjoy watching us work hard. The old men come to sit outside in lawn chairs and regale us with tales of their youth, sleight of hand reminders at the end of every tale to enjoy being young and stupid. Done and done. Scott and I are spreading rock with rakes along a pathway to a gazebo. I'm tired and a little hungover. It's hot work, no reprieve from the sun blasting down on us. Rhett said Ginny got locked in the bathroom last night, he says, breaking the silence. I'm really not sure how much to say. She was in a full-blown panic, but I don't want to freak out at him. However, it sounds like Routhrus filled him in. Yeah, she got in there with no light and couldn't get the door open to get out. Oh, shit. He stops raking and stares at me with wide eyes. Ginny's got a thing with the dark. She okay? It took a few minutes to calm her down, but she seemed all right when she went to bed. I put a fresh bulb in just in case. She was gone this morning before I woke up, and she hasn't answered my texts. That must be why she left so early this morning. I'll check on her after we're done here. Thanks, man. I appreciate you looking out for her. I swallow thickly and nod. His request to look out for her wasn't even a factor in it or really any of the times I've hung out with her. I like her. I like being with her. She makes me be in the moment more deeply. I'm not looking for hookups or to get drunk. I want to sit beside her, pull her hair, and tease her. Basically, I'm five again. I was thankful that I was there last night when she needed me. Last semester me wouldn't have been. He'd have been wasted, or with a girl. I take my shirt off and tuck it in my back pocket. It's so damn hot out. It's nice not to have the material sticking to my sweaty back, but now I can practically feel the sun turning my back into a barbecue grill. Adam looks past me. The old women at six o'clock are not so subtly undressing you with their eyes. I pause and lean against the rake. Sure enough, three ladies with snow-white hair are walking toward us in monochromatic cotton ensembles and thick Dr. Scholl's sole-type shoes. Take it off. Scott, give the ladies something to live another day for, I taunt him. I get it if you don't want them comparing our bodies and finding you lacking. Good morning, ladies, he says as they approach. He stands straight, lifts the hem of his shirt, and wipes his face. The ladies pause, taking in his abs, and when he drops the material, he tosses me a smirk. Fucker. You boys are doing a wonderful job. The one in the middle drops her gaze. As she brings it back to my face, I wink. Just trying to make this place as beautiful as you. Mav appears out of nowhere. The guy has a freaky ability to find the center of attention. I hand him my rake. I'm going for water. Make yourself useful. I take my empty water bottle inside to the water fountain and fill it. Bert's in his usual spot, sitting in front of the TV watching CSI or ESPN. I only know his name because someone is always yelling at him. He's a grumpy old prick, always sitting alone, and always pissing someone off. He's beating the remote on the arm of the chair, cursing under his breath. No one pays him any attention. A nurse walks by and sighs. I can't really blame her for not rushing to his aid. I've only been here a few times, and even I'm tired of his shit. Goddamn remote. He tosses it across the room, and it skips along the white tile floor, coming to a stop in my path back outside. I lean down and pick it up and walk it over to him. He frowns as I hold it out. Trouble with the remote? Trouble with everything. He grumbles as he punches at the buttons with his thumb. Maybe it's the batteries. Already changed them out twice to be sure they weren't dicking me around. That Sharon's got it out for me. He twists his body in his chair and hollers over his shoulder. Are you sure this is the right remote? Sharon, I presume, doesn't even look up as she calls back. Yes, Mr. Thomas, I'm sure. I'll send Louie over to help as soon as he gets done with bedpans. Bert snarls. I wouldn't want Louie's nasty hands on my remote either. I could give it a try if you want, I offer. He holds it out with another sigh, as if I'm the last person he really wants to put his trust in. Again, can't say that I blame him, but a man should at least have TV if he's going to sit around in this depressing place all day. 
I tested out, pressing the channel up button with the same result Bert had. It's on the wrong input. I tell him and hold it so he can see. I press TV and then the channel button again, this time with success. He keeps frowning as he takes it back in a liver-spotted hand and tries it for himself. I don't get a thank you or even an acknowledgement before I leave him to CSI. If the options are going out young and unaware or old and hating the world, I think I'm in favor of the first. Live hard and die happy. Desert Rose treats us to lunch after we're done. The guys are all in good spirits. Everyone's talking and laughing as we go through the buffet line set up for us. We're starting to get a nice camaraderie among the group, and I hope it translates to the ice when we get out there. We spread out under the pavilion, sweaty and dirty, but so hungry. Mav and I sit across from one another. The place goes silent as we eat. Even Mav barely speaks as we devour everything on our plates and then grab seconds. I finish and then guzzle what remains of my water. You want to grab a beer after this? Mav asks. Nah, not today. Xbox? He asks as we stand to leave. I shake my head and we walk to his car. I need a shower and to find Ginny. She still hasn't responded to my text from earlier. Movie? No. I slide into the passenger seat and Mav opens the driver's side door and gets in. Running out of options, buddy. He starts the car and taps his thumb on the steering wheel as he thinks. Girls? Now you've got it. But just one girl. Sharesies? He seems surprised, but dare I say a little excited about the idea. I lean back against the headrest. Tired laughter slips out. Really, man? I don't have an exact plan. Find Ginny, make sure she's good, then convince her to spend more time with me. You wouldn't share with me? What if I sing Mariah and promise to keep my hands to myself? I don't know if he's kidding or not, but I wouldn't put anything past Maverick. Absolutely fucking not. I don't want to share one second of my time with Ginny. Not with anyone. Chapter 11 Ginny and that's the story of why I'm never going back to my brother's apartment. I'm sure it wasn't that bad. Reagan gives me a hopeful smile across the table. I snuck out of Adam's early this morning and went straight to Dakota and Reagan's. They're consoling me over brunch at a cute little cafe they like. I was having a full-on panic attack in the bathtub. I have an issue with dark and closed spaces. I wave it off, hoping they don't ask more about that piece because I don't really feel like going into the specifics. It was absolutely that bad. Dakota snickers and takes a bite of her bagel. It's kind of romantic, Reagan insists, crawling into the tub with you and calming you down. I'm impressed, although not that surprised, that Heath was the one to come to your rescue. He's got that cocky but capable look about him. Still, I'm not sure I would have known what to do, so you were really lucky. It wasn't romantic. It was pity. I groan and bury my head in my arm on the table for a second. When I lift it back up, they're both smiling at me. It's too bad. I like teeth. Now I'm going to have to avoid him until I can look at him without wanting to disappear into the ground. Are you a drama major like this one? Dakota asks and points her bagel toward Reagan. No, why? She smiles and I toss a crumpled napkin at her. Ha ha, very funny. We've all made fools of ourselves one time or another. It's college, it's fine. Dakota finishes her bagel and grabs her coffee. Do you need to get back to the dorm or do you want to hang out today? I need to shower and change, but I don't have anything after that. You'll want to shower after, but we can swing by the dorm on the way because you need sneakers. On the way where, I ask, standing and following them out of the booth. I gasp as we jog around the Valley U campus track. When you said hang out, I was picturing Netflix or Manny Petty's. Two more laps and then we switch to speed walking, Dakota says, sounding far too comfortable talking while jogging. 
The Scott pride and competitive nature keeps me pushing on, but when we finally begin walking, I'm a lot more sweaty and tired than these two. Do you guys do this often? Three times a week, Reagan says, sounding only slightly out of breath. Why? I like to run, Dakota says. She was on the track team, Reagan adds. I let her drag me along because it justifies the really big slice of cheesecake I'm going to have later while I make Dakota watch Lifetime movies. What's Ava, your roommate, like? Dakota asks, swiftly changing the subject. Ava and Trent hadn't been at the dorm when we'd stopped by, but Trent's things were still there. I can't wait to sleep in my own bed tonight. She's really nice. Her boyfriend goes to school at Northern. That's why I was at Adams this weekend. He was visiting, and I wanted to give them some privacy. Hopefully next weekend she goes to his campus, because I'm going to need a few weeks while I'm in a hiding. You can always crash with us. The bathtub is all yours, Reagan teases. Thanks a lot, jerks, I say with a smile. Trent's gone, and Ava's asleep in her bed when I get back. I shower and then get into my own bed to nap, but last night plays over and over in my mind. Adam and Heath have both texted, but I only responded to my brother with a quick, I'm fine, it was nothing, that will hopefully keep him from asking more. A knock at our door gets me out of bed, and I'm half expecting it to be Adam. It would be just like him to skip texting back altogether and want to check on me in person, but it's Heath standing in the hallway. What are you doing here? He smirks and adjusts the baseball hat on his head. It's nice to see you, too. Sorry, hello, how are you today? Great weather we're having. What the heck are you doing at my dorm, and how did you know where I lived? His rough chuckle pulls a smile from my lips. Good, agreed. I wanted to see you, and... He leans in closer. I can't reveal all my secrets. He's full-on grinning at me with a mocking glint in his eyes. Come on, take a walk with me. A uh, walk? Sure, you got something better to do? I was planning on taking a nap. Sleep's boring, come on. Am I really having to talk you into this? It's gorgeous outside, and we can stop at the dining hall to feed you. Me? Now that you mention it, I could eat. He doesn't move, and I relent. One minute. I leave him in the hallway, shut the door, and change out of my comfy yoga pants and into a pair of shorts. I swipe on lip gloss and a dab of mascara. When I pull the door open, he's leaning against the wall, one ankle crossed over the other and hands in his pockets. Ready? He pushes off the wall and motions for me to go first. If you are. We cross the street to the dining hall in silence. Heath seems perfectly at ease with the quiet while I have a million questions on the tip of my tongue. He holds the door out for me. I should have assumed spending time with you would mean eating. Always, he says. Plus, it's where we met. We have history here. I huff a laugh and grab a tray. Now that we're here, I am kind of hungry. Heath gets a much smaller portion of food than normal, and I raise a brow. I already ate lunch once, he admits. We take our food to our usual table. What time did you sneak out this morning? He asks. I hesitate with a chip up to my mouth. I didn't sneak out. His left brow rises as he takes a bite of food. Okay, fine. I very quietly left at a ridiculously early time. Happy? Obviously not, since I tracked you down. I'm fine, okay? He shrugs. As we eat, he tells me about his morning with the team doing community service, and I tell him about running with the girls. Congrats on being drafted, by the way. Adam mentioned it this summer, but I didn't piece together it was you until Reagan mentioned it last night. Thanks. He sits back in his chair, drinking his water and studying me. What? I ask self-consciously. Trying to figure you out. What are you into? Everything and nothing. I didn't play sports in high school or anything like that. Had to have been into something. I was into socializing. Turns out you can't make a career of that unless your parents are rich and famous. Damn those Kardashians. Right? Genevieve, Genevieve, Genevieve. 
I love the way my full name sounds when he says it. I was always sort of embarrassed by it. Teachers would comment on how beautiful it was, which to a middle schooler is super humiliating. Kids would taunt me with it, at least until I got boobs. Then it became some sort of bad pickup line. Genevieve, huh? Cool name. Hugh swooning. Not. Except I'm sort of swooning now, and all he did was say my name. And I'm also staring at him when I'm supposed to be saying something. Anything. Heath, Heath. Heath. His playful smile makes my stomach flip. I'm going to get ice cream. I stand before he can comment and take my time at the dessert bar, creating a perfect Sunday. He's picking at the chips on my tray when I get back. I assumed you were done. They're all yours. What is that? He asks, face twisted in disgust as he eyes my bowl of ice cream. Neapolitan with sprinkles and gummy bears. All the flavors are touching. I laugh and bring a big spoonful of all three flavors to my mouth. He continues to watch on, horrified. I don't understand Neapolitan flavor. It's ice cream for people who can't make a decision. Not true. The decision is we want all three and don't want to settle for one boring flavor. I offer him my spoon. Want to try it? His mouth pulls into a tight line and he shakes his head. Come on. I sit forward and lean over the table to get the spoon closer to his mouth. He opens and I feed him, which turns out to be a surprisingly intimate thing. His throat works, eyes locked on mine, as I sit back and study his reaction to the food. Well? I think I swallowed a gummy bear whole, he says, voice tight. We finish the rest of my ice cream, and if Heath eating more than half of it is any indication, I'd say he likes my Neapolitan Sunday just fine. After, we take a walk around campus. It isn't as busy as it is during the week, but lots of other people are out walking, hanging out in the shaded areas, playing frisbee, and some are even going in and out of buildings. Eventually, we take a seat on the ledge of the fountain in the center of campus. It's one of my favorite spots. So, you're all right? What? I try to play it off like I don't know what he's talking about, but his serious expression says it all. Oh, yeah, I'm fine. I dig through my pocket for a penny, close my eyes, and toss it into the fountain. What do you wish for? I can't tell you, or it won't come true. It's quiet, and I hope we've successfully avoided talking any more about last night until he asks... You've had them before, right? Panic attacks? Adam said you had a thing with the dark. I consider lying, but it feels as if it couldn't get any more embarrassing with the truth. Really, I'm fine. I don't like being trapped in dark places. And sure, I've had them before, but it isn't like a common occurrence. I quit talking and hope I've said enough to make me seem less crazy. My mom used to have them. The first time she thought she was dying or having a heart attack scared the shit out of both of us. I finger the hem of my shorts and avoid meeting his gaze. It's okay. I didn't bring it up to make you embarrassed. I just wanted you to know it's nothing to be ashamed of. I'm not ashamed. I just prefer not to need to be rescued by my brother's insanely hot friend. I slap a hand over my mouth. Forget I said that. Clearly there was something wrong with those gummy bears, and it's making me say crazy things. He quirks a brow. You think I'm insanely hot? Did I say insanely? That was the gummy bears talking. I mean, objectively, yes, you're hot. But it isn't like I think you're hot. His hand comes up and brushes my hair back from my face. His thumb traces my bottom lip. He leans in, and the seconds while his lips descend on mine seem to happen in slow motion while my pulse quickens. My eyes flutter closed, and finally his mouth covers mine. His lips are soft, but his scruff is scratchy against my smooth skin. His hand at my face slides to the back of my neck, cupping it with his large palm as his mouth widens and his tongue asks for entrance. His tongue feels divine. Kissing Heath feels divine. He's a great kisser, and even though it's only my neck and lips he's touching, I feel it everywhere. 
When he pulls back, I'm breathless and turned on. Jesus. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. His words are like a bucket of cold water dumped over my lady parts. Why not? Because maybe you were right. You're off men, I'm not capable of being more than your friend without ruining everything else. Your brother is my teammate. Pick a reason, I guess. Those gummy bears are making you do crazy things, too. He smirks. Friends? Is he serious? He wants to be friends after that kiss? But I did just get out of a relationship, and it's probably not the best idea to jump into something one week into college. So I nod. Friends. September. Chapter 12. Heath. Ginny takes the seat across from me with a bowl of ice cream. I'm ready for fall. My boobs are sweaty just from walking across the street. I totally get it, Mav says. My balls. All right, too much information, man, I tell him. I don't see how it's any different than Ginny's boobs. Mav shrugs and goes back to his homework laid out on the table in front of him. Boobs, Mav. It's different because boobs. Ginny giggles, not the least bit offended by my buddy or me, and slides the bowl along the top of the table to me without asking if I want any. The chemistry between Ginny and I is hard to ignore. I thought friendzoning myself would take away the tension, but even when she says things like sweaty boobs, I find I'm wishing the clock would move a little slower so we could spend more time together. There are too many complications. For one, I don't need the team captain having it out for me. And then there's the fact that I don't want to stop hanging out with Ginny. If that means being friends instead of kissing her so I don't screw things up, then so be it. Better friends than nothing at all. I smile as I stare down at her bowl of ice cream. She never gets gummy bears on top anymore. I don't know if she really believes it was their fault she admitted I was hot and let me kiss her or not, but the loss of them makes me a little sad. Hard, awful little things. I take a small bite and push it back. That's all you're eating? Gotta get the seasoned diet back on track. We're taking the ice today. I can barely keep from jumping out of my skin. I want to be out there so badly. Mav looks up and nods, but then groans. It's going to be short-lived for me if I fail this British literature test. He hits his head on his book several times and then sits up and closes it. He barely scraped by with grades good enough to play last year, and Coach is watching him closely. You still have Tanya's number? I think she tutors. Uh, yeah, maybe. I pull my phone up and find her and hand the phone to Maverick. I wouldn't tell her you got her number from me, though. She's not my biggest fan. Did she tutor you? Ginny asks. No, she did not. What we had was much more honest. A quickie in a bathroom at a party last year. She wanted to continue the fun, and I didn't. Maybe I can help, Ginny says. I love literature. Really? Mav looks hopeful. Sure. Tonight? While they make plans, I sit back and watch Ginny. She's nice, interesting, funny, and a little naive, but naive in that way that she still believes in the good of people and situations, and being around her makes me believe a little more, too. There isn't anything I don't like about her. Every little detail. It's safe to say Ginny Scott's grown on me, just like Neapolitan ice cream. I look forward to our meals together. She's never mentioned the gummy bear-induced illicit kiss, and neither have I, but we both show up at the same time for breakfast and lunch every day to eat together. Sometimes Maverick and the guys are with us, sometimes not, but the two of us never miss. Lunch, friends. I can think of worse things to be. I can think of better things, too. After lunch, I head to the rink for practice. I'm early, but I can't wait another minute to get out on the ice. The weeks of preseason workouts on the football field are hot and grueling, but I'd do it three times a day if it meant stepping on the ice sooner. Adam's in the locker room already dressed when I walk in. Hey, he says when he sees me. Couldn't wait either? I barely slept last night, I admit. He chuckles and heads toward the door. Guess it'll be easy to stop you from scoring today. You wish, I call after him. As I walk to the ice, I feel a sense of peace and an unbridled excitement. One month without skating and I feel like I'm regaining a limb. 
I respect Coach's idea that a month of practice on the turf, learning to work as a team, makes us stronger before we step out onto the ice, but man, how I've missed it. I breathe in the cool air as my skates glide over the fresh ice. I nod to Adam, who's skating with that same look of joy on his face. We skate in silence for a few minutes before he juts his chin for me to join him. We take turns passing and shooting. I'm sweaty and breathless, but in the best way. When the rest of the team arrives, Coach Myers and Coach Kelly start us with speed drills and then some power play scenarios. My heart races and adrenaline courses through me as I skate hard. Move your feet, Coach Myers bellows from his spot in the opposing side fan section. There you go. Nice. I'm gonna puke, Maverick says on a raspy breath as I fall back into line. How are you out of shape? We spent the last month running our asses off. Can't run this sweet ass off, he says, straight-faced. Beautiful genetics, but not great for speed. I laugh. You're blaming your ass for being slow? Really? He smirks and takes off as Coach blows the whistle for the next person to go. Practice goes by entirely too fast. The girls' team practices in 30 minutes, so I can't even linger like I want to. Not everyone is so sad to be done. Jordan's face is red and splotchy, and he mutters, Oh, thank God, I was burping ham and cheese. I swear it was coming up in the next five minutes. I'm the last one off the ice. Adam notices and laughs at what I'm guessing is close to a pout on my face. I'm totally not beyond kicking and screaming and throwing a tantrum if I thought it'd work instead of Coach Myers making me run laps around the football field. Come on, Payne. I'll buy you a beer. At the hideout, Adam pays for two pitchers and sets it down on the table before handing out glasses. Mavs filled his glass and taken a long drink before the pitcher even makes its way to me. Dude, maybe it's the beer gut and not your ass that's the problem. He flips me off, continues drinking, and then says, Hey man, how much do you think Coach Meyer will pay you to babysit Liam and Jordan this year? Minimum wage? I grimace and he laughs, knowing he's hit a sore spot. Coach had me on a line with two freshman forwards today. Both need a lot of work. It's going to be a great season, Adam insists, always wearing his captain hat. Frozen Four this year. Last chance to secure my legacy as a Frozen Four champ before graduation. I lift my glass. Ginny is waiting at the apartment when we get back. What are you doing here? Adam asks and takes a seat on the couch next to her. Maverick and I are studying Shakespeare. Adam looks to Mav. You know, you don't live here, man. I ordered pizzas, he says, standing in the doorway. Gotta take Charlie out. Back in five. When he's gone, Ginny looks from Adam to me. How was it being back on the ice? Amazing, we say in unison. Ginny giggles. I'm going to shower, Adam says, standing and pulling off his shirt. Save me some thin crust. Come keep me company while Mav is gone. I motion for Ginny to follow me back to my room, and she does. She walks in and scans the room before taking a seat on the bed, feet dangling off the side. I drop my bag and then pull out a pair of basketball shorts and t-shirt. I take off the shirt I'm wearing and toss it in the hamper without thinking about it. Ginny's eyes are fixed on my chest. I wait for her to catch herself, but she's full on checking me out. Hey, friend? Hmm. Eyes are up here, I say with a wink. She rolls her brown eyes, but then they land back on my bare upper body. You're seriously cut. Maybe I should give up ice cream. Don't you dare. You're perfect. Charlie zips into my room, jumps onto the bed, and covers Ginny with slobbery kisses. She smiles and leans away, but pets her behind the ears. Down, Charlie. Mav appears in the doorway, and Charlie goes to his side. Ready, Ginny? Yeah. She scoots off the bed. See you out there? I nod and watch my friend and the object of my fascination walk out of my room. I might need a shower and some Mariah first. Chapter 13 Ginny The following night, Reagan's sitting at her vanity with the laptop open in front of her while I stand off to the side doing her makeup. 
I can't believe how much it looks like the girl on the video. I swear I tried a few of these and it never looks anything like it's supposed to. Ava's been letting me practice on her. I glance at the girl on the screen and back to Reagan. The winged eye looks really good on you. Putting makeup on Reagan is fun. She's so naturally beautiful, I probably couldn't make her look bad if I tried, but she's right. I managed to get it pretty close to the girl on camera. You're hired. Someday when I'm a big, well-known actress, I'm going to force you to do my makeup every day. In fact, I wish you could do my makeup for the winter play. Reagan is a theater major, and according to Dakota, she kicks ass in the school plays. Doesn't the department hire someone to do makeup for the performances? Yes, the previous stage director's mother, Ms. Morrison. She's lovely and nice and has been doing makeup for the university performances for something like 20 years. But last spring, she had me looking like a clown. There's stage makeup, and then there's straight up too much blush. I brush a little shimmer powder along her cheekbones. Well, I'm happy to do it anytime. Seriously, doing your makeup every day is my dream job. Why aren't you going to school to be a makeup artist? Dakota asks from the bed. She's lying on her side, looking at her phone. Unless you work in a salon or store, it's a lot of freelance gigs like wedding days and special occasions. Plus, there's so much pressure to get it perfect so they feel beautiful and confident. Well, I feel both right now, so I think you'd be great at it. Reagan purses her lips and then smiles. Speaking of jobs, I need to find one if I'm going to be able to move out next year. Do you guys know of anything on campus or off? I was thinking about checking local restaurants and cafes. Rooming with Ava has been great. We get along well, and she doesn't have any crazy habits like leaving out old food or rummaging through my things without asking. But I don't want to do dorm life again next year. The Hall of Fame is always looking for guides, Dakota says. Guides? She sits up and abandons her phone. Yeah, we do tours for local groups like schools and other organizations, but we also get to help with recruitment. I can ask my boss if you want. Just like that? Well, I'm not going to lie. The fact that you're Adam Scott's little sister will probably help. My boss has a giant crush on him. What? I ask at the same time Reagan mutters. Who doesn't? Dakota and I look to her. What? Come on, he's hot. No, not only hot, he's nice, and... She trails off. I'm just saying, it isn't totally ridiculous that she has a crush on him. Dakota shakes her head. Well, whatever, but every time he's around, she gets all flustered and blushes. Gross. That's so weird, but whatever, the job sounds fun. Great, I'm working tomorrow, so I'll ask. I get up and pull my phone out of my pocket so I can take pictures of my work. Stand against the wall. I point to a blank section of white wall in her room, and Reagan moves in front of it. The guy you were crushing on earlier this year, it was Adam, right? What? Reagan freezes. No, of course not. I only meant I could understand it. Is it Heath? Seems like a long shot since he's not dating anyone, but I need her to rule him out anyway. It would be too weird if she was into him. Definitely no. Why definitely no? Heath is great. Rhett? Dakota asks. Would you two stop trying to guess? I'm not telling you, and it doesn't matter anyway. Every time I'm around him, I go stupid shy. I need a guy more on my level. Plus, I have a new crush, and he is single, and he asked for my number. My phone pings, and I take a few photos of Reagan's makeup. That's Maverick. I'm going over to study with him again. Can you do this for my date? Reagan makes a circle in front of her face. Absolutely, but you don't need my help to look gorgeous. I grab my stuff and wave as I head out. Maverick is already at Adam's apartment when I get there. He's on the couch with Charlie next to him. Rhett and Heath are playing video games. Did I miss Adam? I sit in the chair next to Heath. He bumps my shoulder. Yeah, you left for Terrans a few minutes ago. Does she ever come here? Nah, not really. I get up and haul my backpack to the table and pull out my laptop and a copy of Shakespeare's sonnets I borrowed from the library. Maverick follows and takes the chair across from me. 
Charlie lies at his feet. Do you want me to take a look at your notes, or should we jump into the study questions? He heaves a dramatic sigh. My notes might be shit. He hands over a notebook filled with three pages of his small penmanship. Did you write down everything the professor said? I ask, baffled as I scan over them. The amount of detail he's captured is crazy. Uh, yeah. I wasn't sure what was important and what wasn't, so I wrote down damn near everything. I'm not sure either. Wow, okay. The test is an essay? Yeah. Payne, phone's going off in your room. Maverick calls to him. Heath stands with the controller, backing out of the room. Ah, ah fuck. I'm cornered, Pot. One second. He rushes into his room and out of view, but I hear him answer the phone. His voice lowers and softens. That tells me immediately he's talking to a girl. A surge of white-hot jealousy heats my face. He comes back out, phone to his ear, and tosses the controller on the couch. Sorry, man, gotta take this, he says to Rhett, and then disappears back into his room, shutting the door behind him. So, what do you think? Maverick asks, bringing me back to the present. These notes are great. We spend the next 15 minutes picking out things we think he can use. Maverick is detailed and thorough in his studying. It surprises me he's failing, actually. At least until I start asking him questions about it and his attention is about as focused as Charlie's. What was the question again? He asks. I laugh and he gives me a sheepish grin. I really fucking hate this class. Why are you taking it? I thought it would be an easy A. I breezed through American literature. Okay, well, how did you study for that class? I don't know. He leans over and pets his dog, and a smile pulls at his lips. Heath and I read the books out loud to each other in funny accents. Heath helped you study? Did you have the class together? Not together, but we were both taking it. Different professors. Most of the reading was the same, though. Were you roommates? Yeah, we lived in the dorms together last year. I'm suddenly less interested in studying than I am about hearing Heath helping Maverick study. What I would give for a peek into the past of those two reading Hemingway. Okay, well, we can try that. I grab the book off the table between us. The first five sonnets? I've already read them. But now that you know the form and themes, I think you'll be able to pick them out easier. Maybe they'll make more sense. Yeah, all right. I clear my throat and open it to the first page and start reading. As I'm finishing it and handing the book over to Maverick for a turn, Heath's door opens and he steps out. Payne, say your sexy ass down and read me some Shakespeare. Heath takes a seat and to my surprise, he takes the book. You're reading it out loud? It helped last year. Worth a try, right? Heath crosses one ankle over the other. What do we have here? Sonnets, Maverick says. A deep laugh rolls out of him as he brings the paper back up and starts reading. His voice is crisp and the gravelly timbre is easy to slip right under. His pitch varies and practically sings along the stanzas. I'm falling into it so deeply and I'm not even the one who needs to be paying attention. Heath looks up as he's flipping the page and our eyes meet over the top of the book. Do it in your British accent, Maverick begs. Heath looks like he might object, but then Maverick sticks his bottom lip out like he's pouting. Heath looks to me again quickly before he starts again. I giggle at his accent, but my stomach flips. Shakespeare will never be the same. As I'm packing up to leave, Maverick thanks me. I'm not sure how much I actually helped, but it was fun. Do you feel good about it? Yeah, Shakespeare's the shit. I laugh. Next week, then? Sure. Also, I was thinking, if listening helps, you could try audiobooks. Maybe, but then I'd miss out on Heath reading to me. He winks at Heath and then whistles to get Charlie's attention. I'm out. See you tomorrow. The man has a point. My body still tingles from Heath's voice reading such beautiful words. Rhett went to his room earlier, so it's just me and Heath as I shoulder my backpack. 
He's right, you have a really nice voice. One side of his mouth pulls up into a boyish smile. Thanks, I have no idea what I was reading. I won't tell Maverick. Do you have to run off, or do you want to stay and hang out? I can stay for a bit. Yeah? He smiles wider like he'd been expecting me to say no, then takes my backpack off my shoulder and carries it to his room. He puts my bag on the floor and then clears the clothes and books off his bed so we can sit. There's a box addressed to him at the end, still unopened. What's that? Oh, uh, my brother and his fiance send me these care packages every month. He looks a little uncomfortable to admit it. My mom did that for Adam his first semester. Now that I think of it, she hasn't sent me one yet, although she has been distracted with all the fabulous trips they've been taking. The last time I talked to her, she and my dad had just returned from one trip, and she was already planning another with her girlfriends. Every month? Yeah, pretty much without fail. What's inside? Random shit. Different every month. He pulls at the tape and dives in, looking more excited than he'd seemed a few seconds ago. Gift card? He sets it on the bed. Granola bars, gum. Nathan must have put this one together. You guys are pretty close then? I ask as I watch him pull out more stuff, all food-related, shocker, and lay it on the bed. Yeah, we're cool, but it makes me crazy how he's always trying to take care of me like I'm still a kid. I get that. Man, do I get that. But this is really nice. I motion to the gifts laid out on the bed. But I don't need him to send me stuff. I could buy all this on my own. Our dad passed when I was in middle school, so I think he feels like he needs to step into those shoes and make sure I'm okay. Or maybe he just wants to show you he cares with stuff he thinks you might need or want. Yeah, maybe. He laughs lightly and picks up a Ziploc bag filled with quarters. What do you suppose he was trying to say with this? I have no idea. I take the bag. It's heavy and must have at least $10 worth of quarters in it. Enjoy the vending machines? Chapter 14. Heath. A knock at the door breaks my concentration, and I rub the back of my neck as I call, Come in. Adam steps into my room with a beer in each hand. He holds one out to me. You know there's a party out there, yeah? I accept the drink and set it on the desk. I'm just finishing up work. He takes a seat on my bed. You're still working for that sports website? I am. John in Texas wants to know how many hours a day he needs to practice in order to make his high school team. Adam pauses with the beer up to his lips. Depends on how bad he is. Yeah, I'm gonna need a more polite way to say that. He considers for a moment. Tell him to focus on quality sessions, practicing until he masters small skills instead of focusing on time. Quality over quantity. Not bad. I won't even charge you for using it, he stands. Hurry up. Someone needs to beat Ralph Russ at Halo, and you're the only one that can. It's a matter of life or death, man. His ego is going to make his head explode. I pop the top of the beer and take a long drink before answering John. Nathan got me a job working for Reeves Sports, an instructional sports website owned by pro golfer Lincoln Reeves, the summer before I started college. Link has become a good buddy, so even though things aren't so destitute anymore that I need to have a job, it's nice to have extra cash and the job itself is fun. I answer questions from hockey players all over the world looking to up their game. The party is loud and Maverick is louder when I finally close my laptop and head out to the living room. I grab another beer and make a lap to see who came. It's mostly the usual suspects, the team, their girlfriends, puck bunnies, but the sight of Ginny on the deck playing flip cup makes me smile. It's her turn and she chugs her beer and then sets her cup on the edge of the table, flipping it over on the rim her first try. She squeals, and the next person goes. I step up behind her. What happened to the girl who didn't like beer? I guess she's getting used to it. I guess you are. Her hair is braided in pigtails, and I tug one end. Excuse me? Dakota pokes her head between us. I need my girl here for the next game. She's our secret weapon. 
Ginny smiles as Dakota pulls her back toward the table. See you later, Genevieve. I head inside where Ralph Russ is still dominating anyone who dares to take him on. He's got a puck bunny on either side, but I swear the guy doesn't even realize it. Or if he does, he's really good at acting disinterested. Jordan groans as he takes his turn losing. I give up. I hold out my hand for the controller. Don't take it so hard. Any kid with a name like Rhett Roger Routhrus would be good at video games. Routhrus grunts a laugh. He's not wrong. Kids are assholes. At least until I got big enough, they were scared to mock me. That's awful, Jordan says. Why would your parents name you that? Routhrus stares blankly at him and doesn't answer. Move over, freshman. Let me show you how it's done. An hour or two must pass while I refuse to give up my seat, waving off anyone else who wants a turn. This is personal, I tell them, from one weird kid to another. The girl sitting next to me drapes her hand on my thigh. I have no idea how long she's been there or how long she's been touching me. I guess now I understand why Routhrust was oblivious to the two hanging next to him earlier. You were a nerd? she asks. I don't believe it. Not a nerd, just weird. She looks at me unbelievingly, so I add, Dead dad, non-functioning mom. The words have barely left my mouth before I regret them. I don't talk about my family shit ever, but drunk Heath is a very sharing Heath. I don't usually drink so much, but I ran out of beer several games ago, and instead of getting up to get another, I switched to sharing gulps of the Mad Dog bottle Maverick is passing around. I glance around and notice the party is starting to die down. Inside, it's me, Mav, Ralph Russ, and the girls between us. Voices still carry from the deck outside. I'm gonna get some air. Standing, I'm much more aware of how drunk I am. My legs feel a little too light and kind of wobbly. The group outside is almost as small as the one inside. Adam and the girl he's been seeing, Taryn, a few guys from the team, plus Reagan, Dakota, and Ginny. Adam spots me first, and his loud laughter barks into the night. Gumby Legs is back. He's drunk. I lean against the railing beside Ginny. Her sweet smile hits me in the gut. Hi, Genevieve. Hi, Heath, she says, still smiling at me. You look happy. I feel pretty happy. We should play sardines tonight, Dakota says. Is Maverick still inside? I nod. Yep. You guys in? She looks around to everyone. What's sardines? Taryn asks. I don't think that's a good idea, Adam says, arms wrapped around Taryn's waist, but his gaze is on Ginny. It's kind of like hide-and-seek, Dakota answers Taryn. Ginny looks uncomfortable under her brother's scrutiny, but her words are enthusiastic. Yeah, let's do it. The walk to campus in the dark with the fresh air sobers me up a little. Jenny's still smiling like something's funny as I walk beside her. What? You're lifting your knees so high. It's adorable. You're adorable, I fire back. She giggles, links her arm through mine, and leans in. Her boob presses into my forearm, and all I can think about is reaching over and squeezing it like a stress ball. I completely understand that this is not acceptable behavior for friends, drunk or not, so I don't. But I think about it anyway. At the edge of campus, Adam turns, so he's walking backward. Jenny, you good? I'm fine. Her tone is playfully annoyed. Seriously, Adam? He waits a beat as if he expects her to change her mind. When she doesn't, he nods and says, All right. We split into pairs. One couple hides, and the rest of us try to find you. When you find them, you have to hide with them. The tighter the space, the better. No going inside buildings, no going on roofs. He looks at Maverick, who busts out laughing. Took you guys fucking forever to find us. So, wait, Taryn speaks up. We're hiding on campus in the middle of the night? Campus is huge. There are some boundaries. You're with me. I'll show you. He winks and then looks to Ginny and me. Heath, stay with Ginny. You can show her the boundaries. I'll be your guard, guardian. I mean, guide, I think. She smirks. Adam points to Mav and Dakota. It's your turn to hide and you get to make up a rule. We got this, Dakota says beside him. 
Tonight's rule is that one partner has to carry the other by piggyback. Everyone laughs. Adam holds up his phone. Five minutes and go. While Dakota and Mav head off to hide, I lead Ginny over to the bottom of the economics building stairs and sit. You guys play this often, I take it? She asks as she takes a seat next to me. It's fun. You'll see. I'm not really a fan of games where you have to hide in small, dark spaces. It's then I notice she's staring down at her fingers and rubbing her thumb along the inside of the palm on her opposite hand. I slide my hand in between hers and link our fingers. Shit. Of course. Adam's words make sense now. Do you want to go back? We can tell them we're going to go make out instead. Like they'd believe that? She huffs. No, it'll be fine. Just don't leave me. I won't. She pulls her hands away and glides them up and down her thighs. I don't really want to stop touching her, so I reach up and touch the end of her braid, rubbing the blonde ends between my fingers. Adorable. You're a flirty drunk. I'm an honest drunk. Too honest. Don't ask me anything embarrassing. How'd you get so drunk? Alcohol. She giggles and then falls quiet. All around us, our friends are chatting and laughing. But we're in our own little bubble, which is nice. A Genevieve and Heath bubble that I kind of dig. Hmm. What kind of dirt can I get on you while you're drunk? She narrows her gaze and smirks. What's your favorite color? Pink. I get the reaction I hoped for and then chuckle. Kidding, it's green. What's yours? Mine actually is pink, but not pink pink, like a really dark pink. Cerise. That's cute. What is? That you think I know what color Cerise is. She reaches over, catching me by surprise, and runs a thumb along my chin. Did you get this scar from hockey? She's barely touching me, but I like it, so I lean in a bit and tilt my chin up so she can see it better. No, I had a confrontation with a coffee table. It won. Her hand falls away. Ouch. Time! Adam calls, breaking the moment. He holds up his phone. One hour time limit. One hour? Ginny squeaks. We're really good hiders, Routhrust says before Reagan climbs on his back and he jogs off. Dude is super competitive. Ginny and I move at a much slower pace. I manage to get her on my back. The feel of her pressing up against me is way too nice, but my legs aren't cooperating. Maybe I should carry you. I got this. I say, but then stumble a few feet. Which way, you think? She asks when we get to the first turning point. Everyone else is going right, so I head left. I heard you got a job. I slow my pace. I'm not all that interested in searching for Maverick and Dakota, or generally being around anyone but Jenny. She smells like gummy bears, which makes me think about kissing her again. I did. Dakota hooked me up with it, actually. I start next week. I'll be leading tours of the Hall of Fame and athletic facilities, even doing recruitment tours once I get the hang of it. That's cool. I still remember mine. You do? I pause when we come to another spot where we need to decide which way to go. You decide. She waves to the left, which really doesn't go anywhere, and we're real close to being out of the borders of the game, but I keep that to myself. Yeah, I had this guy named Clint. Wasn't nearly as cute as you. Her light laughter tickles my ear. You're incorrigible. I'll be honest that I'm not really looking for Mav. I just want to keep talking, so I'm especially surprised when Ginny yells, There they are! Dakota and Maverick are crouched down inside a fancy-looking rectangular water fountain that's currently empty. It's a good spot, and I don't see them myself until we're basically on top of them. How did you find us? Dakota asks. This spot is amazing. I've been waiting for weeks to use it. Maverick's shoes were reflecting in the light. Ginny points to his shoes. Dakota throws her hands up. Reluctantly, I set Ginny down. Now what? Ginny asks, dropping off my back. We get in and wait for the others. I hop down, not so gracefully, and then help Ginny down beside me. It's dark, but not total blackout due to the lights around campus. The space is really only big enough for us to sit side by side, but the more we spread out, the easier we are to see. Dakota and Maverick are sitting facing one another, legs stretched out in front of them. 
I sit and pull Jenny down in front of me so her back is at my chest. Maverick passes me the half-empty bottle of Mad Dog. Do I need another drink? Definitely not. However, we might be here for a while. After taking a small drink, I tap Ginny on the shoulder with the bottle. Her fingers brush mine. They're cold and seem to tremble as she twists the cap off. I wait until she passes it to Dakota before pulling her against me. Are you okay? I whisper. Somehow the end of her braid gets stuck in my mouth in the process. Did you just eat my hair? She runs her hand along her braid and flips it so it lands in front of her. Unintentionally. Shh, I think I can hear someone coming, Dakota whispers. Since I can't soothe her with words, I take her in a vice grip snug against me. Her shoulders are rigid and I feel her take in a deep breath. I hum the first song that comes to mind, fantasy, and after a few minutes, she melts into me. She turns her head so her lips are close to mine. Thank you. I'm frozen, staring at her mouth. The cupid's bow, the fullness of her bottom lip, how soft it feels under the trace of my thumb. I don't know when I touched it, but I keep doing it. Her eyes fall to my mouth and her tongue darts out, the warm tip wetting my thumb. I lean in but hesitate to see how she reacts first. She nods her head a fraction, almost as if she's giving me permission to kiss her. Adam's voice calls out, breaking the moment as the other four find us. Twenty-five minutes. Mav, dude, your shoes are shining like a flashlight at anyone that walks by. Ow! Ow! Mav yells and shields himself as Dakota pelts him and says, Worst partner ever. Chapter 15 Jenny this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. I turn a circle. Flat screens cover every inch of the walls, floor to ceiling, all the way around. Dakota grins and taps on the tablet in her hands. Wait for it, it gets way cooler. We stand in the middle of the room. It's cozy, not really meant for more than a few people comfortably. The recessed lighting above us dims and the screens all come alive at once. Height music pumps into the room, and images and videos of the Valley U hockey team play like a highlight reel. My heart races as if I were sitting front row in a playoff game. My brother is shown a lot, which makes sense because he's been a big contributor to the team since his freshman year. Sometimes the clips are of the players in action, and sometimes it's media-type posed images. One of the latter of Heath fills the screens. His face, jumbo-sized, stares back at me and my stomach does a somersault. He's so damn hot. It goes on and on, a good five minutes of film, but when it ends, I want to watch it all over again. Awesome, right? Dakota asks as the screens go black and the overhead lighting returns. This is just for recruits? Hockey, specifically. Each team has their own recruitment video, and there's a generic one, too, that combines pieces from all the videos. We do tours for the community, local schools, and alumni, too. She shows me the tablet where I can select and play the videos, and then how to get in and out of the room, because it's a very fancy coded system that seals you in and won't open while the video is playing. I follow her out of the room, still a little awestruck. That's the last stop on the tour. Once you're finished in the hype room, you'll walk them to the front desk, and the coach from whichever team they're here for will take over. I didn't realize how much effort they put into getting athletes to come to Valley. They recruit hard, basketball and hockey especially. So do you have any questions? Feel ready to lead one on your own? No, I'm probably going to totally botch it. How long have you worked here? Since my freshman year, I quit the track team, but I still wanted to be a part of something that was sports-related. They like to hire student-athletes since we're familiar with a lot of the facilities and can answer questions they might have. She must read the panic on my face because she laughs and adds, You'll be fine. It isn't that hard. You probably know more than you think from Adam. I'm not so sure about that. Dakota smiles. We're just here to get them excited about Valley. You're one of the few people they'll meet outside of the team. It's fun. 
You get to meet a lot of top athletes from all over the country, and if they come to Valley, you'll see them again and know you were part of getting them here. I'm doing two tours today, volleyball and hockey, so you'll shadow me and see how easy it is. We take a break to grab lunch before our afternoon of leading recruits around campus. I sit across from Dakota at an outdoor table outside of University Hall. So, you and Heath looked pretty cozy last night. He was drunk. Drunk Heath is hilariously honest. One time he told me I was really pretty, but not his type because I was too bossy. She takes a sip from her straw and then adds, which is totally true. But you and him, I could see it. We're just friends. Except that time you kissed. She raises a brow pointedly and takes another bite of her sandwich. It was the gummy bears. Would it really be the worst thing to admit you like him? Even if I did, Heath made it clear that he isn't interested in dating and that Adam's little sister was off limits. Your brother shouldn't be giving anyone orders on being single. The man goes from one relationship to the next. He's always been like that. He got his first girlfriend in seventh grade and probably hasn't been without one for more than a week since. Taryn seems nice. I like her better than the last one, Heather. Heather wasn't the last one. He dated Maria over the summer. I shrug. Taryn's okay. I try not to get attached anymore. Makes sense. Probably especially hard given Taryn's history with Heath. My head pops up. She dated Heath? Dated might be a stretch. They were more like fuck buddies. Those two were going at it all the time, loudly and everywhere. My face heats and the food in my mouth turns to paste. Dakota busts up laughing. <laughs> I'm totally kidding. I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. She points a fry at me. I knew you liked him. The first tour is a local high school volleyball player. She towers over me, and I keep pushing up onto my tiptoes so I don't feel so small. I barely say a word after introducing myself, and instead let Dakota take charge while I try to memorize every detail she says. I really don't want to screw this up when it's my turn to lead a tour on my own. The hype room is just as cool the second time around, and as we hand her off to the coach of the volleyball team, I'm feeling better about the job. The next one should be here in five. She reads from the tablet and then passes it to me. Nick, a senior from Newburgh High in Boston. I look over Nick's information at the front desk while we wait. The scouting reports are detailed and makes me appreciate how much effort goes into recruiting athletes to Valley. Maybe Adam and our parents downplayed it, but hockey was just sort of this thing he did. Adam never made a big deal out of touring colleges or getting a full-ride scholarship. Even when he had NHL teams inviting him to summer camps and agents asking about his plans after college, he waved it off like it was nothing. I'm not sure why he doesn't want to go pro, but he's wanted to be a doctor for as long as I can remember. My thoughts briefly go to Brian. He came to Valley and did a tour that probably looked a lot like this, too. He hadn't made a big deal out of it either. Maybe the jocks in my life are used to being fawned over like this. Freaking jocks. I'm only checking Brian's social media every other day now, a real step in the right direction from the hours I spent obsessing after we first broke up. Since I've started hanging out with Dakota and Reagan, I'm less jealous of his happy photos with new friends. He likes every single thing I post as if he truly believes we're cool and going to step right back into the way we were when we see each other again. There he is, Dakota says, breaking my thoughts. I look up to find Adam and Heath walking Nick through the front doors. Heath and my brother are wearing matching valley hockey t-shirts and jeans. I smile and stand beside Dakota while we wait for them to approach the desk. Hey! Dakota says cheerily. You must be Nick. Dakota introduces me and then gives Nick a chance to use the restroom and grab a soda or water before we start. When he's gone, Adam leans against the desk. Hey, Jenny, first day. Yep. Anything we should know about him? Dakota asks. 
It's good one of us is still thinking about the job because I'm ridiculously distracted by Heath. His hair looks like he tried to manage it into a style, but the long top curls and flips in every which direction. Adam and Dakota talk, and Heath smiles at me and takes a step to the side of the desk, motioning for me to follow. Look at you. His eyes scan my blue polo and khaki pants. Look at you, I toss back. He runs a hand through his hair, and his smile turns sheepish. Missed you at lunch. Guess I'm going to have to find a new lunch, buddy. It's only a couple of days a week. He nods. Tomorrow, then? Yeah, I'll be there tomorrow. Nick rounds the corner, and we all stop talking to give him our attention. Ready? Dakota asks him with a big smile. Later, Genevieve. Heath winks, and then he and Adam say their goodbyes to Nick. I watch him leave and then blow out a long breath. Holy gummy bears. October, Chapter 16, Ginny. We're decked out in valley blue and yellow for the first home game of the season. Dakota, Reagan, and I sit in my parents' season ticket seats. I feel bad for not inviting Taryn, I admit as the team takes the ice. Dakota waves me off. She's fine. She said she was going to sit with her sorority sisters and meet up with us after. I think I'm going to have to get to know her. Why do you sound so defeated? She's nice, Reagan says, eyes forward, watching the guys. Every time I get attached to one of Adam's girlfriends, they break up and it's like I lose them, too. I always wanted a sister. Dakota and Reagan put their arms around my shoulders. Well, now you have us, and neither of us plans on banging your brother. Right, Reagan? Reagan's jaw drops. Of course not. He's with Taryn. When the game starts, we cheer like crazy. It's nothing like being at a game with my parents, and I feel so much more invested being a Valley student now. And my brother is good. Really good. I spot Taryn jumping up and down in the front row of the student section as he scores a goal. Ugh. I really am going to have to make an effort with her. She seems to really like Adam and not be one of the crazy ones. But first, I need to talk to my brother and make sure he isn't already thinking about breaking up with her. There's a line switch, and Heath and two other guys come off the ice. They sit not far from us. Jordan, a freshman, I think, is drinking out of a water bottle. Heath shakes his head when someone tries to hand him his own water. Stick in hand, he's practically bouncing with untapped energy to get back out there. He turns his head to follow the action on the ice, giving me a view of his strong profile. Dark hair peeks out around his helmet. His nose is straight, jaw sharp, nice lips that are soft despite all of the ways the rest of him is hard. I press two fingers against my lips, remembering how it felt to be kissed by Heath. I've done my best to avoid going down this particular memory lane because I don't want to ruin the friendship we have. But I don't think I'll ever forget that kiss. Valley wins, and the girls and I head to the hideout. The local restaurant and bar is a favorite among college students, and we have to push our way through a mass of people to find a table. There's a collective cheer in the place when the guys arrive. Adam and Taryn lead the pack. Rhett, Maverick, and a few other guys from the team not far behind. Congratulations! I stand and hug my brother. You were amazing. You've seen me play before. I know, but it was different this time. I can't explain it. I'm so proud of you. One side of his mouth pulls up into a smile. Thanks, Jenny. We pull a couple of tables together so we can all sit. Pitchers of beer and shots arrive at the table, some the guys ordered and others that people buy for them. My gaze falls to the front entrance every time someone new appears. I just assumed Heath would be coming, but now I'm not so sure and I'm disappointed. A friendly disappointment. We're friends. I'm allowed to be disappointed when a friend doesn't come out for the night. I'm sitting at one end between my brother and Jordan. Adam's turned toward Taryn, which kind of leaves me hidden behind his giant back from the rest of the table. 
I'm leaning in and listening to a Celine Dion cover that Jordan promised would change my life when Heath's voice washes over me. Thanks for saving my seat, Jay. Jordan looks from me to Heath, and he nods slowly. You two are... Friends, I say at the same time Heath says, Yep. I'll send you the link, Jordan says as he stands to give Heath his seat. I wasn't sure you were coming. Came with the rest of the guys, but my brother called as we were walking in. You've been outside on the phone this whole time? He nods and reaches for one of the pitchers and a glass. Yeah, what I miss, other than Jordan hitting on you. He wasn't hitting on me. Heath's brows rise and he takes a long drink from his glass, then leans back and places his arm around the back of my chair. Five minutes talking with him and anyone would know he's totally hung up on his ex-girlfriend. He was playing me videos of her singing some Celine Dion song. That's why he picked that savvy-ass song. Picked it for what? On game days, we do a light skate in the morning, and we each get to pick one song that Mav compiles into a playlist for us. That's cool. What's your song? He smirks, and instead of answering, pulls out his phone. Like with Jordan, I have to lean in close to hear it. As the music plays, I can see how it affects him, getting him pumped up. But unlike when I was this close to Jordan, I'm acutely aware of everything about Heath. The way he smells like soap and something masculine. Sandalwood, I think. The fit of his shirt, tight around his chest and biceps, but looser at his tapered waist. And the way my body reacts. Heart racing and breathless. Friends schmenz, I want to kiss him again. When the song ends, he pockets his phone and leans back, and I can think a little clearer without him so close. I push my chair back and stand. I'm going to use the restroom. I catch Dakota's gaze as I walk by the table and motion for her to come with me. She and Reagan tail me into the ladies' room. What's up? You are flashing panic eyes. Do you need a tampon? Dakota asks as she checks herself in the mirror. Reagan sets her giant purse on the counter and pulls out a tampon. I wave her off. No, I'm good. Next, she pulls out lip gloss, which I take. I like Heath, I admit after I swipe on the shiny pink gloss. Dakota snorts. Duh, what's the problem? We're friends. He's one of my best friends here. He's already told me that he isn't interested in dating me. If I make a fool of myself, then I'll have to stop hanging out with you guys, and that would be a real bummer. First of all, we're not going anywhere. Second, don't be a pussy. Dakota meets my gaze in the mirror. My mouth tingles, and I rub my lips together. What is this gloss? Lip plumper, Reagan says, putting it back in her purse and pulling out mascara and adding a coat to her lashes. It stings. Holy crap! I grab a paper towel and wipe it off, but the burn only subsides a little. That's awful. Do you have something else that will dull the pain? Reagan hands me another gloss, this one I inspect more closely before applying. Dakota holds out her hand for the lip plumper. I like the pain, she announces as she puts it on, turning so her back rests against the counter. Listen, if you're sure that nothing is going to happen between you and Heath, then stop torturing yourself. She's right, Reagan says. You guys spend a lot of time together, which makes it hard to get over him. Or find someone else. Dakota's icy blue eyes bore into mine. Come on, let's go back out there. Sit with us and forget about Heath for tonight. There are a ton more guys at Valley, and we're going to introduce you to all of them. The ones out there, anyway, Reagan says with a light laugh. Not a terrible idea. I'm done being angry and sad about Brian and spending my time wondering what college would have been like if he were here. I'm ready to have fun, date, maybe even hook up with someone new. And if that's not Heath, then there are other people out there. Heath is at the bar getting another pitcher when we make our way back to the table, which makes my transition to sitting next to Reagan and Dakota less awkward. When he spots me down the table, he raises both hands in question, but I just smile at him like it's nothing. 
Reagan and Dakota are true to their word, and they casually introduce me to so many guys they start to blur together. I feel like I'm on a covert version of The Bachelorette. Okay, point taken, there are a lot of guys at Valley. You don't need to introduce me to any more. My gaze flits to Heath across the bar. He's talking to Maverick, but looks up and smiles when he catches me staring. Hey, Jenny. Liam approaches with his hands in his pockets. Are you going over to Adam's, I mean, your brother's, after this? Uh, I look to Reagan and Dakota, who both nod eagerly. I think so. Cool, I'll see you there. I watch him walk off and then look to Reagan. I think I'm going to need more lip gloss. She digs into her purse and hands it to me. Keep it. You may need to reapply many times. Chapter 17 Heath I get a ride back to the apartment with Maverick. I'm riding shotgun while Taryn and Adam sit in the back seat sucking face. Is that Liam's truck? Adam asks as Mav parks and we get out. Yeah, I think so. I answer, looking over the silver F-150. There's like a million of these trucks and they all look the same, but this one has a Valley University hockey license plate. His brows draw together, and he has a weird look on his face as he passes it. Adam isn't one to care who comes over. It's one area he's actually chill about. He's got the whole everyone's welcome mentality when it comes to the apartment. Something wrong with Liam being here? He asks for permission to ask out my sister. He makes a little grunt of annoyance and Taryn smiles and pats his arm. Ginny? Now I'm the one getting the weird look from Adam. I only have one sister, dude. Right. I hang back, trailing the guys up to our apartment. I pull out my phone and text Ginny. Me. Where'd you go? You coming by? Halo rematch? I cringe a little at my borderline needy message, slide my phone back into my pocket, and force myself to chill the fuck out. After grabbing a beer, I look for Ginny. I don't see her or Dakota and Reagan. The three of them are inseparable these days. I check my phone, but she hasn't texted back. Liam is outside, and I head toward him. What's up, Liam? I tip my chin up in acknowledgement to the other guys on the team standing with him. Hey, Payne. Nice assist tonight. Thanks. I spot Dakota walking out the back door to the deck first. Ginny and Reagan follow. They go to the opposite side, stopping to talk to Taryn and Adam. Heard you asked Scott for permission to ask out Ginny. I go for a teasing tone, but don't quite hit the mark. Liam nods. She seems like a cool chick. You two are friends, right? Any advice? Back the fuck off. Find someone else. Anyone else. But that's not really fair. Ginny is a cool chick, and Liam is a decent guy and hockey player. I avoid his question altogether. Scott gave his blessing? He didn't seem all that happy about it, but he said Ginny could make up her own mind who she dated. Jordan laughs and elbows Liam, and threatened to beat your ass if you hurt her. And that, Liam admits, but I'd never screw over a teammate's sister. God, I hate that he's such a nice guy. I think it's a terrible idea. Tiny says with a shake of his head. It's messy. If things don't work out, then you're on the outs with the team captain. No chick is worth that much trouble. I watch Liam's face to see if he agrees. Part of me hopes he does and backs off. Some girls are worth the risk, he says, and I grind down on my teeth. Of fucking course Ginny is worth it, but Liam and Ginny? I can't see it. Well, good luck, man. I go inside, do a shot, and grab another beer. Everything okay? Mav says as he gets two beers from the fridge. Fine. He lingers as he pops the top on the first can. You sure? You look... off. Off? Yeah, like at practice that time coach tried to switch you to the left side? You do this weird thing with your face. He looks like a deer caught in headlights and some shit imitation of me. I don't look like that. Fuck off, I'm fine. I run a hand through my hair. Seriously, man, what's up? It's nothing. Liam is interested in Ginny and I can't see it. Because... Adam asked me to look out for her and I don't know, it doesn't feel right. Because you like her. I don't... It's not... 
He waits for me to string a complete sentence together, a smug expression on his face. It isn't a big deal. Jenny's cool. Just tell Liam you're interested and ask her out yourself. I tap my foot on the linoleum, consider it, and shake my head. She probably isn't even interested in him like that. Mav clears his throat and points with a finger wrapped around the beer can to Ginny and Liam standing in the doorway between the deck and dining area. They're both smiling. Liam leans a hand above her and she doesn't look at all uncomfortable. I take off in their direction without a plan and hear Mav mutter behind me, Yeah, that's what I thought. Four steps. Four big, hurried steps is all it takes to get to her. I grab Ginny's hand, mumble an apology I don't really mean to Liam, and pull her through the party to my room. She laughs, obviously not concerned that I'm dragging her to my bedroom like some sort of caveman. What's going on? We need to talk, I say once I close the door. About? She asks, sounding concerned but still smiling. Do you like Liam? Sure, he's nice. Nice like you'd let him feel you up, or... She laughs. Loudly, and I think at me. She walks forward and pokes me in the chest. You're jealous. I'm not. I don't know why I bother denying it. Gut reaction, I guess. She laughs again and moves to sit on my bed, digging through her purse. I'm sorry I didn't respond to your text earlier. I thought we needed a little space. We're friends, but we've kissed, and I know you've probably already forgotten, but I haven't, and sometimes things with us feel messy. So, yes... I think Liam is nice, like maybe someday I'll let him feel me up. But I'm not going anywhere. You and I will still be friends no matter what. You don't need to worry about me dating Liam or anyone else and forgetting about my favorite cafeteria buddy. I grin at being called her fucking cafeteria buddy. She pulls out a long tube of pink gloss and coats her lips. I'm mesmerized by the action and the way her lips catch the light. She rubs her lips together and puckers them, and all I can imagine is her walking out there and every guy in the place wanting to kiss her and smear that perfect pink outline. She stands. I promise not to be one of those people who ignores her friends when she meets a guy. Or, in our case, another guy. Don't date him. Why not? He's not good enough. Good enough for what? She rolls her eyes. Thank you for wanting to look out for me, but I'm a big girl. I can take care of myself. I swear, if it were up to you and my brother, I'd spend the next four years alone while everyone else hooks up and pairs off. I want to do those things too. Go on dates and make bad decisions. And I know it's possible it'll hurt me or he'll be a total bore, but I won't know unless I go out with him. Don't date him. She looks like she's going to start arguing again, but I keep going before she can get a word in. Don't date him. We could... We could what? You know. Date? She fights a grin. You can't even say the word. I close the space between us and drop my mouth to hers. Her lips part in a surprised squeak and I take full advantage, sweeping my tongue inside. She tastes so good and so right. I'm breathless when she takes a step back. Breathless and filled with so much energy, my steps feel light as I fill the gap again. Wait. She puts a hand at my chest. I don't understand. You don't date. You told me that you weren't interested in dating anyone, especially me. I never said especially you. It was implied. Fuck no, it wasn't. We already hang out more than I ever have with any other chick, so let's do that and make out. That's basically dating, right? She gives her head a little shake. I'm confused. Is this some trick to keep me from dating Liam? Hell no. I don't care who Liam dates as long as it isn't you. My mouth tingles. Fucking tingles, this girl. Fuck. I said we shouldn't date because you had just gotten out of a relationship and in the past, dating hadn't really been my thing. Enjoying college has been my top priority. I only have a few years before I'm going to be married to hockey. I didn't want us to hook up and then never talk again, and I wasn't sure I was capable of more. I like hanging with you, and I don't want to mess that up. Oh. But I was overthinking it. If what you're looking for is the same thing I am, to have fun, hang out, hook up. I pull her against me so she can feel how hard I am. Then of course I want to date you. Really? Her eyes light up. I swipe a hand over my mouth. It's on fire and sticky from her lipstick. Really? But I should talk to your brother first. She groans. 
You don't need his permission. I know. I give in and press my lips to hers again. It's almost painful with how much my mouth aches to be on hers. I kiss her harder and the burn intensifies. Fuck, baby. Your lips are on fire. Her hand flies to her mouth. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Don't move. I'm going to talk to your brother. Right now? I promised him I'd look out for you. I don't want him to feel like I took advantage or... I don't know, maybe it's stupid, but I respect your brother and you, and I can't kiss you like I want to until I talk to him. Kiss me like you want to? She asks with a laugh. I walk to the door and pause with my hand on the doorknob. Naked. Adam's in the living room. I call his name and motion for him, going to the kitchen where I can pour a couple shots, just in case one or both of us needs it. Dude, what's going on with your face? I rub absently at my face, which still stings. Since I can't very well tell him my body is having some sort of physical reaction to kissing his sister, I avoid his question altogether. I need to talk to you about Ginny. I slide one of the shot glasses in front of him. He looks, but doesn't touch it. What about her? Is she okay? Yeah, she's fine. Reagan picks this inopportune time to join us. Hey, have either of you seen Ginny? I glance at her. She's... Oh my god, Heath, what happened to your face? Dakota appears next to Reagan and steps forward and inspects my face. I think your body is rejecting whichever random bunny you were making out with. I swipe a hand over my mouth. Pink's not really your color. Adam laughs. I grab a paper towel and wet it so I can wipe his sister's lipstick off my face. It can't be helping the situation. I think I'm allergic to this shit. It stings. Reagan starts giggling, and within a few seconds, it's full-blown hysterical laughter that has tears coming from her eyes. The lip plumper, she manages to get out, and that sets Dakota off. What the hell is going on? Adam asks. I was kissing. My body is yanked to the right by Ginny as she pulls me away. Sorry, I need to borrow him for flip cup. I hear Reagan say, I must have given it to her again by accident. And then Adam's gruff voice asks, What the fuck is Lip Plumper? Chapter 18 Jenny. I don't stop until we're in the corner of the deck outside, far away from my brother. We can't tell him. Heath's rubbing at his lips. Why not? Because he'll freak out and make a big deal out of it, and any chance of low-key and fun will go right out the window with it. I don't know. He was pretty cool about Liam asking to date you. Liam asked to date me? Ugh, I hate that they all feel like they need to ask permission. He's not the boss of me. Heath puts his hands in his pockets and nods. Just trust me on this. He might have said he was cool with it, but he'll interfere somehow. We don't need his okay. I don't relish the idea of going behind his back. We may not see eye to eye on everything, but we're teammates. I know, and it isn't forever. Only until we decide if there's anything even worth telling him. Keith raises a dark brow. You know what I mean. All right, if that's what you want. I let out a sigh of relief. Thank you. What the hell did you do to my lips? He rubs at them again, and I bite back a laugh and run a thumb over the tender skin. It's red and irritated, but his lips look nice and full, so I guess the stuff works. I press my lips to his. A chaste kiss, but I linger, enjoying the feel of him being so close and his mouth against mine. Thirty seconds into this, and I'm already having a hard time keeping my hands off him around other people— he makes a little humming noise when I pull back. You expect me to keep this a secret? He shakes his head. At least I'm not alone in wanting to jump him. I take a step back as Maverick approaches. Hey, you do. He looks from Heath to me with a big smile and then sniffs the air. Is that romance I smell? Heath smirks at me. Busted. Well, so much for keeping it from everyone. I huff a laugh. We do a slightly better job of staying apart after we make Mav swear to secrecy. 
With a butt squeeze and a whispered promise to find me later, Heath goes with Maverick to play Xbox and I find Reagan. She's sitting in a folding chair in a circle of people, but she's quiet, playing with the label on the beer bottle in her hand. I grab a chair and pull it up beside her. Hey, are you okay? You look a little bummed. Sam, the guy I went out with last week, was supposed to meet up with me tonight, but he flaked. Oh, babe, I'm sorry. It's fine, he was kind of boring, but it still hurts to be blown off. Her shoulders rise and fall with a big sigh. And the worst part is, I'm still not over... She pauses and fidgets with her beer again. Are you ever going to tell me who it is? No, probably not. Well, at least tell me what it is about him that has you so spun up. He's smart and caring. She bites her lip. And so hot. Have you ever been totally into a guy and no matter how hard you try to move on, you can't stop hoping he notices you? She groans. I just realized how pathetic I am. God, I hate being the girl who can't even enjoy the party because of a boy. No, I totally get it. Been there. I think you're there now. She smiles, dimples popping out. At least with you and Heath, it's mutual. You kissed again, right? He had gloss all over his face. Listen, can we keep that between us for now? I don't want my brother all up in my business with this. I won't tell him, but good luck hiding it. You've got a ridiculous grin on your face just talking about him. I do? She nods. You know what? You helped me earlier by introducing me to guys. Let's do the same for you now. I already know all of these guys. Humor me? Maybe you were too caught up in this other guy to notice how great some of these other boys are. You think? She looks so hopeful. I stand and hold my hand out. She takes it and gets out of her chair. Okay, but you're sleeping over tonight. I need a safety net so I don't do something crazy and end up having sad, forget-you sex. You never know, I say as we head inside. I make eye contact with Heath and my stomach flips. Later, after everyone else leaves and it's just a handful of us left, Adam convinces us to play sardines. Heath and I walk just ahead of the group toward campus. I'm holding his arm in a friendly way that we've done a hundred times before, but this time is completely about touching him any way I can. Which pair was the first to find Maverick and Dakota last time? Adam asks when we arrive. Me and Heath? I speak up, briefly catching my brother's eye. I hold my breath to see if there's any indication from his expression that he knows. Maybe it really is written all over my face. All right, one of you gets to make the rule. Heath looks to me. You pick. I think for a minute. Partners have to swap shirts. Heath eyes my white tank top and nods his approval. That's kind of easy, Jenny. Adam says, but then Rhett groans loudly and we all look to him and Reagan, who's wearing a dress. Heath and I start our search for the perfect hiding spot, but only make it as far as the first corner away from the group before he backs me up against the building. His lips take mine and his body presses into me. I'm stuck in between a rock and a hard place, quite literally. The brick building bites into my back and the rigid swell in Heath's jeans presses into my hip bone. My body hums with excitement. I drop my hands to his waist and slip my fingers under the hem of his shirt. He keeps kissing me as I glide my palms over his abs and chest. His muscles tighten under my touch and he grinds into me harder. Who knew secret relationships were so hot? Removing my hands from his body, which is exceedingly difficult, I take off my shirt, letting the breeze and his gaze pebble my skin. Fuck, Jenny. He rasps. We're supposed to swap shirts, I say, voice a little too breathy. Oh, right. Without taking his eyes off me, he pulls his shirt off and we trade. He tucks my shirt into the front pocket of his jeans and runs his fingers up the curve of my waist, stopping when his thumbs brush against the sides of my bra. 
I don't make any move to put on his shirt because he's looking at me with so much admiration and hunger. I don't want it to end. Wrapping my arms around his neck, I lift up on my toes to kiss him. The skin-to-skin -skin contact feels better than anything I've ever experienced. Kissing down his jaw, which flexes under my lips, I move to his neck and chest. He holds my hair back with one hand as I learn the contours of his body with my hands and mouth. I'm circling his nipple with my tongue, which he seems to like very much, when he curses and flattens me against the wall. Footsteps approach and Adam and Taryn come into view holding hands. Adam's wearing Taryn's strapless top around his neck and she's in his oversized t-shirt. Our only saving grace seems to be that we're so close they aren't looking for us yet. My chest rises and falls, and I fight to slow down my breathing as the others go off in search of us. Shit, that was close, Heath says when they're out of sight. He steps back and looks me over again, hunger flashing in his gaze and a smile on his lips. We should hide. He takes his shirt from me and slowly pulls it down over me. His scent covers me, warmth still clinging to the material. Now, they're already looking for us. He glances around and clicks his tongue. I got it. Come with me. Is this in bounds? I ask after he leads me back around the corner to the spot the seekers usually wait. He shrugs and takes a seat on the top stair, so we're as far out of sight as we can be while still pretty much being in plain view of anyone who walks by. He pulls me down into the space between his legs. Technically it is, but no one has ever hidden here as far as I know. Probably because it isn't a very good hiding spot. I disagree. It'll take them at least ten minutes to double back, and in the meantime, I have you all alone. His mouth brushes against my neck. His shirt is baggy on me, giving him more access, and his lips trail along my collarbone. I start to turn around so I can touch him, but he stops me. If you get any closer, they're going to find us naked. Naked sounds great, but not in front of my brother, so I don't move. There's something about holding still and just receiving his affection that is hotter than anything I could have imagined. Fingertips tease my waist and occasionally dip down to the top of my jeans, but he doesn't slide his hand lower to rub the ache between my legs like I desperately want. This time, I'm the one who hears our friends approaching, and I squeeze his calf hard enough it gets his attention. He hunkers down like he's hiding behind me, and we sit still until Rhett, wearing Reagan's dress, a sight I'll never be able to unsee, spots us. What the hell, man? He asks as he and Reagan take a seat on the stairs beside us. You had to have switched hiding spots after we started. Is that legal? He's heated about it, talking loudly, and it isn't long before the others find us. It turns out that it isn't legal, but I don't even feel a little bit bad about it when Heath and I get chastised for ruining the game. Totally worth it. Taryn's chatting with Dakota on the walk back, so I take advantage of her not being attached to my brother's side and fall into step beside him. Sorry I ruined your game. Hands in his pockets, his long stride is slow. Eh, it's fine. Rothrus takes games of any kind real serious. For me, it's just fun getting out and doing it. Taryn seems nice. Should I get to know this one? He shoots me an annoyed glare. What? Come on, your track record isn't stellar. It can't surprise you to know I'm hesitant to get attached to one of your girlfriends. Taryn's great, he shrugs. Get to know her if you want or not, whatever. So it isn't serious. I didn't say that. You're not saying anything. Good God, sometimes I want to shake him. He huffs a quiet laugh. <laughs> Look, I like her. She's nice and a lot of fun, but I have no idea where it'll go. Dating in college isn't like it was in high school. People don't go into it thinking they've found their forever person, or at least I don't. I wonder if that's a universal thing or just my brother. Heath basically summed it up the same way. Seems a little depressing if I follow their logic too deep, but 
fun, fun I'm in for. When the apartment building comes into view, I fall back beside Heath. I promised Reagan I'd stay over tonight to talk boys. He smirks and his eyes darken. You could come over later when you're done talking. I'd like to, really, but sneaking into your place with Adam there? I don't know. He nods, and I can't tell if he's disappointed or not. I'm glad he doesn't push any harder to get me to change my mind, though. I'd probably cave, and some part of me knows I'm not ready to get naked with him yet. I'm not a virgin, but my experience is pretty limited. And if what Adam says is true, that this isn't a big deal, I need to capture the butterflies in my stomach and give them a good pep talk about slowing their flutter every time Heath is near. Breakfast tomorrow? I offer. Yeah, text me and we can go over to campus together in the morning. Are you coming, Jenny? Dakota asks when we reach the top of the stairs. She and Reagan are headed into their apartment, and the rest of the group has already gone into the boys' place. Yeah, I'll be there in just a minute. As the doors close, Heath's mouth finds mine. He kisses me like he's begging me to reconsider going inside with him. His large hands frame my face, and he walks me backward until I'm trapped between him and the wall. Heath likes to be in charge, and my body doesn't mind one bit. His lips find the sensitive flesh at the curve of my neck, and I sigh. How many hours until the dining hall opens? Five or six. The words are spoken against my skin between nips. That's a long time to wait. Hungry, baby. His deep baritone rumbles. I don't answer, not even sure I'm capable of stringing words together as his face nuzzles in between my boobs. We didn't bother switching shirts back, so I'm still in his. Even through the cotton material, the scrape of his scruff provides a delectable friction. His hands fall to my ass and he pulls me against him. He's hard again, or maybe still, and I rub myself on him, desperate for more. He growls and pushes his hips forward, slamming me back to the wall. Yo, Heath, whoa, sorry, man. Maverick covers his eyes but doesn't leave as I duck my head, embarrassed. What the fuck? Heath asks, not moving. Even in my embarrassment, I can't resist moving just slightly so I can recapture the delicious friction. At my movement, he moves his hand lower on my ass, and his fingers dig into me through my jeans, deep circles giving me just the right amount of pressure. Maverick can't see what's going on, but I nearly cry out as the orgasm hits. I stop myself by biting down on Heath's bare shoulder. I miss whatever exchanges between them, and I'm coming down, body still shuddering, when the door closes. My head falls forward into his chest as I catch my breath. Heath pulls me into a hug and kisses the top of my head. Did that really just happen? I squeak, apparently out loud, though not intentionally. He chuckles deep and throaty. God, I hope so. But we can try again if you need to be certain. I lift my face and wrap my arms around his neck. I should go before Dakota comes looking for me. He steps back and adjusts himself. Are you going to be okay? I bite my lip. Maybe there's time. Hand jobs for him and her. Go. I'm fine. I'll see you in the morning. I'll still be hard then. Don't worry. Seems to be a constant thing around you. Chapter 19 Jenny. My brother will be home any minute. I squirm as Heath's hands slide up my shirt and his hot mouth sucks on my collarbone. All the more reason to get naked quicker, then. The door opens and I sit up straight and elbow Heath inadvertently. He groans and leans back in his chair as Adam and Rhett walk into the house. Hey, guys, I say cheerily and reach for a pencil on the table. Jenny? Adam's brows pull together. What are you doing here? Studying with Maverick. Adam quirks a brow. He's on his way over. He had to let Charlie out. Oh, cool. You want to stay for dinner? Actually, I promised Reagan and Dakota we'd grab food when I was done. Invite them too. Mav can grill. 
You cook? I ask the always shirtless Maverick as he walks in the front door with Charlie. I grill. Is that different? It's manly and awesome. Which is different than cooking? He grins. Open flame. Dakota and Reagan agree to come over to the guy's place for dinner, and the seven of us sit around the outdoor table. My brother might be oblivious to me and Heath, but my friends are not. Dakota corners me when I go inside to grab ketchup. What is going on with you and Heath? More kissing since last weekend? Reagan is right behind her, shutting the door and joining us. It's no big deal, I try, but I'm sure the smile on my face gives me away. Reagan's dimples pop out and Dakota shakes her head. You absolutely slept with him. No, we haven't yet, but you cannot tell anyone that we're... Whatever, promise? Dakota looks to Reagan. She's talking to you. Reagan tries to look offended, but then rolls her eyes. I already knew. Besides, I'm good at keeping secrets of the heart. I won't say anything. Do you really think your brother would care? Dakota asks. I mean, he's one to dog. I'm not sure, but I don't want to cause a big thing. Heath and I are just hanging out. If Adam finds out, he'll be all overbearing about it, and I don't want that. Judgment-free fun. And hot, dirty sex. Dakota smirks. I feel my face warm. How are you planning on keeping it from him? They live together, G. Reagan reminds me. I don't know. I haven't thought that far ahead. I don't like the idea of outright lying to my brother, and I hope it doesn't come to that. Dakota snickers. Well, you better figure it out, because the two of you are beyond obvious. He's going to catch on. There's no reason to worry tonight, though. As soon as dinner is over, Adam leaves to go to Terrence, and Rhett goes to his room to call his girlfriend. Maverick already knows, so when Heath pins me against the counter in the kitchen, I let him kiss me like I've been dying to for the past two hours. He hums into my mouth as his hands come up and wrap around the back of my neck. My fingers fly to the hem of his shirt, craving the feel of his skin against mine. I need to get you naked. He mumbles into my mouth. You two want to watch a movie? Maverick asks. Neither of us answers as we keep on kissing. Heath's hard as he presses into me with a groan. A pillow flies by our head and hits the cabinet door to my left. What the hell, Mav? You two are a major bummer. Everyone's getting laid but me. Come hang out with me. Let me feel up your girl a little. Seems fair. Like hell. Heath growls, but he pulls me to the living room. I can tell by Maverick's smile that he's just trying to get a rise out of Heath. Not that I doubt he'd like to feel me up, because I think Mav is game to feel up just about anyone, but there are zero sexual vibes between us. Heath's possessive side is hot, though, so I follow him. He sits in the chair and pulls me on top of him. I hesitate to get comfortable, knowing Rhett could catch us at any moment. Keith doesn't seem to give it a second thought. We watch the first half of some action movie. Keith teases me, fingers absently roaming over my skin. He doesn't seem all that affected, minus the huge erection poking me, until suddenly he stands and carries me to his room, calling out to Mav as we leave. Sorry, buddy, you're on your own. I giggle as he lays me down on the bed and stands tall to remove his shirt. What if I wanted to watch the rest of the movie? He unbuttons my shorts and pulls them and my panties down before he answers. Say the word and we can move this back out to the living room. His head dips and then his tongue flattens over my center, sending a jolt through my body. He glances up, eyes dark and taunting. What do you say, baby? Want to watch the movie while I lick you? Maybe you want Mav to watch as I eat your sweet pussy. I arch into him, wanting more. More of his mouth and more of the dirty, obscene things coming out of it. I don't know how much of it he's actually serious about, but the idea of him going down on me like this, not giving one single fuck that people might watch, is hot. Not that I actually want to give in to the fantasy. He wraps his arms around my legs, spreading me wider and lifting me to his mouth. 
His moans and grunts rival mine as the orgasm builds. I come once, crying out and trying to move away. It's so intense, and my body can't decide if it wants more or to curl up in a ball and let the sensations slowly disappear. Heath doesn't give me an option. He keeps his grip tight on my legs, holding me in place. He eases the pressure on my sensitive clit. His tongue laps slowly and tenderly until another orgasm begins to build and I start to writhe beneath him. He adds a finger, ever so slowly, matching the tempo of his mouth. I reach for him, for any part of him to cling to like a lifeline as the second wave slams into me. I pull at his glorious hair and his ears, his shoulders. I'm not sure I've ever maimed a guy while he went down on me before. I roll away from him as my body quivers and I try to catch my breath. Heath chuckles and lets me loose this time. He lies beside me and wraps his arm around my waist. I shiver at the contact. Even that feels like I might get off another time. Cuddle orgasms. I don't think that's a thing. There's nothing cuddly about you. Even your cuddles feel like foreplay. Oh, it's foreplay. It's all foreplay. I need two minutes for my soul to float back inside of me, and then it's your turn. Your soul floated away. Damn, girl, can I get that in a Yelp review? Five orgasmic stars. I mumble as I wiggle back against him and his thick erection. I must doze off, because when I wake up, it's to Heath pulling on his t-shirt and answering the bedroom door. He talks so quietly I can't make out who he is talking to or what they're saying. He shuts the door and locks it and returns to bed. Who was that? Rothrus. They're playing Xbox. Asked if I wanted to join. I haven't made good on my end of the bargain yet. I yawn again as I reach for him, which makes Heath chuckle. He wraps me in his arms and I tip my head up to look at him. It's okay. I'm getting used to you leaving me with blue balls. My jaw drops and he shakes his head. I'm kidding, baby doll. Come on, I'll distract them while you make a getaway. As I get to my feet, Mav's deep voice shouts from the living room. I can't make out his words, but it's his presence that makes me pause. Oh crap, I totally forgot about helping Maverick with his literature class. I'll help him. You're gonna read aloud to him in that sexy British accent? Swoon. Maybe I can stay for that. Don't look at me like that, Genevieve, or I'll never let you out of here. He goes first while I hide in his room, peeking out the crack of his mostly closed door. He calls for Rhett and then walks into the bathroom. Rothress's tone sounds confused as he asks why he's going into the bathroom, but I don't stick around to figure out what Heath says to keep him in there while I hurry out of the apartment. When Ava and I get to the dining hall the next morning, Heath is waiting outside, leaning against the wall, his phone in hand. He looks up as I approach, and a smile spreads across his face. Took you two long enough. I'm starving. I hadn't asked him to wait for me, so I find it particularly endearing that he did, especially when I know how important food is to him. I'm going to grab something quick and sit outside to call Trent. Ava says before we split to grab breakfast. You don't need to do that. We can all sit together. Eh, it's fine. I get all tongue-tied around your brother and his hockey friends anyway and end up feeling like a bumbling idiot. I fill a tray and find Heath at our usual table, already digging into his first plate of food. He raises his brows and smiles around a big mouthful as I sit. His long legs find mine under the table and he spreads them to frame mine from either side. We eat in silence. Heath somehow devours all his food before I do, and he leans back and eyes my tray as if he's hoping I might leave him some. Stop eye-fucking my food, pain. That strawberry jelly looks good. Should have gotten some then, I say and take a big bite of my jelly toast. I'm teasing him, but now that he's watching my mouth while I chew, I'm a little turned on. Leave it to Heath to turn cafeteria breakfast into foreplay. In his words, it's all foreplay. Chapter 20 Heath 
Has anyone seen my hat? Rothrus walks around the living room, moving cushions and checking under the couch. Bathroom, Mav and I say at the same time. He narrows his gaze. Why the hell is it in the bathroom? He disappears and returns with the faded Bruins hat on his head. Hell if I know, you and Heath went in there and you came back with a frustrated scowl and without a hat. Did he violate you? You could tell me, you know. I needed him to rub a little icy hot on my back, I say. Mm-hmm. And he took his hat off for that? Mav grins big and looks to me. He knows damn well why I called Ralph Russ in there yesterday. Getting Ginny in and out of our place without being seen is a great source of entertainment. I couldn't reach it, I protest, playing along. The old reach around. Mav hands me a controller as I take a seat next to him. Where's Adam? I haven't seen him since practice this morning. Probably at Terrence, I offer. He was having dinner with Ginny. Rhett sits in the chair, messing with his phone, most likely texting his girl, which is good because he misses the way my head pops up at the information. Dinner? I look to Maverick. I could eat. You could always eat. He sets down the controller. I'm in. Any idea where they went? When we walk into the hideout and crash the Scots family dinner, Adam laughs. Miss me, guys? Nah, man. Missed your sister, I say, jokingly. Janey turns red and Mav goes into a coughing fit. I slide in next to her and drape my arm over her shoulder. Adam rolls his eyes, not taking me serious for a second, which is hilarious since I'm not kidding. Ralph Russ takes a seat next to Adam and Maverick grabs a chair for the end. Smells good. I lean in close as she bites the end of a fry. She elbows me. Get your own. We order food, but I continue to sneak fries off her plate while we wait. Ginny's so much nicer than I am. I'd never let anyone get away with taking food from me. Heath doesn't share food. I totally said that in my Joey from Friends voice. He had the right idea. After dinner, we linger. Maverick grabs a pitcher of beer and a few guys from the team show up. All the extra commotion means it's easier for me to flirt with Ginny without anyone noticing. I place my hand on her leg under the table and she pins me with a playfully annoyed smirk. What you doing? She glances around. No one is paying us any attention. I tell her without looking. Do you want to go into the bathroom and make out? I waggle my eyebrows and she laughs. No thanks. She scrunches up her nose. I knew I should have gone with the dumpster out back. So much better. She leans in and my heart rate picks up. Sneaking around is hot. It isn't something I ever planned on doing. My sexcapades have never been secret, but moving my hand up her thigh and brushing two fingers against her jean-clad pussy with no one being the wiser, while Ginny tries hard not to react, is awesome. I may never go public with a chick again. Seriously, though, I drove. Meet you at my car? I motion with my head to the door. She studies my face. You're serious. Hell yeah, I'm serious. I scoot out of the booth. Are you coming? Her mouth opens and she looks around. This time I do too, but no one is staring at us. I mean, honestly, who'd picture us together? Ginny is sugar and spice and everything nice, while I'm the dude who propositioned her for a quickie in the public bathroom thirty seconds ago. She nods. I put cash on the table to cover my food and a portion of the alcohol. I text Maverick that they are under no circumstance to come outside until I return, and I wait for her just outside the door. Maybe it'd be safer to wait inside the vehicle so that no one sees us walking together, but I'm not making her do the walk through the parking lot to my SUV for sex by herself. I'm a gentleman like that. She pushes out of the hideout and scans the parking lot, stopping when she finds my SUV and giving me a perfect opportunity to sneak up behind her and lift her at the waist. Oh my gosh, she squeals as I do an overhead press with her in my arms. When I bring her back down, she grabs hold of my neck. What if you dropped me? Such little faith. I unlock my car and open the back door. I can't believe I'm doing this. She climbs in and I follow. I'm quick to shut the door and finally have her alone. For whatever hesitation she had before, she attacks my face as soon as I turn my head. Her hands go to my hair and her mouth is on mine. I pull her onto my lap the best I can in this back seat, slouching down so our heads aren't bumping against the roof of the car. 
God bless tinted windows. My fingers slip under her shirt and lift. I enjoy the way her skin pebbles at my touch. I push up the fabric so I can access her bra, pull the cups down and press my lips to one nipple. She arches into me and rubs herself against my crotch. Do you put something on your skin? Edible lotion? I pop off just long enough to ask and then move to the next nipple. Edible lotion? She giggles and then moans. You always taste so good. I lick and bite. Seriously, Ginny-flavored nipples are my favorite food and I am starving. It's just me. She pulls away, scrambling onto the seat beside me and unbuttoning my jeans. She smiles up timidly at me as she frees my dick. I hiss as she licks the dot of pre-cum. Fuck, Ginny. Do that again. She does, except this time she takes me all the way in. Dead. Gone. Rest in peace. Thought I was going to hell, but this is heaven. I hit the back of her throat and she gags. But does she stop? Hell to the no. I place my hands on her head, running my fingers through her hair. Gently, I guide the tempo, but I let her decide how much to take. I'm a big guy. No one has dared to deep throat me before, and she's the last person I expected to try. I'm getting dangerously close with each swirl of her tongue and hollowing of her cheeks. I hold her hair back from her face like a ponytail. One blonde strand hangs in her eyes, the ends brushing my stomach as she bobs. I'm close, I warn her. I think there are some napkins in the glove box. Unless her hearing is broken or she's in some sort of blowjob-focused trance, she hears me, but she doesn't stop until I've come in her pretty mouth. I lean my head back against the leather. My whole body is trembling. That was... holy shit. She laughs. And I thought the way to your heart was through your stomach. Only one thing I enjoy more than food, baby. Fifteen minutes later, after returning the favor, we head back into the hideout. She runs a hand over her hair and then her mouth. Relax. You look gorgeous. I should probably go in first. She takes out her phone. I'll pretend like I was on my phone. As she pushes through the door, holding her phone up to her ear like she's on a call, mine buzzes in my pocket. Hey, I'm just walking into dinner, I say, taking a step away from the door. Hello, Mom, how are you? She mocks and then chuckles, and that light sound makes me smile. Sorry. Hey, Mom, how are you? Well, I'm good now that I finally hear your voice. Sorry, I say again, not just for being a dick with how I answered, but for not calling her sooner. Can I assume no news is good news? Yeah, everything's good. How are you? How's Kevin? I'm good. Kevin's good, too. He's actually why I'm calling. My brows draw together. Oh, shit. If she's calling to tell me she's getting remarried or some shit, it's going to be a real bummer to my night. I want her to be happy, but... He is? I was talking about coming down for your home games next weekend, and he offered to come with me. I'm speechless, letting the information sink in. My mom hasn't been to a game since before Dad died. I stopped asking years ago. Now she's coming willingly and bringing the guy she's seeing? Heath, are you there? Yeah, I clear my throat. Yeah, I'm here. Well, what do you think? I know I haven't... Sounds great. I interrupt before she can finish that statement. Can I text you later to hash out the details? I'm with some friends. Of course. Have fun and be safe. I will. Love you, honey. I click end and blow out a breath as I head inside. November, Chapter 21, Jenny It's nice. My mom steps into my dorm and smiles. Dad hangs in the doorway and gives a tentative glance around. Dad, you can come in. He moves only an inch farther inside. Since my parents were in Mexico when I left for college, this is the first time they're seeing my dorm outside of the pictures I've sent. Where's Ava? My mom asks, now inspecting her side, the Vampire Diaries poster, and the collage of pictures that is basically a shrine to Trent. 
She's visiting her boyfriend. Dad frowns. You stay here by yourself on the weekends? Not every weekend. Besides, I'm not exactly alone. I motion behind him where people are moving up and down the hallway. I set the bag of new towels Mom brought me on the floor by my desk. Should we head over to the arena? Riding to the game with my parents feels a little strange, like I'm back in high school, and reminds me of the times Brian and I rode down the valley with them. It's a fleeting feeling of sadness at the thought of my ex, but as soon as Valley U takes the ice and I see Heath, Brian is completely forgotten. I sit forward in my seat to get a better look. He and Adam skate out next to one another. Adam scans until he finds us in the crowd. He smiles and lifts a hand to greet my parents. Heath notices and follows the movement to our family. I wave back as I stare at Heath. He smiles, straps his gaze, and then does his own scan of the crowd. His mom and her boyfriend are in for the weekend, too. And though he didn't tell me, I know it's the first time she's come to a game. I heard Adam and Rhett asking him about it earlier this week when I was hiding in his room. Grand Canyon is the worst team in the division, and they didn't bring their A-game tonight. Valley leads by two after the first period. On the plus side, Adam is playing great, so my parents don't care that the game is a snooze fest. I head to the bathroom during intermission and run into Taryn as I'm going back to my seat. Hey, I pause and move out of the flow of traffic. I wasn't sure if you were here tonight. Yeah, of course I am. Wouldn't miss it. Her red hair is pulled back in a high ponytail with blue and yellow ribbons. Adam's number is painted on her face. I have a flash of jealousy at how proudly and openly she displays her loyalty and fandom for my brother. Are you going to meet up with us for dinner after? She twists her hands in front of her and nods. Yeah, Adam asked me to come. I'm a little nervous about meeting your family. Don't be, they'll love you. Do you want to come meet them now and get it over with? I don't know. Come on, let me introduce you, and by dinner you'll be sharing embarrassing Adam stories with my mom. A slow smile spreads across her face. Yeah, okay. As I predicted, my parents love Taryn. By the time the game ends and we get to the hideout, they're completely enthralled with catching up on Adam and learning more about his girlfriend. I'm able to half listen and stare across the restaurant to Heath and his table. Maverick is with him, and they sit across from a woman with light brown hair and small features. I catch her smile as she turns her head to the man sitting beside her. He has a thick head of gray hair and a strong jawline and muscular arms that defy his age. They look happy. Heath looks, well, not uncomfortable exactly, but like the outsider. To a bystander, you'd think Maverick was the one related. He looks far more relaxed and like he's enjoying himself. That's just Maverick, though. He's always comfortable in his skin. Rhett's girlfriend Carrie is here this weekend, too. They're celebrating their five-year anniversary, and the two of them sit up at the bar. She's nothing like I expected. Rhett is so nice and sweet, and Carrie is a little harsh and rough around the edges. When he introduced us, she didn't even fake a smile. Maybe she has resting bitch face? I glance back at Heath. He's got RBF right now, too. <laughs> right, Jenny? Adam asks, breaking my surveillance of the Payne family. Sorry, what? My brother smiles like he's on to me and my cheeks warm. Shit, was that just totally obvious I was staring at Heath? I was telling Mom and Dad that you hang out at our apartment pretty often, too. That it's nice and not the pigsty they are imagining. I wouldn't say often, no. I shake my head. I've been over a couple of times. What? No way. You're over at Reagan and Dakota's all the time. He looks to my parents. Our neighbors are cool and we hang out a lot. I'm slow to nod and my pulse is thrumming much too quickly as I realize he isn't talking about the times I've been over at his place and hidden in Heath's room. Right, yes, we've become good friends. I'm actually considering moving in with them next year. Out of the dorms? My mom frowns. Yeah, just like Adam did his sophomore year. That's not exactly the same. My dad points out. Adam smirks, knowing how it rankles me when our parents give him differential treatment for being a guy. 
Yes, I get that some things are safer for him because he's male, but I don't think this is one of those things. I could probably pull up statistics for crime in dorms versus apartments, but can't they just trust me? I don't argue for now. It's a year away, and I don't want to spend this weekend annoyed with my parents. Heath's table finishes with dinner first, and they get up and head toward the door. We're just out of their path to the exit, but Maverick moves to us with a big grin. Hello, Scott family. Mom, Dad, you remember Johnny Maverick? Adam asks, dropping an arm around the back of Taryn's chair. And Heath Payne? My parents say their hellos. Heath doesn't introduce his mom, and there's an awkward beat before she steps forward. Hello, I'm Lana Payne, Heath's mom. It's nice to meet you, my mother responds with a warm smile. She's always been good at making people feel at ease. Are you guys heading out already? Adam asks. We can pull up more chairs? My dad offers. Mav looks to Heath, who glances to his mom. You guys probably want to get back to the hotel. I'm not sure if it's a question or statement, and neither is she. Lana nods, though I detect maybe the slightest disappointment. It has been a long day. She smiles stiffly. If you two want to stay with your friends... Nah, I'm tired too. Mav? Mav's brows pull together. Sure, man, let's go back. I'm beat. Catch you guys later. Heath says, finally meeting my gaze and letting it slide around the table. Good meeting you, Mr. and Mrs. Scott. They walk off from the table and out of the hideout. After they're gone, my attention and desire to be out wanes. Don't get me wrong, I'm enjoying seeing my parents, but I talk to them almost weekly, so there's not a lot to add. And I might also be thinking of a certain boy. I don't know his family dynamics. I know his father died when he was young, and I know his mother hasn't visited him at Valley, but I don't know the why or how and if the two are related. Heath isn't very chatty about his family, and okay, we haven't done a lot of talking lately. When we decided to date, we caved to months of sexual tension and haven't come up for air yet. Mom and Dad drop me off in front of the dorm, and I head up to my room. I unlock the door, push it open, and flip on the light. Movement catches my eye and my heart goes to my throat. Oh my gosh, you scared me. Heath sits on my bed, his back against the wall and his long legs hanging off the side. I glance back to the door. That was locked, right? Your RA let me in. My brows raise up toward my hairline. She did? Rachel, my RA, isn't known for being all that lenient on rules, which hasn't ever really bothered me since I don't spend that much time here. I told her I was surprising you for our one-year anniversary. He looks a little embarrassed, which makes me laugh. Have you ever had a one-year anniversary? Nah. He chuckles. It was the first thing that came to mind with Roth Russ and his girl's big anniversary this weekend. I move to the bed and sit next to him. Six-month anniversary? He shakes his head. I've never even had a one-month anniversary. A small shrug of his shoulders, and then he leans into me. What about you? Brian and I were together for two years. We didn't really celebrate the milestones. For one, we could never agree on the date. He thought it was March 3rd, and I swore it was the 7th. Heath's chest moves with a silent laugh, and he takes my hand, running his thumb along the inside of my palm. How was dinner? I ask. Weird. I scoot back against the wall and lean my head against his shoulder. How so? He lets out a breath and brings our joined hands to his thigh. It's a few moments of silence before he answers. I knew meeting Kevin would be weird. He seems nice, but he's just like this stranger who is the center of my mom's world now. And I don't know her life like I used to. Even Maverick's random jokes and comedic commentary couldn't push past the awkwardness. I'm sorry. He sits tall, and I do the same so I can look at him. It's over. Besides, she seems good, so that's worth something. He clears his throat. So, back to this anniversary thing. Why do people get hung up on the number of years or the exact date? I want to ask him more about his mom, but can sense his need to talk about something else. 
I'm not sure. I think people like to have milestones to celebrate, or maybe it makes them feel like their relationship is the gold standard if they can slap an award on it. He grunts a response. But also, it's just sort of nice to look back on a year or twenty of your life and reflect on how it might have been different if you hadn't been together. He studies me carefully, and I feel like I've gone too girly on him. It's a romanticized version, I admit. What would you do if you made it an entire year with the same girl? His eyes widen, playfully exaggerating as if he's horrified by the idea of a relationship that long. Maybe he's not exaggerating, but he grins. <laughs> I'm not sure. His mouth finally captures mine. Maybe it's because we aren't in danger of being caught, or maybe he's just exhausted from the day, but our kisses are lazier. We take our time just kissing without rubbing up on one another, no hands roaming beyond the face and neck. It's unexpected, but nice, soft and sweet in the sexiest way. When we finally lay down on my bed, he removes my clothes between kisses dropped on my lips and body. I tug at the hem of his shirt, and he lifts it and tosses it to the floor. We've never been completely naked at the same time. My heart rate skitters when I finally get the full skin-to-skin -skin contact I'd only imagined until now. Whether it's because he hasn't wanted to, or because he's read my hesitation, I'm not sure. But Heath and I haven't had sex. We've done practically everything but. The largest part of me wants to, but something inside of me still screams for me to hold back. I hate to acknowledge that something because I think it has everything to do with the way I held out on having sex with Brian for years, and then as soon as I did, he broke up with me. I get that it wasn't the sex, and maybe I still would have slept with him even if I knew it was going to end. But the fact of the matter is, it scares me that the same thing might happen with Heath. His stick twitches between us and heat pools at my center. There's a lump in my throat as I find my voice. I don't think I'm ready. Is that okay? I mean, I want to do other stuff, just not that. His hands frame my face and his blue eyes stare deeply into mine. Of course it's okay. He savors my body in a way I'll remember forever. Taking sex off the table only makes him more creative, and he gets a well-deserved A+, plus in that department. We fall asleep still naked, and I take note of a different type of anniversary. The first time you realize you're falling for someone. Chapter 22 Heath my mom wants to go to breakfast Saturday morning before I head to the arena. Mav is still sleeping when I get back from Ginny's, so I'm on my own when I push through the door of the cafe. She waves from a booth, her other hand wrapped around a coffee mug. Hey, I say as I sit across from her. Sorry I'm late. It's okay. You know I like to have my first cup of coffee in silence anyway. I smile at the reminder that something is still the same. The waiter stops by to pour me a cup of coffee and take our order, after which I lean back in the booth. Kevin isn't joining us? No, just the two of us. Her smile is warm and genuine as she studies me. I've missed you. There's an uneasy ache in my chest as the sincerity of her words hit me. Maybe our bond wasn't always the healthiest, me taking care of her more than the other way around, but in some ways it's good to know I'm still missed if not needed. I spent the first year of college trying not to fuck up. If I'm honest, I didn't even want to come to college. I mean, I did. Of course I did. College is fucking awesome. But I was so scared. My mom was barely hanging on by a thread after my dad died. I'd lost one parent and the panic was real that I'd leave and the other one would disappear without me watching over her like I'd done for the past four years. I was the one who made her smile when no one else could. The person she relied on to remember things like paying the electricity bill and mowing the grass. And I wasn't perfect. I found a release for my teenage angst with other things. Fast cars, easy chicks, occasionally getting high. But I did my best to never bring any more burdens inside the four walls that were already crashing in on us. 
So imagine my surprise when I go away to college and nearly give myself a fucking ulcer with worry, only to return home this past summer and see she's fine. No, not just fine. Fine is the word she used when she was wearing last week's clothes lying on the couch and staring at the TV in a comatose state. She wasn't fine. She was good. She didn't need me to walk around the house singing Disney songs or brush her hair while we watched Friends on repeat. I should be happy that she is doing well. I am happy. I'm just also bitter. Where was this woman when I needed her to hold me and tell me everything was going to be okay? It isn't fair. I know that. There's no right way to mourn, and my dad's death rocked us all to the core. You don't get to tell people how to feel. Fuck. You don't even get to tell yourself how to feel. It's a real bitch of the human condition to be in control of everything and also nothing. Is everything going okay? You look good. I am. She reaches across the table and squeezes my hand. I can't bring myself to return the gesture. Her fingers linger and each second that passes feels like an eternity. I don't know why I can't just accept and enjoy her company. She gives me one last squeeze and then pulls back. You looked good on the ice last night, too. I still can't believe how talented you and your brother both turned out. I can barely walk a straight line. You got your athleticism from your father. He would be so proud. Can we not? She flinches and I wince. Damn it. Why can't I just sit here and let her talk about him? Partly it's because I'm afraid that conversation leads to me telling her how bitter I feel. And what good would that do? She's finally on her feet and I knock her down with memories of how she hurt me when she was drowning? No way. Can we talk about something else? I try again. She nods. Sure. We suffer through breakfast, talking about stupid shit like the weather and repairs she's having done on the house back in Michigan. My mood sours with each bite, and I'm all too eager to head to the arena when it's time. Adam walks in just after I do. Hey man, where were you this morning? I'm sorry, did I need to check in before I left? His brows raise. Shit, I'm sorry. I'm in an awful mood. Had breakfast with my mom this morning. He nods and takes a seat on the bench, setting his bag on the floor. Are you two not close? We are. We were, I don't know. When my dad passed away, shit was fucked up for a while. Sorry, man. I can't imagine what it'd be like if something happened to my parents. Anything I can do to help? Nah, I just need to get on the ice. One side of his mouth pulls up into a smile. All right. After the best game of my life, apparently bitter frustration works well for me, I find my mom waiting for me outside of the locker room with some of the other families, including the Scots. Ginny smiles and approaches me. That was incredible. Congratulations. She hugs me, taking me by surprise given all the onlookers, but it feels too nice to pull away. Thanks. Hopefully not the last time I get a hat trick. Then I lean down close to her ear. Maybe we can celebrate with a hat trick of our own. She blushes and pulls back. I accept a hug from my mom and a handshake from Kevin and from Mr. Scott. We should celebrate. Adam claps me on the shoulder. What do you feel like doing? Your sister. Mav steps up, his bag slung over his body. Party at our place. Invite the rents. Let's get weird. I think we'll pass. Let you guys celebrate on your own. Mr. Scott wraps an arm around his wife, who nods her agreement. We have reservations for dinner. She looks to my mom and Kevin. Would you like to join us? I think that sounds great, Kevin says. What do you say, Lana? More of the parents make plans and the guys start heading out. Ginny's still standing by my side, and I have the strongest urge to grab her hand. I'm going to find Reagan and Dakota. See you later? Ride over with me. But, she glances around, are you sure? Yeah, no one will notice or care. Just give me a couple minutes to say goodbye to my mom. Okay. My mom walks over to us before I get the chance to go to her. Ginny smiles at her and then me. See ya. Mom watches her leave, only speaking once we're alone. A sad expression on her face as she lowers her voice. 
I should have come alone and not brought Kevin. I wanted you to meet him to see that I'm happy. I thought it would give you some peace, but I see now that was my own selfish reasoning, and I'm sorry. This isn't how I wanted this weekend to go. It isn't Kevin. It's us. I don't know how to do this with you. I motioned between us. Everything is so different. I know, but I still love you just the same. I'm so proud of you. Love. I hate that damn word. Why does it always feel like it's an excuse? When she says it, all I hear is, I love you so it's okay that I screwed up. Thanks, Mom. I am glad you came. Kevin steps up behind her. Nice game, Heath. Thanks. The hall has cleared and we start toward the door. Mom hugs me tightly before we head our separate ways. Be safe. I hug her back. She's heavier now, no longer the small, fragile thing she once was. I will. I'll call next week. She nods and smiles, maybe a little disbelieving that I really will. Ginny leans against my vehicle, her phone in hand. It's dark and she's all alone, and I feel like an ass for making her wait for me out here like this. I hit the unlock button and she looks up, those light brown eyes meeting mine under the fluorescent parking lot lights. Instead of going to the driver's side, I go to her, kissing her hard out in the open where anyone might see us. She doesn't seem to care either, though, because she wraps her arms around my neck and presses her body to mine. And it's the best damn part of the day. Well, unless she lets me hat-trick her later. Chapter 23 Jenny the following weekend, the guys are gone for two away games. I sit on the floor in Reagan and Dakota's apartment. Reagan brings two bags of chips and a platter of dips and sets it down between me and Dakota. Dakota stands. I'm going to grab the bottle of wine so I don't have to get up again. You're staying over, right? She asks. Yeah, might as well. Ava's out of town visiting Trent, I say before digging into the queso. She grabs the wine and we all settle in. Does he stay with you then on the weekends, or are you two getting it on with your brother on the other side of the wall? Dakota asks. I make a face and toss a chip at her. Gross, and Adam isn't on the other side of the wall, thankfully. Maverick is always hanging in the living room, though, and sometimes has girls with him. I have no idea why he doesn't go to his own place. Reagan scrunches up her nose. Yeah, I've heard entirely too much of his sex talk for my liking. Dirty talk? Maverick? Dakota asks. That surprises me for some reason. Not dirty, exactly, and I think he might be talking to himself. I make a face. He's a weird dude. Come on, give us something, anything. We're dying for details. You've barely said anything about this new hot thing between you and Heath. Dakota pulls her red hair over one shoulder. I look between my friend's eager faces. There's not much to tell. I don't buy it, Reagan says. You two looked like you were gonna rip each other's clothes off playing video games last night. Some clothes have been ripped off, but we haven't had sex yet. Interesting. She says it like interesting means bad or weird. Is it? We're making out every chance we get. He's given me more orgasms fully clothed than I would have thought possible, Technically, we haven't slept together yet, but it's been fun and hot. None of it seemed odd before, but now I'm nervous that maybe he thinks it's weird, too. Is that bad? Should I be worried? Sounds sweet, Reagan says. Dakota takes a sip of her wine. Sounds very unlike Heath. Dakota, Reagan says in a shrill voice. What? She looks to me. You know he's not some innocent guy, right? I mean, I wouldn't call Heath a slut because I'm not into label shaming, but he's not been shy about hooking up with chicks. And by hooking up, I mean sex. No, I, I know. Reagan places a hand on my knee and squeezes. But he hasn't dated anyone else as far as I know. When did dating become more romantic than sex? I ask, and then... If I tell you guys something, will you promise not to laugh? Yes, Reagan says, at the same time Dakota says, no way. Coda, 
Reagan admonishes. What? If it's funny, I won't be able to hold back. I will try. Good enough, I guess. I take a drink of the wine. My last boyfriend, Brian, broke up with me after. After? After we'd had sex, like, still inside of me. Oh, shit. Dakota's eyes widen. I hide behind my hands, stretched out over my face. Now I wish you'd just laughed. Wait, wait, wait. We need the full story, Reagan says. So I tell them how Brian and I had planned to go to Valley U together, but then he'd received an offer to play football in Boise, and how he'd broken the news to me after we'd had sex for the first time. What an asshole. He really isn't, though. It was my idea. I was ready, and I thought it would bring us closer before we headed off on this great adventure together. After, he told me he wasn't going to Valley, and that he thought it would be better if we broke up instead of trying to make it work. I've gone over that day a million times looking for cues I missed, but I was ready and excited, and I think he could have shown me a million red flags and I would have ignored them. Sorry, babe. Dakota rubs my arm. For what it's worth, even Heath's not that cold. No, I know, and I'd had sex before Brian, just one other time with a guy I met at summer camp. It was right before Brian and I started dating. Neither were great. I made Brian wait because I wanted it to mean more than the first time, and I think I'm doing it again with Heath. Does that make me too idealistic? Reagan shakes her head. No, of course not. But holding out doesn't mean that it will mean more. It just means you build it up to an impossible standard. I hadn't thought about it like that, I admit. We go through two bottles of wine and watch a movie before calling it a night. Reagan brings me a blanket and pillow from her room. Thank you. The TV is muted, but I lie down and watch Golden Girls reruns with subtitles. I'm just about asleep when my phone buzzes. Hottest guy on campus. You awake? Me. No. Hottest guy on campus. Me either. Me. Don't you have a big game tomorrow or something? Hottest guy on campus. Maverick snores. Me. I don't snore, and I miss you. Hottest guy on campus. Now I really wish you were in this hotel room with me instead. Me. Oh, yeah? Need a cuddle, buddy? Hottest guy on campus. Yeah. Just don't tell Mav. He thinks I only cuddle with him. Me. Your secret is safe with me. Hottest guy on campus. What did you do tonight? Me. Hung out with Reagan and Dakota at their place. You'll be back tomorrow night? Hottest guy on campus. Yeah, but it'll be pretty late. Me. Can I come over and stay the night? Hottest guy on campus. You never need to ask, baby. I smile and close my eyes. My phone buzzes with another text. Hottest guy on campus. Hat trick? I type out a dozen different responses, trying to decide if I should go along with his playful banter or take this opportunity to confide in him. He takes the decision out of my hands by sending another when I've been quiet too long. Hottest guy on campus. Shit, I'm sorry. Did I freak you out? Me. Honestly, a little, maybe. I mean, I want to do all those things. A lot. But I'm nervous, too. My experiences are limited and were just blah. Hottest guy on campus. I find it very hard, pun intended. That any form of sex could be blah with you. Me. That might have more to do with you than me. You're fun and hot. Hottest guy on campus. Right back at you, baby doll. Chapter 24. Heath. I drop into the seat next to Rothrus as my phone buzzes in my pocket. Pain, how are your ribs? Coach Myers stands in the aisle, hands on the seats in front of me. That was a nasty hit. Fine. Nothing's broken. I laugh and then wince as my side screams. I adjust the ice pack strapped around my waist. Try to take it easy tonight. Check in with the trainer first thing tomorrow. I nod and he walks off. I wait to make sure he's not watching before leaning back with a groan. 
I dig my phone out, breathless by the maneuvering that's required. I read Ginny's text asking me to give her a heads up so she can sneak into my room before we get home. She added three hat emojis and fuck my life. I don't think I can even make good on that tonight. I text her back the tongue, peach, and eggplant emojis because I'm not an idiot and I think it might be worth dying for. Another win under our belt and it feels good, even if my body aches. I took a hard hit in the last minute of the game and my ribs hurt like a bitch. You all right? Ralph Russ asks from the seat next to me. I grunt a response as I close my eyes. Somehow that seems to make the pain lessen. I'm gonna video chat my girl. Cool. I wave my hand to let him know I don't mind. Roth Russ is the kind of guy who doesn't care who hears his conversations with Carrie, so he doesn't even bother putting in headphones. Hi, baby, she answers. Congrats on the win. I've only met Carrie a couple times. Seems okay. I don't get why Roth Russ is so hung up on her, but he didn't ask my opinion, so I don't give it. Thanks. How's your editorial coming? She sighs and goes into a long explanation. Rothrus listens intently, with his mm-hmm and oh yeah at all the right times. He's good at listening. Has to be, apparently. She barely takes a breath between sentences. I doze off, and when I wake up again, we're pulling off the freeway to Valley, and the dude is still on the phone, and she's still doing most of the talking. I sit up with a wince and check my phone but only have a couple texts from my mom and Nathan congratulating me on the game and checking in on my well-being. I tap out responses to both of them in the time it takes Carrie to get out a single run-on sentence. How do two people have so much to talk about? It isn't like they haven't talked in weeks or something. She was at Valley visiting just last weekend. As the bus pulls into the campus lot, they say their goodbyes with promises to talk later tonight before bed. When he hangs up, I ask, Seriously? You're going to talk to her again later? His hard, steel-blue eyes study me, and then he chuckles. You don't get it, but someday you will. When I don't respond, he clarifies. Some girl is going to make you so crazy that you'll want to talk to her all day, every day. What in the world do you have to talk about after being together so long? Not even Scott talks on the phone as much as you. I look across the aisle to where Scott is staring out the window. It's different for him. He's going to get off the bus and go see Terran. I gotta take what I can get for now. Sounds pretty awful, I say truthfully. What's the point of being in a relationship if you have to do it through an electronic device? We file off the bus, me much slower than the rest of the guys. Mav's got an energy drink in hand as he steps up beside me. Hey buddy, how you feeling? Like I got hit really fucking hard in the ribs. He grins. Need me to drive? I toss him the keys and manage to get myself into the passenger seat with a lot of wincing. Text Ginny. I tell the Bluetooth once Mav is headed to the house. When prompted for the message, I say, Back. On our way. And send. Her response pings over the speakers and the feminine British voice asks if I'd like her to read it aloud. I glance at Mav. Earmuffs. And then... Yes. Already here, the British voice reads the text, but I hear it in Ginny's bubbly voice. I blow out a breath, tired but excited to see her. Ginny's at your place waiting? Mav asks. How'd she get in? Her brother gave her a spare key, I grin. Wasn't that nice of him? And super convenient for me. I hate to be the one to rain on anyone's parade, bro, but don't you think you ought to tell him? What? No. Why would I do that? Look, at first, I understood you guys wanting to keep it from him while you figured out what it was, but it's been weeks and you're spending a shit ton of time together. He's going to figure it out. Ginny doesn't want to. Besides, he won't understand. You know what he's like in relationships? All in. Balls to the wall. I squeeze the phone in my hand. He won't understand, I repeat. Maybe not. I still think it should come from you. Hey, Scott, guess what? I'm hooking up with your sister, but don't worry, it isn't that serious. I glance at Maverick with an annoyed glare. That what you had in mind? He laughs.
Maybe work on the delivery. A bead of sweat has formed on my forehead by the time I make it into the apartment, and that's with Mav carrying my bag. Just set it there. I point to the spot in the living room where our bags usually end up. I'll get it tomorrow. Thanks, buddy. He grins, knowing exactly why I don't want him to bring it to my room. Adam went straight to Terran's, and Rothruss heads to his room while I limp to mine. The light's off, and I wonder how she's handling the dark. I push open the door and find her sitting on my bed with her laptop. The screen is dimmed, but providing a decent amount of soft light. I flip on the overhead light and she closes the laptop and sits up. As I walk, her eyes narrow in concern. What's wrong with you? Bruised ribs. She gets on her knees and lifts her hands to touch me. Easy. Why didn't you tell me you were injured? I'm fine. Lay down. Bossy. I can dig. Gingerly, I sit and then fold over. I'm pretty sure I'm stuck this way. I kick off my shoes and she lies beside me. Shit, I forgot the ice pack. Where is it? She asks, angling like she's about to grab it for me. I left it in my car. I can get it. Nah, I got it. There's another in the freezer. I inch up, but not before Ginny is to her feet and padding to the door. Be right back. She opens it and peers out into the hallway. It should be all clear, I tell her, knowing Rothruss is almost certainly still on the phone. She nods and smiles back at me. Okay, be right back. I manage to get out of my jeans, although I think the shirt's going to have to stay, because raising my arms hurts too damn much. I'm adjusting the pillow behind my head when she returns. She hovers over me lifts my shirt up to reveal my stomach, and gasps at the angry red and purple skin. Don't think I'm going to be able to follow through on the hat trick tonight. I try to laugh, but my ribs dislike that a lot. It's fine. I've got my laptop for porn. Can I borrow your hand, though? She holds a serious gaze long enough that my dick starts to get ideas. Oh my god, I'm kidding. Not a terrible idea, though. I say, and then have to clear my throat a few times. Not a terrible idea at all. However, when she settles the ice on my skin, those ideas disappear pretty quickly. Wanna watch a movie? She asks as she gets up and takes her pants off. Damn it, now I'm getting hard again. My body is so confused. She settles next to me and opens her laptop between us. Which one? She scrolls between two. I'm starting to feel the exhaustion for the day, so I let her pick. Once the movie is going, she places her head on my chest. Her hair smells like apples and tickles my face. This is nice, I'll admit. Maybe I can kind of see Rothruss's point about wanting to talk to Carrie all the time. Though I can't really picture having an entire relationship through a phone. For Ginny, though? My mind starts to conjure all types of ideas for phone sex. Hanging out with Ginny is always nice. I'm not even disappointed we didn't have sex. Okay, I'm not too disappointed. When I finally get inside of her, I want full range of motion. Especially knowing her past experiences were blah. Seriously, what the fuck? How is that even possible? There's so much passion in Ginny. Kissing her is a trip. Just lying next to her, there's an energy that flows through my veins that doesn't exist when she's not with me. Sex with Ginny, blah? If I weren't so tired, the thought would be laughable. Chapter 25 Jenny. Thursday night, Heath and I ride over to the White House with Maverick and Dakota. We're in the back seat and Heath's big palm is stretched out over my knee. He's texting with his other hand. Sorry, he's getting married next summer, and for some reason I need to decide what kind of tux I want right this second. His fingers keep flying over the screen as he and his brother text back and forth. A tux, hmm. The image of Heath in a nice suit or tux does not suck. He glances up and winks. Tuxes do it for you, huh? You do it for me. Mav groans. You two are a real buzzkill. Should have stayed home and boned, left the party to the single people. Don't be a dick to my girl, Heath tells him, still staring at his phone. 
Maverick turns in his seat. You are ruining it for the rest of us. Girls see you two together and you give them hope and ideas about what the rest of us want. And all I want is a good blowjob. I hope that's not your best pickup line, I tell him. Keith and Dakota laugh. Maverick shakes his head, but smiles. You're such a liar, Heath says, finally putting his phone in his pocket. Some girl gets her mouth anywhere near your junk and you'll be proposing marriage. Probably true. Mav sighs. I'm a romantic at heart. From the front of the White House, it looks like a nice, respectable family home. But one foot inside the door and it's college madness. Though, thankfully, not quite so mad as the pool party. I can actually see two feet in front of me tonight. As we walk through the entryway, I look around to take it all in. The last time I was here, it was so packed it was hard to appreciate. I know, right? Heath takes my hand. The other two have already gone ahead of us. My brother lived here. Since my interactions with Heath have mostly been limited to the hockey team and the dining hall, I didn't realize just how many people he knows. The guys on the basketball team call out to him, Baby Payne! They ask him questions about Nathan, and a few girls ask about Chloe, his brother's fiance. With each group of people we talk to, Heath introduces me, we chat, and we accept drink after drink. Heath more so than me. The end result is a very Gumby-like drunk Heath by the time we've made it outside where the main party is happening. He wraps an arm around my shoulders and leans into me. I think I might be drunk. I stutter step my way to where our friends are sitting. Dakota's found Reagan, and they've pulled lounge chairs together. They're sharing one and facing Maverick. When they spot us, more specifically me, desperately trying to unload a very heavy Heath, Mav moves to sit with Reagan and Dakota, and I manage to get Heath and I seated. The oversharer is here! Maverick lifts his cup with a smile. How you feeling, buddy? Feeling good? Feeling like you want to tell us all your deepest secrets? Heath makes a motion like he's zipping his lips and tossing the key, nearly loses his balance, and falls off the back of the chair. How do you get so drunk when you're this heavy? I groan as I pull him upright. I want to take you to the Olive Garden. He sways a little, staring at me. You deserve the Olive Garden. Our friends are laughing, but even drunk and out of his mind, I can't take my eyes off Heath. I'm pretty sure they're closed right now, but food isn't a terrible idea. I look to Reagan. What do you have in that purse of yours to soak up the alcohol? As she pulls out snacks, everyone suddenly gets very interested in eating. I manage to snag a granola bar and a mini bag of pretzels for Heath. I think you might be my dream woman. Maverick says to Reagan as he opens a peanut butter cookie and takes a bite. He finishes that off and then downs two granola bars. Let's go eat. We can hit IHOP or get Jack in the Box and head back to the apartment. Ooh, Jack in the Box tacos. He closes his eyes and moans. Can't, Heath interrupts. I'm showing my girl a good time. He throws his arm around me again. You can show her a good time back at the apartment. Naked. Maverick stands and everyone else follows his lead. It isn't about sex, he says and looks at me dreamily. My stomach does a thousand backflips. We aren't having sex, so even though our friends are reacting with a series of aw and laughter, he's only stating facts. It isn't about sex, but I think that needs to change soon. I get to my feet and pull him up. Come on. Are we going to the Olive Garden? The next morning, Heath wakes as I'm getting dressed to sneak out of his room. Where do you think you're going? He pulls me down and hugs me against his chest. I have to go to class. In three hours. His eyes are barely open, but apparently he knows the time. I want to get out of here before the guys wake up. The apartment is still silent, but it's game day, and I know the guys will be getting up soon to go skate. It'll be fine. Go to sleep, he murmurs against the top of my head. I turn so we're facing one another and trace tiny circles on his chest. You have to get up in 30 minutes. I decide to try another approach. 
Sliding a leg over him, I scoot on top of him. He makes a strangled sound between a groan and a sigh. I pepper him with kisses, his jaw, his neck, his chest. His hands move to my back, and one comes up and fists my hair. He pulls back just hard enough to lift my chin. What you doing, Jenny? Instead of answering, I close the space between our mouths and kiss him hard. I can feel him smiling. That is, until I roll my hips against the bulge in his sweatpants. In one smooth motion, he has me on my back and he holds himself over me. He dips his lower body to brush against me. This is what you want, Genevieve? My cheeks flame. It is, but suddenly I feel really shy about it. He tips my chin up with a finger. No need to be embarrassed. You can feel how much I want you. But what do you want, Genevieve? I'm having a hard time finding my voice. There's no rush. His sweet words comfort me, but man, do I wish I were ready. It isn't that I don't want to have sex with Heath. I do, very much. But it's a big deal to me. More so, maybe, because I know in the past it hasn't been to him. And because of my previous experiences. I nod, and his thumb glides across my lower lip before he kisses me again. My head may have reservations, but my body does not. Fifteen minutes later, we're basically dry humping when Heath's palm slides up my leg. His fingers brush against the lacy material between my thighs, and a shiver racks my entire body. His thumb rubs the tiny bundle of nerves over my panties, while one finger slips underneath. I cry out and then slap a hand over my mouth. Heath pries my hand away. I want to hear how good I make you feel. He pumps in and out of me a few more times before he decides my underwear are hindering him too much and he yanks them down to my ankles. I think he's moving to free them and toss them to the ground, which he does, but then his large shoulders nudge my legs farther apart and he wraps an arm around me to open me wide. I arch into his mouth, wanting more as his tongue flattens against my throbbing core. He gives it to me, sucking and licking. Slow at first, but as I get louder and the orgasm draws closer, he pushes my legs wider and increases the pressure. As I start to go over the edge, I fist his hair in my hands and ride his face. When one ends, another builds. He rumbles something that vibrates against my pussy and clamps down, sucking on my clit as the second wave hits. My body melts into the mattress. Heath's head is still between my legs, and he places chaste kisses along the inside of my thighs and along my hips. I reach for him, pushing my hand under his sweats. He's not wearing any underwear, which means I have easy access to wrap my fingers around his hard shaft. He hisses a breath and moves his hips, a slow pace that quickly turns into him fucking my hand, hips pumping fast. He growls out as his release fills the inside of his pants. We lay shoulder to shoulder as we catch our breath. Shower with me. He asks, brushing my hair away from my neck and kissing me there. We pad down the hall to the bathroom quietly. He starts the shower while I stare at my wild hair in the vanity mirror. He turns back and drops his pants. I'll never get over seeing him naked. My throat closes and I just stare. He steps forward and kisses me, then pulls the t-shirt I'm wearing over my head. You're beautiful. I reach out and touch his once again hard dick. You're huge, I swallow. He chuckles. Come on. He lets me get in the shower first and then follows and pulls the curtain. I wash and condition my hair, and then Heath covers the both of us in his body wash. It's somehow fun and silly showering with him. He looks adorable with his hair matted down. His very hard penis keeps poking me, but he doesn't make any move to do anything about it. We dry off and get back to his room before I hear other people in the house starting to move around. I sit on the bed and finger comb my wet hair, 
while I watch Heath pull on a gray Coyotes hockey t-shirt. What was it like when you got drafted? It was cool. Cool? That's the best you've got? He flashes a sexy smirk. Really cool? I'm serious. It was incredible and surreal. Easily one of the best days ever. I'm jealous that you have it all figured out. I can't even decide what classes I want to take next semester. I think you're missing the best part of college. And that is? Having fun and not thinking too hard about the future. I snort. Says the guy who knows his future. Maybe, but there are no guarantees that when the time comes, I'll play. A million things might happen between now and then to fuck it all up. I never considered that Heath would worry about his future when he has it mapped out. I don't stress about life beyond college, only planning for it. I guess once you have it figured out, the only thing to worry about is how things might go wrong. You just got here. Give yourself time to just be and let life happen. You don't need to have the next three years or beyond all planned out. What fun would that be? Four months ago, I didn't know you, and now I do. He steps into my space and places his hands on the mattress on either side of me. Not knowing can be exciting. A knock at the door is followed by Maverick's voice. Yo, Bane, let's go. Heath brings his mouth to mine and kisses me softly. I think I'll wait for you guys to leave, I whisper. How are you going to get to the dorm? A lock. No. No? He finds his keys on top of his desk and tosses them to me, and then kisses me one last time before he heads out. Chapter 26 Heath We're sitting around the apartment before we head to the arena for tonight's game. Ralph Russ is FaceTiming Carrie, and it doesn't annoy me quite as much as usual. Mavs sharing his pregame peanut butter sandwich with Charlie, and Adams staring at the TV with a look of hard concentration. I know he wears the weight of the world on his shoulders before games, worrying about how we'll play. He takes a lot of that pressure on himself. Most, I think, isn't really necessary, but I guess that's why he's the captain. Scott, what are you going to do after graduation? I ask him, surprised I don't know. Mav's already signed with the Cats, and Rothraus's family runs a hockey camp that he plans to take over. I'm pre-med, man. Going to medical school. Really? The other guys look to me with equally surprised faces. I didn't know. Or maybe I did and forgot it already. I don't spend a lot of time thinking past next week. Even my own future feels weird. Pro hockey is like this thing I've agreed to, but doesn't really feel like it's going to happen. Two and a half years feels so far away. We're going to be busting people up and he's going to be putting them back together, Mav says, mouth full of peanut butter. I can see you being a team doctor or something. That'd be cool. He laughs and says sarcastically, thanks, I hadn't thought of that. I'm sorry, you probably mentioned it before and I let it go in one ear and out the other. Making plans isn't really my thing. Speaking of plans, is it okay if I crash here tonight? Maverick asks. I'm meeting up with that girl Holly later and I don't want her to know where I live. Dude, gross. Stop hooking up on our couch. You have your own apartment for that. Adam's laughing as he says it, though, the mood light before we have to get serious and ready for the game. He looks to me. What about you? I haven't seen any girls running out in the mornings. You're never here. Rothraus points out, somehow managing to follow two conversations, his with Carrie and ours. Okay, well, fine, but I don't see them zipping through to your room at night before I leave to go to Terran's either. Mav's smile is big and mocking. Yeah, Heath, what's up with that? Well, now I know why I don't try to make small talk with Adam. I stand and start toward my room. Just focused on hockey. I come back with my bag. It's a little early, but I need out of this conversation. You guys ready to head over? None of them mention the time. They're all just as ready to get out of here as I am. Hey, can I catch a ride over to the hideout? Maverick asks after the game. I'm pulling on a shirt and jeans, but I glance over to make sure Adam is out of earshot before I answer. I can drop you off, but I'm not going. Why not? Taking Ginny out. A date? 
he asks, louder than I'd like. Adam's still not paying us any attention, so I nod. Yeah, a date, hanging out, whatever. Where are you going? I don't know. Maybe Prickly Pear, since all the guys will be at the hideout? The Prickly Pear is our second favorite local hangout, but on the weekends. It's often taken over by townies, so we aren't likely to run into anyone we know there. That's a lame date. Then I guess it isn't a date. Yo, Scott, Mav calls, and I fight the urge to pummel him. What's the best spot in Valley to take a girl on a date? On a Friday night? Adam asks, eyebrows drawn together in consideration. The drive-in up on Mount Lockin, or pretty much anywhere downtown. Araceli's has a nice outdoor patio and good food. Didn't take you for the romantic type, Mav, Jordan says. People are surprising, aren't they? He chuckles. Thanks, Scott. Knew you'd come through for me. Maverick closes his locker and turns to me with a smug look. Ready? I pick up Ginny at her dorm. She slides into the passenger seat in a short dress smelling like apples and cinnamon, and I can't help but kiss her while sitting in the no parking zone. Someone honks and I reluctantly pull back and then guide the car back on the road. Where are we going? Ginny's beaming at me and I'm suddenly glad I have some better suggestions than Prickly Pear. You'll see. I rest a hand on her thigh and head out of town. I drive to the outskirts where the houses get bigger, set up on the base of the mountain, and are placed farther apart. The roads are mostly quiet with as many people biking and walking as cars driving along it. It's still nice and warm in Arizona. A few trees have leaves that are changing colors, but mostly it's the usual dull greens and browns, nothing like what I'm used to from growing up in Michigan. Even in the coldest part of the year, the days are too warm in Arizona to consider it real fall weather. It takes almost an hour to get up to the top of the mountain. The road curves through the trees, and we follow a long line of cars, all with the same idea. I park and we get out to get food before the movie starts. It's so much cooler up here she says, wrapping her arms around her body as the wind whips through the lot. Ah, shit. Something I hadn't thought of. I double back and grab a sweatshirt from my car. She pulls it on over her dress. It's nearly as long, and she looks freaking sexy as hell. I smooth her hair away from her face and drop a kiss to her lips. Hungry? She presses her mouth to mine and nods. I tug her behind me to the concession stand. We order hot dogs and popcorn, soda, and more candy than any two people should eat. Ginny's words, obviously, before walking back to the vehicle. The movie is just starting, and I open the back and help her into the cargo area of my SUV. How do you, of all people, know about this place? Me, of all people? She grins. I said what I said. Chuckling, I admit. Actually, from your brother. Her nose wrinkles up. My brother? Ew. He brings dates up here, doesn't he? It's a good spot, gotta admit. I lay out a blanket and we sit, her nestling into my side. Come on, it's gonna be fun. We dive into the food while watching the first half hour or so. It's some old Cary Grant movie that I'm not really into, but Ginny is smiling and practically in my lap, so I'm dealing just fine. When the movie fails to keep our attention any longer, we lie down flat in the bed of the SUV with our heads at the end so we can stare up at the stars. It's really nice up here, she says. Yeah, I think I'll start bringing more of my dates up here. She turns her head to face me. We're both smiling. Jerk. Her eyes are lit with humor and a contentedness fills my chest as I slowly bring my mouth to hers. Kissing Ginny is better than just about anything. She's fun and sexy, and when we're together, everything just feels good. Her nose is cold, and I pull the blanket around us and hug her tight against my chest. What's your major? She chuckles a little, caught off guard by the question as my dick poking her tells her just how much I'd like to be inside her. I haven't decided yet. Why? Just curious. I realized today I'm not great at asking people about themselves, I didn't even know your brother was pre-med. Adam's weirdly quiet about that. He is about everything he does, really. He takes things on and just holds it in so no one else can feel responsibility for it. I know I gripe about him butting into my life, 
but he's always looked out for me, always ready to save me from trouble. He'd do anything for me, no questions asked. Am I trouble he'd try to save her from? The pit in my gut tells me yes. Her hair blows into my face and she tries to tame it. The way you talk about Adam reminds me a lot of Nathan, always looking out for me even when I didn't want him to. Maybe we're just good at giving them reasons to worry about us. That's probably accurate. I think back to all the times I gave Nathan reason to worry. What about you? You're going to be a big hockey star when college is over. Is it weird to have your future all mapped out? Feels so far away it doesn't seem real yet, I guess. Will you get me tickets so I can come cheer you on? I like the vision of her being there, even if it's unlikely to happen. We might be able to work out some sort of barter system. Oh yeah? What'd you have in mind? That sexy glint is back in her eyes. Nothing appropriate for the kids sitting in that minivan next to us. I tell her and sit up. I take her hand and pull her up next to me, drop a kiss to her forehead and say, We can discuss it back at my place. Chapter 27 Jenny. On Sunday, I drag Heath over to my dorm to hang out. Ava's still gone, so we sit on my bed and watch TV, make out, watch TV, nap, make out. It's the perfect ending to a great weekend. You could stay the night, I offer as he's getting dressed to go. I wish I could, but I promised Maverick we'd work on Shakespeare. His test is tomorrow. I let out a sigh. I should probably do some homework, too. Someone distracted me all weekend. He leans down to kiss me. You didn't seem to mind so much when you were riding my face. Fresh desire blooms, and he must read it all over my expression because the next thing I know, I'm flat on my back and he's on top of me kissing me like the world will end if he doesn't. A squeak and the slamming of a door breaks us apart. I give Ava an apologetic smile. No matter how many times she sees Adam or Heath, she still gets shy around them. Hey, Ava, he says to my roommate and then slowly rises off me, but not without another quick kiss. Bye, baby. See you at the dining hall tomorrow. Um, yeah, I think through my schedule. Only for breakfast, though. I'm working at the Hall of Fame in the afternoon. Too bad. He winks and then heads out. Monday afternoon, I have three tours in a row. It's only my second time working by myself. Usually we do them in pairs, but today I'm the only one available. I have a junior high class, a soccer recruit, and then finally a hockey recruit. Knowing I might see Heath before or after the last tour makes the time go by at a snail's pace. It's nice out today, though. Perfect Arizona weather with blue skies and a light fall breeze. I take Andy, the soccer chick, over to the practice field and we sit while I let her ask me questions and soak up the experience. We return just in time for my last tour. I hand her off to a girl on the Valley team as Rothrus and Maverick walk in the hockey recruit, Tom. Genevieve, Maverick calls, his voice echoing in the big open space. I wave and step forward. Hey, nice to meet you. I smile and extend my hand to Tom. You're in good hands, Mav assures him. Jenny is Adam's sister and Heath's... He catches himself in time, but my blood pressure still rises. Mav coughs. Friend. Thanks, guys. I bypass the weirdness by stepping away and inviting Tom to follow me with a head tilt in the opposite direction. Tom is a quiet guy who doesn't say a lot as I show him around. We go by all the usual places on the tour, but I still can't get a read on him until we get to the last stop. And this is the hype room. I do my best Vanna White as he stares into the darkened room with wide eyes and an excited smile. Upbeat music already pumps into the space, and with the press of a button, the TVs come to life with the standard Welcome to Valley message splashed across the entire room. Tom walks in, slowly giving it the appropriate amount of awe. This is so dope. Right? I follow behind him and close us inside. 
I queue up the hockey team video and scoot to the back to let him enjoy the five-minute segment in as much privacy as I can. The hype room is still my favorite part of this job. I could sit in here all day. Even I feel like a badass after watching the videos, and I did not inherit the athleticism my brother did. I wait for the bits with Heath in them, having practically memorized when his face or an action clip appear. Things have been great. While I don't love keeping it from my brother, it's been nice to spend time with Heath without the judgment or questions from anyone. I love my brother, and I understand why he wants to protect me, but I don't need it in this scenario, and I'm not willing to gamble that he'll be cool with it. Heath and I are having fun. A lot of it. And yes, maybe my feelings have gone beyond that, but I refuse to get swept up in analyzing it. But as Heath's face displays on the screen, flashing a cocky and disarming smile, my body melts. Fine, I like him a lot. Who knew dating could be so much fun? I've never laughed so much or felt so wanted. And I don't mean his obvious appreciation for my body. We spend a lot of time together and only half of that is naked. 70% tops. As it gets to the end sequencing, I step closer and get my tablet ready. It's the last tour of the day, and there's a whole different set of steps for shutting down for the night that I haven't done before. Dakota's shown me a few times, and she texted me instructions earlier today as a backup. This room is worth a very pretty penny to the university, and I don't want to break anything. When it finally freezes on the end frame, Tom turns to me. Awesome, right? I ask at his captivated grin. I've seen this look before. He's totally sold. Let me just shut everything down, and some of the guys should be waiting at the desk outside to take you over to the arena. I tap the screen and begin to shut things down. I'm sweating a little with Tom staring at me while I try to juggle my phone and the tablet. Sorry, it's my first time closing it out for the night. No problem. He shoves his hands in his pockets, and I turn slightly and walk toward the door. It isn't pitch dark in here, but it isn't exactly a comfortable light level either. Dakota is much better at sequencing everything, so it happens seamlessly. Okay, I think I got it, I say as I tap the final button. Except, instead of opening the door, it shuts off all the TVs, and now we really are in the pitch black. Shit, I forgot to open the door before shutting down. No problem, I've got this. With trembling hands, I try to turn on the TVs, but they won't come back on until the systems reset. I search for another button, hoping to find one labeled lights. Oh, shit, 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 shit. One second, I'm so sorry. My breaths come in quick, short gulps as I text Dakota and then press buttons at random on the tablet, hoping I get lucky. I'm sure there is a very simple solution, but I'm panicking. Oh, my God. Are you okay? Tom asks. I think I nod, but it isn't exactly believable because I cower against the wall, retreating into myself. One, two, three. Chapter 28. Heath. When Adam and I get over to the Hall of Fame, it's chaos. There's a crowd hanging out in the back of the main area, and a couple of security guards stand outside of the hype room. What the hell? Adam asks. My pulse accelerates and adrenaline swells as we head toward the commotion. What's going on? I ask one of the football guys hanging out watching the security guards talk into their walkie-talkies. Two people got trapped in the hype room. At that moment, the doors open and a frazzled Ginny pushes out. Her breathing is so labored I can see the rise and fall of her chest, eyes wild, clutching the tablet to her stomach. Adam and I move to her, and when she sees us, her pace quickens. Oh, fuck. I hear Adam mutter quietly under his breath. He's a step ahead of me, and I'm so thankful he's here because she looks like she needs him. She's on the brink of a complete meltdown. But when we finally get to her, it isn't him she throws her arms around. It's me. Her body is limp as she sucks in air with ragged breaths. My throat is tight, and my chest cracks open, letting her slip inside. I feel her fear with the force of a Mack truck slamming into me and then dragging me a mile down the road. I can't find the oxygen to speak, so I wrap my arms around her and pull her head under my chin. I glance at Adam. 
feeling his presence like a dark cloud hovering over us. His glare goes from confused to pissed, but this isn't the time or place to have this conversation. Adam senses the same thing, and I shield her while he gets us some privacy, calling for everyone to get lost with only slightly more polite words. Ginny. When his attention is back on us, his voice is softer than I expected for the rage rolling off him. Gee, are you okay? She pulls herself away from me, not meeting my gaze, and hugs him instead. He looks relieved as she glues herself to his side. What happened? He asks gently, cupping the back of her head. She tries to speak, but her voice is shaky, and he shushes her. Later, G. Just relax. He's calm and loving with her, and I feel a sense of relief that he's here with all the right words, even if it means he's going to kick my ass later. Adam's jaw flexes and he nods over my head. Can you see Tom to the arena? Ginny's face is buried in his side, giving me her profile. She's not crying, but her eyes are closed and her dark lashes fan out against her smooth skin. Heath, Adam says again, voice as sharp as razors. I take a step back. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Adam doesn't show up to the arena while I'm showing Tom the locker rooms and team training facilities. The guys who are free this afternoon are hanging around, including Maverick and Rothruss. They both question me on Adam's whereabouts. I shrug it off and focus on getting through the quick tour. When Coach shows up, I hand off Tom and decide to do a quick skate to clear my head. I assume Adam is going to show up and slam me into the boards at any moment, but he doesn't. I trudge home with dread and guilt weighing down each step. No matter how many times I tell myself it's none of his business, I can't find any solace in it. Adam's sitting on the couch with his phone to his ear when I walk into the apartment. I hesitate, but ultimately decide a shower is what I need before he goes nuclear on me. When I'm clean and dressed, he's still sitting in the same spot. Sands the phone to his ear. He doesn't even look at me as I join him in the living room. I'm already sweating again with uncertainty on how to navigate this. Quick and honest. Rip off the band-aid. It's not what you think. A growl escapes from his chest and his eyes turn to angry slits. Fuck. Okay, that wasn't the best opening, I admit. Okay, it's what you think. I backtrack. Of all the girls, man... You can have any other one but not her, not my baby sister. I'm sorry if it pisses you off. Maybe I should have told you. Not because I think I need your permission, but out of respect. I'm sorry for that, but I'm not sorry for digging your sister. She's awesome and I like her a lot. I don't need your permission, I repeat. And Ginny doesn't need it either. For any guy she decides to date. Ginny said as much. He stands. He's a good three inches taller than me and he uses every single one. You can honestly tell me you think you're good enough for her? Fuck, man, I see how you are with women. I don't want that for her. Is that so hard to understand? He doesn't wait for my answer before heading to his room and slamming the door. He and Taryn are sitting guard in the living room. I tell Ginny on the phone later. The two of them never hang out at our apartment. That's part of the Adam Scott boyfriend experience, bending over backward for his girl and always staying at their place. Or, that's what I hear. Since this is my first year living with him, I don't really know. But Rothross made an offhanded comment once that Adam hardly ever has girlfriends sleep over. So I'll just come over. What's he going to do, kick me out? No, but he might kick me out. She groans. This is stupid. I can date whoever I want. He's just looking out for you. I don't need him to look out for me. She sighs into the phone. I guess it's best to give him a couple of days to cool off. My chest tightens, and I wonder if, in a couple of days, she'll decide it isn't worth making waves. Maybe that'd be for the best. The next morning, though, she's waiting outside of the dining hall for me, and a goofy grin pulls at my lips. I hug her, and she laughs. Miss me? Yep. I take her hand and follow her through the line for omelets. I need my hand back she says, and I realize I'm still holding her palm in mine. We take our usual table. Mav drops into a chair beside her a few minutes later. Hey there, Romeo and Juliet. Ginny laughs. Their families were enemies. This isn't really that sort of thing. 
Well, it is a Shakespearean tragedy anyway. What are you going to do? I shrug. Thought about it all night long, and I still don't have an answer. I'm heading home tonight. I'm sure by the time I get back on Sunday, he'll be over it. I'm not so sure. After my morning classes, I head back to the apartment. Jenny's on her way home for the long weekend, and the prospect of spending that many days without her is a real bummer. Ralph Russ is on the phone with Carrie. Mav and Adam are still on campus. I've got my newest package from Chloe and Nathan, so I grab it and walk to my room. I call him as I cut open the tape. Hey, he answers on the second ring. Hey, got your latest box. And? As soon as I pull back the flaps, a deep chuckle escapes from my throat. This one is all you, bro. What? How can you tell? It looks like you went down the aisles at Target and just threw random things in. I pull out deodorant, body soap, condoms, major eye roll, toothpaste, pencils, a giant tub of my favorite protein, and an Xbox gift card. Plus, it's all just shoved in here. Chloe's boxes are packed a lot nicer than yours. I knew I should have had her wrap it all up. I chuckle again. Thank you. I appreciate it. Sitting in my desk chair, I lean back as he catches me up on the latest wedding details. Getting married takes an awful lot of planning, apparently. So, spill, he says eventually when he's done with the rundown on dinner entrees and cake tasting. What'd you think of Kevin? He was fine, I shrug, even though Nathan can't see it. Mom's happy, so that's good, right? Yeah, I guess so. It's weird seeing her with someone else, though, no matter how nice he is. I hum my agreement. Are you still calling her and checking in to see how she's doing? Nah, I mean, we chat every other week or so, but she doesn't need me to do that anymore. She's got Kevin, plus Uncle Doug is still checking on her. Yeah, I guess. Chloe and I are going to fly up to have Thanksgiving with her. Bummed you can't make it. I'm sure you guys will make the most of it. We've got a game on Saturday, so it'll just be another Thursday around here, although the extra days off school are nice. I could never make her smile like you could. Remember that time we went to the water park in Wisconsin? I smile, knowing exactly where he's going with the story. She got up on the top of that big slide and she wouldn't budge. The line was backed up and people were yelling for her to hurry up. There were six-year-old kids going down that thing. She hates heights, I say. Yeah, I'm not even sure why she attempted it in the first place. Because I was too scared to go on my own and you were whining about me tagging along with you and that guy you used to hang out with? Lee, he fills in. I nod. She came up there for me. I knew she was scared too, but I didn't care. Dude, you were like nine. I still knew it was a bad idea. You sang to her at the top of your lungs the whole way back down the line. I had to scream so she could hear me over all the people yelling at us. He laughs. I'm smiling now, but I was so embarrassed at the time and Nathan made fun of me for weeks. You were always good at calming her down, being her rock. You still are. She might be doing better, but there's no one that can make her as happy as you. Call her. When I get off the phone with Nathan... I send her a text, checking in, and promise myself I'll call her tomorrow. With my gift card in hand, I walk out into the living room. Everyone's back from campus, and Adam has parked himself back in his guard dog position between the door and my room. I toss the gift card on the coffee table. I was going to order pizza and get the new Call of Duty. You guys in? Oh, no way! Ralph Russ picks up the card. Rad, man! I'm in! We both look to Adam, and he shrugs his big shoulders. I guess that's a start. Chapter 29 Jenny Hottest guy on campus. Hey, gorgeous. Why aren't you in my bed? Me. Better offer. Hottest guy on campus. Damn, woman, that's cold. Me. I figured you would understand better than anyone... My mom's been cooking for days. So much food. Hottest guy on campus. My stomach just growled, for real. Also, my dick's hard just from texting you. Me. Proof for it didn't happen. Hottest guy on campus. D 
Dick pics, always a bad idea, Genevieve. Me, like vag pics, shudders. Hottest guy on campus. Not the same at all. Speaking of, feel free to send some my way. Me, tit for tat. Hottest guy on campus. Tit's okay too, I guess. Make sure you get front and side view. I very much enjoy a little side booby. Me, how's Valley? I don't want to ask specifically about how things are with Adam, but he must read between the lines. Hottest guy on campus. Okay, we stayed in tonight and played video games. Adam hasn't punched me yet. Me. I heard my mom say you guys are having a team dinner to celebrate Thanksgiving. That's nice. Hottest guy on campus. Beats the dorm food. Don't tell Brenda. Me. Brenda? Hottest guy on campus. My favorite lunch lady. Me. Of course you have a favorite lunch lady. Hottest guy on campus. Eyes keep closing. Gonna sleep. Don't forget boob emojis. The following night, I'm lying on the couch watching TV when there's noise outside. A car door followed by deep voices. I get up and peer out the window. Adam's Jeep is in the driveway, and I see his big frame climbing out of the driver's side. Heath, Rothrus, and Mav follow. I run to the door and fling it open as they approach. What are you doing here? I hug Adam first. As excited as I am about the man behind him, it's been three years since Adam and I have celebrated a Thanksgiving together. He always stayed at Valley because of his hockey schedule. Decided to come up for the night. Enjoy mom's sour cream apple pie. We have to go back tomorrow night to have dinner with the team. Figures you found a way to have two Thanksgiving dinners. Adam heads inside, so do Mav and Rhett. Heath lingers with a sexy smirk. Hey, Genevieve. I throw myself at him. Couch, pain. Adam's voice comes from behind me. Mav and Rhett, you guys take the guest room. Adam gets Heath a pillow and blanket, and I stay downstairs as Heath spreads out on the couch bed. Why didn't you tell me you were coming? I wanted to surprise you. Also, I didn't know until about three hours ago. Your brother said he was heading up and asked if we wanted to come with him. He shrugs. I was half expecting him to stop on the freeway somewhere and kick me out of the car. So you're here because of my brother. I sneak a hand inside his shirt and up his chest. Yep, he really does it for me. He winces. Shit, I can't even joke about it while I'm hard. Come up to my room. I start to stand, but he doesn't budge. I don't think I should. Because of Adam? He's had more girls in his room than Sephora on sale day. I don't know what that means, but I'm guessing it's a lot. Yes. I pull him again, but he shakes his head. It's not just Adam. I'm a guest, and I don't want your parents to think I came up to get in their daughter's pants. Oh my god, when did you turn into this good guy? Don't worry, baby. I'm still bad. He pulls me down on top of him and quickly has me pinned underneath him on the couch bed. He doesn't kiss me, though. Just stares down at me. I'm so excited you're here. He grins. Me too. I wake up to the smell of pumpkin and turkey and am instantly giddy. A real Thanksgiving with the whole family. And Heath. Adam and the guys are already up, their doors open and rooms empty as I pass by on my way downstairs. I slow as I get to the last step. Heath's pulling a gray t-shirt over his head and holding his phone up to his ear. When he spots me, he smiles and my insides turn to mush. All right, I should go. The guys are waiting on me. He continues staring at me as he says goodbye to whoever he's talking to. I meet him halfway as he pockets his phone. Was that your mom? Yeah. She must miss having you home for the holidays. My mom's ecstatic Adam's here. She's been in the kitchen all morning making extra pies. Hope she doesn't mind we came along. Are you kidding? She's thrilled. My mother's happiest when she has lots of people to dote on. He wraps his arms around my lower back. What are you up to this morning? Can you save me from some lame football game outside? I gasp. Lame? It's an honored tradition. I take his hand and pull him to the door. You can be on my team. I've never lost.
The neighborhood football game on Thanksgiving morning is a tradition as far back as I can remember. When I was little, I'd sit along the sidelines and cheer on my dad and Adam and whatever boy I had a crush on at the time. But sometime in middle school, I decided to join the other brave girls out there. I love it. Morning, sunshine. Mav jogs up to us. Morning, Heath says, voice cracking. He clears it a few times. His gruff morning voice is my favorite. Glad you got your sexy ass up. We need a QB. Heath shakes his head. I never played football. Mav punches him. I know, but you've got those QB good looks like Tom Brady. Did they already pick teams? I ask. Nah, Mav says. They're fighting over Adam. You four are the most athletically inclined people we've had in a while. I scan the yard to see who made it to play this year, and my gaze snags on someone I didn't expect. Brian's here? The question is more to myself than the guys, but Heath asks, Who's Brian? My ex. Brian and I make eye contact, and he starts toward me. Seeing him for the first time in three months has my emotions whipping around like I'm on a merry-go-round. Hey, Jenny. Brian envelops me in a hug, pressing his large body against mine and squeezing tightly. Apparently, he feels none of the awkwardness I do. I can't decide if that's comforting or not. It's so good to see you. I didn't expect you to be home for break. Just for the day. I fly back tonight. Oh. I shift uncomfortably and wring my hands to have something to do. How's Idaho? Eh, you know. Actually, I don't. Well, it's not Arizona. How's Valley? I sneak a glance at Heath out of my periphery. He's got his arms crossed and a hard expression on his face. It's great. I really love it. Yeah? I nod. That's awesome. He does a blatant once-over of my body. You look amazing. Thanks. I smile politely. He looks good, too, but not in that way where I want to rip off his clothes. And the guy who I do want to do that to is standing beside me. I turn to him. Brian, this is my friend Heath. Hey, man. Brian juts his chin in acknowledgement. You play hockey with Adam, right? That's right. The guys were talking about you earlier. Sounds like you're going to be the opposing QB. I'll try not to make you look too bad. He takes a step back and winks. Good to see you, babe. I'll call you. Maybe we can hang out while we're both in town for winter break. I wait until he's gone to face Heath, prepared to stroke his ego, but he's... smiling? Your friend, huh? Did you want me to introduce you as my makeout buddy? He chuckles and winces at the same time. Guess not. You dated that douche? He's... not so bad. I play down any lingering resentment because the last thing I need is Heath or my brother to make a scene. And honestly, it's not so much resentment as just dislike for the guy. Sure, he had his own reasoning for how things ended, but let's be real. He did it in a super shitty way. I can see that so much clearer now. He's a douche. Is this jealous, Heath? I wave a hand in front of his broody frame. He glares toward Brian's retreating back. What? No, of course not. But he continues to stand close while we set up the game. We've got enough people to play with two full teams and a couple alternates. Rothrus and Heath end up on my team, and Adam and Mav on the other with Brian. We're just waiting on my dad, Adam says and glances toward the house. Jenny, did you see him when you came out? No, I haven't seen him this morning. Adam's brows scrunch together. That's weird. He probably had to run to town for something Mom forgot. Let's just start. I'm sure he'll show up. Adam doesn't budge. I will go check on him. I nudge Heath playfully. Don't screw up my winning streak, Payne. I hurry back up to the house and to the kitchen where I can hear Mom and her sister Zoe talking and cooking. Mom's wearing a half apron chopping onions while Zoe sits on a stool peeling potatoes. Hey! They both look up as I enter. Morning. Game over already? Mom asks. No, we haven't started yet. We're waiting on Dad. Do you know where he is? Mom and Zoe exchange a look. What? I ask when neither of them immediately answers. Mom shakes her head. I don't know where he went, but it's not like him to miss the big game. 
Start without him and I'll text him and let him know the team's missing him. I grin. Okay, thanks, Mom. Are you staying for dinner, Aunt Zoe? No, your Uncle Wyatt and I are heading to his mom's. I'll stop by Sunday before you head back to school. As I go out, Dad's pulling into the driveway. I run to him, pleased to see he's dressed to play in an old t-shirt and shorts. You're late. How's the team looking, kid? He gives me a one-arm hug as we walk toward the game. We've got a few ringers, thanks to Adam and his friends. At the next break in play, Adam finds us on the sidelines, and he and my dad hug. Adam's taller and broader than him now, which is just another way things have changed over the last three years. Good to see you, son. You ready to get your ass kicked, old man? Adam and my dad smack talk like they're both 12, but it's so good to see them together. Our whole family home at the same time. You're on Jenny's team, Adam tells him. Our team huddles up and dad and I substitute in. As we play, I have this sublime feeling of total completeness. Like I've never been this happy. Maybe it's just nostalgia and the sense that this is a rare moment. Adam will graduate, become a doctor with insane hours, and get married or move far away, and who knows when we'll all be here again. Maybe another three years, maybe longer. Heath isn't as good of a QB as Brian, as painful as that is to admit, and Adam is way better than I remember. While we grab water, Heath gives me a rueful smile. You might want to think about a trade if you want to keep that winning streak. I would never leave my team in the final quarter, I say, faking shock, then wrapping my arms around his sweaty neck. He grins, and I kiss him in front of everyone. I definitely got the better QB, and I'm not shy about letting the other team know it. Chapter 30 Heath Ginny's ex is a piece of shit. Hello, Jealousy. Nice to meet you. But come on, this guy? I don't miss the way he tries to flirt with her or the little inside jokes he tosses out. I want to throw the football in a perfect spiral directly into his face. Or maybe his balls. I remind myself that Ginny referred to sex with this guy as blah. My jealousy? Petty as hell. Adam makes the game-winning touchdown and his team celebrates as I approach Ginny with a rueful smile. Sorry, baby doll. My girl has a competitive streak I find as amusing as I do sexy. Her mouth pulls down in a disappointed pout. It's fine. I was due for a loss. Besides, I was distracted more than normal. I worry for a second that she means because of Brian, but then her lips twist up and she fists my shirt to pull me closer. You threw me off my game, Payne. Usually you're covered in layers of padding and I can't really see you when you're on the ice, but out here I could see every drip of sweat. That padding keeps me alive. She brings her lips to mine and hums against my mouth. Necessary evil. QB looks, but missing that QB arm. Maverick places both hands on his hips when he stops beside us. Yeah, well, I'd like to see you get a pass through Adam and Rothrus, I grumble. Ginny drops another quick kiss and then steps back. I better go check on my mom in the kitchen. After everyone else leaves, the guys and I sit in the yard drinking beer. Adam and his dad are tossing the ball back and forth. They have this easy way about them. Like I can tell Adam respects him, but his dad has stopped being the hard-ass parent now that his son is older, and they just seem to enjoy being around one another. I never got that. Never even knew it was a thing until now. I had lots of good times with my dad, but I was still a kid. We didn't talk girls or life, none of that. Losing a parent is one of those things that as soon as you think you're over it, something stops you in your tracks and the wound is as fresh as if it just happened. I have a feeling it'll be like that the rest of my life. But as sad as it makes me for what I missed out on, I enjoy being around Ginny's family. It's the first holiday I've had in years where my worries are only the limitations of my stomach and how much food I can stuff in it. We're eating in 30 minutes, Ginny says as she rejoins us outside. She's freshly showered and dressed in jeans and a ruffly shirt with a deep v-neck that's going to make it impossible to keep my eyes off her boobs while I feign the role of respectable friend. She hasn't held back with the PDA since I showed up last night, but I still want to respect that Adam's not exactly on board. 
She takes a seat on my lap, and I glance around to see if anyone shoots daggers at me, but Mr. Scott and Adam barely seem to notice. I should shower. I'm dirty and sweaty, and probably not presentable for a Thanksgiving table. Yeah, we all should get cleaned up, Mr. Scott says as he tosses the ball to Adam one last time and heads for the house. Adam, do you have some clothes I could borrow? Mav asks. I was so excited when I packed, all I managed to grab were socks and boxers. Adam chuckles, but nods. I'll see what my dad has. They all head in, but Ginny doesn't budge to let me up. I can think of a few things to do while you wait for the shower. Oh, yeah? I put my finger in the V of her shirt and pull the fabric away from her chest so I can look down it. Mm-hmm. She presses her lips to mine and then pulls back so we're nose to nose. I, uh, decided something last night. What's that? I ask and kiss her again. I don't want to wait anymore. Wait for what? Sex, dummy. I'm ready. A few months ago, I would have thought going without sex this long would have been a real sacrifice. But Ginny's sexual appetite is ravenous. Just without the actual sex. When we first started hooking up, I couldn't wait to get inside her. But Ginny's creative, and I can't pretend to have been anything but satisfied with our hookups. However, now that she's giving me the green light, I am ready to skip dinner and just have her instead. All the blood is rushing to my cock with all the new things this opens up for us. I can't freaking wait. I kiss her hard, giving her a taste of how excited I am about her news. Pain, Adam bellows from the house. Quit sucking face with my sister and get in here. I smile into her mouth as our kiss stops. We walk up to the house and Ginny goes to the kitchen to help her mom. I grab my overnight bag and Adam and I head upstairs. You can take a shower in my room. Should have everything you need in there. He stops outside his room and motions for me to go ahead. Thanks, man. No problem. Lock the door on both sides. What? I ask, confused. You'll see. I walk in and set my bag on the floor and then wander to the bathroom. There's another bedroom on the other side, and I grin as I get my first peek at Ginny's childhood. I go all the way in and turn a circle. The walls are painted teal and the bed has a white comforter with a thousand throw pillows piled on top. Framed photos line the top of a desk. Even without walking closer, I can tell Brian is featured in a lot of them. Her ex-boyfriend might be better at football but Ginny barely even looked at him the entire game. I know it sounds conceited to say she's totally into me, but I know she is. I'm totally into her, too. Still, I turn the largest frame around so I don't have to stare at their happy faces. As I'm coming back to the bathroom, Adam walks in his room with brows furrowed. Do you have any extra clothes Mav could wear? Nah, man. I just brought the one change of clothes. He goes to his dresser and rummages through the few items inside. My dad doesn't have a single item of clothing in their closet. I shrug, and so does he as he says, Guess Mav will have to wear some vintage duds of mine. By the time I shower and head back down, the Scots dining room table is filled with food and the guys are already sitting around, practically salivating. There's an empty chair between Ginny and Mav, and I take it. Mrs. Scott sets a final dish on the table and smiles. I think that's everything. Dig in, everyone. For five minutes, no one speaks except to compliment the food between bites. Even my sweet little Ginny, who barely fills a plate most days, eats her weight in mashed potatoes and turkey. I feel like I can't eat another bite, but then Mrs. Scott brings pies to the table and I can't help myself. I think I'm gonna be sick, Mav says after his second piece, leaning back and rubbing his stomach. What are you wearing, Mav? Ginny asks. Is that Adam's high school homecoming shirt? He looks down and shrugs. Adam speaks from across the table. Yeah, Dad, I went in your and Mom's closet to loan Mav a shirt, but I couldn't find anything. Did she finally take over the entire closet and ban your clothes to the basement? Adam laughs at the idea, but then an uncomfortable silence follows as Mr. and Mrs. Scott share a nervous glance. My skin prickles with awareness even before I've put it together. I'm good at reading bad news. Ginny's confused expression is heartbreaking, and I rest a hand on her leg under the table. Mrs. Scott frowns and then says, 
We wanted to wait until after the weekend to tell you. To tell us what? Adam asks, his tone hardened in anticipation. Uncomfortable silence falls over the room. Your mother and I have separated, Mr. Scott answers finally. Mav goes into a coughing fit, unable to hide his surprise, and I elbow him hard in the ribs. He grunts loudly, but no one is paying him any attention anyway. Separated? Adam questions. You're getting divorced? Mrs. Scott looks around the table. Maybe we should talk about it later. Mom? Ginny's voice wavers, and my chest... My chest fucking aches. Mrs. Scott's mouth pulls up into a smile, but it's sad as hell. We love you both very much. That hasn't changed, and it won't. We're still a family. Ralph Russ clears his throat. Maybe the guys and I should give you some time to talk? He glances to me and Mav, and we start to stand, only to have Adam beat us to it. No, you guys stay. I need some air. Ginny pushes back her chair so quickly it scrapes against the wood floor. Me too. She disappears after him. Holy uncomfortable Batman, Mav whispers. I'm going to talk to them, Mr. Scott says and looks to his wife, maybe for approval. She nods and he follows them out. It isn't until Mrs. Scott stands and excuses herself that the guys and I take a breath. Fuck, man, that was rough, Rothrus grimaces. What do we do? No clue, I tell him honestly. Chapter 31 Jenny. Adam and I sit in the garage after Dad leaves to go back to his place. He has his own apartment. How weird is that? I ask, mostly to myself. You really had no idea? Adam looks to me again like I should have known and warned him. Maybe I should have, but I didn't. I shake my head. I didn't know. Dad was in Scottsdale for work when I got here earlier this week. I think back, not only to the days since I got home for Thanksgiving break, but over the last few months. They were going on trips, and it hits me then that those trips were probably a last-ditch effort to save their marriage, and I feel like throwing up. At some point, my brother grabbed a bottle of wine from the kitchen, and we are well on our way to finishing it off. Adam's drunk the lion's share. He seems to be taking this harder than me. I feel numb, but he... Well, I haven't seen my brother so devastated since the day I got locked inside the pantry. He'd been nine then and took on the big brother protector role with a dedication second to none. Since then, I'd thought of him as unbreakable. He can't protect me from this, though, and I can't protect him. Everything is going to be different whether we like it or not. Rothrus walks outside with his hands in his pockets about the time Adam is tossing the empty wine bottle in the trash. Are you guys okay? Getting there. Adam holds up his wine glass and takes a healthy drink. We thought you might want to stay another night, head back in the morning. Adam nods and his expression softens. Yeah, thanks, I appreciate it. Sorry for the family drama. Mav and Heath walk out. Heath's blue eyes fixate on me. You guys want to go out? Adam asks. I need to get away from here for a bit. They all agree, and I stare down into my wine. You coming, little Scott? Mav asks. I think I'm going to stay. Heath hangs back as the rest of the guys head for Adam's Jeep. Rothrus climbs into the driver's side, thankfully. I know he'll make sure they're safe. Do you want me to stay? Heath offers. No, I think Adam needs you more than me right now. I'm going to check on my mom. He squeezes my hand and drops a kiss to my forehead. Sorry, baby doll. Text me if you need me and I'll come back. I offer the biggest smile of appreciation I can, which probably isn't that big. He jogs off, hops into the Jeep, and I watch them pull away. I find mom in the kitchen wiping down the counters. She stops when she sees me and offers a sad smile. Are you okay? I slide onto the stool in front of her. Funny, I was going to ask you the same thing. She lets out a sigh and nods. Yeah, it's the best thing for your dad and I, but I know that's not easy for you and Adam to understand. What happened? 
Is that weird to ask? Her smile is soft and warm, and she holds her arms out. I hop off the stool and go to her, stepping in and letting her wrap me into a reassuring embrace. It wasn't one big thing, honey. We grew apart and started seeing our futures differently. I tilt my head up to look her in the eye, and she runs a hand along the back of my head like she did when I was a little girl. I love you. Your father loves you. We're still a family, even if it looks a little different now. It'll be weird to go back to Valley and not think of you and Dad together here. I so get that. It's taken some getting used to being here by myself. I glance around the kitchen, wondering if she'll even stay here in this big house without him. I'm not brave enough to ask. I can't take another blow today. I promise that we'll both still be there for you and that we won't be those awful parents who can't be in the same room together. My heart hurts imagining any scenario that looks different than what I'm used to. Everything's changing. Adam's wrecked. Your brother is a romantic. I huff a small laugh. <laughs> Adam? It's true, he is. From the time he was old enough to talk, he'd tell everyone he wanted to be a husband when he grew up, just like his daddy. I don't remember that. Middle school happened, and that's when he decided he wanted to be a doctor, but he hasn't changed. But he goes through girlfriends faster than anyone I know. He's a romantic, but he's still a young man. She smiles, and I notice how tired she looks and wonder how I didn't see it before. I should talk to him. They went to the bar. Even Heath? Yeah, he offered to stay, but I figured Adam needed him more than me. She touches my face. You're a good sister. I'll talk to him before he leaves, but he'll be okay. We all will. I hope so. I was going to have some pie in bed and watch It's a Wonderful Life. Want to join me? Is there any pumpkin left? You didn't really think I put all the pies out on the table earlier. She smiles and shakes her head as she goes to the oven and pulls out a pumpkin pie. I barely ate earlier, and my stomach growls at the delicious smell of pumpkin and nutmeg. In that case, I want two slices. Mom and I eat pie curled up on her king-size bed. As I lay there, I can still smell my dad in their room and wonder if she can too. I'm sad, but I know my parents didn't come to this decision lightly, so I do my best to not let it show too much. Mom falls asleep right after the movie, and I head to my own room. The guys aren't back, and the last text Heath sent said he thought they were in for a late night. Adam's always been my protector. I never thought I'd need to repay the favor, but it seems like now might be the time. I can be the strong one this time. I doze off sometime after one and wake up to the bed dipping with Heath's weight. His familiar scent mixed with alcohol wraps around me. You're back, I say, voice thick with sleep. How's Adam? Took all three of us to get him upstairs. Rothrus is sleeping on the floor in there to keep an eye on him. I'm really glad you were here. Me too. He pulls me tight against him and rubs my back in long, soft strokes. How are you doing? I hated not being here for you tonight. Well, I've had better Thanksgivings, but I ate my weight in pie, so I'm okay for the moment. It doesn't feel real yet. Twenty-three years. Can you imagine? He shakes his head almost imperceptibly. The TV is still on, and his face illuminates with flashing colors. His warmth heats the space between us. You can turn off the TV if it bugs you, I tell him. It doesn't bother me, and I know you prefer it. Being scared of the dark is embarrassing. Maybe even more embarrassing than my parents announcing they're separating over Thanksgiving dinner. But I've gotten used to sleeping without the TV since going to Valley. I realize it probably doesn't help, but you don't need to feel embarrassed in front of me. Not for any of it. It does help, actually. Thank you. What also might help is knowing your deepest, darkest secrets and fears. He chuckles. I'm scared of all kinds of things. Like? Worms. What? I laugh. Why worms? He shudders. We used them for bait when fishing. 
I never liked touching them, and once Nathan noticed, he started chasing me around and dangling the little slimy fuckers in front of my face. He shudders again. Worms are gross, but not scary. Fears don't have to be rational. That's true. Why are you scared of the dark? Did something happen, or have you always been? When I was five or six, me and Adam were playing at my grandparents' house. It was this old house with creaky wooden floors and doors that somehow no longer fit the frame, so you had to put all your weight into them to close. They had this great backyard with a treehouse and a trampoline. Before my grandmother passed away, the whole family on my dad's side would get together. The adults would sit outside in lawn chairs, and the kids could run wild. Sounds like something out of a 50s TV show. Well, it wasn't quite that idyllic. Uncle Walter showed up stoned more often than not, and my cousin Tilly was always teaching us urban dictionary slang. My mom almost had a stroke with some of the words I learned. Anyway, one day the whole family was over there. I think it was one of my cousin's birthdays. Everyone was outside, and the cousins decided we would play hide-and-seek. I'm the baby of the family, and I really wanted to prove that I was a good hider, so I'd been scoping out places for weeks and finally found the best hiding spot. In the pantry, there was this extra closet where Grandma kept brooms and mops. It was really small, and I knew I was the only one who could fit in it and that no one else would think to look there. So when everyone took off to hide... I hung back, so not to give away my spot, and then went and shut myself in. Heath strokes my arm as my voice wavers. Part of the memory is so real, I can almost smell the dust and pledge mixture of that tiny closet. Other things I only remember, like I watched someone else go through it. Like the way I wrapped my arms around myself, squeezing tight and sobbing through the screams. I don't know how long I was in there. For a while, I was so careful to be quiet. I didn't want to give myself away. I could hear Adam calling my name, and I just felt so proud, you know? He's always been a total know-it-all, cocky and just better at everything, so I was really excited to have beaten him at something. Anyway, eventually my cousins grew bored of the game, and when I was certain I'd waited long enough that they were never going to find me, I pushed the door open, ready to show off my awesome hiding skills. Only I couldn't get out. The outside of the door had one of those hook latches, and it had fallen in place when I shut the door. I screamed and screamed until I lost my voice. It was so dark and so small. Fuck, Jenny. I nod. By everyone's best guess, I was in there for two hours before my mom noticed she hadn't seen me in a while and went looking for me. They called an ambulance because I couldn't get my breathing under control. Adam freaked. He knew I was missing, but didn't think it was a big deal, so it really hit him harder than anyone. He didn't leave my side for weeks. Heath's hold tightens around me, and I snuggle into him. I know I probably should have gotten over it by now. I don't think fears work like that. I think they hang on until you face them in one way or another, poking holes in the pain and letting good shine through. He pulls the sheet up over our heads and smiles at me in the near darkness. Let's make some good memories in the dark. The thin sheet doesn't really block out the light of the TV, but it's a step, and I take it. Chapter 32 Heath I disappear from under the covers long enough to grab a condom and then hurry back underneath where a very eager Ginny is wiggling out of her clothes. I had big plans for undressing her with my teeth, but I'm too busy appreciating the view to complain. You're so beautiful. Her smile, even in the near dark, is bright and genuine. She eyes the condom in my hand. I'm on birth control. We can... She hesitates. I mean, if you're comfortable going without... So am I. My already throbbing cock is now harder than it's ever been. I pull my shirt over my head and Ginny works on unbuttoning my jeans. Together we push them and my boxers down and before I can kick them off, Ginny's mouth is covering the head of my dick. Oh, Jesus, slow down, babe. I'm never gonna last like that. I tell her, guiding her head up and down my length. Her warm mouth is heaven. She comes off with a pop and I groan at the loss. 
I pull her up and swipe a hand over her lips. She looks a little uncertain, and I tuck a strand of hair behind her ear. You sure you want to do this? I do, but I'm a little nervous. I might suck at it. Well, in that case, you can just keep sucking me with your hot-as-fuck mouth. I wink so she knows I'm joking and shift so I'm on top of her, holding most of my weight off her slender frame. Babe, don't take this any other way than I mean it, a compliment, but there's no way you're bad at sex. You're the sexiest, most enthusiastic partner I've ever had. That earns me a grin, and I take her mouth in a bruising kiss. And just like that, the wild Ginny I've come to know is back. The blanket falls, but she doesn't seem to notice or care. She pulls at my hair and rakes her nails down my shoulders. I swear I could make this girl orgasm from kissing alone, if I could ever bring myself to only kiss her. There's no single part of her that I like better than the rest. I like it all, and I show her so with a dedication to touching and kissing every inch. She squirms underneath me as I move down her body, tracing a single finger along the middle of her stomach, past her belly button, and down to her slick pussy. She raises her hips to give me better access, and I dip my head. Her hands find my hair and her fingers slide along my scalp and tug the strands as I taste her. She writhes and moans, and it's so fucking hot my dick leaks with desperation. I wait until she's so close she's panting my name before I finally line up at her entrance. I inch in slowly, her tight pussy squeezing me. I'm worried about hurting her and making it good for her for all of two seconds before pleasure wraps around my spine and zaps my brain. I'm okay, she says when I don't immediately move. That makes one of us. She laughs and the slight movement of her body nearly sends me over the edge and I have to close my eyes and grind down on my back molars for a second to regain my composure. I move at a pace meant to keep me from coming, but that somehow tips Ginny over the edge. She looks up at me wide-eyed and gorgeous as she rides out her first orgasm. Damn, she's beautiful. I pull out and place a kiss to her lips and then turn her onto her stomach and lift her hips. I bite one ass cheek and then kiss it before nudging the head of my cock inside her pussy. She pushes back into me. Hold on, baby. This won't be as gentle. She flashes me a grin over her shoulder. With one hand on her hip and the other at the base of her neck, I bury myself inside of her sweet heat. We both shudder. My balls are heavy and I resist the urge to pound into her like a jackhammer. Slowly I ease in and out, finding a nice rhythm. Harder, she whispers so quietly it takes me a second to realize what she's asking. You're sure? She nods. Fuck me hard like I know you want to. Stars dot my vision and my voice is gruff. Grab the headboard. Her fingers find it in an instant. Her eagerness and the new angle gives new meaning to torturous pleasure. Oh my god. I fuck her as hard as I've dreamed of doing, but with every thrust and every slap of skin against skin, it somehow feels more meaningful too. It's never felt this all-consuming before. I know Ginny in a way I've never known anyone else, and that makes this better in so many ways. I can read her body and the emotions on her face. She owns me as she falls apart beneath me for a second time. I fight to hold off my orgasm so that I can keep watching her, but with two more hard thrusts my eyes slam shut and I follow. I wrap an arm around her waist and fall onto the bed with her tucked into my front. We're gasping for air together. I feel like I've landed in another dimension. This girl. Fuck. This girl. I really don't want to move, but I need to clean up and I know she'll want to also. I start to pull back and she grabs onto my forearm. Don't go. Not yet. Just going to clean up. I'll be right back. I slide out of bed and pad to the bathroom to wash up, grab a wet cloth and bring it back to her. She sits up and reaches for it. I got it. She leans back on both elbows while I take care of her. She watches me with a sleepy smile. After getting rid of the rag, I climb back into bed with her. Neither of us speaks as we lie there drifting off. A peacefulness I wasn't expecting after the day's events settles in. Heath, 
she says as I'm just about asleep. Yeah. I don't think I'm bad at sex anymore. No, baby doll, I snicker. You definitely aren't. She yawns, snuggles into my side, and falls asleep in my arms. The next morning, I wake up before Ginny and head downstairs. Rothrus is already in the kitchen with a cup of coffee. He looks tired, hair sticking up everywhere. Long night? Yeah, man, real long night. How's Adam? Sleeping hard. We've got to get out of here soon, though. I nod and grab some coffee, too. His phone pings and he lets out a sigh. What a weekend. That Carrie? Yeah, she's pissed because I forgot to call her last night. Had a few things going on. No shit, he sighs. I should call her, let her yell at me and get it over with so I can start groveling. Sounds awesome. I chuckle as he heads outside. I try to conjure an image of Ginny and me like that, but can't summon it. I take my coffee upstairs, ready to wake my girl and enjoy the last moments before we head back. As I walk into Ginny's room, her voice carries through the bathroom from Adam's room. I glance in and see her legs hanging off the end of his bed and the bottoms of Adam's feet. Are you going to be okay? She asks him. Yeah, I just can't believe it. They always seem so solid. My whole life feels like a lie. That's a little dramatic. But seriously, if they can't work things out, what hope is there for anyone? Oh, come on. You and Taryn are great. Me and Heath, it can work out. You and Heath. A deep, sarcastic laugh follows. Look, I know you're all anti-love right now, but don't rain on my parade. Heath is great. Sure, of course he is, Ginny. My issue with you two was never about him being a bad guy. He's not. Heath's fun and always up for a good time, but I've seen him go through a lot of women. Some he hooked up with more than once, most he didn't, but ultimately he moved on from all of them as easy as changing his underwear. I just don't want to see you get hurt again. He's not wrong, but he's missing the thing that makes it different now. Ginny. Relax, we're good. Heath and I are... I'm holding my breath, waiting for her to finish that sentence, but Adam lets out a long groan, interrupting her. Oh, Jesus, you're in love with him. Stop it, she says playfully. It sounds like she tosses a pillow at him as her light laughter trickles from the next room. But since you're being nosy, yes, I am. I love him, and I truly think what we have is special. My hand tips forward and coffee spills on my bare toes. Fuck. I place the mug on Ginny's dresser, clean up the mess, and get dressed quickly. I manage to grab my stuff and head downstairs, heart in my throat, before either Ginny or Adam notices me. Chapter 33 Ginny I walk out with the guys as they load up in Adam's Jeep. My brother looks as hungover as he smells. He slides into the passenger seat, Rhett gets behind the wheel, and Maverick hops into the back. I follow Heath to the other side. Let me know how he is. I ask, motioning with my head to Adam. We'll keep an eye on him, he promises. We've got practice this afternoon. Hopefully that'll help. If he doesn't throw up all over the ice, he makes a disgusted face and shifts from one foot to the other. I lean into him and close my eyes, and his arms wrap around me. Despite all the awful things that happened this weekend, I enjoyed being with Heath. The jeep starts up, and I know the guys need to get going. Later. He kisses my forehead, and I step away. The rest of the weekend is uneventful, a welcome change. Mom and I watch movies, I see a few of my friends from high school, I text with Heath between his practices, and I even have lunch with Mom and Dad together on Sunday before I head back. After dropping my things at my dorm, I go to Reagan and Dakota's apartment. And all I did was eat turkey and watch college football, Reagan says when I've finished giving them the rundown of my crazy weekend. I saw Adam earlier, Dakota says from the kitchen, where she's putting away groceries while Reagan and I sit in the living room. He and Taryn looked like they were having a serious and depressing talk outside of the apartment. Trouble in paradise? Oh no, I should probably check on him. I hope he didn't do anything stupid. Well, it has been, what? Three or four months? He's about due for a new girlfriend. Dakota smirks. 
Maybe I'm turning into the new romantic of the family, but I really thought he and Taryn were a cute couple. Reagan nudges my foot. I want more details on you and Heath. So he met the whole family? Technically, yes, but it wasn't really like that. He was there as Adam's guest, not mine. Plus, with everything else going on, I don't think my parents even realized he snuck into my room at night. Oh, a sleepover. Fun. Dakota's eyes lit up from across the room. Did you two finally? She waggles her eyebrows. A slow blush creeps up my face and I glance from friend to friend. Aww, Reagan says and tilts her head with a dreamy look on her face. Okay, maybe she's the romantic. Dakota joins us in the living room. You're totally gone for him. There's little point in denying it. Totally. I bury my head in my hands. He's just so perfect. Dakota's eyebrows jump. Okay, fine, not perfect, but the way I feel when we're together, that's perfect. Don't worry, Adam's already given me the Heath doesn't do relationships talk. That was before you, Reagan insists. I look to Dakota. I know she won't bullshit me. She shrugs. If you'd asked me before you, I would have laughed in your face. Now I'm not sure. Only one way to find out. You think I should tell him? I squeak. Why is that so crazy? Reagan laughs. I don't want to ruin what we have. What if it's too soon? You'd be okay continuing to hook up even if you knew that's all it was to him? That he didn't feel the same way? A heavy pit settles in my stomach. No, probably not, but things are great. I don't want to ruin it. Dakota snorts. Isn't love supposed to make everything better? Yeah, yeah. I lean back and wave a hand of indifference. Well, I think you should tell him, and soon. Reagan stands. Do I look okay? I nod. Even if I couldn't see her, I'd know she does. Reagan always looks beautiful. Date? Yeah, a guy from my speech class. We're going to dinner. Her dimples pop out. You look gorgeous as usual, babe, Dakota tells her. Condoms in the purse? Phone charged in case you need to make a getaway? Reagan rolls her eyes. I'm all set. Her phone buzzes. He's here. Bye. Dakota and I watch her go, and then I let out a sigh and lay my head on her shoulder. Wanna watch a movie, or are you heading over to Heath's? She asks. No, PS team stuff this evening. They're working out or watching film or something. I'm all yours. The next day, I corner Adam outside of his last morning class. He gives me a half-hearted smile that tells me everything I need to know about how he's doing. What are you doing here? He asks as he wraps me into a one-armed hug. You didn't respond to my texts. I extend both arms around his middle and squeeze tightly. Sorry. He doesn't bother offering an excuse. It's okay. We walk down the sidewalk slowly. Have you talked to mom or dad since you got back? Not yet. Mom called while I was in class. It's a weird switch of roles for us to be worrying about him, but I want to be there for him the same way he's always been for me. I nudge him. It's going to be okay. I know it won't be the same, but they'll still be here for us. Plus, you've got me. He grins. Anyway, the real reason I came to find you was to see what you were doing tonight— we need a night out, a fun night with all our friends to let loose and forget about parent drama. I don't know, maybe. Let me see what's going on tonight. It is a Monday night after all. Monday is a perfectly good day to drink. Live a little, bro. Bro? He hitches the backpack higher on his shoulder. You sound like Heath. We get to his car and he quirks a brow as I open the passenger side door. I mean, since you're going home anyway, can you give me a ride? He shakes his head. Get in. At the apartment, I walk back toward Heath's room. He's sitting at his desk in front of his laptop. Hey, I say cheerily as I enter. One side of his mouth pulls up. Hey, did I forget we were hanging out? Nope, thought I'd surprise you. I didn't hear back from you last night after your hockey stuff. Yeah, sorry, I crashed. I go to him and he swivels to make room for me on his lap. 
Let's go out tonight. It's Monday. Why does everyone keep using that as an excuse? He chuckles softly. I take a deep breath. The girls are right. I need to make sure we're on the same page. Also, I have something I want to talk to you about later. He stiffens under me. Okay, that was probably not the smoothest. Don't worry, it's nothing too crazy. A proposition, if you will. God, now he probably thinks I want to chain him to the bed and peg him. His phone pings on his desk. Maverick's name flashes on the screen with a text. All right, sure, I'll text you later. I've got to check on Maverick. He didn't make conditioning this morning. He's got the flu or something. He hasn't been by all day. I stand to let him up. Well, then he really must be sick. He takes a step toward the door and then backtracks and brushes his lips against mine before hurrying out to go check on Maverick. Chapter 34 Heath Mav? Buddy, where are you? I call as I enter his apartment. He's got a one-bedroom, ground-level unit. On a normal day, it's already darker than ours upstairs, but today all the lights are off. The TV, too, so it's like a cave. The place is awesome. Nice leather furniture, a huge TV that takes up the better part of one wall. He's even got throw pillows. Why he always wants to hang at our place is beyond me. Charlie barks, and I follow the sound to the bedroom where my buddy is on his back with a comforter and blanket thrown off the bed and an arm over his eyes. Charlie lies at the end of the mattress near his feet. You don't look so good. I step closer and then back. Or smell so good. I think I threw up a kidney. His voice is raspy and pained. What can I do? Do you need water? Soup? I can make a call about getting you a new kidney. A knock at the door has me looking back through the living room to the front door. Are you expecting someone else? It's food. Can you grab it? I cross through the apartment and open the door, taking a deep breath of clean, uncontaminated air. After thanking the delivery guy, I take the bag of food back to the sick room. Here you go. Not for me, he heaves. Oh, just the smell makes me want to hurl again. It's for you, so you'll stay with me. You didn't need to bribe me. Look, I know I'm your favorite person, but eventually your stomach would have convinced you to leave me. I chuckle and take the bag back out to the kitchen. There is a lot of food in here. You're a hungry bitch. He's in the same position, but Charlie has moved up to his hip and Maverick strokes her with the hand closest. What do you need? I just want to lie here until the room stops moving. Tell me a story. I take a seat on the floor near the door and lean my back up against the wall. I like the dude, but he smells, and I don't want whatever he has. A story? Anything to distract me. He peeks out from under his arm and then reaches over to his nightstand and tosses me his Shakespeare textbook. Read to me. Do the funny voices. I thought you were done with Shakespeare. I am, we're on Shelley now, but that book is all the way in my backpack. I hesitate. Come on, please. I dig the rhyming shit. It's beautiful. All right, all right. I open the book and start. Maverick falls asleep about five minutes in, which is good because reading sappy words about love is the last thing I want to be doing. I go out to the living room and eat, feed Charlie, and then take her out for a quick walk. Back inside, I take my spot in his room sitting on the floor, and I must pass out because the next thing I know, Charlie is licking my face, and Maverick is standing in front of me with a grin. Feeling better? I ask, nudging Charlie away and wiping a hand across my slobbery cheek. I think so. I'm gonna try to eat. I follow him out to the kitchen and he heats up some of the Chinese he ordered. We sit on stools at the counter. The smell of food has me heating up a plate too a few minutes later. Jenny texted while I was asleep to let me know the plans for tonight, meeting up at the hideout with our friends. I'm real nervous about whatever she wants to talk to me about but I do my best to push it out of my mind for now. Mav finishes about half the food on his plate and then pats his stomach. Thanks for hanging. Yeah, of course. You're not as hot as Nanny Laura, but it did the trick. Nanny Laura? She was my favorite. Had these gigantic boobs that were like pillows. 
he nuzzles his head to the side like he's remembering it. She'd sing to me when I was sick or when I was upset, which was a lot because Dad was always flaking on shit. I think I got more hugs from her in the year or so that she was my nanny than I have from him my entire life. Parents are bullshit. I'm quiet. Don't really know what to say. For all the shitty things that happened growing up, physical contact was never in short supply. Sometimes my mom clung to me all day as if I was the only thing keeping her connected to the planet. My stomach twists and I push away my plate. Sorry, man. Didn't mean to go dark. Nah, it's fine. I don't feel so well. I stand and I break out in a cool sweat. My mouth waters. Oh, shit. Mav says right before I take off in a dead run toward the bathroom. After puking for the better part of three hours, I join Maverick in the living room. I stripped down to my boxers. Everything else is wet from sweat. God, you weren't kidding. All my organs feel like they've shifted. Is that a thing? No clue. He nods with his head toward the kitchen. Ginny brought soup and jello. Ginny was here? Your phone was going off, so I texted her. I find my phone on the counter and see that she did text several times about tonight and then to tell me to feel better and let her know if I need anything. She wanted me to tell you that she'd be by later to check in. He shakes his head. Hey, Ginny, she's a peach. She's the best. I say because even though I'm a little freaked out, I know it's true. I text her back to thank her for the food and tell her not to bother coming again until we're on the mend. The last thing she needs is to catch whatever this is. I feel like I've been run over by a bus. I take a seat in the recliner. The cool leather feels nice against my skin. I'm pretty sure I have a fever. I need a Ginny. Maverick sighs and Charlie whines. I think Charlie would take issue with getting kicked out of your bed for a chick. We spend the late afternoon and evening watching TV. Just when I think things are taking a turn for the better, one of us gets sick again. We reek. The whole apartment probably does, but I've lost the ability to smell it. Ginny continues to text, but I don't respond. Nobody needs to be around this. I miss her, though. Weird to admit to myself how much I've gotten used to having her around, that even though I'm freaked about her loving me, I still want her. I've had girls that I hung out with, not exactly friends, but ones that were part of my circle of friends, and girls I've hooked up with for a month or two, but I've never had one that ticks both those boxes. I'm delirious enough I think about calling her and telling her that, but something tells me I'd fumble up the message. Thanks for letting me do you, and also for being cool enough I want to be with you even when we're not naked. Let's keep things like they are, cool? Shakespeare, I am not. As I lie there, alternating, sweating, and then shivering, I think about her and what I'm going to say when she tells me she loves me. That's what she wants to talk to me about, right? Is she expecting me to say it back? And if I don't, what does it really change? Nothing? Everything? My mom was quick to tell me she loved me. Still is. And yeah, I believe she means it, and even meant it when she barely knew what day of the week it was. But it always felt like the words I love you came as a substitute for I'm going to do right by you. Things with Ginny are amazing, and I don't want this pure and good thing we have to become an excuse to hurt one another when we could do better. Fuck, I don't even know if I'm making sense. My head is fuzzy and my stomach aches. I wake up sometime later that night, stuck to the recliner. Mav must have thrown a blanket over me and gone to bed because he's not here and I'm tucked in like a child. The next 48 hours is much the same. I wake up Thursday morning, finally feeling like I might be able to get up, but my entire body hurts. I'm laying here, staring up at the ceiling when I notice Ginny on the couch. You're alive. Barely. She sits up. I tried to text a few times to check on you. My phone died. I wasn't in much shape to talk anyway. Do you want me to stay with you? I brought some more soup and jello. It's in the kitchen. She jabs a thumb in that direction. Do you want some? You didn't need to do that. I'm fine. I just want to lie here for a minute before I go to practice. You're going to practice? Can't you take another day off? Could, but I've played in worse shape. I'll be fine. 
We've got Vermont this weekend, and I don't want to miss it. She smiles, and it hits me in the gut. Either that, or I'm going to be sick again. Okay, well, I'm going back to my dorm before class. Call me later? She looks uncertain, and I hate that. Hate it, but can't seem to bring myself to reassure her. I also don't want to get much closer in case I'm still contagious. Yeah, of course, I'll call you later tonight. I have a feeling after practice I'm going to need a nap. Okay. She steps back and gives me one of those sweet Ginny smiles. Feel better. December. Chapter 35. Ginny. I'm sitting at the bar at the hideout waiting for my friends and brother. Reagan's the first to show. Hey, I stand to hug her. Where's Dakota? She wasn't done studying for her biology test. She said to tell you she was sorry and that she'd make it up to you. Well, boo, I was hoping she'd come. Adam's running late and the rest of the guys didn't feel like going out. It feels like everyone is bailing. Monday night was a bust after Maverick and Heath got sick, but I was hoping tonight we could all finally hang out. Actually, I'm glad I have you alone. I need to talk to you. Okay. We sit, and when the bartender comes over, she orders two shots of rum chata. You're making me nervous, Ray. The shots come, and she downs one without waiting for me. I start to chuckle. Whoa there, it can't be that. I like your brother. Her words hit me slowly, but she doesn't give me time to respond anyway. I'm sorry I lied, but we'd just met, and I didn't want you to think I was some weirdo or that I was pretending to be your friend because of Adam. His name makes it all finally click. Your crush, the hockey player, is my brother? Yes, and I'm going to tell him tonight, but I wanted to tell you first. She eyes the second shot. Do you need that or do I? I'm not upset. Adam would be lucky to have someone like you, but you can't tell him tonight. Why not? Her brown eyes crinkle at the corners as she draws her eyebrows together. Because I invited Taryn and she just walked in. I'm sorry, I didn't know. As I stand to greet my brother's girlfriend, I see Reagan down the last shot. Hey, Taryn says tentatively. Hi, Taryn, I say, and we hug. Thanks for coming. She laughs lightly. You didn't leave me much choice. You said it was life or death. Maybe that was a little dramatic, but it is important. I glance to either side of me, but there's nowhere for her to sit. Reagan hops out of her seat. Here, you can have mine. I'm going to go. I just realized I need to be somewhere. Are you sure? I ask. I feel awful. Not that I could have predicted this. I'll call you later. Taryn takes a seat and I blow out a long breath. Best to just dive right in. Whatever my brother did or said, he's an idiot. He's going through some things right now, so he's not to be trusted. Her face twists into a surprised expression. You mean your parents separating? He told you? Yeah, of course. He's really torn up about it. Exactly. Don't let him push you away because of it. I think he just needs some time. She smiles sweetly. I agree, but that's not why we broke up. It's not? No. She shakes her head. It probably was the catalyst, but it wasn't the reason. Well, shit. I guess this is what I get for meddling. Oh, I slump in my chair. You're sure? You two seemed great together. We are. Your brother is fantastic, and I really like him. But I'm transferring at semester, and neither of us really wanted to try to manage a long-distance thing. Oh, well, shit. I didn't know. I just decided before Thanksgiving break. I got into a really competitive design program at my dream college. Her face lights up. Wow, well, congratulations. Thank you. For the next half hour, I listen as she tells me about her plans and the program at her new school. The more we talk, the more I like her and the sadder I am that she's leaving. We part with a hug and a promise to keep in touch. I don't know if we actually will, but it's more than I can say for my relationships with most of Adam's ex-girlfriends. I've got a bunch of texts from Adam apologizing for not being able to make it. This night is a giant failure. 
I call Heath on my way to his apartment, but he doesn't answer. Since he got sick, he's been keeping me away for fear I'd catch it. But right now, I'm willing to risk it to lay in his arms. Noise filters out, laughter and loud voices as I head up the stairs to their door. I knock twice before walking in. Rhett, Maverick, and Heath are in the living room. All eyes are on the TV and whatever video game they're playing. Beer cans line the coffee table. It's far from the scene I was expecting. When they finally notice me, Maverick and Rhett's glassy stares and big smiles gives me some idea of just how drunk they are. Heath doesn't look drunk, but I'm still a little irritated that they're all hanging out together when I tried to plan a night out with all of us. Genevieve, Maverick calls. He's got a bottle in one hand and a controller in the other. Come be on my team, they're kicking my ass. Rhett puts his controller down and runs a hand through his dirty blonde hair. You can take my place. I'm out, boys. I need to call Carrie. He stands and heads to his room, leaving me with Heath and Maverick. Need another? Mav stands, sways, and then walks to the kitchen. He grabs a beer and holds it up. No thanks, Heath says. He motions me over to him and holds his arms out. I go to him and climb into his lap. As he wraps his arms around me, I snuggle in close and breathe him in. Hey, I whisper into his jaw. He's unshaven, and I love the way his scruff feels against my smooth skin. Feeling better? Mm-hmm. He places a thumb under my chin and lifts my mouth to his and places a quick kiss on my lips. I melt into him. I only had two beers, and look at me. I'm a lightweight now. Sorry that we didn't make it out. How was it? A total bust. You didn't miss anything. You two want to cuddle? Maverick asks. Make a little Mav sandwich? No chance, Heath says and stands, holding me in his arms. He's unsteady on his feet, but somehow he carries me without falling or dropping me. Night, Mav, I call over Heath's shoulder. He kicks the door closed and deposits me on his bed and lies on top of me, burying his head in my neck. He kisses the spot. You smell nice. You feel nice, I say, lifting my hips into the hard bulge in his pants. I slip my hands under his t-shirt and up over his pecs. He leans up enough for me to pull the material all the way over his head. I love Heath's body. Every muscle and every ridge. The light smattering of hair covering his chest and the defined abs and V that disappears into his jeans. A shiver of pleasure shoots through me as he kisses my neck and collarbone, first on one side and then the other. I unbutton his jeans and slide the zipper down. As my palm meets skin, I chuckle. Had to freeball it. He says and leans up to give me a sheepish grin. Haven't done laundry since I got back. I free his cock from his pants. Convenient. He hisses and then moans as I slide my hand down his length. I may never wear boxers again. Fuck, I missed you. My insides are total mush when he voices his feelings, even if I am touching his dick while he's saying it. It's only been a few days. And your point is? He asks, eyes closed and hips bucking into my palm. I pause and his eyes open and lock onto mine. It's an opening to tell him how I feel, but instead of taking it, I slide down the bed and wrap my lips around the head of his cock. Afterward, we're lying on the bed, curled up together, Heath's eyelids keep shutting even as he tells me he's not tired. Let me get you some water and Tylenol. I start to stand, but he captures my hand and tugs me back down. No, I don't need you to do that. People are always trying to take care of me. I just want you to lay here with me. You are very stubborn. His mouth pulls up into a smile, eyes still closed. You know, it's okay to let people do nice things for you. It doesn't mean you're incapable. That's how relationships work. I bite at the corner of my lip. 
Speaking of, I've been trying to talk to you since we got back from break, but with everything that's happened, we haven't had a chance. Maybe tomorrow we can hang out, just the two of us? His lids flutter open and those dark blue eyes focus on me. It's okay, Jenny. I already know. I overheard you talking to Adam. You know what? At your parents' house. I was in your room that morning before we left, and I overheard you tell Adam that you... how you feel about me. Oh. Crap. Embarrassed, stilted laughter slips out, and I sit up. Why didn't you say anything before? I didn't know what to say. His lips turn down at the corners, and then his tongue darts out to wet them. Ginny, I like you a lot. All the blood drains from my face. The way he says it and his expression, it's excruciating. Like, he didn't tell me because he doesn't feel the same. I'm absolutely horrified, and fleeing is the first thing that comes to mind. Get out of here before I start crying. I forgot how honest you are when you've been drinking. I try to laugh it off, but tears sting my eyes. I stand and look for my clothes. I'm going. Let's talk tomorrow when you're sober. Please don't go. This is why I didn't bring it up before. I didn't want you to say it and be hurt if I didn't say it back. What we have is great, and it's just a bullshit word. He runs a hand through his hair, making the dark strands stand up. Then the other hand joins it. I love his hair. It's always such a beautiful mess. Even now, when he's breaking my heart. Love is a bullshit word? I shake my head in disbelief. This is why I told Adam and not you. I thought it might be too soon and I didn't want to pressure you or make things weird. I had no intention of telling you that I love you. I swallow. I can't describe how much I hate that the first time I utter those three words to him, it's like this. I feel completely shattered that I've been his unknowing pity case while he's been secretly trying to figure out how to let me down easy. No, that's not what I'm saying. It isn't that you- He pauses. Wait, you weren't? But you said that you wanted to talk. I just assumed that's what it was about. I've been worrying about it all week. Oh my god. I glance to the ceiling and try to calm the anger rising. When I look back to him, I can no longer keep my eyes from welling hot, angry tears. Fuck, that came out wrong, he says. I was going to ask you to be my boyfriend, you big jerk. His brows draw together. Oh. But it's really nice to know you've been stressing about me using the L word, heaven forbid. What an awful thing for you to cope with. Anger. Yes, I need more anger to keep from feeling the sadness. He gets to his feet. His jeans are on but unbuttoned and they slide down to his hips as he starts toward me. Fuck, Jenny, I thought I already was your boyfriend. Yeah, well, we've never talked about it, hence the talk. I'm sorry. For what? Not loving me or thinking the whole concept of it is ludicrous? My voice cracks. He groans and he runs those big hands through his hair again while he struggles to find the right words. But it's too late. What could he possibly say now? Any illusion I had that he might feel the same way, today or someday in the future, is now gone. Dating a guy who isn't ready for a serious commitment is one thing, but once you tell them you love them, even by accident, there's no going back and pretending it's just a casual fling. This isn't going to work. Don't say that. Forget everything I said in the past five minutes. Start over. Ask me to be your boyfriend. He closes the distance between us and frames my face with his hands. Ask me, Genevieve. He pleads. He makes a strangled sound deep in his throat as I pull away and finish getting dressed, tossing the t-shirt of his I was wearing on the bed, yanking on my own clothes and slipping into my shoes. I think he might say something else to try to stop me, but he doesn't. He just watches me prepare to leave, looking helpless. Before I go, I have to say it at least once, out loud and to him, if only for myself. I love you, Heath. He flinches. I'm sorry if that's too much for you to deal with, but I do, and I don't want to just forget it. Chapter 36 Heath I haven't been this hungover in years. Mav drops on the couch and chugs half the Gatorade bottle in his hand with one long drink. 
Getting drunk after being sick and hardly eating all week, I've basically got the tolerance of a high school chick. I'm silent and he nudges my foot on the coffee table. What's up with you? You've been quiet all morning. I'm fine. Girl fine or really fine? I said I was fine. His brows lift and he smiles, but he drops it. He finishes off his drink and stands. Ready to go to campus? I'm starving. Let's go out for breakfast today instead of the dining hall. Yeah, that sounds rad. I want pancakes. Text Ginny and we can swing by and pick her up. She doesn't want to come. What? Of course she does. I'll text her. No, don't. We're not. She's... Jesus, I can't even finish a sentence that puts an end to whatever we were. Maverick stops and the hand holding his phone falls to his side. What the fuck did you do, Payne? I'd like to resent his automatic assumption that I'm at fault, but of course I am. I let out a giant sigh. I'll tell you over pancakes. He doesn't press me to talk until we both got a heaping stack of pancakes on our plates. Only then does he ask what happened. I fill him in on last night, unable to eat more than a bite or two. That's cold. What was I supposed to say? I'm not sure. He shrugs and takes a large bite of his food. He looks thoughtful as he chews and then swallows. You really think love is bullshit? Don't you? If anyone would understand, I figured it'd be Maverick. His childhood was as fucked up as mine, just in a totally different way. No, man. Love is beautiful. How the fuck would you know? Damn, I need a muzzle lately. Sorry that came out wrong, but you know what I mean. Who's ever said it to you and not screwed you over? Well, you've never said it, but you love me, and you've never screwed me over. That's not the same, isn't it? Not unless you're over there thinking about me naked. His lips part and pull into a smile. Relax, you're not nearly kinky enough for me. But seriously, man, you think there's someone out there that's capable of speaking the words to you and really meaning it? No strings, no ulterior motives? Two people who care deeply and want to support one another? Isn't that basically what you and Ginny had before you blew it up? He sets an elbow on the table and waves his fork around. I'm not much for trying to live up to other people's expectations. I know what it means to me, and yeah, he shrugs. At least I hope so. Otherwise, it's going to be me and you heading to the early bird special together. The only question you need to ask yourself is, do you believe Ginny means it? Yeah, I think she does. She's never given me any reason to doubt her. I toss my napkin on the table. I'm not hungry. He takes my plate and I watch as he inhales my food and then sits back with a contented sigh. I don't know what to do. I want to be with her, but I can't tell her I... You know, when the words make me want to throw myself off a cliff. But you do? If I didn't hate the word and everything in my past associated with it... Yeah, that's probably how I'd define it. Big gesture. Huge. I'm talking Kanye antics. I think I'll just try to talk to her first. Talking got you into this mess, he points out. When we get to campus, Maverick starts toward class. I'm going by the dorm first to see if I can find Ginny. Something tells me she didn't show up at the dining hall this morning either. Good luck, buddy. Try not to use the word like. I flip him off. He turns and I call after him. Hey, Mav. My buddy glances over his shoulder. You can always count me in for the early bird special, no matter what. I move at a clip across campus and jog up the stairs to the second floor. I knock on the door and wait. No answer. Knock again. Jenny, are you there? It's Heath. Open up if you're there. Please? It's quiet on the other side, and I rest my head against the door. I'm so sorry. A few people pass by in the hall and give me weird looks, and the door continues to mock me by staying shut. I blow out a breath. The magnitude of how badly I screwed this up makes my whole body ache something fierce. I'm caught off guard when the door finally opens, and I stumble forward. My heart soars and then plummets when it's Ava's face that appears and not Ginny's. She's not here, Ginny's shy roommate says, her cheeks turning pink. Right, okay, could you give her a message? She nods, prompting me. Shit, what was the message? 
I'm sorry that I'm a giant prick doesn't really tell her anything she didn't already know, even if it's accurate. Just ask her to call me. I step back and then add, Please? Chapter 37 Jenny Thank you for doing this one with me, I say to Dakota as the group of local elementary students line up for a tour of the Hall of Fame. It's my first day back working after being locked in the hype room. I'm already a mess from last night, and the idea of being in there by myself again is scary. Of course, these guys might look little, but trust me, it's going to take two of us plus their teacher to keep them in line. She gives me a reassuring smile and steps forward and introduces herself. I fall back and let her do the majority of the talking. I'm not feeling particularly chatty, but I answer questions and help the kids from wandering off. It's a totally different experience than the recruits get, less focused and more about letting the kids walk around awestruck by catching glimpses of college athletes working out or walking around campus. They look up to them like celebrities, and it's pretty heartwarming. But since it's less intense than our recruit tours, I'm able to fade into the background, and today I'm extremely thankful for that. When we walk into the hype room, Dakota goes first. The kids follow, and I bring up the end of the line. She glances to me as I enter. I nod to let her know I'm okay. Maybe the anxiousness I thought I'd feel coming in here again is dulled by the deep, aching pain I've had since I walked out of Heath's apartment last night but I'm able to stand and watch the video without panicking. It's a generic video, encompassing all sports, but since hockey is such a big deal at Valley, there are still lots of times that Heath's face splashes on the screen. Each and every time, it feels like someone's pouring alcohol into an open wound. I'm sad and mad, flipping between the two so frequently even I don't know which one is the prominent emotion. Does he really think we can keep dating like nothing happened? Even if I could get over the idea that he doesn't feel the same and likely never will, I'd be a wreck waiting for the day he freaked out again or decided to move on. There's really only two ways a relationship can go, and he took one of those options away. When you know how something is going to end, it's harder to enjoy the moment. As the video stops on the final frame, a drone shot overhead of campus, the kids' faces are lit up with joy and wonder. I step to the door so I can be the first out. Dakota and I take them to the football field and let them loose to run around in the big open space. How was it? She asks as we stand on the 50-yard line. I don't know if I'll ever feel the same about that room, but it was okay. Listen, I've got it from here. Take off, go see Heath, or go lay in bed and cry. Whatever you need to do. You're sure? Definitely. Five more minutes of them sprinting up and down the field, and I can hand them back to their teacher. I hug her. Thank you. I take off from my dorm with the intent of trying to nap. Needless to say, I spent last night tossing and turning, so I'm not only emotionally exhausted, but physically, too. However, as soon as I fall into my bed and pull up the covers, I get a 911 text from Reagan. I get back up and trudge across campus. I find her in the back of the theater in their dressing room. Her hair is in curlers and she's wearing her green, silky robe. Hey, what's going on? Miss Morris fell and broke her wrist. She's out and now I don't have anyone to do my makeup. Can you help? We have our dress rehearsal in 30 minutes. I'd gotten the first part from her text message and had come prepared to do her makeup, but dress rehearsal? The look on her face is pleading, though, so I suck it up. I've never done stage makeup like that, but I can try. Thank you. The dressing room in the theater is a large open room with a long counter that extends on two walls with lighted mirrors. Stools are around the room in disarray. Some tucked under the counter, others have clothes and makeup bags on them, and the rest are occupied by girls as they get ready. Reagan sits, her cosmetics litter the space in front of her. So what happened with Heath? Dakota heard from Rhett that Heath was not looking great at their morning skate. I set down my backpack and add my makeup to the counter. It was a very long night after you left.
I fill her in while I add primer to her face. All of this happened last night? And you haven't heard from him since? Ava said he came by the dorm looking for me. She smiles and tries to shoo me off. Go, I can do my own face. No way, I've got you. Let's just talk about something else. Okay, like what? Like how nervous I am right now? What? Why? You've done my makeup lots of times. It always looks great. But the lights and the people... My hands tremble. I'm nervous and I'm not even the one who has to go out there. Her sweet laughter relaxes me. It's only a dress rehearsal. As I work, she studies the script in front of her. I've heard her running lines with Dakota enough that I know she's already got it memorized, but I decide it's best not to mess with whatever process she has. When she finally looks up, I'm ready to add another coat of mascara. Oh, wow, Jenny. Is it too much? It's amazing. She turns her face to look at each side more closely. You're a miracle worker. I don't know about that, but thank you. Mascara wand in hand, I tell her, look down. Instead of heading back to my dorm or going to class, I stay for the rehearsal. The play is a modern take on a Christmas story, and Reagan plays the ghost of Christmas present. The green gown she wears could have been made specifically with her in mind. She looks exquisite. That's my first thought, but the longer she's on stage, the more I fall into her character. I smile as the clock strikes midnight. She bows her head and slowly walks backward until she disappears behind the curtain. After the rehearsal, she comes down off the front of the stage and finds me in the third row. What did you think? I pull her into a tight hug. You are so talented, Reagan. I let her go to look her in the eye so she knows how much I mean it, and then I hug her again. A woman who'd been sitting in the row ahead of me turns and walks toward us. Her blonde hair is pulled up into a tight bun, and she wears red-framed glasses that she takes off when she reaches us. She has an air of sophistication and also looks like she might cut a bitch if necessary. Really well done, Reagan. You found the lighting up there really well. She steps closer and inspects my friend's face. Your makeup. She makes a little humming noise in her throat. Who did you use? Oh, uh, I did it. I'm sorry if it isn't. It looks amazing, she assures me. She tips her head to Reagan. It needs to be a little darker to read at the back of the house, but it suits you. Great job today. See you tomorrow. Thank you, Dr. Rawson. When she's gone, Reagan grabs my hand and squeals. You did it! That woman is scary. Who is she? She's the director. Well, she's not someone I want to cross. She's made more than one person cry since she took over last year. Come on, let me buy you coffee as a thank you. We stay on campus and go to University Hall. It's busy with a late afternoon rush, but we order from the cafe and find a small table near the door. I'm so relieved that's over. Don't you have two real shows this weekend? Yes, but the rehearsal is the only time I really get nervous. It's harder to be on when you're staring out into an empty theater. I so don't get that. She smiles. Thank you again. You might have been fleeing the Heath situation, but it benefited me greatly. Anytime. I take a sip of my coffee. So are we going to talk about that thing you said last night? She looks down to the table. I was hoping we could pretend I never said a peep. Like you've been trying to pretend you don't have a thing for my brother all semester? Longer than that, she mumbles. I'm grinning ear to ear when she finally looks up at me. I think you should go for it. He and Taryn are done for good. She's transferring at the end of the semester. Now's your shot. I don't know. Now that you and I are so close, wouldn't it be weird? I consider it for a few moments. No, I don't think so. Not unless we make it weird. It's probably not even worth worrying about. Honestly, he hasn't noticed me in the three years we've known each other. I don't think he sees me like that. Only one way to find out. Listen to you dishing out advice while you're hiding from your boyfriend. I'm not hiding. I'm giving us some time to breathe. And? 
I prefer breathing his air. I turn my phone on silent, stuff it in a desk drawer, and bury myself in schoolwork all afternoon. I don't allow myself to think about anything else. That is, until a pounding on my door breaks my concentration. My heart is in my throat waiting for Heath's voice on the other side, but it's Adam that calls. Jenny, open up. I scramble off my bed and fling the door open. Hey, what are you doing here? I've been calling you all day. Oh, uh, I turn my phone on silent while I caught up on schoolwork. What's up? I heard about last night. Oh, that. Yeah, oh, that. He moves my books out of the way and sits on my bed. I'm sure it's payback for meddling in your relationship with Heath, but I still can't believe you went to so much trouble to get Taryn and me back together. Oh, right, that. I sit and pull my pillow into my lap. I know I overstepped. I thought you were having a reaction to mom and dad, and I wanted to help. You've always looked out for me, and I wanted to do the same for once. Taryn said as much. Are you mad? No, I get it. I'm sorry about you and Taryn. Yeah, me too. On the plus side, I know lots of girls who will be thrilled you're single again. One in particular, but that's not my secret to tell. His chest lifts and falls with a quiet chuckle. I think I'm going to try being single for a change. With everything going on, I think the universe might be sending me a sign. Single, huh? I can't picture it. Me neither. He leans so his back rests against the concrete wall. I don't think I'm doing as well with mom and dad as I thought, either. I came back and threw myself into making plans with our friends because I wanted so badly to pretend everything was normal. But it's not. I think it's going to be weird for a while, no matter what. Plus, uh, Heath and I are... I don't even know. Yeah, that's actually why I'm here, but I figured that wouldn't get me in the door. You know? One look at Heath this morning, and I think we all knew something was up. Want to tell me what happened? The short version? He overheard me telling you that I loved him, freaked out, told me love was bullshit, and I ran. Why did you run? That's not like you. Because I was embarrassed. Do you know what it's like to tell someone you love them and have them not return the sentiment? No. He shakes his head. But I'm sure I've had a lot of people say it and not mean it. It's a risk either way. You know, I never thought about it before, but you're like the bravest person I know. You jump from girlfriend to girlfriend, he groans. Let me finish, I punch his leg. You keep putting yourself out there no matter how many times it doesn't work. Maybe it's a little excessive, but definitely brave. He rubs at the back of his neck. Well, I guess that's one way to look at it. We fall silent and I lean my head on his shoulder. The alarm on his phone sounds and I sit straight. I gotta go, he says. Are you coming to the game? I'm not sure. Probably. It's funny how even when you're pissed, you can't help but show up to support him. It's you I'm supporting. Mm-hmm. I roll my eyes. Are you gonna be okay? He stops at the door and regards me seriously. Yeah, I will. I blow out a breath. I was perfectly happy with our fun college fling until he found out I love him. Freaking love. He scrunches up his face. And on that note, I'm out. He opens the door and winks back at me. Later, G. Chapter 38. Heath. When we take the ice, I automatically look for Ginny in her usual seat. She's not there, and the knife in my gut twists. Vermont is tough. They've got a freshman, Lex Vaughn, who's almost as fast as I am, and their defense is big and mean. I played against Vaughn in high school, Adam says. He was just a skinny kid who could barely stay upright back then. We watched tape last weekend on Vermont, and Jordan and Adam filled us in as best they could. All three of them are from Arizona, and Jordan went to high school with Vaughn, playing together all four years. No one can believe the progress he's made. It seems the New England air agrees with him because every game he just gets better. Yeah, well, looks like he's improved. A lot. No shit. Adam laughs as we watch him warm up, looking steady and sharp. 
The game matches our pace, a brutal intensity that's exactly what I need tonight. Neither team scores in the first period. I've skated nearly half of those twenty minutes and I'm sucking air, but the burn of my lungs is nothing compared to the feeling I get when I glance at Ginny's empty seat. Coach gives us his usual quick and straightforward pep talk between periods. He's not big on grand speeches, but his words are always effective. Vermont's goalie is one of the best in the country, not that we're making it hard on him. We're losing the puck before we can even do anything with it. I get a pass from Maverick and use some of my aggression on a mean slap shot. It's wide, and I swear I feel him grin underneath that fucking mask. The second line comes in, and I get a breather and a moment to collect myself. You good? Mav asks. Good enough to finish this, I grunt out, and then go find Ginny. Let's go, then. When we jump the boards, it's another minute of skating my ass off before Vermont scores and the Valley crowd groans their disapproval. We go into the third period down by one. Like some sort of masochist, I continue to glance to the spot Ginny's occupied at every home game. Every time I look is like another punch to the gut, but I can't stop myself. Pain, coach calls from the bench. Are you standing still out there? I skate like the pain doesn't matter. I deke out a defenseman, pass to Jordan on the left side, and fly by two more players just as he sends it back. I get a decent look at the net that's denied. At least this one requires the goalie to use a little of that all-star athleticism, but the end result is the same, with Valley losing. A shutout in front of our home crowd. After our loss, no one feels like going out, and the guys and I head back to the apartment. I take a seat on the couch with my phone in hand. I haven't heard from Ginny, and I don't think it's because her roommate didn't give her the message. I tap out a bunch of texts, but don't send any of them. Rothruss is playing video games. Wanna play? Yeah. I lift my hand, and he tosses me a controller. We play in silence for a few minutes. Can, um, I ask you a question? Sure, he says, not looking away from the screen. You and Carrie, how'd that come about? We went to high school together. Right, but I mean, how did you make it official? She told me we were no longer seeing other people. And that was it? He pauses the game and looks to me. I probably said something real eloquent like, Uh, okay. She was popular and I wasn't. I'd have done anything she asked. Adam's bedroom door opens and he walks out and drops into the armchair and blows out a long, exaggerated breath. Rothruss looks to him. Not going to Terrence? Adam waves a hand. Nah, that's over. Another one bites the dust? Rothruss jokes, then looks to me. You want advice on getting a girlfriend? He nods his head to Adam. Scott's the one to ask. You want to ask Ginny to be your girlfriend? Adam asks. Yeah, this would be a lot less awkward if I weren't having this conversation with her brother. He hated the idea before I made her cry, so I doubt he's pumped now. I tread carefully. To be honest, I thought she already was, but I guess that's a thing people talk about first. Adam's face slowly transforms from a stony wall of indifference to amusement, and he laughs. Have you ever had a girlfriend, pain? I clear my throat and wipe a hand over my brow. Jesus, it's hot in here. Clearly not. He studies me and lets out another one of his new broody sighs. Jenny doesn't need a big gesture. Just tell her how you feel. Well, no, actually, first, you need to convince her to speak to you again. Yeah, thanks a lot. Good talk. Mav walks through the door. Honey, I'm home. He plops down and reads the room. What's going on? Heath is going to ask Jenny to go steady. Ralph Russ smirks. Fuck off, I tell him, but smile. Damn it, I should have known better than to ask him. Nothing is ever taken seriously around here. I take it talking didn't go over so well? Mav asks with a knowing smirk. I flip him off. Are you guys going to help me or what? Maverick claps his hands together. Let's brainstorm on the whiteboard. We don't have a whiteboard, Adam points out. Maverick shakes his head, smiling. Real oversight, minion. Task one, find something to write down ideas. Surprisingly, Adam does get up and appears to search for something to write on. Maverick goes to the fridge and grabs four beers and then hands them out. 
Adam comes back with a scrap of paper and a pen. All right, ideas to ask a girl out. I feel like I'm back in middle school. I would have guessed you started more pre-K age, Rothross says and twists the cap on his beer. Adam flips him off and then looks to me, poised to write down our ideas. You're on board with this? I ask him. He shrugs. If it's what she wants. Besides, it's going to be fun as hell to watch you try to pull this off. Maverick takes the lead and I let him. For as much shit as he talks about his dad, I can see the family resemblance. When he sets his mind to it, he's a good leader. An hour later, we've got a handful of ideas, and they're all pretty awful. Rothraus is the straightforward one, take her to dinner, buy her roses. Maverick is elaborate and has so many suggestions only about half are being written down. They range from renting out a movie theater to hiring a mariachi band and everything else you can imagine in between. Adam has some good insights since he knows Ginny the best, but none of his suggestions feel right either. I'm probably overthinking it. I don't know anything about love or being a good boyfriend, but I know Ginny, and I know that I'm better when I'm with her. Well? Rothrus asks once we're out of new suggestions and beer. Maybe dinner? It isn't the most creative, but a lot easier than renting out a movie theater. I have no idea how to pull off the ladder, and I feel like that kind of thing might take days or weeks, and I don't want to wait that long. Dinner. Maverick's face twists up in clear disappointment. Dinner is so... dinner. Unless... he sits forward, elbows on knees. You buy out the restaurant so it's just the two of you, and then... I cut him off. Let me stop you right there, buddy. Appreciate your dedication, but I don't want it to feel like I'm being someone else for the night. Some of my favorite memories with Ginny over the past semester have been hanging out with our friends or chilling, just the two of us. None of that was elaborate or over the top. But maybe this is different. Maybe big and bold is what I need. I scrub a hand down my face and then look to Adam. Does anyone know her favorite song? You're going with that one? Rothraus's eyebrows shoot up. This I gotta see. Maverick fist pumps. Yeah, I love that one. Of course you do. It was your idea. Chapter 39 Jenny. Dakota and Reagan sit on one end of my bed, their concerned faces staring back at me. Ava's gone for the weekend visiting Trent, and when I told my friends I was going back to my dorm alone after the game, they insisted on coming with me. My phone pings on my desk and Dakota reaches to get it for me. Read it for me. It's Adam. He says he didn't see you at the game and wants to know if you're in your dorm watching Notting Hill. She looks up to me for an explanation. When I was in, like, seventh grade, my first boyfriend broke up with me and I was so devastated, I watched Notting Hill on repeat for an entire weekend. Something like twenty times. It became my go-to breakup movie. I could so go for watching that movie on repeat about now. I love that movie, Reagan says. Julia Roberts is a goddess. Dakota sets my phone on the bed. Guess they didn't see us. That's good. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think it's good. I'm not sure what difference it would have made, but there was no way I could sit in my usual seat so close to the bench where he could read the sadness on my face. The game was brutal enough as it was. Instead, the girls and I sat at the top of the student section, blending in with the sea of blue and yellow. It was hard to watch them lose, but it fit my depressing mood nicely. My phone pings again, and this time I reach for it. Adam. Are you okay? Just let me know you're at the dorm and that all is well and I'll leave you alone. Me. Yes, I'm safe and sound in my dorm. He doesn't respond right away and I toss my phone back onto the bed. Holding it reminds me I haven't talked to Heath. Well, should we watch Notting Hill? We're just queuing up the movie when there's noise outside of my window. My window faces a parking lot, so it isn't unusual that it's noisy, but this noise is, well... It's different. Do you hear that? I ask. Sounds like a bunch of drunk guys heading out to party. It's too early to be so obnoxious. Must be freshmen. No offense. She stands and goes to look. Uh, Ginny, I think you need to see this. I scramble from the bed to look. 
There's shrubbery along the edge of the building, so the aforementioned obnoxious guys aren't directly under my window, but they're as close as they can get. Adam and Rhett are on all fours on the ground, and Maverick is on top of them on his hands and knees, and then Heath stands on his back. They've built a freaking pyramid. Reagan and Dakota laugh. We open my window as far as it goes, which is only a couple of inches. Heath holds his cell phone over his head and sings along with the music. What in the world is he doing? Dakota asks. Shh, he's serenading her, Reagan says. Why Mariah Carey? Dakota asks in a whisper. A few other residents have opened their windows and call out or sing along. People walking by in the parking lot are stopping. Some have their phones out videoing it, no doubt. Heath wears a shy expression, one I wasn't sure he possessed, but he belts out the song confidently. When he's through the chorus for a second time, he stops. Rhett calls, Did you hear us? What's going on? I can't see shit down here. The whole dorm heard you, asshole, someone calls. What are you doing? I ask through the crack. My heart hammers in my chest. Hope and excitement claw at the hurt and anger. I didn't think this all the way through. I don't know what to do now, he admits with a sheepish grin. Tell her how you feel, Mav urges. He looks up to me and lifts a hand to wave, which makes Heath wobble on his back. Maybe you should get down first, Adam prompts. Heath jumps down and the rest of the guys get up. Heath walks closer and stares up at me. I miss you. You could have said that over the phone. I was afraid you wouldn't answer. Trying to watch a movie in here. Someone else calls out a window not far from mine. Heath looks toward the voice. Sorry, man. Almost done. Mav pushes forward. Go fucking watch it then. Guy's trying to pour his heart out. He nods to Heath as if to say, I've got you covered. Heath tilts his head to the side and speaks a little quieter. Can we talk somewhere else, not through the window? I hesitate, and he adds, Doesn't have to be tonight. Tomorrow? Next week? Next month? You name it and I'll be there. Reagan whispers beside me. Go down there. My heart is beating so fast, but the rest of me is frozen in place. I'll call you, okay? He nods, a look of resignation taking over his features as he takes a step back. Come on, boys, Adam says. Every one of them looks disappointed, but I can't bring myself to run down there and throw myself into his arms. Of course that's what I want to do, but then what? They head toward the parking lot. Adam's Jeep is parked in one of the 15-minute spots closest to my dorm. Heath, I yell out my window. They all turn with matching hopeful expressions. I miss you too. Last night, Reagan and Dakota stayed through the movie. They didn't ask if I was going to call Heath or say anything, really, and I'm glad because I didn't know the answer. I still don't. After they were gone, I laid in bed with my phone scrolling through our text history and then my pictures. He's become such a big part of my life, and I know that I can't cut him out completely. At least for another semester, he'll be living with my brother. But even if that weren't the case, I'd see him on campus. A glimpse across the crowd, or maybe we'd run into one another at a party. I've started a dozen different text messages, but I haven't been brave enough to send any of them. I go to the game Saturday afternoon with Dakota, and this time we sit in our usual seats. We're in our blue and yellow, and I do my best to plaster on a happy face as the team takes the ice. Heath looks straight to my seat, and when he sees me, a hint of a smile pulls at his lips. Tonight's game is as fast-paced as last night's, and we're on our feet, hands clenched in nervous excitement for most of it. Vermont's defense is big and mean, and they seem to have it out for Heath in particular. He takes hit after brutal hit. I cringe when Maverick slammed into the boards. In front of me, Adam and a guy from Vermont collide and both go down, but not before Adam passes the puck to Heath. It's like a wrestling match on skates, but Heath races to the net, past defenders, and finds the net. The horn blares and we go crazy with the rest of the crowd. 
The goal seems to shift things, and Vermont is sloppier, not quite recovering their composure. Valley holds on to win by one. I decide to wait for Heath by the locker rooms. I have no idea what I'm going to say, but avoiding him forever isn't an option. The guys are slow to come out, and I'm pacing and wringing my hands when his dark head finally comes through the door. He pauses when he sees me, and Maverick runs into the back of him. I start toward him and meet him halfway. Hey, he says tentatively. Congratulations. Thanks. We both shift awkwardly, and I step forward and hug him. He hugs me back, but hisses through his teeth. Oh, shit, sorry. I step back as he winces. You got tossed around like a rag doll out there tonight. Yeah, it got a little rough. Are you headed to the hideout? That was the plan, unless... Yeah, you should go. It was a big victory. You're not coming? There's obvious disappointment on his face. Not tonight. Dakota and I are going to watch Reagan's play. It's opening night, but maybe we can talk tomorrow? Really? He looks so excited about it, I can't help but smile. Yeah, really, we should talk. It isn't like we can avoid each other forever. Wouldn't want to, even if I could. I'm at a loss for words, and he takes my hand. Just give me a chance to explain. I nod and take a step away, breaking our contact. Tomorrow. Seeing Reagan perform a second time is just as amazing as the first, and bonus that I get to watch as Dakota and the rest of the crowd react. She's so damn talented, Dakota says when it's over. She wipes an honest-to-goodness tear from her eye. I don't even like theater. Let's go find her. She said she'd meet us out in the lobby. I'm surprised to see my brother and Rhett as we crowd into the lobby with everyone else. Their tall and muscular frames make them easy to find, but getting to them takes a few minutes. When we do, I ask the obvious question, what are you two doing here? A quick scan of them, and I can tell they're in their travel suits for away games. Adam hugs me. She always comes to support us, so we thought we'd return the favor. That's really nice of you. What did you think? I ask Rhett. I don't really like theater, but Reagan's part was cool. Maybe you could leave out the first part when you see her. I tell him as I spot her. She's over there. Come on. Chapter 40 Heath After having a beer with some of the guys on the team at the hideout, I head back to the apartment. My latest care package from Nathan and Chloe is waiting for me, and I open it. Definitely, Chloe put this one together. It's covered in gold tissue paper. And call my brother. Thank Chloe for the package. I lie down on my bed and stare up at the ceiling. You can thank her yourself in three weeks. We're flying up to watch you play the weekend before Christmas. For real? I ask and sit up. Yeah, Mom too. She didn't tell you? Uh... You haven't talked to her, have you? She's my next call. I pull the phone away from my ear and look at the time. Or tomorrow, maybe. It's kind of late there. She'll be up. You know what a night owl she is. Call her. I will. I will. I say begrudgingly. I get it, he says. Trust me, I do. I did the same thing. I got to Valley and tried to live like the past hadn't happened. I barely talked to you or Mom my first two years of college. I know. I remember. I'd been sad at first and then pissed. Dad died, then Nathan left, Mom got worse, and before I knew it, everything had changed except me. She's trying. I know it doesn't magically make up for everything, but you can't be pissed at her forever if you really want to move on. I'm not pissed, I say, and then backtrack. Okay, maybe a little pissed. If it helps, the more I talk to her now, the easier it gets and the less I find myself thinking about the past. Yeah, all right. Well, I've got to get to bed. We're flying to New York early tomorrow, but I'm really excited to see you in a few weeks. Also, Chloe started Christmas shopping two months ago, so be prepared. Her level of excitement is intense. Can't wait, I say honestly. It's been a long time since we've had a holiday together, or really, any time together. After we hang up, I call Mom, but she doesn't answer. So I shoot her a text and then change into sweats. 
She returns my call as I fall back on my bed. Hey, sorry I missed your call. My hands were covered in cookie dough. I'm doing some late night baking. No problem. I'm about to head to bed. Have you talked to Nathan? Did he tell you we're coming to Valley? Her voice is upbeat and I realize she's excited, which makes me more excited. Yeah, I just got off the phone with him. I can't believe you guys are all coming. Visiting you at college and then your brother and Chloe coming home for Thanksgiving reminded me how much I miss my boys. I was so focused on myself and getting healthy that I've let us all go too long without getting together. You're doing great, Mom. She really is, and it only takes her voicing her own regrets to make me feel like a giant douche for holding the past against her. I haven't magically forgiven her, and I don't know how long it'll be until I do, but I know Nathan is right. I've got to meet her where she is now if I want any type of relationship with her. The thing is, I don't avoid calling her because I don't want her in my life. I'm just having a hard time figuring out what that looks like now while I try to let go of years of hurt I didn't even realize I was harboring until she was well enough for me to take a breath. I am, she says confidently. And so are you. I'm so proud of you. I clear my throat. Thanks, Mom. Three weeks? I can't wait. I'm making a test batch of oatmeal raisin cookies now. My stomach growls. Those are my favorite. I know. I haven't made them in years. The more we make plans, the more excited I am, but also cautious. I'm excited too, but if it doesn't work out, then we'll still all be together next summer, assuming they go through with the wedding. Of course they'll go through with it. Your brother is head over heels for Chloe. Yeah, it's not her I'm worried about screwing it up, I joke. Honestly, I know my brother would gnaw off a limb before doing anything to sabotage his relationship with Chloe. And she's awesome, so I get it. I'm happy for them. Oh, hush, your brother is doing great. I'm proud of both my boys. I'm really glad you called. The house is still lonely without you, especially at night. I yawn, and she laughs in my ear. Get some sleep, honey. I'll call you this week. Okay, sounds great, Mom. I love you. I try not to react to the word, but my muscles tighten, waiting for the thing that comes next, which used to be disappointment. It doesn't come, but it's too many years of hurt built up. I don't know if there'll ever be a day it doesn't fill me with a sense of dread coming from her lips, or a day I'll be able to say it to her or Ginny or anyone else. Thanks, Mom. Sunday, I'm practically glued to my phone waiting to hear from Ginny. I texted her as soon as I woke up, but by mid-afternoon, I'm starting to worry she's blowing me off. Give me your phone. Maverick prompts and holds out his hand. No way. Payne, give me the fucking phone before you do something stupid. Why can't I text her again? Because it's pathetic, Ruthross says. That's really something coming from you. You're on your phone constantly with Carrie. Yeah, but she wants to talk to me. Ouch. But okay, point made. I place my phone in Mav's palm and not two seconds later her name flashes on the screen. I swipe it back with a giant smile on my face. And? Mav asks. She's been at the theater all day. Apparently they asked her to do the makeup for Reagan and a few other girls at the show today. Oh, right. Adam's in the kitchen making food. Yeah, I think I heard them talking about that last night. Reagan looked as hot as she always does, but I guess it was too subtle for the stage or the lights or fuck, I don't know. You're just telling me this now? I didn't think of it until now. I take my phone into my bedroom and dial Ginny. Hey, she answers, sounding out of breath. I'm just now heading back to my dorm. Sorry about that. I didn't realize that I'd need to stay through the whole performance. Stage makeup, huh? Yeah, they even offered me a job for future performances. That's great, Ginny. Congratulations. Thank you. So, today was kind of a bust. I need to shower and then head to the library. I have a group meeting for one of my classes. I'm not sure when it'll be done. Can we talk tomorrow? Tomorrow? Shit, that sounds so far away. Breakfast? Yeah, I'll meet you at our usual time. So, Mav starts as we're walking into the dining hall. Which one did you decide to go with? What are you talking about? I scan the room for Ginny. Which big gesture is next? Rent out a theater, dinner? I decided to go with something that's more... me. You? I slap Mav on the back. Yeah, but it's not because I didn't enjoy your suggestions. 
You save those for when you find the perfect girl and screw it up. Good luck, buddy. He gets in line for food. I don't see Ginny yet, so I head to the back where I find Brenda. She smiles when she spots me. How's my favorite lunch, lady? She snorts. Brenda is the no-nonsense lady who manages the dining hall. I won her over last year. It started with a lot of flattery. Much deserved flattery. She works hard to keep us fed, and I appreciate that more than most people. Then I got to know her a little and found out she's a huge hockey fan. Sam and the kids good? She softens at the mention of her husband and children. Maddie is graduating high school this year, and Sophia is all about boys. God help us all. She hands me a tray and quirks a brow. Coach Myers approve of this? What he doesn't know won't hurt him, I wink. Thanks, Brenda. I owe you. Mm-hmm. How about paying me back with another win next weekend? She calls as I walk off. My steps are light as I head to my usual table. Jenny waits, looking around for me. When she spots me, a shy smile tips up the corners of her lips. And I'm suddenly really nervous. Hey, she says tentatively. She looks as anxious as I feel. I'd planned to say a lot of things, but fuck words. I drop the tray on the table, frame her face with both hands, and bring my lips to hers. She lets out a yelp of surprise, but then her body melts and she kisses me back. I've missed her so much. Not just this. Her. I don't want to stop kissing her, but the sound of people bustling around us going about their usual morning routines makes me pull back. That and I know there are things she needs to hear. I missed you so damn much, baby doll. Same. And I'm really sorry. I know you are. I sit and guide her to take the seat beside me. I want to explain, but I'm sure I'm going to say it all wrong. I blow out a breath. The way she watches me, willing to hear me out even when I know I've hurt her, pushes me forward. The other night was six years of frustration coming out at once, but it shouldn't have been you I was saying all that to. For a big part of my childhood, my mom used the words like a band-aid. Every time I took care of something for her, paid the bills or made dinner, the repayment I got was with a string of I love yous. It changed how I felt about it. Her love felt like an excuse to not show up any other way. I squeeze my eyes shut. Trust me, I know that's fucked up. I know she was grieving, I know she was depressed, but it didn't change the fact that all I wanted was for my mom to act like everyone else's. I didn't want I love you. I wanted her to take care of me. Oh, Heath, I'm sorry. She squeezes my hand. I won't pretend to understand what that must have been like. I'm certain that she loved you the best she could. That's all anyone does. It isn't perfect. I know. Knowing it and accepting it aren't the same. My heart's beating like a drum in my chest. The thought of my feelings for you being tainted by the past, I hate it. I don't want anything bad to ever touch you. You are my favorite person. You're the only person I'd skip food for or that could convince me to eat Neapolitan ice cream or a thousand other things. You. It's only you. And when I walked in here, I fully intended to stand firm on my stance of never speaking the words, of keeping the best thing in my life away from my worst memories, but then I saw you and I realized that it doesn't matter what it's meant before. If loving you is wanting to spend every day with you, laughing and having fun, supporting you and having your back, then I do. I love you, Ginny. Of course I do. Really? Really, really. I love you. I love you. I freaking love you. She smiles and closes her eyes like she's trying to savor the moment. When her brown eyes meet mine again, it's such a punch to the gut, I wonder how it took me so long to realize it. We don't need to use the word. Not if it bothers you. I just want to know that you're as crazy about me as I am you. That we're in this together. Did I mention I'd skip food for you? Her lips part into a happy grin and my chest tightens. One last thing. I hop up onto the table and clear my throat. Genevieve Scott, will you be my girlfriend? People are staring and snickering. Ginny's cheeks go red with embarrassment, but she nods. Of course I will. I'd skip food for you too. I jump down and kiss her again, then pull back so my forehead rests against hers. 
I had no idea it was ever unclear that you were my girlfriend. I've always thought of you as my girl. I'm sorry that I left any room for doubt, but I won't make that mistake again. I'll stand on this table and ask every day if you want me to. I'll consider that. Could be entertaining. She laces her fingers with mine. Speaking of food, though, is that for me? She tips her head to the bowl of ice cream. I push the tray toward her, a huge bowl of Neapolitan ice cream topped with gummy bears. That is a lot of gummy bears. How did you get ice cream at this hour? I know people. Her gorgeous smile will be the death of me. She picks up the spoon and brings a big bite to my lips. I take it and then kiss her again. Maverick appears at the table. Oh, look at you two, all smiles. He drops his tray and then drapes an arm around each of our shoulders. Bring it on, you two crazy kids. I'm so dang happy I could cry. Way to go big, buddy. He nudges me with an elbow and then squeezes Ginny into his massive frame. I love you too. And I know he does. Whatever it means to him, he means it with his whole heart. It's freeing to know I get to make it mean whatever I want to, too. Love you too, Mav, I tell him. He gives me a toothy grin. Damn straight. Chapter 41 Jenny. One week later. I have to go to class. I'm going to be late, I protest, but make no move to actually go anywhere. Heath's arms are wrapped around me and I nuzzle into his chest, stealing some of his warmth. It's so cold. This isn't cold. It's like 40 degrees outside. Like I said, this isn't cold. Wait until you come to Michigan sometime in the winter. You'll need real winter clothes, not these cute accessories you have. He pulls my beanie down farther so it completely covers my ears. It would be fun to see snow. It almost never snows here, and when it does, it's gone too quickly to appreciate it. Another chilly breeze whips through campus, and I shiver. Come on, baby doll, he says. Let's get you to class where it's warm. As we're crossing to the humanities building, a guy headed toward us slows, and a big smile tips up his lips. Heath stops, as does the guy. Heath, hey! Wes! Heath steps forward and they hug. Wes is a few inches taller than Heath, with lighter hair and a leaner build. He looks familiar, but I can't place him until Heath turns to me and introduces him as one of the coaches of the basketball team and an old teammate of his brother's. Heath comes to stand beside me again. And this is Ginny, my girlfriend. My insides light up every time he calls me that. Wes nods his head to me in greeting. Nice to meet you, Jenny. You too. What are you doing on campus, old man? Heath asks. Shouldn't you be at the gym making guys run sprints or something? Not for another hour. His smile is big and his eyes crinkle up at the corners. I'm meeting Blair for lunch. He takes a step past us and turns. Hey, nice season, by the way. I'm hoping to make another game soon. Nathan's coming up in two weeks for the game against Western Michigan. Yeah, I'll have to call him and give him some shit for not telling me himself. I'll see you later. He heads off in the opposite direction, and Heath and I continue across campus. I slide my glove-covered hand around his and squeeze. Coming over tonight? He asks, swinging our arms lightly between us. Yeah, but I need to do some laundry first. I've barely been at my dorm all week. I don't see a problem. Should just pack your stuff and bring it to my place. I slow. You'd give me a drawer? I'll give you as many as you want. I laugh lightly at how easy it is for him to share himself and his space. Although that's not really new. Heath may not have experience in being a boyfriend, but he's always gone out of his way to give me anything he thought I might want. But all I really want is him. No one has ever made me happier, and I've never had more fun than when I'm with him. It wasn't exactly my plan to fall for someone first semester, but I can't wait to see what new adventures the next one will bring. Mav, these burgers are amazing, Reagan says with a groan of pleasure. They really are, Rhett adds. I bow down to the grill master. 
Mav waves his hand and dips his head in a mock bow. The guys bought a patio heater, and we're outside having dinner. Me, Heath, Adam, Rhett, Maverick, Dakota, and Reagan. We're like our own little dysfunctional family. My brother is leaned back, beer in hand, smiling as everyone eats and talks. He seems happier. I know our parents' separation hit him hard, but I think he's coming to terms with it. So am I. Things will look different now, but at least we've got each other. It's so weird to think that if I'd come to college with Brian, so many things would have been different. But the thing I'm the most thankful for is how close Adam and I are again. Heath and I huddle under a blanket, eating and bumping shoulders occasionally since our hands are full. We should play sardines tonight, Rhett says as he crumples his napkin and sets it in the middle of his plate. We've got an odd number without Taryn, Adam says. You guys play, I'll hang back. What? No way, I protest. We can have three on a team. Mav needs two people to keep him in line anyway, Rhett nudges him. Who's going with Adam? Reagan, I say too quickly, and my friend's eyes get large as if she's afraid I'm going to out her. Mav helps cancel out some of Rhett's hiding skills. It's perfectly good logic, and Adam nods. Yeah, that makes sense. What do you say, Reagan? Sure, I guess that's okay, she says, barely looking at him. We head to campus. Heath and I are slower than the others, stopping to kiss every few steps and generally being the obnoxious happy couple. Who's hiding tonight? Dakota asks. Should be Rhett and Reagan, so let's go with Adam and Reagan, I say. Everyone nods their agreement. Playing matchmaker is way too much fun. What's the rule? I ask Reagan and Adam. They share a look as they try to decide. You pick, Adam says to her. One person has to close their eyes and be led by their partner or partners. She says the last part, looking at our group of three. All right, let's do this. Adam's breath shows in the cold air, and he claps his hands together before he and Reagan head off to hide. I've got the time, I call as we all settle in to wait. The ground is cold, so we stay standing and form a small circle sharing our body heat. Heath's arms wrap around me from behind, and I lean back into his chest. You two are annoyingly adorable, Dakota says, as Heath leans down to kiss my cheek. While our friends make fun of us, good-naturedly, of course, Heath keeps right on hugging me, and I soak it up. Him, our friends, all of it. Don't be jealous, Dakota, Heath says, speaking near my ear. You've got two. Jenny only gets one. Rhett and Maverick attack her from each side, hugging her tightly between them. She squeals and bats at their chests, but she's laughing as they bounce up and down, jostling her around. Okay, okay. She finally gets free. Let's go find Adam and Ray. Close your eyes, Dakota. We'll lead you, Mav says. Not a chance. She shakes her head, making her light red hair toss around her shoulders. Rhett takes a step. Mav, close your eyes. Dakota and I will make sure you don't run into anything. Dakota gets on the opposite side of Mav from Rhett. No promises from me, she says before they start to guide him away. Heath sweeps my feet out from under me. Close your eyes, baby doll. I got you. I wrap my arms around his neck and let him carry me. I close my eyes, playing along, though I hardly see the point. Are you really leading me to find the others or taking me somewhere to make out? The last one sounds real tempting, but the sooner we find the others, the sooner I can take you home and make out with you in my warm bed. His lips graze against mine, and I lean forward to kiss him harder. He stops wherever we are, and his tongue sweeps into my mouth, warm and demanding. He pulls back way sooner than I want, but he doesn't move. Ginny, open your eyes. His voice is filled with wonder and excitement. His head's thrown back and he stares up into the sky. A tiny snowflake falls onto his nose. It's snowing! The small white flurries fall around us, slowly at first. Heath sets me down and I hold my arms out to the side. I love the snow. It always feels so magical. 
I can just make out Dakota's laughter and the guys shouting and know they're excited about it too. Keith and I walk toward them in the snow, joining them at the same time Reagan and Adam have abandoned their hiding spot. This is amazing, I say as I reach Adam. Right? I can't remember the last time it snowed like this in December. It won't last, I say sadly. Even by morning, it'll probably be gone. But it's here now. Rhett smiles and takes a seat on the ground. One by one, we all drop to the cold grass in the middle of campus. Maverick goes into his coat pocket and brings out a bottle of Mad Dog. I came prepared. It hits me, sitting here with my friends, people I can no longer imagine not being in my life. I found this amazing group of people in the hardest five months of my entire life when I needed them the most. And amidst my brother's friends. Who would have thought? But if I've learned anything since coming to Valley, it's that we can only really prepare for the small things. What to wear, what to bring on a trip, which direction to go. The rest is fate and luck. And I feel like the luckiest girl of all. June. Epilogue. Ginny. Do I look okay? I smooth a hand down my dress and turn in the mirror. Keith sitting on the bed waiting for me as patiently as one can while his girlfriend changes clothes five times. You look gorgeous. He stands and wraps his arms around me, meeting my eyes in our reflection. You don't need to be nervous. You've already met my family. I know, but it's not just your family. There are a bunch of people here this weekend, and I don't know any of them. You know me. Besides, I only know half of them myself. He brings his lips to mine in a quick kiss. Come on, I promise I won't leave your side. The hotel is huge and right on the beach in California where Nathan's fiance Chloe is from. Later tonight, we have the rehearsal dinner and tomorrow they'll say I do. Down in the lobby, Heath guides me to a long table where his brother Nathan sits with a group of guys. Nathan and Heath look a lot alike, same nose and same eyes. Heath's hair is darker and his build is bigger, although Nathan is a little taller. Nathan stands when he sees us, and he and Heath hug. You guys made it, Nathan says and smiles at me over Heath's shoulder. When they separate, Heath comes back to my side. We got in about an hour ago. This is gonna be fun. Nathan looks around at all the people and grins. Are weddings allowed to be fun? Heath asks, earning a playful glare from his brother. We're going to grab a drink. Baby Payne! One of the guys calls as we start to walk off. Grab me one, too. He holds up his empty glass. He has deliciously dark hair and a cocky smirk. He turns that smirk on me, and I go stupid. Who is that? I whisper as we get to the bar. Hey, now, no creeping on my brother's friends. I wasn't creeping, but damn, is he a model? He is happily married, young lady. I wonder if his wife gives him hall passes. Heath chuckles. Well, your boyfriend does not. I bite back a laugh as he pulls me into his side possessively. Heath and I grab a drink and head back to the table where I meet Nathan's friends, Joel, Wes, and Zeke. Watching Nathan and his friends reminds me a lot of Heath and his. They have the same easy way about them with all the teasing and competitiveness I've come to love. When their wives and girlfriends join us, I sit next to Heath, his hand around the back of my chair, missing our friends and wondering what we'll look like in five or ten years when the whole group of us gets together. I hope it looks even half as happy as this. Nathan and Chloe are the picture of excitement and love as she sits on the edge of his lap and absently plays with the hair at the nape of his neck. I don't think she's stopped smiling since she sat down. Joel, the one I'm pretty sure could have a second career in modeling, looks at his wife Katrina like she's the center of his world. And she looks at him the same way. Every time he looks at me, I blush. I can't help it. He's stupid hot. Zeke and his oh-so-very-pregnant wife Gabby are possibly the cutest couple I've ever seen. 
She's all big blonde hair and tiny body except for her bump. Zeke's at least twice her size and keeps reaching over and touching her stomach. I don't even think he realizes he's doing it. Wes, who I've met before, and his girlfriend Blair are currently in the hot seat. They're the only couple of the group that isn't married and their friends are poking at Wes to get on the ball. Blair doesn't seem to mind. She leans over and kisses Wes, and they share some sort of private exchange. I'm fighting a yawn, and Heath notices. He sits forward. I think we're going to take a nap before the rehearsal. We were up at dark 30 this morning to get here. Heath takes my hand, and we start toward our room. Don't be late, Nathan calls after him. Heath rolls his eyes and yells back, I know how to tell time and work an alarm. I pull him to the elevator and up to our floor. How long do we have? I ask, climbing into bed and grabbing my phone to set an alarm. Heath takes the device out of my hands and places it on the bedside table. He pulls his dress shirt out of his pants with a wicked glint in his eye. I thought we were napping, I say as I unbuckle his pants. We will, but first. He shrugs out of his shirt and my hands slide up his abs, enjoying the way the muscle cords and dips. Yeah, I'm suddenly not tired either. His body covers mine and he kisses me hard. He rolls us so I'm on top. Making quick work of undressing me, his hands come up to palm my breasts. They ache. My entire body does. That's the way it is with Heath. One touch is never just one touch. He touches me and I feel it in my soul. It's all foreplay, he said once, and I think he was right. My body sings when he's near. I keep waiting for the newness to wear off, but the more time we spend together, the more convinced I am that what we have is a once-in-a-lifetime type of love. I guide him inside of me, and we both groan. This, this feeling, it's completeness, it's connection, it's everything. The next morning, I shower and get ready to meet up with the girls. Chloe and Nathan's mom, Lana, invited me to join them for hair and makeup. You're leaving now? It's barely noon, Heath protests, arms wrapped around my waist as I comb out my wet hair. Last night's rehearsal dinner went late. I'm not sure how many people they invited, but with their family and friends and Nathan's teammates, there are a lot of guests here to watch Nathan and Chloe exchange vows. In a whirlwind of excitement and drinks, I met a lot of them after the rehearsal dinner. We closed down the hotel bar and then continued to hang out on the outdoor patio for well into the early morning hours. So the only thing we've done this morning is lie in bed. Not that I'm complaining. Spending all day in bed with Heath is one of my favorite activities. Yes, I'm leaving now. Don't make that face. I don't want to be late. Fine. Reluctantly, he loosens his grip. You're lucky I didn't tell Chloe you're a better makeup artist than the one she hired. My jaw drops. I would maim you, Heath Payne. It's the biggest day of her life. My pitch rises with the panic I feel just imagining it. Relax, baby doll. Your secret's safe with me. He drops a kiss on my lips. I guess I should find Nathan and see what he needs from his best man. I kiss him again quickly and make my way to Chloe's suite. It's intimidating walking into the chaos. Chloe and her friends are chatting excitedly and fawning over her dress, which hangs in the corner. Gabby spots me from the chair she's sitting in and waves. She and the other bridesmaids are wearing matching pink robes, but Gabby's is shorter where it hitches up to cover her baby bump. I would get up, but the longer I sit today, the less chance that I'll have cankles when I stand up next to the blushing bride. You look beautiful. You totally have the whole glow thing going on. She rubs at her stomach. Thank you. Do you know if you're having a boy or a girl? Girl, she winces, and I think she's dribbling a basketball in there. Jenny, hey. Chloe hugs me tightly. Let me introduce you to everyone, and then your first stop for hair and makeup. Heath.
The guys are kicked back in Nathan's room, a bottle of Jack on the table between them. Couldn't spring for something a little nicer, I ask, as I take a seat next to them and pour myself a glass. Old school baby pain, Joel says. It was this or Everclear, and I don't think Chloe would appreciate your brother passing out before the ceremony. Nathan wears a sheepish smile as he tips back another small sip. A knock at the door gets him to his feet. Link, Nathan calls as he holds the door wide and my boss walks in. I stand to greet him as well with a hug. Hey, I didn't know you were coming. Wouldn't miss it. He steps back and looks me over. How have you been? Good. Great. He met a girl, Nathan says as if that clarifies why everything is great. I guess it does. Man, I hand you over to Wally for weekly check-ins and I miss all the good gossip. When I first started working with Lincoln and his sports coaching website, we talked weekly. I reported directly to him. But the busier he's gotten, the less frequent our calls have been. I'm also pretty certain that the only reason I was reporting to him was so he had an excuse to check in on me. I'd like to think he and Nathan have finally started to trust that I can take care of myself and are giving me more credit. Is Kira here too? Nathan asks. She killed it at the tournament last weekend. She is? He beams with pride, talking about his pro-golfer wife. The room becomes a back and forth of questions and cross-conversations as everyone catches up. When Nathan gets up to get another bottle of liquor, I follow him. Hey, I have something for you. Yeah? He abandons the bottle on the wet bar and takes the box I hold out for him. Wrapped it myself, I say as he pulls back the flaps of a battered box I reused from my collection of care packages he sent. Grinning, he pulls the items from the box. Gum, breath mints, sunscreen, condoms, earplugs. What is all this? He asks with a chuckle and holds up the earplugs. A little honeymoon care package from me to you. Those are for Chloe, so when she's tired of your shit, she can tune you out. Thank you. I take out the smaller gift from my pocket. Your real present. He tears off the white paper and a ghost of a smile pulls one side of his mouth. Is this? Yeah. It's the same cologne Dad wore. I was walking through the store and the scent just hit me. I don't expect you to wear it. I thought you might like to have a reminder. Especially today. His hug is unexpected and tight. It takes me a moment to return the gesture, but when I do, there's a feeling like Dad's really here with us, or at least looking down and watching. Thirty minutes before the wedding is scheduled to start, we put on our tuxes and prepare to head down. Yo, Heath, can you do me a favor? Nathan approaches me, looking sharper than I can ever remember seeing him. I need to give Chloe her wedding gift before the ceremony, but I'm not supposed to see her. I take the present, covered not in wrapping paper but in college-ruled notebook paper with his writing all over it. I give it a little shake. What is it? It's not for you. He blushes, and now I really want to know what's inside. Can you get it to her or not? Yeah, of course. I find the girl's sweet and knock. When it swings open, my heart squeezes in my chest. Holy shit, babe. Heath. Ginny looks around. What are you doing? I'm still staring slack-jawed. Listen, Ginny on an average day is a knockout. She's generally casual, not a lot of makeup, hair straight, or pulled away from her face in a braid. She doesn't need all the extra stuff to be the hottest girl I've ever seen. But right now, hair in big waves, eyes lined with black, wearing a dress that pushes her boobs up and shoes that make her legs look twice as long. Heath. I shake my head. Fuck, you look... Fuck. She giggles. You look nice, too. I've been waiting for this day. She runs a hand along the lapel of my jacket. You in a tux is really something. Yeah? I step into her. I'm starting to see the appeal of weddings. What's that? Open bar and a night of fun while I try to figure out how to sneak you away without anyone noticing. You're ridiculous. You're beautiful. Five-minute warning! Someone yells from inside the room. Can you give this to Chloe? I don't want to go in there. It looks like a bomb went off. Yeah, I'll see you down there. She turns, but I catch her wrist and pull her back to me, taking her lips in a much quicker kiss than I'd like. Someday I'm going to marry that girl, but today it's all about Nathan and Chloe. 
The guys and I head down first. The hotel restaurant has a huge patio that extends out onto the beach, and there are flowers everywhere. In pots, hanging from the doorway, lining the wall. It's nuts. People are seated and waiting for the ceremony. The other groomsmen bring Chloe's mom and grandparents up the aisle. What do you say? I hold out my arm for my mom. Her eyes are already glassy. She's for sure going to cry, probably in the first thirty seconds. She lets out a breath and flutters her lashes a few times as if she's trying to stop the tears. Turning to Nathan, she regards us both. I'm so proud of the both of you. If your dad were here, he'd give some speech about baseball or fishing that somehow related back to life. But since he's not, you're going to have to make do with the girl version. Which is, Nathan asks, hands in his pockets. Just be happy. Life's too short. Her eyes are tear-filled again, but she smiles. He loved you two more than anything, and so do I. Nathan leans forward and kisses her cheek. I love you too, Mom. She slips her arm in mine and lets out a long breath. Okay, ready. I guide her up the aisle and to the groom's side. Ginny's sitting two rows behind the family. I shoot her a wink as we pass. Kevin stands from his seat when we approach. We shake hands and he smiles at Mom. He's a good guy, and I'm coming to enjoy having him around. If nothing else, I know he's been good for Mom. Today is one of those happy days when I can practically read Mom and Nathan's thoughts, all of us wishing Dad was here for our own selfish reasons. It's moments like these that will always remind us our family looks different now. She squeezes my arm and then slips hers out to take her seat next to Kevin. Mom. Wait. Her brows raise as she looks to me expectantly. I love you. My chest aches with emotion. Fuck, maybe I'm going to cry today too. Her eyes well with tears again and this time one slips down her cheek. I've waited too long to say the words to her, but I mean them now in a way I didn't before. Acceptance, forgiveness, or maybe it just took me growing the fuck up. She hugs me tightly. I clear the lump from my throat and take my place at the front. As the processional music starts and all eyes go to the back, mine go to Nathan, my mom, and then Ginny. My family. I couldn't imagine life without them. If that's not love, then I don't know what is. Maybe it's not supposed to mean the same thing to everyone, or maybe it is and it's about finding someone whose meaning matches yours. I don't plan on giving it a lot more thought. It is what it is, and that's good enough for me. Ginny glances at me, and it hits me in the gut, like it does every single time she's near. Our love matches, plain and simple. And it's the best thing to ever happen to me. Life is short. Be happy, and enjoy every moment. This has been Secret Puck, Campus Nights, Book One. Written by Rebecca Jenshak. Narrated by Joe Arden and Vanessa Edwin, both members of sag -Aftra. Produced by One Night Stand Studios. Post-production by Michael Straza. Text copyright 2020 by Rebecca Jenshak. Production copyright 2020 by Rebecca Jenshak. All rights reserved. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.
This is Audible. This is Bad Crush, written by Rebecca Jenshack, narrated by Lee Samuels and C.J. Bloom. Chapter 1 Reagan Cancer Today you might feel overwhelmed. Get over it. Seriously, everyone is overwhelmed these days. Don't stress or make any major decisions. Practice self-care, meditate, and reserve energy for exciting things coming later this week. You've got this. Few things are scarier than that moment when you wake up hungover and the events of the night before wash over you with sober clarity. My stomach twists and turns, and it isn't the bottle of wine I consumed late last night with Jenny. Though it probably isn't helping. Neither is the lack of sleep. We drank, laughed, crafted elaborate and daring plans, as one does when they're drunk, until our late night crept into the very early hours of the morning. I sit up in my bed and squeeze my eyes closed. My head pounds. Flakes of gold glitter dot my bedspread. Construction paper and markers are tossed haphazardly around the floor and on my desk. Several prototypes have also been discarded around the room. Hearts of varying sizes in six different shades of red. It's like the Valentine's Day card aisle and a Michael's store had a baby. And that baby threw up all over my room. Never underestimate the ingenuity of two girls after a bottle of wine. Oh no. No, 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 no. No more online dating. At least the guy from last night hadn't been 15 years older than his profile stated. What can I say? My standards are low. Expectations even lower. Thanks to several dates that ranged from boring to flat-out cringeworthy. I'm giving up on dating, focusing on my friendships, or whatever cliche thing people say when they cannot go on one more bad date. Besides, my friends kick ass. Case in point, last night, Ginny is always a blast. But after another failed date, my friend really came through for me, showing up within the hour ready to console me with wine and ice cream. I really should have known better than to get out of bed yesterday. My horoscope said I should look for the good in the worst situations. The good of last night's date, well... I'll figure that out when my head stops throbbing. The apartment is quiet as I walk out of my room to the kitchen. My roommate Dakota is already at class. If she'd been around last night, she would have stopped us. Damn her busy schedule this semester, working and taking 18 credits. She's the rational one in our friendship trio. Ginny is the optimist, I'm the dreamer, and Dakota is our dose of reality. I find my phone buried in the couch cushions and call Ginny. I need a little of that optimism right now. Good morning, she answers. Her voice is scratchy and less bubbly than normal. Are you at the guy's apartment? I peek out of the front door across the breezeway to our neighbor's door. No, I went back to my dorm when Heath left for conditioning this morning. I check the time. How long before it's over? They should be finishing up now. Sometimes they go a little over. Why? Why? Seriously? Why? Uh, the note! I whisper screech. She's still silent on the other end. Maybe I dreamed the whole thing. Nope, I'm not that lucky. I wrote Adam a letter last night, heart-shaped and covered in glitter, ringing any bells yet. Ooh, I forgot about that. She says like I didn't just tell her about my most embarrassing moment in recent memory. I mean, I remember now, but I'd completely forgotten. What did he say? I don't know. I haven't seen him. I'm hoping that he hasn't found it. If he has, I'm moving and changing my name. My skin goes clammy, and I take several deep breaths through my nose. So dramatic. Seriously? I don't think she understands how bad this is. I just told a man I like him via a drunken craft project. Nothing makes a man fall harder than a homemade secret admirer letter. Groan. I'm going over there to grab it before he comes back. Why? 
I thought you were ready to tell him how you feel. Do you really think a red heart cut out of construction paper with glitter is the way I should do that? She giggles. We were going for fun and heartfelt. My brother is a romantic. He's also a 21-year-old man. I don't think bedazzling the sentiment was my best laid plan. I think it's sweet. Well, when I decide to tell you how much I like you, I'll keep that in mind. I prefer chocolates. Helpful. What if he's already seen it? She asks. Then I'll send a postcard when I get settled in my new town. I have to go. Relax. If he saw it, then he finally knows. And if not, then we'll figure out another way to tell him. You have to tell him. Promise me you'll never let me craft for a man again. I can't promise that. Two glasses of wine and my judgment goes right out the window. Again, helpful, she laughs into the phone. Text me and let me know how it goes. After saying our goodbyes, I toss my phone back on the couch and cross over to the apartment where Adam, Heath, and Rhett live. I try the door, finding it thankfully open. The living room is empty and quiet as I rush toward Adam's room. Their apartment has a similar setup to mine in Dakota's place, with bedrooms on either side of the living area. Heath and Red are on one side, and Adam on the other. I glance over my shoulder toward the hallway that leads to the other bedrooms to make sure Heath or Red aren't home. As I get near the closed bathroom door, I hear the shower going. Crap, he's here. My heart races as I hurry into Adam's room. His scent temporarily stops me in my tracks. Old Spice deodorant and Calvin Klein cologne. I'm not some sort of creeper. It's just that he's worn both as long as I've known him. There are always at least two different scents of the deodorant on the vanity in the bathroom right next to the cologne. Obsession, which stuck with me for obvious reasons. The next thing that causes me to freeze is his bed. His white sheets are rumpled, covers thrown back. My imagination runs away from me, creating vivid and amazing scenarios that include the two of us wrapped up in those sheets. Sweaty, but like that glowy, dewy look, not gross sweat. My crush on Adam knows no respectability. For the past two years, I've had it bad for my neighbor. He's just everything. Smart and sweet, caring, protective. He could easily be a conceited jerk. I mean, the guy is seriously hot. He's the captain of the Valley University hockey team, and he's ridiculously smart. Like straight A's pre-med smart, but he's not conceited or a jerk. Sure, he's a bit of a playboy. He jumps from girl to girl, but not the same way his friends do. Adam is a relationship guy. He goes all in with every girl. Those relationships just don't seem to last very long. He was with his last girlfriend for just over three months. Three very long, heartbreaking months, for me, at least. Giving my head a shake, I scan the room for the note. We slid it through the crack at the bottom of the door sometime very early this morning. A vision of Ginny and me on all fours giggling and shushing one another as we pushed my heart-shaped confession through to the other side makes me wince. What the hell was I thinking? I find myself on all fours again, desperately searching for it. A trail of glitter leads me toward the bed, and I reach under it, feeling around. I pull out a dirty sock, which I fling toward the hamper, and then the letter. Score! Oh, dear Lord. The nightmare version did not do it justice. It's huge and gaudy. The heart is lopsided, one side bigger than the other. My normally neat penmanship is sloppy. I have a vague recollection of acknowledging that and saying it was my passion that couldn't be contained in a tidy manner. Adam, my heart is yours, Reagan. With another groan, I fold it three times until it fits in my palm. That line isn't even good enough for a Hallmark greeting card. No more wine, ever. Reagan? Adam's deep voice washes over me. I'm still on my knees. Quickly, I scramble to my feet and force a smile. I start to speak, but the wall of naked man in front of me renders me speechless. 
Fresh out of the shower with only a towel around his waist, he strayed out of every woman's fantasy. At six foot three, 215 pounds, yes, I've memorized his height and weight from the hockey roster because, hello, mad crush over here. Every delicious inch of him is chiseled. Jaw, chest, abs, and I'm only guessing on this one, ass. Water drips from his dark blonde hair. My gaze follows a slow trickle that dips between the valley of his pecs, down his six pack, and then is absorbed into the white terry cloth that hangs just below his waist. Cock blocked. Me and you both, little water droplet. What I wouldn't give to be a bead of water on his Reagan. Is everything okay? Yeah, perfect. My voice is tight and squeaky, sweat beads on my forehead, and between my boobs. Not the glowy sweat I was imagining happening in this room either. One side of his mouth pulls up. His smile is my undoing every time. He doesn't do it often, not that he isn't a happy guy. But Adam is serious and controlled. Even when he's having a good time, his smiles and laughs are few. Growing up like I did... His determination and the values he lives by speak to me in a way that I can't describe. It's as sexy as those rare smiles. What were you doing under my bed? Hazel eyes narrow, taking in the scene. Oh, I... My fist closes around the paper. I was looking for my scrunchie. I let Jenny borrow it. I thought it might be in here. A scrunchie? Like a hair tie? For my hair. I add dumbly and then comb my fingers through the tangly locks. Like the one on your wrist? He points. Right. Because why would I be looking for a scrunchie when I have one? Hiding my arm behind my back, I smile. It's my good luck scrunchie. It's black and has little gold stars on it. I haven't seen it, but I'll keep an eye out. Thanks. That'd be great. We're in an awkward stare off. Anything else? His hands go to his waist. He's literally waiting for me to leave so he can get naked. Move your feet. Flee. Go. Don't say another word. Unfortunately, my brain works in slow motion when Adam is nearby. Obviously, he's gorgeous. But it isn't his looks that make me dumb. It's just him. My crush is out of control. I've built him up so much over the years. No one can compare. Not even him. That's partly why I haven't told him. The other reason is far too self-deprecating to admit, even to myself. Nope. All good, I say finally. I lift a hand and salute him. A salute? Seriously? You've got a little... He stops speaking and steps forward. His hand grazes my cheek. With a thumb, he strokes my skin. I melt into his touch. My eyes flutter closed. Sweet, sweet nirvana. What is this? Glitter? He asks. Hmm? His hand falls away and I open my eyes to his finger in front of my face with a dot of gold. He's so close I could lick the water droplets off his neck. I refrain. Oh, yeah. I was crafting last night. Crafting, huh? Well, whatever you did... It must have been fun. Ginny was a mess this morning, hung over as shit. Adam moves past me and digs in his dresser. He pulls out jeans and a gray t-shirt, then socks and black boxer briefs. Right, a mess, like me. I'm suddenly acutely aware that I haven't washed my face or brushed my teeth yet this morning. My standard sleep attire is shorts and a t-shirt, so I'm not exactly undressed, but I sure feel naked and unworthy standing here. I'm still gawking, too, which is about to get uncomfortable as he reaches for his towel again. Are you sure you're okay? You're acting weird. I'm good. All good. My voice lowers like I'm some sort of suave dude. I wave him off, and the red heart falls from my hand and tumbles like a weed toward his feet. He picks it up and looks over the red square. Some of your crafting? What is it? He starts to unfold it, but I snatch it from his hands. It was a rough concept of an idea that didn't really work out. If you did it, I'm sure it's great. 
The compliment warms my insides. Everything he says is so perfect. Thanks, Adam. I should, I motion with my head, leave before I make this any more uncomfortable. One of those rare smiles tips up his lips. Later, Reagan. I hustle out of the apartment and back to the safety of my own. Dakota's back from class and standing in the kitchen throwing ingredients into the blender for a smoothie. The same one every day. Chocolate protein powder and a scoop of peanut butter. She adds peanut butter to everything. Buys it in bulk. I've had so many peanut butter sandwiches since we started rooming together freshman year, I can't even look at a jar of Jif anymore. Where have you been looking like that? She waves a peanut butter covered spoon in my direction. And without shoes. Retrieving a secret admirer letter. I run a hand over my messy hair again and then use my scrunchie to pull my hair back. Where is that black and gold scrunchie anyway? It isn't exactly lucky, but it is my favorite, and I haven't seen it in weeks. Oh, her brows lift. Sounds like I missed an interesting night. You have no idea. Chapter 2 Adam, I'm broken. A hot girl is sitting on my lap, and the only thing I can think about is how her bony ass is digging into my thigh. I try to adjust to find a more comfortable position without tossing her off my lap. She turns and smiles at me, bats her lashes. She's pretty, stunning blue eyes, a cute pixie haircut that few girls could pull off. My gaze drops to take in the skin-tight dress that molds to her curves and stops mid-thigh. Nope, nothing. I feel nothing. I really am broken. Being single isn't my jam. Sure, it's fun hanging out and drinking, flirting, but it all feels so shallow. I flirt with a purpose to get a girlfriend, and the one in my lap isn't really my type. Hey, she says for about the tenth time. That's all she says. One word, repeated. I can't tell if it's some sort of private joke we're supposed to be sharing, or if it's the only thought floating in her head. Hey, I pair it back. I don't get the game but I play along. She smiles and shifts, digging her tailbone into my thigh. Fuck, that hurts worse than taking a stick to the face. At least the ladder is over quickly, instead of this constant, unrelenting jab. I'm not this guy. Sitting around with a random girl I'm not interested in draped over me. Which is kind of the point lately. Whatever I've been doing isn't working. Four different girlfriends in less than a year. That sounds like a lot, even to my own ears. I like being in a relationship, but I can admit that something needs to change. Maybe shallow interactions are exactly what I need right now. The door to our apartment opens, and our neighbors, Dakota and Reagan, step through. It's just a small party tonight, but the living room is crowded. Hey, guys, Dakota says. She marches right in like she owns the place and motions for Maverick to move over so she can sit between him and Rhett. Maverick's dog Charlie lifts her head from where she lies on the floor at his feet. Hey, pretty girl. Dakota talks soft and sweet highly un-Dakota-like, to the dog. Reagan is more hesitant and polite than her roommate. She waves and scans the room, smiling at everyone and presumably looking for a place to sit. The only empty seat is next to me. I pull bony-ass girl, Leah, higher up on my leg to make room and find some relief from her tailbone, too. We've got room over here, I say to Reagan. Have a seat. 
She meets my gaze and then drops hers to the floor as she squeezes past us and sits as far away as she can. We've known each other for two years, but Reagan is sort of shy. I say sort of because I've seen her come out of her shell lots of times with Ginny and Dakota. But any time I've tried to talk to her, she's quiet and hard to get to know. I always found it ironic how timid she is in person, because on stage she's vibrant and alive. Did you find your scrunchie? I ask. What's that? She leans closer to hear me. Honey blonde hair falls over her shoulder and tickles my arm. Did you find your lucky scrunchie? No, but it's not a big deal. I'm sure it will turn up. She gets an embarrassed look on her face and pulls back. She has no reason to be embarrassed, though. I know how possessive girls can be about their shit. Finding her in my room... Searching under the bed for a scrunchie my sister borrowed. Not even the weirdest example I can come up with. Once, Ginny had a meltdown, complete with tears, when I borrowed her concealer. I was 17, and it was prom night. I needed a little extra coverage hiding a zit in the middle of my forehead. Anyway, Ginny caught me with her makeup, and she flailed and screamed. It's discontinued. That's the last tube. Then she didn't talk to me for three days. I tore my room apart this afternoon looking for it. You did? Her eyes, brown with light flecks, lock on mine and hold. Her lips pull higher, and her dimples come out to play. Leah shifts, making it harder for me to see Reagan. I didn't find it. Found some odd things, but no black scrunchie with gold stars. What kind of odd things? I think I might embarrass myself if I divulge too much. I inch closer. Well, now you have to tell me. I shake my head. Oh, no. You wouldn't share your bad artwork with me. Speaking of, I keep finding more glitter in my room. I went to class with it all over my face. I'm sorry. Reagan smiles shyly again, and a small laugh escapes her lips. It's cool, I... Hey. Leah snaps at her, cutting me off. Find someone else to hit on. I was here first. I guess she does know more words. But man, gotta say... Don't love being marked like a spot in the line for the bathroom. I also don't like anyone talking to my friends that way. Especially Reagan. She's so sweet and nice. The Reagan I know is gentle. Slow to jump into a conversation. And has never been one to get in the middle of an argument. Dakota is the outspoken one. Often speaking for the both of them. But she's across the room and oblivious. I'm slow to find my words, but I'm about to tell Leah she should find someone else to latch on to for tonight, when Reagan morphs into a badass. You interrupted him. Her tone is still quiet, but firm. Yeah, to tell you to get lost. Do you not see me sitting here? He's mine. I called Dibs, and I'm not going to sit here while you throw yourself at him all night and try to steal him. Reagan's mouth opens, her cheeks flush. I wasn't. I think it's time for you to go. I help Leah off my lap. Are you serious? Completely. Reagan's my neighbor and friend. I'm not cool with people treating my friends like shit. She gawks some more, as if she can't believe I'm really turning her away. Whatever. She adjusts her dress, pulling the hem down to cover more of her bare thighs. This party sucks anyway. She mutters something about hockey players being stupid, which feels appropriate after I said one word to her most of the night. 
Leah huffs all the way to the door and slams it shut behind her. The rest of the room doesn't even bat an eye. Girls running in and out of here. Sadly, it's not an uncommon occurrence. Well, that was interesting. I rub at my thigh with two fingers. Reagan's large brown eyes go between the door and me. Then her shoulders slump forward and she giggles. Did that just happen? I think so. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to scare off your date. Eh, it's okay. You wouldn't believe how bony her ass was. I think I'm gonna have a bruise on my leg. Somehow, I think you'll survive. Probably. I definitely need a drink, though. Want something? Her eyes fall to her lap. Sure. In the kitchen, I pour Reagan a glass of wine and grab myself a beer. She's reverted back to looking timid and unsure. Quiet. Now I know she has some fight in her. I want to see it again. You were scrappy back there. Mean girls are the worst. Old wounds, I guess. I can't imagine why anyone would be mean to Reagan. Aside from generally being one that hangs back out of the center of attention, she's just so sweet and good. She has a way about her that makes people want to be friends with her. I know that's how it was for me. The second I saw her, I wanted to talk to her and find out more about her. Being ridiculously hot probably had something to do with that too, if I'm honest. Two years later, and I don't know as much about her as I should for the amount of times we've hung out. Leaning against the counter, I scan the living room. Guys from the team and the group of girls that tend to follow are piled into the tight space, watching the Coyotes play Vegas. I've never dated from the Jersey Chaser pool, and now I'm remembering why. They outnumber us, and more than one seems to have noticed that Leah left. Since you scared off my date, I think you're going to need to stick with me. Reagan looks to the girls eyeing me up like a prize. Why's that? She bats her lashes, playing it all innocent like she doesn't know why. I think the two next to Ginny are playing rock, paper, scissors to decide which one gets to make a move next. That's weird, right? Yeah, that's weird, she confirms. If only I had someone else to be my date tonight. I tap my chin. Keep the crazies away. Date, friend, bodyguard. Her dimples pop out, and she gives me a big, wide smile. Oh, I see. You want me to be your beard. You're too beautiful to be anyone's beard. Let's go with date. Ginny walks into the kitchen and looks back and forth between us. What are you two talking about? I grab her a hard seltzer from the fridge and toss it to her. Reagan's my date for the night. He's joking, Reagan says quickly. He's hiding out. I think it's a great idea. You two would be adorable together. My sister beams. All right, easy on the booze, Reagan says to her. Remember last night? Yes, I do. Do you? Ginny volleys back. They share some sort of look that I can't decipher. Baby doll, Heath calls to Ginny from the living room. You're too far away. Gotta go, she says, and skips off toward her boyfriend and my roommate. It's easy to see that Heath is crazy about her. But I'm still not loving that my baby sister is dating one of my teammates. Not that she asked. She didn't. My little sister is in a relationship and I'm... I don't know what this is I'm doing yet. If it's playing the field, then I suck at it. And I don't enjoy sucking at anything. They seem happy. 
Reagan watches them over the top of her wine glass. Yeah, I think they are. You don't look as angry as you did a couple of months ago when you're in the same room as them. As long as he doesn't hurt her, we're good. You should try saying that with a smile. My jaw loosens. Shit, I do sound like a grump. What about you? No date tonight? So that must mean last night's blind date was a dud. How did you know? She nods her head and glances at my sister. Ginny? Yeah. Before she rushed out of here last night, taking my wine, she mentioned something about your date ordering a salad for you. He was a Scorpio. I should have known better. I don't need a man to order for me. And if he does, it better be something chocolate. Also, the wine was delicious and more than made up for my bad dinner. So thanks for that. I'm grinning at her. This might be the most I've ever talked to Reagan, just the two of us, and the most she's ever said about herself. One of the girls that came over with Leah comes into the kitchen and steps closer than necessary. Her friends wait behind her. Our kitchen isn't that big. She could stand on the other side of it and we'd be close enough to whisper. I wonder if she won rock, paper, scissors. And if so, what she won with. Can I ask that? Adam, you have to come outside with us. We're going to play flip cup. She takes my hand and tugs. Sorry, I don't budge. I don't want to ditch my date for the night. Date? Her voice climbs, and she searches my face. I look over her head to Reagan and give her my best pleading eyes. Sorry, girls. She sweeps in front of them and nuzzles into my side. Tonight he's all mine. I even had to fight for him. She says that last bit with steel in her voice. Her hand gently slides up my stomach and rests on my chest. Well, that feels... nice. I thought you were just the neighbor, one of the girls says. It's a good thing one of us is an amazing actress. Reagan doesn't miss a beat. Is that what you heard? She laughs sweetly, just a hint of condescension. Okay. Well, since Leah left... We need one more anyway. Both of you have to join us. The girl motions for us to follow and steps toward the sliding glass door that leads to the deck. As soon as they're out of sight, Reagan jumps away from me. Sorry. Yeah, so am I. Sorry that she's no longer touching me. No, that was perfect. I tip my head toward outside. What do you say? Don't you think they'll figure out we're not really on a date? I take her hand in mine. Yep, definitely nice. No way. Not with Scarlett Johansson by my side. She grins. What about you? Well, I'm no Hollywood actor, so I'll just do my best to look like I'm not having too bad of a time with you. I tease. In truth, I don't worry for a second that we'll have a good time. And for the next two hours, we do. I have to say, being the center of Reagan's attention, I don't hate it. She's outspoken, funny, and she keeps touching me. Just little possessive moves every so often. Physical reminders for our new friends a squeeze of my bicep, a quick hug around my waist, linking our pinky fingers. You are ridiculously good at flip cup, I tell her after she pulls off the win for our team. Any more hidden talents? Hidden? Where do you think I practiced this talent? I nod. Right. Probably in this very spot. 
She steps to me, so her tits brush against my chest, and she places her hands loosely around my neck. Without hesitation, my hands go around her back. You were usually standing on the opposite side of the deck, not paying me any attention, she whispers. There's no malice in her tone, but I still feel like an idiot for not noticing. I lean down until my lips hover near hers. I'm paying attention now. As the sky darkens, we give up on Flip Cup and sit with our new friends outside on the deck. It's cold out, the heaters are going, and I brought blankets outside to help keep us warm. The girls may have been interested in me to start, but it's Reagan they're fawning over now. She's sitting next to me. A blanket covers our legs, and my hand rests on her thigh over the soft material. Winona and Sage, two of our new friends, lean forward and are touching her hair, complimenting her, and basically just totally girl-crushing. You two should come with us to Theta for the after-hours party. Oh, uh... Reagan looks to me. I think we're going to pass tonight, I say, and squeeze Reagan's leg. They prepare to leave, and Winona and Sage take turns hugging Reagan. You two are so cute together, Sage says. She's trying to say it so that only Reagan can hear, but her drunk whisper isn't quiet at all. The cutest, right? Reagan says. She waves as they go back through the apartment to leave. When it's just the two of us left outside, Reagan lets out a long breath and slumps back into her chair, giggling. Wow. Thank you for that. Standing ovation-worthy performance. The few stragglers that haven't left or gone to bed are inside in front of the TV, watching Rhett and Heath battle it out on the Xbox. You're welcome. She's stopped acting now, and I can feel her growing more distant. I had a really good time tonight. I'm sorry if it was weird for you. I really didn't expect that to be an all-night performance. No, it's fine. I had a good time, too. The wind blows her hair into her face, and she brushes the strands back. Can I ask you something? Anything. Why were you avoiding the girls so hard tonight? You and Taryn broke up months ago, and as far as I know, you haven't dated anyone since. Except you now. I tip my beer toward her and then take a drink. You know what I mean. A real date, and hookups don't count. Those girls were pretty nice. Are you still hung up on Taryn? Are you politely asking me why I haven't jumped into another relationship already? Because the guys have been giving me shit. No need to tiptoe over my feelings. I know I have a reputation for going from one girlfriend to the next. It's more than a reputation. You haven't gone more than a few weeks without a girlfriend in all the time I've known you. I hesitate, nodding. I don't know if that's true. I've never really tracked it, but it's not far off. It's okay if you're not over Taryn. She was great. We all liked her a lot. She was. My last girlfriend was someone I thought I could picture a future with. But when she transferred schools at semester, we both decided it'd be easier to cut ties instead of trying to make it work long distance. I'm a romantic, but I'm also realistic. I like spending time with my girlfriends too much to be happy with a weekend here and there. It isn't Taryn. I'm trying to take some time. Be single. Plus, with this being my last year playing hockey, I really want to see it through and focus my energy there. Makes sense. Also, don't tell the guys I know. 
but they have a bet going on how long before I'm with someone new. Oh, I know, she says. Heath's out. He had one week. I guess between my buddies betting on me and the shit with my parents, it seems like a good time to break my usual cycle. I still get an ache in my chest when I think about my parents splitting up. They completely blindsided me. I thought they were crazy in love, even after all these years. Ginny thinks I'm taking it too personally, but it is personal. Everything I believe about love and relationships was based on watching them. They were so happy. Or so I thought. But what if you found someone you wanted to be with? Would bad timing stop you? No, I doubt I'd let anything stop me. The trouble is, I'm not sure if I trust my own instincts. I never get into a relationship expecting it to fail, yet they always do. It starts out fantastic, and then a month or six later, and suddenly everything just feels... wrong. Adam, I need to tell you something. Reagan angles her body toward me. Her eyes fall to her hands. She looks so serious all of a sudden. What is it? Seconds pass. My heart rate accelerates in anticipation. I... She starts, and then stands quickly. It's nothing. I should go. See you later. Reagan beelines inside, says something to Dakota, and then heads out of the apartment. Huh. Well, that was abrupt. What a weird fucking night. Good news, though. I'm most definitely not broken. Chapter 3 Reagan Committed cancer. You might be feeling bored with a complacent partner. Mix things up. Single cancer. This is the perfect time to join a pole dancing class or read a book on sex positions. You never know when the right guy will fall into your lap. All the usual suspects show up to open auditions for the spring play, mostly drama majors and a few that aren't, but who have done previous performances. We're clearly divided by the level of seriousness we bring. All the drama majors sit together on one side of the stage and the others on the opposite. As Dr. Rawson starts to explain the audition process to the newbies, a girl I don't recognize steps into the theater. The door slams behind her, and we all stare. She walks down the center aisle to the stage. I'm sorry I'm late, she says not quite meeting anyone's eyes. Dr. Rawson looks over her glasses impatiently. Are you here for auditions? She scans the stage, looking at all of us. I can see her gulp. Yes. Very good. Name? Mila. Have a seat, Mila. She lifts her clipboard. As I was saying, Director Hoffman and I will take auditions according to the sign-up. You'll come out, do your prepared monologue, or read from the script. If needed, we'll do callbacks at the end of the week. The cast list will be posted this weekend, and we'll start rehearsals next Tuesday. Any questions? She barely waits a second before ducking her head and walking toward the second row of seats. Let's get started. Everyone files off the stage except the unfortunate soul who got stuck with the first time slot. Dr. Rawson and Mr. Hoffman are both notoriously hard to impress. No one ever wants to go first, although their moods really don't improve much the farther along we get. And this is Mr. Hoffman's first time taking the director role, so I have a feeling he's going to be even harder to win over. Mila looks apprehensive as people push past her. I remember just what it's like to be the new girl. Hey, I say as I approach. I'm Reagan. I know. I mean, I'm kind of a fan of yours. I've seen every student performance for the past two years. Her smile is shy, but she talks fast and animated. Mila, nice to meet you. She follows me behind the curtain, 
There are a few chairs and props that people sit on. I keep going, passing by everyone and dropping my backpack in a corner. This is my little nook. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll go. No, wait. That isn't what I meant. Have a seat, please. I'm more nervous than normal. It would be nice to have some company. She lets her bag fall to the ground. You're nervous? I've never done this before. Really? Never? She shakes her head. Not in elementary school or summer camp? I thought everyone had done some theater, however unwillingly. That look on your face, she waves her hand in a circle dramatically, is not helping. Sorry, I offer her an apologetic smile. We don't get a lot of new blood around here. Are you doing a monologue or reading from the script? Mr. Hoffman is one of the few directors who lets us audition for a specific part. He still casts us however he feels best suits the show, but he at least pretends to take our preferences into consideration. I'm not sure, she pulls out a printed script. You? I hesitate to tell her. She'll know in a few minutes anyway. I'm reading the youngest sister's tantrum at the end of act one. Really? Her eyes widen and her mouth hangs open. That's so different from anything you've done. No kidding. I've been cast as the quiet, the serious, the average girl. But I've never played a comedic or silly role, and I've never been the lead. Both are out of my comfort zone, but I know it's just what I need to take my acting to the next level. I can't play the same role forever, quiet, hot girl. Besides, everyone is hot in Hollywood. I need more than looks and a few college plays under my belt to be taken seriously anywhere outside of Valley University. Assuming that's where I go next. I haven't made plans that far ahead, but I like to be prepared for anything. And I grew up on a steady diet of I Love Lucy reruns and cinnamon sugar toast. Comedic and silly was sort of my whole jam. My mom was not the most attentive parent. When I got old enough to feed myself, she stopped pretending she wanted to be home altogether. She was gone more than she was at home. I'd stay up late, partly waiting for her and partly too afraid to sleep, and I would watch whatever late-night TV I could get. My cell phone bill rarely got paid, but with a decent antenna, I could manage a few channels even when the cable got shut off. I got pretty good at taking care of myself, Lucy and others kept me company and helped me feel less alone. I probably learned more life lessons from TV parents than my own mother. All but the most important one. Not all mothers want to be a mom. I was thinking about reading a few lines for the middle sister, Mila says. She doesn't say a lot, but she's on stage quite a bit. Are you worried about memorizing the lines? I settle in with my script. Another thing I like about Mr. Hoffman, he gives us the script in advance of auditions. I've had it memorized for a week, but it's still comforting holding it in hand. Absolutely. It took me three days to learn my audition piece. I have no idea how you do it. It's easy. I promise. You'll be able to recite the entire play forward and backward before we're done with rehearsals. Don't be afraid to try for a bigger part. With that, we go silent, reading over the script and prepping. My audition time is before Mila's, so eventually I stand to gather my things. Good luck, she says. Thanks. Same to you. Looks like I'll be seeing you around. Hope so. When it's my turn, I head out to center stage. The lights are on throughout the theater today, giving it a completely different feel than our performances, where the audience is darkened and the spotlight illuminates the action. Reagan, Dr. Rawson glances down at her clipboard. When you're ready. Nerves I haven't felt in years make my voice shaky as I begin my audition. But no matter how anxious I am, there's a sense of peace standing center stage that I don't feel anywhere else. It's anonymity, while still being my most true self. Mr. Hoffman has a great poker face that never gives away his thoughts, 
but he has a slight tell in how quickly he writes. If he enjoyed it, he furiously scribbles, as if he's trying to get every feeling and thought down before he forgets. If he didn't feel it, he takes his time, the pen moving slowly across the paper. I close my eyes for just a moment, breathing between words, slipping farther into character, until I become someone else. The youngest sister is sassy and crass. She moves with a carefree demeanor. She's free of inhibition and wounds. She holds nothing back because she doesn't know just how cruel the world can be yet. She isn't the official lead, but her character will steal the show if done right. If only it were as easy to apply some of those carefree characteristics to my real personality. I'm fully confident I can pretend to be anyone. But when I'm me, well, it's not as easy to fake confidence. When I finish, I pause and hold my breath before I let my gaze land on Mr. Hoffman. He has his pen up to his mouth, poised between his teeth. Neither he nor Dr. Rawson speaks for several seconds, and the theater goes quiet, too quiet. He puts the pen down to his paper, but doesn't write. What does it mean when he doesn't write anything? I'm guessing nothing good. He shifts in his seat. Okay, thank you, Reagan. Let's take five, everyone, and then we'll resume where we left off. I step down from the stage, heart racing. Can I talk to you for a second? I ask, approaching them slowly. Without answering, they give me their attention. I know that it was a little rough, but I can do this. This being that role? Mr. Hoffman asks. I nod. I'm surprised you went with that character. I think you'd be a good fit as the older sister or any number of other parts. The oldest sister. The serious one of the three. A role I could perform without thinking. I really want a chance to prove I can do something different. This is the role I'm interested in. His brow furrows. Okay. I back away, not sure if I helped or ruined my chances of being cast. Thank you for your time. I meet Dakota at the track after both of our classes are done for the day. She's already running when I step through the gate. While I wait for her to come around, I stretch off to the side. She's moving at a ridiculously fast clip for as many laps as she's probably already done. She was a runner, is a runner, I guess but she's no longer on the track team. She quit after freshman year. Hi, how was the audition? She stops and checks her watch. She times herself to make sure she hasn't lost her edge. According to Dakota, just because she's not competing doesn't mean she shouldn't be able to on a whim. She's one of those people who could tell me she's decided to try out for the Olympic team, and it wouldn't seem all that crazy. She lets me set the pace as I fall in beside her, a much slower jog than she's capable of. I'm here solely because I know I need to do something to offset my other unhealthy habits. I dislike exercise only slightly less than giving up junk food. He didn't write anything. I think I shocked him. Shock can be good. Her red ponytail sways with each bouncy step. Who has bounce in their step when jogging? My feet shuffle along the ground. I hope so. I push down that uneasy feeling, reminding me that it's entirely possible. I'll be working backstage on this one. Why were you so late getting in last night? You mean after you were outside getting cozy with Adam and then freaked out and ran home? I already told you, we were pretending. And I was tired. Don't turn this around on me. Sadly, my whereabouts aren't as exciting as you and Adam flirting. I went with Maverick and Jordan on a taco run that lasted forever. A lot of people want tacos at two in the morning. So, did you finally tell him? Dakota asks with a smile that takes over her face. My friends are entirely too invested in my crush on Adam. For almost two years, I was able to hide it from everyone, and those were much easier times when no one was dissecting every interaction I had with him. No, I was his fake date so the group of puck bunnies that came over with Jordan wouldn't harass him. Okay, she says the word slowly, 
since when does Adam shy away from female companionship? I feel myself getting defensive of him. He wants to take some time between relationships before he jumps into something new. How is fake dating you for a night different than letting some random girl hang on him? She huffs a laugh. Leave it to Adam to figure out a way to not date but still date. Was it awful fake dating a guy you have a massive crush on or amazing? I can't decide if it's tragic or exciting. I went into the zone. I barely remember it. Mostly accurate, but I'm never going to forget the feeling of being wrapped up in his strong arms. Tragic. Definitely tragic. I'd hoped you'd finally told him. You have to tell him, Ray. I will. I am. I'm just trying to figure out how. I was so close to telling him last night, but I don't want to ruin everything. Easy. Go over there tonight and tell him. Blame it on last night if you have to. We need you to tell him. We? Yes. Even Rhett is starting to pick up on it. Oblivious Rhett. Besides, the sooner you tell him, the sooner you'll stop going out on dates with all of these losers. They aren't all bad. What about Hunter, the guy from my psychology class? He brought you dandelions in a Dixie cup. I thought that was sweet. If you say so. I think subconsciously you're saying yes to these guys you know you won't like, because you don't want to like them. You only want Adam. You're never going to move on until you tell him. Move on. The way she says it, as if the idea of us together is unlikely, makes my chest ache. Like I should tell him, let him laugh in my face, and then get over it. Okay, even Dakota isn't that cruel. But is that what she's expecting? I will tell him, I reassure her. I just have to find the right time. When we're done at the track, Dakota heads to work at the Hall of Fame, and I go back to our place. Adam's coming out of his apartment when I get to the top of the steps of our shared second floor landing. He's dressed in dark jeans and a t-shirt that hugs his broad shoulders. He tips his head when he sees me. Hey there, sexy girlfriend. What? My heart races and my brain short circuits. He waves it off. Sorry, I was referring to the other night. Thanks again for that. Could have used you earlier today in the cafeteria. I think finding a real girlfriend would be easier. I meant me, of course, but the look on his face makes it clear that is not where his head's at. Stupid, stupid. No, he should not find a real girlfriend if it isn't me. I swear I don't just put my foot in my mouth around this guy. I put the whole leg. He chuckles softly. Yeah, I guess I shouldn't complain. Most of them are nice. But I can't tell which ones are in it trying to help the guys win the bed or which ones actually might be interested. Mav is plain dirty to win. Hooking up with someone for a bet? He shakes his head. This is my window, maybe? Perhaps I'm overthinking it, and I don't need a perfect moment or perfect way to tell him. Any girl would be lucky to date you. I'm sure they're all interested. Speaking of... I've been trying to figure out a way to tell you something. You have? What? His hazel eyes soften, but he crosses his arms at his chest. Classic Taurus preparing to hold his ground. He must think it's something bad I want to tell him. While I organize my thoughts, the door to the guy's apartment swings open, and a shirtless maverick fills the doorway. Oh, God, you're still here, he says to Adam, he smiles at me and juts his chin. Yo, Ray. Hey, Mav. I wave with one hand. He looks to Adam. Can you grab some food while you're out? The pantry and fridge are bare. Dude, you don't live here. Go rummage through your own pantry for food. There's no bite to his tone. Adam shakes his head. Maverick lives downstairs in a single apartment, but he spends so much time at their place, he's basically the fourth roommate. Adam's phone pings. He pulls it out and then rolls his eyes as he reads it. Thanks for the great oral. Seriously? Mav cackles and throws his head back. You're the best, Scott. Get some of those little Debbie Swiss rolls. You know my mom has access to my Venmo, right? She's going to see you sent me $100 for great oral. 
then she'll be very proud of your oral game. Moms want their sons to give good head, right? Adam winces. Too far. Thanks, Scott. You really are the best. With a wink, he disappears back into the apartment. I would apologize for Maverick, but I'd spend my entire day doing nothing else. Adam smiles at me. What were you going to say before? It's nothing. I chickened out somewhere around the mention of good head. All right. He's slow to move. I guess I should go. Good to see you, Reagan. Inside my apartment, I bang my head against the closed door. I have to tell him, but not today. Chapter 4 Adam Be back here at 7 tonight to watch film. Take a nap between now and then if you need to, because if anyone dozes off, you'll all be skating laps. Coach looks at Rhett. My buddy is notorious for falling asleep while we watch game film. Colorado is going to be tough this weekend. With a nod, he dismisses us. Maverick ruffles Rhett's unruly blonde hair. Don't worry. I'm sure he wasn't talking about you. He snorts and looks to me. He totally was. It was two times, Rhett says, then adds, No, three. It's so warm in there, and the lights are dim. You must be a firecracker in bed. Carrie is a lucky woman. Maverick slicks back his dark hair with a comb. Do you guys want to go to the hideout? Rhett rubs his stomach. If I eat a big meal before coming back here, I'll definitely fall asleep. I'm having dinner with Ginny at the dining hall, Heath says. You're welcome to come. I can only take so much of you two in one day. No offense, buddy. Love you. But I'm starting to feel like the third wheel. Mav looks to me. Scott? I shoulder my bag. Can't. I have a meeting with Dr. Selko. I'm hoping she found a scholarship for me. Later, guys. After trekking across campus, I stop outside of Dr. Selko's office, then take a deep breath and let it out slowly. She's holding my future in her hands and she is not known for her bedside or office-side manner. Medical school is expensive. I don't qualify for aid, and if I don't want to end up in debt for the next 30 years, I need the scholarship she funds. One student is chosen each year. She's some sort of multimillionaire. Her dad, also a doctor, co-founded a pharmaceutical company that took off Anyway, the only detail that's important is that she has the ability to make my next four years of school a hell of a lot cheaper. I step into the doorway and then freeze when another student is sitting in the chair in front of her desk. Not just any student. Janine. Also known as the bane of my existence. Sorry. I check the clock on the far wall. I thought we were meeting at five. We are, she waves me in. Have a seat. The only available chair is crammed into a corner and has a stack of medical journals in the seat. I hesitate, avoiding Janine's gaze. We've been duking it out for the past three years, both pre-med, both at the top of the class. Both hate to be outdone. You can set those on the bookcase, Dr. Salco instructs. Once I'm finally squeezed into the small chair, she starts. Thank you two for coming. I won't mince words. Choosing a recipient for the department scholarship has been difficult this year. You're both straight A students, hardworking, and each juggling your own extracurriculars on top of school. Your professors have wonderful things to say about you. 
Both of your recommendations are top-notch. In short, it's been an impossible task deciding between the two of you. And here I thought I was the clear choice. Sure, Janine is smart and gets good grades, but she relies too much on her book smarts and being ultra-prepared and organized. Not that those things aren't important, but being a doctor requires you to be ready for anything, to think on your feet. What does that mean for the scholarship? I ask. You're not going to make us split it, are you? I need that scholarship more than Adam does. Half isn't enough, Janine says. Dr. Salco raises a hand to silence us, which is great because I need to keep my cool and that's impossible when Janine spouts off. She has no idea what I need. No, the rules are clear that only one student can be selected, but to help the committee choose, we'd like you both to join us for the scholarship banquet. Tell us in your own words why you should be chosen. You want us to give a speech? I sit forward and swallow thickly. How long should the speech be? And are there any guidelines for content outside of why I'm a better candidate? Janine takes notes on her iPad. I grind my teeth at her eager and prepared attitude, then unzip my backpack for a pen and paper. Five minutes is plenty. The focus should be on your accomplishments and plans for the future. The committee is made up of doctors and professors who have been in your shoes. Make your case. Her mouth pulls into a tight-lipped smile. I will email all the details, she says to me as I continue, elbow deep in my bag, rummaging for something to write on. Thank you, I mutter quietly. Once she dismisses us, I walk out feeling a lot less optimistic than when I arrived. Janine is a step behind me as we exit. Neither of us speaks until we're outside of the building. Don't look so down, Adam. Sweet-talking women is your specialty, right? She rolls her eyes. I doubt that's going to work, considering the committee is 60% male. I fire back. Also, I don't sweet-talk women. Sure, whatever you say. At least you don't have to worry about all the old men who still think women should be nurses instead of doctors. Yeah, that definitely sucks. I've seen it firsthand in a couple of classes, too. Extra help, pulling me and a few other guys aside after class to make sure we're doing okay, and probably other instances that I didn't even pick up on. I level with her. I need that scholarship. So do I. I'm already in debt from undergrad. I was lucky that I got a full-ride scholarship for hockey, but it's nothing compared to the total we'll need for medical school. What do you think they're going to be looking for in our speeches? She asks. I don't know. I glance around the campus screens, mind racing. Assurances that we won't drop out, probably. Or flunk out. Do you want to get together to work on our speeches? She asks, sounding like she'd rather not. You know, most people wouldn't share their plans with the enemy so willingly. She mutters something under her breath that I don't catch, then says, If I win, I want to know it's because I'm the better candidate. Well, when I win... You can extend that same line of thinking and know I'm the better candidate. Your ego is obnoxious. She takes a step down the sidewalk. Tomorrow, after biochemistry? I'll be there. The following afternoon, I slide into a chair opposite Janine at a table on the second floor of the library. She's already got her laptop open and a printed draft of her speech sitting beside her. I worked on it all night. It's rough, 
but I tried to hit three main points. I pick it up and scan multiple pages. Jesus. I haven't even started. I drop it to the table. Okay. Let's hear them. Point number one. I'm an exceptional student and dedicated to the medical field. I have an example of my work with the crisis line. Point number two. All the reasons why I want to be a doctor and the justifications for why I think I'll be good at it. I won't bore you with my life story. Gonna hear it eventually anyway. And point three. My goals and promises for the future as it relates to being a doctor. Not bad, I say. Not bad at all. Not bad isn't good. She sounds offended that I didn't love it. It's just that what you have planned is exactly what they're expecting. We both drone on about our qualifications and hopes and dreams. And then they choose based on what? Who they like better? That is the basic setup of this whole thing. They already know all this shit about us. I wave toward her papers. They've seen our transcripts, and probably our admission letters, too. She nods. Yeah. So what are you suggesting instead? I tap my pencil on the table. I'm not sure. All night? And that's what you came up with? She gives me a look like she expected as much from me. You know, you won't be able to glide through med school like you have the past four years. What does that mean? You show up unprepared. Always. Class, meetings, study group. And it works for you because you're smart and professors like you. I'm not unprepared. I thought we were meeting today to prepare. Instead, you overprepared, like you always do. I'm sorry if I don't wait until the last minute to do everything. As opposed to doing it three weeks before the professor assigns it, and then having to redo it because it was wrong. That was one time. And I was going out of town. I was trying to work ahead. She throws her arms up. Admit it, Janine. We're different. And that's fine. Your speech is totally you. And I'm sure it's great. I'm just not sure that's the format I want to go with. Maybe going different directions is best. It'll show them who we are at our core. Maybe. Just as long as you don't get up there and regale them with tales of your heroic performance on the hockey team. Dr. Salco hates hockey so I doubt that would help me. Something about it being responsible for too many injuries, yada yada. I mean, that's why we wear pads and helmets. All right. Will you at least read over my speech and let me know if it sounds okay? Of course. Email it to me. I'll send you mine when I figure out what I'm going to write. I'll be looking for it the day before the banquet then. Janine starts to gather her stuff into her backpack. So much for getting together to prepare. But I have a better idea of what I don't want to do now. Are you going to the mixer? Haven't decided. You? She shrugs. That's a yes. What else do you think they'll be judging us on? She asks as we take the stairs to the first floor. Everything, probably. Are you bringing a date to the banquet? My boyfriend, Sean, is coming with me. What about you? Nah. I think I'll fly solo for the event. Unless my sister wants to tag along or something. She frowns. What? I could be wrong, but I get the feeling Dr. Salco likes that I'm in a serious relationship. She told me once that the only reason she got through school without being evicted from her apartment for forgetting to pay rent or utilities was because her husband took over the bills and everything else so she could concentrate only on studying. 
She told you that? That's so personal. Also, I can't picture her young or married. The professors pat you on the back for a good game, and they let personal things slip to me. We each have our secret weapons. Well, thanks for the tidbit. I'll take my chances. Maybe they'll think being single is a pro for me. Fewer distractions. Janine looks behind me and smiles. Heads up, she says without switching her gaze. I open up my stance to Dr. Salko coming along our path. Good to see you both. Did you get my email? Yes, ma'am, Janine says. I included the details for the mixer tomorrow night. It isn't mandatory, but it might be nice to get to know the committee before giving your speeches at the banquet next month. I nod. We're looking forward to it. Dr. Salko smiles that pursed lip upturn that I can never quite read. Will your boyfriend be joining you? I so enjoyed getting to meet him at the department party. He reminds me a lot of my Michael. Having a support system is so important when you're in medical school. It can be really overwhelming. He will be there. And I agree, Janine says, smiling smugly at me. And you, Adam? Will you be bringing a date? A partner, friend, or family member are all welcome. Dr. Salko looks to me expectantly. I will, I say, keeping it vague. The one time in my life I don't want a date. Turns out I need one. Chapter 5 Reagan Today is the day. Seize it. Grab it by the balls. You know all those cliché sayings? Own them. The world is your oyster. Scared to start a new job? Do it anyway. Letting fear stop you from asking out your crush? Please. Who could say no to you? Whatever has been weighing on your heart, go for it. Today is the day. I tossed and turned all night trying to decide how to tell Adam, or if I should tell him. But this morning's horoscope couldn't be any clearer. There will always be a reason not to tell him. Lots of really good reasons, like he might not feel the same and break my heart. They are called crushes for a reason, after all. We're all going out tonight to the hideout, and I'm going to do it. I am. Probably. Hopefully. No, definitely. I pack tissues and wear waterproof mascara in case it goes badly and wear my favorite panties in case it goes very, very well. Are you almost ready? Dakota calls from the living room. She's always ready before me, 15 minutes tops. She's so confident in her choices, so unlike me, who changed five times before deciding on my favorite jeans and a cropped sweater. Two minutes, I yell back. Is Ginny riding with us? No, she went ahead with the guys. I shove my lipstick and mascara into my giant purse and take one last look in the mirror. Seize the day, I mumble under my breath. The hideout is a local restaurant and bar. It's the guys hang out on nights they want to get out without worrying about kicking people out of their place at a decent time. Get in, have a drink, talk to Adam, and then we'll see. It's loud and packed as we push through the bar area. The hockey team is at their usual table. Ginny stands from her seat next to Heath and throws her arms around my neck. You made it! She hugs me and then Dakota. I saved you both a seat. Maverick moves his legs off the two chairs. Coda, Ray, looking great as always. Dakota slides in beside him and then I take the other chair. The pitcher is passed our way and the waitress brings extra glasses. I glance around, looking for Adam. What's wrong? Jenny asks. I'm still sitting here, the pitcher and an empty glass in front of me. Do you want something besides beer? I can grab the server. I stop her. No, beer is fine. 
I was just wondering where Adam is. Sulking, Ginny says at the same time Rhett says, hiding from girls. That too, Ginny agrees. He's at the bar. Sulking about what? I pour a drink and try not to sound too interested. Ginny and Dakota know about my crush, obviously, but the rest of the group gives me a pass and at least pretends not to know. There's this scholarship. He thought it was a sure thing. She waves her hand around. He's fine. I think it's just everything with our parents, plus the breakup, and now this. He's had a lot going on, and you know how broody he can get. I do know although I've never known him to sulk and hide at the bar. My stomach sinks. Here I am, ready to dump more on his lap, when all he seems to need is a friend. I think I'll go check on him and buy another pitcher for the table. I fiddle with my hair and calm my nerves as I weave through tables and groups of people standing around to get to the bar. I follow it around all the way to the far right corner before I spot Adam. He's positioned behind a pole, and the cash register stand where all the servers work, the perfect cover for a guy of his size. Even so, he has two girls standing nearby sneaking glances. They're angled toward him, smiling, completely oblivious to his body language. It's easy for me to tell that he isn't happy to have been found. Elbows on the bar, his eyes are downcast into his beer. I second guess adding to his harem, but he glances over and spots me. A slow smile spreads across his face, and he sits tall. Reagan. I step between him and the girls. Hiding out over here? Just didn't feel like chatting. Right. Of course. That includes you, dummy. I'm just grabbing a pitcher for the table, and then I'll leave you be. Stay. I don't mind talking to you. He leans forward to speak to the girls on the other side of me. They're standing instead of sitting on the stool in front of them. Can we grab that seat, he asks. Then, without waiting for their answer, pulls it closer. The brush of his shoulder against my arm and the scent of his body wash does funny things to my stomach. Thank you. I sit and place my glass on top of the bar. Is everything okay? Tired. Have a lot on my mind. Basically, I'm shit company tonight, but the guys wouldn't let me stay home. Anything I can help with, you've already helped. He tips his head toward the girls on my other side. They've turned their attention to another broody-looking guy at the bar. Using me to avoid girls again? Not my intent, but also not a terrible idea. Is it really so awful having so many girls vying for your attention? No, of course not. I love girls and attention. Falling into something new would be as easy as breathing. It's my cycle. Trying to break it is much harder. Plus, I really do have a lot going on. Seems unfair to bring someone into that. And I suck at hookups. Maybe the next girl you date will be the one. Maybe, he snorts. You don't sound convinced. I'm not sure of anything anymore. He takes a long pull from his beer. Maybe the one is a myth. I don't think I ever said it, but I'm sorry about your parents splitting. That's tough. He nods. Are your parents divorced? Never married, but I'm not close to my parents like you are with yours. I didn't know. I don't talk about them much, I shrug. Dakota's more family to me than anyone else. He smiles. I get that. You two are close. So, what else is going on with you? The thing with your parents happened months ago, so that can't be the only reason you're over here brooding. It's this scholarship for medical school. They've narrowed it down to me and one other person. We have to go to these two events with the committee before they decide. Nerve-wracking? Yeah, no kidding. And if I wasn't already worried, I told the head of the committee I was bringing a date. And you know how I feel about those right now. Couldn't Jenny go? No, I already tried that. Heath's friend Lincoln is coming into town tomorrow night and they made plans. And I got a tip that the committee might be looking for someone who's settled down. Settled down? You're in college. 
seems a little old-fashioned, right? I know. It's probably not a big deal, but you don't want to risk losing because of that. I need that scholarship. But you also really don't want to go on a date right now. Exactly. I'm struggling to feel sorry for you on the dating front, I say. He cuts me a playful glare. I'm sorry, but just pick someone you trust and try not to make too big of a deal of it. It's just a date. Slowly, he nods. Yeah, you're right. Fuck. Thanks for listening to me bitch and moan and then telling me to get over myself. I smile. Is that what I did? You did. And I appreciate it. Do you want to order a pitcher and join the group? Sure. We make small talk while the bartender gets the pitcher. I thank her and stand. I thought he'd meant we'd both go, but Adam doesn't move from his stool. Aren't you coming? Nah. Go have fun. I'm going to finish this beer and then grab a ride home. I've got a date to find. Thanks, Ray. I pause, then finally force my feet to move. So much for seizing the day. Looks like I've seized it for someone else. I'm still up, sitting in the living room long after we get back from the bar. Dakota's in bed, so I keep the volume low on the TV. I'm only half paying attention anyway. My thoughts of Adam are interrupted only by my worries about the play. Cast announcements are in a few days, and I don't have a good gut instinct about it. A light knock at the door pulls me from the TV. It's so faint, I think it might be at the guy's place until it comes again. I get up and walk to the door quietly, then peek out the peephole to find Adam on the other side. Dressed in sweatpants and a t-shirt, his feet are bare, and his hair looks like he's been running his fingers through it. I glance down at my outfit, decide there's no time to change, and open the door. Adam, hey, what are you doing here? I wondered if I could talk to you. I know it's late. Did I wake you? No, I was up. Come in. He pads in a few steps and stops. Adam Scott is in my apartment. I can count the number of times he's been here on one hand, and never when it was just the two of us. Can I get you something to drink? I ask. And we stand awkwardly in the space between the living room and kitchen. No, I'm good. Okay, well then, do you want to sit? I get a glass and pour water from the tap, mostly to give myself something to do. Adam sits on the couch next to the spot I just vacated. Were you studying? No. I take a seat and fold my legs up underneath me. I'm a night owl. Late night TV is like comfort food for me. I prefer ice cream. He rests his hands on his knees. I apologize for barging in, but I couldn't sleep. And I had an idea. What if you were my date to the mixer tomorrow night? What? I spill the water, curse, then set it on the coffee table. Are you serious? Excitement and disappointment take turns soaring through my body. I was. I'm second-guessing myself right now, though, he says with a small laugh. He leans forward. But hear me out. We had fun the other night, and you're the best actress I know. Those girls totally bought it. So we do that except somewhere nicer with all my professors. I'm the only actress you know, and that wasn't exactly an Oscar-worthy performance. Playing flip cup and giving you a few flirty looks isn't the same thing as fooling a scholarship committee. We don't have to fool them. You will be my date. I hesitate. The water I just drank sits heavy in my stomach. I don't know. Maybe it's a dumb idea. I just thought of all the girls I could take on a fake date. You were the only one I trusted with the job. You get me. Get what I'm going through. His eyes are sincere and vulnerable. I want to say yes. Of course I do. But for as excited as I thought I'd be when, and if, Adam ever asked me out, I'm so thrown and torn about how my very real feelings might complicate the situation that I'm quiet for several moments. Will I be more disappointed if I go on a fake date with him or if he takes someone else? The answer to that is a no-brainer. What would I say if they asked about us? 
It won't be like that. No interrogations, just free drinks and mingling. I'll handle any questions that might come up. And as a bonus, I get to be the guy with the hottest date. Now you're just buttering me up. Is it working? His grin is boyish and charming, like I could ever say no to him. Yes, okay, I'm in. Seize the freaking day. Chapter 6 Reagan Cancer It's better to leave the party early than to be the last one standing. Walk away and leave them wanting more. The mixer is held in the back room of Araceli's. The restaurant sits up in the foothills, and the scenery from the wall of windows along the room is breathtaking. So is my date. Adam's wearing a classic black suit, and the combination of the suit with his longer hair is really working for me. It's definitely an added benefit of going on this fake date. He's serious arm candy, and tonight, he's mine. The event itself is amazing, too. These doctors know how to do it upright. Small, high-top tables are set up all over the room. There's a bar on one side and a buffet on the other. It's also classy, so elegant, so rich. I, on the other hand, am a mess. Sure, I look good. Several hours of primping guaranteed that. But I'm so nervous that my hand shakes as I accept a drink from the bartender. I have to tell Adam tonight. I should have told him last night before agreeing to come. But I couldn't force the words out of my mouth. And a night out with Adam was too good to turn down. So tonight is the night. For real this time. Okay, now what? I ask as we make our way to the center of the room. How do you want to play this? Casual date? Serious date? He places a hand at my lower back. Relax. His touch pretty much guarantees that isn't possible. I need to know my part. If I don't turn on stage, Reagan, soon, I'll be this bumbling, anxious girl all night, and I am not going to spend the evening with the guy I've crushed on for two years, being shy and unsure. He ducks his head and speaks quietly so only I can hear. Just be you beautiful, talented Reagan. You went to a lot of trouble to bring a date for this event for me to be myself. It's possible that appearing to be in a serious relationship will help my chances, but that's a long shot, and I don't expect you to pretend to be in a relationship with me. I insist. Otherwise, I might as well duck out of here and leave you to fend for yourself. Please don't do that. I need at least one friend in my corner tonight. Then let me be both, your kick-ass friend who is also pretending to be in a serious relationship with you. If I can be anything but what I am, a girl on a fake date with her real crush, then this night will be a lot easier to get through. He looks uneasy, but a man steps to us and says hello to Adam, and then I'm on. Professor Pick, this is Reagan. Adam places a hand at my elbow to bring me into the conversation. Hi, it's nice to meet you. I shake his hand. He smiles and nods, but his attention goes back to Adam. Big game Saturday night. Yes, sir. We're ready. Good, good, he slaps Adam on the back. Congratulations on the scholarship. It isn't mine yet, Adam says, but here's hoping. You're a bright young man. The way he says it makes the whole thing seem so insignificant. But I know this is important to Adam. Speaking of, my date seems uncomfortable with all the praise. Adam's hand goes in his pocket, and his gaze falls to the floor every so often, especially when Professor Pick starts talking hockey again. I guess his discomfort with attention isn't just with eager girls trying to catch his eye. I finish my drink, and then hold it up. Adam notices, of course he does. He's a very good date. Well, looks like my date needs a refill. Yes, yes, of course. See you in class tomorrow. Thank you for that. Adam dips his head to whisper as we walk away. You're welcome. 
but I think I need to get water if I'm going to have to slam drinks to get us out of any more conversations. Let's hope that isn't necessary. I need to convince these people I'm the right person for the scholarship, not chat about the season. I've got you, I say. I order a water from the bartender, and we hang off to one side. Who's our next target? He chuckles. Take your pick. I need to talk to pretty much everyone in this room. Wow, this might be a long night, which I don't mind, but I feel a little bad for him. How about the woman on the far left, gray updo, gray dress, standing by herself? Dr. Hunt, is she a professor? She teaches biology. I've taken a few of her classes. She has great taste in shoes, love the red pumps. Has she ever asked you about hockey? He smiles. No. Great. Let's go say hi. I link my arm through his and do my best to ignore the shock of electricity zipping up my side. Dr. Hunt smiles as Adam and I draw near. Mr. Scott, good to see you. You too, Dr. Hunt. This is Reagan. Hi, I say and extend my hand. I love your shoes. Oh, she looks down after shaking my hand. Thank you. I didn't realize that students were invited tonight as well. Adam's throat works as if he's thinking about what to say. Only the two scholarship nominees, I say proudly. Right, right, of course, Dr. Hunt smiles. You've made it very hard for us to choose this year. It isn't often we have two candidates so equally deserving. Thank you. He shifts his weight from one leg to the other. Her gaze flits back to me and narrows. You look familiar. Are you pre-med too? Oh, gosh, no, I laugh. I'm a theater major. Her face lights up. That's where I know you. The Christmas play was beautiful. You looked like a real angel up there. Thank you so much. Adam grins down at me. Reagan's ridiculously talented. My face warms. It was wonderful to meet you, Reagan. Adam, good to see you again. I'm afraid I have to make my apologies. My husband is beckoning from across the room. She points, and Adam and I swivel to find him. He's staring in our direction, but otherwise, I can't make out any cry for help. He's standing slightly outside a large group of men with a drink in hand. By all outward appearances, he seems to be okay. Maybe a little bored. Wait for it. He'll tug his right ear every time I make eye contact. Sure enough, he reaches up and gives his ear a pull when Dr. Hunt looks up. We came up with that trick years ago to save each other. He's not much for these types of events. I imagine he's had all he can take. Her smile softens. Great to see you both. We watch her cross the room. Adam chuckles when the man lifts his hand to the guys, clearly indicating his departure. That's awesome. If I tug my ear, can we get the hell out of here? Afraid not. He scrunches up his face. No fair. Come on, who's next? Dr. Salco just walked in. She's the head of the committee. Great, lead the way. Dr. Salco is a woman in her mid to late 50s, by my best guess. Her brown hair is stick straight and falls just below her chin. Her features are sort of pinched and not exactly welcoming, but she does smile as Adam and I step in front of her. You made it, very good. Her gaze moves from Adam to me. I smile big, ready to win this woman over. Dr. Salco, this is Reagan, my f- He stops, catching himself before saying friend. There's an awkward beat of silence while he fumbles to correct himself. Fiance. The lie slips from my lips so smoothly. I step closer and rest my head on Adam's shoulder, just like I've thought about doing so many times. In these heels, I'm just the right height to do it. Adam makes a strangled sound and then turns his body away while he composes himself. He tries to cover his reaction by taking a drink. I smile sweetly at Dr. Salco. Fiance? She looks from Adam back to me, eyes widening. I didn't realize you were engaged, Adam. Congratulations, he swallows, 
then starts coughing. Oh, dear God, I may have killed him. Miraculously, he clears his throat, and then his arm slides around my waist. He opens his mouth like he might want to speak, but then just nods. My confident fiancé looks like he's about to break a sweat. Maybe I've gone too far, but since I've jumped over the cliff, I'd do it with flair. It's recent, but I've been in love with this man for years. The first time I saw him, I just knew. Dr. Salco is hanging on my every word, so I keep going, telling her how I crushed on Adam from afar. I do love a captivated audience, part reality with a dash of drama. The script is juicy, and my co-star is the most handsome leading man, if not a bit shy on stage. We've swapped personalities, it seems. He's stopped coughing, though, so that's a plus. And as Dr. Salco and I talk, more people gather around. That's the thing about a good performance. It tends to draw a crowd. That is quite a story, Dr. Salco says. She's not much of a smiler, but her eyes are kind, and I think I've sold her. Taking a sip of my drink, I finally stop talking and lean into Adam. It's easy to look like you're in love when you basically are. It really is, someone says. I search the crowd to find the source. The tone of this new person says, she doesn't believe me. When I find my hater, I suck in a breath. Janine, what are you doing here? She smiles and looks like she might want to step forward and hug me, but she doesn't, thank goodness. I might be holding Adam up. He's stunned silent beside me. Janine's boyfriend, Sean, waves. Long time no see, Reagan. You three know each other, Adam asks, finally finding his voice. His gaze darts between us. I'm thrown, grappling for my next line. Maybe I should tug my ear. We all went to high school together, Janine says. I think Adam curses under his breath, but it's so quiet I can't make out the words. Probably, fuck my life, why did I bring this crazy person as my date? I'll leave you all to catch up, Dr. Salco says. Nice to meet you, Reagan. Sean, glad to see you again. Adam, Janine, enjoy tonight and make sure you do the rounds to meet everyone. They're all very eager to get to know the both of you. It's just the four of us, and those nerves from earlier are back. Fuck, did I just screw this up for Adam? You're his competition? I ask Janine. I should have known. She always said she was going to be a doctor. No, not just a doctor. The best there was in whatever field she decided on. The last I knew, she was leaning toward pediatrics, but that was years ago. Another lifetime, it feels like. Well, you would have if you'd kept in touch over the years. Ouch. But also truth. So, you two are together now? Janine points a finger between me and Adam. I let him take this one. I have no idea whether or not to keep selling it or back off. Uh, yup, he stares at his feet. We're engaged, I say when it's clear Adam's not going to offer more. Engaged, her brows raise. Only you could go from single to engaged in a week. Not exactly a week. Reagan and I have known each other for years, the relationship moved quickly, yes, but we've always had an... He clears his throat again and his voice gets higher. Attraction. He wipes his forehead. Is he sweating? Oh my God. My face heats with embarrassment for him. He's so out of his comfort zone and I did this to him. Also, he's a terrible actor. I guess he does have a flaw. Well, congrats. I'm happy for you too. She takes a step away and then turns back. Does Lori know? Who knows what Lori knows? I look away from her scrutinizing gaze. You should reach out. She's doing better. She takes Sean's hand. Come on, I need to make the rounds. Bye, Reagan. Adam rakes a hand through his hair and lets out a long breath that puffs out his cheeks. I'm so sorry. I got a little into the part. I wilt beside him and hang my head in shame. What an abysmal performance. He chuckles. 
but the sound is too tight and brittle. He's trying to be a good sport, but seriously freaking out. Don't be. I never should have put you in this situation. This is my fault. He stands a little taller and takes another deep breath. His free hand finds mine and holds it loosely. Well, we're committed now. I'm so sorry, I say again. At least we're in it together, I guess. Ready to get this over with? He drops my hand, but then places his arm around my back. I'm sure he's just trying to keep up with my wild story and doesn't really want to be holding me so intimately. But I lean into him, soaking up his touch. Ready. He's definitely never asking me out on a real date after this shit show. Might as well enjoy it while it lasts. Chapter 7 Adam Reagan smiles over at me as she talks to a group of my professors. She leans closer, like she's done a dozen times tonight, and I hold my breath waiting for... Yep, there it is. Boob alert. Reagan's boob is touching my arm. My maturity has taken a real nosedive tonight. She's all dolled up in a bright green dress that pushes said boobs up. And from this angle, I can see right down into her cleavage. I don't do that, though. This time. Because that's a crappy way to treat a friend doing you a solid. Instead, I mentally recite all the bones in the hand. I'm not too busy distracting myself to notice the way people react as soon as she says we're engaged, though especially the women, but even the men, get these happy smiles and want to hear more about how we got together. People love engaged couples, and they especially love us, it seems. I pause my recital of Bones to listen to her retell the story of how we first met. It's at least in part based on truth. I remember that day well. I was moving into the apartment next door, and he swooped in to help me carry my boxes upstairs. It was one box, but if she wants to remember it like I carried twenty, then who am I to correct her? I find myself grinning and wrapping my arm around her waist as she rests her head on my shoulder. I know we're not really engaged, but Reagan is a damn good actress which makes it harder than you'd think to play along without forgetting. Hell, when Dr. Dove, a professor in the physics department, asks to see Reagan's ring, I want to kick myself for not buying her a rock the size of my fist. Then I remember, we're not actually engaged. Real shame. She's the kind of girl who deserves big diamonds and opportunities to show them off. As the hours pass and we finish talking to everyone, I start to relax again. I'm usually better under pressure than this, but I've got a lot on the line. Wow. I don't know how you do it, I say when we finally get a second by ourselves. Do what? Keep up the charade like that. You're incredible. They all bought it. Every single one of them. Even Professor Hammond looked like he was happy for us, and I happen to know he just went through a nasty divorce. It was nothing. She crosses her arms at her waist, then drops them and stands straighter. Anyone else we need to talk to? I don't think so. I do a final scan of the room and loosen my tie. Ready to get out of here? She nods. Once we're in the jeep, I lean back in the seat and blow out a breath. That was intense. I'm sorry I put you through that. Wholly uncomfortable situation, am I right? I owe you big, and I promise I'll never ask you to do anything like that again. We lock eyes. I can't read her expression, but I can tell she's dropped the act now. 
Little disappointing, I gotta say. When someone looks at you like you're everything, it sucks when they stop. Do you want to grab dinner or something? It's still early. No thanks. I'm pretty tired. She stares out the window as I pull away from the restaurant. She's got to be exhausted. I am, and I was barely doing any of the work. We're both quiet as we head back. Tonight was a lot to process. I got to see a side of Reagan I've never seen before. She was so... perfect. She said the perfect things at just the right time. She's smart and funny and obviously observant. She could recall snippets of my life, interests, family, like she was an integral part of my life. Sure, we've been friends and neighbors for two years, but I'm not even sure Rhett could have done better. No one was looking to trip us up on our lie, but if they had been, they wouldn't have been able to. Well, as long as they only spoke to her. She was flawless. And I'm not too proud to admit that I wasn't a lot of help. She carried us to victory for sure. Reagan walks ahead of me up the stairs toward our apartments. I'm sorry for tonight, she says, breaking her silence. What? Why? Those professors ate it up. You were great. They loved you. I raise a hand to touch her arm and then shove it into my pocket. You're not engaged. You're just friends. Yeah, they did but you looked like you were going to faint for most of the past two hours. She states simply and opens her door. I chuckle quietly. It was real close there for a bit while my whole future flashed before my eyes. She steps inside. I'll see you later. Night, Adam. I slip into my apartment and practically flop onto the couch. I'm exhausted but the adrenaline of the night is still pumping. How'd it go? Rhett asks from the kitchen. He's drinking orange juice straight from the container and staring into the fridge. Great, I think. I don't know. It was weird. Weird? Weird how? I'm hesitant to tell him about me and Reagan pretending to be engaged. Rhett's my best friend. I know he's always got my back. But I guess I don't want to admit that I had to stoop to that level. I'm not proud of it. In fact, I've already decided I need to tell Dr. Salko the truth. That's not going to be a fun conversation. I wave him off. Want to grab food somewhere or go on a run? Oh, run? He lifts a brow. I need to do something besides sit here. I'm all amped up. Smiling, he says, It really must have been a weird night. You should have seen Reagan charming my professors. If she were up for the scholarship, they would have given it to her tonight and then probably thrown her a parade. I've never seen anything like it. Rhett grins at me. You like her? What? No. I dismiss the idea, not because it's so crazy that I'd be into her, but the fact that it took Reagan pretending to be my fiancé to get her to open up to me. That tells me how much of a chance I stand at there being anything between us but friendship. I'm thankful, though. I think I have a good shot at the scholarship if I don't blow the speech. Maybe you can get Reagan to do that for you, too, he jokes. I stand. I really do have way too much energy to sit around. Let's go for a run through campus. Remember that old trail behind the dorms we ran freshman year? Rhett grins. That's a killer night run trail. You think it's still the same? Only one way to find out. I head to my room and change quickly. Come back out with my shoes in hand. I can't, he says when I find him still in the kitchen. I promised Carrie I'd call her again before she goes to bed. 
It's getting late there. Can't you just text her and tell her you'll talk in the morning? I can tell by his expression. That's not happening. Rhett's girlfriend, Carrie, lives in Nebraska. They've dated since high school and have been doing long distance all of college. This isn't the first time he's had to bow out of something to call her. I get that it's important they communicate, but it's six or seven times a day that he has to talk to her. If it seemed like he wanted to, I guess it wouldn't bother me so much. But it feels like it's out of obligation. And I've heard their goodnight conversations. They last all of two minutes, which means he's blowing off our run for a conversation that could be done through text. I don't get it. Sorry, man. I'll catch you in the morning. I decide to go anyway. I'm smiling when I step outside. My brain keeps circling back to the mixer with Reagan at my side. I swear it was so real. Pausing, I stare over at her apartment, wondering if she's in there watching TV like last night. I contemplate knocking and asking if she's up for a run but talk myself out of it with a shake of my head. You're just friends, man. Chapter 8 Reagan Beautiful sunsets need cloudy skies. Look for the moments of beauty today. So, how was it? Dakota asks the next morning as she gets ready. I'm still in bed, and she's rummaging through my makeup searching for the eyeliner she lent me. It's in my purse, I think, I say, and point to where it sits on my desk. She dumps the contents on the bed and laughs. How do you find anything in here? I sit up and grab the eyeliner. Like that. She snatches it and then sits at my vanity to sharpen and use it. Her gaze meets mine in the mirror. Did something happen? Was he a dick to you because so help me I'll... No, nothing like that. Then what happened? Honestly, I expected you to wake me up when you got home last night to spill every detail. That's what I'd expected to happen too. But after I got home from the worst date in the history of mankind, I didn't want to talk to anyone. Giving up play-by-play -play will remind me of the horror. Kind of like now, as an image of Adam... Wide-eyed and swaying flashes through my head. It was awkward, I say finally. I thought that I could compartmentalize it all, but I like him too much. And I may have cost him the scholarship if anyone finds out I lied through my teeth. I consider smothering myself with a pillow, but I deserve far worse, like sucking it up and dealing with the awful situation I got us in. Dakota stands and checks the time. I have to go, but I want to hear all about it later. I'm doing a tour at the Hall of Fame this morning. Lunch? I can't today. I need to finish the reading for my music theater history class this afternoon. Dinner? She shakes her head. I'm pulling a double shift today, but why don't you come to my game tonight? Game? Spike ball, she says like I should know. Our first game is tonight. You were serious about that? Yes. She picks up a pillow that's fallen on the floor and tosses it at me. Will you come? Of course, I say, because that's what you do when your best friend asks you to go watch her play intramural sports. It couldn't have been softball or something that I at least understand. Would that really make it better? She grins as she leaves my room. No. Today, I'm not sure anything would make it better. I don't see Dakota, Ginny, or the guys all day once I leave the apartment. I stay on campus between classes, skip lunch, and throw myself into avoidance. I'm getting an A+, plus until Ginny tracks me down. How'd you find me? I ask when she gets to the front of the stage. I'm sitting in the center with my textbooks laid out in front of me, but I'm not really studying. Please, I know your spots. I tried University Hall first to see if you were drowning in coffee. I wish, I mutter. What's that? She smiles. Nothing, I sigh. What did you need? 
I'll tell you over dinner. Come on. My stomach growls. I'm not eating today. Um, why not? Punishment. Ray, you cannot punish yourself for indulging sometimes. That's twisted. No, it's not like that. Her brows lift in challenge. Fine, I'll go with you to dinner, but I'm only eating foods I don't like. That seems like a fair compromise. Healthy foods only. Take that, self. After we go through the line at the dining hall and get our food, we take our trays and sit down. I glance around for Adam, seeing as how we're sitting at the hockey team's table. Their practice is running late, she says as if she can read my thoughts. I relax and pick around my salad. When I look up, Ginny is staring at me. What's with the all black? She asks. She looks me over like she's just noticing my outfit. I'm in mourning. Oh my God, who died? Her expression is horrified for a moment. No one? Just my fake relationship and any chance of ever dating your brother? She laughs and then coughs and holds up a hand while she takes a drink of her water. I'm sorry, what? I hadn't planned on confessing any details of last night, but once I start, I can't stop. And maybe that really is the punishment I deserve, because it's just as awful when I start remembering all the little details that I manage to forget. Ginny listens intently, and even manages not to laugh, though I can tell how badly she wants to as she smashes her lips together in a flat line. It sounds like you did him a solid. I'm sure he was appreciative, and you're just making too big of a deal out of it. No, you're wrong. It was the biggest train wreck since Justin Bieber and Selena Gomez. Oh, please. It couldn't have been that bad. Also, I loved Jelena. I thought he was going to faint. He got sweaty and pale and no words were coming out of his mouth. She grimaces. Yeah, that doesn't sound good. I've only seen him like that one other time when he had to give an impromptu speech at an award banquet. I groan. But I'm sure you just took him by surprise. Oh, I took him by surprise, all right, but not the good kind of surprise, the truly scary kind that should only happen in cheesy horror films. Well, let's find out. She nods and her gaze goes above my head. My entire body lights up and I just know he's here even without looking. Maybe our shared trauma has forever linked us. Please don't tell anyone else about the fake engagement, I whisper while we're still alone. I'll tell Dakota eventually, but I can't do it right now. Retelling it was almost as painful as living it the first time. I'm calling that good as far as punishment goes. She laughs and smiles. You're so dramatic, Ray. I love you. I won't tell anyone. But speaking of secrets, tell him the truth. She stands as the guys join us. Hey, let's sit somewhere else today. Heath glances to me and then Ginny trying to figure out what's going on, but she pulls him along. Mav tries to set his tray down, but Heath pulls him back. I think she means all of us. This is our table. We always sit here, he says. Let's switch it up today, Ginny says smoothly, then turns to her brother. Can you stay and help Ray with a problem she's having? She doesn't give him any time to answer before she herds the rest of the group away from us. Adam places his tray down in front of me. Is it okay if I sit? Instead of answering, I motion for him to have a seat. He opens a bag of chips as he stares at me. A problem, huh? Not really. She knows about last night and is trying to give us time to talk. He nods slowly. I'm so sorry. I feel awful about the entire thing. I told you, it's fine. Though I probably have to tell Dr. Salco the truth. As much as I want to win, I wouldn't feel right about getting the scholarship based on a lie. You're a good guy. Somehow that makes me feel worse. Blame me. Tell her I had food poisoning or that I had too much to drink. I'm not throwing you under the bus. I could have stopped you and I didn't. I'm not sure a force of nature could have stopped me, but I appreciate him saying so. I even feel a little better now that I know he doesn't hate me. 
I forgot that you went to high school nearby. What was Janine like? He asks between bites. Smart and dedicated. She's always been really competitive and driven. Her parents were hard on her to do her best and get good grades. You two were close. A stab of guilt makes me look down at the table. Yeah, we were. What happened? Nothing, really. We're so different. When we got to Valley, we started running with completely different groups of friends, and we lost touch. I met Dakota, and we became inseparable. Plus, she's been dating Sean forever, so she spent a lot of time with him. Makes sense. She's tough. We've been competing for years. Yeah, about that. She's my age. How is she already graduating this year? It's been bugging me since last night. I knew she was pre-med, but I never imagined she was the person Adam was competing with. I think she said she came to Valley with like 30 hours of college credit. Plus, she's always taking big course loads, and she's taken classes every summer. She's intense. He shakes his head. If we weren't always competing, I might even admire her for it. Right. Yeah, I had forgotten that she took a bunch of college credit courses during our senior year of high school. Meanwhile, I was partying and getting stoned with friends. A stoner? Really? His gaze narrows and he smiles at me. The first real smile I've seen since before I told all his professors we were engaged. For a short time. It wasn't really my thing, but I gave it a shot. He doesn't respond at first, but keeps smiling at me to the point I feel a blush creeping up my neck. Thank you for last night. Seriously, you were amazing. Everyone loved you. And I'll take care of everything. Everything being my big, fat lie. You're welcome, I say. So, it's over? Now you just wait to find out who won? He gets that panicky look from last night. I still have to give a speech. Right, the speech. What do you have so far? I am desperate to move this conversation away from last night, even if it means making small talk about his speech. Nothing. Are you going to wing it? Because I feel like I should warn you, Janine is a pretty good speaker. She was valedictorian of our class and had students, parents, even some teachers in tears with her graduation speech. She doesn't come across as someone who could command an audience, but the girl can perform when the pressure is on. No, I know. We've done group projects together before. She's great. He blows out a breath. I don't love talking in front of people. You're afraid of speaking in public? I ask, maybe a little too accusatory. But you're team captain. I've heard about your amazing pep talks in the locker room and on the bench. That's different, he shrugs. And I prefer my phrasing to yours. I roll my eyes. No one loves talking in front of people. You do, he points out. You're unbelievable. Getting up on stage and putting yourself out there, that's so much harder than yelling at the guys to pump them up. You're fearless. I admire that. Me? Fearless? You're joking, right? The way you worked the room, talking to people, making them believe we were this bomb couple and that I was some incredible guy they should all get to know. It was inspiring. You had me believing it, you were so good. That's because I wasn't acting. Not really. Exaggerating, yes, but make no mistake. I was terrified. I don't understand. His hazel eyes hold mine. Maybe it's more punishment, or maybe I've just reached the point where nothing could be scarier than last night, but I decide it's time, way past time. The story about how the first time I saw you and it took my breath away, how I had a crush on you for years, he stares blankly. Okay, apparently I'm going to have to spell it out. Adam, I have had a crush on you for years, a really bad crush. So last night, it was scary for me, not because I was in a room full of strangers, but because I was telling my story over and over again, except with a much happier ending than the reality. And look, I don't want this to make our friendship weird. It's why I haven't told you. Well, that, and I've chickened out a dozen times. 
He doesn't blink for a long time. He drops the bag of chips to the table and leans back all while looking at me like I've grown two heads. Yep, more punishment. A slow smile spreads across his face at last. You like me? Chapter 9 Adam Reagan has a crush on me? A bad crush? What does that even mean? And why does having a crush on me make her look so nauseated? She nods, shrinks a little in her seat. Did I make it weird? No. But now I want to kick myself for not figuring it out. Seriously? I can't help the grin spreading across my face. You're always so quiet around me. I'm quiet because you make me nervous. I get this total body lockup around you. I can't think or talk. It's sort of humiliating how into you I am. She screws her eyes shut and then peeks out, opening one and then the other. Why? I think it's fucking awesome. You do? I'm not sure why she looks so surprised. I admit I'm stunned, but hell yeah. Last night was... A disaster, she says. I was thrown when you told Dr. Selka we were engaged, but before that, I was having more fun than I've had in months. I had fun early in the night, too, she says, then mutters. Before I opened my stupid mouth. But honestly, she continues, it's okay if you don't feel the same. We can go back to being friends. I just thought you should know and that maybe it would help explain my mental breakdown. I thought I was decent at noticing when girls were into me, but I swear I never had any indication that Reagan saw me any differently than the rest of the guys. No, that's not true. There was one moment, a year ago, where I thought maybe there was something between us, but nothing ever came of it. Do you want to hang out or something? I'm fumbling this badly, but my brain is still slow to let this sink in. Reagan likes me. Isn't that what we're doing? She smiles so that one of her dimples shows. Right. Yeah. I meant outside of the dining hall. Not that this isn't romantic. I promised Dakota I'd go watch her play spike ball tonight. When a pang of disappointment hits at hearing she has plans, I realize that I may be more into this than I even realized. Then I guess dining hall date it is. Dinner goes way too fast, and before I know it, we're heading back to the apartment complex so she can get ready to meet up with Dakota. Reagan's somewhere between the talkative and outgoing girl she was last night and the quiet one I've known over the years. And I'm wondering if this is her, the version I never got to see. I take her hand and walk her to her door across from mine. What do you say? Can I take you on a real first date another night? I'd like that, she says, and then bites her bottom lip. Are you sure? I don't want to talk you out of it, but you were just telling me a couple of nights ago that you weren't in a good place for dating. That was before. Before what? Before I knew you liked me. This changes everything. I squeeze her hand and force myself to take a step back. Later, Reagan. Ginny and Heath are in the living room, cuddled up on the couch when I walk into the apartment. Dr. Scott, Heath calls. How was it? Ginny asks. Did you get Ray's problem solved? Yes. I say, and check her expression. She's wearing this big, uncontained smile. Wait a minute. 
You knew. I shake my finger at her. Of course she knew. She and Reagan are close. Can't believe she kept it from me. If your own sister won't tell you when the hottest girl on campus is into you, who will? She told you then? Really? Ginny sits up, and her grin gets somehow bigger. Ah, uh, I thought she'd chicken out again. Yeah, I drop into a chair. Some sister you are, keeping something like that from me. I'm a great sister, but I'm also a great friend. So? So? Heath and I ask at the same time. Are you into her? Her face pales. Oh my gosh, do I need to go over there with ice cream and wine? If you broke her heart... Chill. I admit I was surprised. But yeah, I think she's awesome. We're gonna go out. Good to see whose side you're on, though, sis. I'd bring you ice cream and wine, too, if someone broke your heart. Back to last night. Was it really that bad? She was petrified that she'd ruined everything for you with the fake fiancé thing. Wait, Heath says. What fake fiancé thing? I'll fill you in later, she promises. I shake my head. No way. The exact opposite. You should have seen her working the room. Even my hard-ass professors loved her. Oh, and get this. She knows Janine. The chick that's always making you look bad? Heath asks. I've only ever heard you refer to her as kiss-ass Janine, Ginny says. Heath snorts a laugh. He's always complaining about her note-taking and showing up early, then turns around and yells at us at practice for forgetting shit or being late. She takes notes and then emails them to the entire class. It's a tad much. I defend myself. Sounds nice, Ginny says. I wish someone took notes for me. She's fine. We're different, and that's totally cool. But she's the type of student people want to give scholarships to. And I need them to give it to me instead. Ginny nods her understanding. I get it. So Reagan crushed it. Did you? They're waiting to see our midterm grades. And they want us to give a speech at the scholarship banquet before they decide. Which means I have a month to keep making them all believe I'm the better candidate. Okay, now that we're through the boring stuff, tell me more about Reagan. How did she tell you? What did she say? Ginny squeals at the end of her barrage of questions. Gah, I wish I'd been there. We could have been if you hadn't made us sit somewhere else, Heath points out. I stand to head to my room. The excitement I had after spending time with Reagan is wearing off, and in its place is that same uneasy feeling about the scholarship and a speech being the deciding factor. It needs to be amazing, especially if I have to tell Dr. Salco that I'm not engaged. I think I'll let her tell you the story, if she wants. Oh, she wants. She throws the blanket off her and tries to stand, but Heath wraps both arms around her waist. You can ask her tomorrow. If you go over there now, I won't get you back until late. She's headed out anyway, I say. Ginny sinks back into Heath. Fine. If we're going to make out, though, we should get a move on it. I need to go to sleep early. Too much information, I say as I go into my room and shut the door. I'm glad my sister is happy, but knowing she's having sex on the other side of the apartment is a definite overshare. I change into sweats and fall onto my bed with my phone and call Reagan. She answers on the third ring. Her face fills the screen. Hi. She's back to sounding and looking timid. I'm just about to head out. This won't take long. 
I just realized you didn't actually say yes when I asked you out earlier. So I'm calling to ask again. We're flying to Colorado in the morning for the game, but I'll be back sometime in the afternoon the next day. Will you go out with me Sunday night? She laughs, and the sound hits my chest. Yes, I will go out with you. Good. Also, I wanted to warn you that Ginny knows you told me. Her eyes widen. Oh, no. Is she on her way over? I have to meet Dakota in ten minutes. No. Lucky for you, and unlucky for me. Heath had other plans for them tonight. Did everyone know except me? I prop my head up with an arm behind my neck. I'm not sure. Ginny knew first because I wanted to make sure she was okay with it if I decided to tell you. You asked my sister's permission? Wow. Now I know why Ginny hated that so much when guys would tell me they wanted to ask her out beforehand to make sure I was cool. We're friends, and I didn't want her to feel like I was using her to get to you or anything else. Then Dakota found out, of course. And Ginny told Heath, I add. It's easy to see how it got around the group. I'm shocked they all kept it from me. Yeah, I don't know if anyone else knows. I wasn't really that subtle, so probably... Subtle enough that I never noticed. You were wrapped up in your girlfriends, and you didn't see me like that. It's okay. I promise you, I saw you like that. I just didn't think you were into me. Aside from being so quiet, you never flirted with or dated anyone on the team. Fuck. Because you didn't want to date one of my teammates. Damn. Her soft laughter seeps through the phone again. Yeah, I've spent enough time around you guys to know how you feel about dating a teammate's ex. Damn. Neither of us speaks. I'm thinking back to all the times we hung out, searching for more hints, and replaying her actions with this new knowledge. Man, I hate missing things, and I definitely missed this. You know, I remember the first time we met, too. You were holding a box and scanning the apartments like you couldn't remember where you were going. I couldn't, she says. I wanted to talk to you. But I didn't know what to say, so I offered to carry the box for you. And if I remember correctly, I did ask you out that day. You invited me to a party... That's basically the same thing, I argue. I never felt luckier than when I realized the hottest girl on campus was going to be living next door. Flattery will get you everywhere, she says, and I make a vow to do a lot more of it. Sunday afternoon, when we get back, I call my mom to check in. Hey! I was just thinking about you, she says when she answers. Congrats on the game last night. Thanks. What are you up to? I'm cleaning out the garage. I found a box of trophies from when you were little. Fifth grade spelling bee champion, she says proudly. I think you're safe to throw those out. No way. Besides, now that your dad got all of his old tools out of here, I have way more room. I'm moving everything that's in boxes into tubs and putting up shelves, so I have space in the garage to park. Since they announced their separation, they've mostly kept any annoyance or animosity toward the other from me and Ginny, but occasionally it slips out in their tone. Who knew tools in a garage was something they'd ever fight over? We have a home game next weekend, I say, changing the subject. Can you come? Wish I could. Aunt Zoe is having eye surgery Friday, so I promised her I'd drive her to and from the appointment. Another game where neither parent will be there. 
I already got a text from Dad saying he has a work thing and won't be able to make it. Okay. Well, there aren't a lot of home games left. You could drive up Saturday. Maybe, she says. I'll check the schedule, but I promise I will drive down soon. I miss you. I miss you too, Mom. I better go. I think I took on more than I can finish in one day. Ginny steps into the doorway of my room, and I hold up a finger to tell her to wait. All right. I'll talk to you later. Ginny says hi. When we hang up, Ginny walks all the way in and sits on the chair at my desk. Mom? Yeah. Doesn't sound like either of them are coming to the games next weekend. They suck lately. I shrug. They said everything would be okay and that we'd still be a family. We will, I promise her. Just as soon as our parents stop acting like children. But I keep that part to myself. Now help me figure out what to wear on my date with Reagan. She squeals. I might not know how to fix the shit with our parents, but I know how to get Ginny's mind off it. Chapter 10 Reagan Tuck your heart back into your pocket, Cancer. Now is not the time to be emotionally slutty. While you're at it, keep it in your pants, too. It's up. It's up! You look! I can't do it. I slide my laptop to Dakota when Dr. Rawson's email comes in with the final cast list. She scrolls slowly. So dang slowly. I pace and hold my hands up like I'm praying. I want this so badly. Well? I ask when I can't take it any longer. Her face lifts from the screen, and she smiles. You got the part of Molly. Is that the one you wanted? I did? I jump in front of her so I can see. Molly, Mary, and Mara. Those are terrible names for sisters. They sound too much alike, she complains. But I barely hear her. I can't believe it. I got it. Congrats. I hug her so hard she grunts and gasps for air. This is going to be amazing. I'm really proud of you, she says when I free her. And then it really registers. Oh, no. What? I might screw up the entire production. Holy crap. Wow. That was a quick turn of feelings there, even for you. I've never played a part like this. I'm not funny. Why did I think I could pull off a funny character? She grins. Sometimes you're funny. You're making me smile right now. I groan loudly just as there's a knock at the door. Sounds like your date is here. Want me to let him in and sharpen my knives while he waits? I laugh, hoping she's joking, as I rush to let Adam in. His hair is still damp, and he steps in with a grin that's so sexy, I forget to speak. Hey, he says and snaps me out of it. Hey, hi, I wave awkwardly. Some of my uneasiness around him has diminished now that he knows about my massive crush on him, but I'm still nervous about all the disastrous ways this could go. My hair and makeup are already done, so I change quickly while he waits on the couch. I send Dakota to her room with a promise that she won't threaten my date. He stands when I walk into the living room. I clutch my purse against my body. Waterproof mascara and tissues are packed, and I'm wearing my favorite panties. I'm ready. You look great, he says. He looks me over like he can't believe we're really doing this, like he's seen me for real the way I always wanted him to. With a hand at my lower back, Adam guides me to his Jeep and opens the door for me. And then we're off. I am on a date with Adam Scott. I pinch myself, which freaking hurts, but at least I know I'm not dreaming. The thing about all the bad dates I've been on lately is I know now how to spot one early. Little cues like silence on the ride to our destination. It's not foolproof, Sometimes things turn around by the time the appetizers arrive, but more often than not, my initial reaction to the date bleeds through to the end of the night. 
And I also know what a good date looks like. Specifically, what Adam looks like on one. I've watched him date so many girls over the years. So, when Adam and I get to the restaurant and neither of us has said more than two words, I start to panic. All the giddiness about finally going out with my dream guy turns to nerves. And then I start to babble. All through dinner, I barely touch my food. I'm so busy regaling him with every detail of my day. It wasn't that exciting to start with, and my retelling does not enhance it. By the time we get back into his Jeep to go home, I'm ready to cry. I fall into silence that would have been helpful an hour ago when I recited my horoscope and his. He starts the engine, but doesn't put the vehicle in gear. I blink back hot tears. I'm so mad at myself and angry at the situation and just pissed that I was so wrong. How can I like him so much and then find out we're so bad together? Shit, are you okay? Adam asks. Fine. I turn to look out the window and brush away the wetness on my cheeks. You're not fine. You're crying. He shifts and leans into my space, takes my chin into his hand, and makes me face him. I'm sorry. That was awful. It was my fault. Since the second you walked out in that tiny red dress, my heart's been in my throat. My jeans are so tight, I'm worried my dick might actually be losing circulation. What? A surprised laugh escapes, and I can't help but stare down at his crotch. Oh, he's hard. Really hard. I thought you were counting the seconds until the date was over, and I couldn't stop talking because I didn't want this to be the worst date of all history. Well, second worst date. Nothing could be worse than me forcing you into a fake engagement in front of all your professors. I'm doing it again, I say. I can't stop. Before, I couldn't talk around you, and now I'm blabbering on. Seriously, I can't stop. His hand covers my mouth, and I squeak my surprise. He chuckles and removes his hand. Sorry, that was a dick move. I didn't mean to cut you off. It's just, I really want to kiss you, and you're making it hard to find a second to dive in. I slam my lips together. He's looking at me like he's waiting for me to say something else. Yeah, never speaking again, I whisper. Laughing, he leans forward. His breath is minty and soft as he parts his lips. His hand goes to my chin and then slides behind my neck, leaving a trail of goosebumps. The radio's on, but I can still hear the groan he lets out as I press my mouth to his. His kiss is the magic touch that zaps some confidence into me, and I tangle my tongue with his. My hands find his hair, and I thread my fingers through the thick locks, and gently tug him closer. He comes so easily. You'd think I have super strength. He's basically in the seat with me, which is no small feat, considering how big he is. One arm circles my waist, and he brings us both to his side of the jeep, all without breaking the kiss. Impressive. Ouch, I yelp as my knee hits the gear shift. I think he mumbles sorry, but that hand at my waist has shifted to palm my ass and, oh, sweet, sweet Nirvana. Climbing into his lap, I sink down onto him, and it's only then we stop kissing. Our lips are only millimeters apart. His hot breaths mix with mine. His gaze locks me in place. I don't know how long we stare, neither moving, panting, wanting, reading each other before his dick twitches under me. My eyes flutter closed. Tell me to slow down, he pleads, as his mouth finds my neck. I have a choice, slow down, risk that we've salvaged this date enough that he might ask me on another, or go for it. One night is better than none. My horoscope told me to keep it in my pants, but come on, this has to be the exception. Adam is my every exception. I roll my hips and claim his mouth. I'm all in, whether that's just for tonight or more. After that, 
There's no more pleading or asking permission. Adam's hands are everywhere, guiding me over the thick bulge and then on my face, caressing and tender. When his fingers slide up to cup my boobs, I lean back and the horn blares. His laughter tickles my throat. I think we should probably take this back to your place. Instead, I unzip his jeans and push them down far enough to free his dick. His eyes close, and his throat works as I wrap my hand around him and pump slowly. Condoms are in the glove box, he grins sheepishly. Sure enough, a new box waits for me. I'm a little shaky as I rip open a foil packet, but I do it with the excitement that's built for two very long, very frustrating years. I barely remember covering him with the latex or the short words we share after, him making sure I'm okay and that I'm sure I want to do this, and me asking if he's a crazy person because, duh, of course I'm sure. I don't even bother taking off my panties. With a little maneuvering, I shove them to one side. Crotchless panties seem like a good idea for the first time ever. When I slowly sink down onto him, it's so much more than I dreamed. I'm breathless and fevered, and there's a frantic energy that courses through me as I hold on to his neck and let him fill me so completely. He controls the pace. Both hands are at my waist, lifting me and bringing me back down over and over. My dress inches up, and he pulls it even higher so that his palms dig into my hip bones. The expression on his face is bliss and lust, and I put it there. A thousand times I wondered what this moment might be like, but I never imagined it like this. I left too many things out. Things I know I'll never forget, the nip of his teeth along my jaw, deep groans that vibrate through his body, and the possessive way he grips my skin, and the feeling somewhere deep inside of me that comes alive in a way I can't explain. My head falls forward, and I bury it into his shoulder as I come. He's only a few pumps behind me, slamming me down onto him and driving his hips up, then stilling as he finds his release. I stay like that, collapsed onto him, until he brushes my hair away from my neck and kisses me chastely. That was unexpected, says the guy who has condoms at the ready. A chuckle shakes his chest. Come home with me. We both know going to his place or mine makes this more complicated. We'll have to answer questions once our friends know we've hooked up, and they'll know. There's no way I'll be able to hide this huge grin on my face and rumpled dress. One look at me and Ginny and Dakota would know everything. Okay, I agree. All in. I text Dakota to let her know I'm not coming home, and then put my phone away to avoid any reply texts. At the guy's apartment, we get lucky and don't have to speak to anyone. The TV is on and Maverick's passed out on the couch in front of it, and it looks like by their closed doors, both Red and Heath are in their rooms. Adam hasn't dropped my hand since we got out of the Jeep. He flips on the light of his bedroom and shuts the door, crowding my space, he stares down at me with a smile, a real one, the kind that makes my stomach flip. We've done things all out of order. I can't decide if I want to get you naked again immediately or ask you all the things I planned to ask over dinner. You had questions? He shrugs a shoulder. I realized that I don't know all that much about you. Not like you know me. You've paid attention. There's no use in denying it. Little has happened in Adam Scott's life these past two years that I haven't noticed. Why didn't you ask them at dinner and save me from myself? Couldn't get a word in. I hide behind my hands. He laughs and slides my hands away from my face. It was adorable. I'm pretty sure you know all my embarrassing secrets, including how I blather on when I'm nervous. Well... I want to know more. 
Ask me whatever you want. I sit on the edge of the bed and tug him with our joined hands to follow. I'm having a hard time remembering what I wanted to ask. Having you here in my room, on my bed, it's pretty distracting. The best way to remember something is to focus on something else. His gaze darkens, and he leans forward to press his lips to mine. Our kisses are lazier this time, and we even manage to go several minutes without letting our hands explore. But soon, he's stroking my legs, slowly moving higher until his fingertips disappear under the hem of my dress. Listen, I know Adams dated a lot of girls, and therefore slept with a lot of girls. But I've never been more aware of it than the second he finds the hidden zipper of my dress and is pulling the fabric over my head. The man has skill. Not fair, I say. You're still so clothed, and I'm basically naked. You can take off whatever you want, he says, voice gruff. I reach under his t-shirt, but I don't get very far because his mouth covers one nipple, and I suck in a deep breath. He palms the other and then alternates. I've totally forgotten about getting him undressed until he lays me down and covers my body with his. He helps me pull his shirt over his head and then goes back to worshiping my body as I let my touch roam over his back and chest, exploring every muscle. And there are a lot. Adam is tall and broad. His body has been sculpted and defined by years of hockey. I find a raised line and trace the scar on the inside of his bicep with a fingertip. What's this from? I ask. Went down on the ice with a defender my first year at Valley and took a skate blade to the arm. What about your pads? It got through or around. Not sure. Didn't work. Well, that's not reassuring. Have any more? He rears back and points to another scar. This one lighter than the last and just below his belly button. That one is from a stick. Good thing it didn't go any lower. I rub the outline of his dick through his jeans. You're telling me. He falls back on top of me. And that's the last thing either of us says until he's covering himself with a condom. Adam laid out next to me naked and wanting me. Well, there's no horoscope that could have prepared me. Chapter 11 Adam, there is nothing that could have prepared me for this. Reagan, gloriously naked in my bed. It's like one of those ambiguous images. At first, you see a wine glass, but if you squint or flip it upside down, then eventually you see there are two people kissing. Once you see both, you can't unsee them. And I'm never going to be able to unsee this version of Reagan. Lips pink and wet, chest heaving with excitement. So, so naked. Fuck. You're beautiful. I brush her hair back away from her neck and can feel her pulse under my thumb. As I push inside of her for the second time in an hour, I can't believe this is happening. With Reagan, gorgeous, shy, sweet little Reagan's pussy is squeezing me so tight and greedy. Her nails lightly scratch down my shoulders. Her tits bounce every time I plump into her. Bounce, bounce, bounce. And I am entranced. I flip us so she's on top. Ride me. She hesitates, but not for long. My hands find their way back to her tits. I sit up so I can lick and bite each one. Feather light, then rougher. She pushes me down onto the bed and takes over, which is absolutely fine with me. Reagan manhandling me? Yep, no complaints here. But damn if I'm not going to get off way faster than I want. We'll just have to go again. I plan to see this date through to the early hours of the morning. 
making her come so many more times. I'm making plans for all sorts of fun. This is not how I expected tonight to go. Honestly, my expectations were that we'd have a nice dinner, talk and get to know one another apart from the group. I don't want to say this is better, but she's naked, so... Yeah, fuck it. It's better. There'll be time later to talk. When her moans get louder and her movements more frantic, I take over by gripping her hips and thrusting from below. Her skin slaps against mine. Her hands at my chest squeeze until her nails prick my skin. Only by seconds, she gets off first, and it is the most amazing performance. Hair wild and face of pure bliss. Reagan having an orgasm is something I want to watch on repeat. She starts giggling, gulping in air as she collapses on the bed next to me. Holy crap. That was amazing. Understatement of the decade. I stare up at the ceiling, trying to catch my breath. I don't want to move, but I need to do something about this condom. As I sit up, noise outside of the door catches my attention. The apartment is a constant den of activity, so it isn't surprising. But the fact that the voices are hushed and seem to be centered directly outside of my door is suspicious. Uh, I think we have an audience. What? She snaps upright, and I point toward the door. The whispers start up again, and I distinctly hear Ginny yelp. Ouch! Mav, you stepped on my foot. Then there's a round of shushing from someone or someones. I have no idea how many are out there, but I'm guessing the entire apartment is standing outside my door listening in. What do we do? Reagan asks. Nothing. They're the idiots with their ears pressed to the door. They'll get bored eventually. I kiss her and then get up to take care of the condom. Reagan's got the sheet wrapped around her, staring at the door when I pull out clean clothes. She's more bothered by them than I am. I guess I was expecting it. Nothing happens in this apartment that doesn't open itself up for public scrutiny. I love these guys, but they're nosy as hell. I pull on sweats, toss Reagan a shirt, and then quietly pad to the door. I wait to be sure they're still there, but when Maverick's deep chuckle gives them away, I swing the door open without warning. Stepping into the doorway, I stretch out an arm to stop them from getting in and hopefully shielding Reagan from view. Can we help you? I ask. I try for annoyed, but it's been too good of a night for it to ring sincere. Maverick, Ginny, Heath, Rhett, and even Dakota stand in a huddle with matching guilty expressions. Is Reagan in there? Dakota tries to peek around me. It's Reagan, right? If it isn't Reagan, then I'm going to kick your ass, Scott. It's none of your business. Get away from my door. It's weird. Especially you, I say to my sister. Just tell us if Reagan is in there, Ginny pleads. I don't feel Reagan approach, but she ducks under my arm wearing the large t-shirt I gave her. It falls past her knees, and I can't tell if she's wearing panties, but I sure plan to find out as soon as these idiots get lost. Yay! My sister squeals the loudest, but even Rhett's got a dopey grin. Now, will you please step away from my bedroom door? I go to shut it. But Maverick slaps a palm onto the open door and holds it there. We need details, he says. No, Reagan and I fire back at the same time. We deserve details. Mav has absolutely no boundaries, so I'm sure he truly believes that. 
I wrap an arm around Reagan's waist and pull her against my hip. All our friends track the movement. Thanks for your interest in our sex life. But we're not discussing it. Their sex life, Heath grins, implies it's going to continue. Fuck yeah, it's going to continue. I don't say that out loud, though. Instead, I say, Good night. Don't come back. Reagan waves, and I manage to get the door closed and lock it. Well, I start and run a hand through my hair. They know we are in here together mostly naked, so we might as well make sure it's worth the millions of questions we're both going to get tomorrow. She wraps her arms around my neck, and the t-shirt rides up, giving me a glimpse of her bare ass. It already was. I lift her in my arms and carry her back to bed. I think we can do better. The next night, Reagan asks me to meet her at the theater after hockey practice. I'll admit I was hoping she was going to do some sort of sexy performance for me. Maybe put on one of those costumes she's worn and strut across the stage. Okay, that makes her sound like a stripper. But they're my dreams, and I refuse to apologize for them. I can still vividly recall her dress from the last play. It was a deep green and had a v-neck that made her boobs look huge. I've seen just about every performance she's done since she and Dakota moved in across the breezeway from us. A private show. Yeah, that sounds like a great follow-up to last night. She sits with her books laid out in front of her, a notebook on her lap. Her hair is pulled into a low side ponytail with a black scrunchie. Black with gold stars. You found it. I hop onto the stage. What? She glances side to side. The lucky scrunchie. Oh. She reaches up and touches it, and then glides her hand down to the end of her ponytail. Yeah, I did. It was in my purse. I gaze out into the empty theater. Man, I don't know how you do it. I feel nervous just being up here thinking about what you do. I love it. This is my favorite place. There's a reverence to her tone. It's kind of creepy being in here by yourself. The more I think about it, the less I like the idea of her alone in this dark place with no one around. It might be my dislike of public speaking and standing on a stage facing rows and rows of seats, but this feels like a scene straight out of a horror movie. Mr. Hoffman's office is right outside, and I'm pretty sure he'd hear me scream. That is not reassuring. I'm fine. Besides, you're here now. I pull her to her feet and kiss her. Crazy. I still can't believe we're kissing now. This is a thing. We kiss. A lot. And it's fire. Besides making out, what did you have in mind when you invited me here? I'm about five seconds from distracting her from whatever plans she has if they don't include my lips on her body. No plan. I just went with the one place I thought we couldn't be hammered with questions. Do you know how many texts Ginny sent me today? If it's half as many as she sent me, then I have a pretty good idea. What did you tell her? I ask. Who? Ginny. When she texted and asked, What happened? And, What does it all mean? I changed my voice to mock Ginny's bubbly and excited tone. I sent a series of gifts indicating my silence on the topic, and I've been hiding out here. And you? I didn't respond, which will drive her crazy. She's probably waiting at the apartment to pounce on me when I get home. That's as good of a reason to stay as any. Reagan presses her lips to mine and kisses me hard. Glad we're on the same page with our plans for tonight. Kissing.
because kissing is awesome. There's too much adrenaline pumping through me to stay still. Attacking her mouth, I back her up, moving to one side of the stage. It's dark, but I find a wall and pin her against it. I can't seem to get close enough. I'm flattening her against the hard concrete, and still it isn't enough. I boost her up, and she wraps her legs around me. Any closer and we'll be one person. She tugs on my hair and sucks on my bottom lip. I forgot to ask about your day. My day? Her laughter is the best damn sound. My day was good. How was yours? Better now. We're not going to be able to hide from them forever. I'm not hiding. I just want you to myself. I bite down on her neck, and she squeals and laughs. There's so much I don't know about Reagan, and I want to get to know her. I honestly do, despite the way I keep mauling her. It just seems like in order to get to know each other, we have to get some of our physical feelings out of the way. And stay the hell away from our friends. Hello? A male voice calls out from the back of the audience. Shit, Reagan whispers and jumps out of my arms. She smooths a hand down her hair frantically and steps out toward the middle of the stage. It's just me, Mr. Hoffman. Reagan? I stay hidden, but I can see Reagan wringing her hands. Then she starts talking fast. Yeah, sorry. I was studying and then decided to run some lines. I guess I got a little carried away. All right. I thought I heard screaming. I peek out from my hiding spot. Hoffman is a balding, middle-aged man. His hands are on his hips as he interrogates Reagan. I'm sorry. I was really getting into it. Yeah, she was. I'm about finished, she assures him. Okay. I'm heading home soon. You should too. I will. I promise. Reagan glances over at me quickly. She doesn't move until the theater door closes. Oh my gosh. She walks toward me in a fit of giggles. Good to know you're safe in here. From everyone but you. She hugs my waist. Come on. Let's get out of here. Chapter 12 Reagan Eat your veggies, wear sunscreen, daydream, and spend more time with people who make you smile. My heart rate climbs with every step toward the theater Tuesday afternoon. Mila is the first person I see. She stands off to the side as if she's unsure of where she should be. When she spots me, her face lights up. Congratulations! Thank you, you too. Understudy for not one but two parts, Molly and Mary, the middle sister, played by a sophomore named Harriet. Mila tightens her grip on her backpack. I'm so nervous. Now I have double the lines to memorize. Don't be. I nudge her with my elbow. This is going to be fun. I hold on to that hopeful attitude until after my first scene. Director Hoffman's face is pinched as he calls for us to take a break. Reagan, he beckons me with a wave of his hand. I hop down from the stage and meet him in the second row. Are you sure you want this role? Yes, I'm sure. His mouth pulls down into a frown. You look uncomfortable. Your lines and movements are right, but it isn't believable. It's the first day, I argue, feeling a prick of annoyance. This isn't the casting I wanted for you. But you seemed so determined, I went against my instinct. If we need to make a change, I'd rather do it now than halfway through rehearsals. We don't need to make a change. Tell me what I need to do. It isn't one thing, Reagan. It's everything. He sits and crosses one leg over the other. I think we can alter the character a little in some of the big comedic scenes. Make her less over the top. No, he stares at me unspeaking. 
I can do this. With a tilt of his head, he says, Okay then, let's try it again. The first weeks of rehearsals are always grueling and frustrating, but I've never felt more picked on and discouraged than when we finish for the day. My body hurts, which doesn't even seem like it should be possible. I was holding myself so tightly, my muscles scream from overuse. Good job today, Mila says as we're grabbing our bags from backstage. Thanks, I groan quietly. Who knew playing the silly character would be the most exhausting? I have a whole new appreciation for how hard this is going to be. Over the next two days, classes, rehearsal, and Adam take up every waking second. After Sunday night, we stopped making plans, and he just texts to tell me to come over as soon as I'm done for the day. We avoid our friends with muttered apologies and lock ourselves in his room, so it's just the two of us. On Thursday, I have to throw a wrench in our routine to work on a paper I've neglected. There you are, Jenny opens my bedroom door and pokes her head in. Hey, yeah, I have a paper due tomorrow. I've been in here since noon trying to finish. I glance out the window to see the sun is setting and then rub my eyes. Oh, what's up? What's up? Really? Jenny walks in and makes herself comfortable, kicking off her shoes and sitting on the end of the bed. You've been avoiding me all week. I'm not avoiding you, just spending every free second getting naked with your brother. I don't know what to make of the silence from you two. Neither one of you has said a peep. It's only been a few days. I know, but usually when you come home from a first date, I get the whole scoop. Well, technically... I didn't come home from our first date. Jenny smiles, but then her lips fall into a pout. Is this going to be weird? Are you going to stop sharing things with me? He is your brother. Wouldn't it be weird to hear details? No, she says too quickly. Okay, maybe, but you're like a sister to me and I don't want to lose you to my smelly brother. You won't lose me, promise. I take her hand and squeeze. So, she perks right up. Did you just play me? Give me something. I'm dying to know if you guys are like a thing now. Are you his new girlfriend? Is the bet off? We haven't talked about it or labeled anything. We went on a date and hung out a few times. That's it. You've been banging nonstop. You're telling me you haven't had any conversations between sex rounds? I feel my face warming. Sure, we've talked but nothing heavy. I don't want to jinx it. Everything is great. We're having fun. And I think we both wanted to keep everything away from our friends until we figure it out. The last thing I want is to screw up the group dynamic. Well, you better figure it out quickly, because we're all hanging out tonight. My expression must give away my hesitation. No excuses. I'm totally cool with my brother hooking up with my best friend, but I am not cool with it driving a wedge between us. Plus, Rhett and his girlfriend broke up, and we need to be there for him and help take his mind off it. Rhett and Carrie broke up? Jenny nods. Wow. Rhett's had the same girlfriend as long as I've known him, since high school, or maybe even longer. They've been doing long distance since she's at a college in Nebraska, but I thought they were solid. Okay, I give in, but I have to finish this paper first. Jenny leans forward and hugs my neck. No matter what, Adam doesn't come between us, okay? Okay, I reply automatically. Of course, that's the last thing I want, but hearing Jenny voice the concern makes me wonder exactly what she thinks is going to happen that she'd need to choose sides. When I get to the guy's apartment an hour later, everyone is outside on the deck. They've got the fire pit going and music playing. Adam smiles when he spots me, and the guys all say, hey. Dakota's holding two glasses of wine and lifts one toward me. Celebratory wine for finishing your paper, or fuck it, I'm dropping the class, booze. I figured it was appropriate to drink either way. Celebratory, I say as I take the wine. I finished. It might be crap, but it's done. 
I sit next to Adam, not on him or any closer than I'd sit to any of the guys. But Mav grins. You two are gonna hook up again tonight, aren't you? Adam throws an arm around my shoulders and pulls me closer. Get it all out of your system. We can take it. We can? I whisper to him. I got you. And he does. He holds on to me as the guys tease us, mostly Mav. It breaks the ice, and it isn't as weird after that. I relax. I don't think I realized how nervous I was about this screwing up the group's vibe. They're important to me. They're more than friends, and the only type of family I really know anymore. Rhett's always quiet, so it's hard to get a read on his mood until Maverick turns his questions on him. How are you doing, buddy? Fine. Rhett continues to stare off into space as he answers. Maverick hands him the bottle of Mad Dog. Every time you give a one-word answer, you have to do a shot. Rhett doesn't even bother arguing, just takes the bottle and a healthy pull. Now, how are you doing, buddy? Mav asks again. Doing fine. He holds up a hand with two fingers. That was two words. Is he okay? I can't tell. I ask Adam quietly. He'll be fine. Let's play sardines tonight, Rhett says. I don't want to sit here. I need to move around. Everyone mumbles their willingness. We head inside to get warmer clothes. I go with Adam into his room where he pulls a sweatshirt on over my head and then a beanie. You're on my team tonight, he says, as he adds his own warm layers. What about Rhett? We have an uneven number and he shouldn't be on his own. He can be on a team with Dakota and Maverick. Do you think Dakota and Maverick are the most supportive decision? Fuck. Adam curses. I was really looking forward to having some time alone with you. I missed you today. He fists my sweatshirt and tugs me toward him. You're staying over tonight, right? Yes, but we have to sleep some tonight. I fell asleep eating lunch today. He chuckles. Well, come on then. Let's get this over with. We hold hands on the walk over to campus. It's cold out, and I huddle into the sweatshirt Adam lent me. It's one of his many valley hockey sweatshirts, but he's worn it recently because it smells like him. Once we arrive, Dakota and Maverick head off to hide, and the rest of us wait. This wasn't a game I'd ever played before meeting the guys. I didn't grow up with siblings or cousins, and I rarely had sleepovers where games like this might have been played. Dakota's told me that traditionally, it's played indoors, but given the limited space of our apartments, we use the main area of campus. One person or group hides, and the rest of us try to find them. Though instead of regular hide-and-seek, you have to join and wait for everyone else when you find them. And sometimes, we throw in crazy rules like making the seekers chug a beer or swap shirts with their partner— Pretty much anything goes, so long as you don't go inside of or on top of buildings. That opens up too many possible hiding spots. Ginny and Heath are standing off by themselves hugging and talking, which leaves me with Adam and Rhett. I'm still holding on to Adam's hand, but I keep some distance between us so that Rhett doesn't feel weird. He isn't much of a talker, so I really can't get a read on his emotional status. How would I get stuck with you two? He asks as he pulls a beer from his coat pocket and pops the top. What do you mean? Adam sounds downright offended. I got stuck with the happy new couple. I drop Adam's hand and cross my arms over my chest. Rhett chuckles. It's fine. You can touch around me, whatever. I'm fine. Totally fine. Yeah, that's convincing. What happened? We were fighting all the time. Every day she was pissed about something else. I just couldn't take it anymore. You broke up with her? I ask. For some reason, that surprises me. He nods, takes another long drink. Wow, you did the right thing, Adam says. You'll find someone who treats you better, who you click with, and things will be easier. 
or maybe you two will get back together, I offer. You were together a long time. Maybe you just need some time apart. Adam shoots me a confused look. Nah, I don't think so. Rhett runs a hand through his hair, making the long top fall to one side. It's weird, though. I haven't been single since I was 15. You were together for six years? Now I feel even worse about them breaking up. That's such a long time to have history with someone. Yeah, fucking forever, right? That's way longer than I've ever dated anyone. I can't imagine. What about you two? Red asks us. Then he looks at me. Is this a thing? Are you his girlfriend? Oh, uh, nothing like being put on the spot. You haven't talked about it, huh? Rhett grins. You know, what might cheer me up? What? Adam asks. He steps closer to me, almost as if he's trying to reassure me with his presence. If you wait another three weeks to make it official, I'll be 50 bucks richer and really, what's another month? The bet. Of course. Rhett is the most competitive guy of the group. It probably would make him feel better. Boys are strange. Oh, we're not jumping into anything, I say. Adam and I haven't talked about it, but I think that's true. It's true for me. While being Adam Scott's girlfriend sounds amazing, he was just telling me how he needed to switch things up and get out of old patterns. Accept each other's beds? Adam's phone alarm goes off. It's time. He calls loud enough that Heath and Ginny can hear. Let's go. He shoves Rhett. You keep talking, and I'm going to forget about your broken heart and get pissed at you for saying shit like that to my, your girl? Rhett grins. You are going to say your girl, weren't you? Adam's mouth pulls into a straight line. I link my arm through his. Come on, you two. I think I know where they are. Dakota mentioned something about finding a good hiding spot near the library. I gotta take a piss. Now? Adam complains. I'll be quick. Rhett promises and jogs toward the nearest building. When he disappears inside, Adam turns to me. Sorry about that. Don't be. I expected it. Though not from Rhett. I guess we should have talked about what to say. It's my fault. Anytime I've hung out with a girl this much, she's been my girlfriend. It's okay, really. You don't owe me any explanations. I'm perfectly content not labeling this and hanging out. You want to break your routine and I just want to spend more time together. That's the thing, though. I'm not sure I'm okay not labeling it. His lips come down to meet mine, and his hands circle my waist. His face is cold, but his mouth and body are warm, and I snuggle in closer to both. I'm back. Rhett falls in beside us. He's opening another beer when I pull myself away from Adam. How many have you had tonight? Adam juts his chin toward the can. Don't know. Not enough. Maverick promised there was a point in which I'd forget everything, including my name, but I still know it. Rhett. R H E T T. Are you drunk? I ask through a laugh. I don't think I've ever seen Rhett drunk. Sure, he drinks when we all hang out, but it's never altered him in any way I could tell. He winks at me and keeps on spelling his middle name and then his last name. Well, this is new. I don't even think he's looking for Maverick and Dakota. I've been his partner more than anyone else, and I can say without a doubt, he takes it far more seriously than the rest of us. He gets off on the competition. Speaking of the competition, we're the last group to find Mav and Dakota. It's been over 30 minutes of us searching when we hear whispers and find Ginny, Dakota, Heath, and Maverick crammed together underneath a table outside of University Hall. Finally, Maverick stretches out his legs. Cramp. Fuck, I have a cramp. He holds his calf and cries out. Everyone else is laughing as he dramatically curses and rolls to his side. Adam crouches down beside him. Massage it, 
he instructs. Try to stretch out your leg again. Fucking hurts when I do that, Mav complains. All right, stand up. Maybe that'll help. Adam helps him to his feet, and Maverick slowly puts pressure on the leg with the cramp. Damn, that was a bad one, Mav says once he's hobbling around a little. You need to make sure you're stretching out really well every day. Sure thing, Dr. Scott. On the way back, Adam sticks near Maverick. He's walking on his own, but slowly and stopping every 20 feet or so to rub the muscle. Ginny and Heath make their excuses as soon as we're back and head to bed. Rhett starts up the Xbox. I sit next to Maverick on the couch. He's screwing off the top of his mad dog when Adam comes from the kitchen with a Gatorade. Perhaps you should try this instead? I'll use it as a chaser. Adam laughs quietly and sinks into the cushion beside me. I think I'm off too, Dakota says with a yawn. She stops at the door. Are you sleeping here? She asks me. Yeah, running after classes tomorrow? I've seen less of Dakota this week, and I think that's harder on me than her. I need her, and I need us to be close like we've always been. I'll meet you there. She says goodnight, and then it's just the guys and me. Adam places a hand on my thigh, and I nuzzle into his side. He's talking to Red and Mav about practices, and then the game they're playing on the Xbox. The long week of late nights has caught up to me, and at some point, I fall asleep only to wake when he lowers me onto his bed. It's dark with just a small amount of light from the sliding glass door that leads out to the deck from his room. Sorry, I say my voice is deep from sleep. I guess I was tired. He strips down to his boxers and gets into bed next to me. It's okay. Been a long week. He draws me against him and kisses me. He tastes like toothpaste. I need to brush my teeth and wash my face, I say as I pull back. I also really need to take off this bra. It's pretty and lacy with some awesome padding that makes my boobs look A+. But the comfort is more C-. minus. Hurry back. His tongue sweeps into my mouth, and he kisses me deeply before letting me go. I do hurry, but by the time I get back, his eyes are closed. Arm thrown over his face, I grab one of his t-shirts and change into that. Carefully, I get into bed, trying not to wake him. One arm reaches around my waist and pulls me tight against his chest. His nose nuzzles into my hair, and he places a kiss on my neck. Night, beautiful. Chapter 13 Adam I'm stretching out as the rest of the team arrives for our morning skate. They take the ice slow and quiet. What do you say, boys? I force a pep into my voice that I definitely don't feel. Last night was the first time I got more than a few hours of sleep all week. I'm not complaining. Far from it. I do it all over again. But it makes being a leader and setting the tone for this weekend's games a little tougher when I'm fighting back a yawn. We've got the team playlist going. A mix-up of songs submitted by each guy that Maverick puts together. We skate for 30 minutes on game days. No more and no less. It's a light skate. We go through a few drills just to get the nerves out. And in the case of some of the guys, work out the alcohol from the night before. Food and a nap, and they'll be good to go tonight. Rhett's dragging today. Not surprising, considering the breakup and the amount he drank last night. I'm glad he finally ended things with Carrie. Not liking your best friend's girlfriend is a real bummer. I tried to warm up to her. Really, I did. He gave so much, and it was never enough for her. If he called her twice a day, then why wasn't he calling three times? She hated that he played hockey because it meant he couldn't travel to see her on the weekends. But did she visit? Rarely. Maybe once a semester. It was hard to watch him with her these past four years we've been teammates and roommates. Not that my relationships have been the picture of excellence. 
Hopefully that's changing, though. Things with Reagan are going so well, I have to remind myself that I'm trying to break my cycle of jumping in and getting too serious too fast. From night one, I planned to take it slow. But there's just no doing that with Reagan. We're spending every night together. I think about her during the day, and it still doesn't feel like enough. I want to be with her all the time. I don't want to date anyone else, and I sure as hell don't want her to date anyone else. I should probably mention that. You can have a casual but exclusive thing, right? I shake my head. This is what I do. Give myself completely, jump in headfirst, and live in that new relationship until the little things I overlooked in the beginning start to pile up and I realize it'll never work. I want this time to be different. I need it to be. Reagan isn't like the girls I've dated in the past. She's my friend and neighbor. She's tight with Ginny. No matter what happens, she's going to be part of my life. It's almost like it automatically became serious when we crossed over that line. Or hurtled over it in our case. I care about what happens between us, of course, but also just about her. I should probably do the opposite of whatever I think is right. Put some space between us. Slam the damn brakes on. She's got a full day of classes, and I've got the game tonight and another tomorrow, so that shouldn't be too hard. Though I'm already itching to text her. Kiss her. How are you feeling? I ask Rhett as I fall in beside him. Like I put my liver through a shredder last night. He smells like the sweet liquor he drank. And I put a little more distance between us to breathe some non-alcoholic air. I'm sorry about Carrie. I don't think I said that last night. You definitely didn't. And no, you aren't. He cuts me a knowing look. Fine. I'm not sorry you broke up. But I am sorry that you're bummed. Bummed? He scoffs. We've been together since high school. I've known her since I was four years old. I'm not bummed. That makes it sound like I'm a child disappointed that there's no more ice cream. My world is rocked. I search his face for understanding. But you broke up with her. And I feel awful about it. Sick to my stomach. Then why did you do it? Honestly, I never thought he would. He's grumbled about her before, mentioning in passing that things seemed harder between them this past year, that they had less and less in common. But then he'd be on the phone with her 20 minutes later, and everything would be great again. Because I don't want to hate her or dread talking to her. She might not be the person for me, but I care about her. She saw something in me when no one else did. I was nothing before I met her. Miserable and lonely. I owe her a lot. Retz made no attempt to hide that he was a skinny, unpopular kid until he started dating Carrie. But I think he gives her too much credit. He's a great guy. I have no doubt he was also a great kid. And I know he was a great boyfriend. I saw it day after day. She liked him for who he is, instead of what he looked like. That doesn't make her a saint. Besides, he grew into his giant frame and big nose. He's a good-looking guy now, according to the girls that often hang around trying to get his attention. He'll have no problem finding someone new. I'm here for you. Whatever you need. You want to have people over tonight and get stupid? I secretly hope that isn't the answer because we need to be sharp for our games this weekend. One night of heavy drinking, he might be able to push through. But two? No, man. I'm good. It's just going to take time. The offer's good anytime. Whatever you need. 
Thanks. He nods his appreciation. What about you and Reagan? Did you lock that down yet? We get in the back of the line for passing drills. We're taking it slow. You heard her last night. We're not jumping into anything. Why not? Reagan's great. Because I want this to work. And in the past, when I've been too quick to label things, it's blown up in my face. But you're still doing it. Rhett gives his head a shake. You can call it or not call it. Whatever you want. But you're treating her like you do all your new girlfriends. I'm not, I say. Though I can't offer any evidence of that. I grind down on my molars. He's right. Of course he is. But I'm in uncharted waters. I want to make her my girlfriend. But it's only been a week. And that's exactly what the old me would have done. Acknowledging that is like admitting that I'm setting us up for failure. All I'm saying is, I've seen you date a lot of girls. So has Reagan. If you're not being clear about whatever it is you're doing, then you're both assuming something. Make sure that something is the same thing. Your advice is that I should clarify that we're not together? He chuckles. Or that you are. Ginny's at my apartment when I get back. Sitting on the couch, braiding her hair. She nods in greeting. What are you still doing here? I ask, tossing my bag in the general direction of my room and sitting next to her on the couch. Heath had to go straight to class after our skate, so she's not waiting for him. Ew, you're sweaty and you stink. I wrap an arm around her and pull her into my armpit. She squeals and punches my chest until I free her. Gross. I'm going to stink for class. Thanks a lot. Her mouth pulls down in disgust, but her eyes are twinkling with laughter. You are welcome. I get a whiff of myself as I bring my arm back down. And yeah, a shower is definitely in my future. Did you move in and I missed it? I elbow her. She's here most nights now. I really miss when you slept at your girlfriend's places instead of here. She teases me back. I'm glad things are good with you and Heath. I say honestly. Me too. And now you and Reagan. She trails off like she's waiting for me to give her more information. Yep. Things are good. That's all I get? I lean closer and whisper like I'm going to share some deep, dark secret. That's all there is to tell. She rolls her eyes and shoves at my shoulder. Mom texted me earlier. She said to tell you good luck, and sorry again that she's not coming to your games this weekend. I shrug. They haven't made it to any games since they announced their separation. Considering they barely missed a game before that, it's just one more reminder that our family is broken. It's fine. No, it isn't. This is your last year. There's a familiar ache in my chest at the mention of hockey ending, with an added gut-deep annoyance that my parents are missing it. There's only a month left of the regular season. Dad assured me he was coming for family night. I might be frustrated with our parents but I try not to let Ginny see just how much it bothers me. She doesn't need to add my issues to her own. Ginny nods. So weird. I went from sad to pissed at them. I want to shake them both. They're being ridiculous. They're figuring it out. We're all figuring it out. It's going to be all right. Ginny smiles and rests her head on my bicep. At least we have each other. I'm glad you're going to be here for med school. Me too. She sits up and pins her gaze on me. Things are good between you and Reagan? Really? 
Your favorite sister doesn't get any more details than that? You know, I bet if I told mom and dad that you were engaged... She trails off, smiling innocently as she looks down at her lap. You little shit, I say, and tickle her sides. She elbows me hard, and I back off. Don't you dare. If I weren't already sweaty, I would be thinking about their reaction. Especially mid-divorce. I got a shower. Boo! She huffs when I stand and head toward my room. Can I at least get a ride to campus? Leaving in five, I say over my shoulder. I get to class a few minutes ahead of schedule. Janine's already here. I think she must arrive at every class at least five minutes early. I drop my backpack onto the floor and slide into the chair next to her. How's it going? She has her iPad out and continues to stare at it for a few seconds before putting it down to answer me. Fine. I was just finishing the chapter on immunology. Isn't he covering that today in class? I snicker. Yes, I read ahead. It helps me retain the information in class better. She rolls her eyes. I'm sure your big head has no problem soaking it all in at once, but I have to work hard for this. What she doesn't say is she thinks I don't have to work hard, period. And that's just not true. I like to read it again after class. I prefer getting the professor's take first and then going over it a second or third time on my own. I work hard, too. Sorry, I didn't mean to imply you don't. I'm stressed about the scholarship and grades this semester. Your grades are fine. I know this because we're in almost all the same classes. I've rarely seen anything other than a shining A on her returned work. She rests her elbows on the desk and leans forward. So, you and Reagan? Right. I almost forgot that Janine was there for the whole fake fiancé thing. The thought of coming clean to her and Dr. Salco makes me shudder. How do you bring that up? We're together, yes. I could tell Janine the truth right now. But if she mentions it to Dr. Salco before I do, that'd be shitty. Not just together. Engaged. When did that happen? A little of that panic from the other night returns. I'm no good at acting the part without my leading woman. We've known each other a long time. Please. I've known Reagan a long time. You've known her what? Three years? Two, actually, since she and Dakota moved in next door. I nod. Something like that. Well, I'm surprised to see my childhood best friend engaged to my college rival. But I can see you two together. I struggle to form an appropriate response before she adds. It was good to see her. I've worried about her over the years. You've been worried about Reagan? My brows lift. Why? We lost touch when we got to college. That's probably my fault. I've been so focused on grades and making sure I got into med school. But she's doing well? I'm missing something. But I don't know what. And I can't really ask since I'm supposed to be her all-knowing fiancé. She is. Good. I really am glad. Lori was a mess for most of her life. She does seem to be doing better now. Not that I blame Reagan for not forgiving her. Will you tell Reagan that for me? I tried to tell her the other night, but she didn't seem like she wanted to hear it. Other people are starting to arrive to class, including the professor. So I nod and then close the conversation by turning in my desk to face the front. Of course. The music is loud, the crowd even louder, as we take the ice for warm-ups. 
I stand at the gate and give each of the guys a word or two of encouragement. I'm always the last one out. I see to them first. We're only effective if each one of us is at our best, and that's my job. I give them whatever they need to be their best. Some guys like Jordan get pumped with a tap of the helmet, where other guys like Liam require attaboys periodically throughout the game. Mav likes me to check him into the boards during warm-up. I know how to motivate each of my guys. It's why Coach made me captain. It's never been my dream to play hockey after college, so it's easier for me to look out for the team than guys like Heath or Mav who have already been signed. I love it, but it never felt like enough to base my entire life around. Here, with these guys, though, it's an experience that I know I'll hold on to forever. When I finally step onto the ice, I stretch and scan the crowd. I already know my parents aren't here, but I can't help but look for them anyway out of habit. They've had season tickets since my freshman year. Same spot halfway up the lower level, next to the bench. I wonder if they'll sit together when they come now, or maybe the seats will be a bargaining chip in their divorce. Season tickets for the China set or some other sentimental piece they acquired in the 23 years they were together. Since they split, I'm continually getting tripped up on things like that. As far as I know, there haven't been any real fights over furniture but watching them divide the items that make up every memory of my childhood has been awful. But tonight, since they're not coming, Ginny, Dakota, and Reagan are in their place. Reagan's wearing my hockey sweatshirt. It's huge on her, but she is working it. My clothes have never looked so good. I tip my head at her, and a shy smile pulls at her lips. Even sharing a smile in an arena packed with people feels intimate. It's been a great week, and it feels good to have her here. I like her. I want things to keep being great with her. Do I resist every natural instinct I have? Do everything different than I have in the past? I don't know what the secret trick is to lead our relationship as well as I lead the team but I'm determined to figure it out. Chapter 14 Reagan The planetary configuration makes it likely that you'll reap the benefits of your hard work. You'll be tempted to relax. Don't. Lean in. You can sleep when you're dead. Kidding. You'll also need lots of rest to push through, so getting plenty of sleep and eating healthy is more important than ever. Valley is winning by two at the start of the third period. Adam stands at the edge of the ice near the bench as the guys file in. He's a giant, broad shoulders accentuated by all the padding and the added inches to his already massive height from the skates. I like how tall and big he is. I feel safe with him. I didn't have many male role models in my life, or role models of any gender, actually. So maybe it's daddy issues that make something like safety seem sexy to me. I don't care. Knowing Adam could physically maim someone but is choosing to go into a career where he'll help people makes him incredibly attractive. Ginny leans over me to speak. Heath says they're going to the hideout after the game. Don't they always? Dakota asks. The answer to that is yes, or almost always yes. I can't tonight. I promised Matt I would go with him to their frat formal tomorrow. It's at a resort a couple of hours away, so we're leaving early in the morning. I huff a laugh. I love how you say I promised, like it's this casual friend thing. It's an overnight date? Jenny asks. No, Dakota shakes her head then says, yes, it's overnight, but it's not a date. She's wearing her high school prom dress. It's absolutely a date. I nudge Dakota and smirk at Ginny. Whatever. He's a guy I know from when I ran track. Nothing more. I'm wearing sneakers with the dress. Not a date. We're just friends. 
and I'm doing him a solid. When have you ever worn anything but sneakers on a date? I ask. Dakota rocks a pair of sneakers, but if I ever saw her in heels, I might die of shock. Once upon a time, I'm sure. Seriously, just friends. I've seen him in running shorts. Not interested. Well, I'm in for the hideout, I say and link my arm through Ginny's. I'm in for wherever Adam's going. I haven't seen him since very early this morning when he left me in his bed to go to their team skate, and I've missed him. My feelings are moving fast, despite us taking things slow. Everything about him makes me happy. It's hard to ease into something you've wanted for eternity. After a valley win, Dakota drops Ginny and me at the hideout. The guys are only a few minutes behind. Adam wraps me in his arms. Congratulations, I inhale, as I rest my head against his chest. He smells like soap, and my mind wanders to the shower we took together two nights ago. My nipples tighten, and my face flushes. Thank you, he pulls back, obviously not lost in dirty fantasies. I'm going to grab another pitcher. Someone claps him on the shoulder to offer their congratulations. He turns to say thanks, and I stand just behind him. Jenny's already planted herself on Heath's lap, and people are filling up the table we secured. Adam doesn't look like he's going to be able to escape conversation anytime soon, so I leave him to claim a chair. Rhett drops into the one next to me with a sigh. He places his phone on the table. Nice game tonight. Thanks. He pours a beer and then offers the pitcher to me. You want a beer? Sure. I move my glass closer and he fills it. I scan for Adam, but don't see him anymore. The empty seats around us are almost gone. Should we save Adam a place to sit? Nah, he shakes his head. When he's ready to sit, he'll make someone move. Right, I angle toward Rhett. Without Dakota or Ginny, I feel a little out of place, which I know is silly. These guys are my friends too, but I rarely interact with them one-on-one. -on -one. How are you doing? Okay, he shrugs and then runs a hand through his unruly blonde hair. Have you talked to Carrie? She texted, but I haven't responded. Adam told me to leave it alone. Can I see? He unlocks his phone and slides it to me. My heart breaks for him when I see his contact name for her, Care Bear, with a heart emoji. That will suck to change. The last text from her is a freaking novel, but basically says she wants to see him in person and talk. You don't want to see her? I'm not going to change my mind. Is extending this out and telling her that in person really going to help anything? I don't know. She seems to think so. I hand the phone back. Can you even take time off to go see her? No. She'd have to come here. I don't see the problem if she wants to make an effort. Let her. You think? I second guess myself. I'm probably not the one that should be giving advice on this. I've had exactly zero serious boyfriends. Really? His head cocks to the side, and his hair flops over one eye. He pushes it back. That surprises me. And now you're dating the guy that only knows Sirius? Weird how things work out. Speaking of Adam, he's back in view, standing at the opposite end of the table talking to some guys on the team. Why doesn't Adam think you should see her? Did he say? He never liked Carrie. They got off on the wrong foot freshman year. Why? I laugh. Oh, it was a mutual dislike. She hated that I was rooming with the campus playboy. Obviously, that was her word, not mine. He was bringing chicks back to the dorm, and he stops. Shit, I'm sorry. I'm well aware that Adams dated a lot of girls. It's fine. Anyway, I guess she was worried he was going to corrupt me or some shit. Adam and I are different. I love him, but he doesn't have to finish that sentence for me to understand. That's not who I am either. He's a good guy, Rhett reassures me. I know. I'm a little worried he's going to get sick of me in a few months, and I'll lose him and the rest of you. I laugh it off like I don't believe it, but it's a real concern. 
never gonna happen. He lifts his glass and waits for me to do the same, then clinks them together. You're stuck with us, Ray. As the night goes on, I chat with Rhett and Maverick and a bunch of other hockey guys. Ginny pries herself away from Heath to hang for a while, too. The only person I don't spend any time with is Adam. He bounces all around the bar. He catches my eye once or twice and smiles. But otherwise, we don't interact. I'm having a great time. But something feels off with him. Maybe he's already sick of me. I don't generally worry about coming off as clingy. But we do share all the same friends. So maybe this is him trying to make space? The later it gets, the more I worry that might be true. Where's Adam? Ginny asks as she and Heath get ready to leave the bar. I nod in his direction. Is everything okay? I haven't seen you two together all night. Ginny's brows pull together. Do I need to get Heath to kick Adam's ass? Hey now, let's not get your boyfriend into any fights tonight, Heath says from behind her. No need for violence. We're fine. At least I think we are. Do you want us to stick around for a little while longer? Jenny asks. Heath does not look stoked about that, but he nods his head in agreement. He'd jump through fire if Jenny asked. No, you don't need to stay, I say with a small laugh. I catch Adam's eye and he smiles. I'm making too big a deal of this. You two go home. I'm fine. We're good. Seriously, I add with a little pep to my tone. Jenny puts her arms around my neck and hugs me. Love you. I'll talk to you tomorrow. When they're gone, I weave through the still-packed bar to reach Adam. Hi, I step up beside him. Hey. His arm goes around my waist and then quickly drops. He stands tall. Having fun? Yeah, but I think I'm just about funned out. Heath and Jenny left, and I think I'm going to go too. Oh, really? Already? I can't read the expression on his face. Disappointment? But he's made no effort to talk to me tonight, so that can't be right. Yeah, I'm tired. It's been quite the week. Okay. Well, there's still a few guys out, so I'm going to stay and make sure everyone gets home before curfew. Right, of course. Do you want me to wait? No, go home and get some sleep. He pulls me to him for a quick embrace. I pause, expecting him to say he'll call or see me later. But he doesn't. Okay. Briefly, his lips brush against mine, and then someone calls his name. With an annoyed groan, he says, Later, beautiful. I take a step toward the door on wobbly legs. Later, Adam. But he's already dismissed me and is talking to someone else. I'm more embarrassed than angry. Embarrassed that I showed up and made myself so available. Embarrassed I assumed he wanted me there. I hurry out to the parking lot in time to catch up with Ginny and Heath. He's got her pinned against the passenger side door, kissing her so hard, I have tingles. I stare at the ground. Uh, hey, is it still okay if I catch a ride back to the apartment with you guys? Heath pulls away so reluctantly, I want to laugh. Ginny's head comes into view. She's flushed, and her hair is a little messy. Of course, we were waiting to see if you'd change your mind. We were? Heath asks. Ginny shakes her head at him and moves to open the car door, forcing Heath back. He tips his head toward the car in invitation, and I hop in. When we get back to the apartment complex, Ginny looks at me with sad eyes as Heath opens his apartment door. Call or text if you need anything. I'm fine. Everything is great. I'm just tired. I change clothes but don't go to sleep. Sitting in front of the TV, I hold my phone in my hand. I consider texting Adam, but I have no idea what to say. Being disappointed because we didn't hang out, after an entire week of hanging out almost nonstop, seems a little pathetic. It's really my expectations that need adjusting. We spent so much time together this week, and I thought it'd be the same tonight. No big deal. But my stomach cramps, and I feel gross all over because I know Adam. I've seen him with so many different girls that I know his playbook by heart.
Hanging out after a game at the hideout is definitely part of that playbook. So is leaving with said girl. I'm still awake when they get back. Our apartments aren't exactly great at blocking outside noise. Plus, let's be honest, I'm listening for him. I give it five minutes, and then I text him. Can I come over? While I wait for his response, I think back on the night. I can't shake this uneasy feeling that something isn't right, even though he hasn't really done anything wrong. His response chases away some of my doubts. Absolutely. The living room is dark as I enter. Adam's bedroom door is open. He's changed into sweatpants and is pulling a t-shirt over his head. Hey. He smiles when he sees me. I linger in the doorway as he gets ready for bed. It isn't until he's pulling back the sheets that he realizes I haven't moved. Everything okay? He asks. I'm not sure. I have this weird feeling like I did something wrong. What? His expression tells me I clearly caught him off guard. Why would you think that? It's just that I barely saw you all night. I was hoping we'd be able to hang out. I realize how ridiculous that sounds, but I know you. I know how you are when you're dating someone you really like. Reagan, he starts. I wave a hand in front of my face, embarrassment making me flustered. No, I think I'm going to go. This was a bad idea. It's been a long week and you have a game tomorrow. We can talk about this later. Everything is great. Night, Adam. He's in front of me, blocking my exit before I get to the front door. I don't think so, he says, and picks me up and carries me back to his bedroom. We'll talk about this now. Chapter 15 Adam Well, clearly, I'm an idiot. And Rhett was right. Not that I'll ever admit that to him. As I set Reagan down on my bed, she looks like she's either going to burst into tears or claw my eyes out. I'm hoping for the latter. I do not think I can survive a crying Reagan. I don't want this to be like every other time, I say. Does that mean you want to date other people? Her tone is fragile, but hard as nails. I don't know how she manages to be vulnerable and badass at the same time, but it's hot. And wait, what? Date other people? The fuck? No, it sure as shit doesn't mean that. Oh. Her lips form the sound and stay that way while she processes my words. She's probably thinking I'm a moron. Welcome to the club. I was working with a theory tonight that if I did the opposite of what I wanted, maybe I wouldn't screw this up. I need to take this slow. We've been hanging out every second, and it's been amazing. But I want to do things right this time. I should have just told you what was going on. But this is new territory for me. What I don't say is I really like her. A lot. This week has been awesome. When this started, I didn't give my past much thought. I was so excited to spend more time with her and explore this thing between us. But now that I'm starting to develop real feelings for her, I have to wonder if I'm leading us down a path that ends like all my other relationships. You ignored me because you like me? Yeah. Next I'll be kicking your shins and pulling your hair. I hang my head for a second, trying to get my shit together. Doubting myself is new. I don't like it. That last one doesn't sound so bad. I look up as she swallows, and her gaze drops to my chest. That look, the one of desire as she checks me out. I can work with that. In here, we make sense. This is uncomplicated. It's everywhere else that I haven't quite figured out. How do I date her without falling into the same old cycle? I climb onto the bed, forcing her onto her back. It doesn't, huh? Instead of answering, 
she pulls my face down to hers. It's a lot easier to shut down my brain when she's touching me. Her kisses are as hungry as mine. You'd think it would be easy to slow it down. I'm good at following rules, especially my own. But where Reagan is concerned, I'm turning into a loose cannon. I let go of my worry about going too fast. Slow is dumb. And well, slow. I undress her fast and drop my pants even faster. Damn, she's beautiful. Blonde hair tumbling past her shoulders. Brown eyes the color of cinnamon. And those dimples. They knock the air out of me when she flashes a big smile that makes them appear. And somehow, below the neck, it just gets better. Why would anyone want to deny themselves this? They wouldn't. I really am an idiot. I turn her onto all fours and latch onto her pussy from this angle until she writhes and moans while I rip open the condom packet and then cover myself. She hums impatiently. I need you. Yeah? I ask, nudging the head of my cock at her entrance. I get an unintelligible response as she pushes into me, driving me farther inside of her slick heat. Sliding my hand up her back to the nape of her neck, I bury myself as far as I can go, then still. Does it feel like I want to date other people? She shakes her head. I tangle my fingers in her hair and gently tug. Her graceful neck twists until she's looking me in the eye. No one else, baby. This pussy? I pull out slowly, letting her squeeze me all the way to the tip before driving back in. It's mine. Words aren't necessary or possible after that. I take her hard and fast, showing her the only way I know how that I want her. There's nothing I can say to make her believe doing things differently with her isn't purely selfish. She knows me and my patterns. I keep forgetting that. I settle for leaving us both panting and limp against the mattress. Actions speak louder than words, baby. I discard the condom and fall beside her. I hope you don't mind if I sleep over, because I don't think I can move. I wrap an arm around her waist and bring her closer. Nah, I don't mind at all. I'm in the kitchen the following morning, cooking oatmeal and downing a Gatorade. Reagan sitting on the countertop next to the stove, sipping coffee and watching me. Looking damn good doing it, too. She pulled on one of my t-shirts earlier, and it hangs off one shoulder and leaves her legs bare. My closet has become her new wardrobe, and I'm not mad about it. I drop a kiss on her lips. You want some? Uh, no. I'm good. Rhett stumbles out of his room in sweatpants, with his phone in hand. Morning, sunshine, I quip. His hair sticks up all over his head, and his eyes are barely open. Are you expecting a call from Carrie, or are you just used to carrying that thing with you at all times? He stares down at his hand, as if he's just realized he's holding it. Habit, I guess. He places it on the counter and takes his seat at one of the bar stools. What's for breakfast? Oatmeal, Reagan says, and makes a face over her mug. I was hoping your presence had inspired something more flavorful, he grimaces. I'm used to the guys ribbing me, and then eating it despite their complaints. I look to Reagan. You don't like oatmeal? I add blueberries and turn the heat down. It's so boring and healthy, she says. Right? Rhett chuckles. I didn't even think to ask her. Before Reagan, I always stayed at my girlfriend's places, instead of having them stay here. 
I'd get up, usually before them, and be gone before breakfast. I eat the same thing almost every day, but my boring oatmeal never came up. Do you want me to make you something else? I ask her. No, she shakes her head. Breakfast before ten isn't really my thing. Healthy or not. I'll take pancakes, Rhett calls. Someone say pancakes? Mav busts through the front door, Charlie at his heels. He's still in his boxers, no shirt, like it's perfectly normal to walk up a flight of stairs from his apartment to ours, half-dressed, searching for food. And with his dog, no less. Oatmeal's done. I grab a bowl for myself, and then let them have at it. I step between Reagan's legs. Are you sure you don't want a bite? I'm sure. I'll wait until an appropriate hour and grab a muffin and coffee somewhere. But I've got this perfectly cooked oatmeal. I spoon some up and wave it in front of her face. Her lips draw into a flat line, and her head shakes side to side. Come on, open up. You'll like it. It's good for you. She smiles, but doesn't open. Fine. I eat it, and then press my mouth to hers. No fair. She opens, and I sweep my tongue inside. What was meant to be a quick, teasing kiss turns into a mini makeout session. Maybe I do like oatmeal. When I step back, I realize the guys are watching us. And at some point, Ginny and Heath joined. Good morning, I say to the room. It certainly is, Mav smirks. Breakfast and a show. Reagan hops down from the counter. I've got to get going. We have rehearsal this afternoon. I abandon my oatmeal and follow her into my room. She strips out of my shirt and starts to pull on her own clothes to which I greatly detract progress by running my hands along her bare skin and kissing her stomach and then her neck. Are you coming to the game this afternoon? I ask as I sit on the bed and use her hips to pull her closer to me. Do you want me to? Yeah, of course. But you said you had rehearsal. I'll be done in time. But you're sure... You want to take things slow, and... I suck at slow. No more trying to go against the grain. Everything is different because it's us. Come to the game. Okay. Her lips pull into a smile. And us? We're what? Dating? Sleeping together? We're... Whatever, I say. Exclusively. Exclusively whatever. Got it. Let's not label it. That part seems to get me in trouble. I like you. Her light laughter does funny things to my chest. Some might say I'm your girlfriend, she quips. Totally different thing, I assure her with a grin. Good. I've got money on you being single until summer. My mouth falls open. Gotcha. Let me walk you home, I say as she heads to leave. I live 15 feet away. I'll manage. Besides, that sounds like something a boyfriend would do. So it does. She brushes her mouth against mine so quickly I almost miss it. And then she's gone. When I go back out to the living room, it's just Rhett and Mav. I drop into a chair, Mavericks grinning at me like a fool. Something to say? I ask. So many things. I'm trying to decide where to start. Get it all out. I raise my arms to my side. I can take whatever these guys can dish. What are your intentions? Excuse me? A chuckle escapes. I like Reagan. Always have. 
And let's face it, buddy, your track record is shit. Mav crosses his arms over his chest. Charlie whines. Thanks for the vote of confidence. I flip him off. What are your intentions? Rhett asks. You too? Seriously? He shrugs. I was hanging with her last night. She likes you a lot. I can tell. I like her too. Have you made it official? Mav asks. His gaze darts to Rhett and then back to me. He knows about the bet, Rhett tells him. You don't need to dance around it. How? Mav wails. You idiots weren't exactly quiet about it, I say. The bet's off then. You've got a new girlfriend. Mav claps his hands and looks to Rhett. Who won? Rhett pulls out his phone. It's of no surprise to me that my best buddy is the one who's running the betting circle around my relationship status. He's the most competitive guy I know. Looks like... You're the closest, Mav. He shoots up off the couch and starts dancing around the living room. He's bumping into shit and knocking things off the coffee table. Sit down. No one won. She's not my girlfriend. But... Mav looks so crestfallen. What is going on? Ginny comes out of Heath's room. He's right behind her. Your dipshit brother is still single. Mav sits back down on the couch with a frown. That's it? Ginny places her hands on her hips. I thought something awesome happened. I just smile as the guys grumble about the bed. Maybe she's not my girlfriend, but something awesome has definitely happened. Chapter 16 Reagan You can't always trust that people are who they say they are. Wait, and let them show you their true colors. Monday morning, I ride to campus with Adam. He's got classes an hour earlier than I do, but the extra 15 minutes riding over and holding his hand as we walk toward his building make it totally worth it. Thanks for walking with me, he says, swinging our joined hands. Anytime. What are you going to do for the next hour? I'm not sure. Maybe go to the library and study? He stares at me with narrowed eyes. Really? Okay, fine. I'm going straight to University Hall for coffee, and then I'll probably watch videos and look at TikTok until class time. I love his deep laughter, and love it even more when I'm the one to bring it out of him. Hang later tonight? He asks. Yeah, I nod. And he pulls me into him and wraps his arms around me. I'll text you after your rehearsal. He keeps holding on to me, leaning side to side, this was a good plan, up until I realized I have to leave you for class. I squeeze his middle to show him I don't want to go either. Okay, on three, he says. One, two. Before he says three, I push at his chest. Get out of here, Dr. Scott. He scoops me up and heads toward the building. Maybe I'll just take you with me. Oh, no, put me down. I need coffee. Inside, he finally sets me on the ground, but he doesn't make any more progress on getting to class. His mouth slants over mine. I could kiss him like this for hours. But one of us needs to make sure he makes it to class. I really didn't expect that person to be me. You need to go learn things, and I need caffeine. Later, stud. I'm grinning like a fool as he reluctantly heads off to class. I watch him until he starts into the room. He waves and winks, then disappears. I'm lost in my own little atom bubble when I hear someone call my name. She says it twice, before my brain snaps out of it. I peel my gaze from the doorway Adam went through to Janine, walking in my direction. Her gait slows the closer she gets. Hey, Janine. 
Haven't seen you in years and now twice in a month. I ignore the subtle jab. I was just walking with Adam to class. She adjusts her backpack on her shoulder. Do you have class now? No. So you're free? Well, crap. I walked right into that. Oh, I'm actually on my way to University Hall. I'll walk with you. Okay. We're quiet as we exit the building and start down the sidewalk. A memory of the two of us walking around campus our junior year of high school flashes through my mind. Janine looks just the same. She's someone who knew early on exactly who she was. It takes a lot of confidence to be who you are, unwavering and steadfast. I always admired that about her. It's probably why I was drawn to her as a kid. I had no idea who I was or what I wanted to be. Some days I'm still not sure I have it figured out. She heads straight for the cafe when we enter University Hall. I assume you still live on coffee? It's unnerving being around Janine again. Someone who knows me so well, every part. We place our orders at the coffee counter. Awkward silence hangs between us. When the barista rings us up, I hand my card over quickly. I've got it, I say. I owe her too much as it is. Thanks. With our drinks, we meander to a small table in the center of the hall. You look good. Happy, she says after we're seated. I can't believe you're with Adam. Makes sense, though. He's totally your type. I am happy. I fidget with the lid of my coffee. How are you? I'm good. And Sean? Really good. He switched his major, just as you predicted. Yeah? I ask. What did he settle on? Law school. I knew it. I smile big, forgetting myself. She laughs softly. Yeah, you did. The day he told me, I thought of you. I nod and take a sip of my coffee. Her somber tone smacks me back to reality. We are not two friends catching up. Not anymore. I've thought about you often, she continues. Honest, open Janine. My heart thumps too fast in my chest. Me too, I admit, then plaster a smile on my face. But it sounds like things have been great for you. Graduating early, med school, this big scholarship. I'm really happy for you. I'm working on an excuse to get me out of here when she goes for the kill. I saw Lori last weekend when I went to my parents for Sunday dinner. Oh, yeah? I look anywhere but at her. She's doing really great, Reagan. The old house is cleaned up, and she's working at the elementary school as an aide. They let her work with children? Someone should be fired for that hire. Janine doesn't react like someone else might to my outburst. She smiles sadly. My mom got her the job. But she's working hard. Whatever, good for her. Is that what you want me to say? I just thought you should know. She's still your mom, Ray. Yeah, well, she didn't act much like one for the first 18 years of my life, so I'm sorry if I'm not eager to hear how great she's doing now. Those kids at the school probably see more of her in a week than I did for months at a time when I was their age. The more I talk, the angrier I get. She's doing great now, really now that I'm capable of taking care of myself, now that I don't need her. I'm sorry, I can't imagine how you feel. You're right, you can't. Janine with her perfect family, a mom who dotes on her, and a dad who would go to the ends of the earth for her. She asked how to get in touch with you, said the number she has for you doesn't work, and she wasn't sure your email was still the same. Are you kidding me? I roll my eyes. Janine's lips flatten. If I wanted to talk to her, I would have responded to one of the many emails she sent over the years. So you are getting them. What is this? An interrogation? No, of course not. 
Janine rests her palms on the table. This isn't going like I imagined. You have every right to your feelings. But if there was even a chance you wanted to know how she was, I thought I should tell you. Well, you've told me. I push back in my chair. See you around. I rush out of University Hall, holding back angry tears. Outside, I hang a right, then slump against the brick building and take deep pulls of the cold air. Janine finds me. I should have expected her to follow me. She left me alone for three years, and that's longer than I expected. She has a good heart, wants everyone to be happy. She still believes that everyone can have what she does, even after watching me grow up with a mom who didn't give a shit. Go away, Janine. There's nothing you can say to fix this. She shakes her head slowly. There's something else. She pauses and wets her lips, tugs her hat down over her ears. I told her that you were engaged. What? A shiver of dread runs up my spine. I wanted her to know how well you're doing. She doesn't deserve to know anything about me. You had no right. I know. I'm sorry. Does Adam know about any of this? No. Her brows pull together in confusion. Why? It's none of his business or yours. I'm so sorry, Reagan. I know that it's not the same, but I was mad at her all these years, too. I saw what she did to you. And I guess I wanted her to know that despite all of that, you had still found a way to make a great life. You didn't need her. I may not have needed her, but how much easier might my life have been? I may not have needed her, but I wanted her. Janine's family always made me feel welcome, but they weren't mine. What can I do? Janine asks. She reaches out and squeezes my arm. You can tell Lori to stay out of my life. I swallow hard and step away from her. And you can do the same. She doesn't follow me this time. I skip my next class and wait for Adam in the same spot I left him. When he sees me, he grins. And those long legs erase the space between us. Have you been waiting here the whole time? He takes me in his arms and my heart rate finally starts to even out. I breathe him in and relax against his chest. No, I grabbed coffee first. I was thinking maybe we could play hooky. I'm free until one. I can't miss my lab. What did you have in mind? I've never been to this place, Adam says as we walk into the arcade. A blind date brought me here once, I admit. He cocks a brow. A date? Yeah, the location was the best part of the date. I always wanted to come back with someone I actually liked. I feed dollar bills into the machine. As the coins clatter into the dispenser, Adam kisses me. The place is quiet. I'm surprised they were even open this early, but a few groups of young kids and families are already milling about. Gotta keep it G-rated in here. There are small, innocent eyes. He laughs against my mouth. What about PG? I smack him playfully on the chest. What? Their parents are here. I grab our coins and duck under his arm. Come on, stud. Adam and I hit skee ball first, then table hockey. He takes it easy on me, but still wins. I edge out victorious at a basketball shooting game and dance dance revolution. It's been great, but I still can't completely shake the awful interaction with Janine. I'm frustrated with her but I hate that I was so mean to her. We were friends for a long time. Good friends. Let's go in the photo booth, he suggests, as we're making a second round looking for games to spend our last coins on. It's a total scam, five dollars for a strip of tiny, blurry photos. He inserts money in the slot and pulls me inside. The bench is cold and barely big enough for the two of us. We watch the screen for the countdown. Are we going serious or funny, I ask. Serious on the first one, funny on the second. What about the others, I ask as the countdown ends. We press our faces together and smile. After the flash, I stick my tongue out at the camera and Adam gives me bunny ears. On the next one, 
he kisses me. And then I lose track of the flashes. His tongue invades my mouth, and I cling to him desperately, filling the ache, erasing the worry. I don't need Lori or Janine. I have Dakota, Ginny, Adam, and our friends. They're enough. Chapter 17 Adam Reagan and I get doughy pizza from the snack bar and take it to one of the kid-sized tables. My legs do not fit underneath, so I'm sitting sideways. This was fun, I say. It was. Thank you. Anytime. I've been waiting for her to tell me what spurred her sudden desire to skip class and come to the arcade, but it looks like I'm going to have to pry for information. Want to tell me what happened while I was at class this morning? She wipes her hands on a napkin and takes a drink before answering. Caught on to that, huh? Hey, I'm not complaining. Pumped to spend more time with you. I ran into Janine. Oh. I still don't know exactly what the story is there. When I passed on Janine's message last week that Lori was doing well, Reagan shut down and changed the subject. Whoever Lori is, she isn't a popular topic. She still thinks we're engaged. Yeah, I've been meaning to tell Dr. Salko myself. Janine will find out eventually. I am sorry again for getting so carried away and pulling you into the mess to start with. Nah, it's fine. I think that's the end of the conversation, and I'm prepared to let it go for now. But Reagan starts talking. Janine and I have known each other our entire lives. Our moms were friends as kids and stayed close until I was two or three. It's hard for me to picture... They're so different. She says different like it's a bad word, which has me swallowing and worrying about what that means. When I was in high school, I actually lived with Janine's family for almost two years. You did? Why? Where was your family? Reagan shrugs. My mom was in Vegas, mostly. She traveled there for work almost every week usually day trips so she'd be home by bedtime. But then day trips turned to overnight trips because she'd stay at the casinos too long and miss her flight. That turned to her booking extra days so she could sightsee. Reagan rolls her eyes. I doubt she ever left the casino floor. After a while, she didn't even make excuses. I stopped asking when she was coming home, and I guess that gave her the freedom not to care. She just left you to fend for yourself? How old were you? Reagan nods. Her face is red, and I can't tell if she's on the verge of tears or ready to throw something. Nine or ten, I guess. The first time she didn't come home for an entire weekend. It wasn't just that she was absent. I was pretty self-sufficient, even at an early age. But every year, things seemed to get worse. She gambled away all of her savings, then sold everything we had, which I guess was good because we eventually lost everything else. She got in so deep. I only had a roof over my head because my great aunt left the house in my name. That's fucked up. Sometimes things were great. If she won, we'd splurge and celebrate, make plans for awesome vacations. But of course, before we ever took any, she'd lose it again. Reagan shrugs. Eventually, I realized it was going to be on me, and I found creative ways to pay the utilities and basic needs. Recycling cans, doing odd jobs, babysitting. I even did some modeling. I get to my feet and move to her side of the table. I'm so sorry. I cradle her against my chest. I wanted to tell you the other night when you mentioned her, but it's so embarrassing. Even now, 
You didn't do anything wrong. It isn't your fault. I know. Do you? I brush her hair away from her face and stroke her cheek. Yeah, but I'm still ashamed. It was so humiliating. What about your dad? Other family? I never knew him. He was gone long before I was born, and I was always too scared to press her for details. She got pissed when I asked about him, and she was home so little that I didn't want to give her any reason to leave. And as for other family, what was I going to say? I didn't want to tattle on my own mom. I missed her. I just wanted her to be home. I didn't want anyone else to take me. Fuck. My chest splits wide open. I'm so sorry, baby. Janine says she's doing better now. She even has a job at my old elementary school. Reagan snorts. Ironic, huh? When's the last time you talked to her? She showed up at my high school graduation, asking for money. I guess she knew that I'd have extra cash coming in from relatives. Damn, that's cold. I stroke her arm as she continues. Janine and I moved to Valley the next week, and I haven't been back. I can't forgive her. You don't have to, I assure her. I don't know if that's the right thing to say, but it seems to calm her. Thank you for letting me steal you away for a few hours. I needed this. It doesn't have to end. Come on, let's go back to my place. What about your lab? I'll make it up. No, I can't let you do that, Reagan straightens. My shitty childhood isn't taking any more from me, and it definitely isn't touching you. I want to be good for you. Your dedication to school is something I've always found really attractive. It wasn't my stellar personality or flowing locks, I ask, and shake my head to make my hair fall in my face. I like those things too, she says, and slips her fingers through my hair. Feels good. Are you okay? Really? Yeah, I'm fine. Seeing Janine brought it all up again. Is that why you've avoided her? A small smile graces her lips. First genuine one I've seen since this morning. How do you know I've avoided her? You said you haven't seen her in years. Valley Campus isn't that big, baby. Over the next two weeks, Reagan and I spend more time together than apart. I'm humming to myself in the locker room, looking forward to seeing her again just as soon as I get out of here. She should be finishing with rehearsal, and I'll have her to myself all night. Heath corners me before I can leave. We need to talk, he says, looking nervous. Nervous can only mean one thing. My heart skips several beats, and I see red. What did you do to my sister? He flips me off. Fuck you. This isn't about Ginny. Oh, my shoulders relax. What's up? Keith laughs at me. You're ridiculous. Noted. I wave my hand for him to continue. It's Rhett. I'm worried about him. I glance over to where he's sitting on the bench, leaning forward and running a towel over his sweaty hair. Seems fine to me. Yeah, Will, no offense, man, but you're in a love bubble right now, so your judgment is shit. Love bubble? You're completely engrossed in Reagan and this thing between you two, and you can't see anything else. I see you right now wasting my time time I could be with Reagan. I leave that part out so I don't add fuel to this love bubble theory. Let's go out tonight. Fine, I relent, mostly to shut him up so I can be on my way. 
text me the details, and Reagan and I will meet you guys there. He grabs my elbow to keep me from leaving. No girls, just the guys. For serious? Chuckling, he nods. For serious. Shouldn't be hard to get away since you're not in a love bubble. What about your love bubble? Oh, I'm still in one. But after a while, you start to remember that other people exist. Whatever. Text me the details. I shrug out of his grasp and head for the door. Be in the living room, ready to go in an hour, he calls after me. Bregan is cool about it when I stop by and tell her my plans for the night. It might help that I eat her sweet pussy until she screams my name and then drop the news that I have to go out with the guys. She's picking up her discarded clothes around the room while I resist moving from the bed. I was hoping you were going to throw a fit and demand I stay here, I say, and pull her down onto the bed with me. Her oh-so-glorious naked body. No, it's good. I've been neglecting my school stuff and Dakota. She lies on top of me, her tits pressed against my chest and my dick smashed between us. Love bubble, I mutter. What did you say? Love bubble? Heath told me I was in a love bubble. Her mouth drops to mine, and she sucks on my bottom lip. More like a sex bubble. I flip us so I'm on top. It's so much more than sex with Reagan. She's a hunger I can't abate. I tease her, rubbing my cock against her clit. You're going to be late. She taunts as her eyes flutter closed and her hands come up to tweak her nipples. I can be fast. I say like I'm not about to explode all over her stomach just watching her touch herself. She grabs a condom from her dresser. While she rips the foil open, she takes my dick into her mouth and sucks. Not going to need the condom if you keep doing that. A tingle runs up my spine as her sweet mouth slides down to the base one more time. Fuck me. Baby, I groan. She keeps going. Obviously, she thinks I'm joking about how close I am. Reagan, baby, I'm not kidding. She stops long enough to look me dead in the eyes and says, I know. Those two words alone are almost my undoing. I run a hand through her hair, guiding her gently down the length of my cock at a faster pace. I give her one last warning, but she keeps right on swallowing my dick as I come down her throat. Holy. I can't even finish the sentence. There are no words. Reagan smiles proudly as she wipes her mouth. I've never done that before. Well, I sure as fuck hope you want to do it again sometime. I'm a little lightheaded as I sit back, trying to catch my breath. She hums. Definitely. But now you have to get out of my bed. Kicking me out? Only for a few hours. She gets up and pulls on a shirt and panties. Will I see you later? I don't know. It'll probably be late when we get home. Rarely does a guy's night end early. And if Rhett really is having a hard time, we'll go harder to try to cheer him up. Booze is the cure for heartbreak. I hope he's okay. He'll be fine. He's better off. She starts gathering her school stuff up to study, so I guess it's time for me to leave. Maybe I am in a love bubble, because I don't want to go anywhere. I get dressed and send a text to Heath to let him know I'm running five minutes late. That gives me four more minutes to kiss Reagan. Have fun. She squirms out of my hold when Heath and Mav get tired of waiting and bust into the apartment.
They're calling my name and threatening to come in and get me. They would, too. Reagan stands on her toes to kiss me once more and then opens her bedroom door. Try to stay out of trouble. I'll be good, I wink. At least until I see her later. Instead of going to our usual spot, the hideout, we venture to the prickly pear. It's a quieter bar a little farther away from campus. We get a pitcher of beer, and Rhett orders a round of shots. Captain Morgan, his favorite. Are the girls coming? Rhett asks. Nope, Heath says. Just us tonight. Ginny and Reagan aren't coming? Rhett stares at me with a confused expression as the server brings our liquor. What's the occasion? No occasion. Just having a guy's night for a change. We each grab a shot glass. Is this because of Carrie? He holds his shot near his lips. Am I on a fucking pity hang? Take your damn shot. No, it's not a pity hang. I give him my most convincing face. Fuck. He figured that out way too fast. He tosses his drink back, and the rest of us do the same. I'm gonna cue up some good tunes. Maverick pushes back his chair. Any requests? Rhett and I shake our heads. I better supervise so he doesn't pick 30 songs by Christina Aguilera and get us kicked out like that time last year. Heath stands to follow him. Good call. I chuckle and tip my beer to him in appreciation. It's just Rhett and me, and I study him a little closer. Aside from those first few days where he drank too much, I haven't really noticed any major differences in him since he broke up with Carrie. But I have been a little preoccupied. Have you talked to her? I ask. No reason to beat around the bush. Nope. He takes a long swig of beer, draining his glass. He pours another as I stare down into my full drink. Do you want to talk to her? You don't have to do this, he says as he leans back in his chair. Do what? Pretend to care about Carrie. I know you're not her biggest fan. Doesn't matter what I think. So, do you? Of course I do. I want to know that she's okay. I take a drink, choosing my words carefully. Then you should call her. Seriously? I shrug. What the fuck do I know about lasting relationships? I don't think she's the right girl for you. But if she is, then I'll gladly shut up and be happy for you. Wow. Reagan's good, he says as Heath and Maverick return. Sex talk. Finally. Maverick looks between us. Reagan's good in bed, huh? He nods. That doesn't surprise me. Her body is killer. And that mouth. Heath and Red are trying hard not to laugh. If you want to keep breathing, I suggest you stop talking. I glower at Maverick. Heath finally stops fighting it and chuckles quietly. Kind of possessive. Almost like a boyfriend. She's not my girlfriend, they say in unison. We know. You mention it daily. I do not. I bite back a grin. Are you two just hooking up, or is it leading somewhere? Heath asks. I swear he's the last person I would have imagined asking me that before he started dating my sister. He was the king of casual hookups. I can't come up with an answer easily, so I shrug. Is this your first fuck buddy? Maverick asks. Because I don't think you're doing it right. He's right, Heath adds. The whole point of not making a girl your girlfriend is to avoid sleepovers and spending time together that's not naked. 
You and Reagan are together all the time. You even let her sleep at our place. So? She's your girlfriend, man. Heath waves his arms around. He's a pretty chill dude, so I know he's frustrated with me when he starts getting loud and talking with his hands. What does it matter? I lean forward. Bet aside. We're having fun. I like her. She likes me. I'm trying really hard not to fuck this up. You're trying so hard not to screw up that you can't even see how badly you're screwing this up, Heath says. What? I look around the table for help. Reagan and I are solid, which is exactly what I tell them. They snicker and hang their heads. What am I missing? Heath doesn't look like he wants to share, so I look to Red. Well? Hold that thought. We need another round of shots. Maverick scoots his chair back, the wood screeching along the floor. He hustles back a minute later with four shots of what looks like Jägermeister. Fuck. It's going to be a long night at this pace. What I miss? He asks as he hands them out. I was about to drop some enlightenment, Rhett grins. Cheers to that, Heath says and raises his glass. After we take the shot, Rhett starts in. It's like pulling the goalie late in the game so you can have an extra skater on the ice. I think. Hard. I've got nothing. How does this relate to me? Yeah, I'm lost too, Mav says. And I know the punchline. Rhett fidgets with his glass. Forget it. The point is, you're doing everything you can to make this time different. But in doing so, you're denying Reagan exactly what she wants. No, I refute it. She's happy. We're good. Dude, Mav starts. Reagan has been into you for a long time. She's seen you with girlfriends. And she's wished that girl was her. He places his hands over his heart and bats his lashes at me. Wait, I think I finally figured out where you were going with that. Reagan's the goalie in that scenario, right? No, Rhett says, sounding annoyed. Scott's the goalie? Mav tries again. Rhett groans. No. No one is the goalie. I was trying to make a point that he switched things up late in the game. I so didn't get that, Heath says. They're bickering back and forth over metaphors, but my stomach suddenly feels like I swallowed a bowling ball. Rhett pins his gaze on me. If you'd been secretly pining after someone for years and finally got your chance, would you want that person to switch things up? Or be relegated to some weird non-relationship thing different from everything you knew about how they acted in the past? No, I guess not. I think back to all of our conversations about it. She hasn't said anything. In fact, she's been great about all of this. She's cool with us not labeling it. Yeah, but what could she say? I'm sure you gave her the same speech you gave me, Rhett says and waits for my answer. I don't, though, because the answer sucks. You told her that you wanted to do things different, that she was different or some combination or variation of that, he nods his head. That right? Yeah, I managed to admit and shift in my chair. All she wants is to be your girlfriend, the kind of girlfriend she's seen you have in the past. She doesn't give a fuck about all your perfectly logical reasons why she shouldn't be. A quick glance around the table tells me they're all in agreement. I'm going to use the bathroom. 
I stand. Rhett, grab us another round of captain. Me? Why? I got the first round. Because you're about to be 50 bucks richer. All three of them study me for a few seconds before they realize what I mean. What? But you... Mav flounders for words, looking like I kicked his dog. No way, he whines. That's it? But what about all of your really good reasons for not jumping into a new relationship? He curses under his breath. If I'd known you were going to listen to us, I would have suggested Guy's Night last week. Aw, oh, cheer up, Mav, I tell him. You can help me figure out how I'm going to ask her to be my girlfriend tomorrow. Something big and bold, he grins. The bolder, the better. Wait, why tomorrow? Heath asks. She's with the girls. I'm hanging with you guys. I leave out the part about tonight's purpose being cheering up Rhett and making sure he's doing okay. I still don't know if he's all right, so leaving feels wrong. Nah, let's do this thing tonight, Rhett finishes his beer and nods. Really? Yeah. Look, I know this was some sort of intervention to help me get over Carrie. No, we... Heath starts, but Red holds up a hand. I've been moping around and sucking at practice. I get it. But I made a decision tonight. I'm going to call her, get closure, and then move on. You decided that in the 30 minutes we've been out? Damn, we're good, Maverick says. I decided the second I realized you three were trying to help me. Like you fools have your shit together. So yeah, please, let's do this thing tonight. I think seeing you ask Reagan to be your girlfriend might be the cure to my shitty month. All right then. Make those shots doubles. Chapter 18 Reagan the element of surprise is a great way to make an impression. Today, you'll have the opportunity to surprise someone. Leave them wondering what you'll do next. Also, pack clean undies. You never know. My face is tingling. Dakota brings her hands up to her face but doesn't touch it. That means it's working, I say, wiggling my nose. It does tingle, but it also itches. These are hilarious. Ginny hands me her phone. Take a picture so I can send it to Heath. Yeah, I'm sure a creepy looking tiger face mask will really turn him on. Dakota snorts as I snap a picture of Ginny and hand her phone back. You'd be surprised what turns Heath on. Dakota and I both burst into laughter. No, honey, we wouldn't be surprised at all. Dakota tells her. He says, "Rar." Ginny tells us, staring down at her phone. Reagan, you should send Adam a picture. You think he's into llamas? I ask, and pose with my hands under my face. She snaps a picture. Absolutely do not send that to him. We are not at that stage. The tingling gets worse as my face flames with embarrassment at just the idea of him seeing me like this. Promise me? Okay, okay. She puts her phone down but you look adorable. What stage are you at? Dakota asks. It's hard to take you serious with that on your face. I deflect. Her mask is a narwhal and makes her face almost entirely blue. My friends, or the tiger and narwhal they've become, stare back at me. They don't look like they're going to let this go. We're at the everything is great and everyone else should mind their own business stage, I say. She has no idea, Dakota says to Ginny. My brother is an idiot. Ginny's shoulders sag and she sticks out her bottom lip. I'm sorry. There is nothing to apologize for. Everything is great, I smile. Though I'm not sure how effective it is through this mask. 
I get up and go to the kitchen to grab another bottle of wine. The truth is, everything is great. Do I have an uneasy feeling wondering if Adam is as into me as I am him? Yes. Do I think I'd have this same uneasy feeling regardless of what label we slapped on this thing between Adam and me? Also, yes. I've been crazy about him for years. It makes sense that I'd fall harder faster. There's a knock at the door, and all three of us look at it, but don't move. Go away. We're too poor to buy anything, and we've already found Jesus, Dakota yells. Ginny giggles. What if it's Girl Scouts selling cookies or hot firefighters checking smoke alarms? If you have cookies, knock three times, Dakota yells again. Oh, what about the firefighters? Ginny asks. My stepdad is a firefighter. Kind of ruins the fantasy for me. The knock comes again. Only once must not be Girl Scouts, Dakota shrugs, and I sit back on the floor where we've got a whole home spa thing going on. Wine, nail polish, face masks, and magazines. Ginny gets to her feet. The suspense is killing me. Can you hand me the white polish? I ask Dakota, while Ginny goes to see who it is. We see our fair share of solicitors here, and the only person I really want to be on the other side of the door is out with the guys tonight. Uh, Reagan? Ginny calls from the door. I think you'll want to see this. Who is it? I ask. Firefighters? She doesn't answer, just smiles and opens the door wide. Adam steps through. I gape at him. He's so handsome. He still takes my breath away sometimes. What are you doing back so early? I can barely pull my eyes away from him, but I do note that Heath... Red and Maverick file in behind him. Go away, you're supposed to be at guy's night, Dakota says from behind me. I never get these two to myself anymore. What exactly are you supposed to be, Coda? Maverick asks her. My hands go to my face. I'm a narwhal, Ginny's a tiger, and Reagan's a llama, duh, my roommate tells him. Oh shit, I'm a llama. I'm a llama standing in front of my incredibly sexy crush. A freaking llama. I duck my head and use my hand as a shield. We're having a spa night. You guys aren't supposed to be here. I know, but I needed to see you. Adam steps forward and leans down to see my face. Uh-huh. Can llamas blush? I motion toward the bathroom. I just need a few minutes. Don't go. He grabs my hand. This can't wait. Slowly, this llama faces her dream man. Okay. Reagan, I... Adam's brow furrows. I've been thinking. He stops again and looks around. I'm no good at speeches, so I wrote it down. Maverick steps forward and hands him a stack of poster boards. The first one says my name. Maverick plays a song from his phone. He even holds it over his head and sways in time with the music. Adam smiles shyly as he drops the first poster board. The next one reads, The past few weeks have been amazing. I smile. They really have. The guys must know what the poster boards say, which makes sense since they came over together. But they're watching me instead of Adam, and I'm blushing hard. The next board falls. You are the coolest girl I've ever known. My stomach flutters as he keeps going. You're smart, talented, kind, and gorgeous. Somewhere behind me, Ginny says, Aw, your butt's nice too. Mav chuckles and whispers, That one was my idea. Thanks, Mav, I say. I don't know how I got so lucky. Adam drops the board, and the last one reads, Will you be my girlfriend, Reagan? I step closer and whisper, but what about everything? Maybe we should give them some privacy, Rhett says. But, Mav starts, it's just about to get good. Come on. Rhett puts an arm around Mav's neck and guides him back out the door. Christina Aguilera's voice gets quieter as they cross the breezeway into their apartment. Ginny squeezes my arm as she and Heath follow. Pretend I'm not here, 
Dakota says, just grabbing more wine and going to my room, where I have knives, just FYI. Adam leaves the posters on the floor and shoves both hands in his pockets. So, what do you say? Wanna be my girlfriend? Me or the llama? I joke. I need a minute to process this. Come with me. I need to take this thing off, I say as I pull him toward the bathroom. While I peel off the mask, Adam leans against the doorframe. I feel his gaze on me, but I wait until I've rinsed my face and dabbed it dry before I speak. That was probably the nicest thing anyone's ever done for me. But how come you changed your mind? Talking to the guys tonight, I realized that I'd only taken what I wanted and needed into consideration. I never once asked how you felt about it. I want you. The rest isn't all that important. Then maybe it is all about me. I want you to be mine in every way. I want to do boyfriend things for you. Take you on dates, walk you home, make you oatmeal in the mornings. I laugh at his oatmeal remark. I might even eat it. That's how crazy I am about him. And all your worries? Maybe I am in a love bubble, but I don't have those worries when I'm with you. It's only when I'm by myself and second-guessing everything. What you just described is a lust bubble, and your dick is doing all the thinking for you when I'm around. Maybe, he chuckles and places his hands on my hips. Me and my dick like you a lot. I like you too. I settle between his legs, leaning against his chest. But you won't be my girlfriend. Remember how I said I wanted to be good for you? I glance up, and his hazel eyes narrow playfully. Not being my girlfriend is good for me. According to the guy I talked to before he fell into the love bubble, yeah. I want more than anything to be his girlfriend. But maybe he's right. And even if he isn't, I don't need him to make it official. I feel it when I'm with him. This is enough for now. Using my own words against me, Adam rests his forehead against mine. Your face feels really soft. It's from the mask. You were a cute llama. Can we never speak of that again? A slow smile spreads across his face. Got any other animals? Maybe something badass like a grizzly bear or a lion. I have a unicorn or a shark. He rubs his palms together. Let's go with shark. You're going to wear a face mask? Will it help me convince you to be my girlfriend? My heart squeezes. No, probably not. But it'll be funny. What exactly am I looking at here? Dakota asks the next morning, as I hand her my phone to show off the pictures of Adam wearing the shark face mask. I conveniently left out that the mask was all pink before he let me put it on him. He chased me around the apartment demanding payback, which he took in the form of sex against the wall. I can't even pretend to be mad about it. However, sex with a guy in a pink shark mask is a little disorienting. He was a shark, I love how you can see his facial hair through it. Creepy. She gives my phone back and takes a drink of her smoothie. So, it's official then? You're Adam Scott's new girlfriend. Not exactly. She tilts her head and stares at me. I'll explain later. Anyway, I'm sorry our girls' night got crashed. One brow quirks up with disbelief. Okay, it was an awesome night, but I really do want to hang out. Just the girls. The guys have away games this weekend, and I was thinking we should have a do-over. Ginny had the same idea. She did? Yeah, she was by early this morning. Pack your bags, little lady. We're taking a road trip this weekend. Chapter 19 Adam, are you ready to go? I ask, stretching my legs out in front of me. My right foot is asleep from this weird angle I've been sitting in for the past hour. Reagan's study spot on the stage in the theater is about the most uncomfortable I can imagine. But she's here, so I keep coming back. 
I should be home packing for our away games, but I couldn't resist spending a little more time with her. Just about. First, I have an idea. She stands, then takes both my hands and helps me to my feet. Oh, yeah? It's amazing how fast my mind can conjure a dozen dirty images. Not that kind of idea, she shoves at my chest. Stay here. She leaves me on the stage and hops down and walks toward the last row of seats. There is a podium that I never really noticed before, but within a couple of seconds of stepping to it, Reagan has the lights dimmed and a spotlight on the center of the stage. I squint to see her. I can't see shit now. That's the idea. But we can see you. We? I scan the darkened theater. Royal we. It's just me, but use your imagination. It's the night of your big scholarship banquet, and a room full of doctors are eager to hear your speech. Sweat beads on my forehead. You want me to give my speech here? Why not? I have about a thousand really awesome reasons why not. You said you need to practice. Her voice sounds closer, but I still can't see her. I know. And I really do. The banquet is coming up fast, and I'm not prepared. I jump from the stage and instantly feel calmer. Reagan stands in the aisle halfway between me and the podium. How about I give you the speech back at my place? You tend to get distracted with all this when we're at your place. She makes a circle with one hand, motioning to her boobs. It isn't my room. I'm distracted by them right now. She crosses her arms over her chest like that's gonna help. I still know they're there, and I can recall them in oh-so-vivid detail from memory. Okay, I give in. She grins, lets her arms fall, and my eyes go straight to her rack. I can recall them, but it's always better to get a good look in person. Get back up there, stud. I groan, but I walk back to the stage and hop onto it. I shield my eyes again as the light blinds me. Can you at least turn off the homing beacon? Oh, fine. But for the record, you look damn good in the spotlight. In the dark, I can make out her silhouette, but I can't read her expression. I don't know how you do this. I'm sweating bullets, and I know there's no one out there but you. I find it much harder to speak to one person versus a crowd of people. I so don't get that. I blow out a long breath. My pulse ticks faster. You're stalling, Dr. Scott. Okay, okay. I pace a few steps, getting my thoughts together. I don't hear her walk onto the stage, but the next thing I know, she's standing in front of me. Breathe. She inhales through her nose and then holds it and lets it out slowly. I feel ridiculous, but I mimic her. Why do you want to be a doctor? She asks, and then continues breathing with me. When Ginny was little, she got trapped in a pantry closet at our grandparents' house. She was fine, physically, but she was so upset by the time we found her, she was having a hard time breathing. She told me about that. Reagan says. I was young, but not so young that I didn't realize I couldn't help her. It was an awful feeling. So you decided to be a doctor because you couldn't help Ginny? Well, that's where it started anyway. Who doesn't want to play Superman? I don't, but I'm glad there are people like you who do. I can't tell them that story, though. Ginny would be horrified. Also, I don't want to be the guy who gives the downer speech. She laughs. You could focus on the positive. 
Ginny was found, and she got the help she needed, thanks to a doctor. Still kind of sappy. With an eye roll, she says, Okay. Then what do you have planned? I was going to tell them about the time I broke my arm playing hockey. The bone was sticking out and... Reagan squeezes her eyes closed and shakes her head. Okay, never mind. Maybe I don't want to hear the speech. I pull her against me and drop my mouth to hers. Thank you for this. For what? Helping me. I didn't do anything, and you still didn't practice your speech. Do you know that when someone has a panic attack, the best thing you can do for them is stay by their side, talk calmly, and remind them to breathe? You were having a panic attack just now? No. But my point is, sometimes helping someone isn't flashy. Just being here with me, supporting me, pushing me to practice when all I want to do is kiss you until the bus leaves tomorrow afternoon. It helps. You're welcome. Be my girlfriend. She doesn't answer, but I get an amused smirk. I'm serious. I'm better with you. I really like you. This time is... Fuck, I hate to say it's different, but it is... And yeah, it's because you're different, which I know you're going to roll your eyes about. But you make me different, too. I have a good feeling about this. I'm sure she's going to say no. I haven't exactly made a compelling argument. But instead, she says, Yes. Really? I scoop her up. She nods. Yeah, really. You're kind of hard to say no to. Kiss me, stud. That's boyfriend to you. You seem to be in a better mood. I say the next afternoon on the bus to State. Rhett's phone is nowhere in sight, and he's playing on his Nintendo Switch. That's because I talked to Carrie, he says, without taking his eyes off the game. You did? I brace myself for the news they're back together. Instead, he says, She's coming to the game. She is? But that's... I don't know. A fuck-long way for her to drive. She's flying, and it's as close to neutral ground as we could get considering we have games or practice almost every weekend. Rhett and I have been friends for a long time so I'm quiet for a moment as I collect my words. As the captain, I want his focus to be solely on hockey. As his friend, I want him to get the closure he needs. But I'm also afraid it's the opposite of closure he's going to get. Is this the best idea? It won't affect my game, if that's what you're worried about. No. Okay, yes, that is a concern. The games this weekend are important. We're getting down to the final month of the regular season, and we need to be our best every single time we step onto the ice. But I'm more worried that talking is going to lead to you two getting back together when that isn't what you want. His gaze pops up from the video game in his hands to me. He studies my face and then huffs a laugh. I can't decide if I should be insulted for myself or Carrie. I'm sorry. I think you can do better. I want better for you. We're quiet for the rest of the ride. When we get to Arizona State, the team files off the bus, and the Sun Devil's team manager greets us at the door to take us to our locker room. As is his pregame routine, Rhett's dressing and listening to music with Maverick. They have this thing where the two of them share one pair of headphones, each of them getting a single earbud. I don't get it, but it's their thing, and I don't mess with guys' routines. What do you say, boys? I ask as we walk down the tunnel to take the ice for warm-ups. What do you say? They file past me, stepping into the rink. When I finally take the ice, 
I breathe in the cool air and relax. I've always loved hockey and skating. Especially this moment just before the game starts, when everyone is optimistic and ready to do whatever it takes to win. Nothing else matters in this moment. We all have a single focus. After I've stretched, I skate over to Rhett. I'm sorry about earlier. Whatever you need, man, I'm here. He grins. I was hoping you'd say that. I'm going to need the room later. With a pat on the shoulder, he skates past me, and all I can do is laugh. If they're in your room, where are you? Reagan asks later when I call her. I'm hanging out in Heath and Maverick's room. Can't you hear them? I thought you were at a bar or something. They're loud. Yeah, no kidding. Well, you'll never guess where I am. I can hear the smile in her voice. I hope you're about to tell me you're here. Sadly, no. But I am in your room. You're at the apartment? I thought you were doing some sort of road trip with the girls. We did. We drove up to your mom's house for the weekend. My mom's house. The phrase forms a pit in my stomach. I'm not sure I'll ever get used to them living apart. Ah, Ginny's been saying she wanted to go back. I know it's as weird for Ginny as it is for me to be there now that our dad's moved out, so I'm glad she has her friends with her. What are you girls going to get up to there? Wine, sappy movies, junk food, the usual. Sexting your boyfriend? I ask hopefully. She hums. Maybe. First, I'm going to snoop around your childhood room and look for dirt. Good luck. Hasn't been a girl in that room in a long time. It's pretty boring in here. Not a single picture of an ex in sight. I picture her walking around my old room, which leads to picturing her in my bed. Probably shoved in a drawer somewhere. I haven't gotten to the drawers yet, she says. Ginny's yelling for me. I better go. How long will you be up? Can I drunk text you later? You can always drunk text. I'm hoping Carrie will be gone soon and I can go back to my room. But I'll be up for a few hours. You don't think she'll stay the night? I don't know. I hope not. How long does it take to tell her it's over? You really dislike her, huh? I just don't think she's good for him. And I think he's kidding himself that talking to her in person is going to give him closure. She wants him back. And she knows that in person, she's far more persuasive. He never should have agreed to it. Actually, that might be my fault, Reagan says. Yours? How? A while back, we were talking about the breakup. He sounded really upset. And I told him I thought seeing her could help. It won't help. The words come out harsher than I intend. He's only ever dated her. He needs to move on, date other people. That will give him closure. He was with her for a really long time, Adam. Yeah, exactly. He has no idea what a good relationship is. And you do? She gasps as if she can't believe she said it out loud. The line goes quiet. I'm so sorry. Reagan's voice is small when she finally speaks again. I didn't mean that. No, you're probably right. What do I know about a successful relationship? I haven't dated anyone more than a few months at a time, and all of those failed spectacularly. Adam, I'm so sorry, she says again. I believe her but I don't think it's an accident she said it. She's obviously been thinking about how I've blown up all my previous relationships. I can't blame her, but it still stings. Have fun with the girls. I gotta go.
I press end and stare straight ahead. Yo, Scott, Mav calls from across the room. You want in this game? I put my phone in my pocket and join them. Chapter 20 Reagan You may find yourself acting as a mediator between two people you care about. Don't feel obligated to take sides, and do remember that words said in the heat of the moment can have an impact far beyond the immediate disagreement. In short, watch your damn mouth. Numbly, I walk downstairs to find the girls in the kitchen. We went a little overboard at the grocery store on the way to Ginny's mom's house, and the counter is littered with bags of chips and candy, booze, and other things that we randomly threw into the cart. Red or white, Ginny asks, as she holds up two bottles of wine. I don't care. What's wrong with you? Dakota asks, as she opens a bag of chips. I think Adam and I just had our first fight. Oh, honey, what happened? Ginny asks. She sets the wine on the counter and then proceeds to open both. She must read on my face that it's going to be a two-bottle night. I slump onto a bar stool. We were talking about Red and Carrie. Carrie went to their game tonight so she and Red could talk. She did? Dakota's eyes widen. I nod. Yeah, Adam is totally against them talking or reconciling in any way. I don't get it. It's like he thinks everyone should be able to break up with someone they love and move right on to the next. He said Rhett didn't know what a good relationship looked like, and I kind of threw that statement back in his face. I bury my face in my hands. It just slipped out. I didn't even realize I was thinking it until the words left my mouth. That is sort of his thing. Jenny gives me a small smile. How did Adam react? Dakota asks. I apologized immediately, and he acted like it was fine, but then he said he needed to get off the phone. Me and my big mouth. I feel like such an ass. You two will work it out, Jenny says, sounding so sure, but she didn't hear the hurt in his voice. Words said in the heat of the moment have an impact far beyond the immediate disagreement. I grumble. What? Dakota asks with a laugh. You sound like a fortune cookie. I wave her off. It was in my horoscope this morning. I look between them. What do I do? Do I call him back now? Wait and hope he forgets? If only I could be so lucky. Give him the night, Ginny says. They'll be back tomorrow night. I'm sure by then all will be forgotten. And if not, you make it up to him. You realize you're talking about your brother, right? Dakota grins. Gross. That isn't what I meant. Her face scrunches up and she tosses a chip at Dakota. I know that waiting is the right call, but tomorrow sounds so far away. I don't know how I'm going to make it through the night worrying about it. Okay, yeah, that sounds practical. Unless, Dakota starts. Yeah, I ask. Hopeful she has a genius idea. Screw practical. We could go to the game. Ginny and I share a confused look, and Dakota shrugs. You want to go to the hockey game? Ginny narrows her gaze at our friend. I thought you wanted to spend time just us girls. I study her closely. This feels very unlike Dakota. And I do. But we can do that in Tempe. I love a good road trip. She avoids eye contact completely. Her phone buzzes on the counter and she jumps for it, and then she smiles. Who's that? I ask. No one. Her thumbs tap on the screen. Are you texting one of the guys? Is it Mav? Ginny asks. What? Dakota looks up. No, I told you. It's no one, okay? So, are we going or what? Your mom won't mind? I ask Ginny. We just got here. She has to work, and it isn't like I'm here to hang out with her anyway, she grins. I'm up for it. Heath will lose his mind. I'm not so sure Adam will be as happy to see me. He will, Ginny reassures me. Now, let's go watch the movie and drink all the wine. 
The following afternoon, we arrive at the game and find seats behind the valley bench. I sent Adam a text this morning, wishing him luck on the game, but his response was a one word, thanks. Needless to say, I don't feel great about how he's going to react to me coming to the game. Heath spots Ginny right away. He gets this goofy grin on his face anytime she's around. I love them together. Adam's slower to spot us. Maverick nudges him, and he looks up and scans the crowd until he finds me. One side of his mouth pulls up, and he lifts a hand. I wave back and try to communicate how sorry I am and how much I don't want this thing between us to end before it's even really started. I doubt he gets that from my meek wave, but I send it out into the universe anyway, hoping he feels it. Valley won the game last night, but today the guys look sluggish. Or that's what Ginny says after the first period when Valley is down by two. I'm watching, but really only seeing Adam. They can't lose, I say. That would feel like a seriously bad omen for the night ahead. When the guys take the ice to start the next period, Adam looks up at me. His smile is bigger this time, and I feel just a little bit hopeful that we're going to be okay. Adam wins the face-off, and Heath chases a long pass. Ginny's on her feet, yelling and clapping. Heath and a guy from State are up against the boards fighting for the puck. He manages to kick it out, and Maverick is close enough to take possession and send it to Adam, who is waiting on the right side. The puck sails toward the goal, and the lamppost lights up. Dakota and I join Ginny, and the three of us scream so loudly, you'd think he'd just won them the game. Adam skates toward the valley bench and points. At first, I think he's pointing to the guys. It's kind of hard to tell with the big gloves he wears, but when he winks, I know it's for me. Valley ekes out a victory, and as soon as the game's over, we head to the parking lot behind the arena where the Valley bus sits, waiting for the guys. Is that Carrie? Ginny asks, looking toward a girl standing next to a shiny red car. I think so, Dakota says. Things must have gone well. Should we go talk to her? I ask. I've only met her once, and it was brief, but she's important to Rhett, and therefore indirectly important to us. Before we can decide, the guys start filing out of the arena. Adam's one of the last, like usual. I've noticed it's a thing with him. He doesn't just lead by example. He knows when he needs to follow. I don't run to him, but it's only because I have on heeled boots, and tripping seems likely. Neither of us speaks at first. He hugs me and lifts me off the ground, squeezing me so tightly I can practically feel his forgiveness. I'm sorry, we say at the same time. You were right. I don't know shit about their relationship. You just want what's best for him. For everyone, he nods. But he's a grown-ass man. He'll figure it out. Did he say that to you? Yeah, Adam chuckles. Verbatim. You want to protect the people around you. It's one of the things I like most about you. And I didn't mean what I said about you. I think I just got freaked out being in your room and realizing if this doesn't work out. My voice trails off. I don't want it to end. I get it. I don't want it to end either. All around us, the guys are heading onto the bus and the managers are loading up the equipment. Can we hang out later? I ask. Definitely. I want to take you somewhere. Dress warm. I'll come by to pick you up as soon as we get back. Okay, I say with a smile. I've heard about this place. Adam pulls into the drive-in movie theater. It sits on top of Mount Loken. I'm giddy with excitement. We haven't been on a real date since the night I babbled through dinner. And this is official playbook date material. You have? He looks guilty. Probably because it's a known fact, this is Adam Scott's favorite date location. Someone once told me there's an Adam Scott special on the menu. Two drinks, one large popcorn, and a bag of candy. I'm pretty sure they were making that up, but it's also not entirely out of the question considering how many girls he's brought up here. Yes, it isn't exactly a secret you bring all your girlfriends here. Okay, yes, that's true but it's because it's my favorite place. Wanna see why? 
Oh, I know why. I glance to the back hatch of his Jeep. He laughs a deep-throated chuckle that makes my stomach flip. You think I bring chicks up here to get laid? He asks as we get out of the vehicle. Yeah, that's the whole point of drive-in movie theaters, right? I don't actually know since I've never been to one, but I always assumed. I'm not saying I've never felt a girl up in public or slid my hand up her skirt, he says as his hand slips under the hem of my dress. I'm wearing leggings, but his fingers trail all the way up to my ass, and then he palms one cheek. But no, I'm not banging my dates at the drive-in. He looks at me like I'm a crazy person for even thinking it. And now I really want to have sex in the back of his Jeep to see why it's such a bad idea. Okay, well then, why? He leads me past the concession stand. It's dusk, and the temperature is much cooler up here. It feels like winter instead of the warm February weather in Valley. I'm forced to walk behind him as he heads down a narrow path. I'm looking at the ground, watching my step when he stops, and I finally glance up. Oh, wow, I say. All a valley opens up below us. Dots of light litter the dusk sky. He holds my hand as we stare down. Everything looks so small. Something about being on top of the mountain reminds me of how insignificant we are. We're just two people in a world of billions. It's reassuring and scary all at the same time. This is amazing. I pull my gaze from the view and drape my arms around his neck. You're good at being a boyfriend, and this is a good date. I'm glad you brought me. Yeah, maybe, he says. I feel like an ass now that you mentioned I bring all my dates here. It's a cool spot. Everyone should see it, especially you. You're always thinking about other people. Do you like coming here because you enjoy seeing it so often, or because you think your date will like it? He hesitates. I'm not sure. Both, maybe. Do you come here alone? No. Hmm. What? He asks. What's your idea of a perfect date? Something you would want to do. I don't really care. I like being with you. Any old where. That's not an answer. I don't know. Me, you, the rest doesn't matter. Well, come on then. I want the full Adam Scott drive-in experience with the Reagan twist. Do I even want to ask? I'll give you a hint, stud, I say, as I cup him through his jeans. Chapter 21 Adam That's all, Dr. Salco says, staring up at the big ancient clock that hangs on the wall of the lecture hall. She never lets us out early, not even by a second. Don't forget, we'll be having a quiz on Monday. There's a collective groan as students file out. Mr. Scott, she says catching me before I leave. She motions me to the front. I take my time, letting the room empty. She's shoving papers into her tote when I approach. The banquet is next week. Are you ready? I think so, yeah. She lifts a brow, calling my bluff without saying a word. I do have my speech written, I assure her. I just don't love it yet. Speech writing is not my calling. Write from your heart and edit with a heavy dose of logic. She waves a hand. That's what my advisor told me once. You'll be okay. It isn't the words I'm worried about, though. I'd just rather not say them to a crowd of people. Thank you, Dr. Salco. And will your fiancé be joining us? Right. About that. I've somehow managed not to come clean on the subject of my fake fiancé. On the one hand, it hasn't come up. On the other, I haven't brought it up. She seems like a lovely girl. Dr. Salco's mouth tips up. I'm pretty sure she's smiling. Wow. Reagan's good. She is. I nod my agreement. 
Reagan is the best. So she'll be there? Slowly I nod. She will. What's the harm, really? Reagan and I are together. We're just not quite as serious as Dr. Salko believes. We can tell her together at the banquet if it comes up again. Wonderful. Have a good day, Adam. I pick up Ginny from outside of her dorm. Yo, she says as she gets into the passenger side of my Jeep. You've been around Heath too much. You're starting to sound like him. I am, aren't I? She settles in and buckles up. I pull away from the curb and head off campus. The usual? Sure, Ginny says, and then starts messing with my phone to change the music. Our usual is grabbing burgers and fries and driving around. It was something we started when she first got to Valley, so I could show her around the campus and town. But now it's just nice to spend some time with her away from everyone else. Today, I head for the outskirts of town. Valley is a decent-sized city, but there's still plenty of desert land when you get outside the city limits. I heard you and Reagan went up Mount Loken to the drive-in last weekend. Ginny scrunches up her nose. You took her to your usual spot? Yeah, yeah, I know. She called me out on it, too. I like it up there. It's a great date location. You need to get more creative. Oh, we did. I smile as I think about our night on top of the mountain. That's the thing about Reagan. Even doing the same old things with her is fresh and exciting. I see things from a new perspective when I'm with her. But Ginny isn't wrong. Any ideas? Or are you just going to bust my balls? Hmm. She chews and stares out the windshield. Something uniquely Reagan, but that only you could give her. I wait for her to come up with something. She's quiet for too long. Well? I ask when I can't take it anymore. I have no idea. She laughs. Sorry. My hands tighten on the steering wheel. Why are you so stressed about this? I've never seen you so spun up over where to take a girl on a date. You were just telling me I need to be more creative. Yeah, but I've told you that before, and you just brushed it off. Ginny grins. You really like Reagan? Yeah, of course. She's great. Ginny squeals a high-pitched sound that makes me wince. I'm not sure why you find this so surprising. She's your friend. You know how great she is. I know, but honestly, I've been afraid you were going to break her heart. No one's worried about her breaking my heart? I ask, shooting her an annoyed look. Ginny rolls her eyes. Please. You're a pro at moving on to the next girl. Reagan's been crushing on you for a long time. When you two got into it over the phone, she was a wreck. Yeah, that was rough, I admit. But that wasn't even about us. I was annoyed about Carrie weaseling her way back into Rhett's life, and I got short with her. Maybe it wasn't a fight about the two of you, but it absolutely had everything to do with her concerns about you. She's worried that what happened with Carrie will happen to her. What? No. Yes, Ginny insists. Carrie and Rhett broke up, and you've been very vocal in not wanting them to get back together. And I get it. I didn't like them together either. But it's very much your M.O. You end things and you move on, never speaking to them again. Reagan doesn't want that girl to be her. I don't think I could ever move on from Reagan like that. If things didn't work out with us, my jaw tightens. Maybe you should tell her that, and I have the perfect plan. 
even with food in her hands. She manages to flail them around while she talks. She's clearly excited about whatever she has cooked up, and I find myself hopeful that it will give me clarity on how to move forward with Reagan. Can't I just text her and repeat what I said? I'm kidding, but the outrage on Ginny's face is totally worth it. I'm going to pretend I didn't hear that. She finishes her food and turns toward me. Maverick's birthday is on Sunday. Let's throw him a party. I'm failing to see how a party for Mav is the perfect plan to tell Reagan how I feel about her. Do I have to figure it all out for you? The place doesn't matter. Then why do I need a party? You don't. I just really want to throw a party at your place. I chuckle. Does Maverick even want a party? This is the first I've heard about his birthday. And when it comes to Johnny Maverick, he shares everything. So it's suspicious if he's not mentioned it yet. Then again, I have been preoccupied lately. Who doesn't want a party thrown in their honor? Whatever. As long as the rest of the guys are cool with it. I already asked. She claps. Let's go by the store. Wait. The party is tonight? Didn't I mention that? She smiles sweetly. I shake my head. Such a pain in my ass. Ginny does most of the work, and by the time we get back to the apartment with party food and alcohol, the entire team is already here. Someone's made Maverick a crown out of beer tabs, and he wears that shit proudly. Happy birthday, I say, handing him a bottle of Mad Dog 2020. Aw, oh, thanks, Scott, he says, and pulls me into a hug. He's already missing his shirt. It's not a party until Mav's half naked. I don't understand the guy, but he's definitely a good time. I pat his back and pull away. Seen Reagan? Outside, he says. He twists the top of the bottle and takes a drink, then passes it to me. I manage to swallow the grossly sweet liquor and hand it back. Enjoy. I grab a beer and head out to the deck. My gaze goes right to her. Sometimes I wonder how I went two years without looking at her. I mean, really seeing her. She's standing in a group with Dakota, Rhett, and Liam. Reagan looks up as I approach and smiles. Stepping toward me, she wastes no time kissing me. I fucking love that. I wrap an arm around her waist and lift her so I can kiss her harder. I missed you, she says, tearing her mouth away. The girl I once described as shy and reserved never misses an opportunity to shower me with affection or tell me how she's feeling. And I eat that shit up. I suck on her lower lip. Missed you too. Want to get out of here? She laughs, and I place her on the ground. Holding my hand, she pulls me into the circle. Guess that's a no. How did everyone get here so quickly? I ask Rhett. What do you mean? He and Liam share a confused look. It's barely been an hour since Ginny texted Heath to let everyone know. Dakota starts laughing. Then Rhett joins her. Reagan looks at me with a placating smile. What am I missing? Uh, Liam starts. He's a freshman and probably the nicest guy on the team. So I wait for him to tell me what's going on because he'll be straight with me. Reagan squeezes my hand. Ginny sent out a group text this morning. But she knew you'd say yes. Besides, it's Maverick's birthday. I shake my head. It wasn't about Reagan and me at all. Though maybe that's the point. For the next few hours, the party grows, 
More people arrive, and the music gets louder. I'm leaning against the railing, and Reagan stands in front of me, her back to my chest. The wind blows her hair away from her neck, and I dip my head to kiss her. This is kind of perfect. Me, you, our friends, I say against her soft skin. It is, isn't it? How long until I can steal you away? She laughs like I'm kidding. My kisses on her neck become harder. It's real easy to get carried away where Reagan is concerned. Mav requested that we play sardines later. I don't think that's happening. I point toward him across the deck. He's kissing one girl, and another is plastered to his side, sucking on his neck. Oh, Reagan says. That's kind of hot. She turns in my arms. Have you ever had a threesome? Um. Tell me. I don't care, she insists. Just once. It was... tricky. I think I'd lose my mind if some other girl put her hands on you. She slides her hands up my chest. Good because I'm not big on the idea of sharing you either. I like this, us, just the two of us. Though I can think of some ways to get tricky if you want later. Her smile is so big, I want to keep talking to let her know how much I'm digging this. But my dick is growing harder against her. Talk of sex, threesomes, or Reagan tends to have that effect. Combined, and I'm ready to fuck her right here. I guess she has the same idea, because she pushes her hips into me and inhales sharply. Maybe we could sneak away just for a few minutes? I tug her, already halfway across the deck before she's finished the last word. I'm never gonna say no to that. Chapter 22 Reagan. Expect good things. Flowers, jewels, amazing sex, lots of it. Manifest your own damn luck. I'm sitting on Adam's lap, one arm around his neck, fingers absently playing with his hair as our friends argue over whether butter and margarine are the same thing. I have no idea how we got on this topic. It's late, and most people have gone home. We are all outside because Mav is celebrating his birthday in the living room, and by celebrating, I mean there's a good chance he's having a threesome on the couch. Happy freaking birthday to him. I kind of miss him, though. Our group never feels quite right without his shenanigans. Margarine is processed bullshit, Liam says. It's maybe the meanest thing I've ever heard him say. He's got this wholesome goodness about him, from his perfectly kept blonde hair and preppy clothes to the polite way he talks and acts. I'm surprised he's out this late, to be honest. He's the kind of guy I assume follows a strict curfew and also takes vitamins. I scan our friends, Heath and Ginny, Rhett and Dakota, all of us sitting here just enjoying the night and each other's company. My heart squeezes, this group is so much more than just my friends. Before, when I was pining away for Adam, it was hard for me to really feel this at peace when we were all together. But now I can't imagine a group of people that could feel more like family. You good. Adam whispers next to my ear. His arms slide around my waist, holding me protectively. I turn to look into his hazel eyes. So good. His gaze drops to my mouth and he kisses me softly. I'm crazy about you. Can't seem to get enough. But right now, somehow it feels like enough. Tonight's been perfect. My heart flutters, and I'm putty in his hands. I can't think of a response. All of my emotions feel too big and overwhelming to put into words. Instead, I nuzzle into him, enjoying the warmth it brings me inside and out. Dakota's next to us. She smiles and winks when we make eye contact. 
She's been hesitant to trust Adam, afraid he'd break my heart. But I know how happy she is for me. I think I'm out, she says. I can't miss my eight o'clock class tomorrow. Good luck getting through the house without going blind, Heath says as she stands to go inside. She leans down to hug me. I'll survive. I'm out too. Liam stretches his long legs and then gets to his feet. You need a ride? Adam asks him. I grin up at my considerate boyfriend, always looking out for his guys. Nah, I didn't drink tonight. You were arguing over butter and margarine, stone cold sober? Heath shakes his head and takes a drink from his beer, emptying it. Jenny's on his lap, and he leans forward. Ready for bed, baby doll? Jenny nods and Heath stands, carrying her with him. I hear him tell her to cover her eyes before they walk in. I don't want to go in yet, I say. It's so nice out. We can stay out here as long as you want. Adam brushes my hair away from my neck and kisses me. I want to soak up this night, this feeling, as long as possible. Rhett kicks his feet up on an empty chair. I'm giving it another 30 minutes before I go in. I do not need to see Mav's O face. It's all clear, Heath calls from inside. Rhett doesn't move. I'm still not ready to go in yet. Sorry, you two are stuck with me for a little while longer. We're good, I say. Adam pulls me closer, wrapping me up in his arms, and I lean my head on his shoulder. You can stay as long as you want. Rhett's gaze narrows. A slow smile spreads on his face. You two snuck away and boned earlier, didn't you? Adam chuckles. My face heats. Rhett sighs. Man, that must be nice to have your girl here every night. My hand-to-girl ratio is pathetic. Hand-to-girl? I ask. Amount of times I've fucked my hand instead of my girl. Oh, my face flames even hotter, poor guy. So, you and Carrie are back together? No. He says immediately, then, yes? Fuck. I don't know. We're talking. Adam's quiet, but I can read his silence well. Nothing to say? Rhett grins over his beer. Obviously, he can read Adam well, too. Now, man, I just want you to be happy. Thanks. I am. Rhett looks at us and points one finger from around his bottle. Maybe not that happy, but happy enough. The thing about being this happy, I don't think I'll ever be able to settle for happy enough again. Saturday morning, I wake up to strong hands squeezing my ass and pulling me against a very hard male body. Good morning. Adam's deep morning voice is straight sex. Or maybe that's just what's on my mind. I mutter my greeting and wriggle closer. Sex before coffee is fine, but talking is not. Someone knocks on the door, and Adam tells them to go away as he climbs on top of me. There's a lot of noise in the apartment for a Saturday morning. I pry my eyes open enough to look out the sliding glass door. It's still dark out. You can go back to sleep in 10 minutes, he says, as he peppers kisses down my neck and over my collarbone. His skin is warm under my hands as I slide them down his back. Yo, Scott, Mav calls and knocks on the door. Buddy, 911, time to get up. Fuck, Adam groans. Let me just make sure they haven't set the place on fire. Don't move. When he opens the door, Mav's standing there in a Hawaiian shirt, backward hat, Smiling like it's a perfectly acceptable time to be awake, I pull up the sheet around me. This better be important, Adam grumbles. I'm sorry for the early morning wake-up call. Mav steps into the room carrying a tray of coffees as Adam pulls on a t-shirt and sweats. Morning, Reagan. Hey, Mav. I'll give you $1,000 for one of those coffees. He walks to the edge of the bed and extends it to me. No money necessary, but I do need you to get up and pack a bag. I'm too tired to ask what the heck he's talking about, but he grins and adds, 
I'll explain everything, but we have to hurry. It'll be worth it. Promise. He leaves, and Adam and I exchange a confused look. This should be interesting, he says. We get dressed and head out to the living room, where Mav tells us his plan for a weekend getaway to Palm Springs to celebrate his 21st birthday. Didn't we celebrate your birthday last night? Dakota asks. She waves off the coffee he tries to offer her. Yes, and it was amazing. Thank you guys for that, but my parents already booked the house. It's a five-hour trip, so if we hurry, we can be drunk in our own private pool by lunchtime. Well, that doesn't sound safe, Ginny says. Come on, Mav begs. Are your parents going to be there? Rhett asks. Nah. He shakes his head and makes a face like the idea is ludicrous. The Maverick family doesn't do birthday celebrations, but we do enjoy showering people in gifts instead of affection. They got you a house in Palm Springs for one night? Heath asks. Technically two, but we already missed the first night. Mav, Ginny whines. Why didn't you say anything? Because you guys went to all that effort to invite people over. He waves her off. I loved it. Really. Adam is the last one I expect to jump in and offer his support of the idea. But that's exactly who speaks up first. Yeah, okay. It's the last weekend we're going to have off until the end of the season. Sounds baller. I'm in. You had me at private pool, I say. You had me at drunk, Heath adds, and Ginny elbows him. Coda? Mav asks. My roommate nods. Yeah, fine, but I call shotgun, and I need to be back early Sunday afternoon to study for a test. We all look to Rhett. I don't know, he says when he realizes it's down to him. I need to check with Carrie. Are you serious? Adam asks. How would you feel if Reagan went on a road trip with three dudes? The vein that notoriously pops out on his forehead when Adam's agitated starts to appear, but he nods. I already thought of this, Maverick interjects, and there's enough rooms for us to all have our own when we get there. He looks to Red. I'm sorry our friends are hot, and they're going to be in bikinis, but to be fair, that could happen here too. Red's quiet. His leg bounces as he stares at the phone in his hand. Okay, fuck it. I'm in, but no giving me shit for calling her to check in every few hours. No promises. Heath says as he coughs into his hand. Chapter 23 Adam We get to the rental house just after lunchtime. The place is nuts. The grounds are palatial. A phrase I never thought I'd use, but I saw it on the brochure when we walked in, and they really are. There are six bedrooms a massive living room with a fireplace that takes up most of one wall, a huge kitchen inside, a bar outside by the pool, and covered patios. Yes, plural. Everything in this place is ridiculously over the top. Maverick is behind the outdoor bar playing bartender. Rhett and I sit in front of it, and the three of us watch Dakota and Reagan chicken fight with Heath and Ginny in the pool. Mav brought Charlie, and she's running around the yard investigating every inch. Five bucks says Reagan falls first, Rhett says, tipping his drink toward them. I jump to my girl's defense. No way. Reagan's scrappy. Guess we're on. He holds his beer out, and I clink mine against the side. Mav hops onto the bar and sits his legs dangling over the side. Dakota won't let her fall. Guarantee. Reagan's blonde hair is slicked back, and she's concentrating hard as she and Ginny both try to push the other over. They're pretty evenly matched as far as size goes, but Heath's height advantage over Dakota gives Ginny the upper hand. Reagan's looking unsteady as Ginny pushes hard. Dakota moves backward, and they readjust. This time, when they come together, Reagan grabs Ginny's hands and intertwines their fingers. Then Dakota walks backward, and that pulls Ginny forward. She teeters, 
and almost falls over Heath's head, but he catches her in time. Rhett chuckles. This is quality entertainment. Let's go, Coda, Mav yells. Heath looks over to him. What the hell, man? I thought we were friends. He's so sensitive, Mav says quietly, then yells. Sorry, buddy. Love you. Heath flips him off, and with one hand not protecting his partner, Reagan pushes my sister backward and off his shoulders. Reagan raises her hands overhead and cheers as Ginny goes under. She shoots a grin over at me, and damn, she's stunning. I'm totally gone for her. We'll fuck, Rhett says. Double or nothing? I'm going in. Mav puts his sunglasses on and runs toward the pool. He jumps in and holds his beer up to keep it from going under. They get set for another chicken fight, but this time Dakota gets on Mav's shoulders, and Reagan sits on the side of the pool cheering them on. I glance over at Rhett. I haven't seen him on the phone all day. How's everything with Carrie? Eh. Do you want to talk about it? His brows lift toward the hat covering his head. I'm a good listener, I insist. He hesitates as if he's considering it, but then shakes it off. Nah, thanks though. I'm cool. Things with you and Reagan seem good. Deflecting. Nice. A grin tugs at his lips. They are good. She's great, man. I didn't realize what it could be like. It's... I struggle to put it in words. A real smile spreads across his face. Congratulations, my man. Sounds like you're in love. After a long day outside in the pool, we grill and then head inside. The fireplace is going and we're all in the living room drinking and talking. Half-empty bottles of liquor litter the coffee table. Maverick went all out, buying everyone's favorites, including his own. Happy 21st, Heath says and lifts his cup. We all mimic him, and Mav grins shyly as he raises his bottle of MD-2020. Thank you guys for being here. This is the first birthday in a long time that hasn't royally sucked. Reagan's sitting between my legs. She reaches over and squeezes Mav's arm. And I wonder if she feels that way too. Reagan's parents aren't around, and Mavericks think they can buy him off instead of spending any time with him. I'm irritated with my own parents for how they've acted recently but not one birthday has gone by my entire life where they haven't made it feel special. I dip my head lower to kiss her shoulder. We should play sardines or something. I bet this house has some killer hiding spots, Rhett says. Dakota groans. No, let's play something different. We're on vacation. Truth or dare? Ginny suggests. Or I've never? I love I've Never, Mav says. He puts his beer down on the floor and rubs his hands together. I'll go first. I've never kissed a girl. We all drink, except Reagan and Ginny. Mav cackles at Dakota as she drinks. She glares. I told you that in confidence. Yes, I know. I'm sorry, babe but it's such a great visual. She rolls her eyes. I've never had a threesome. We go around the room, taking turns. I've played with the guys before, so I know most of their secrets. But it's fun finding out a little more about Reagan. Like, she's kissed more than one guy in a single day. And she's had a one-night stand. Stupid things that don't change how I feel about her but just peel back more layers and remind me what an idiot I was not to notice her before. Maverick, why do you like this game so much exactly? 
You've had to drink every single time, Rhett asks. His experiences are a lot more limited than the rest of us, since he's dated Carrie for so long. Precisely. Plus, I'm an open book. But the shit you can find out about your friends with a little I've never is gold. Like, who would have thought you and Carrie have tried anal? Rhett's face turns red. I have one, Ginny says, and lowers her gaze to the floor as she continues. I've never been engaged. Maverick, Rhett, and Dakota look around the circle to see who is going to drink. Who is it? And how do I not know about this? Dakota asks. She looks at Mav. He raises his hands. No way, sweetheart. Not me. Not me? Ginny and Heath say at the same time. Mav and Dakota look to Rhett. No, definitely not. Slowly, Reagan lifts her drink to her lips, and I do the same. What? Dakota screeches. Her voice bounces off the walls. You two are engaged? Fake engaged, we say at the same time. Then we have to tell the entire story. Honestly, I figured they all knew, especially Dakota. Wait, only Ginny knew? Dakota asks. And Heath, Ginny says. Mav looks hurt. Bro. I'm sorry. I didn't realize this was such hot gossip. And I figured the rest of you already knew if I did. I'm never the one in the know first. He shrugs. Dakota excuses herself and heads toward the kitchen. I should go talk to her. Reagan places a chaste kiss on my lips and stands. I grab her hand and tug her back down. Her cheeks and legs are red from the sun, and her hair falls in waves over her shoulder. She's all sun-kissed and glowing, and it's been a long day with our friends where I haven't been able to kiss or talk to her like I want. I have this uncontrollable urge to tell her how I feel. That this thing between us is so much more than I could have imagined. That I'm falling for her. She smiles. I'll be right back, stud. I'm going to bed. Meet you there. Hurry. Chapter 24 Reagan You can't always push forward. Give yourself space and time. Wait for the right moment. Jenny follows me into the kitchen. I'm sorry, I thought you'd told her by now. It's okay, I say. Dakota's cleaning up, tossing empty beer cans in the trash, and basically just avoiding my gaze. I'm so sorry you found out this way. How could you not tell me about this? When she finally looks up, I see just how hurt she is by her expression, and I feel twice as awful. I was going to tell you, but I was so humiliated over the entire thing, I didn't even plan to tell Ginny, but she coerced it out of me. It's my sweet and innocent face, she says. People always want to tell me their secrets. I don't understand why you were so humiliated? Dakota tosses a bottle into the trash with a clang. Because I went too far? Adam wanted a date for the night, and instead, I made him pretend to be engaged to me. He was horrified, and I was humiliated that he was so horrified at the idea. But now look at you two, she says and smiles. I nod. Yeah, it worked out. But I really thought that I ruined everything. Even thinking about it now, I feel so stupid. I mean, really, who does that? I'm a mess. Hey. That's my best friend you're talking about. I'm really sorry. I've always got your back, you know? There is nothing you can tell me that would change that. Same, you're my family. Aw, Ginny says. Heath walks in and glances around the room. His gaze stops on Ginny. Ready for bed, baby doll? She goes with him, and then Mav appears. I'm hitting the sheets. Thanks for today, guys. I should go to bed, too. 
Dakota hugs me. Love you. See you in the morning. I squeeze her extra hard. It's a maze finding my way back to Adam's in my room. I crack the door open and peek inside to make sure it's the right one. He's lying on the bed, totally naked. His dick is hard and pointing up, making his intentions very clear. He smirks at me. Lost again? I walk all the way in and shut the door. I was afraid I was going to walk in on your sister and Heath. He makes a face. Almost lost my heart on. My gaze goes back to it. Yeah, I don't think so. Everything okay? He sits up as I approach. I think so. His arms circle around my waist, and he pulls me on top of him. Calloused hands slide under my shirt, gliding up my sides. He unhooks my bra and then removes it with my shirt. I got a little too much sun today, and I have tan lines from my bikini top. He takes one nipple into his mouth and palms the other. I fist his hair in my hands, tugging the thick strands. My body lights up as he kisses and worships each breast, then trails down my stomach. He flips us, so I'm on my back, removes my shorts and panties. I groan when his mouth finds the aching spot between my legs. He sucks on my clit until I cry out, coming so hard, I feel like I might die. My hands are still in his hair, and I tug him up. His cock nudges my entrance, and my body quivers. That small movement sends me over the edge again, and I hold on to him as the second orgasm rips through me. When I open my eyes, he's staring down at me. It isn't the cocky, I just got you off by barely touching you, look, I expect. There's something much more in his expression. I have an IUD, I say when my brain functions enough to realize that expression is probably frustration. I've gotten off twice, and he's still hard and thick against my leg. He nods, but still doesn't move. Everything okay? Yeah. He nudges just the tip inside, and we groan together. Everything is perfect. The next morning, we pile into Maverick's SUV for the second time in two days. He has a big smile on his face and sings quietly along with the radio. Charlie's asleep in his lap. Dakota brought her class notes with her to study for a test she has tomorrow. She's studiously reading them over. Ginny and Heath are quiet in the third row seats, and I'm leaning against Adam, half asleep, between him and Rhett. The latter is passed out cold, arms crossed over his chest, hat covering his eyes. The trip went too fast, but I'm glad we went. If Maverick's birthdays feel anything like my own, it was worth it. We stop halfway to eat and stretch our legs. My charger's toast, Mav says. I'm going to run into the store and grab another. I'll meet you guys at the restaurant. We split up. The guys go with Mav, and Dakota, Ginny, and I walk down to grab a table for us. There's a 15-minute wait if we want to sit together. So we put our name on the list and continue down to see the little shops in the outdoor strip mall. I don't want to go back, I say. Rehearsals are going to kick my ass this week. You've been rehearsing for weeks, Ginny says. Yeah, but we're completely off book this week, and there's always at least one person who doesn't know their lines and throws us all off. Dr. Rawson asked me to come by tomorrow and teach the new people how to do stage makeup, Ginny says. Do you want me to do your makeup for the show? She's a wizard with a makeup brush and helped me and several others for our Christmas production. She did such a good job, they asked her to be an unofficial stage assistant this semester. She gets college credit for coming to rehearsal and making sure we're all prepared, and in turn, we all get to look fabulous. I would be an idiot to turn that down, I say, and bump my hip against hers. But if you'll just watch me do it once and make sure it looks okay, I think I can manage to do it for the shows. She nods, then stops abruptly. Oh, look, it's a wedding dress store. The three of us turn to see the white gowns in the storefront window. I can't wait to get married, she says dreamily. I want a big dress with a really long train that takes two or three people to carry it. Or maybe I want to get married on the beach with a simple dress. It's all about the dress, I say, looking longingly at the beautiful beadwork of one of the dresses. We should go in, 
Dakota takes a step and opens the door. Her eyes light up with mischief. I've always wanted to try on gaudy wedding dresses. It'll be so much fun. Ginny and I don't move. Come on. You two owe me. Reagan got fake engaged, and you two kept it from me. She tilts her head to the side. We'll be quick, and I promise to put on the most hideous one I can find. We're supposed to meet the guys, I say. Ginny's switched teams, pulling out her phone. I'll text Heath and let them know we put our name on the list and headed to look at the shops. Her thumbs tap away on the screen as she texts him, and she steps into the bridal store. I can't think of a good excuse, so I follow them inside. I've never given much thought to my own wedding. Things like that always led to thinking about how my mom probably wouldn't be there. No helping me get ready or walking me down the aisle. But the second I put on the beaded dress from the window, I gasp at my reflection. Oh my God, Reagan, Ginny says when I walk out. She's in a tulle gown with a corset-style bodice, a sales lady is fussing over her, trying to add a veil, which Ginny waves off. No veil. Let's see the veil, I say. The lady smiles at me and clips it into place. Definitely veil, I say. Dakota's sitting on the bench. She put on the biggest, puffiest gown she could find and is now watching Ginny and me with rapt interest. I agree. Ginny sighs. You're both right. I had this picture in my head of the gown and my look. This is none of that, but I love it all. I smile. She'll probably be the first of us to get married. She's the youngest at 19, but I have no doubt that she's found her person. She and Heath are the most adorable couple I've ever known. The sales lady moves over to me, pulling up the spaghetti straps and pinning it. I should stop her from going to all this effort since there's no chance in hell I'm going to be buying this dress. But I can't bring myself to say a word as I stare at myself in the mirror. When she's finished, Jenny moves over and we giggle at the sight of us. Turn around, I wanna take a picture. Dakota holds her phone up and we link arms and smile while she takes several. Those photos stay between us, I warn as I spin around to get one last look before I have to take it off. Maybe someday I'll get a chance to wear a dress like this. Yeah, uh, Reagan, I don't think that's going to be possible. At Dakota's words, I look up into the mirror to the front door of the store, where the guys have just entered. Adam's eyes are wide as our gazes lock. Oh my gosh, I wrap my arms around my chest as if that could hide me. The sales lady must think I'm trying to keep the future groom from seeing my dress, because she whisks past us to shoo them out of the store. Oh no, 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 I mutter. This cannot be happening. I've got this, Dakota says. She whips off her dress, which she put on over her regular clothes, and shoves it into my hands. Get changed. I'll wait for you two outside. You're fine. It's just a dress. Ginny squeezes my hand. You're not freaking out? Your boyfriend just caught you trying on wedding dresses. She shrugs. Heath and I talk about our wedding all the time. Not that we're planning on actually doing it anytime soon, but I think he's beyond freaking out. Well, your brother and I do not talk about it, and he's definitely freaking out. I slap a hand to my forehead. First, I faked an engagement, and now I'm in here trying on wedding dresses. He's going to think. I can't even finish the statement. The thoughts I imagine going through his head are too awful. We haven't even said we love each other yet, and it looks like I'm planning our happily ever after. Breathe, Ray. It's going to be fine. The group's waiting outside, Adam's leaning against the building. When he sees me approach, he pushes off and walks forward. I can't read his expression at all. It isn't what you think, I blurt out before he can say anything. My heart is hammering in my chest. I cannot have screwed this up over something so dumb. I don't want to get married. I mean, maybe I do someday, but not today. Not even this year. Not even in five, probably. And we haven't even... He takes my hand and squeezes gently. Relax. Dakota told me, although for a second there, 
I thought you were picking out a costume for your next pre-med function. He interlaces our fingers, and we fall in with the group walking toward the restaurant. I search his face to see if he's being truthful, or if he's sweating and swaying like he might faint. He smiles. For the record, though, you looked beautiful. Chapter 25 Reagan You may face tough decisions today. Confusion is likely to reign. Wait a couple of days, and then consider your options. We'll stop there for tonight, Director Hoffman calls rehearsal Tuesday night with a sigh. Despite his continual look of irritation, the play is starting to come together. Ginny came yesterday to make sure we're all set for makeup. We've been fit for costumes, and the backdrops and props are mostly finalized and in place. It's starting to feel like we're going to pull this off. I know we will. We do every time. But those first few run-throughs off book always feel like we're working toward the impossible. Mila catches my gaze and smiles as he barks out the schedule for the rest of the week. I playfully roll my eyes at him, and she holds back a laugh. It's been fun getting to know her, and she's fitting right in with everyone. We get to spend quite a bit of time together since she's my understudy, and just as I assumed, she's memorized all of her lines with no problem. Occasionally, Director Hoffman pulls her in so I can work on technique with Dr. Rawson, my timing is still shit, and I'm struggling with my facial expressions in a couple of scenes. Sometimes I feel like I'm the newbie instead of her. What was I thinking going for such a different role? I will get it, though. I am nothing if not determined. A few of us are going out for drinks. Do you want to come? Mila asks as we're helping clean up the stage. There's an orchestra performance tonight, and it's all hands on deck to transition the space quickly so they can set up. No, I can't. I have plans. Do they involve that cute guy that just walked in? She nods over my head, and I turn to see Adam waiting for me. My heart rate kicks up a notch. They do. Her smile is big and genuine. Is that your boyfriend? Yep, sure is. I get butterflies in my stomach just talking about him. I'm so ridiculously crazy about him. This weekend solidified that more than ever. Now that I'm making eye contact with him, he walks toward me. You ready? Almost. Go, Mila says. I'll cover for you. Really? She nods and waves me off. Thanks. I jump down from the stage. Adam takes my backpack and slips it over one shoulder. That was rehearsal. I kiss him hello. Not as bad as yesterday, but not good. Your girlfriend might be the laughingstock of Valley University after this show. No chance. His reassurance is endearing, if not totally unfounded. Do you want to stay in practice or rehearse? Whatever you call it. I can read lines or something. That's sweet of you to offer, but the theater is booked tonight for an orchestra performance. I loop my arm through his. Feed me. That I can do. After dinner, we shut ourselves in Adam's room to work. He's got his laptop in front of him, eyes scrunched together in hard concentration. How's the speech coming? I ask. He looks up and blows out a breath. It's crap. I know it's crap, and I can't seem to fix it. Do you want me to read it and see if I can help? Uh-uh. He shakes his head adamantly. Not until it's done. It's too rough. Adam's funny that way, never wanting people to see his rough draft of anything. Yet, somehow he accepts me in all my unpolished glory. He took the whole catching me in a wedding dress thing way better than I thought he would. He even made Dakota send him the picture she snapped with me in it. Things are good with us, and that's scary. It takes a lot to trust that someone is going to be there for you no matter what. I don't have a lot of those people in my life, but I'm starting to think Adam might be one of them. I'm sure that you're being too hard on yourself. What would you say to the guys if you were in the locker room, down by one, going into the third period? I ask. I don't even know. Words just sort of come out of my mouth without thought. Like, he thinks for a moment. When he speaks, 
His voice is deep and authoritative. What do you say, boys? What do you say? Let's get that W. That's it? I laugh. He grins sheepishly and shrugs a shoulder. I told you I wasn't really that inspiring. I raise my arm to show him the goosebumps. It's all in the tone, apparently. When I put on the uniform and step onto the ice, it's different. It's the one place I feel completely confident in my abilities. I get that. It's your stage. Yeah, I guess so. Too bad I can't give my speech there. I hate that so much is riding on this. What if I get up there and freeze or forget what I want to say? I climb on top of him and kiss him, hoping some of my confidence in him transfers. I have no doubt he's capable of doing anything he wants, and I highly doubt his speech is crap, even now when he claims it's rough. Okay, I pull back before we get carried away. Back to work. We'll continue this later. Chapter 26 Adam I'm sitting on my bed, working on my speech while Reagan paces my room reading lines. She's been working on one scene for the better part of an hour. It sounded fine to me the first time, but what the hell do I know? Ah, she groans and flops onto the bed, lying on her back and staring up at the ceiling. I'm never going to get it right. I abandon my work and lean over so I can kiss her. Yes, you will. Hell, it sounds like you already know it by heart. I know the lines, but I'm still not getting the character right. This is so far out of my expertise. What can I do to help? Nothing, she sighs. Kiss me again. I climb on top of her and kiss her until we're both breathless. I have an idea. I stand and adjust my dick. Down, boy. Now? She sits up, resting on an elbow. Her face is red, and she eyes my crotch. Yep. Kissing you gives me the best ideas. Hmm. She hums and shoots me a playful smile that makes her dimples show. I have a much better one. Later, remember? I pull her upright. Come on. Are we allowed to be in here? Reagan asks as we walk into the arena. Eh, it would probably be frowned upon, but I won't tell if you don't. She stares out at the ice. Is now a bad time to admit I'm a terrible skater? I got you. We change into skates and I step onto the ice. When I look back, Reagan is still clinging to the wall. I haven't been skating since I was five or six. I take both her hands, and she slowly steps to me. It's like riding a bike. I was never very good at that either. She wobbles and squeezes my hands in a death grip. I'm basically pulling her along, but slowly her grasp lessens. The cool air makes her cheeks red. She's concentrating so damn hard. I move in front of her and skate backward. Show off, she mutters. Her gaze lifts to me, and she loses balance. I grab her elbow before she goes down. Oh, baby, this isn't even close to showing off. I pull her closer to the wall so she can stop and hold on if she wants. And then I take off on the ice, skating hard to the other end. I jump and go side to side, backward. I even throw in a little leap. Being on the ice makes me so ridiculously happy. But being here with Reagan is next level. It takes all of my love of skating and makes it seem more complete somehow. I want to take her skating a bunch more times until she's comfortable although her needing to hold on to me as we skate doesn't suck either. She finally starts to get the hang of it after a few laps. Her arms fall to her sides, and her stride lengthens. Together, we skate to the center of the ice. Thank you for this, 
It was good to get out of my head for a while. This play feels like it might be the end of me. Nah, not my girl. She's too tough to go out like that. I squeeze her hands. You've done a whole bunch of these before. Why is this one causing you so much trouble? Or is this like your creative process? Are you trying to politely ask if I turn into a drama queen, tortured artist every time? Your words, baby. No, not usually. I love acting, and when I step on stage, it's easy. Or it used to be. Slipping into someone else is comforting in a way I can't explain. What's different this time? Well, she starts, I told you how I landed a part that's different for me. I'm playing the youngest of three sisters. She's carefree and fun. She's a bit silly and always doing things for a laugh. Sounds fun. It is. Turns out fun is harder to pull off. I should have stuck with something more comfortable for me. How come you didn't? I've been trying to summon the courage for two years. I've been trying to summon the courage for two years. Dr. Rawson is great. I really respect her. And when I first got to Valley, I auditioned for two different roles. One serious girl-next-door type, and the other was a comedic relief character. She gave me the first part, and I got such great feedback from everyone. I guess I didn't want to take a chance and fail. And now? I'm taking all sorts of wild chances this year. I lift her and spin around, then set her back down. Show me. What? Perform for me. Here? You need a stage and an audience. I skate off to the side and pull myself up to sit on the half wall that goes around the rink. I can barely stand, and you want me to perform? She looks around and pushes off one foot hesitantly. I had a coach once who made us run drills blindfolded. What? She laughs. That sounds really dangerous. Yeah, it was. My parents were pissed. But it actually worked. I had to know exactly where I was on the ice. I had to feel it. Sometimes taking away the ability to see or hear... Or walk, she screeches. Your logic is twisted, Dr. Scott. I don't think that's going to work here. Either way, it should be entertaining. I cross my arms over my chest. Let's take it from the top of scene two, where you enter from stage right. She nods, opens her mouth as if she's going to deliver her first line, and then looks straight at me. Wait. How do you know? You left a copy of the script in my room. I hop down from the wall, back onto the ice, and skate toward her. It's a great part. You're gonna kill it. You don't know that. I do. You're the most amazing and talented person I know. You can do this. Okay. She inhales, and then lets it out slowly. I'm ready. I speak the first line, and then watch in awe as Reagan delivers hers. Amazing isn't the half of it. When she goes into performer mode, you can't help but stop and stare. I'm still staring when she looks at me and says, Next line. Right. Sorry. From there, I manage to keep up. I haven't seen her truly perform it before now so it's hard to say if the ice is helping or not. But I know I'm totally enthralled. She's funny. Her body language, the tone in which she speaks, the looks, it's incredible. She's incredible. We go through the first act. I'm back sitting on the wall, and she skates over to me. She's steadier now the longer she's been out here but she still clings to my legs for support when she reaches me. Thank you for this. Are you kidding? 
I feel like I just got an exclusive preview. You're going to be amazing. I don't know if it's the ice, or maybe just you, but I feel amazing. We should probably go soon. She nods. Okay. I just want to take another lap or two. We skate slowly. I still take her hand, even though she seems to have the hang of it now. What made you decide to be an actress? I watched a lot of TV as a kid. Mom was gone, and I was lonely. My chest aches at her admission. Fuck, baby. I'm sorry. During the day, I would go to friends' houses or play outside in the neighborhood. But at night, I was on my own a lot. I couldn't have friends stay over because I didn't want their parents to know. And I didn't want to be gone in case my mom came back or tried to call. She smiles. TV kept me company. How did you end up living with Janine? I told you our moms were friends. But I guess even she didn't realize how bad things were. My mom asked her to check in on me one random Saturday night. I don't know why she suddenly grew a conscience. She'd left me alone for entire weekends plenty of times before. Anyway, Janine's mom came over to see that I was doing okay. Reagan glances over shyly. I was more than okay. I'd thrown the most epic of high school parties. Even popular kids who never talked to me showed up. I was so cool for about two hours. Alas, my popularity was cut short when Marge, Janine's mom, busted in. She was nice about it, really. It could have been worse. She made everyone leave and then told me to pack a bag. I'm glad she looked out for you. Yeah, me too. Who knows what kind of trouble I would have gotten into without her watching out for me. Popularity would have gone straight to my head. And your mom? She didn't care that someone else had taken you in? I think she was relieved. Reagan's brows pull together. She wasn't mean or awful to me. At least not outright. She was negligent and absent. But I think she wanted good things for me. And she thought that was you living with someone else? It's hard for me to have any empathy for a woman who left her kid alone for days at a time. No matter the reason. Janine's family did take better care of me. Yeah, I guess. About six months after I moved to Valley, Lori started emailing me every day. You said you haven't talked to her. I haven't. I don't respond. The first few emails were apologies and promises that she was getting her life together, moving back home, getting a job that would keep her around. Now all I get is my horoscope. What? Every morning, she emails me my horoscope. It sounds weird when I say it out loud, but it was always her thing. When she was home, she'd read them out of the paper or the magazine while we had breakfast. I knew the astrological signs before I knew my ABCs. You ever think about replying? To say what? We've gone around the rink a couple of times, and we both stopped near the gate where we came in. I don't know. Just curious if you wanted to, I guess. I think I'll always want to. You want to, but you don't? I question, trying to make sense of it. I can't take her running out on me again. Even through email. Chapter 27 Reagan Sometimes you have to do like Elsa and let it go. Forgiveness is the key to happiness. Plus, stress gives you wrinkles. The night of Adam's scholarship banquet, I get ready at my apartment with Dakota and Ginny. How's it look? I ask Dakota. Ginny has a hand at my chin and gently corrects. 
Keep looking forward. I'm almost done. It's killing me not to see what she's doing to me. Not that I doubt her. Ginny's a genius with a makeup brush. She adds another layer of mascara and then holds two tubes of lipstick up to my face. Dramarama or candy yum yum? Dramarama, Dakota answers. My eyes go wide at the bright red she uncaps and starts dabbing on my lips. It's not too much, I ask. Hold still. Ginny smiles as she coats my mouth and then leans back, taking in the full effect. You look amazing. My best work yet. She looks to the bed where Dakota is sitting. Dakota, confirm. My roommate's jaw is slack and brows raised. My stomach drops. I'm already so freaking nervous and the shocked expression on her face is not helping. Honey, you look... Dakota still can't seem to find the words. I wave her off, giving her an out, so she doesn't have to finish that statement. I told you to I can't pull off a smoky eye. I always end up looking like a high price escort. I swivel in my seat to look in the mirror at the same time she says, beautiful. And I don't think I've ever called someone beautiful before. Like, legit, I'm stunned. She points to her face. I can't move my eyebrows down. They're stuck like this forever. Ginny claps. Yay, my brother's going to lose his shit. I hardly recognize myself, and holy crap, somehow I'm even more nervous. The alarm on my phone goes off, which means it's go time. We head over to the guy's place. Maverick is the first to see me. He drops the controller in his hand onto his lap. Whoa. Reagan, sweetheart, I think you just became the starring role in my dream later. Hot, right? Ginny asks as she sits next to Heath on the couch. He gives me a thumbs up. So hot, Mav mutters and keeps staring. You're a rocket. Adam walks out, adjusting his tie. I think he tells Maverick to fuck off, but I'm too busy ogling my handsome boyfriend in a suit and tie. Hey. His gaze finally lands on me and drops slowly. Fucking hell. I bask in his attention, even twirling so he can get the full effect of the dress. It's long, black, and so tight, I'm probably not going to be able to take a full breath all night. Totally worth the look he's giving me right now. You two are adorbs, Ginny says. Let me get a picture before you leave. This isn't prom, Adam protests but he wraps an arm around my waist and holds still while his sister takes a dozen photos. But when she suggests we go outside to get a few more, he guides me toward the front door. Okay, that's enough. We have to go. As soon as we step outside alone, Adam pins me against the building and his mouth slams down onto mine. He sucks the remaining air from my lungs, but who needs to breathe anyway? Dying kissing this man wouldn't be a bad way to go. Sorry. He pulls back and adjusts his jacket. Needed to get that out of the way. You look beautiful. Mav's right. You're a fucking rocket. You too. I run a hand along his chest and kiss him again quickly. Grinning, he tucks his hair behind an ear. Ready to do this? By the time we make it to the banquet, there are several more stops for kissing. The room is packed. Adam stops in the doorway and takes a deep breath. He hasn't mentioned the speech, but I know he must be nervous. You're going to be great, I assure him. He brings our joined hands to his lips, and we walk in together. Round tables are covered in white tablecloths. A single candle in a faux crystal holder sits in the center of each. Water glasses are turned upside down at each place setting, and black napkins rolled up with shiny silverware gleaning out the top. Simple elegance, but not too flashy. A low hum falls over the room as people talk. Groups stand mostly near the bar area, set up near the far wall. Some guests are already sitting at the tables. There are a lot of other students here tonight with their families, which I wasn't expecting, but Adam tells me it's because they're recognizing scholarship recipients for the pre-med program, too. Much like the mixer weeks ago, we're swept up in conversation from the moment we have drinks in our hands. Professors and scholarship committee members want to offer their congratulations and best wishes.
Adam takes it all in stride, thanking people, answering their questions, and attentively bringing me into the fold by introducing me and talking up the show next weekend. We're chatting with a woman who I think is a professor. I've sort of lost track of all the names and titles. She's asking me about my part in the play when Adam leans in and whispers that he's going to get us another drink. Be right back, he says, loud enough to excuse himself from the conversation. It sounds wonderful, she says. I can't wait to see it. She gives me a friendly smile. I won't keep you talking to the old people. Go have fun. It was great to meet you, Reagan. Tell Adam good luck tonight, and you break a leg next week, okay? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. As she walks off, I sip the last of my wine and look around. Adam's at the bar, one hand in his pants pocket, waiting for his drink. He's so devastatingly handsome. I've completely fallen for him. The real him, not the guy I built up in my mind over the years. The one I've gotten to know this past month. The one who likes to wake me up every morning by squeezing my butt, and who owns more hairbrushes than any one person should. Seriously, one in his Jeep, one in his backpack, one in his hockey bag, several stashed in his room and bathroom. And the generous and sweet man who makes the world my stage. Someone grabs my arm, and I tear my gaze away from Adam to find Janine at my side. Can I talk to you? I'd almost forgotten Janine and Sean would be here, or maybe I was just hoping they wouldn't show. Seeing her brings back too many bad memories. Hi, you look great, Janine. Thanks, she quickly dismisses the compliment. Lori, I groan, can't you give it a rest? Just for tonight? I don't want to get into this with you again. Not here. I take a step, but she walks with me. Reagan, please, you need to hear this. Lori, stop it, Janine. I keep my voice low, but I'm fuming. I don't need to hear anything. I will not be dragged back into the past, especially tonight. But I shake my head and brush past her to meet Adam halfway. I press up on my toes and kiss him, trying to erase all the hurt that Janine is so insistent on bringing back up. Why can't she just let it go? It's almost as if she wants to keep hurting me by bringing up the past. But the Janine I knew wasn't vindictive. What gives? What was that for? He asks. I, my heart hammers in my chest. I am so in love with him. I want to tell him. I want to tell the whole world. Sing it while skipping down the street and twirling, all of which he'd probably find wildly amusing. For now, I settle for another truth. I'm really glad that I'm here with you. His gaze roams over my face as his lips slowly pull up. I'm glad to dance with me. No one is dancing. I scan the room to validate my claim. Light music is playing, but there's no dance floor. So... I still hesitate. A server carrying a large tray nearly hits me with it as she passes by. She mumbles an apology, and Adam tugs me toward a small area of the room that's cleared of tables. His arms go around my back, and he brings our bodies close together. You're in this gorgeous dress, and I want to dance with you. More servers are bringing pitchers of water to the tables, and people are starting to take their seats. It looks like dinner is about to start, I say. Maybe we should take our seats. In a minute. I'm enjoying this. He hums lightly as he continues to move us to the beat of the music. How come your parents didn't come? I ask, as I lean my head on his chest and close my eyes, letting myself relax into him. There's nowhere else I'd rather be than in his arms. Eh. You did invite them, right? Nah. I wanted to spend tonight just with you. I glance up at him. His hazel eyes are impassive. Adam, your family would want to be here for this, if I get the scholarship. Otherwise, it would have been a long drive for nothing. They would have wanted to be here to support you regardless. He shrugs. This is more fun with just you. I have a sliver of concern that he didn't invite them because he didn't want to introduce me to his parents. I've met them before in passing, but never as his girlfriend. 
maybe we aren't at that point yet? When the song ends, his embrace loosens, and reluctantly we pull apart. He takes my hand. I'm still dreamily leaning into him and living in our happy little bubble when Adam says, Dr. Salco. A pair of reading glasses hang from her beaded necklace. Speeches will begin right after dinner. Janine first, then you. I feel him stiffen next to me, and I squeeze his fingers. I'm glad you could be here tonight, Reagan, Dr. Salco says. Me too. I look back to him. His nervous gaze meets mine and softens. He's going to be great. You picked a good one, Dr. Salco tells him. I'm so glad you'll have such a supportive fiancé while finishing school, she smiles. Or maybe wife? When is the wedding? It takes me way longer than it should to realize she means Adam's and my wedding. Oh, I glance to Adam for help. He clears his throat. We haven't really discussed that. If my face is as red as it is warm, then she has to know the truth. I sell it the best I can, resting my head on his shoulder and looking at him adoringly. It isn't hard to fake loving him like I think an engaged couple loves one another. In fact, it's a little too easy, and I have to remind myself we're once again playing a part. Dr. Salco flashes me the friendliest smile I've ever seen from her. We've clearly sold her on our fake engagement, but somehow that just makes me feel worse. Enjoy dinner and good luck tonight, Adam. When she's gone, I turn to him and whisper, you didn't tell her we weren't engaged? His brow furrows and the corners of his mouth pull down. I'm sorry, I meant to. Guilt is written all over his handsome face. God, no wonder he didn't want to invite his parents. That would have been an awkward conversation. It's a pleasure to meet you. Oh, by the way, we're just faking our engagement for everyone here. Yeah, I'm a super great influence on your son. Don't worry. I'm peeved that he didn't come clean, which is ridiculous. I'm the one who started the lie. If anyone is to blame, it's me. Still, I can't fight the irritation I feel at him as he leads us to our table. I think I'm going to get some air, I say as he pulls my chair out for me. Now? I'll only be a minute. I'll come with you. No, I place a hand out to keep him from following me. Stay. These people came for you, not me. I'll be right back, promise. When I get to the hallway, I take a breath. I can't shake the awful feeling from talking with Janine earlier, or the guilt of faking an engagement to a man I'm starting to be able to picture a life with. This isn't the way it's supposed to go. It all feels so wrong. When footsteps approach, I assume it's Adam coming to check on me. I even smile a little, thinking how sweet it is that he wants to make sure I'm okay. But when I look up, it's Janine that's walking toward me. I open my mouth to tell her to go away, but she beats me to it. I'm sorry, she blurts out. What? I shake my head and attempt to go around her. Fleeing from Janine is the game of the night, it seems. All the air is knocked out of me when I see her. Ten feet behind Janine... Her parents, Sean and Lori, stand watching us. Her hair is shorter, but otherwise it's like no time has passed. She's exactly like I remember her. And so is the punch to the gut at seeing her. I tried to tell you earlier, Janine says, as if that makes it okay. Why is she here? I grit out. My ears ring as she apologizes. I'm sorry. That's what I was trying to tell you earlier. My parents called as they were leaving the house, and I wanted to warn you as soon as I found out. Lori insisted on coming. She wants to meet Adam and tell you congratulations or whatever. There's nothing to congratulate me for. I thought... Janine trails off. Her brows knit in confusion. Of course, she believes we're really engaged, like everyone else. My life is none of her business. Janine, we should get inside. Sean speaks up but keeps his distance. I'm sorry. She whispers one last time before leaving me. Their happy family all goes inside, leaving me with Lori. 
Slowly, she closes the distance between us. Reagan, the way she says my name is soft and sad, like she's missed me, like even saying my name brings her pain. Hi, Mom. I don't know why I call her that. I've called her Lori since I was 12. It must be the shock. What are you doing here? We came to support Janine, of course, and it was the only way I knew to see you. Maybe I don't want to see you. Well, you've made that clear. There's a hint of a smile on her face, which pisses me off. Obviously not, I mutter, and walk toward the door to go back inside. Adam's coming out. His face relaxes when he sees me, but then he must read the situation because he looks past me and comes up short. Are you okay? He runs a hand down my arm from shoulder to elbow. Speeches are starting. I nod, not trusting what might come out of my mouth if I speak. I'm so mad. Mad that she's here and that Adam's worried about me when I'm supposed to be here taking care of him. Mad that we ever faked an engagement. Just pissed at the universe. Applause breaks out in the room, and I glance inside in time to see Janine making her way to the front. I still can't find my voice, but I lean into him. I feel infinitely stronger with Adam by my side. You must be the fiancé. Janine speaks highly of you. Lori smiles and looks back and forth between us. Her gaze takes in every detail. The way he touches me, and the way I let him support me. I hate that she's privy to even that much detail about my life. Um. Adam's head swivels between us. Adam, this is Lori. His jaw drops and he looks at her closer. It's nice to meet you. As Janine starts her speech, and the three of us hold our awkward standoff, I go from furious to enraged. How dare my mom show up here? After all these years, this is probably the first time she's ever shown up to a banquet or school function, and it's for Janine? Where was she my entire childhood? I was the kid who had no one there to take pictures as I received awards, no one to take me out for ice cream after. I stopped participating in things somewhere along the way. I didn't need the looks of pity or polite applause. Why worry about perfect attendance or perform in choir if no one is going to be there to celebrate it? With theater, I could forget that no one in the audience came to see me and lose myself in the darkened room imagining just for a minute that maybe she was there somewhere out of sight. I can't lose myself in this situation. It's almost time for me to go. Do you want to go in? Adam asks. Of course, I assure him. I don't want him to think about anything but killing his speech. I still haven't heard it, but I know he's been working hard on it. He deserves so much. I can't wait to see you crush it, but can you give us a minute? He nods. I'll wait at the door. I face Lori. There's nothing that I could have done to prepare for this. Years worth of playing this conversation over in my head, and I still don't know what to say. She's much chattier. He's very handsome. How long have the two of you been together? She speaks quietly, but every word slams into me with a crushing force. I don't answer. In fact, my throat feels like I swallowed nails. Speaking to her causes me physical pain. It's why I haven't in so long. Okay, well, at least let me tell you congratulations. My baby's getting married. I close my eyes and whisper, don't do this. Please, just stop. I know that I haven't always been there for you, but you're getting married. Every girl wants her mother at her wedding, and I want to be there. I want to be in your life again. God knows I failed you, but... You have no right, I say too loudly. My cheeks heat with embarrassment, and I glance down the empty hallway. I know. I'm sorry, Reagan. It isn't enough, but I am. You're starting a new life. I just want you to know that I want to be a part of that. My hands curl into fists, and my body vibrates. We're not even really engaged, okay? I spit the words at her. You're off the hook. He's not my fiancé. We're not getting married. You can keep on living your life and not giving a damn about me. I turn on my heel where Adam's waiting for me with Dr. Salco. I don't need to look at her downturned mouth to know she heard me. Adam's face says it all. 
so you just left? Dakota asks. I can read her judgment. I feel it deep in my soul. I couldn't breathe with her there. I can't believe the nerve, showing up like that. What was it like seeing her again? Like it was just yesterday that she was running out on me? All of the anger and hurt I've tried to shove down just came right back. I snap my fingers. My body still vibrates with rage. She squeezes my elbow. I'm sorry, babe. And fuck her. I wish I would have been there. I've dreamed of saying that to her face for three years. Thank you. I love you. What are you going to do about Adam? He had to stay for his speech, obviously. My stomach turns. He said it was fine and that he'd come by later. But I abandoned him. He's going to hate me. No, he won't. It was a shitty situation without a good outcome. But she didn't see his face. I think he was happy when I said I was leaving. Who could blame him? It was supposed to be a fun night for him. Instead, he got a dose of my crazy family drama, and I probably put his scholarship in jeopardy again. I look down at my lap. I've got to get out of this dress. It's mocking me. It's going to be okay, she promises. In my room, I take off my dress and sit on the floor. Oh, how I wish I could climb under the covers and fall right to sleep. But I know I'm in for a long, restless night, so I don't even bother getting into bed. Long after the apartment complex has quieted, Adam still hasn't called or stopped by. I pad over to the guy's apartment and peek in. Mav's on the couch with his phone in hand. Hey, Ray, he straightens. Is he here? I ask. Maverick nods toward the deck. I mumble my thanks and head out back. My heart races as he comes into view. I see him before he sees me, kicked back, beard dangling from his fingertips, staring out into the dark night. He looks over as the deck creaks under my footsteps. Hey. He tries to hide the despair on his face, covering it with a smile like he's happy to see me. I was just about to come check on you. He holds an arm out and I sit on his lap. How'd the rest of the banquet go? He runs a hand down the back of my head and I melt into his touch. Eh, my speech was crap, but at least it's over. We won't know which one of us got the scholarship until next week. I'm sure your speech wasn't that bad. I totally deviated from what I wrote. I'm not even sure it made sense. He makes a rough sound in his throat. You doing okay? I have had better nights. A shallow laugh escapes my lips. My mother managed to ruin yet another school function. I'm really sorry. You don't have anything to apologize for. I cannot believe she showed up there tonight. Yeah, I guess our fake engagement really made the rounds. I told you. You were a good actress. She told me she wanted to come to our wedding. Can you imagine? The happiest day of my life, and she thinks I'd want her there? But we're not really having a wedding, so I swallow taking in his words. Right, speaking of, why didn't you tell Dr. Salco the truth before tonight? I, he stares back out in front of him and then shrugs. I'm sorry, I should have. I started to, but I guess I was afraid of how it might impact the decision of the scholarship. Well, she definitely knows now. Did she say anything? No. I left as soon as my speech was done. I'll talk to her and explain. If he left as soon as he finished his speech, that means he's been home for a while. Home and avoiding me. Is that why you didn't invite your parents? You were afraid they'd find out we were together or think we were engaged? No, of course not. His brows pull together. Then he shifts to one hip and pulls a piece of paper out of his pants pocket. Before I forget, your mom asked me to give you this. You talk to her? I don't mean it to sound like an accusation, but the thought never even occurred to me that she'd use him to get to me. Briefly. I wait for him to say more. He shifts uncomfortably. All she wants is a chance to talk. And you think I should? A cool breeze stirs around us, and I cross my arms at my chest. I don't know. She's family. Maybe hearing her out will help. She's only family by blood. She was no mother to me. I know. Do you? Because you're acting like I should call her up and welcome her back into my life with open arms. The things she did, 
the way she abandoned you, it's awful. I hate her a little bit for you, but sometimes people change. He rubs my arm, but I don't feel any warmth. I cannot believe this. You're taking her side. No, definitely not. I'm on your side. Always. You didn't even want Rhett to talk to Carrie, and the only thing she did was boss him around for six years. That's not the whole story with Rhett. And you, I stand in front of him, a sick feeling in my stomach. You want me to forgive my mom and hear her out. When is the last time you talked to an ex-girlfriend? I recognize the impassive and distant look on his face, but I can't bring myself to stop. Do you know there isn't a single picture of an ex-girlfriend in your room? Not the one at your parents' house either, not in your phone, not even on social media, unless you count photos other people have tagged you in. All evidence is banished. Are you really pissed at me for not keeping in contact with girls I used to date? He runs a hand through his hair. What the hell is happening? When you're done with people, you're done with them. You write them off and move on to the next. I guess I'm just wondering how much longer until my time is up. And there it is. All of my worst fears recognized by the look on his face. This time isn't different. It's exactly the same. And I just moved us into the final phase of the Adam Scott relationship playbook. The breakup. That's a really shitty thing to say. It's true, though, right? My voice cracks. When we break up, you'll take a week or maybe two to rid me from your life. And then it'll be as if I never existed. It's what you do. This time together will mean nothing. We're here again? Seriously? I don't know how to make my feelings for you any clearer. I reach out for his arm and he flinches. Small, but I catch it. I'm sorry. I didn't mean it to sound like an attack on you. It's just, I can read you. I can see how upset you are. It's written all over your face. And I know how this goes. Someday, maybe it will be different for him. But this time isn't it. I'm tired of waiting for the other shoe to drop. He nods. Jaw flexes. Of course. I'm fucking upset. My girlfriend is counting down the days until I break up with her. Do you know why I didn't invite my parents tonight? I shake my head. Because things are still fucked up from the divorce, and I didn't know which one to invite. If I asked one and not the other, I thought I'd hurt someone's feelings. If I invited them both and they showed up, who knows what the hell would have happened. And even worse, there was a real chance that neither one would, because they're in some messed up avoiding game. So why bother? He finishes his beer and tosses it to the ground with a clank. His voice rises, angry and sharp. And Carrie fucking cheated on Rhett. So yeah, I didn't want him to talk to her and get sucked back in. I didn't know. No one does. That's why I didn't tell you. He doesn't even know that I know. I overheard him on the phone one day. He's agitated, angry. Shame washes over me. I know that my anger isn't really about him, but I'm terrified that he's just one more person I'm going to lose. I'm sorry. Seeing my mom took me by surprise. It's not an excuse, but it reminded me how few people I have left in my life. Maybe this just wasn't meant to be. I need you in my life, even if we're just friends. I'm not sure if I believe that, or if I'm trying to convince myself, because I think he does. He stands and takes my hands, links our pinky fingers. You can't mean that. We're great together. I get that my track record sucks, but I'm crazy about you. I want to believe that. Really, I do. But I'm not sure it's worth the risk. I'm not a gambler. Never have been. I learned early on that the house always wins. I care about you so much, Adam, but I can't do this. I'm so sorry. His face twists with frustration and maybe even sadness. I should go. He drops my hands and steps back, jaw set in stone, mouth in a hard line, and still the most beautiful man I've ever seen. I've watched Adam fall out of love with a lot of girls. It looks a lot like the look on his face right now. Chapter 28 Reagan It's going to be a good day, Cancer. Put a little extra pep in your step. 
blast some tunes, and be ready for anything. Reagan, Dakota knocks on the door. Ray, are you in there? I don't answer. I don't trust my voice or the tears that might follow. I'm tired of crying. I ordered lunch. Please open up. She waits a few seconds longer. Okay, well, food is on the counter. I'm going to class, but if you need anything or just want to talk, text me. She waits a few seconds longer, and then I hear her footsteps down the hall, and the front door opens and shuts. Curling up tighter and hugging a sweatshirt that Adam left in my room, I breathe in his scent. You'd think it wouldn't possibly be calming after last night, but somehow even heartbroken and angry, all I want is to be surrounded by him any way I can. He's certainly never coming back inside my room. I was mean and accused him of awful things. I took out all of my frustrations on him. I don't blame him for not calling or texting or chasing me down and trying to win me back. No sane guy would. And maybe it's better this way. No, I don't blame him. I blame Lori. All night I alternated punching my pillow and then sobbing into it. They say you can't outrun your past. I don't want to run from it. I want to move forward and erase it and all the damage and baggage that goes with it. I thought I had. Stupid me. This is for the best. All I did was beat him to the punch. Still, I sigh and wonder what if. The thing is... I may not have meant to blow up at him and say all of those things, but they were true. All of those concerns were things I was worried about, even before Lori showed up. He says it's different, but is it? When my alarm goes off an hour later, I'm in the same position. There's only one thing that could pull me out of bed today. I'm sluggish as I change clothes and splash water on my face. So sluggish that by the time I get to rehearsal, I'm late. They've already started, and Mila is on stage for me. I get into costume for the next scene change and then watch from the wings. Mila's come a long way from the nervous girl who walked into auditions. She's gained confidence, and that's made everything else she does better. At the end of the scene, they stop while director Hoffman makes some adjustments to props and positioning. Sorry I'm late, I say, walking out onto the stage. Mila smiles at me, but our hard-nosed director does not. I know how he feels about people being late. I'd offer more than my apology, but I don't have a good reason aside from my broken heart, and I'm just guessing, but I doubt he cares. Everyone gets set for the next scene, he says, and steps up onto the stage. Theater has always been the one place I can shut off the world and slide into someone else's skin. But today I can't summon the strength to be anyone but me. Sad, angry, heartbroken Reagan. It isn't as easy to get to that place where I block out everything else and become my character. But by the time we're done, I finally feel a little better. And I've even managed to not think about Adam for a bit. I grab my water while we get feedback. I know my performance today was abysmal. I mean, I've been struggling to nail some of the movements and dialogue. But whatever steps I'd taken to improve over the past few weeks, I leaped 12 backward. I'm surprised when he doesn't call me out. But as we start to clean up, he calls for me and Mila. I have an awful feeling as he regards us. He wastes no time beating around the bush. Hands on hips, he says, Reagan, Mila is going to cover your part. What? Cover for me when? For the duration of the play. I laugh. He must be joking. I was expecting a lecture, but not this. You missed yesterday. You were late this afternoon. And the scenes you did get in today were off. Swallowing my pride, I acknowledge that he's right. I cleared missing last night's rehearsal for the banquet, but it's obvious he's still holding it against me. I'm sorry. I've had a lot going on this week, but I will be ready tomorrow. I promise. We don't have time for you to work through personal issues. The performance is in six days. I need your best now. I know. 
And I'm ready. I will be ready. Please? His mouth falls into a thin line. I'm sorry. I think this is the best thing for the entire group. He dismisses us with a nod and walks off. Mila looks as if she might pass out. I'm so sorry, she says immediately. My legs tremble and my chest aches. I must have cried too much in the past 24 hours because I can't get past my shock to feel the really awful, soul-shattering pain I know is coming. I can try to talk to him, she offers. No, I say quickly. He won't change his mind. I pull at the collar of my costume dress. It has a high neck with lace trim that irritates my skin. Congratulations. I hope I'm smiling, but my face feels numb. There's always next year, right? My already broken heart smashes into a few more pieces. I take my time going back to the apartment. I know that Dakota will want to talk to me and tell me everything is going to be okay, but I'm not ready to face her or Jenny. Except when I get to the apartment complex, there are very few cars in the lot, and the silence continues up to our apartment. It isn't until I'm inside that I remember there's a hockey game tonight. Everyone is there. Most of Valley, all my friends. Adam? I drop onto the couch and turn on the TV, staring blankly. When I Love Lucy pops onto the screen, I burst into tears. No play, no friends, and no Adam. It's just Lucy and me again. Chapter 29 Adam after the game, the guys are in good spirits. It was a low-scoring game, but we were victorious, continuing our winning streak. Can I catch a ride to the bar? Rhett asks. He could easily go with someone else. Half the team is going to the hideout to hang for a few hours. We have another game tomorrow afternoon, so most of us will call it an early night. There are a few guys on the team that can manage to party hard the night before a game and still function. Okay, not a few. There's Mav. Anyone else who tries to keep up with him tonight will be sitting their ass on the bench tomorrow, or puking out their guts between periods. Sure, whatever. I'm not staying out long. You always say that. And yet you never leave until you make sure everyone else is headed home and safe. He smirks. Not tonight. My head hurts. No, scratch that. My whole body hurts. Ever since last night when Reagan lashed out, kicked my fucking chest in, I feel like I can't breathe. She was waiting for me to screw up, for us to end, just like all my other relationships. I guess I can't blame her, but damn. I didn't realize she'd been holding on to it. Or that she thought so little of me. Why would she want to be with me at all if she really believed that? Then I remember she doesn't want to be with me anymore. So I guess that makes sense. It still feels like a dream. What the hell happened? I mean, okay, I know what happened but I don't understand why all of a sudden everything between us means nothing. I don't know whether or not to fight for her or back off. She's always got me second-guessing myself, and I really hate that. That prickling sensation and nausea hit me hard. I fight it, wish it away, but it builds and builds. It's always been the same. Every relationship gets to this point where I feel sick to my stomach. Usually, it's because I've realized it won't work. But now, I'm just gutted. I scan the bar as we enter. Ginny and a few other girlfriends of guys on the team are seated at our usual table. No, Reagan. That awful feeling takes over, and I can no longer push it away thinking that maybe it was just a stupid fight and we both needed time to cool off. Nah, it's really over. Feels like it's done before it ever really started. So many things I still want to do with her. Congrats on the game. Ginny stands as I get to the table and hugs me. 
Thanks. She pulls back and searches my face. I know that look. A concerned Ginny is an unusually stubborn Ginny. Are you okay? Yep, I say. I take one of the empty glasses on the table and pour myself a beer. I nod and say hello to everyone. I make a lap around the bar. It's easier to fake quick, easy conversation than fall into something deep or meaningful with the people who know what's going on. Dakota's not here? I ask Rhett as I refill my glass for the third or fourth time. Not that I've seen. She was at the game, though. I nod. I think I'm about ready to go, he says. You want to head out? I mull that over. Go back to the apartment where Reagan is ten feet away, and I might run into her, or stay here where she isn't, and drink. The choice is obvious. I'd rather be far away, so the physical distance matches the emotional. Being that close, knowing she's there but doesn't want to see me, makes that awful churn in my gut worse. No, I think I'm going to stay. You go ahead. I'm sure Heath and Ginny are headed back soon. Those two never stay out long anymore. He looks like he might want to say something, but Rhett always chooses his words carefully, mulls them over before speaking. I take advantage of that and walk away before he figures out what he wants to say. I find Maverick at the bar. He's got three shots in front of him. Jordan and Liam are cheering him on. Liam's got his phone out, taking video of the whole thing. Maverick contemplates which glass to take and settles on the one in the middle. He tosses it back and then grins. Rumple! He dances around playing eeny, meeny, miny, mo with the remaining two. What's he doing? I ask Liam. Shot roulette. Oh, fuck. Tequila? No. He chuckles, then whispers, Cheap-ass vodka. My lip curls. Maverick wraps his fingers around the glass on the right and closes his eyes as he takes it. ooh he says as he drops the empty back on the bar. Triple sec. Fuck, Jordan curses as Maverick slides the last shot to him. Yo, Scott. He claps me on the shoulder. I'm unbeatable, Cap. Getting the team fucked up, are we? Jordan shoots the vodka and then gags. He shudders. My insides are on fire. Another? Mav asks him. Jordan and Liam look to me and shake their heads. I'm in, I say. But I get to pick the shots. Hell yeah! Maverick's excitement should tell me just how bad of an idea this is. But fuck it. Maverick goes to the bathroom while I order three shots from the bartender. Anything else? She asks with a smile. No, I think we're good after this. You can run my card. When we're set to go again, we attract an audience. The guys on the team who are still at the bar crowd around which pulls the attention of everyone else. Mav! 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 They chant as he selects the first shot. It goes quiet as he brings it to his lips. He smiles and wipes the back of his mouth. White wine. Nice, Scott. Classy choice. I smirk. The bar gets noisy again. Maverick eats up the attention, hopping around and making a big show out of trying to decide which shot to take next. Which one? He asks the bartender. Oh no, she holds her hands up. You're on your own. How fucked am I if I choose wrong? Her eyes flit to me, and she grins. Pretty fucked. Sorry. That makes everyone howl with laughter. 
He exhales a breath that puffs out his cheeks and grabs the shot glass on the left, tosses it back quickly. I don't know which shot is which at this point, so I'm waiting to see his reaction just like everyone else. He lifts his hands overhead in victory. Coconut vodka! Excited cheers ring out. A few people slap my back, commiserating. Oh, shit. The bartender laughs. Looks like you're the one that's fucked. Maverick sniffs the remaining glass before handing it over. What is it? Rum and tequila. I mutter before shooting it. It burns all the way down, and I cough. Maverick slings an arm around my neck. You're fucking crazy, Scott. We stay away from shots after that, but Maverick and I linger until we're the last guys on the team at the bar. Anne, the bartender, is closing out tabs, and servers are wiping tables. Another? I ask him, lifting my almost empty glass. He shakes his head. You outdrank me. Congratulations. Do you guys have a ride? Anne asks. I feel around for my phone. I haven't touched it all night, but it's there in my front pocket. I'll grab us an Uber. Mav puts some cash in the tip jar and stands. I already texted Dakota. She's coming to get us. Dakota? My mouth goes dry. Reagan isn't with her. I wasn't, I start. Mav chuckles. Come on, Scott. It's been a long night. I sway on my feet. My buddy is quick to grab an arm and steady me. Not so sure out drinking you was a good idea. That's what the last guy said. Then he kissed me. I lift my head, which has suddenly become really heavy, to check to see if he's serious. That's the thing about Maverick. He never seems serious, but I've never known him to lie or exaggerate either. He's unfiltered and honest, but the dude's fucking crazy too, so his truths always feel a little ridiculous. That's a story for another time, Mav says and opens the door for me. On a scale of one to ten, how pissed is Dakota? I ask when I spot her car pulling into the parking lot. He doesn't answer until she stops in front of us. Why else do you think she'd agree to come get us? Pulling open the passenger side door, Mav slides into the seat. Dakota, baby. He rolls down the window. You coming? Walking is starting to sound like a better choice, especially when I make eye contact with Dakota and she glowers at me. Get in, Scott, she says, and I obey. It's a long walk to the apartment. Thanks for coming to get us, I say as I buckle up. Missed you tonight. Maverick plays with the radio until he finds a song he likes. He sits back and drums his hands on his legs. What did you do? Oh, you know, held my best friend's hand while she cried her eyes out. Dakota's eyes find mine in the rearview mirror. Even as the image of Reagan crying kicks me in the gut, I can't help asking for more. How is she? Dakota doesn't answer. Mav looks over his shoulder at me and then asks her again. How is she? She'll be fine. But right now she's a mess. I swallow thickly. Anything we can do? Dakota meets my gaze in the mirror again. Yeah, leave her be. I consider doing that until we get back. I linger behind Dakota as she opens her apartment door. She stops and glares at me. She'll talk to you when she's ready. But... 
Unless you're going to walk in there and tell her that she's the one and nothing is going to come between you, then walk away. She's going through some shit. She can't take any more heartbreak. Yeah. All right. I mumble my thanks for the ride, and she leaves me standing outside by myself. I know she's right. But I just want to see her, talk to her, comfort her any way I can. Maybe I should be angry with her, but I can't manage it. Instead, I tuck tail and go to my place. Ginny and Heath are on the couch, lying together, watching a movie. Ginny lifts her head from Heath's chest. Hey. Hey. I go to the kitchen and grab a glass of water, chug it, and then fill another to take to my room. Ginny steps into my room as I go to shut the door. I'm tired, G. She holds out her hand. I brought you some Tylenol. I heard you drank Maverick under the table. I take them with a nod of thanks. Hardly under the table. He had to help me out of the bar. Ginny snorts and sits on my bed. I kick off my shoes and lie down. I slept like shit last night. And the exhaustion I've kept at bay all day finally starts to set in. Have you talked to her? No. Dakota made it clear she didn't want to talk to me. Made it clear that Reagan didn't want to talk to you? Or that she didn't want you to? I shrug. Kind of the same thing. What happened? Do we have to talk about this now? I rub at the ache in my chest. You love her. I know that you do. Whatever happened, don't give up so easily. She ended things with me. So maybe you should be having this conversation with her. Oh, I will. But something tells me that Reagan isn't going to be the one to make a move here. It's up to you. Up to me to what? Beg her to feel something for me that she obviously doesn't? To trust me? The things she said, the way she looked at me. I get that she was hurting. But she took all the things I told her I didn't want to be and tossed them in my face. Maybe she's right. Reagan's been through some shit. We are her family. You and Dakota especially. I don't want to fuck that up for her. You keep saying that this time things are different. But from everything I've seen, you're doing exactly what you always do. Ginny stands. You want to prove she's different? Now is your chance. Chapter 30 Reagan it's a new day, Cancer. Dab on a little eye cream and pack your brass knuckles. It's an anything goes type of day. Dakota and Ginny are in the living room when I force myself out of bed Saturday. Morning, I say. I think you mean afternoon. Dakota smiles sadly and holds out her arms for me to go to her, which I do happily. I sink down on the couch beside her and she wraps me in her arms. Ginny joins us and hugs me from the other side. Feeling any better? Dakota asks, still hugging me tightly against her. A little. I pat the bags under my eyes. The sensitive skin hurts to touch. After the game, Dakota came home and sat beside me while I blubbered for the better part of the night, nonsensical ranting and crying. I brought you an iced coffee. Ginny holds out the large cup to me. Thank you. I set it on the coffee table. Has he called? She asks, no. I saw him last night after he got home from the bar. He was in rough shape. She glances at Dakota. I want to ask more about what that means, press her for anything he might have said, but I don't deserve to know. Whatever happened, you two can get through this, Ginny pleads. I've never seen either of you so happy. We can't, we won't. It's over. My heart breaks a little more, saying it out loud. And it's probably for the best. 
I refuse to believe that, Ginny says. Coda? My roommate shrugs. I don't know. Well, I do, I say. You guys weren't there. It was awful. We're not coming back from that. People fight. Adam's crazy about you. Ginny's optimism makes my chest ache. I know that he's your brother, but come on. We all know that Adam doesn't do second chances. Trust me, we're over. What can we do? Do you want to go to the track and run it out? Dakota asks. I find it amusing that her plan for getting over heartbreak is exercising it out of her system. Or we could go to the wineries. Wine and sunshine. A little fresh air. Ah, sunny Ginny. I love these two. But there's nothing they can do to make me feel better. And I don't feel like faking it for their benefit. Thanks, but I have to be at rehearsal in an hour. Did you get your part back? Dakota asks, a note of hope in her tone. No. Wait, what? Ginny asks. I shake my head. I screwed up. Can't you call in sick? You look sick. Dakota smooths a hand over my hair. No, I need to do something. Get out of this apartment and try to function. Besides, the show is this week, and every rehearsal is crucial, even if I'm no longer a crucial member. I still can't believe I lost my part. There will be other shows, but it stings. I worked so hard, and I was excited about doing something different, proving I'm more than a pretty face that can recite a few lines. Shouldn't you be at the game anyway? I ask Ginny, looking at the time. Eh, Heath can manage one game without me. I quirk a brow. She's wearing his jersey and has blue and yellow ribbons tied to the end of her braids. I wanted to make sure you were okay. I'm here for you. Go. I'm okay. Are you sure? She uncrosses her legs to stand. Positive. Get out of here. I smack her on the butt as she gets to her feet. I love how excited she is to go cheer on her man. It even makes me feel the tiniest bit better. Text me if you need anything. She waves as she leaves the apartment. You're not going? I ask Dakota after Ginny's gone. No, I've had enough hockey for one weekend. Do you want to order food before your rehearsal? I'm not hungry. I'm going to take a long shower. Okay, well... I'm going to grab lunch, and then I guess maybe I'll stop by the game for a bit since you have rehearsal, but text me as soon as you're done. I will, I promise. Even though I really don't want to be there, I get to rehearsal ten minutes early. I'm in the back helping pull props when Mila gets there. Hi, she says tentatively. I'm so sorry. Don't be. You are doing a great job. Still, she offers me a small smile. What if I forget all my lines and mess up the entire show? You won't. I'm not going to let you. Come on. Let's get you ready. After rehearsal, I borrow Dakota's car and head out of town. The drive to my hometown feels like a dream. I don't remember any of it, and I don't think I even turn on the radio. Sitting outside of my mom's house, I take in the pots of flowers on the porch and the matching white rocking chairs. The house itself... Looks like it's been painted recently, and the windows are open. No dark curtains pulled tight across every crack, blocking out the light and any prying eyes. I've been sitting outside for the past ten minutes, trying to work up the courage to go inside. Maybe Adam's right, and I should talk to her. I don't know anymore. Not talking to her feels as awful as talking to her. I should have asked Dakota to come with me, but I felt like I needed to do this on my own. Besides. I can't remember the last time I introduced someone to my mom on purpose. Not that she was around enough for that to have even been a consideration. I don't know what I'm walking into today. Seeing her inside counting money on the kitchen table, rummaging through couch cushions, or rolling change would almost be an easier thing to see than her making home improvements or knitting. Then I could get back in the car and leave without a second's hesitation. But if she's really changed... That decision is harder. Try as I might to push away the longing for her approval and love, I can't. I hate that about myself. I don't need her. I've proven that by basically raising myself and moving away, going to college, having as normal of a life as I can. But deep down, I can't remove that piece of me that's connected to her. If I could, I certainly already would have. 
She appears at the front door, probably trying to figure out who's creeping outside. She steps out and smiles. With a lump in my throat, I get out of the car and walk toward her. Reagan, she smiles. Do you want some iced tea? I just made a pitcher. I open my mouth to say no. Maybe scream how ridiculous the thought of us sitting together sipping sweet iced tea is. But I came here with a purpose, and I need to keep my composure until I say my piece. Sure. I sit on the front step as she goes inside. I can't bring myself to go in. This house holds too many memories, few of them happy. A sad, lonely girl lived here, and I don't want to be reminded of her. Lori comes back a minute later with two glasses of tea and takes a seat in one of the rocking chairs. I'm glad you came. I was afraid I'd never see you again after the other night. How long have you been back? I don't bother with pleasantries. I come out swinging. I need to know if this is another one of her month-long attempts at a normal life before she disappears again. Three months. Longer than I expected. Janine said you're working at the elementary school. I am, for now. The pay is crap. I take a sip of the tea and then put the glass down. I can't sit here and pretend to be having a lazy Saturday afternoon with my mom on the front porch. You can't just show up in my life like you did. It isn't fair. I didn't know how else to see you. That isn't an accident. I did what was necessary to protect myself from you constantly coming in and out of my life. Every time I think I've put it behind me, you pop up. I thought this time, the years and distance between us, it was really over. And in some ways, that was so much easier to handle. Not expecting or hoping for anything. I understand that. Do you? Do you have any idea what it was like for me? Her brown eyes widen and glass over like she might cry. You let someone else raise me. Marge did a much better job than I could. You were better off. I wasn't. Hot, angry tears fall from my eyes. I swipe at them. She was a better mom than you, hands down. She made me breakfast in the mornings and remembered important dates. She never asked me to give her my birthday money so she could double it. But she wasn't you. I just wanted you to get your shit together. She closes her eyes, and the tears slide down her cheeks. I did the best I could. Now you seem to be doing better, and that's great for you, but it's too late for me. I don't need you anymore. She stands and walks over to sit beside me, pulling me into her arms. It's a foreign feeling, but not altogether terrible. Once upon a time, curling up on the couch together was a regular thing. She smells just the same, like hairspray and her floral perfume. My shoulders shake and I sob into her. I'm still pissed, but there's something comforting that my body can't deny. I let her hold me as I cry out my frustration and hurt. When I'm done, I pull back and wipe my face. I didn't come here to make amends. Why did you come? because I need to move on. I twist my hands together in my lap, and I guess I needed to see this place for myself to see that you were doing better. The old house looks better than I imagined. Doesn't it? She beams. I'm glad you think so. It'll go for a pretty penny. You're selling it? Her mouth opens and she sighs, then nods. She takes my hands in hers. Think about what we could do with the money. You could pay for school or buy yourself a new car. Have a nice little nest egg for when you graduate. And you? Where would you live? Her eyes twinkle as her lips pull up into a smile. A rush of uneasiness floods my veins. I found a cute little apartment in Vegas. I don't understand. I thought you were back and working at the school. But I do understand. I understand all too well. This place was never for me. Or you. She places a hand on my cheek. You and I were made for bigger and better things. Closing my eyes, I focus on breathing and not the shattering of my heart. What do you need from me? Nothing. Well, the house is still in your name. Got it. You need me to sell it for you. For us. Laughter spills from my lips. For us. Right. I should go. Reagan, she admonishes. What about the house? 
You want to sell it? Fine by me. Great. Let me call my realtor. No, I think I'll find my own. It is my house, after all. The implication of that hits her, and she looks so shocked. After everything I've done to the place? That's rather selfish, don't you think? Selfish? Ha! Huh. Don't get me started. If I'm selfish, it's because I learned from the master herself. I wave a hand at her. I did the best that I could. And look how great you turned out. No thanks to you. I take one last look at the house and at her. I know it's the last time. She'll have no more use for me after this. I'll make sure that you're compensated for the renovations. But after that, you and I are done. I have nothing left to say to you. Stop contacting me. I don't want to see you or read another email. You are not my family. Chapter 31 Adam Congratulations, Adam. Dr. Salko smiles. Maybe the biggest one I've ever seen from her. I can see her teeth and everything. We're all really pleased to offer you the scholarship, and we know you're going to be a great addition to the program. I hold the envelope with the official award letter. It feels light in my hand. Unbelievable. I was sure after everything that happened that night, there was no way I was getting the money. I don't even remember half of what I said when I gave my speech. I obsessed over that thing for weeks, and then I got up there, and it just didn't matter. I wasn't even nervous because I wasn't there. Not really. I was a million miles away while standing in front of a group of people who mean next to nothing to me. I respect them, sure, but they aren't a part of me like Reagan is. I need to apologize to you. I set the envelope on her desk in case she wants to snatch it back in a moment. I lied about being engaged. Reagan is, or she was, my girlfriend. But we were never engaged. I asked her to be my date, and well... We thought it would help my chances with the committee if we exaggerated our relationship. She's a hell of an actress. I smile, thinking back to that night of the mixer. How damn convincing she was. How much I liked it. I should have come clean immediately, but I was afraid it would cost me the scholarship. Anything else? All things considered... I should probably tell you to give Janine the money. She played fairly, and she deserves it as much as I do. Maybe more. I was surprised to learn you weren't engaged, but your relationship status did not sway the committee either way. I'm sorry you felt the need to lie to better your chances. Reagan explained everything when she stopped by yesterday. My head snaps up. Reagan came to see you? She smiles. This one is definitely the biggest I've ever seen from her. It even makes her eyes twinkle a little. Medical school is hard. It helps to have people who will be there for you. Engaged or not, it's clear you do. Anyone who would go to such lengths to help you achieve your dreams is worth keeping around. She nods toward the envelope. I swallow thickly. I do have people like that. A lot of them. Who does Reagan have? Please don't let this leave the room, as I haven't talked to Janine yet. But I was able to find another scholarship for her. You both deserve to be here. And I'm doing my best to make sure that happens. Thank you. Another four years of going head-to-head -head with Janine. Yeah, that sounds about right. I leave Dr. Salko's office smiling. I did it. I really did it. My chest expands as I breathe in, and relief floods through me. I'm one step closer to getting everything I want. Or almost everything. 
I pull out my phone and consider texting Reagan. A week ago, she would have been the first person I told. And now? I think it's highly likely she'd ghost me even if I did reach out. I have no idea where we stand. I miss her, but I can't shake that feeling that maybe it isn't right. Maybe we are better off ending things now and protecting whatever friendship we can salvage from here. I don't want to hurt her. That much I know. Instead of Reagan, I text my mom and dad. One text, both parents. I'm tired of tiptoeing around their divorce. They promised us that we'd still be a family, and I'm holding them to that. If not for me, for Ginny. But if I'm honest, mostly for me. Their responses come almost instantly. Mom hearts my text. She just learned to do that and does it every chance she gets, and says, congratulations. From my dad, I get the applause emoji and, way to go. Look at me, bringing people together. I smile, and then it falls. I pocket my phone and head to class, the gloominess I felt earlier slowly creeping back in. When I'm done for the day, I head back to the apartment. I linger outside of Reagan and Dakota's door. Texting feels wrong, but I can't just go over there. And if I knock and Dakota answers, she's likely to slam the door in my face. I'm standing there trying to come up with a plan when Rhett opens our door and steps out. She isn't there. Who? I ask. He laughs. Reagan. That is why you're standing out here creeping in the breezeway, right? Because if you're standing out here trying to find a new girlfriend... I've scoped out our other neighbors, and you won't do any better. Of fucking course I won't do any better. There is no better. Where are you going? He's in jeans and a sweater. I think he even combed his hair. Going out. You want to come? You're going out? Why? Carrie and I broke up. For good this time, he lifts his arms to his sides. I'm single. It isn't all it's cracked up to be. I mutter and then ask, where are you going? Does it matter? No, I guess it doesn't. Mav drives the three of us to the White House. It's Valley U's unofficial basketball house. The place is insane. When you win a national championship, I guess this is what you can expect. Here's hoping that's us this year. There are a lot of people, as is the case any time I've ever been here. The house itself is huge and over-the-top elegance for college guys, but the backyard is where it's at. There's a keg on one side of the yard, and a folding table has been set up as a DJ stand, and music pumps. It should be too cold for swimming, but their giant pool is heated, and some of the bravest are in bikinis and trunks, enjoying the water with a drink in hand. Maverick disappears, mingling as he always does, mad dog in hand. Rhett and I fill our cups with beer and slowly weave through the crowd. Adam! Someone yells my name, and I look over the crowd until I see Sage heading toward me. Hey! She gives me a side hug and waves at Rhett. I heard you and Reagan broke up. She sticks out her bottom lip. Way to kick a guy when he's down, Sage. Fuck. Guess who else broke up, Rhett says, bringing the attention off me. No way. Her eyes light up. Wait until I tell the girls. She claps and runs off. When she's gone, I look to Red. Thanks for that. But I don't think you know what you just got yourself into. These girls have been circling you for four years. That was the idea. 
I don't for one second think Rhett is going to turn into the guy who sleeps with puck bunnies. It's not who he is. But far be it for me to get in the way if he needs to sleep around after dating the same chick for six years. What about you? How long until you get back out there? I glare at him. What? It's a valid question. Remember Montana? You broke up with her on a Sunday night, and by Monday afternoon, you were dating... He stares up like he's trying to remember. Barbie, I say. He snaps. That's it. Barbie. Not the same thing. Reagan's not the type of girl you just move on from. Have you talked to her at all? Nah. Dakota told me to leave her be. She doesn't want to talk to me. That's Coda talking. She's hella protective of her girl. Maybe. But Reagan hasn't reached out. All right, well. You aren't ready to move on, and you're not going to talk to Reagan. What's the plan for tonight? Can't we just hang out without girls? He laughs. Yeah, we could. But what fun would that be? It's like I don't even know you. I shake my head. Come on. I'm a hell of a good wingman. And I am. It's easy to focus on Rhett when I have no interest in talking to anyone else here. It's weird seeing him flirt with girls. Or attempt to. He's real rusty. He's giving me save me eyes while he talks to some chick who ran up to offer her condolences to us on our recently failed relationships. Rhett being Rhett engaged. And now she's latched onto him. Excuse us, I say, and wrap an arm around his shoulders, pulling him away. There's an emergency. He's the only man for the job. Rhett hurries with me to the other side of the yard. What's the emergency? Getting you away from that chick. Thank you, he grins. Nice acting skills. I think Reagan rubbed off on you. It physically hurts every time I hear her name. No problem. If I'm going to be a good wingman, I'm going to need to know what your type is, though. I don't know. He shrugs one big shoulder. What's your type? An image of Reagan flashes in my mind. Is that my type? I try to find the common thread between her and other girls I've dated. Doesn't matter. She's the only one I want back. Thinking about Reagan again? He asks with a grin. Maybe. You get this look on your face. Look, I know we're different. And so any advice I give you is probably falling on deaf ears. But I think you should talk to her. Get closure or get her back. That part's up to you. But you're a real bummer to party with. He lifts both hands to his sides. I'm finally single. You've been razzing me for years so we could pick up chicks together. Let's do it. Shit. He's right. Many times I've wished we could do just this. Party and be single at the same time. Okay, yeah. Let's fucking do this. For the next three hours, I am the life of the party. Drinking, chatting to anyone and everyone. We play beer pong, flip cup. Hell, we even jump in the pool in our boxers. I don't even try to fake interest in the girls that blatantly hit on me. But it doesn't matter. Tonight is about Rhett and hanging with my best buddy, Rhett's giggling like a tween girl as we leave the party to catch a ride. Mav already left. It's probably the first time ever that Rhett stayed out later than him. I lost a sock somewhere, he says. Got a phone full of numbers, though. Yeah. We get in the Uber, and Rhett starts scrolling through his new contacts. What's the likelihood I'm going to remember who 
pink shirt hottie is tomorrow. Slim, buddy. But you can always lead off with a text that says something like, I fat-fingered your name when I entered it into my phone, and now I can't remember it, but I really want to take you out. In the future, have the girl enter her contact info in your phone. She'll tell you as little or as much as she wants. I once had a girl include her full name, birthday, address, and in the notes a list of her favorite color, flower, and food. You can learn a lot about a girl by what she puts in your phone. Wise words. Should have known you had a system. By the time we get to the apartment a few minutes later, Rhett's so sleepy he shuffles up the stairs and into our place. He falls onto his bed face down, fully dressed, minus one sock. I head back out the front door, walk to Reagan and Dakota's apartment, then hesitate. I knock softly and wait. I'm about to give up, head resting on the front door when she opens it. Hey. I shove both hands in my jeans pockets and take a step back. Hi. She folds her arms at her waist and looks around. What are you doing here? I missed you. It's honest, but damn. I hadn't meant to blurt it out like that. I've missed you too. The words should make me feel better, but she says it like it's a real inconvenience. I started to text, but I wasn't sure you'd answer. No response. Listen, I'm sorry about the other night. I can't imagine what that was like for you having your mom show up. I should have gone with you, and I never should have let her use me as a messenger. She would have found another way. She's amazingly resourceful when she needs something. I went to see her today. You did? Reagan nods. I thought maybe she really had changed. She huffs a laugh. Lori wants to sell the house, but it's in my name. She didn't come to Valley to reconnect or because she thought I was engaged. She needed money. Like always. I'm sorry. Damn, I hate that woman. It's okay. I feel like maybe I've finally made peace with it. Or I'm working on it. She rubs her upper arms and shrugs. She is who she is. And I have to accept that. You shouldn't have to accept that. You deserve so much better. She nods. Her brown eyes are haunted, and I want nothing more than to chase away the ghosts of her past. Can I come in? We could watch TV, talk some more. I just want to be near you. I've missed you so damn much. I got the scholarship, and all I could think about was calling you up and telling you. You did? She sounds as shocked as I felt. Yeah. Thanks to you, I appreciate what you did. All of it. I should have done it sooner. I'm sorry that I almost cost you the scholarship. I bet Janine's bombed. Actually, it sounds like they found another scholarship for her, too. Congratulations. That's amazing. Truly. I'm really happy for both of you. We could celebrate. I think I've got a bottle of red. I jab a thumb back toward my apartment. Standing here talking to her is the best I've felt all week, and I don't want to leave. I don't think that's a good idea. It's late. Okay. Can I see you tomorrow? This weekend? The play is this weekend, so I'm going to be pretty busy. Even though I lost my part... I heard. I'm sorry. I still have to be there. The show must go on and all that. Well, how about next week? You name the time and place. I consider throwing in next month, but she looks like a startled horse about to bolt.
I need you and me to be okay. Just about the worst thing I can imagine is the two of us not being able to be in the same room together. You mean too much to me. You, Dakota, Ginny, the guys. You're my family. And I can't risk losing the only family I have left. Never. You have us. Always. That doesn't change whether or not we're together. Doesn't it, though? This is the first time we've spoken in days. She shakes her head. I should go. It's late. It was really good to see you, Adam. My fingers itch to touch her, pull her to me, kiss her. But instead, I back away, slowly watching until she shuts the door. With a sigh, I head back inside. I sink onto the couch. Ginny's in the kitchen getting a glass of water. Hey, she says, voice deep from sleep. Where have you been? Outside talking to Reagan. Yeah? Ginny looks hopeful. I don't know what to do. I miss her, and I want to be with her, but maybe it just isn't meant to be. Why do you say that? I always thought when I found the right girl, I'd just know. That things would click into place. That it would be easy. Mom and Dad always made it look that way. I realize what I've said and add. And look how well that worked out. Fuck. I don't know. You're a guy who likes facts and certainties. I get that. I can't tell you if it's right or not with Reagan but I know that this is the first time you've ever acted like you cared when a relationship ended. That's because I didn't want it to end. No? Ginny's brows pinched together. Then why did it? Reagan said she could read it on my face. That we were done and we weren't meant to be or whatever. That she was tired of waiting for the other shoe to drop. I rough a hand through my hair. I hesitated. I thought maybe she was right. But you don't think that now? I can't stop thinking about her. Ginny looks at me with big, sappy eyes. I don't want to lose Reagan because I gave up too soon. But I know that she's been hurt, and I can't add to that, even unintentionally. What if I'm wrong? You could start by telling her all that. I did. I think back. Okay. I didn't use those words. Ginny rolls her eyes. Try using the words you mean, bro. I chuckle. Yeah, I guess you're right. Also, if you're going to win her back, you should do it not reeking of alcohol or wearing jeans with a wet crotch. I glance down. My boxers were still damp when I pulled on my pants, and sure enough, there are weird wet spots all over the front. Fuck me. Go to bed, Ginny says. We'll figure it out in the morning. Chapter 32 Reagan I walk to campus and head to University Hall. Janine's waiting for me at one of the tables. I drop into a chair across from her, and she slides a cup across the table. Light cream, half sugar. Thank you. I wrap my hands around it, but don't drink. And thanks for meeting me here. I wasn't sure you'd show. Figured it must be important. You haven't called me in years. I nod. I wanted to apologize for the way I've acted. No, Reagan, you don't need to apologize. When I found out that Lori was coming to the banquet, I should have told my parents to turn the car around. I know how crazy she's made your life. She wouldn't have listened. My mom told me she's leaving. I'm sorry. I really thought this time was different. You couldn't have known. I shake my head. What I wanted to apologize for is avoiding you these past few years. Oh. Janine leans forward and a hint of a smile spreads on her face. Go on. When we got to Valley, I was so eager to start fresh. You were a reminder of the past. 
You knew all the awful, embarrassing things that I wanted to forget. I felt like I couldn't really have a new life, as long as anyone around me knew about my messed up childhood. I get it. Her smile is small and sad. You were always great to me. I don't know where I would be today without you or your family. Something tells me you would have done okay on your own, just like you've done these past three years. I think about Dakota, Ginny, the guys. I've never been on my own, not really, but I appreciate her words. You deserve to be happy, Ray. It's all I ever wanted, and if being friends with me complicates that, I get it. I'm stronger now. Just promise me we never have to mention Lori again. Deal. I lean back in my chair. So, tell me everything that's been going on with you. What do you want to know? Everything that I missed the past three years? I did think about you often, for what it's worth. You haven't missed much. I have been so focused on school, I kind of forgot that this is the time I'm supposed to have fun. You want to stop focusing on school and have fun? Well, no, let's not talk crazy. School is still my priority, but I let Sean talk me into only taking one class this summer. Such a slacker, I tease. How's Adam? Is he gloating over the scholarship? He's okay. Excited, I think. We actually decided to end things. Seriously? Are you really that surprised? She shrugs. Sure, Adam's dated a lot of girls, but you two seem so great together. We were faking an engagement around you, so I'm not sure you saw the most authentic version of us. Maybe, but I did read his speech. I'm quiet, and she checks my expression. You didn't see it, did you? No, I left before he gave it. I hate that I wasn't there for him. Maybe if I'd stayed, things would have gone down differently. If I believed that, it might be easier without him. We were always going to end. Not the speech he gave. The one he wrote. She pulls out her phone and slides it across the table. He sent this to me the day before. Read it. I'm so nervous. I don't think I can do this. Mila holds a hand to her sternum and breathes deeply. Relax. You're going to be great. As soon as you get out there, you'll forget all about being nervous. No, I don't think so. I'm going to be sick. She rushes out of the dressing room and runs toward the bathroom. I follow, entering as she slams a stall door shut and heaves. Ew. I'm just going to wait out here in case you need anything, I say as she heaves again. Our costume designer walks into the bathroom. She has Mila's dress in one hand, standing in the doorway holding it open. Have you seen Mila? She'll be right out. She's late. Director Hoffman wants to see everyone in two minutes. We'll be there, I assure her. Once the door shuts behind her, I ask Mila, are you okay? No, her voice trembles. Come on, let's get you in your costume, then you'll feel ready. I have no idea if that's true, but I sure hope so. She steps out of the stall, looking a little green. In the dressing room, she gets into her first costume, and we touch up her makeup. There, you look perfect. And it's a good thing, because I can hear Director Hoffman's voice outside in the hallway, calling for everyone to gather around. We join the rest of the cast as he gives his usual pep talk, which includes no less than five reminders, all worded slightly differently to stay alert backstage and be ready to go when it's our turn on stage. We've never had an issue with someone sitting backstage not paying attention. We are all anxiously and acutely aware of every second of the show until the curtain drops, but we listen to his reminders anyway. Mila grabs my hand and squeezes. I try to think back to my first show at Valley, in front of a larger stage than I was used to in high school or community theater. I'm sure I was nervous, but all I can remember is how excited I was. My heart aches that today I won't be the one out there. When he dismisses us, someone else yells that we have five minutes before the house lights drop. Director Hoffman, Mila says, still holding my hand. I don't think I can go on. She presses her free hand to her stomach. I think I have food poisoning. Are you sick or nervous? He asks with no hint of compassion in his voice or eyes. Both, but I'm throwing up every few minutes. She winces like she's about to again. He takes a step back and his gaze moves to me. Looks like you're up. Butterflies swarm in my belly. 
Quickly now, we don't have a lot of time, he grumbles. Mila drags me into the dressing room. She takes off her dress and hands it to me. I pull it on in a daze. My hair and makeup are already done, but she smooths a few wisps back. I meet her gaze. She's beaming, and she looks far less green. You aren't sick, are you? She shakes her head and speaks quietly. This is your part. I'll get my chance, Mila. No. Yes, she grins. It's already done. Now go break a leg. When the curtain falls, I close my eyes and soak up the applause. My heart only now starts racing, as if all the adrenaline and nerves are finally hitting me. The lights come up, and we go out in groups to take our bows. From the wings, I can see out into the audience. I scan, like I always do, seeing faces I don't recognize and searching for the one that's never there. Sometimes I like to pretend my mom is here, and I just don't see her, or maybe she snuck out early to keep it a secret that she came. It's a fantasy I don't truly believe, but I indulge in it one last time. When it's my turn, I walk out to cheers and yells. I wave and then bow. The applause seems to get louder and louder, and I let it fill me up, soothing the pain. Here I make a difference to many. I'm all of their daughters, all of their friends. I'm family, if only for tonight. The entire cast joins hands, and we take one last bow together. As I stand and we start off stage, I get one last glimpse out into the audience. I know she isn't here, but maybe I'll always look for her. Mila is waiting for me backstage. She squeals and practically tackles me with a running hug. You are amazing. Thank you, I say, for letting me go on tonight. It was everything. She nods. Welcome. Now go back out there and let your fans squeal at you. I accept congratulations and other encouragement from people as I walk out in front of the theater. I stop and chat, smile for pictures, and accept hugs from strangers. Reagan, someone calls, and I glance up to see Dakota, Ginny, and the guys, even Adam. Especially Adam. What are you doing here? I told you you guys didn't need to come. I wasn't even supposed to go on. Good thing we didn't listen, Dakota says and gives me a one-armed hug. Adam hangs at the back of our friends. After everyone else has hugged me, he steps forward. Congratulations. You were amazing. I am in awe of you. Thank you. They keep fawning over me, and I absorb it all. After this past week, I will never take for granted these moments or these people. I should mingle and get changed, I say after a few more minutes talking with my friends. Everyone else offers one last congrats and hug. Then Adam smiles tentatively. Can we talk real quick? People are coming up, standing by to talk to me. One person taps me on the shoulder. I smile at them and then glance back to Adam. Sorry, I need to... Yeah, of course. His brow furrows, of course. Congrats again. Thanks for coming. I hug Dakota again because I can't help myself. I'm so glad that she's so stubborn. I'll see you guys later. It feels like an hour goes by, and the theater is still packed with people, cast members who haven't been able to escape, as well as families and friends that are lingering to talk. My hand goes to my throat, and I apologize to the nice couple I'm talking to, citing needing a drink of water. It's true. My throat is dry and scratchy, but I am ready to retreat back to the dressing room, change back into my normal clothes, wipe off my makeup, and go home. I'm almost to the door that leads backstage, when a deep voice crackles over the speaker. Hey, everyone. Sorry to interrupt. Chapter 33 Adam I've had worse ideas. But as I start talking, and every head in the theater snaps up to look at me, giving me their undivided attention, I can't think of a single one that could have ended with this level of humiliation. I can usually talk myself out of bad ideas. I'm good at weighing the pros and cons, and deciding against whatever stupid notions pop into my brain. Not tonight. I'd do anything to prove to her that I'm not going anywhere. 
that I'm either going to fail spectacularly loving her or be the best friend she's ever had. Still, I hope I don't pass out or get booed off stage before I can force the words out. I make the mistake of looking at Rhett and the guys grinning from the back of the theater. I appreciate their support, but I can barely look at them without wanting to hop off this stage and tell them all to fuck off. I'm looking for Reagan, I say to the crowd. I was waiting for her to finish talking to her fans, but at some point, I lost track of her. It was somewhere between hearing my buddy's suggestions for winning her back and deciding myself that she deserved nothing less than seeing me lay it all on the line for her. Now here I am. Everyone looks around for her. I might have just made an ass of myself for nothing. She's on her way back to the apartment, and I'm still here standing on stage making a fool of myself. There she is, a guy in front of the stage points, and I follow the line to where Reagan is slowly walking toward me with a confused look. The spotlight comes on, blinding me. Well, that feels unnecessary. I glower in the general direction of whoever turned it on, but can't see shit. What are you doing? Reagan asks quietly. You missed my speech last week. I think you should hear it. Here? She glances around, smiling politely and waving at the crowd. I almost jump down and beg her to hear me out anywhere else but here, but I need her to listen, really listen. Here. She nods. Then I start to get really nervous. What the hell was I thinking? I should have gone with one of Maverick's ideas. They were bold and ridiculous, but they didn't include public speaking. Um, I sweep the crowd and swallow down my nerves. When I was eight, I broke my arm playing hockey on the street with some friends. My mom drove me to the hospital, bones sticking out of my arm. I didn't even cry. I was shocked. Terrified, really. All I could think was that they were going to have to amputate my arm. I chuckle and swallow down the lump in my throat. I was so scared I'd never play hockey again. When the doctor came into the room and told me I could keep my arm and I'd just have to wear a cast for a while, I was so happy I cried. I continue on with the story, telling them how the doctor talked me through the entire process, taking extra time to make sure a kid my age understood every single thing. I gloss over some of that this time I tell the story, because this audience doesn't care about how fascinated I was with the process, or how it made me want to be a doctor. But the procedure for setting a broken arm wasn't all I learned that day. Reagan smiles. Her body language relaxes with every word pushing me to continue. It's just one of many times I was awed by the impact one person could have on my life. There's a study out there that estimates the average person meets 10,000 people in their lifetime. 10,000. Yet the ones we remember, the ones who change the very core of who we are, is a much smaller number. I've been lucky. So many people have touched my life, most of them in a good way. Family who guided me to be a better man, friends who make me crazy, but that always have my back. There's a hell yeah from the back that I think comes from Maverick. Professors who have helped prepare me for the future, peers who push me to work harder in school so they don't make me look bad and a girlfriend that reminds me every single day what real bravery looks like. I will be a good doctor not because I want to change the world, but because I want to make a positive impact on every single person I meet. I want to take their pain or confusion and ease it, help them get back to what's important. Living life. I always thought that nothing could be more important than that. Helping other people. 
I shake my head. And I don't want to trivialize what it means to heal someone. I long held on to the doctor who fixed my arm as my ultimate hero. I thought it was his skills as a medical professional that I admired, but it wasn't. It was the hope he instilled. He made me feel like everything was still possible, like the world was at my feet if I was just brave enough to get back out there and try. A scared kid afraid of never playing his favorite sport isn't high on the list of traumatic events. But it didn't matter to him. He treated me like nothing was more important. His affection and compassion changed my life. A million other doctors could have healed my arm. But if it had been anyone else, I might not be standing up here. I think the way that we impact people wherever we stumble upon them, is far more profound than whatever we choose to do. Doctor, hockey player, actress. They're empty titles that come alive with the people who claim them. I just started seeing this girl. I meet Reagan's eyes. A talented, beautiful actress. She couldn't fix a broken arm, or do anything that she'd think is heroic. But she is the single bravest person I know. The core of who she is reminds me a lot of that doctor from long ago. She inspires me every day to pay it forward. 10,000 people. But none of them have made me feel like her. I lock my gaze on hers. I love you, Reagan. I have fallen in love with you. 10,000 people. But I just want you. I step away from the microphone. The place booms with applause and cheers. I almost forgot we had an audience. That prick of nerves is back, and I start to sweat at the nape of my neck. She comes to me, smiling, tears in her eyes. I'm fresh out of words, so I kiss her instead. I don't know if I believe there's one right person for everyone, but I believe in her. That was a pretty good speech, she says, pulling back and staring up into my eyes. Did you mean it? Every word. I'm not going anywhere. No matter what. Even the ones you left out? There was that whole section where you compared love to school, the importance of choosing the right one and working hard. I liked that analogy. How do you? Janine showed me. She lifts her hand. Her fingers are curled around her phone. I was just about to text you. Yeah? The speech I had prepared wasn't nearly as good as yours, though. So I'm glad you went first. Still want to hear it. You stole the show and my line. I love you too, Adam. You're worth risk. We're worth it. I chuckle and wrap my arms around her waist. Feels so good to be near her again. My lips are millimeters from hers when Rhett comes out of nowhere and hugs us around the neck. That was epic, he says. So much better than those weak-ass pep talks you give us. Saved the good stuff for her, I say. I hold on to Reagan as the rest of our friends join us. You're back together? Ginny asks, voice about five pitches higher than normal. Yes, Reagan answers for us, and leans up on her toes to kiss me. Fucking finally. I should warn you, though. I've fallen so deeply in love with you. You're not getting rid of me now. I swear my heart fucking leaps for joy. Like I'd ever try. Chapter 34 Reagan Things are looking up, Cancer. Especially in the bedroom. Expect mind-blowing orgasms on the regular. Did you write this? I ask as I reread Adam's text, with what I can only guess is my daily horoscope. 
Of course I did. A lot more where that came from, too. Every day, baby. Since I saw Lori and told her I was done, she stopped emailing my horoscopes each morning. There's a finality in that somehow. It was the one thing that tied us together all these years. You know she didn't write the horoscopes, right? She just pulled them from some website and emailed them. Well, how very unoriginal of her. Besides, it isn't a horoscope so much as it's a mantra for the day. And I'd say I already fulfilled today's. He winks. Yes. Yes, he did. Can you grab my chapstick in that top drawer? I ask Adam. He's lying closest to my nightstand. He tosses it to me and then asks, what's this? Hmm? I slather my dry lips. There was a lot of kissing last night and this morning. I look over to see a piece of red paper folded up into a small square. Oh no, give that to me. What is it? He's smiling now, more determined to see it. He's unfolding it while I tackle him, trying to pull it free. He stands on the bed and holds it up high so I can't reach it. Stupid height. Dear Adam, he says, and then falls quiet. I sit on the bed and cover my face. Oh, God, why didn't I burn the thing? Wait, 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 he looks down at me. Is this what I think it is? If what you think it is is the most embarrassing moment of my life, then yes, seriously, give it to me. I try sticking my bottom lip out. He is not moved by my pouty face. You put this in my room that night, he asks and keeps reading. Yeah, I slid it under your door after a bad date and a bottle of wine. When I woke up the next morning, I knew I had to get it back. Why? I'm sorry, did you get to the line about holding my heart in your hands? He chuckles and joins me sitting on the bed. This is one of the nicest things anyone's ever done for me. Almost done. And if you would have woken up and found that, we would never have gotten together. You don't know that. I stare at him disbelievingly. Okay, I probably would have thought it was a little over the top for a girl I'd barely talk to. He pulls me onto his lap. But I love that you had a bad day, got drunk, and your thoughts went to me. Do you promise to always think of me when you're drunk? I think for a moment. I do. There was this one time, he starts, right before spring break last year. I know which time he means immediately. It was just the two of us at his apartment while the rest of the group went to get food. I hung back that night just to spend more time with him. I almost told you the night before you left, but I chickened out. Then you came back and started dating Maria. Man, what an idiot I was, he says. And then he more than makes up for it by kissing me until my alarm goes off. There goes my chapstick. I have to go, I say reluctantly. Five more minutes. Can't, I say. You said that at my last alarm, and this time I really do have to go. He loosens his hold. Fine. I gotta get to the rink anyway. Will you come out with us after your show? Yep, also, you have glitter all over your face. I tell him with a smirk and attempt to wipe it away. It's hopeless. He gets up, pulls on his jeans, and tucks the heart into his back pocket. I'm keeping this. No, it should be burned. Too late, it has my name on it, and I wanna frame it. I groan. He drops one more kiss on my lips. See you after the game. Break a leg today. Good luck, I call after him. Don't need luck. I've got your heart in my hands, he says, voice fading as he walks out of my room. Today's final show is a matinee. There's a difference in the air from just yesterday. Nerves are calmed, and all of those worst-case scenarios we all worried about have been thwarted temporarily. Ten minutes before showtime, we'll all feel it again but nothing is as terrifying as opening night. Director Hoffman looks up as I walk backstage. Reagan, good morning. You're early. I wanted to talk to you before everyone else got here. Sure, shoot. He drops his clipboard to his side and opens his stance to me. I'm sorry that I missed a rehearsal and that I was late, but I worked hard for that part. Mila's fantastic, but I want to finish out the show today. The lines around his mouth pull up as he smiles. It's yours. Mila called out sick. I think she's actually sick today. That's karma for you. Wait, 
You knew that she was faking? Please, he scoffs. This may be my first time directing, but I've seen it all before. You wouldn't believe what kids will say to get out of class. I'll bet. You did a great job yesterday. You found your fire. I know that I've been hard on you, but it's because I know you can do better. You just need to believe in yourself, not the character, you. I think I'm starting to. Good. Go get ready. I start toward the dressing room, and he calls my name. Yeah? You're a good mentor to Mila. I know she appreciates it, and so do I. Thank you. Since the hockey team has a game today, the guys won't be in attendance. Ginny comes before the show to make sure I'm set with makeup, then wishes me luck and heads out. The matinee audience doesn't have the same energy as the night show, but when we take our final bow, it's to the same enthusiastic applause. Dakota's in the front row cheering and clapping with a huge, proud grin on her face. I don't think she's ever missed a performance, now that I think of it. I scan the crowd out of habit, and my breath catches when I see her. Lori is on her feet, clapping with everyone else. My knees buckle, but I'm held up by the people on either side of me. We exit, and the curtain falls for the final time. I grab water and then head out front. I look for Lori. Sure, I imagined her, but there she is in the same spot, clutching her purse to her side, looking more than a little nervous. She gives me the briefest nod and then disappears into the crowd, exiting through the back doors. I let her go. Maybe she needed her own closure. I have mine. You were amazing, Dakota hugs me. Someday when you're a big star, do you promise to still be my best friend? Please, I'm going to need a personal assistant. I slip my arm through hers. And a personal trainer, she runs in place. A groan escapes from my lips, but she laughs it off. Come on, if we hurry, we can make the end of the game. Chapter 35 Adam Great game, son. My dad hugs me, and then my mom takes her turn. I look between them. You both came. Of course. They look at me like I'm the crazy one, and they haven't been absent from all of my games for the past two months. I let it slide. I don't know how comfortable they are being together, and I decide that tonight I don't care. Let me grab Reagan, and let's go out to dinner. Heath and Ginny, too. Shit. Let me just grab all the guys. They promised we'd be a family still, and families go to dinner after the game with their friends. We head to the hideout and span two tables that they've pulled together for us. I don't have any delusions that my parents are going to decide to get back together, or that things will be easy from here on out. I'm sure there are lots of things I haven't even considered yet that will pop up and remind me that we're no longer the same family we once were. But for tonight, this is just about perfect. Is this okay? I whispered to Reagan. It hadn't occurred to me until now that being around my family might be like rubbing salt in an open wound. Yeah, it's great. I'm glad to see you and Ginny both smiling so much. I bring our fingers up to my lips and kiss the back of her hand. You're pretty great. She leans into me and presses a quick kiss to my lips. My mom doesn't miss a thing. She's smiling as she watches me and Reagan interact. I'm definitely going to get some phone calls about us. I introduced her as my girlfriend, but if the way I feel is projected in my actions even a fraction then they'll know how special she is. The conversation is light and fun. Mav is good at injecting humor into any situation. I can see my parents relax at their opposite sides of the table, and that makes me take a deep breath and sit back too. Dad asks me about our upcoming games. We're down to only a few games in the regular season, so the guys are quick to jump in with their excitement and hopes for regionals. The only awkwardness comes as we're saying goodbye, 
and my parents get in their separate cars. That's going to take some getting used to. But they came, and I feel like maybe we're going to be okay. A new normal. Not the way I would have pictured it, but what is? Life has a way of taking whatever you think you know and flipping it upside down. Testing your faith in people, love, and even family. Back at the apartment, we all file out to the deck. Should we play sardines? Dakota asks. I'm pretty cozy right here. Reagan snuggles into my side. I hear that. Yeah, and I'm tired of having to be a trio with those two. Rhett tips his beer toward us. It's a real bummer. I flip him off and pull Reagan closer. I took care of that and called in a backup, Dakota says. Come on, it's so nice out, and sitting here with these happy couples makes me feel like I'm on a bad episode of Bachelor in Paradise. I would totally pick you if we were stranded on an island, Mav tells her. Who says I'd pick you? She smiles at him, though. It's a nice night. The late February weather promises spring is near. Warm enough to skip the layers, but cold enough, Reagan still sticks close for warmth. Where's this backup, Coda? Maverick slings an arm around her shoulders as we get close to campus. She points, and we all look ahead where Liam is walking toward us. Dreamboat? Mav asks. Whose team is he on? Not it, Rhett calls quickly. What's up, guys? Liam says. Hey, I say. Ever play sardines? Not outside, he says, looking around. Rhett and Maverick argue over who has to pair up with him. I'll be on his team, Dakota says and rolls her eyes. You guys are ridiculous. We need another person now that Adam started dating in the family. Ginny giggles. That sounds so wrong. If I'm dating in the family, so are you, I tell my sister. Heath's arms snake around her waist. But he might wrinkle his jeans, Mav says, motioning toward Liam's pants. They are impeccably wrinkle-free. Man, this sucks. Rhett needs a girlfriend. I want my partner back, he yells at Liam. Then maybe that should be the rule for the night, Dakota says and looks at Liam. Take off your pants. No pants? Rhett barks a laugh. His gaze rakes over Dakota's legs. Just for the boys, she clarifies. Oh, come on, Heath complains. Tomorrow's laundry day. So? Dakota lifts her hands in exasperation. Ginny's laughter echoes into the night, and pretty soon there are tears in her eyes. Oh my gosh, again? Heath's starting to blush. What the hell? I ask. He turns to the side and pulls his jeans down enough that I get an eyeful of bare ass. Dude! I put up a hand to block my vision. Are you going commando, bro? Mav asks. Reagan laughs, and I pull her tight against me and duck down. Shield me? Okay, wow. Well, that's unexpected, Dakota smirks. I guess the guys can keep their pants on. Thank you, Rhett says and shakes his head. There are some things you just can't unsee. Reagan turns in my arms and looks up at me. How come you never go commando? I prefer not to chafe my dick on my jeans. Just the thought makes me shift uncomfortably. Fair point. But think how easy it'd be to cop a good feel if I could just slip my hand down. She says as she does just that, slides her hand down the front of my jeans over my boxers. I chuckle and groan glance up and suck in to give her more room. 
Hey, hey, you two. Rhett kicks a rock at us that hits my hip. Dude, you could have hit her. But I didn't, because I was aiming for you. No getting it on out here. Reminds me I'm going home by myself tonight. Gonna touch base with yourself? Mav asks him, then laughs at his own joke. Rhett nods enthusiastically. Absolutely. A strategy session, if you will. Plan out all our goals for the coming year. Oh, jeez. Dakota shakes her head and gives Liam an apologetic smile. You still want to be a part of this? I won't blame you for bowing out now. He's used to us, Mav says. And he's going to do the same thing later. Aren't you, Dreamboat? Liam turns a bright shade of red. All right, let's get this thing started. It's clear I'm going to have to be the one to take control of their ridiculousness, per the usual. But tonight, I'm feeling pretty ridiculous too. Ridiculously lucky, ridiculously happy, and absolutely ridiculously in love. Anything's possible. It's a one and a million kind of night. Epilogue Adam Four months later What could you possibly own that is this heavy? I ask Ginny as I carry a cardboard box up the stairs to the girl's new apartment. She's moving in with Reagan and Dakota into a three-bedroom a floor up from their old place. I think you have the box with the sex swing, she says casually over her shoulder. I stop, and Heath runs into me from behind with another box. Chill, dude. She's kidding. I think, anyway. His voice raises. Did you buy us a sex swing, baby doll? Ginny laughs. Who needs a sex swing when you... Okay, all right. I wince ears bleeding, and mind going places no man's mind should go about their sister's sex life. We've heard enough. With all of us helping, it only takes one trip to get Ginny's stuff from my jeep to the third floor, and then I'm free to grab Reagan and pull her into her new room. It's a replica of mine, right up to the sliding door that goes out to the deck. It's open, letting in a nice breeze. Looks good. You got a lot done since this morning, I say, walking around to inspect all the details. Pictures are taped up on the wall above her bed. Her with Dakota or Ginny, some with the entire group, and lots of the two of us. When was this one taken? I ask, pointing to a picture of us sitting side by side at a party. There's a ton of people around, and we aren't paying any attention to the other. It's the old Reagan, the one who barely talked to me. I can tell by her posture and the reserved look on her face. And I guess it's the old Adam, too, because there's no way I could sit next to her now, reserved or not, and not notice her. She laughs. I found it in some of Ginny's photos. It's a picture of us, but it isn't really a picture of us. See Heath in the corner? I'm pretty sure she was trying to sneak a picture of him, but instead she got me freaking out because I was sitting next to you. I frame her face with my hands and kiss her. I hate that I can't spend all day, every day kissing her and making up for all the missed opportunities. Ouch. It's going to take some getting used to all this. She tugs on my beard. I'm a college graduate now. Mature and wise. Gotta look the part. She scrapes her nails along my cheek. Damn, that feels good. I groan and pull back. I have a meeting with my advisor. Hang later? We're having a girls' night to celebrate our new apartment. Wine, junk food, the notebook, face masks. I smile thinking of the last time I stopped in on their face mask party. 
my adorable llama girl. Can I crash again? Anytime. She glides her hands over my stomach. But maybe not until after midnight. Why don't you grab the guys and do something? Otherwise, Heath is going to show up here. He and Ginny are inseparable. Do you think it's possible they are more in love now than a year ago? She shakes her head at the notion. Crazy. I'd like to be inseparable. I say and kiss her again. I don't think I'll ever get enough. And yeah, I think it's real fucking possible I'll be even crazier about Reagan in a year. Time doesn't seem to do anything but make it more obvious how damn lucky I am. How long is your lease? A year. I graduate next May, remember? Oh, I remember. You're going to graduate and move to New York or Hollywood to blow up the stage. She talked about it often when we first started dating. I don't doubt for a second she'll do it. She's so freaking talented. Actually, I've been thinking I'd like to open a community theater. Something for kids. She looks down. A place they can come after school and learn acting, singing, dancing. A safe place to be creative and silly. Yeah? I ask. I hate that she needed a place and didn't always have one as a kid. But I love her so much for wanting to make a difference for others like her. She nods. Does it sound crazy? I haven't told anyone else yet, but since the house sold, I have enough to pay off my student loans, and even a little extra. Not crazy at all. You wouldn't miss performing? I'm not sure. I could always do local theater if I do. I don't really care about the size of the audience. You're pretty amazing, you know that? Her grin hits me right in the chest. I do. Move in with me. What? Her face pales. But we just signed a lease. Ginny and Dakota have been so looking forward to the three of us living together. Not this year. Although the idea of having her in my space all the time sounds pretty great. After graduation. Stay in Valley and move in with me. We'll figure out how to open your theater together. I probably have to get some experience first. I don't know anything about teaching kids. Can you do that here? I ask hopefully. You're serious? Completely. Her smile is slow, but soon she's ear to ear grinning, dimples lighting up her face. You want to live together? Mm-hmm. What if you change your mind? A year is a long way off. I'm not going to change my mind. But if you want to think about it or decide later, that's fine. I don't need to think about it. Yes, she bounces. Yes, yes to all of it. She jumps into my arms, attacking my mouth. It's a welcome invasion. I forget all about my meeting. What can I say? I've got it bad. Her fingers slide through my hair, holding my head in place, and I walk her backward to the wall so I can pin her against it. When her back hits the glass, I adjust my grip and slide my hands under her shirt, then dive back in, kissing her, savoring every stroke of her tongue, living for the way she nips and tugs at my lower lip. She goes for the button of my jeans, and we maneuver around, Mouths still joined, trying to get our clothes off. Not an easy feat. We slide along the door, fumbling and grinding into one another. Lifting her, I switch us so that I can lean against the door long enough to get her naked. But I take one step too many, and free fall backward. Oh shit, I yelp, knowing I'm about to slam into the ground. I hold tight to Reagan so that I'll take the brunt of it. My tailbone hits first, then my shoulder and my head. The wood deck has no give, 
and I grunt as all the air is knocked out of my lungs. Are you okay? I ask. Pain shoots through my ass, and I think I took a knee to a vital organ. Heath comes running outside at the commotion. What the hell? He sounds concerned at first, but then he bursts into laughter at the sight of us sprawled out on the deck. My pants are down to my ankles, and Reagan's missing a shirt. I don't answer him, because I still don't know if Reagan's all right. I lift my head. Yeah, definitely going to have a bump on the back of my noggin. But it's the least of my worries. Reagan's curled up on top of me, and her face is buried in my armpit. Her back shakes, and I freeze. Oh, shit. Reagan, baby? I lift her chin. Tears stream down her face, but her lips are curved up. And those shakes are from laughter. Oh my god, are you okay? That's all she manages to get out before she starts laughing again. And you say we're bad? Ginny stands next to Heath, smiling at the scene in front of her. Yeah, yeah. Glad we all think this is funny. Oh, damn, that's gonna leave a mark, I say and rub my ass. Gonna need to see if Coach will let me borrow some padding next time. Reagan tries to make a pouty face, but she can't keep from laughing. I'm sorry. I get my pants up. Bending over hurts, but I'm distracted by Reagan's cleavage because she's still topless. She doesn't seem bothered by it, but I pull off my shirt and then bring it down over her head to cover her boobs from prying eyes. Just in time, too, because Mav, Rhett, and Dakota make their way outside. Great. Wonderful. Let's all enjoy this moment together. Damn, it hurts to talk. They're laughing their asses off at the situation. Bet you wish you had a sex swing now, Ginny says. She pushes the guys back inside, leaving Reagan and me alone. Reagan jumps to her feet, looking far more spry than I'm feeling capable of. Come on, big guy. She takes both hands and helps me to my feet, leads me inside to her bed, and as soon as she starts kissing me again, the pain magically disappears. Out of nowhere, she starts giggling again. Her brown eyes twinkle and soften. I can't believe that just happened. Are you okay, really? Never been better. And that's the damn truth. Epilogue Reagan Two years later Today is the start of something big, cancer. The Valley Children's Theater ends the summer session with a performance of Alice in Wonderland. Adam's in the front row, clapping and smiling as the kids take their bows. I watch him from the wings, heart bursting with how proud he looks of them. He should be. With the amount of talking and obsessing I did over my first assistant director job, he probably knows these children and their struggles as well as I do. When director Martinez calls me to the stage, Adam gets to his feet with the rest of the audience. I wave, not quite as at home on stage in this role yet, but getting there. We all take one last bow before the curtain falls. I have to see to the kids backstage, make sure they get changed and find their parents before I can meet him out front. He's leaning against the wall with a dozen roses in hand. Happy birthday, baby, he says, kissing me and wrapping me in his arms. And congratulations, they were great. Thank you. I lift the roses to my nose and inhale. Aside from the white rabbit for getting his watch backstage for his first scene, it went pretty smoothly. Kid looked panicked there for a second, Adam says with a smile. I was ready to hand over my own watch, but he rolled with it. He did well. So did you. We head out of the theater and start the walk home, hand in hand. Now I can catch up on sleep, read a book or two, maybe reorganize the closet, get a manicure. I lean into him. 
I'm not leaving the house for a week. The theater is closed for two weeks before the fall session starts up, and I'm glad for the break to get in some late summer relaxing and tackling the things around our house that I've neglected over the past month. You could do that, or you could ignore all of your responsibilities completely and let me take you on vacation somewhere to celebrate. We do not need to go on vacation to celebrate my birthday, I insist. Last year, he gave me a gift every hour on the hour, all day long. I think it's sweet how he wants to pamper me on my birthday, as if he's trying to make up for the fact the woman who brought me into this world doesn't. But it's totally unnecessary. Adam's love shines through every single day in a million different small, seemingly insignificant ways that mean everything to me. And that's all I could ever ask for. Not just for your birthday. He fights off a grin. Oh my gosh, I search his face. Did you get your test results back? He nods. 248. Adam, that's amazing. I throw my arms around him. He's been seriously stressing the results of his step one test. He and Janine spent months studying for it. Med school is not for the faint of heart. Did Janine get hers back? Yeah. And? 250. He rolls his eyes. Oh, she's never going to let you live that down. No kidding. She keeps sending me silver metal gifs and memes. Ah, what an amazing day. Did you already know this morning with the horoscope? He still sends them to me every morning, and it's my favorite part of the day. Sometimes they're silly or sweet, sexy, but they always bring a smile to my face. No, uh, actually, I didn't. Must be fate. I rest my head on his arm as we walk up the sidewalk in front of our house. It's just a rental, halfway between campus and the theater, and within walking distance of both, but I love it. My phone rings in my pocket, and I take it out. Dakota's calling. She probably wants to make sure I didn't blow my first assistant directing job. I threatened to eat my way through the entire ice cream aisle if I did. I should answer and let her know I survived. She'll call back. He plucks it from my hand and puts it in his back pocket, then takes my hands. We're having a moment here, celebrating us. His mouth slants over mine, and I lift up on my toes to thread my fingers through his hair. He breaks the kiss and rests his forehead against mine. Those stunning hazel eyes pierce right through me. I don't think I'll ever look at this man and not feel like the world is standing still. I almost forgot to give you your birthday card. He reaches into his back pocket and pulls out a red piece of paper. You made it? I ask as I take it from him. The construction paper is cut into a perfect heart shape. He grins as I unfold it. Reagan, my heart is yours. Marry me, Adam. The words register slowly. I read it twice, tears blurring my vision. I love you. I want you to be my wife. I want to send you horoscopes every day for the rest of my life and celebrate your birthday big every year. I'll be in the audience every single time you're on stage, whether it's acting or directing. I'll cheer you on or wait with a tub of ice cream. I want all of it. Marry me, Reagan. He pulls the ring box out of his pocket and gets down on one knee. It's straight out of a fairy tale. No, it's straight out of my dreams. Yes, oh my gosh, yes. He slides the ring onto my finger. I toss the roses to the ground, jump into his arms, and kiss him with everything I have. He spins us around, laughing into my mouth. My heart is so full and complete, all because of this man. The past two years have been the best of my life, and now he's promising me more. My phone rings again. The melody starts softly and gets louder. She'll call back, I say, knowing it's Dakota again. I was a tad dramatic when I called her this morning, freaking out about tonight, so I know that she'll keep right on calling until she knows I'm okay. Adam places me on the ground and hands me my phone. Answer it, he grins, and then kisses me on the forehead. She wants to tell you congratulations. It dawns on me that she already knew he was going to propose tonight. Today is the start of something big. Of course she knew, because Adam thinks of everything. And if he were going to ask anyone for permission to marry me, it'd be her. She's my family. And now he is too. 
Bonus epilogue. Reagan. Four years ago. Keep your eyes open today, Cancer. Something good is coming your way. I can't believe it. Our own place. I drop the first box onto the empty living room floor. Dakota pulls her hair back into a ponytail and fans her face. I should have waited to break up with Miller until after we moved in. Could have really used a hand carrying all this. Who needs boys? I ask. I'm feeling too excited to care about the sweat dripping down my back. There's just one more box. I'll get it. I head back out and lift the box from Dakota's trunk. It's so hot. I'm exhausted, arms quivering from carrying all of our belongings up a flight of stairs. But nothing is going to make this day less awesome. For the first time in my life, I'm living in a place I picked out all by myself. Nothing but good things to look forward to. I maneuver awkwardly, closing the trunk with a foot and holding tight to the box. When it slams shut, I breathe out a sigh of relief. I did it. Wow, I might need to start exercising again because I am weak. I come up short when I spot him. He's getting out of a black Jeep. The white T-shirt he's wearing clings to his upper body, like Rose holding onto that door in Titanic. Sweet, sweet mercy. My heart races as his gaze slowly lands on me. A small smile tugs at the corner of his lips, and he lifts a hand in a quick wave. I look around to make sure he's waving at me. I don't understand. Why is he waving at me? Probably because I'm staring, but I can't seem to stop. Awkwardly, and about three seconds too late, I return the gesture, carefully lifting my fingers from one side of the box. He heads toward me, and it feels like a dream. Hey. He tips his head in greeting. He's even more gorgeous up close. Sandy blonde hair that falls past his ears, hazel eyes and a hint of a smile that comes off somewhere between cocky and genuine. Can I give you a hand? With what? I'm staring up at him dumbly. He laughs quietly and holy smokes, that sound, I feel it all the way to my toes. He steps forward and I hold my breath as his hands brush mine. He gets a grip on the box and steps back. Oh, right. Thank you. I tuck a wisp of hair behind one ear. Getting air to my lungs has never felt like such a chore. Moving day, huh? Coming from the dorms? Yeah, you? I mean, do you live here too? Yeah. He motions with his head. You want to lead the way? I'm sweating through my shirt, and I think it has little to do with the blazing sun sitting high in the late afternoon sky. Walking feels like a major feat as I move toward my new apartment. It's a big complex, and all the units look alike. I scan the numbers on the buildings until I find it, and then manage to lead us up the stairs without tripping. You live here? He asks, staring at the only door behind me. Um, yeah. I double-check the number to be sure. He shifts the box to one hand and jabs a thumb behind him. I live just there. We're neighbors. No way. My heart flutters. I'm Adam, by the way. Reagan. He grins. This is awesome. I'd invite you over to meet the guys, but we've got training in 30 minutes. Training? Hockey. Also known as my new favorite sport. What I wouldn't give to see him slam someone into the boards. My sex clenches. Whoa. Yeah, okay, maybe that's me. I just pictured being slammed up against a wall by this guy. Any old wall will do. We're having a party at our place tonight. You should come. I wish I could. Hot date? He asks. I've never regretted having plans more in my entire life. Got it. Of course. Makes sense. Another time. You can meet my roommate Dakota, too. Can't wait. He hands the box back to me and then reaches around to open the door for me. Guess I'll be seeing you. He looks over his shoulder once more before he goes into the apartment across from ours. I let out a long breath, walk inside, and drop the box on the floor. Oh, good. I hope that one has toilet paper in it. Dakota lifts the flaps and rummages around until she pulls out some of our bathroom supplies. I stare back toward the doorway. Reagan, hello, are you okay? Did you get too hot? I turned the air conditioning on, but it's going to take a few minutes to cool down in here. 110 degrees. Ugh. She's going on and on, and I'm still standing staring toward my new hot neighbor's apartment, a little stunned. Ray. Can you shut the door? Otherwise, the AC is kind of pointless. 
sorry. I shake my head. Take a seat and cool off. I got it. I'm burning from the inside. Holy hell. My heart's racing, and I can't seem to catch my breath. Ray, you're scaring me. Dakota steps in front of me and places a hand on either shoulder. Did something happen? I nod. Whose ass do I need to kick? She glances back at the doorway and then to me again. Opening my mouth, I can't find words. She gives my shoulders a shake. Call the cops or grab my switchblade. What kind of situation are we dealing with? Well, that snaps me out of it. You have a switchblade? Focus. Another gentle shake. I'm fine. Don't cut anyone and definitely don't call the cops. I fan my shirt away from my chest. Sweat trickles down in between my boobs. You scared the crap out of me. Did you get too hot or what? No, I met a boy, a very cute one. Already? She glances toward the still open door, walks to it, and looks out. No one. I see no one. Hot boys. She holds her hand up to her mouth and calls. Where are you? Shh. I pull her inside and shut the door. Oh my gosh, quiet. The neighbors will think we're crazy. I swear, wherever you go, hot boys manifest in front of you. Poof. Hot attracting hot or something. Please, you're hot too. Yeah, I'm okay. You look like you belong on the freaking cover of a magazine. Even sweaty. She looks me over. It's really not fair. I don't have your winning personality, though. I say sarcastically. True. She smiles. So tell me about the boy. Hot enough to invite in and christen your new room or just average? Hope you'll bump into him again, hot. Neither. Her brows scrunch together. There are no words to describe the man I just talked to. I feel warm all over again, just knowing he's ten feet away. Maybe naked. He said they had training. Is he in there changing? Dakota snaps. I need details. Way hotter. Hot, like... I think I just found the man I'm going to marry. Thank you for listening to Bad Crush, written by Rebecca Jenshack, narrated by Lee Samuels and SAG AFTRA member CJ Bloom, produced by One Night Stand Studios, post production by Austin Halterman, text copyright 2022 by Rebecca Jenshack. Production copyright 2023 by Rebecca Jenshack. All rights reserved. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program. This is Broken Hearts, Campus Nights Book Three. Written by Rebecca Jenshack. Narrated by John Lane and Savannah Peachwood. Chapter One Red Everybody in? Liam glances into the rearview mirror for the all-clear as we pile into the back seat of his truck. He's got the fun task of chauffeuring his drunk teammates home. I start to tell him we're all set, but suddenly my mouth is occupied. Is it weird to make out with a girl while your buddy is half-sitting on your lap? Liam's truck isn't that roomy and there are five of us smashed into the back seat. My hand is at Layla's waist, but also touching Maverick's ass. I concentrate on her soft lips and the faint taste of raspberries and liquor. She's soaking one side of me. The party we were at had a wet t-shirt contest, and Layla was an eager and enthusiastic participant. I thought she was into Jordan, who's jammed in on the other side of me next to catch him, but her lips don't lie. My phone buzzes in my pocket and Mav jumps, or he tries to, there isn't really anywhere to go. Whoa there, buddy. Ain't that thing the other way? It's my phone. That's all I get out before Layla starts kissing me again. Her fingers glide through my hair and her tongue does laps around my mouth. When the truck stops, I come up for air. Damn, that was unexpected. The doors open and Maverick and Ketchum tumble out from either side. The rest of us follow. Thanks for the ride, I say to Liam. Layla is on my heels. I didn't realize she was coming with me, though maybe I should have. Looks like the party has moved to our place. I head straight to my room while the rest of the guys grab beers and head out back on the deck where people are hanging. Layla is glued to my side. I'm tired, but when she starts kissing me again, I don't protest. You're so hot. How have I never noticed you before? 
she asks between kisses. Her hands make quick work of my button and zipper, and she pushes my jeans and boxers down enough that my dick pops out. We are not wasting any time here. You too, I say, ignoring the question altogether. She giggles. Oh my god, I love your accent. Thanks. Can you record my voicemail for me? She takes off her shirt. Her bra is white and see-through and still wet. Uh, what? You know, like, Layla isn't here right now. Leave a message and she'll get back to you. Her head bounces side to side as she mocks my Minnesota accent. Maybe later, I say, and motion toward my dick hanging out between us. He's starting to get shy and call this thing off. Oh, right. She sets her phone on my desk and then unhooks her bra, revealing small perky tits that jiggle as she lowers herself in front of me. Her lips graze the head of my cock and I suck in a breath through my teeth. Any reservations I have about doing this, and I have a few, fade to the background. She stands and pushes me onto the bed. While she works on tucking my jeans down over my thighs, not an easy feat, I kick off my shoes and lie back. Fuck, it's been a long day. A long two days. It isn't every day that a college hockey team makes it past the regular season. In fact, it's a first for Valley U hockey. We started partying just after breakfast. No, let me back up. Celebrations for winning the Hockey West quarterfinals really began the minute we got back to Valley late last night. But it's blurred into today. Breakfast and lunch were liquid only, and I'm starting to feel it. I need food, and maybe a nap. I wonder if Layla's got any snacks on her. I want to ask, but my dick is in her mouth, and that seems rude. Plus, if she answers, she'll have to stop sucking me. I close my eyes and focus. Food later. How long can this last, anyway? I haven't had a blowjob in... So long, I'm embarrassed to count backward to find out. And Layla's mouth is warm and inviting. She keeps popping off and kissing my legs and stomach. And every time she switches the focus away from my dick, I groan. That feel good? She asks as she runs her hands along my inner thighs and kisses my knees. The correct answer is yes, and that's what I say, even though I really wanted to bring her lips closer to my dick again. She's got a whole routine, kissing down my legs and then back up, a few quick sucks of my cock and repeat. It's all very sexy and frustrating, but I'll be honest, I'm starting to lose interest. I plan out what I'm going to eat. We don't have a lot of food in the apartment. I think there's some leftover pizza in the fridge, or there was this morning. The likelihood that's still left is small. Maybe I can get something delivered or talk one of the guys into doing a taco run. Yeah, tacos. Tacos will be good. With that settled, I turn my attention back to Layla. My hands tangle in her hair and I guide her back north. Uh-uh, she says, and climbs up my body. Her hands wrap around my wrists, and she pins them to the bed above my head. Well, that's kind of hot. Her tits are in my face, and she's putting just the right amount of friction on my dick. I grind up into her. No hands. She's a bossy little thing. Then she drops back between my legs and continues adoring my thighs. Is this a thing now? Did I miss the memo on foreplay involving a thorough kissing of my hairy legs? Do some guys really like having their calves kissed? I'm clearly not one of them. Or maybe I'm just too drunk to appreciate it. My mind drifts again. Tacos and maybe a Dr. Pepper. I hardly ever drink soda, but man, am I craving one right now. I pull my hands behind my head and let out a long breath. Now Layla's massaging my legs, and I'm totally down for that. Hell yeah, her hands are magic. My limbs relax. I guess I didn't realize how tightly strung I was. It's been quite a month. The hockey season is coming to an end, which means do-or-die games at every turn. Plus, I just broke up with my girlfriend of six years. We'd been doing the long-distance thing since high school, and it just wasn't working. I was starting to dislike her, and that made me dislike myself for being with someone I didn't really like anymore. It's complicated. When you've known someone since kindergarten, you don't want to get to that point where you dislike them. We have history, and it wasn't all bad times. It just isn't right anymore. Still sucks. Speaking of sucking, or not sucking, as is the current state, my poor underused dick gives up and I just enjoy the free massage. Layla's hands are small, but man, she's got a firm grip, and all the tension slowly leaves my body until I'm putty. Tacos are really going to hit the spot. That Dr. Pepper, too, because I'm fading. 
Food and caffeine will be the perfect pick-me-up. That's my last thought before Layla's screech bounces off the walls of my room. Oh, my God! My head's heavy as I lift it from the mattress. She stands in front of me naked from the waist up and fire in her gaze. I'm about to ask what's wrong when my bedroom door flies open. Maverick and Jordan crowd into the doorway, taking in the scene. Their heads volley between us. What the hell, guys? Get out. Jordan shields his eyes, but neither leaves. Is everything okay in here? Mav asks. Was that a happy scream or someone call 911 scream? Happy, I think. I look to Layla, since she's the one who screamed. She doesn't look happy. He fell asleep. She recoils in horror. It takes me a second to realize she means me. I'm the he in that statement. Fuck, did I? They all look to me. I'm still free balling it. I find my boxers and slip them on, then grab my jeans. I'm hopping around trying to force them over my thighs as Maverick helps a now crying Layla find her t-shirt and tries to calm her down. I'm sorry, I offer. I drank too much. Am I that ugly that you fell asleep? She asks Maverick. His arms wrap around her back and she buries her face in his chest. Mav gives me what-the-fuck eyes over her shoulder. I move closer. No, it isn't you. I fall asleep all the time. That's true, Jordan says. Yeah, he passes out every single time we watch game film. You're comparing me to some boring game film? She sobs harder. I'm not the only one who drank too much. Layla is drunk girl ugly crying. I'm speechless, but Jordan is quick with his words. No way, you're awesome. You're gorgeous and fun. Red's the boring one. I'd like to object, but if she needs to believe it's all on me, then I'm okay with that. Damn it, did I really fall asleep while hooking up? Or almost hooking up? Or getting ready to hook up? I'll be honest, I have no idea where that was going. I was either getting the best massage of my life or the worst blowjob. She peeks out from under Maverick's arm to glance at Jordan. You think I'm gorgeous? He nods. Absolutely. Mav eases the girl in my room toward the door. Jordy, why don't you take Layla outside? Maybe the fresh air will help. She goes willingly, snuggling into Jordan's side. I run a hand through my hair and then give my face a few smacks to wake me the fuck up. Dude, seriously? Mav asks, finally erupting into laughter that has him bending at the waist. How does that happen? I was tired and hungry. I lift one shoulder and shrug. Now that I'm clearly not having sex, I need food. Taco run? I feel bad. Should I text her? I ask, unwrapping my fourth taco. Nah, I took care of it, Jordan says, leaning back in the booth and lifting his glass. The only thing she's going to remember about today is that she got the best orgasm of her life. You're welcome. Thank you, I guess. I can cross Layla off my list of potential hookups. I'm bad at being single. It isn't something you can be bad at. Well, unless you fall asleep while a chick goes down on you. Jordan smirks. She was all over the place, I protest. My dick was getting very little of the attention. Jordan pauses with a taco up to his mouth. Still, you were naked with a girl, a hot girl. Have you successfully hooked up with anyone since Carrie? Mav asks. Define successfully. His dark brows raise. If I have to tell you what success means, then I don't think you've been doing it right. You need a sure thing, Jordan says, and maybe an energy drink. We can stop on the way back to the apartment, Liam offers. If these guys are trying to help, I really am in trouble. None of these guys are in a position to dole out advice. Nah, I don't want to go back to the apartment. Can you drop me at the rink? Is that a good idea? Liam asks. You've been drinking since this morning. Last night, technically. I'm good, I say. Whatever alcohol was in my system flushed itself out when Layla burst into tears with my flaccid penis hanging out. Liam takes me to the arena when we're done eating. I'm going to drop off Mav, then Jordan and I will come back, Liam says. We will, his roommate asks, not looking pumped about the idea. Fun's over, buddy, he says. We need to get to work. Jordan drops his gaze and nods. He had a rough game last night, and we can't afford for anyone to be in a slump going into the semifinals. Later, I lift a hand as they pull away from the curb. I shower and change at the rink. The figure skaters have the ice for another 15 minutes, according to the schedule. 
With nothing to do, I sit back, close my eyes, and wait. At least no one here will care if I fall asleep. Chapter 2 Sienna The chill of the ice nips at my skin as I skate around the rink. I pull my headband snugly over my ears and come to a stop in front of my friend Josie. We're going over to Olivia and Kate's house to watch Dance Star, and then we're going to hit up the hideout for dinner. I bet the hockey team is there celebrating their big win. Are you coming? The rest of the team has finished practicing and exits the ice, and she steps off behind them. When she realizes I haven't followed, she glances back for an answer. No, I think I'll stay for a little while longer. An amused smile pulls up the corners of my friend's mouth, and she frees her long blue hair from the ponytail. Does coach know you're staying? I'm fine. I check my heart rate on my watch. I just want to work on the spin at the end of my short program. A girl can't live on skating alone. She combs through her hair with her fingers. There's half of a sandwich and some mini pretzels in my bag. I was talking about boys and alcohol. In excess. Come on. We have three weeks to prepare for the Desert Cup, and your spin is already perfect. See you in the morning, I call over my shoulder as I push off and glide away. By the time I make it around the oval-shaped rink, she's left with the rest of the team. Finally, I'm all alone. I leave out my earbuds and enjoy the sound of my skates moving along the ice. Closing my eyes briefly, I let all my senses absorb this moment. Even the echo throughout the arena as people go in and out of doors is a welcome sound. College is a hard place to find any solitude, and ice time is difficult to come by. I'm soaking it up and really appreciating it when I realize I'm not completely alone. Rhett Rothruss, one of the Valley U hockey players, sits in the first row near the tunnel to the boys' locker room. Leaned back and slumped down in the seat, he's dressed in a gray t-shirt and black athletic pants instead of the full pads and gear the hockey team usually wears. One skate crossed over the other, eyes closed. The rest of the team is nowhere in sight. I skate around twice more before I stop in front of him. His dark blonde hair falls over one side of his face and his chest lifts with deep, even breaths. I grab the hockey stick resting near his feet and poke him with it. Nothing. Maybe he's dead. Are you alive? I ask. The rise and fall of his chest continues in a slow and steady rhythm. Okay, not dead. While I contemplate how to handle the situation, I take in his features. Full, pouty lips, big, straight nose, and an angular jaw. I've never been this close to him. While I often cross paths with the hockey team since we practice in the same building and share the ice, I've never met this particular hockey player. Some of his teammates, yes, but I don't know much about Rhett, aside from his name and now how handsome he is when he's sleeping. Hello? I try again to get his attention. He's the only thing standing in the way of an hour of ice time with no one watching. His brows pull together just a fraction, but otherwise he doesn't move. Hey! I shout and give him a harder poke with the stick still in my hands. He startles. Piercing blue-gray eyes snap to mine, but he's slow to sit up. His shoulders hitch, and his back arches as he looks around the empty rink. You're the second girl to wake me up today by screaming. When he stands, I hand him his stick and skate backward. I didn't scream. I raised my voice to get your attention, to get you the hell out of my space. Rarely do I get the ice to myself, and he's ruining it. Also, I resent the implication that somehow I'm at fault here. This is my time. Yeah, well, at least I wasn't naked this time. His lips fall into a thin line, and he looks embarrassed by his confession, like maybe he didn't mean to share that with a stranger. He comes onto the ice. He's tall, and standing in front of me, he seems much bigger than he did sitting down. I'm not done skating. I have the ice for another hour. You woke me up to tell me I can't skate? He pulls one of the hockey nets into place and drops a few pucks onto the ice. I checked the schedule. There was nothing after four. 
Technically, that's correct, but no one ever comes in late on Sunday afternoons. Technically, that's not correct. I did today. He smiles like he knows he's got me. He does, but I'm still not ready to give up the fight. I want all the voices to hush, external and internal. And for that, I need peace and quiet. I need to go through my routine without any distractions. I have a show in three weeks. And I have the most important game of my life in six days. I purse my lips. I should have let him sleep. I won't say a word, and I'll stick to this half. That good? He fires a puck into the net without looking at me. Yeah, okay, I give in. It isn't the solitude I was looking forward to, but at least he won't be paying me any attention. He seems even less interested in chatting with me than I am him. Whatever. He faces me, and those stormy eyes bore into me. I think he might cave, or at least offer an apology. Instead, he nods once, drops his gaze back to the ice, and starts skating around and shooting more pucks into the net. I find my earbuds and turn up the volume to drown out the sound of him, but it's incredibly hard to forget he's here. He got me all riled up when all I was looking for was calm. And why is Rhett Rothrus hanging out at the rink by himself on a Sunday afternoon anyway? Not just any Sunday afternoon. They won the quarterfinals just last night. He should be out celebrating with all his teammates, just like Josie assumed. I've seen Rhett before, the same as I've seen most of the guys on the team around campus and the rink. Even if we weren't sharing a practice facility, I'd probably be able to identify them. They're well-known and liked on campus. Since the hiring of Coach Myers four years ago, he's slowly built a team of insanely talented players. Several of them have already been drafted by NHL teams. We often practice directly after the boys' hockey team, but they're usually in full practice gear, complete with helmet, and a lot harder to check out. And it turns out, Rhett is nice to check out. Not my type, like, at all, but still undeniably hot. The hockey guys are known on campus for two things, being fun to look at and hooking up nonstop. I guess three if you count the talent, but honestly, that gets a lot less chatter than the other two items. I've never seen the appeal that other girls do. It isn't that I'm opposed to casual sex, but I like there to at least be the delusional hope of it being more. Hookups can lead to relationships if the situation is right, right? It never has for me, but I'm holding steady in my belief that it's possible, and I just haven't hooked up with the right person. I know one thing for sure. Rhett and his teammates are not the kind of guys you hook up with hoping for more. That would be dumb, even for a semi-believer such as myself. I practice my spin for a while and then go through my short program twice. I'm taking a break and watching Rhett, while trying to play it off like I'm not watching Rhett, when two more hockey players join him. They must be freshmen or transfers because I can't place their names. One has surfer blonde hair styled so neatly I never would have pegged him for a hockey player. And the other is his polar opposite with dark hair sticking out around a backward hat. Where Rhett was quiet and attempted to be courteous, these new additions are loud. Even with my music turned up, I can't block out the noise. Josie should have stuck around. It looks like the hockey team is celebrating here today. She'll be mad she missed this. Me, not so much. I turn on my favorite song and step back onto the ice. Rhett glances over with what might be an apologetic look. I can't decipher it through my frustration. The other two turn and blatantly stare. They speak to one another, but I can't make out their exact words thanks to the song blasting in my ears. As I skate, I do my best to push them out of my thoughts and focus. In three weeks, I have my final collegiate competition. The last chance to skate, really. Sure, I could seek out local shows after graduation, but I know that once I get a real job this summer, the likelihood that I'll have the time to dedicate to practicing as I do now is slim. So Rhett and his hockey buddies cannot distract me. I won't allow it. I finally find my flow again after a couple of angry girl songs put me in the right headspace. There are few things that Lady Gaga and Taylor Swift can't make better. 
I put on my program music to go through my routine once more. My legs are tired, and I'm beyond hungry, but I have to push through. One of the guys yells loudly, really loudly. It's incessant, and he shouts the same thing over and over until I cannot ignore him. Gritting my teeth, I stop so I can yell back when a hard body collides with mine. I bounce backward like I hit the wall and sprawl out on the ice. My left side takes the brunt of it, and while I think I'm okay, it freaking hurts. When I open my eyes, Rhett is standing over me. His blue eyes are wide as he stares down at me. His mouth moves, but I can't hear him. I sit up and take out my earbuds. What the hell? I'm so sorry, Rhett apologizes. His mouth moves in the same way it had moments ago. She okay? One of the other guys asks. He and his buddy stand back a little way, watching but keeping their distance. She's fine. I stand and wobble. My heart races, although that may have more to do with my anger and the adrenaline still coursing through me. Rhett takes my elbow to steady me. Maybe you should sit for a minute. I rip my arm away. I told you I'm fine. Except I'm still wobbly and I almost eat it. Wordlessly, Rhett takes me by the arm and helps me off the ice. I think Jeff is here, the guy with neatly styled blonde hair says. He comes to my other side and the two of them all but carry me off the ice with tight grips on either elbow. Can you go let him know we're coming back? Rhett asks him. He takes over, walking in front of me with his hands at my waist. His large palms span my ribs, and the heat of him seeps through the thin material of my tank. He guides me onto the bench just off the ice. Jordan, go with Liam. If Jeff isn't here, call the front desk and see who's around. We'll be right there. I said I was fine, I insist, although ouch, my hip throbs where I landed. He crouches down in front of me and hands me my blade guards. You hit pretty hard. Yeah, I know. I was there. The edge to my voice is lost in his concerned gaze and the pain shooting down my left side. Damn, that hurt. I'm so sorry. I wince as I put on the guards and stretch out my legs in front of me. So much for staying on your side. Do you feel like you can walk or do you want me to carry you? You can't be serious. A small, manic laugh slips from my lips. You're not carrying me. He nods once and stands tall. Ignoring the pain, I get up and walk ahead of him toward the trainer's office. Every step makes my hip ache. Jordan and Liam are waiting for us, standing next to one of the trainers I don't know. But I recognize the blue polo shirt they all wear. Hey, I'm Jeff. Heard you took a spill on the ice. A spill? I glance at Rhett, who looks down at his skates as he speaks. I skated into her. Jeff's brows raise. That had to have hurt. There are guys on the team that couldn't collide with Rothrus and walk back here on their own. He motions with his head for me to come back. Hop up here and let me take a look. Rhett and the guys linger as I awkwardly sit on the trainer's table. You three can go, Jeff says. Jordan and Liam don't need any more encouragement, but Rhett is slower to leave. I'm going to wait just outside, Rhett says. I'm not sure if it's meant for my benefit or Jeff's. I hope it's not mine. I want him here even less now than I did an hour ago, and that's saying something. Anything hurt? The trainer asks once they're gone. My hip, mostly. Also the left side of my face, but I'm okay, really. I've been hurt worse. Then there is no harm in taking a look. Lie back and roll onto your right side. I do as he says, and he feels around, tenderly pressing on my hip and then raising and lifting my leg, asking if it hurts as he moves me at different angles. Well, he says finally, I think you're going to live, but I'm going to grab some ice packs and have you sit back here for 15 or so. That's not necessary. It is necessary. You took a nasty hit. Ice it and hang around for a bit. When he walks off, I lie back and press my fingertips to the tender skin under my eye. I can hear the guys out in the hallway. The door is open, and they aren't even attempting to whisper. One of them says, How many more girls are you going to make cry today? She didn't cry, Rhett snaps back. 
I try to follow their conversation as they continue to poke fun at Rhett. I don't have enough backstory to make complete sense of it, but I can understand enough to determine that Rhett is exactly the type of guy I pegged him for, a complete player, not to mention an inconsiderate brute. Pity, he really is nice to look at. Chapter 3 Rhett Adam and Maverick walked down the hallway toward Jordan, Liam, and me. We're still waiting outside of the trainer's room. What's going on? Adam's worried expression darts between us. I bypass his question to ask my own. What are you guys doing here? I texted them, Liam says. I wasn't sure how serious it was. Having a real bang-up day, aren't you? Mav asks, shaking his head with a grin. She's fine. I think, I hope. I've never seen someone fly through the air like that. She probably weighs a hundred pounds, and I hit her skating fast to reach a puck Jordan knocked toward her side of the rink. I was afraid it would hit her, or she'd trip over it. I should have let it go. Hindsight is a real bitch. Is she still in there? Adam points toward the open doorway. Yeah. You two can take off, Adam tells Liam and Jordan. Thanks for the heads up. I push off the wall and slap hands with Jordan and then Liam. Thanks for staying. Try not to make anyone else cry today, Jordan says, and then juts his chin toward the trainer's room. But, uh, if she needs consoling like Layla did, I'm wide open. Yeah, yeah, you're a real Prince Charming, Adam says and shoves at his shoulder. How about you get some rest tonight so you can get your ass back here at six in the morning? Jordan salutes him with his middle finger. Aye, aye, Captain, he looks to me. Later, Lady Killer. Adam keeps up his tough guy act until they're gone. His serious expression melts into a wide smirk. Tired? Sleeping okay? I glare at Maverick. I didn't tell him, he insists, raising his hands in front of him. Actually, it was Heath I overheard telling the story of your narcoleptic hookup. Adam leans against the wall, smiling at my expense. Does everyone already know? It's rhetorical. Of course they do. Mav answers anyway. Kind of hard to keep a story like that to yourself. Ah, relax, Adam says. I'm impressed in a weird sort of way. At least you're getting back out there. And I'm glad we finally have some embarrassing stories to lord over you. God knows you have plenty on me. That's a fact. Adam crosses both arms across his chest. So you fell asleep hooking up with one girl, and then you came here to blow off some steam and took out another chick? I rub my forehead with two fingers. Is that an accurate summary of your day, buddy? Maverick asks. I fucking hate you guys. Adam tosses his head back and laughs. Who is she anyway? Liam just said a skater. I don't know. Jeff sticks his head out, holding onto the door frame. We're done in here. You guys can see her if you want, although maybe keep a foot of distance in case she feels like repaying you for the shiner she's going to have. You gave her a black eye? Mav hoots with laughter as he and Adam walk in front of me. My phone buzzes in my pocket. Carrie, again. Just what I need. Another girl to yell at me today. Though to be fair, at least two of them had good reasons. Sienna, Mav calls, snapping my attention to the girl sitting on the trainer's table. He envelops her in a hug. Red didn't say it was you or I would have kicked his ass already. I'm fine. A little banged up. Her gaze finds mine. She's holding an ice pack up to her eye and another rests on her left thigh. You know each other? I ask. Duh, obviously they do. Yeah, of course. Mav takes a seat next to her on the table. Sienna is my favorite yoga teacher. You do yoga? Adam asks him. He scoffs like he's offended. You should see my plow pose. No, thanks, Adam says. Maverick nudges Sienna. Are you okay? Yeah, just a little sore. I could still kick his ass for you if you want. I glance between them, trying to read the situation. Maverick is the friendliest guy I know. He's never met a stranger and chats up anyone. He also hits on everyone, making it hard to tell when he's really into a girl or just being his usual friendly self. For some reason, I'm hoping it's the second in Sienna's case. My phone rings again. Damn, Carrie is getting persistent. That Carrie? Adam asks as I silence it and put it back in my pocket. Yeah. Another one of the girls you've tortured today, or one you plan to torture later? 
Sienna smiles sweetly. I balk. The guys laugh. I like her, Adam says. All right, closing up for the day. Get out of here so I can sleep easy knowing you knuckleheads aren't injuring yourselves or anyone else. Jeff turns off the lights on one side of the room. Maverick stands and helps Sienna to her feet. She protests a lot less with him helping her, I notice. Did you drive or do you need a ride? He asks her. I am fine, honestly. She hobbles, favoring her left side. We'll drop you at your dorm, Mav says. And that's that. The four of us walk out to Adam's Jeep. I climb into the back with her and Mav sits up front. I'm really sorry. I can't think of anything else to say. Her left eye is starting to turn colors and I feel like a damn asshole. You mentioned that. She smiles ever so slightly. I'll live. I fall quiet. Mav peppers her with questions and fills us in on what a great yoga teacher she is and how she's his favorite. I mostly tune him out and scope her out for the first time since we met. I must have still been drunk earlier because I hardly afforded her a second glance, and she's worthy of a second and third glance. Even the yellow and blue starting to streak her face doesn't take away from the bright green of her eyes. Her lashes are long and strikingly black against her skin. Her dark brown hair is pulled back into one of those messy buns girls wear, and I can't tell if it's short or long. I'm Red, I say finally. Sienna. Nice to meet you. She hums, and the smallest of smiles tips up the corners of her mouth. Nice is not the word I would have used. When Adam pulls up in front of her dorm, she opens the door. Thanks for the ride. See you tomorrow in class, Mav says out his window. I bolt across the back seat as the door closes on me. I'll be right back, I tell the guys. I hustle after her, reaching her just inside of the main lobby of the dormitory. Hey, wait up. I fall into step beside her. Following me? She continues walking toward the stairway. I feel terrible. Let me make it up to you somehow. Dinner? Coffee? Her brows lift. Are you asking me out? No, I say quickly. Not the worst idea, but it's clear she isn't on board. Just an apology meal. I'm good. Then yes, a date. Abruptly, she stops walking and I catch myself two steps ahead of her. A date? Those green eyes pin me to my spot. I shrug. Or just coffee. With you. The guy who was hooking up with someone earlier today and made her cry. She says it like it's a question. How do you... Your buddies were talking pretty loudly. I didn't get the whole story, but I think I heard enough. I open and close my mouth. What the hell do I say to that? My phone rings. I ignore it, but Sienna glances to my pocket and laughs. I think you've already got your hands full. See you around, lady killer. She pushes past me and I let her go. I take out my phone and power off this stupid thing as I walk back outside. When I'm in the back seat, Mav turns around and regards me seriously. She okay? Seems fine. I bang my head against the window. What a fucking day. Leave it to you to hurt Sienna, of all people. Mav's facing forward so I can't see his face, but the back of his head shakes from side to side. I was chasing a loose puck. I was trying to keep it from hitting her. In this case, I think the puck would have done less damage. No fucking kidding, I sigh. And what do you mean, Sienna, of all people? I was feeling pretty fortunate. I took down a tough chick with no heart. She didn't even cry. I cannot take another girl crying on me today. Mav swivels around and his jaw hangs open. What? I look from him to Adam. The latter shrugs. You don't know? Know what? I don't know how anyone can put their foot in their mouth so well without even knowing what he's doing. What the hell are you talking about? First of all, she has a heart. She's one of the nicest, most down-to-earth girls I've ever met. And secondly... Sienna has a rare heart condition. I don't know all the details, but I think it's pretty serious. An uneasy feeling washes over me. How do you know all this? We chat to her in yoga. Her heart stops, or she faints, or both, maybe. It happened at one of her competitions last year. Oh, Adam shakes a finger at him. I heard about that. She has long QT. He whips around to stare at me with wide eyes. You took out a girl with a bad heart? You could have killed her, Mav says. No heart. He huffs. My stomach drops. Holy shit. 
I don't know what long QT is, but it doesn't sound good. How the hell was I supposed to know? And it isn't like I did it on purpose. It was an accident. We pull up to the apartment and Mav jumps out. I was just giving you shit on that last thing. I don't think you would have killed her. But it does seem very appropriate considering your track record today. Fuck my life. Hey, Heath says as I walk out of my room Monday morning. His eyes are barely open as he chugs a protein drink. His girlfriend, Ginny, sits on a stool next to him with her head on the counter. Morning, she says. I tug the end of her braid as I go by. Ginny is Adam's little sister, and since he and I have been rooming together for the past four years, Ginny's like a kid sister to me. Adam appears next, slinking out of his room and shutting the door quietly behind him. Reagan stayed over last night, as she generally does now. Both my roommates are in serious relationships, which is bizarre since I was the only one in a serious relationship until a few months ago. Now I'm dodging phone calls from my ex and blundering my way through being single. Life is weird. He grunts something that might be good morning as he heads to the kitchen to make oatmeal. I'm too tired to even think about eating. The sun isn't up yet, and we have a skills practice in 30 minutes. I'm not complaining. I'm stoked we get to play hockey another week. But two days of celebrating looks like it's taken a toll on all of us. My stomach growls. Obviously, it doesn't have the same issue with the time that I do. I'm grabbing orange juice from the fridge when Maverick walks through the front door. Good morning, he calls, sounding way more chipper than the rest of us. When I turn around, he laughs. Nice shiner. You and Sienna match. Adorable. I'm too tired to come up with a witty comeback. But it's a new day, and today can't possibly be any worse than yesterday. Chapter 4 Sienna It looks like my three-year-old niece did your eye makeup. Josie watches me from the doorway of our shared bathroom while I dab concealer on the black and yellow under my eye. I can't tell if I'm making it better or worse. Less eyeshadow. You aren't fooling anyone. She reaches around me for her toothbrush. She's right. I look ridiculous. I wipe off my makeup and start over with just my usual basics of foundation and mascara. Does it hurt? My roommate asks as we're leaving our dorm. Only if I touch it. She moves her hand up like she's going to poke it, and I slap her hand away. With a laugh, she asks, did he at least apologize? Last night when Josie got home, I was already asleep, so I gave her the short version of yesterday's events when she woke up and saw my black eye. I left out the part where he asked me out, or sort of asked me out. An apology date where I'm limping and have a black eye does not sound super romantic. About a dozen times. I can think of worse ways to get a black eye. Rhett Rothross is some serious eye candy. I heard he's single now, too. Aren't they all? I place a hand on my chest. Commitment scares me. I'm just going to fuck everything that moves. She laughs again. Josie has a great laugh, the kind that you can't help but smile when you hear it. You sound like Elias. How is he? Great, I say, and prepare to fill her in on the latest of my best friend's shenanigans. But outside, we meet up with more girls on the team headed to practice. Oh my gosh, Sienna, what happened to your eye? Olivia asks when she sees me. I give a very abbreviated version as we jog the few blocks to the arena in the dark. My left hip and knee are both bruised and sore, but otherwise I seem to have survived the collision without any injuries. At the rink, I'm forced to retell the story again while we warm up in the hallway, waiting for Coach. She arrives, coffee in hand, and a clipboard in the other. Before we get on the ice, take a look at the updated schedule. She holds up the clipboard. I printed it out, but you'll find it in our shared calendar, too. I can tell by the grumbling of the girls closest to her that the changes aren't good. We're sharing the ice with the hockey team? Josie finally squeaks when we make our way to the front. Her tone is skeptical and not altogether thrilled. Same, girl, same. There's complaining all around. My teammates shout out questions to coach, wondering how this will possibly work. Others are pouting that it isn't fair. 
We still get the same amount of ice time, but we'll need to share for our morning practice. And I've negotiated for an additional hour in the afternoons for those of you who want it. It's the first time in the school's history that the hockey team has gotten this far. We are going to support them the same way we want them to support us. Yeah, right, someone mumbles. None of us qualified for nationals this year, which might make us a touch more bitter than we'd otherwise be. Coach gives us a look that says it is what it is, and we take the ice. We'll make the best of it, she smiles. And they're here, so let's get to work. We turn and watch as the hockey team files out next to us. When Rhett spots me, his eyes widen and a gloved hand goes to his eye, his black eye. He pulls on his helmet with a broody look and I can't help but smile. I had no idea he got hurt in the fall too. I feel a tiny bit bad, even though he was the one that ran me over. Sienna, a minute, coach calls. I skate over to the bench where she waits for me. I heard you took a tumble on the ice last night. How are you feeling? Fine, I'm bruised, but no injuries. You really shouldn't be on the ice by yourself. Technically, I wasn't by myself, I mutter to myself. I don't want to put restrictions on you that I don't require of the other girls, but with your heart condition, I need you to make sure there is someone in the building that knows what to do any time you step on the ice, okay? I nod, feeling guilty and resenting it. Yes, ma'am. Good. Now let's get you ready for the Desert Cup. It's hard to concentrate with the hockey guys on the ice, and not just for me. Coach gives up on continually yelling, focus, halfway through practice and divides us up into groups to work on skills. Coach Myers is having the same issue. Jordan and another guy trip over each other while staring at Josie doing a flying camel spin. Well, this was a great idea, I say to Olivia. I am loving this. Really peps up my morning. Although I wish I'd worn something less wrinkled. She holds the fabric up to her nose. And smelly. I lean forward. It's a little musty, I admit. But I guarantee you smell better than them. We glance back down at the guys. Sweat drips off them. He's cute, she says. Who? I play dumb, but I know exactly who she's talking about. Rhett skates toward the center of the ice and gets back into line, staring at me the entire time. Your twin, Rhett. Sure, he's cute, and he knows it. We work through skills, making the best of our time on the ice, even if it's only half of our usual space. After I complete my turn, I skate to the back of the line. Rhett's standing nearby, also at the back of his respective line. Hey, he says. How's the eye? Does it hurt? He winces. I'm guessing about as bad as yours does. I'm so sorry. The sincerity in his tone catches me off guard. I mean, he sounded sincere last night, but now there's something else behind his voice. Guilt? I'm quiet as I study his face, trying to get a read on him. He's a tall guy, broad, not too bulky, but solid. Makes sense, considering it felt like I ran into a brick wall yesterday. I didn't know about your heart condition. If I had, uh, he trails off. Well, now that makes sense. I don't hide my heart condition, but man, could I make a good case for it, because this is just the type of reaction that frustrates me. Suddenly he feels this greater sense of empathy, like I'm some fragile damsel in distress. Don't worry about it, I clip and turn from him. He skates beside me, moving up with my line. You're okay, though, right? Roth Ross! Coach Myers, the hockey team's head coach, voice booms over all the other noise in the rink. Maybe you and your friend want to share what's so important that you're holding up two practices. Sorry, coach, Rhett responds. Coach Myers skates toward us. He looks from Rhett to me, and I see the second he puts it together. He leans on the hockey stick in his hands. You must be the unfortunate victim of Rothrus's clumsiness. I don't know how to answer that, so I just nod. Coach Brecky, he calls over us. Mind if I borrow? He looks to me for my name. Sienna. Mind if I borrow Sienna for a few minutes? 
My coach gives him a thumbs up. Coach Myers is probably my dad's age. He has dark hair that's graying at the temples and a few wrinkles around his eyes. It's easy to see that he has his team's total respect and attention as he blows the whistle and the action immediately stops. We're going to run an agility drill, he informs them. The guys groan. Coach skates, picking up cones as he goes, then placing four in a square. Sienna, if you'll stand in the middle there. I do as instructed. Coach Myers proceeds, showing them what to do, moving and talking at the same time. Skate around the first two cones with the puck, tight transitions, pivot, quick feet, pass, and then continue around. We'll do it for time. Anyone over six seconds owes me a suicide before they get back in line. What about her? One of the guys asks. Glad you asked, Coach smiles. Automatic disqualification for touching her, not even a hair on her head. Got it? Yes, sir, they mumble. Coach smiles at me. Feel free to lean in. The guys line up. Rhett's in the back. Rothrus, why don't you show us how it's done? The nervous expression on his face makes me giggle. Coach passes him the puck when he's in position. Go. At his command, Rhett starts around the first cone. He's a good skater, smooth and surprisingly light on his feet. I say surprisingly because he sure didn't feel light when he ran me over yesterday. I hold my breath as he moves around me the first time. It's sort of a weaving motion, around a corner cone, around me, another cone, and so on. Rhett gives me a wide berth, not cutting as close to me as he is the cones, and I'm not the only one that notices. Tighter transitions in the center, Coach barks, sending a pass right at me. Rhett pivots and stops the puck before it hits me, then skates backward around me. He doesn't touch me, but I feel him, so close I could move a fraction of an inch and brush against him. He finishes and stops, looking to coach for his time. Five and a half seconds. Rhett's face relaxes. That is until his coach looks to me. What do you say, Sienna? Any contact? I couldn't see from this angle. He fights a grin. I doubt there's much Coach Myers misses. I consider lying. It would be amusing to watch Rhett's reaction if I did. His expressions play out so well on his face. I like that about him, actually. No contact, I confirm. You're sure? The guys laugh. I do, too. All right. Thank you, Sienna. Rothrus, give me a suicide anyway. What? His mouth falls open, and he looks between his coach and me. Consider it an apology. Should I make it too? Coach asks me. I pretend to think about it, bringing my hand to my chin and making him sweat it out for a few seconds. Nah, I think one should suffice. Fair enough. He nods to me. Thanks for your help, Sienna. I think we can manage on our own from here. I skate toward my team, sneaking a peek at Rhett skating along the wall. He really is a good skater, and something about seeing him in the full gear after knowing what he looks like underneath really does it for me. Yeah, I'd say I like this apology a whole lot better than his others. All right, boys, Coach Myers calls. Keep it moving. The rest of practice is far less eventful. Coach Myers keeps the hockey guys on point, and we work on jumps in small groups. There is no time to look at Rhett. Okay, there's very little time, and the opportunities I do get, he's completely focused on hockey. After morning practice, I have classes until lunchtime, and then I have to book it over to Ray Fieldhouse, where I teach bar and then yoga. My schedule is crazy busy, but I happen to like it that way, and the money I'm making teaching group fitness classes will help pay my rent for a while after graduation. I still don't have a job lined up, and with only two months until I say goodbye to college, it's starting to feel like I never will. How do people choose a career? Trying to imagine myself working 40-plus hours, sitting behind a desk, working my fingers to the bone, doing anything is difficult. Or maybe I just haven't found the right thing. My dad thinks it's the first of those two. You can't expect to love any job right away. Work hard and be loyal, he says every chance he gets. That has worked well for him. He started as an assistant and worked his way up to an executive at a software company. I'm proud of him, and I think it's amazing what he's done. 
but I'm not necessarily sold on his story being the right plan for me. I have another interview next week, and I'm hoping that this time when I sit down across from the interviewer, I'll feel something akin to genuine excitement. As people trickle into the classroom, I smile and start the music. Bar isn't my favorite class to teach, but it's popular and almost always filled to capacity. Today is no different. For 30 minutes, I lead them through a brutal toning workout using my ballet training. Eight more, I call. A collective groan sounds under the music. I know I'm an awful person because I love that groan. It means I've done my job. I glance up at the clock to make sure we're on track. A line has already formed for the yoga class that starts next. I love teaching yoga. It's not quite as popular as bar, but most of the students who attend are pretty advanced, so I can push them harder than if it were a class full of beginners. And you're done. Nice job today. As my bar students leave and yoga students start to come in, I take a drink of water and switch the music. I'm rolling my mat onto the floor when I notice Rhett standing outside of the door. A few girls from my last class are lingering, checking him out. I look around for Maverick. He's usually here by now, and the fact I even have to look for him should tell me he isn't here. Johnny Maverick doesn't enter a room without you noticing. I still remember the first time he came into one of my classes. It was last year, about a month into his freshman year. He was reluctant, not that I realized it at the time. But now, after getting to know his personality, I realized that was a much tamer, reserved person that walked into the studio. Even reserved, I was intimidated. He's a tall guy, covered in tattoos, dark hair, your basic bad boy. That is, until he opens his mouth. Once I got to know him, I realized how nice and funny he is. He's part of the reason I enjoy teaching this class so much. No matter how hard I push him, he manages to make it look easy. But he's not here, and instead it's another hockey player walking into the room. He approaches me at the front while others are finding places around the room to unroll their mats. Dressed in athletic pants and a Valley U hockey t-shirt, he looks too hot to be real. He doesn't have the same bad boy look like Maverick. He's more broody jock. Still, he has this appeal about him that is more than just his pretty face or his amazing arms, which I'm definitely not staring at. What are you doing here? I'm pretty sure the question comes out like an accusation. He puts up all my defense modes like my brain is aware that letting him in would be oh so very bad for my heart. I want to apologize. He holds up a hand when I start to interrupt. I know I already have, but I keep getting it wrong. And I'm probably going to this time, too. You seem like a cool chick. Mav has nothing but good things to say, and I guess I just want to make sure we're good. He smiles and points to his eye. I have a matching black eye, and I did a suicide apology this morning. Neither of those was by choice, but the second was pretty amusing. Being here was all me, though. He grins, a boyish charm that I'm sure gets him whatever he wants. How do you find me, anyway? Maverick? Oh, and he wanted me to pass along a message that he has to miss yoga today because he's meeting with Coach, but he'll see you on Wednesday. He nudges me playfully with an elbow. Even that small touch makes my heart rate accelerate. We good? Grab a mat. When my intentions are clear, his deep laughter spills out. The sound makes my stomach flip. If I stay for class and do some downward dog and stretching shit, then we're good. I smirk. Stretching shit? Oh, this is going to be fun. Chapter 5 Red. Lying flat on my back, I stare at the white ceiling and moan. She broke me. The she in question peers down at me with a pleased smile. Class is over. You can go now. If only my legs worked. I roll over onto one side and then push myself into a sitting position. I'm soaked in sweat. Something I didn't realize was possible from yoga. Tell the truth. I start once I manage to get to my feet. You made those poses up, right? 
There's no humble flamingo, half lotus, or full monkey. You were fucking with me. Half monkey, she smiles. No, those are real poses. Well, not exactly the way you were doing them. I hang my head. My hair falls into my face, sticking to my forehead. I need a shower, maybe two, and a soak in the ice bath. Are we even now? I hold my hands out to my sides, letting her revel in my embarrassment. I'm sweaty and gross, and I just made a complete ass out of myself for the better part of my lunch hour. My stomach growls, and I missed lunch. Yeah, we're even. She moves to the front of the class, turns off the music, and gathers her things while I mop up my sweat and wipe down the mat. She glances down at her watch and presses two fingers to the pulse point on her neck, which reminds me what Maverick said about her heart and having to monitor it. Everything okay? Yeah, I'm fine. I just like to keep an eye on my heart rate throughout the day. Habit more than anything. She drops her arm to her son. See you tomorrow, Rothfuss. She backs out of the studio. I don't think yoga is your calling. She brings her hands together in front of her, a huge smile on her face. Namaste. Over the next few days, I don't have any more run-ins with my new favorite skater. I see her at practice, but coach keeps us focused on hockey with the threat of running us until we puke. Thursday, late afternoon, I'm in my room finishing econ homework when my phone rings on my desk. I don't have to look to know who it is, but I glance down anyway. My ex has been calling at least three times a day since last weekend. Yesterday and today, that number has increased dramatically. I feel like an ass for not answering, but we can't keep doing this. The first week we were broken up for the second time in a month, I answered every single time. She cried, begged me to take her back, and I sat on the other line feeling like an ass. I almost caved, too. I don't like that she's hurting. We were together for nearly six years. That's a damn long time. And it isn't like I just stopped caring about her completely. She's a great girl. She's just not the right girl for me. I thought I was doing the right thing by continuing to talk to her and being a shoulder she could cry on, but instead, I think I just gave her false hope. After a three-hour call last week where I heard her out listening to all the really great reasons she thought we could make it work, I finally told her there was no way I was going to change my mind and asked her to stop calling so much. She gave me the space I asked for for a few days, but then the calls started up again after we won the quarterfinals. It sucked. I press silent as Adam fills my doorway. Hey. He leans against the door jam, taking up most of it. You want to go to the hideout and grab an early dinner? I was just going to eat a sandwich or something. I've got to finish this and then study for a quiz. My phone pings with a new voice message. Fuck, that's new. She doesn't usually leave messages. You know what? Fuck it, I'm starving. I stand, abandoning my phone on my desk. I hope I'm doing the right thing by holding firm on my decision not to answer. I've never disliked having a cell phone more in my life. It's just the two of us when we get to the hideout. We put in our order and the server brings us our beers while we wait. No, Reagan? I ask. It's a rare evening that Adam isn't with his new girlfriend, so I fully expected her to show up. She and Dakota are running together at the track. Things are good, then? I know they are. I can see it all over my buddy's face. He's totally gone for her. They recently had a falling out, and he walked around sulking like I've never seen from him. Adam was the king of breakups, moving on within the week or even sometimes the same day. They're great, yeah. He leans forward, both hands around the glass. His smile goes serious. What about you? Talk to Carrie? He tries to come off, relaxed, but I know him well. We've been roommates and teammates for too long. I see right past his calm demeanor. The team is playing well, even better than people expected from us this season, and he's worried about me and how my breakup with Carrie will impact my time on the ice. He's captain, so I guess it's his job to worry. It isn't completely unwarranted. There were a few games after we broke up the first time where I was a wreck. I might have been the one to end it, but it isn't like I stopped caring for her. We were together for so long, and I really loved her. But when I made the decision to end things, it wasn't without a lot of thought and soul-searching. I know it's right, and as the time has passed, I still feel solid in my decision. I've moved on, even if she hasn't. But I get where Adam is coming from. We've got the record to beat, and everyone is gunning for us. It's going to be a long grind over the next month to get to the Frozen Four. Things are good, I promise. Carrie is still calling, but I haven't spoken to her in a week.
That's gotta take a toll. Why don't you block a number? Ah, I say automatically. You think? He shrugs. I don't know. Sucky situation all around. Definitely. I think she'll stop on her own. It's probably just routine. We spend most of our relationship on the damn phone. It took me almost two weeks to stop reaching for it the second I woke up every morning. Our food comes and we fall quiet as we devour greasy burgers and fries. Had any other catastrophic run-ins with the opposite sex I should know about? Adam tries and fails to keep a straight face. No, I grumble around a mouthful of food. He leans back in his chair, smiling at my expense. Don't worry, I'm sure you have plenty more opportunities in front of you. Not if word gets around that I fall asleep on chicks or give them black eyes. Adam chuckles. You just need a good wingman. He points at himself. What about Reagan? The best wingmen are in relationships. It's what keeps them from swooping in and stealing the chicks for ourselves. Especially with your weak game. That and knowing Dakota would cut you if you hurt Reagan. He nods. That too. Come on, it'll be fun. Finish your food and let's go to the bar. I recognize a friend of Ginny's I can introduce you to. I'm not really interested in putting on a smile and making small talk, but ten minutes later I'm following him to the half-circle bar along the back wall of the hideout. Adam never looks out of place or uncomfortable. I admire that about him. I don't know what to say or how to act with girls after being in a relationship for so long. No one expected much from me when I was with Carrie. I was off limits. That may be more intriguing for some girls, but I just faded into the background for most. I'm good with fading into the background. Ava? Adam approaches a girl with short black hair at the bar. She turns in her seat. Adam, hey! She tucks her hair behind her ear and sits a little straighter. She's clearly surprised we've approached her, but Adam being Adam quickly puts her at ease. Good to see you. Have you met my buddy Rhett? Her dark gaze slides to me. She smiles politely and raises a hand in a cute, shy wave. I don't think so. Nice to meet you, Ava. I wave back. You too. Adam shifts closer to me and mutters under his breath, Ask to buy her a drink. I'm pretty sure Ava heard him, but I ask her anyway. Can I buy you a drink? Um, she starts. Excuse me, a deep voice says behind me, and I sidestep to let the guy pass. He goes straight for the empty chair next to Ava and takes a seat. He swivels around so that his knees rest against Ava's. Ava looks at her lap. This is my boyfriend, Trent. He's visiting for the week. Awesome. I'm hitting on girls while their boyfriend is in the shitter now. It's a new low. Adam clears his throat, hiding a laugh. That's great. Where are you from? I go to school upstate. He's eyeing us up, trying to decide if we are a threat. Adam is Ginny's brother, Ava tells him, and immediately his expression shifts into something much friendlier. Oh, cool. You play hockey, right? He asks Adam. That's right, we both do. Adam looks to me and I nod. Really cool. Trent places a hand on Ava's thigh. I get it, buddy. She's yours. No need to pee on her. Well, we were just heading out, but it was good to finally put a face with a name. He's super handsy while leading his girl away from us. Adam slumps into Ava's empty chair after the exit and hangs his head, laughter spilling from his lips. Some wingman you are. I take the other chair. I forgot she had a boyfriend. Convenient. I lift my near-empty beer bottle when the bartender looks my way, and she grabs me another. We'll find you someone else. It's early yet. The TV grabs my attention again. It's figure skating, and I think of Sienna. A new skater is taking the ice. She poses, waiting for the music to begin. I think I'm good. And besides, I've been thinking about asking out Sienna. Again, maybe this time without stumbling all over myself. The chick you gave a black eye? I scratch my nose with my middle finger. Drink your beer so we can get the hell out of here. I need to study. Whatever you say, lady killer. Chapter 6 Sienna I leave my dorm early Friday morning to get on the ice before anyone else. Didn't your coach tell you not to be on the ice by yourself? Also, you really shouldn't be walking in the dark across campus. Elias's brows pinched together on the screen of my phone. I cleared it with coach, and that's why I'm talking to you. 
What exactly do you think I'm going to do if someone attacks you? Yell at them to please stop? No, dummy. Hang up and call the police. He chuckles. It's three hours later in Toronto, and Elias is already at the rink where he skates with his pair's partner, Taylor. So any plans tonight, or are you spending another Friday night watching documentaries on serial killers? He shivers. If you don't like them, don't watch them. You misled me. You were all, this one isn't that bad. You'll be fine. It's a great date night film. He shoots me a glare. That chick ghosted me after I woke up in the middle of the night screaming bloody murder. Laughing, I swipe my card against the door reader and let myself in the arena. I've got to go. I'll call you later. No, don't call me later. Go out and have fun. One of us has to. Bye, E. Don't die on me today. He makes a cross over his heart before he ends the call. I stop in Coach's office to let her know I'm here and then head out to the ice. You, I say when I spot Red at one end stretching out. Hey, he says tentatively. I shake my head. Seriously? Every time I think I have this place to myself. He stands tall and skates toward me. I could say the same thing about you. Plus, I was here first this time. Can't a girl get a little peace and quiet? He smiles, but doesn't answer. I guess you can stay, I say, like I'm the boss of this place. He smirks. Just promise not to run me over. He grimaces. You'd think that'd be an easy thing to promise, but I'll just say I'll do my best. I forgot my headphones, so I'm going to play music over the speakers, I say as I skate to the opposite side. Sure, yeah, whatever. Pretend I'm not here. Which is exactly what he does to me. He doesn't spare another glance in my direction as he starts skating around his half. I put the music on and fall into my routine. I go through it twice, once without jumps and the second all out. When I finish, I grab a drink and check my heart rate before I forget about my routine and just skate for myself. The cool air hits my face as I move, whichever way the music takes me. Everything feels lighter here. My legs, my arms. It's like flying as I move across the ice. Freedom. My gaze falls to Rhett. He skates around the net and our eyes meet for just a moment. He gives me his back again and continues shooting pucks into the net, and I do another half circle before I skate toward him. Can I try? I motion toward his stick. He straightens and pulls his bottom lip behind his teeth, watching me. This feels like a trap. You're not going to hit me with it again, are you? Rolling my eyes, I say, no. It just looks sort of therapeutic, the way you're firing shots at the net. I thought you wanted peace and quiet. So did I. He hands over the stick. Do you know what you're doing? I line up with the stick behind the puck. How hard could it be? I eat my words as I hit the puck and it glides slowly along the ice, stopping less than three feet in front of us. Harder than it looks, eh? He grins. Try again. Put your ass into it. He squints, looks up. I'm just realizing how that sounds when it's not coach saying it to a bunch of guys. It sounds weird either way. I thought it was all in the wrist and shoulders. His brows raise and he cocks his head to the side. My little sister plays hockey, I explain. Nodding, he steps closer. His scent, a mixture of sweat and some masculine-smelling soap, wraps around me. Move your right hand down a little lower. My fingers inch down the stick. I look to him for approval. That's it. Now turn your body at more of an angle. This is one of those moments where he could totally put his hands on my hips and show me. He doesn't, sadly. I shoot again, and this time the puck makes it all the way. It doesn't go in. My aim is crap, but it slides past the goal line, so that's something. I hand his stick back. Not as therapeutic when it doesn't go in. He lines up, shoots, and the puck sails down into the net and dings against the back pole. There's a twinkle in his eye as he looks to me. There's nothing better than that sound. Can I ask you a question? I guess so, he says slowly. What scenario leads a girl to wake you up screaming while naked? Wait, were you naked or was she? He chuckles softly, closes his eyes, and shakes his head. 
You've been thinking about that since we met, haven't you? Pretty much. He sucks that bottom lip behind his teeth again before answering. We were both naked. Okay, so why does that lead to screaming? I'm doing a pretty good job of envisioning a naked rat. He's just over six feet, by my best guess. He's filled out, but not bulky. I can clearly see the muscles in his arms stretching the fabric of his shirt. My eyes drop to his crotch. Maybe he's not packing, but would that make me scream? Run away, maybe, but not scream. He catches me checking him out, and my face heats, but he doesn't call me on it. We were naked, he says slowly, then pauses. And I fell asleep. Oh, my eyes widen. Oh, yeah. He takes another shot. This one goes in, but doesn't make that magical sound he mentioned. So then what happened? Then I came here and got yelled at for sleeping again. He winks and skates toward the net to collect the pucks. Oh, come on. That's all I get. Where are all the details? You know, you're chatty for someone who wanted to be left alone. I can't help it. Your retelling of the story really sold me, I say, sarcasm dripping from my tone. He stops in front of me and grins, then rests both hands at the top of his stick. You're a good skater. You said you have a show coming up. When? You're changing the subject. Yeah, because it's humiliating. You have enough dirt on me already. Yes, there's a competition coming up. But the truth is, I just like being on the ice by myself. I get that, he says. Do you mean all the way naked? Shaking his head, his deep laughter echoes in the empty rink. Naked enough. How does that happen, logistically? Well, you see, he starts in a serious tone. When two people are attracted to one another, I know how that happens. I want to know how you fell asleep. Do you have some sort of sleeping disorder? He's still laughing and smiling at me in a way that makes my heart rate climb. I skate to the wall and jump to sit, taking long, even breaths. He follows, and I share my water with him. He squirts it into his mouth and hands it back. We're quiet, sitting together and staring out at the empty rink. This is the quiet I was looking for when I got up this morning and decided to head to the rink early, but I'm the first to break the silence. In third grade, I fell asleep on the bus home from school. The driver got all the way back to school before he realized I was still in my seat. My parents had to come get me. Super embarrassing. Only mildly embarrassing by comparison to the circumstances in which I fell asleep. Well, I would not know since I haven't heard the whole story. He drops his head and runs a hand along his jaw. I was at a party. We started drinking as soon as the bus got back from the quarterfinals. I think I slept two hours that night. And then we got up for drivers and donuts, and by noon, I was done. I caught a ride back to my apartment with some buddies. She followed. I actually thought she was into my friend, but then she started kissing me, and she came into my room. I was so tired. I'm holding back a smile as he pushes his hair out of his face. She was on her knees in front of me, and I was sprawled back on my bed. He lifts his legs, dangling over the edge, and waves his hand between them. Oh my god, you fell asleep during a blowjob? He glances around like someone might be hanging around eavesdropping. Sorry, I lower my voice. But seriously? If I'd known it was going to happen, I would have better prepared. Maybe taking a cold shower first, or fuck, I don't know. What do you mean if you'd known it was going to happen? Doesn't that sort of thing happen a lot? Girls following you around and dropping to their knees? My face is lava hot. And I mean, okay, prepared or not, I don't think falling asleep is the appropriate reaction to sex. No, I mean, yeah, I guess. It's sort of a new thing, and I haven't quite gotten used to it. Well, it's the opposite for me. I used to have boys following me around, and now they don't. It's better in your shoes, trust me. Guys don't hit on you. His expression says he doesn't believe me. Girls hitting on you is a new thing. I give him the same look back. We're smiling at one another, 
and there's this electricity in the air between us. Rhett's different than I imagined. Easier to talk to. Nice. Funny. Suddenly, we're not alone. A couple of hockey guys come out at the same time Josie arrives. Guess it's time, I say, and jump down onto the ice. Hey, he follows. What are you doing tonight? Would you want to hang out, maybe? A bunch of my teammates are going to this party at the basketball house. You know it? I do. So you want to go? With you, I ask, a little confused. He looks around. Yeah. Sorry, it's just, I don't think I'm your type. Okay, his brows scrunch together. Why aren't you my type? Or better yet, what do you think my type is exactly? Look, I am cool with an occasional casual hookup, but based on the number of girls you've been entangled with this week alone, I'm sorry. It turns out there is really no good way to tell a guy you aren't into being his next slam piece. Right. Rhett skates backward. Got it. Well, I guess I'll see you around. I'm in the library studying when Elias calls. I prop my phone up against my backpack on the table and accept the video call. Hi. I keep my voice low. Why have you not called me back? And where are you? His eyes scan the background, and I can tell the second he realizes my location. Unless you're planning to make a fashionably late appearance at this party, you're going to need to get a serious move on. It's already after eight. I'm not going. I knew I never should have told Elias about Rhett asking me out. Why not? Ronnie sounds like a fun guy. Go have fun. Even if I couldn't see his big smile, I could tell how excited he is by his tone. You know that isn't his name. He gave my girl a black eye. He doesn't deserve real first name usage yet. Plus, hockey boys are stupid. One too many hits. He wraps his knuckles on his head. And still, you want me to go out with him. Not with him, exactly. There are only two months of college left. Go out. Drink a little too much. Make bad decisions. Let me live vicariously through you. He sticks his bottom lip out in a pout. I hum a noncommittal response. What are you doing? He's holding the phone close to his face, so I can't make out the background, but it's dark. Elias is from Massachusetts, but lives with a host family in Toronto while he trains with his pair's partner, Taylor. They have a shot at going to the Olympics. They're really freaking good. I'm in bed. I have acro yoga at five o'clock tomorrow morning. The shade of his dark brown eyes is hard to see in the dim lighting, but it's impossible to miss the giant eye roll he sends my way. We could do all the yoga in the world, and it's not going to make a lick of difference unless Taylor decides to trust me. You did drop her. It was one time. My wrist was fractured. I was holding her with a broken wrist. He gets heated, waving one hand around as if he's holding up an imaginary partner. Until you weren't. I grin at his playful jaw drop as if he's really shocked by my words. We always tell it to each other like it is. No bullshit. All I'm saying is maybe doing acro yoga together will help rebuild some of that trust. You have to start somewhere. And I'm just saying no one is bonding that early in the morning. Also, you're one to talk. What about you? That's the thing about having a best friend that's a guy. A guy not at all interested in sleeping with you. They don't tiptoe over your feelings. What about me? I play it off like I don't know where this is going. You need to enjoy what's left of college. If work is anything like what I'm doing, it's a real snooze fest centered around a continual lack of sleep and caffeine. I hate to think of you sitting in the library tonight. Ew. Plus, I think you want to go. What gave you that idea? He tilts his head and studies me. Are you wearing makeup? Hmm. And is that a new shirt? I bat my fake lashes. Point made. He laughs, smiling at me. My dating life makes yours look pathetic, and I'm training or sleeping 22 hours a day. If you won't do it for yourself, do it for me. I need some excitement in my life. You have plenty of excitement without even trying. What about the girl you met at the coffee house last week? Well, we've been texting. And as quick as that, I've turned the topic of conversation back to Elias.
He very much enjoys talking about himself, and I'm happy to think about anything but Rhett and the party he invited me to. I had fun with him today. I felt something, and it seemed like he did too, but maybe I imagined it. I don't want to be a dumb girl who's reading more into the situation than what's there. But I also know that the indescribable chemistry and connection I had with him is something I haven't felt in a long time. It was only an hour, and I had to basically force him to talk to me. But once he did, I felt it. There was something else accelerating my heart rate and giving me butterflies deep in my belly. I don't put myself out there very often, and it will really sting if I put myself out there and I'm wrong. I close my laptop as Elias chats my ear off and give up on getting any more schoolwork done tonight. I really came here to convince myself I didn't want to be at the basketball party. Elias yawns as he finishes telling me every detail of the text exchange he's been having with the girl he picked up while grabbing coffee. He's handsome and charming, and even though I haven't met him in person, I can tell he's one of those people that are impossible to resist. But he's also super picky. One date, sometimes less, and he convinces himself that it'll never work. She has a pet goldfish and those freak him out, or she's a flight attendant for an airline he doesn't like. One time he stopped texting a girl because she had the audacity to wear white pants after Labor Day, and he is not the picture of fashion. He wears socks with his sandals. He's not allowed to judge anyone. I should let you go, he says, and you should change into something far more revealing, call Josie, and then go to that party. Tempting, I muse. I'm texting her now. Better think up a really good excuse or hide. How do you even have her number? We exchanged after your accident last year, in case of emergency. He says it all so casually. Funny how a few near-death experiences can make a person so blasé about it all. Elias and I have the same heart condition. That's actually how we met. I was scrolling YouTube one day and stumbled upon a video where he was talking about the condition and how it impacts his training. It seemed like fate to see another figure skater my age dealing with it. I reached out, we started messaging back and forth, and now he's stuck with me for life. My phone pings with an incoming text. That was fast, I say as I read the message from Josie. OMG, I'm jumping in the shower. I'll be ready in 30 minutes. I knew I could count on Josie. I don't think this is a good idea. I told him no and basically implied that he was a slut. Won't I look like a bitch showing up now? Please, if you show up looking hot, he's not going to remember anything you've ever said or done. I have too much going on right now. It's a last-ditch bullshit excuse, and he knows it. Of course, he calls me on it. You need to get laid, he says loudly. I duck my head in embarrassment, even though no one can hear him, thanks to my ear pods. He's not wrong, though. Fine, but if this ends badly, I'm blaming you. I can take it. Call me tomorrow or later tonight if you're doing the walk of shame. He makes an X over the left side of his chest. I do the same and then flip him off for good measure. Oh, crap. What have I gotten myself into? Chapter 7 Rhett Ha ha, very funny, I say when I see the mysterious gift left on my bed. A shopping bag filled with three different brands of energy drinks, condoms, and a box of Kleenex. What are the tissues for, I ask, bringing the entire bag out into the hallway. Music blasts through our apartment as we get ready to go out. There are two bathrooms in this place, but the guys are all crowded into one fighting over the mirror. Those are for the girls you make cry, Heath says. Mav elbows him and Heath rubs his arm as he adds. I mean, that's what I assume. Please, I know this was all you two. I hold up the box of glow-in-the-dark condoms. Mav cackles. Those are fun. Makes your dick look like a lightsaber. Adam meets my gaze in the mirror. Maybe the glow will help keep you awake. I hate all of you. I take the bag back to my room and toss it all on the bed except the largest energy drink. That Carrie blowing up your phone earlier, Adam calls across the hallway. Yeah? Everything good? I know he's terrified I'm going to get back with her. Adam never liked Carrie. The feeling was mutual, actually. 
Carrie didn't really get along with any of my teammates. All good. I don't know if I managed to sound like I don't care, but that's the vibe I'm going with tonight. I don't give a fuck about any of it. Not that my ex won't stop fucking calling or that every time I try to move on with someone else, it blows up spectacularly. Last night to get stupid, Adam says, when we're all finally ready to go. Tomorrow it's time to go to work. Hell yeah, we agree. We get to the basketball house, known on campus as the White House, and within the hour I'm already too drunk to walk a straight line. Last night to get stupid? Challenge accepted. I have finally reached the point of not caring about the disaster that is my dating life. Here's a free party tip for you. If you want to have a good time at a party, or anywhere, really, stick with Maverick. He knows everyone, drinks like a damn fish, and nothing gets in his way of having fun. We've been teammates for two years now, but we've only hung out just the two of us a few times, and never like this, where I'm ready to match him drink for drink. The longer we hang and the drunker I get, the more I think how ridiculous I've been stressing over everything. Mav is single and he's always happy. I don't know why I let my breakup drama get in the way of having fun for so long, but no more. We're talking to a group of girls who immediately ghost us when some frat dudes arrive with a cooler of jello shots. Mav doesn't seem phased in the least. Who needs girls? I shout and raise my drink. Easy there, let's not talk crazy. Mav pushes my hand down. I'm jealous, man, I tell him. Nothing gets to you. You're always the life of the party. I don't know how to do it, I admit. I was a couple for so long. Now everything out of my mouth is a disaster. I fell asleep during a blowjob. He laughs and wraps an arm around my shoulders. Yeah, also add that to the vault. Take another drink and forget it happened. She didn't want to go out with me because she thinks I'm a player. I laugh, a little slurred. It's kind of funny, really. Who didn't want to go out with you? Sienna. I asked her out. I managed to keep that to myself all day, but the liquor has loosened my lips. Well, what did you say? What did she say? I asked her to hang out tonight, and she told me I wasn't her type. Ouch. He unscrews the cap on the Mad Dog 2020 and hands it over. Yeah, I tip back the bottle. I care a lot less than I did two hours ago. The truth is, maybe she isn't my type, or maybe I don't have a type. She seems different than Carrie, and that's all I have to go by. Sienna's rad. I could see you two together, but stop overthinking it. If it happens, it happens. If not, he shrugs. That's the most maverick thing you've ever said. I mock his shrug, exaggerating it in my drunken state. Whatever happens, if it's meant to be, it'll be. If not, I'll just bless the women of Valley with my six-pack and beer-drinking skills. He grins. His shirt is still on, but the night is young. Now you've got it. Come on, let's get you on the dance floor. I start to protest. I don't dance. But fuck it. Tonight I do. Not well, but whatever. Maverick moves straight to the middle where a group of girls shake their asses in rhythm to the music. They swallow him up and, yep, there goes his shirt. I hang back, but soon I'm pulled closer and sandwiched between two very enthusiastic chicks. Uh, I don't dance. I say. One of the girls leans forward and I think she asks me to repeat what I said, but I can't hear anything over the music. Huh. The one place I can't put my foot in my mouth. Yeah, I can get down with this. Chapter 8 Sienna My stomach is in knots as we push through the party with drinks in our hands. Josie walks in front of me, holding my hand and pulling me along behind her. My roommate is a lot more social than I am. It isn't that I never go out, but most weekends I prefer hanging with Josie or Olivia. Or, yes, watching true crime documentaries. I find it reassuring that terrible things happen to even really good people. Make out of that what you will. My gaze darts around, looking for Rat as we weave across the backyard of the basketball house, a huge pool takes up a large portion of it. People stand in groups in and around it. On one side of the yard, a DJ booth is set up, and there's a mass of bodies moving to the music. The other side of the yard has the keg, according to Josie, and that's the direction we head. Are you supposed to be meeting him somewhere? She asks when we finally reach the line at the keg. Not exactly. I twist my hands in front of me. 
he doesn't know I'm coming. She laughs, fills us each a cup of beer, and then starts back toward the middle of the yard. I was perfectly content hanging on the side and out of the chaos. I continually scan the party, but I don't see Rhett anywhere. I was so sure he'd be here. I didn't even consider the possibility that he made other plans. We're dancing, Josie announces and pulls me again, sloshing half of my beer on the ground. We are? I ask. The question gets lost in the noise as we step closer to the source of the booming music. She drags me behind her and I squeeze her hand to work out some of my nerves. She stops a few yards away from the people dancing. What's up with you? You're acting like you're nervous and you have no reason to be. Is it the dress? Are you uncomfortable? Because you look amazing. No, it isn't the dress. Love the dress, I assure her, smoothing a hand down the skin-tight pink dress from her closet that she insisted I wear tonight. It's Rhett. I think I like him. Damn him. I don't even really know him, but I can't stop thinking about him. I'm all out of sorts. I hate it when that happens. She smiles at me. Forget about Rhett for an hour. Let's just have a good time, and then we'll ask around and see if he's here. As she speaks, I spot him. I grab her arm so she doesn't step any closer. There he is, the guy I stupidly can't stop thinking about. He's on the dance floor, sandwiched between two girls. One plastered on his front with her hands on his chest, and another at his back, rubbing her boobs all over him. A surge of annoyance and frustration blasts through me, followed quickly with jealousy. The latter pisses me off the most. Of course, he came anyway and is dancing with other girls. I said no, which is why the jealousy I feel is particularly annoying. Josie follows my gawking stare. Guess he came. Yeah, found him. Now can we go? Sienna! Maverick's voice manages to boom over the music. I glance back to the dance floor to see him in a similar position as his teammate. I wave, and he untangles himself from two girls, who move on to someone else in his absence. Mav moves toward Rhett, who, speaking of, still hasn't noticed me, but the two girls he's dancing with are inching up his shirt, and four hands move over his back, stomach, and pecs. The one in front squats down and licks his abs. That's as much as I see before I turn and walk away. Josie jogs beside me to keep up. Where are you going? This was a mistake. Maverick, half naked, tattoos rippling under his muscles, catches us. Hey, no way, you came. Red's going to be so stoked. Right, he looks pretty stoked. I wave a hand of indifference toward him. He's finally spotted me and is attempting to squeeze out from between his dance partners. They are not letting him go without a fight. I can hardly blame them. He looks sinful in a plain white t-shirt and jeans, staring at me with apologetic eyes. The thing is, I'm not even pissed at him. I'm pissed at myself for assuming he was going to be hanging off to the side, waiting and hoping that I'd come. I told him no, because this is who he is, and I didn't want to get my feelings hurt, but then convinced myself otherwise because that's what I wanted to believe. Ah, don't be mad at him. I had to practically drag him out there. Let's go save him. Mav wraps an arm around my shoulders and pulls me back toward the dance floor. Rhett's managed to get free and heads toward us. Hey, he says tentatively. I didn't think you were coming. Surprise. Sarcasm drips from the word. Josie and Maverick look between us. An awkward silence falls over our small group. Dance? Maverick asks my friend, holding his hand out to her. Absolutely. Josie slides her palm into his. She looks over her shoulder as they move into the center of the dancers. Rhett shifts nervously in front of me. You look nice. I've been wondering if your hair was short or long. I can never tell when it's all up. You have? I like it. He lifts a hand and brushes his fingers along the ends of my hair. He sways and inadvertently pulls my hair as he does. Oh, shit, sorry. He untangles his fingers with a sheepish grin. 
Rhett is drunk, and for some reason I find it a little charming. Do you want to dance? I shake my head. No, I think I'm good. I don't think I can live up to the threesome he had going earlier. Okay, uh, drink? I'm still carrying a mostly full cup of beer, but I nod. We walk side by side. His arm brushes against mine and neither of us pulls away. Now that I've found him, I have no idea what to say. At the keg, he takes my cup, looks at how full it is, and laughs. Do you actually want another beer? I'm not much of a drinker. He tops it off and takes a sip of it. I'm gonna level with you. He runs a hand through his messy hair. I'm really drunk. I can't help but laugh as he disarms me with a cocky grin. I didn't think you were coming, and I decided to say fuck it. He shakes his head. Not fuck you, just it. You know, girls, dating, life. You realize I'm a girl, right? He closes one eye and pulls his bottom lip behind his teeth for a second. I really suck at this, like epic levels of suckage. He waves his arm around dramatically, and the beer in his cup sloshes onto me, soaking the front of my dress. It's cold, really cold. I shriek and jump back. Okay, well, this has been fun. Fuck, I'm sorry. Come on. Rhett takes over, gripping me by the arm and walking fast toward the house. He commands people out of the way, leading me inside and cutting to the front of the line for the bathroom. The door opens and three girls stumble out. Excuse us. Drunk, bossy Rhett is hot. Almost hot enough to ignore the stench of beer now coating my dress. The next girl in line smiles at him. Her hand goes to her hair and she curls a finger around a long brunette strand. No problem. Need any company? What? He fumbles, clearly trying to piece together why he'd need company in the bathroom. Before he can, I charge ahead. The beer is dripping down the front of me. Even my panties are wet. To my surprise, he follows me in and shuts the door. I find a towel, hope it isn't too used, and blot the front of my dress, or Josie's dress. What can I do to help? I'm not making a lot of progress. With a sigh, I drop the towel to the vanity. It'll dry. A shiver racks my body. The air conditioning vent in the bathroom has kept this small room cold, which probably feels nice if you aren't soaked. Here, take my shirt. He pulls it over his head without a second thought and holds it out to me. I stare, not at the white ball of cotton in his hand, but at his chest. My mouth goes dry. Are you freaking kidding me? Uh, his gaze drops from me to the shirt back to me. It's clean, I promise. You can't walk around like that. I fling a hand toward his abs, all eight of them. The corners of his mouth tip up. Like what? Don't play dumb with me. Angel, around you, I don't have to play. You make me stupid. I can't get anything right. Looking like that, who needs a brain? I mutter. He stalks toward me, a cocky glint shining in his eyes. Are you trying to say that you like what you see? I mean, it's whatever. My gaze dips over his chest, though, and my nipples tighten. Gah, I can't even pretend. Your body is ridiculous. I'm glad you think so. I might never wear a shirt again if you keep looking at me like that. He gently places the t-shirt over my head and pulls it down. The heat of the fabric and the nearness of our bodies does funny things to my insides. My heart rate climbs and my chest feels tight. I slow my breathing out of habit. Like what? I reach out and slide my fingers over the ridges of muscle. He inhales and those blue eyes darken. He ignores my question. Not that it requires much of an answer. Your hands are cold. Someone tossed a beer on me. I'm really sorry about that. You say that a lot. I've fucked up a lot, and I'm sorry for that, too. The list keeps getting longer. My laugh dies when he places a calloused thumb at the corner of my mouth. Staring at my lips, he traces along the bottom one with the pad of his thumb. Add this to the list.
I'm in an alternate reality as he leans forward, still distracted by his body and the way mine feels when he's this close. It's only when his mouth slants over mine that my brain processes he's kissing me. His hand on my face slides down to my neck in a possessive hold that contradicts the softness of his lips. My back is to the vanity, legs hitting against it, and Rhett crowds into my space as his tongue slides into my mouth. My heart pounds in my chest. Somewhere in the very back of my mind, I'm aware that I'm doing a potentially very dumb thing, kissing Rhett when I know it won't go anywhere beyond tonight. Still, I can see why he leaves a path of crying girls behind him. He kisses like a champ. He's sweet and tender and hard and demanding all at once, and my head is spinning. He lifts me up and sets me on the vanity, then pushes between my legs. His fingers thread through my hair, and he tugs gently, exposing my neck. His nose grazes down the curve of my neck, and his mouth nips and kisses along the way. My legs tremble as he moves those big hands of his to my legs. They inch up my bare skin and slide under the hem of my dress that's now hitched up very high on my thighs. My core aches, and I will him to move his fingers just a little higher. His chest presses against mine, and I remember that I have a half-naked man in front of me. A half-naked man with a body built to make good girls want bad things. I slide my palms over his pecs and down his sides. My exploration encourages him, and one long finger finally touches my soaked panties. It's the beer, I say. It isn't, or at least not entirely. We both groan as he circles my clit through the silky material. I'm ready to let him fuck me here. Correction, I'm ready to beg him to fuck me here, and I'm not even the drunk one. A knock at the door pulls us from the moment, reminding us there's a line of people waiting to get in here. We should probably go, I say, even as I spread my legs farther apart. He pulls back, smug grin firmly in place, hands still rubbing me gently. They can wait. Unfortunately, they don't. The door opens, and the girl that asked if we needed company walks in. She studies us for a beat before declaring, Don't mind me, I just need to pee. Rhett straightens, removes his hands from under my dress, and pulls the hem down to cover me. Ready, Angel? His voice is gruff with want, and no, I'm absolutely not ready. He takes my hand and keeps me close as we exit the bathroom and head back outside. The cool night air hits me, and I take deep, steadying breaths. Holy crap. I almost had sex with Rhett in the bathroom with a line of people outside. If I'm completely honest, I almost had sex with Rhett in the bathroom while a girl peed on the toilet. I'm not proud. A group of hockey guys stands just outside of the doorway, girls intermixed with them. One of the guys, Jordan, I think, calls to Rhett, and we join the circle. Heard you were having a good time, the guy says, his gaze bouncing between Rhett and me. Now I know why. He tips his head to me. Jordan, we sort of met at the rink. Sienna, I say. I remember you. That's Liam, Heath... Ginny, Dakota, Reagan, and you already met Adam. Rhett calls them out, pointing as he goes. I look at each and smile, offer a small wave. Did you and Maverick lose your shirts at the same time? Adam grins as he tips back the beer in his hand. I spilled my beer on her. I'd forgotten how drunk he is until he tries to wrap an arm around my waist and sways, which means we sway. I'm perfectly sober, but my legs are still shaking from what went down in the bathroom. Easy there, Adam says. Let's not give her another black eye. Rhett flips him off. Speaking of catastrophes, I'm still soaked. I should find Josie and see if she's ready to go. His gaze trails down my body, and I'm pretty sure he's thinking about my panties. My body warms, cheeks flame. She's on the dance floor with Maverick, Adam says. Thanks, I wave again. It was nice to meet you guys. Looking to Rhett, I say, see you later. Wait, you're really leaving? Yeah, I'm wet and sticky, and I have to teach two fitness classes tomorrow morning anyway. Yeah, okay. His brows knit in confusion. 
at least let me come with you to make sure you find Josie. I nod and we start across the lawn. We have the semifinals Monday night, so we're keeping it low-key the rest of the weekend. But can we hang again? Ah, uh, I decide to go with honesty, since it's unlikely he'll remember asking me tomorrow anyway. I don't usually do that type of thing, and I'm not judging you, or even me. Casual hookups can be fun. I mean, that was fun. Really fun. I'm blathering on and talking in circles and not really saying what I mean, which is that I like him, and hooking up will end with me getting hurt. You're really drunk. Fair, but I wasn't drunk when I asked you to come tonight. This was a mistake. We both have a lot going on. I'm bullshitting. We both know it. Elias would call me out on it, but Rhett doesn't. We reach the dance floor, and I spot Josie dancing with a group of girls, Maverick in the center of them. Josie sees us and waves. The sight of Maverick without his shirt reminds me that I still have Rhett's. Oh, here. I start to take it off, but he stops me. Keep it. I'm going to head out soon, too. Drinking makes me tired. So I've heard. I take a step toward Josie, half hoping he'll stop me. He doesn't. Later, Rothras. The next day, I'm finishing up with my second bar class when Rhett appears in the hallway. He slips in as my students gather their things. Hey. Hands in pockets, he approaches me at the front of the room. You found me. I'm a little impressed he, A, remembered I said I was teaching this morning, and B, is awake this early. I looked at the group fitness schedule before I went to bed last night and set an alarm. Impressive. He grins. A first for everything. I didn't ruin your dress last night, did I? No, it's fine. Your shirt is at my dorm. I'll bring it to the rink. Or you could bring it to my place later. I laugh. Presumptuous much? Not like that. To hang, watch TV, play Xbox, or whatever. I'd suggest something more exciting, but we have curfew at nine. Ouch. Yeah, coach is pulling out all the stops to keep us distraction-free. And you thought inviting a girl over was the answer? I'll be distracted by you either way. My stomach flips. This freaking guy. What time? I ask. I was prepared to say yes as soon as he asked. Actually, as soon as I woke up this morning and wished I'd stayed at the party longer. But sober and charming Rhett is almost as impossible to resist as half-naked Rhett. Six. He hands me a piece of paper with the address and backs away. And for the record, I don't usually do that type of thing either. Chapter 9 Right. I give Sienna a quick tour of the apartment, grab a beer, and offer her one. I promise I won't spill it on you. She smiles, but shakes her head. No, thanks. Right. You said you were much of a drinker. We also have water, orange juice, and a variety of energy drinks. I'm good, really. And I drink sometimes, like last night. Just not very much or very often. I grab a water and lead her to the couch. It's quiet for a change. Adam's at Reagan and Dakota's apartment across the breezeway. Ginny and Heath are in his room with the door shut and Maverick is at his place. When I asked them not to bombard Sienna, I didn't think they'd listen. I'm pleasantly surprised. Because of your heart condition or just not your thing? She nods. Mostly because of my heart. If you don't mind my asking, what kind of heart condition do you have? It's called lung QT syndrome. Basically, my heartbeat gets out of whack but it's treatable. I take medication and I have an implant that monitors my heart, but no, not really. I just have to be careful and listen to my body. Skating isn't dangerous. I have type 1, which means both physical and emotional stress can trigger episodes. If I wanted to be completely safe, I'd have to avoid basically everything. Sometimes I can feel my heart get out of rhythm when I'm working out. Other times I'm just sitting around doing nothing. Freaky. What's an episode like? Usually it's just a fluttering in my chest or a lightheaded feeling. She shrugs and a small smile pulls at her lips. I've gotten really good at listening to my body and knowing when to take breaks. I can do most things, in moderation. No roller coasters, though. She sticks out her bottom lip. I haven't been to a carnival in forever. 
I miss cotton candy. She angles her legs toward mine. Did you mean what you said about not usually doing that type of thing? I chuckle at the topic change. Yeah, of course. Her gaze narrows. You don't believe me? Everything I know about you contradicts that. The day I met you, you hooked up with someone only hours before, or tried to. Your phone was blowing up with different girls later that day. She laughs softly. Then, last night... Her voice trails off, and I'm accosted with hazy visions of Sienna in the bathroom of the basketball house. I guess if you'd only known me the past week, I could see where you might get the wrong idea, but that's not me. I got out of a relationship recently, and last weekend was, well, it was the result of a lot of things, but that's not something I do on the regular. I'd certainly like to, though, with her. I leave that part out. And last night... You were really drunk. I get it. Yes, but sober right would have done the same thing, minus drenching you in beer. An amused smirk plays on her lips. Okay, fine, that might have happened anyway. I bump her knee. Last night was fucking awesome. I'm only sorry we got interrupted. Just as well, you'd probably have fallen asleep on me, she teases. But her breathing changes and tension hangs in the air between us. Not a chance. Her grin makes my cock twitch. Taking her to my bedroom after I just claimed to not be that kind of guy seems like a bad plan, so I pick up an Xbox controller. Wanna play? She lets out a slow breath and nods. What do you have? I assure the options, including all the other gaming systems. Between my roommates and me, we have pretty much every system and game out there. Sienna picks Mario Kart, and my dick finally gets the idea that we're not getting any action today. He's had to accept that a lot. I'm pretty sure he's ready to remove himself from me and find a new host, buddy. I'm usually pretty competitive, but we're firing questions back and forth as we play, getting to know one another. Only the one sister? I ask. I pass her on the game and toss a banana over my shoulder. She moves her whole body with a controller as she swerves out of the way. Yeah, what about you? Younger brother. Are you close? Nah, he's five. That's quite a gap. Yeah, no kidding. I was 17 when Ryder was born and I've basically been away for his entire life. I bet he looks up to you. Not really. I shake my head and focus on staying just ahead of her on the game. I want to win, but I don't want to blow her out of the water. When he grows up, he wants to be Spider-Man. It's good that he's keeping his expectations reasonable. She glances over and catches my eye. It's hard to look away from her when she's smiling at me like that. She looks away first, but I keep staring. I win! She shrieks. I glance at the TV screen in time to see her cross the finish line. My dude has crashed into the wall going nowhere, and that feels pretty accurate for the scenario. It's the best of four races, I say. I best are in the next three and manage to keep my undefeated record intact. We're finishing up when Heath and Ginny come out of his room. Rothris, your phone's been blowing up. Real mood killer, Heath says. His gaze lands on Sienna, and he smiles awkwardly. Hey, Sienna. Hi. She waves back. Heath goes to the kitchen and opens the fridge, but Ginny joins us in the living room. It's so good to see you again, she says as she sits in the armchair across from us. Ginny, right? Sienna asks. That's right. Ginny's smile couldn't possibly get any bigger. What are you guys playing? Mario Kart. Do you want to play? Sienna offers. Yeah. She reaches for the extra controllers. Heath, you want in too? Uh, my roommate looks to me. Since I don't know how to politely communicate that I'd really rather not have them join us, I nod. Sure. I'm terrible, Sienna says. I only beat him on one race. You beat him? Ginny asks. Her brown eyes widen with disbelief. No one ever beats Rhett. I avoid Sienna's stare and shrug. I'm having an off day. The four of us play a handful of games before Sienna calls it. I can't take any more defeat. You guys keep playing, I'll watch. Same, Ginny says. You boys can have it. I want a chance to talk to Sienna anyway. She moves over to the couch on the other side of Sienna, forcing Sienna to move closer to me. Her leg brushes against mine. I have no idea how such little contact can send so much adrenaline rushing through my veins. Not having sex today. Not having sex today. That's a fucking mantra I hope to never repeat. Call of Duty? Heath asks. Yeah, one game. I say. 
Ginny's latched onto Sienna and is already peppering her with questions. I relax my leg next to hers. She briefly looks over, hits me with a smile, and turns back to Ginny. Listening in on their conversation as I play, I learn that Sienna is from Wisconsin, a town about six hours from where my family lives in Minnesota, something I interject into the conversation and then get killed by Heath. Fuck yeah, finally. Heath holds the controller over his head in victory. I'll get him later. Right now, video games are a distraction to what I really want to be doing. Thanks for the game, I say. Need a rematch? He knows me well. Later, I'm going to hang with Sienna. Right, he stands. Baby doll? What? Ginny asks, briefly looking up at him. Guess I'm not the only one enamored by Sienna. He motions with his head toward his room. Oh, okay. Ginny squeezes Sienna's hand. Rhett is the greatest. I'm so glad you two are hanging out. Really the best. He's... That's enough. I cut her off. Please don't embarrass me. So modest. Another great attribute, she says as she gets to her feet. I'll see you later, Ginny asks Sienna. Yeah, maybe. Hope so. Ginny bounces to Heath and jumps on his back before they disappear down the hallway. Sorry about that. It's fine. They seem nice. Wanna watch a movie or something? I've never invited a girl over to the apartment to hang out. Well, unless you count Carrie and the two times she visited. But that was different. We were already together. Sure. While I flip through the channels, she leans back on the couch until her shoulder rests against my chest. I sink farther behind her, taking advantage of the position and getting closer. We decide on Aquaman and settle in just as the front door opens. Mav walks through with his dog Charlie in one arm, a bag of groceries in the other. Heyo, he calls, shutting the door behind him with a foot. Sienna, what's up? Just hanging out. You live here too? Nah, downstairs. The door opens again. This time, Dakota steps through it. All I have is apple cider vinegar, she says to Mav. Then she looks at the room and waves to Sienna and me. She and Reagan live across the breezeway, I explain, then ask them. What are you guys doing here? We're grilling, Mav says with a duh expression. Well, can you do it quieter? We're watching a movie. Oh, Dakota's eyes light up. I love this movie. She sets the vinegar on the kitchen counter and sits with us. Red, that shirt looks great on you. Her gaze rakes over me, which is super weird. I legit don't think Dakota has ever complimented me before. Uh, I glance down at my plain black t-shirt. Thanks, I guess. It really brings out the gray in your eyes. You do have great eyes, Mav calls from the kitchen. What the hell is going on? I realize now why my roommates spend so much time in their bedrooms when their girlfriends are over. It's like a bus station in here with people coming and going, interrupting and acting fucking weird. Mav stacks plates, meat, and seasoning into his arms. Food will be ready in about 40 minutes. Are you staying, Sienna? She looks to me. Maverick is a pretty good cook, I tell her. Pretty good, he scoffs. Charlie barks at his feet. I guess now I have to stay to find out. Dakota stands and flips her red hair over one shoulder. I better go supervise. Worried about me? Mav asks her. Worried that you'll burn the place down and take my apartment with it. The sliding glass door opens and closes and their voices trail off. Unfortunately, we only get about ten minutes further into the movie when Adam and Reagan arrive. Everyone's here now, so at least I can stop waiting for the damn door to open. I love these guys, girls too, but they keep smiling at me like I am their little brother who's going out on a date for the first time. Fuck that noise. I'm the only one of the group that's had any semblance of a serious relationship. Ginny and Heath have been together the longest, but even that relationship is new compared to how long I was with Carrie. I give up trying to keep her to myself, and Sienna doesn't seem to mind when we all go outside to eat dinner together. The guys keep bringing up random shit, an assist I had last game, that time I stepped in front of a chick about to get run over by a cyclist on campus. That fucking hurt. Adam somehow even remembers when I helped a girl in our freshman dorm find her lost emotional support gerbil. What exactly is it about me that screams desperation so loudly my friends feel like they need to sell me on Sienna? Okay, I know why, but I'm not some sad case. I'm not them and I definitely don't need them to convince some chick I'm good enough. The girls seem particularly attached to Sienna, and she has to promise them they'll hang out again before I can steal her away after dinner. 
I shut the door to my room and run a hand through my hair. I'm sorry about that. That was painful. My friends were trying to sell me on you. She laughs. Well, they sold me on them anyway. They're great. Yeah, most of the time, I agree. We sit on top of the comforter on my bed, backs against the headboard. I slide my hand over hers and intertwine our fingers. What are you doing after graduation? I ask. Going back to Wisconsin? She shrugs. I haven't figured it out yet. I have an interview tomorrow, actually. Do you have a job yet? I nod. Yeah, my family owns and operates a rink. We do skating lessons, camps, rentals. I'm going to help run it, expand the hockey side of it. Plus, I'll be closer to my brother as he grows up. Admit it. You want to be his hero instead of Spider-Man. She leans her shoulder against mine. I just want to know him, you know? Yeah, she sighs. I definitely get that. Allison, my sister, will be heading off to college in a couple of years, and then who knows where she'll end up. I miss seeing her, but we text and talk on the phone. My family does these super corny Zoom calls every Monday night. Sounds nice. Yeah, I guess it is. I rub my thumb over hers. A simple movement that makes my cock press against the zipper of my jeans. She tilts her arm, moving mine with it, to look at her watch. Do you need to be back at a certain time tonight? I thought we could watch a movie without my roommates interrupting us every two minutes or something else, Jill. The bus leaves tomorrow at six. No, I was checking my heart rate. She lets her arm fall slack. I'm fine, she adds. Sometimes when I'm with you, my chest feels tight like I've been pushing my body too hard. Hanging out with me causes you physical pain. Got it. Her laughter fills my room and I lean forward to capture her lips. My chest feels tight too. Shit, my entire body feels tight. Is kissing considered a chill activity? The breathy words are spoken into my mouth. Instead of answering, I cup the back of her head and deepen the kiss. Her hand reaches up and rests on my chest. She lightly fists the material in her palm. No, nah, there's absolutely nothing chill about kissing Sienna. Chapter 10 Sienna We've been kissing for the better part of an hour. Just kissing, and OMG, just kissing Rhett is so not just kissing. He toys with a strand of hair at my neck while he nips at my bottom lip. I should probably go, I say. Leaving is the last thing I want to do, but the longer we keep at this, the harder it's going to be to go. And I have to go. I'll hate myself tomorrow if I hook up with him and that turns out to be all he wanted from me. Okay. His hand slides back to lightly grasp my neck and he pulls me in for another scorching hot kiss. So quickly, I'm caught up in him again and tossing good intentions out the window to keep sucking face. He's really, really good at it. He pulls back before I do with a little groan deep in his throat. Do you need a ride back to the dorm? No, I borrowed Josie's car. Let me walk you out. He stands and pulls me with him. The apartment has quieted, and none of his friendly roommates or their girlfriends are in the living room as we walk through. The night is clear, and there's a breeze that whips my hair around my shoulders and into my face. Can I see you again? He asks, swinging our joined hands between us. Um, I start watching the ground in front of me. I know I'm going to say yes, but I need a few seconds to let all of my fears bounce around in my brain. When? Whenever you're free. He says so casually, like he's willing to rearrange his whole schedule to see me again. Great. How about tomorrow night? I bite back a smile as I glance at him. He rubs at his jaw. I've got a small conflict tomorrow night. We both laugh. Are you nervous about the game? I stop next to the driver's side door of Josie's car. Yes, he admits, then changes the topic back. Go out with me Tuesday night? I'm hesitant to make plans with him. I like spending time together. I really like kissing him, but I'm still not sure I truly believe he isn't a player. Plus, there are only two months of school left. Where can this possibly go? It feels like spending more time with him is the equivalent of signing myself up for a mini life course in dating disasters. 
Text me when you get back to Valley. I lean forward and press my lips to his, then shift to open the car door before I attack his mouth and say screw the consequences. He holds on to the top of the door while I get situated in the seat, then shuts me in. I roll down the window and put it in reverse. Good luck tomorrow night. Good luck at your interview. You remembered. I know it seems like my brain doesn't work when you're around, but I do remember the things you say. He steps back, and I ease off the brake, letting the car slowly roll backward. Thanks for tonight. I had fun. Me too. He grins and stays in the same spot, watching as I pull away from the apartment. And despite all my reservations, I smile like a fool the entire drive back to the dorms. Monday afternoon, I reserve a private room at the library for my video call interview with Dalton Technologies. Kelsey, the HR woman conducting the interview, smiles brightly at me when I join the call. Hi, Sienna. Hello. I wave and fidget with the collared dress shirt. I'm not nervous, but I really hate interviews. Does anyone like them? Kelsey sure seems like she does. And she's good. Within two minutes, she's cut through the awkwardness and put me at ease. She tells me all about the company, then the job. It's an entry-level position that creates sales materials for the healthcare software the company sells. The company is big, with two locations, which they call campuses. And each campus has amenities, like a cafeteria, a game room, meditation space, and a gym that rivals the one here at Valley. I knew a lot of these facts already. My dad has worked at Dalton for 25 years. In fact, the position I'm interviewing for is one he held early on in his career. He worked his way up to being an executive in the customer education department, where he works now. But over the years, he's held a lot of different jobs with Dalton. So at least some of what Kelsey tells me makes sense. Do you have any questions for me about the campus or the position? No, I don't think so, I say. I've been to both locations with my dad, so I'm familiar with where they are and everything. She smiles big again. I wonder if they teach that in HR classes. I try to mimic her. I'm not positive I want this job, but I know that I need to act like I do. Your dad is the best. Everyone loves him around here. Another huge smile. Well, should we talk about next steps? Um, sure. I'm going to email over information packets with all the details I told you on the phone. Look over everything, and you can just email me back if you have questions. The healthcare benefits are incredible. I think you'll be really pleased with that. I know pre-existing conditions can be difficult. I blink a few times, trying to think what to say. Kelsey doesn't pick up on my hesitation, and I manage to compose myself. Thank you. I will look everything over. If you'd like to talk to one of our sales managers, I can set that up. But I've already been given the go-ahead to extend an offer to you, so I will also be emailing that over. Wow. Really? She nods enthusiastically. Big grin. Congratulations. Thanks. I guess. It was really wonderful to meet you, Sienna. Please do not hesitate to reach out if you have any questions at all, and congratulations again. We say our goodbyes, and Kelsey ends the meeting with a what-the-heck-just-happened sigh. I sit back in the chair. I just got a job. I pack up and head back to the dorm. Hey, Josie calls from her desk without looking up. How was the interview? Her hair is piled up on her head with two pencils sticking out of it. Josie is an art major, and I know how deep she is in the creative zone by the number of colored pencils holding up her hair. Right now, we're at a point she can still communicate. Four or more, and there's no talking to her. She might speak, but she won't remember it later. Good. I got the job. She swivels in her chair. Oh my gosh, Sienna, congratulations. Thanks. She gets up to hug me. Or not, you don't look very excited. I'm stunned. They just gave me the job. I thought I'd have to answer questions about my strengths and weaknesses, tell them all the really amazing attributes I have that make me the perfect candidate. She snorts. You were just grumbling about those questions last night. I know, but I spent two hours preparing. What a waste. What is your greatest strength, Sienna Hale? She asks, crossing her arms over her chest. 
I am disciplined and focused and action-oriented, I say just as I rehearsed. That's three, wow. Right? And I can provide examples for all, mostly around skating. Which would be great if you were interviewing for skating jobs. She gives me the look, the one that says she disapproves of me giving up skating after college. The thing is, very few people make it as a professional skater, like Elias and Taylor. Far more take jobs with ice dancing shows. Those are great. Josie works for one every summer and plans to do it after she graduates next year. But those shows are high performance. There are flashing lights and loud music and all sorts of drama and flair. That's what makes them super fun and exciting for an audience. And also dangerous for me. Even if my doctor signed off, most companies wouldn't hire me, knowing the risk. If I just came right out and told Josie that, she'd stop giving me that look. I guess I don't want her to. Some part of me wants to let her believe I'm capable of that. Half the battle with my heart condition is keeping people from feeling sorry for me or treating me differently. And I'm okay with skating being a hobby from here on out. I love it, but I accept that it's not my destiny. The problem is nothing else interests me enough to be excited about doing it for the rest of my life. I like my business classes, and I'm sure once I settle into a job, everything will be fine. It just seems like everyone else is so excited about their plans after graduation, and I feel very meh. I reach for one of the positives. They have a really great fitness studio with yoga classes. The selling point is yoga, she laughs. You can do yoga anywhere. Thanks for ruining the selling point, she sits on her bed. Well, what are the other selling points then, outside of yoga? It's close to my family, the health benefits are excellent, 401k match, and I know it's a great company that's treated my dad well. I just thought I'd feel more excited. I don't know if anyone takes an entry-level job thinking it feels great. You can work up to a better position, though. It takes time. I don't point out that she's ecstatic every summer when she heads off for her job. Last year, she was performing on a cruise ship, though, so her job definitely has more selling points than the one I was just offered. Thanks, Dad. I stick out my tongue at her. That's exactly what he said when he recommended me for the job. Are you going to take it? I don't know. I fall onto her bed and slump over so my head is in her lap. I don't think I'm cut out for the real world. Maybe I'll get a bunch more degrees. What is women's studies, anyway? She snorts and runs a hand over my hair. You'll figure it out, and you'll be great at whatever you do. My phone rings in my backpack. What's your weakness? Josie asks as I get up to retrieve it. That'll be my family, ready to Zoom. I grin. Limited experience. She rolls her eyes. That's everyone interviewing for their first job. I know, right? It's the perfect bullshit answer to a bullshit question. Chapter 11 Sienna Hi! I answer my phone and wave at the screen while Josie goes back to drawing at her desk. My parents are crammed together on our living room couch. A second later, Mom moves the phone to show me Allison sitting in the armchair across from them. Congrats, Al. She plays on her high school junior varsity team, but got bumped to play varsity for the first time because one of their star players got injured. Thanks, she says, trying to play it cool. She breaks seconds later. It was so awesome, see? They turned all the lights down and the music was so loud that the announcer had to yell our names. I've never felt more important in my entire life. She keeps rambling about her hockey game last night. Mom sent me the video, I say when she takes a breath. The only person yelling louder than that announcer was Dad. She snorts. Mom threatened to sit across the rink next time. I'm going to at least need to invest in earplugs, Mom says. She's smiling, though, and just as proud of Allison. My chest tightens, thinking about how I'm missing watching her play. Add that to the selling points of Dalton. I could actually see my sister play a few games. Did your coach say whether or not this was going to be a permanent thing? I hope so. Chelsea is out for the rest of the season. I'm so proud. My little sister is crushing other people's dreams to make her own happen.
I joke with my hand held over my heart. Hey, it isn't like I injured her. And I'm sorry she's out. That royally sucks. But you have to take the opportunities given to you. She's all sass and fiery determination. We are alike in a lot of ways. We have the same dark hair and same green eyes. But at five foot eleven, she looks older than fifteen. In fact, by the time she was ten, she was already taller than me. I'm more quiet determination, and Allison is unapologetically tenacious in everything she does. You're not wrong there. When's the next game? This weekend. It's going to be a tough game. Her expression goes serious, and she gets quiet, presumably worrying about their next game. My parents jump in to ask about skating and school. Dad hammers me with questions about the interview and congratulates me when I tell him they already sent over an offer. They're a great company, he adds. Good benefits, nice office building. It would be so nice to have you living closer again, Mom says. You know I'll visit more no matter what, I tell her. And Kelsey mentioned the great health benefits. I roll my eyes. Doesn't it seem sketchy that they offered me a job without a proper interview? I don't even have any experience. I don't want to tell people how to do their job, but maybe Kelsey should be fired for hiring someone without properly interviewing them. He waves me off. No one comes in with any useful experience. It's about character, and Bob knows you're a good egg. Bob? I worked with him when I was overseeing the program managers, remember? No. Handlebar mustache. Wore flannel before it was trendy. I have a small laugh. Vaguely sounds familiar. He'll be your boss. He's a great guy and has a good team. They're at the South location with the good cafeteria. Another selling point, I mumble. My dad looks like he's two seconds away from giving me another lecture on working my way up, climbing the corporate ladder, when Olivia walks through the door. Game is in five, she says. Are we watching it here or downstairs? There's a bigger TV downstairs in the lounge area, but Josie's already propped up her laptop and is finding the game. You're watching hockey? Allison asks, brows raised. Of course. Valley is in the semifinals. And my new crush is playing. I run two fingers along my bottom lip, thinking about Rhett and wondering if I should keep kissing him. If they win, they play the championship at Valley, Allison says. I know. In the past, I probably wouldn't have known, but thanks to Rhett, I am well aware. We're really excited. I move my phone so they can see Josie and Olivia. Hi, girls, my mom says, except they can't hear her because I'm wearing my earbuds. My mom says hello, I tell them. They wave and say their hellos. Here we go, Josie says. I glance over in time to see the camera zoom in on Valley U's hockey team warming up. If they win, they'll move on to the championship this weekend. If they lose, their season is over. As the game starts, Josie and Olivia settle on the floor to do homework, and I listen as my parents fill me in on everything happening there and periodically glance up at the screen to check the score. And okay to see if Rhett is on the ice. Allison and my dad are talking about her last game again, all things they've already told me, but they're both really excited, so I let them chatter on. I'm tuning them out anyway, watching the game. Number 23 comes onto the ice, and I can't tear my eyes away from him. Valley has the puck, and he speeds down the ice. Several guys take shots at the goalie, but nothing makes it in. Finally, after three or more attempts, Rhett rebounds a blocked shot and passes to Adam on the other side of the net for the first goal of the game. Oh my gosh, I yell. Josie and Olivia look up to see the Valley players huddling up, congratulating Rhett and Adam on the goal. My family stops talking to see what the commotion is about. We scored. I can feel the blush creep up my neck. I don't think I've ever been so excited about a goal in a hockey game. Valley is up by one with three minutes left in the second period. That's a lot of time, my sister says. Is Luke Ketchum in the net? Uh, I glance at the screen. I'm not about to tell them I only know the name and position of one Valley hockey player. The team is huddled up celebrating, but then it pans to the goalie and he turns so I can read the back of his jersey. Yep. He's one of the best, the highest number of games won and most saves in a single game. I think he was drafted already. She looks to me like I might know. 
Yeah, nope. My hockey obsession is more a singular hockey player obsession. The rest of the second period goes by scoreless, but when the third begins, Josie and Olivia abandon their schoolwork, and I say goodbye to my family so I can sit and watch with my friends. Have you heard from him since they left? Josie asks. We texted back and forth this morning, but just about the game. I hope they win. Can you imagine? It'll be nuts. Josie squeaks with happiness. There goes what's left of our ice time, Olivia says. Josie laughs. Hey, I think we should continue to share. It's some serious motivation to land a jump when a group of hot hockey players are watching. It's been the best week of practice ever for me. I snort. I doubt Coach is going to find your reasoning solid. The final minute has us sitting shoulder to shoulder in front of Josie's laptop, holding hands. If they win, I have a great excuse to text Rhett later. Prescott has the puck. They pass it around, looking for opportunities. Valley uniforms are everywhere, trying to cover every inch to block any shot attempt. Still, Prescott manages to get it within a foot of the net. There are too many bodies in front of the goal to keep track of the puck. They hack at it, looking for an opening. I hold my breath as another shot's fired. This one gets by everyone but the goalie. He keeps his pad down on the ice, protecting it until the final buzzer sounds. They won! Josie screeches and bounces up and down, still clutching my hand. They did it! Oh my god! We jump around our room and squeal with happiness. I send Rhett a text before I talk myself out of it. Congratulations! This is crazy, Olivia says. I think I can hear people yelling outside. She moves to the window and we follow. Sure enough, people are screaming and dancing around in the grassy area outside of our dorm. Let's go down there! Josie rushes to the door. The hallway is filled with people who had the same idea. Outside, music is playing, and one guy even has his face painted blue and yellow. People are hugging and high-fiving as if they'd been the ones to win tonight. It's insane and absolutely amazing. I snap a couple of selfies with the chaos in the background and send those to Rhett, too. The mood mellows, but people hang around. Olivia eventually leaves to finish studying, and Josie and I take a seat on the grass with a hundred or more people wanting to enjoy this crazy moment together. This is incredible, I say, looking around the darkened campus. The glow of street lamps is the only light. It's a shame the hockey team missed this. I'm sure they went out to a bar or something. The bus doesn't come back until tomorrow morning. My stomach sinks as I imagine a drunk, charming ret pulling women into dirty bar bathrooms to celebrate. Still, it isn't the same. Isn't it? Girls and booze are interchangeable. I check my phone to see if he's texted back yet. He hasn't. Do you really think that Rhett believes that? I don't know, I admit. It would be easier if I did. And way less fun. She pulls her hair back into a low ponytail. I don't think he's this player you're making him out to be. Nothing I've heard about him backs it up. Seriously, I don't know a single person who was hooked up with him, and I've been asking around. You have? A smile tugs at my lips, partly in relief and partly because it's just like Josie to dig for dirt without my asking. I might have been poking for my own purposes. There are some seriously cute guys on the team that I needed more information on, but yes, I asked around. She shrugs. If he's hooking up with an endless stream of chicks, they're not talking about it. My phone pings, and I glance down to see Rhett's face in a sweaty selfie with Maverick. They must have taken it just after the game because I can see lockers in the background, and they're in a state of being half undressed. Their smiles are giant, though, and I feel a new surge of excitement for them. Laughing, I hold the screen out for Josie to see. Your smile is as big as his friend. No matter your reservations, you like him. You're right. I like him. I do. But I just hope he doesn't crush me. I think you have to go for it. If you do and he breaks your heart, then you've got me to pet your hair and tell you how wonderful you are. I snort laugh. I would. I would do whatever I had to until you were over him. But if you don't see where this could go, you'll regret it. And I can't fix that one so easily. 
Chapter 12 Sienna After my Tuesday afternoon yoga class leaves, I turn on my own music to do some fun poses and basically just play around a little before I go back to my dorm room. I place my hands on the floor and go up into a handstand. I'm upside down when he walks into the studio. I wobble and bring a leg down, then the other to stand upright. Hey, you made that look too easy. My stomach dips at the sight of Rhett. He's in his blue valley hockey t-shirt and jeans with a white Bruins hat low on his eyes. You're back. Got in about 20 minutes ago. You just missed yoga class. Thank God. He laughs softly. Are you teaching another one this afternoon? No, I was just messing around a little. Don't let me interrupt. He drops to the floor next to the wall and leans his back against it. Oh, no, you have to participate, or I'll feel awkward. He kicks off his shoes and goes up into a handstand. His shirt rides up, giving me a view of his chest and abs. He walks around the room on his hands, circling the entire perimeter before jumping back to his feet in front of me. Not bad, I think for a second. What about this one? I go into crow's pose and hold it for a few seconds. He looks apprehensive, so I come out of it. It isn't that hard. Oh, no, I'm not making that mistake again. I ate my words last time I had that thought about yoga. Squat on the mat. Reluctantly, he moves onto the mat and does as I requested. Little lower. His lips twist into a smirk, but he does it. Now put your hands onto the mat in front of you under your shoulders and spread out your fingers. I walk around him, checking out his form. Your knees should rest on your arms. Good. I crouch down beside him. Come up onto your toes and shift your weight. His forearms and biceps flex. Now what? If you can, shift your weight forward until your feet come off the floor. Don't jump or hop. It'll throw you off balance. I move in front of him and place my hands on his upper shoulders in case he falls forward. He gets up and holds it for a second. He lets out a whoop of excitement and then loses his balance and drops back into a squat. That was good for your first try. Give it another shot. I think I better keep my day job. He rests on the mat. Speaking of jobs, how'd your interview go? I sit in front of him and cross my legs. Good. Really good, actually. They sent an offer over this morning. No way. His mouth pulls into a wide smile. Congratulations. I missed so much in a day. Tell me everything. I chuckle. Um, well... It's the same company my dad works for in Appleton. It's a software company in the healthcare sector. Nice. I would be writing and editing sales materials, I think. The interview was kind of a blur. It's a good company, though. That's really awesome. Congratulations. Thanks. I haven't decided if I'm going to accept it. I probably will. I don't know. I haven't lined up any more interviews, so I most likely should. You don't sound very excited. Is there something else you'd rather do? No, that's kind of my problem. I keep waiting for something to come along that makes me as excited as I thought I would be when I was interviewing for jobs. They're all fine, and I think I'll be happy wherever I end up, but I don't feel that glee that everyone else seems to when they talk about their jobs after college. Are you excited about working for your parents? Yeah, he shrugs and leans back on his hands. I've worked there every summer since I was 16, though. We're quiet for a beat, and I realize I haven't congratulated him on the game in person. Oh my gosh, I'm the worst Valley fan ever. Congrats on the win and your assist. I move forward to hug him. He's warm and smells like laundry soap, and my pulse quickens being so close. Thanks. He smiles. I still can't believe it. Totally surreal. Campus was nuts last night. Everyone is so excited that the championship game is here. Us too. Adam and I stayed up half the night talking about it. We're so freaking pumped. Did you guys get to go out somewhere last night to celebrate? Coach took us out to dinner, and I think a few of the guys might have went down to the hotel bar when we got back. But most of us were too amped up thinking about the next game. I had this mental picture of you in some bar, shirtless, slopping beer around on unsuspecting women who then pulled you into the bathroom. He lifts a brow and then slowly sits forward until his face is inches from mine. You're the only girl I want to slop beer on.
he replies playfully and winks. Wow, I feel so special. I say the word sarcastically, but my stomach is filled with butterflies. What are you doing later? I'm not sure. Why? We're watching game film at five, but I was hoping we could hang out after. What did you have in mind? Anything you want. You could come over or anything. Come over, translation, spend the night kissing, and possibly more. Anything, huh? Uh-oh, why do I feel like I just unwillingly signed myself up for more brutal yoga or something equally humiliating? That all depends. How's your voice? Why are you torturing this poor man? Josie asks as we walk around Prickly Pear looking for a table. As soon as we walked in, Rhett went to grab drinks. He looks back and smiles at me from across the bar and my body tingles. I'm not torturing him. We haven't done this in ages. It'll be fun. We squeeze through another large group of people searching for somewhere to sit. I don't remember karaoke night being so packed. Uh, Sienna? Josie nudges me with an elbow and points to a sign that says, Speed Dating Event. Sign in at the bar. Oh, no. Rhett joins us with the drinks and an amused smirk. Is this your way of telling me you want to see other people? I thought it was karaoke night. I'm so sorry. We don't have to stay. Yes, we do, Josie says. Look at them. She waves a hand toward a large group of guys with name tags on their shirts. One of those guys could be my next boyfriend. Josie and I take our drinks from Rhett and thank him. Name tags are in my back pocket. He turns so I can see them sticking out of his denim-clad ass. He filled them out for us, and I admire his small, neat penmanship as I pull the sticky label off and attach it to my shirt. You're cool with this? Really? I move closer to him and drop my hand to his forearm. Yeah, it'll be fun. He cocks his head to the side. Or really awful, but either way we'll have stories. There are more guys than girls at the event. They sit the women in a line of chairs with about two feet of distance between us and a chair directly across where the guys take turns sitting with each of us for 15 minutes before the timer goes off and they move to the left. Because we're at a bar, they also have special add-ons. If a guy wants to keep talking to you, he can buy you a drink and earn an extra 15 minutes. And you have the chance to do a question and answer game where every correct answer about your partner earns even more time. I'm as nervous as I would be if it were a real first date when the first guy sits down in front of me. I glance down the line until I find Rhett a few chairs away. It occurs to me for the first time that while I might not be interested in chatting to these other guys, he might not be as opposed to getting to know some different girls, ones that don't drag him out for a night of karaoke-turned-speed dating because they're terrified of hooking up and having their hearts smashed into tiny pieces— He's the hottest guy here by a mile. He ditched the hat tonight, but still went with his usual jeans and a gray t-shirt. He flashes a smile in my direction, and then the first timer goes off for us to begin. Will, my first date, tells me about his job working for a small advertising firm. He's nice and sort of cute, but I'm only half listening. I keep letting my gaze slide to the left to see Rhett. He's paired up with a pretty blonde. She's sitting on the edge of her chair so their knees touch and has his hand in her lap. What was that? I ask Will. I'm pretty sure he asked me a question. He glances in the direction I was staring. I asked if you were seeing someone, but I think I got my answer. It's new. What about you? A couple of girls, nothing serious. How charming. How do you feel about threesomes? I giggle because I think he's joking. He isn't. After that, I stop pretending to be interested in Will, and I watch Rhett to see what's happening with his date. They're both laughing and talking, so I guess better than mine. Needless to say, Will does not buy me a drink or ask me to play the game so we can spend more time together. My next suitor is a graduate student at Valley named Chad. He's nice and doesn't ask me about threesomes. Who knew the bar was so low? I'm not feeling any sparks of attraction between us, but we're able to chat about classes and professors to kill the time. I'm antsy for my chance with Rhett. If chatting with other guys and seeing him with other girls has shown me anything, it's that I want to spend time with him. 
I don't know how far I'm willing to put myself out there, but I'm not ready to walk away. The next couple between me and Rat opts for more time, and the guy I walked into the bar with finally sits in front of me. He blows out a breath that makes his cheeks puff like a chipmunk. Having fun? He leans forward. I don't want to alarm you, but the woman sitting two chairs away from you is on house arrest, awaiting trial for a crime in which she cannot speak about. She lives next door. And the one who is cradling your hand? A palm reader. I'm going to live a long, healthy life. So you've had about the same luck I have, then. He reaches into his pocket and pulls out two crumpled pieces of paper. You got their numbers? I ask too loudly, and we get some side glances our direction. They weren't winners, but I am. I shake my head. Of course he got numbers. This is a fun date. He leans back and stretches out one of his legs, hooking his foot under my chair. You're just saying that because you got a pocket full of numbers as backup. Wait, you really think I'm going to call the lady who read my palm, or the one who can't go more than 150 feet from her home for the next three months? If not them, then maybe one of the others waiting to toss their digits at you? You're cute when you're jealous. He moves my chair closer to him with his foot. What's your go-to karaoke song? Like a prayer. He closes one eye and tips his head up to the ceiling like he's thinking. Madonna, I add. Do you have a karaoke song? No, when I sing, dogs howl. And still you came. I'll sing badly for you anytime. What do you want to hear? I was looking forward to hearing you belt out a love ballad. Maybe some Brian Adams. He smiles so big at me, and he has a fabulous smile. The kind that makes a girl want to hand out her phone number. Brian Adams. All right, good to know. I might need to study up on my 90s ballads. Ever brought a date to karaoke before? No, actually. You? I've been on a date that involved karaoke, but I'm pretty sure it was coincidental. He lifts a hand to get the moderator's attention. Everything going okay? She asks tentatively. So tentatively, I wonder what kind of interesting stories she might be able to tell about these speed dating events. I'd like to buy her a drink, whatever she wants. When she looks to me, I smile. Can I get a vodka and Sprite? Sure. And can we also do the question game? Rhett asks. Again, our moderator looks to me for confirmation, so I nod my agreement. She brings my drink and then hands us each a pad of paper and pencil. I'm going to ask you three questions about each other. I hope you were asking lots of good questions and getting to know one another because these are tricky. After each one, I'll ask you to show each other what you wrote. Each correct answer earns you one minute, which between the two of you could add up to a grand total of six. Rhett chuckles quietly. Ready? She looks to each of us. I sit tall in my seat like a good pupil. Ready. What is your date's favorite color? I laugh. Favorite color? Seriously? It's the most frequently asked first date question, she assures me, then adds, take a guess. Rhett holds the pad of paper up and scribbles something. I take a guess, blue, and we show our answers. Did either of you guess correctly? Rhett nods enthusiastically. Yep, love blue. It's my most favorite color ever. And pink is also my most favorite color. We share a secret smile. Two minutes, she says without looking at us. Next question. How many sexual partners has your date had? That cannot be a question people ask on a first date, I say. She looks down at me. It isn't, but it makes for really good bar conversation. I hesitate, but finally decide on a number. Rhett seems to have a lot easier time deciding what to write. Okay, let's see those answers. My stomach is in knots. I'm not sure I want to know the answer to this one. Before we can share, our moderator gets called to help someone else. I'll be right back, she says before hurrying off. Let's see, Rhett says, sitting forward. I turn the paper around and watch his expression as he sees the number. I went with 10, because it felt like a good round number, but I have no idea. Am I close? I don't need to know the real number, just let me know if I've got the right number of digits. He barks a laugh. You think it's possible my number has three digits? Like 100 or more? Yes. Heat creeps up my neck and face. What did you guess? Five, he shows me. 
The timer goes off and people move. Except neither of us do. Do you want to go sit at the bar? What about the speed dates? I think when you find the person you want to spend the rest of the night with, you're supposed to stop. He stands and holds out his hand. When we get to the bar, I set my drink down and Rhett orders another beer. And can I get a scrap of paper and a pen? Sure thing. The bartender gets the paper and pen first. Rhett scribbles something down and folds the paper and slides it to me. That's my real number. Look at it or don't, but I can't have you believing I've slept with a hundred chicks. He shakes his head. Where would I find the time? I steal myself for what I'm about to see, then unfold it and gasp. Really? He grins. Really? I, wow. Really? You're not fucking with me? His chest shakes with laughter. I'm 100% serious. But only one? I'm shocked. How is that possible? What about you? Do I get the real number? I tear off a piece of paper and write my number on it. Like he did, I slide it to him, but when his fingers reach for it, I don't let go. I don't care what the number is, Angel. I let go and bring my thumbnail between my teeth while he looks. I was close. He grasps my wrist and pulls it away from my mouth. Relax. Three is nothing to be embarrassed about. I'm not embarrassed. Not about my number, anyway. He takes a drink from his beer and waits for me to continue. It's just this whole time I've been worried that you're some big player, and I had it all wrong. Who's the player now? He teases. I'm sorry. You're forgiven. Just like that? Should I have made you sing me a love ballad? I relax, really relax, for maybe the first time I've ever been with him. Then his large palm stretches out on my thigh and all the nerves and butterflies are back. Because if he isn't a player, there isn't anything stopping me from letting him kiss me again. And maybe more. Chapter 13 Right. Adam knocks on my open bedroom door. House meeting in five. I look up from my phone. All right, but I'm not taking a shot every time I want to talk. House meetings around here tend to end with us solving very little and getting drunk instead. He snorts. I already warned Maverick the apartment is dry until after Friday's game. He lingers, leaning on the doorframe. Carrie? No. Though she's texted plenty, too. I'm texting Sienna. What's she up to? I don't know. I haven't said anything yet. Since we went out Tuesday night, I've been struggling to figure out what the next move is. Adam clicks his tongue. Maybe say, hi, how are you doing? What if she responds with K, then what? It's been a couple of days and I think I might have waited too long. Bring your phone, he says, pushing up to his full height. We'll tackle that after the meeting. We gather in the living room. Maverick always attends our house meetings, even though he doesn't live here. He's here as much as the rest of us, so it makes sense, even if it doesn't make sense. He's on the couch with Charlie next to him and a metal water bottle in his lap. That better be water, Adam says, sitting in the worn leather chair. I grab a chair from the dining room table and pull it into the living room. What's on the agenda, Cap? Heath asks. He and Mav bump fists. They give Adam a lot of shit for these house meetings, but they're usually, no, always, the cause of them. I want to make sure the guys are keeping straight until after tomorrow's game. I know everyone wants to party and celebrate, but we can't have anyone fucking around and getting hurt or showing up to practice hungover. Pretty sure Catch was still drunk this morning, Heath says. A few of the younger guys went out again last night and practiced this morning with shit. You'd think it wouldn't be such a struggle to stay sober for three freaking days, but it's exciting. And unlike us, the younger guys don't appreciate just how fucking rare it is to get this far. The vein in my buddy's head is popping, a sure sign he's stressed. Exactly, that shit can't fly. He still managed to block most of what we threw at him, Mav pipes up. Most, Adam emphasizes. He lives in the dorms, how are we supposed to make sure he doesn't drink, I ask. Glad you asked, Adam says. I'm inviting all the guys to stay here tonight. Here? Heath points with both hands to the floor. Mm-hmm. You want to have a fucking sleepover? Mav barks a laugh. I apologize for my language. Please strike the F word from the minutes. 
Heath pretends like he's scratching it out from an imaginary pad of paper. So noted. You're serious? I ask, trying to bring us back to the topic. The thought of our place sleeping even half the team makes my brain hurt. Some of the guys aren't going to like you fucking with their routines, Heath says, and we can't exactly enforce it. Like hell I can't. Nothing is getting in the way of us going to the Frozen Four. Nothing. None of us have spoken the phrase Frozen Four since we won the semifinal game Monday night. The Frozen Four is this end goal that we've all been silently working toward but don't talk about because we don't want to jinx it. Okay, I'm the first to agree. I trust Adam's instincts as our captain, and if he thinks this is the best thing, I'll support him. Where are we going to fit everyone? We have three apartments, if you include the girls. He nods toward Dakota and Reagan's apartment across the breezeway. I'll sleep there with a few other guys. They said we could use their living room. The rest will be here and at Mavericks. He shrugs. It'll be tight, but we'll make it work for a night. Fine, but Ginny's staying over tonight. It's my routine on home games. It's your routine every night, I add. Our rooms share a wall, so I'm well aware of his ritual of banging his girlfriend every night. She's his lucky rabbit's foot, and he rubs that shit every night. Just, Adam sighs, sneak her in before the guys get here. I don't want to hear them all bitching about how unfair it is that you get to shack up with your girlfriend and they don't. Heath smiles, fighting back a huge grin. Anyone else find it funny that this guy's telling me to sneak his sister into my room? He looks around to us. No one? Well, I think it's fucking hilarious. Or she could stay in her dorm if you prefer, Adam scowls. No, no, I'll sneak her in, he chuckles. This is turning out to be more fun than I thought already. Anything else? Mav asks. Uh, yeah. Adam glances to me. Rhett needs our help texting Sienna. He's overthinking it. I glare at him. When he said we'd tackle it, I thought he meant the two of us. Shouldn't you have loads of experience in the art of sexting after dating Carrie for six years, most of that long distance? This is different, Adam answers before I can. This is new relationship stuff. So, dick pics? Heath asks. I put my face in my hands. Fuck my life. No, not a dick pic. I just want to say hey and make plans with her sometime. I'd go with a dick pic. That says it all. Trust me. Heath grins. I think he enjoys saying shit like that just to get a rise out of Adam. But I wouldn't be surprised at all to learn Heath is sending photos of his junk to Ginny on the regular. Carrie wasn't into that. And I've thankfully never had to try to take a compelling picture of my dick to send to a girl. Nah, nah, I've got you, bro. Maverick stands, holding Charlie in his arms. He drops his dog on my lap. Hand me your phone. Charlie is a cool dog, super chill and pretty damn cute, too. But I'm not sure what he's going for when he says, Say, Charlie's the best dog in the whole world. Charlie's the best dog in the whole world, I repeat, and give his French bulldog a little rub behind her ears. Okay, never mind. That one didn't turn out. Just smile. Averick stands in front of me for a solid minute, taking photos until I can't smile any longer. Okay, what the fuck are we doing here? His thumb swipes across the screen. No, no, no. Maybe, no. Ha! Charlie looks scared of you in this one. No, no, no. Oh, what do we think? He shows the phone to Adam. My buddy shrugs. What's the plan? Send that to Sienna. Dog pics are far superior to dick pics. Well, I was feeling hopefully I had some master plan, but seriously? She isn't even my dog. So? He takes Charlie and tosses me the phone. I've tracked it. You're three times more likely to get laid sending that picture than one of your dick. Or I am, anyway. Maybe your dick is ugly, Heath says. Fuck off. My dick is beautiful. And don't pretend like you haven't seen it. Well, I haven't, so please don't show us. Adam holds up a hand. Then he looks to me. It's worth a shot. Charlie's a really fucking cute dog. I just send the pic? No explanation? Mav groans, takes my phone, taps something out, and hands it back. I didn't realize you needed me to do it all for you, Rothris. You're welcome. Oh, fuck. A pit forms in my stomach as I read the text he sent. Meet Charlie, Mav's dog. She likes to cuddle with me. And along with the text, he sent one of the pics. That's it? That's the magic? You didn't say anything about me wanting to hang out. My phone pings, and the guys all wait for me to read it. Aw, she's adorable. What are you doing later? Mav pumps his fist in the air. And that's how it's done, boys.
The team is less resistant than I expected about spending a night sleeping on our living room floor. Adam and Maverick go to the store to get groceries. Jenny showed up not long after our house meeting, and she and Heath haven't come out of his room since. I walk to the front door, phone to my ear. I'm here, she says. I think. All of these apartments look the same. I open the door as Sienna gets to the top of the landing. Coast still clear? She whispers. The team should be here in the next 30 minutes or so. I open my arms and she wraps hers around my waist. She's still in her workout gear from teaching yoga. Missed you. She laughs softly against my chest. Good. I sort of missed you too. My grin is wide and can't be helped. Sure you're up for this? Are you kidding? A night with the entire hockey team? I'd be stupid to pass that up. She winks and walks into the apartment. Who knew sneaking a girl in could be so much fun? We don't really need to sneak, not until the team gets here, but we head straight back to my room. There's something about trying to keep quiet that makes us both giggle as I shut my door and kiss her. I thought you said you needed to study. I brought my books. Later, I promise. I frame her face with my hands and back her up to the bed. She falls onto the mattress and I cover her. At this point, we've spent hours kissing and it's been awesome, but tonight I'm hoping she's ready for more. My dick kicks against my jeans. Every movement she makes below me makes me harder. Her hands slip under my t-shirt and roam over my back, pulling me down harder against her. Looks like we're of one mind. Remove clothes, get closer. I rear back and remove my t-shirt. Her green eyes darken as she checks me out. Taking her hands, I pull her up to a sitting position, take her mouth again, and inch her tank top up. She raises her arms, letting me bring it over her head. She smiles shyly as my gaze lowers. Her bra is hot pink, with a little bow right between her cleavage. I finger the delicate knot. I like this. I lean forward and press a kiss to her stomach, then hook my fingers around the clasp in the back. She shrugs out of it and tosses it to the floor. Like it even better now. I capture her mouth, swallowing the light laughter and bringing us back down to the mattress. I try not to rush this, savoring the top half of her before taking it to the next level, but Sienna grinds into my dick while she kisses me like she's been able to think of nothing else since we last saw each other. That would make two of us. No time like the present. I scoot down, trailing kisses along her stomach. Her leggings mold to her lean hips and stomach. I inch them down, adding more kisses along the top of her panties. Her hips lift as I settle between her legs. I slide one finger under the material, leaving goosebumps behind. Fuck, I don't think I've ever been so turned on in all my life as she threads her fingers through my hair, encouraging me to move lower. Hey, Adam's deep voice sounds as he walks into my room. Sienna yelps. I jump up in front of her, shielding her with my body, and Adam takes in the scene in front of him, then quickly turns to face the other direction, closing the door with him still inside. Don't worry, I didn't see anything. Get the hell out, man. Nice to see you again, Sienna. He's covering his eyes with a hand even as he faces the opposite way. Hey, Adam. Her voice is tight but filled with amusement. Dude, I say again. See, you took it upon yourself to sneak in a girl as well. Apparently not well enough when people walk in my damn room without knocking. Yeah, trust me, I'm as sorry as you. But, uh, we need you. Team meeting on the deck. He fumbles for the door, still covering his eyes, and exits. Sienna giggles and then slaps a hand over her mouth. I'm glad you find this funny, I say. My roommate may or may not have seen your boobs. She lifts a shoulder and lets it fall. That was my master plan. A whole house of hockey players and me, she grins. Should I go out there with you like this? Uh-uh, player. I crawl back on top of her. You're just mine tonight. Chapter 14 Sienna Isn't the team suspicious that you aren't out there with them? I ask Rhett later. He came back right after the team meeting and hasn't left since. We have a little picnic laid out on his bedroom floor with the food he managed to steal from the kitchen and the emergency snacks I keep in my purse. No, they won't even miss me. We've stopped bothering to whisper. The noise coming from the living room is so loud, there's no point. What's a typical Thursday night look like for you? I ask, crossing my legs and leaning forward. Not that different. Half-naked girls picnicking on your bedroom floor is the norm. Oh, yeah. He smiles and tosses an almond in his mouth, continuing while he chews. 
but usually they bring better food. Hey, if you don't appreciate my snacks, don't eat them. I swipe the bag of almonds from the middle and hold them close to my chest. His blue eyes twinkle as he smiles at me. What's a typical Thursday night for you? Not that different, I mock him, picnicking half naked with hockey boys. My phone lays at my feet, close enough where it can see the screen when it rings. Elias's name and face displays. I wave a hand toward it, as if to say, see, I'm a wanted woman. Rhett chuckles. Don't let me keep you from setting up plans for tomorrow. I'm sure he doesn't expect me to answer, but I do just that, bringing the phone close to my face and smiling sweetly. Hey there, honey. Honey. Elias's face twists in confusion. Okay, sugar bottom. What? I burst into laughter. Please don't tell me you call girls sugar bottom. Not any worse than honey, he grimaces. What's up? Where are you? I am with a boy. I turn the phone so Elias can see Rhett. The latter waves, looking uncertain. Rhett, this is my friend Elias. Oh, Elias coos and waves back. Hey, man, he lowers his voice. Why are you answering your phone? Go have sex. He shoes me with a hand. Rhett chuckles. My face warms. We're just hanging out, having a picnic. An all-you-can-eat buffet kind of thing. He raises his brows seductively. What? Ew, gross, Elias. I point the phone toward our snacks. No, real food. Mine sounds more fun. Well, I'm very sorry I answered now. Thanks a lot. I shake my head, sneak a look at Rhett, who's grinning. What's up? You've got one minute. Nothing. I was just calling to check in which means he was calling to tell me the latest in his disastrous dating life. All good here. You? Fine, fine. Have fun and text me in the morning to let me know you're good. Okay. Now hand the phone to Rick. Elias, I warn. Hand the phone over, sugar bottom, or I'll keep calling all night long. Reluctantly, I do, because Elias isn't one to threaten without following through. Hey, man. Rhett says casually, like this is a totally normal occurrence. Hey, what's up? Elias says in his smooth, charming voice. Listen, I'm going to need your address and phone number. Consider it a security deposit for hanging out with my girl. Rhett's brows lift, and he looks to me. I bury my face in my hands. Not like that, Elias says. She is into some sick, twisted shit. Oh my god. But she is my favorite person in the entire world, so please don't be offended when I tell you that if you hurt her, I will break you. I stifle a laugh as Rhett nods slowly. Elias is right around six feet, and I know he has to be strong for the lifts he does with Taylor, but Rhett probably has 20 pounds on him. Up close, though, I doubt Rhett can tell that. Got it, Rhett says. I'll have Sienna text you my number and address. Great. Thanks a lot, Ron. Rhett hands me the phone with a huge smirk on his face. Are you serious? I ask Elias. Absolutely, sugar bottom. Now go have some fun and don't die on me. He makes an X over his heart, winks, and then disappears as he hangs up. Seems nice, Rhett says with a laugh. He isn't, but I love him anyway. Does he go to Valley? No. I text Elias Rhett's address because I know he'll follow up if I don't. I leave off his phone number. He can call me. I don't need him having Rhett's number. God, I can't even imagine. He lives in Toronto right now, training. He's a skater, too. Pairs. I've actually never met him in person, but he's my best friend. Really? You've never met him in person? I shake my head. So you just know him through skating stuff online? Yeah, I've known him going on five years now, I think. It isn't the whole truth, but I don't want to get into another conversation about my heart condition. He's really talented and a total pain in my ass. I hold up my phone, and now he has your address. Sorry, but he really would have kept calling. It's cool. I've got backup. He motions toward the wall, where on the other side an entire team of hockey players is laughing and shouting. They are awfully loud for being sober. His phone rings, and we both laugh at another interruption. He doesn't make any move to get it. You can answer it if you need to. 
Nah, everyone I need to talk to is here. What did he mean by sick and twisted? I chuckle. I like to watch true crime documentaries. Elias is a big ol' scaredy cat. One side of Rhett's mouth pulls up into a smile. I have a question. I cross my legs in front of me. Shoot. How is it possible that you've only slept with one girl? Still not convinced? No, I believe you, but come on. You're hot, and I see the way girls are around you. And the way he kisses. Goosebumps dot my arm just thinking about it. I was in a relationship. Plus, hockey and school take up a lot of time. What about you? Boyfriends? Two. I hold up the coordinating number of fingers on my right hand. Both lasted only a few months, and like you, skating and school is where I focused. Look at us, we have something in common. He grins and straightens out his legs in front of him. My foot is asleep. I get to my feet and offer him both hands. Tugging, I manage to get him upright. I have bad news. What's that? He crowds my space, wrapping his arms around my lower back and pulling me flush against him. I have to pee. While Rhett stands in the hallway being my lookout, I dart across into the bathroom. I hurry and then open the door a crack when I'm done to let Rhett know I'm ready to run back across. Unfortunately, someone else needs to use the bathroom at that moment. You can't go in there, Rhett tells him. Why not? I gotta take a piss, the guy says. I'll be quick. Sorry, I called it. Rhett pushes into the bathroom and closes it behind him. Now what? I whisper. He shrugs. He'll give up and use the other one. Dude, you better not be taking a shit in there, the guy calls from outside the door. Are you sure about that? Rhett chuckles. His laughter tickles my neck as his mouth descends to my skin. Gonna be a while. Use the other one. What is it with you and bathrooms? I ask as he lifts me onto the vanity and steps between my legs. You're the one that ran in here. I start to defend myself, but when his mouth covers mine, the words die on my lips. His hands grip my legs and his hard bulge presses into my sensitive core. He works my leggings down and tosses them to the floor. I break the kiss, moaning as he rubs against me in a slow rhythm that has me not caring where we are. Did you lock the door this time? I don't open my eyes, but hear the click of the lock. Nothing is stopping me from getting you off. Long fingers slip under the satin material covering me, and one digit slips inside of me while the pad of his thumb circles my clit. His fingers stop, but before I can protest, he pulls me to the edge of the vanity, removes my panties, and lowers between my legs. The stone vanity is cold beneath my ass, but the heat of his mouth starts a fire inside of me. Someone knocks, and instead of answering, Rhett kicks the door and growls. I fling a hand against the mirror behind me. The other, I run through his messy hair while his mouth devours me. I let out a moan as the orgasm builds. You're so fucking tight. So fucking perfect. He rasps as I come. So fucking perfect. Chapter 15 Rhett. Sienna holds onto my arm as I stick my head out of the bathroom to make sure no one is in the hallway. Dragging her behind me, I shoot across to my room. We collapse onto my bed. Her hair hangs down past her shoulders, and her cheeks are pink from the orgasm I just delivered. I can still taste her on my tongue. That was fun, she muses. Fucking right it was. She climbs on top of me, and I think I see Jesus. There seems to be a problem. She wiggles her perky ass, grinding her lower body against mine. A strangled sound gets trapped in my throat. She slides off me and undoes my jeans. Her fingers move down onto my boxers and brush against the head of my cock. I'm going to last all of a nanosecond. She wets her lips like she might be considering using that luscious mouth on my cock. The thought alone is too much. I encourage her to use her hand by pumping up into her. A pleased smile touches her lips and she wraps her hand around the base of my dick. I lean over and capture her mouth while she jerks me. Hand jobs, not something I usually fantasize about. No offense to the women of the world offering them up, but if I want a handy, I can do it myself. Obviously, I won't turn one down, I'm not an idiot. But no one does it better than me. I've got years of on-the-job experience. 
Or so I thought. Sienna's got a tight hold on my cock and rubs against me, all while letting me mouthfuck her. And holy shit, it's a full-body handy. And I relinquish my hard-earned participation trophy to her as fireworks go off behind my eyelids and I shoot all over my stomach. I stare up at my ceiling, chest heaving. I'm not usually that quick on the draw. Mm-hmm. That's what they all say. I sit up and run a hand through my hair. Give me five and I'll prove it. She grins at me. Perfect pink lips that curve up, split to show her teeth. Oh, no. You told me you needed to study and it's getting late. I groan. I did say that, didn't I? She bounds off my bed to get her backpack. Her ass mocks me in those tight leggings. I clean myself up and then join her. With all the traveling for hockey, school has been a struggle this semester, and it's not going to get easier. Seems pointless when I already have a job. Want me to quiz you or something? She offers when I flip open my textbook. Maybe. What's in it for me? A good grade. Eh. I run my hand along the delicate line of her neck. How about every question I get right, you remove an article of clothing? Her pulse thrums under my touch, and she nods. Okay. Seems a lot less pointless now. The next morning, I wake up with an angel wrapped around me and the bells from hell trying to pull me from sleep. Sienna nudges me. Your alarm is going off. I tighten my grip around her. I know. Five more minutes. Laughing, she tries to pull away. But I've got a death grip on her. Last night was amazing, and I don't want it to end. The basketball shorts I'm wearing are doing little to conceal that. How much time do we have? She presses her tits into my chest. She really likes rubbing up on my chest, and I am into it. Not enough, sadly. I can already hear the guys out in the living room waking and moving around. We have a light skate this morning, and Sienna has practice. We both have to get going. Reluctantly, I reach over to grab my phone and silence the alarm. We're in a post-awesome night-together haze until the screen comes to life, showing I've missed 13 calls from Carrie. Thirteen? What the fuck? Sienna is silent, but she buries her head in my chest, and I know she's seen it. Everything okay? She asks tentatively. I toss the phone to the end of the bed. Everything's great. We get up and get dressed without another word. Fuck. I don't know what to do about Carrie, but more importantly, I really don't want things between me and Sienna to end on an awkward note. Once we're ready to go, I pick her up, pin her against the wall, and kiss her until she's breathless and giggling and there isn't any weird tension between us. What was that for? For luck. Are you coming to the game tonight? Yeah, definitely. Hang after we win? She nods. Cool. I pick up my bag and then take hers, too. Ready? Don't I need to wait until everyone leaves? No, nah, no reason to sneak out. It's too late for them to do anything about it now. Heath was right. Sneaking around is fun. But watching my teammates glare at me with jealous eyes? That's fucking awesome. The crowd at our home arena is pumped. With this many people watching, it puts a little extra juice in every movement I make. So does spotting Sienna in the student section wearing blue and yellow with a little roadrunner painted on one side of her face. I wink as I skate by. She smiles big and keeps clapping with the rest of the arena. Adam makes his rounds during warm-ups, getting us all in the right headspace. When he falls in beside me, I'm already there. Has this place ever been this loud? I do another quick scan, taking in all the filled seats. I can't believe we made it here. The championship game. So close to the Frozen Four, I can taste it. Definitely not. We each take a shot on goal and skate back toward the bench. You good? He asks. I knew that was coming. He's asked me so many times in the past month, it's laughable. This time, before I can answer, he adds, You look good. I'm fucking fantastic. I glance once more at Sienna before I step off the ice. Let's do this. The adrenaline of playing in front of our hometown crowd gets us an early lead, but even up by two, the threat of being knocked out keeps us working hard to prevent Southern U from scoring. Coming onto the ice for the start of the third period, we're tired, but the entire arena gets to their feet, and it's easy to push it aside with so many people cheering us on. We're so close. I look to Adam before the puck drops. Like me, this is it for him. We lose and our hockey careers are over. The hard set of his jaw tells me he doesn't want to go out like that, especially not here in front of our home crowd. Southern is physical in the final period. Desperation makes them meaner and tougher. 
I think that motherfucker bit me, Heath says after an SU jersey gets a penalty for holding. They know they're done. Let's put the nail in the coffin, Maverick says as we set for the power play. Everyone in the arena is back on their feet. It's so loud I can't even hear Coach yelling from the bench. Doesn't matter, we've got this. It's a game of cat and mouse as we pass the puck around, firing shots, grabbing rebounds, and taking turns hacking away at their goalie. They aren't going down easily, I'll give Southern that. But they're worried about Heath scoring on them and giving me room to work. Maverick moves toward Heath, just like they expect. His eyes never leave Heath as he shoots the puck to me, and I get a clear look through the five hole as SU's goalie shifts to reposition himself. The goal post lights up seconds before the final buzzer sounds. Three beer limit, boys, Adam says, tossing cold cans from a cooler in the back of his Jeep. In two days, we traveled to Icarus State for regionals, but we couldn't not celebrate our win tonight. The basement of Sigma is jam-packed. It feels like everyone from the arena followed us. Sienna's supposed to meet me here, but I can't see shit over the crowd of people. Ginny, Reagan, and Dakota are with us as we push through the dark room. So were a few other girls that came with Jordan and Liam. I didn't catch their names, but for some reason they all have a vested interest in helping me find Sienna. Is that her? One of them asks, standing on her tiptoes and pointing to a girl that looks nothing like Sienna. Which is what I tell them. Brown hair and green eyes aren't a lot to go on. She holds on to Jordan's arm and tries to make herself taller. You forgot gorgeous, Maverick says, elbowing me and mocking my earlier description. I could give two fucks less. I stand by my description. There she is. Adam, the tallest of the group, points to the far right side of the basement where a group of people are playing flip cup. Sienna and Josie stand off to the side. I start toward her, circling around the middle where people are dancing. She doesn't see me until I get within spitting distance. Hey! Her smile widens and she steps forward, tossing her arms around my neck. You won! Congratulations! Thanks. She pulls back and I slip a finger through one of the loops on her denim shorts. They're really fucking short and her toned legs are going to be a real welcome distraction. She has a mixed drink in her hand and takes a sip, smiling. I think it's the first time I've ever seen her cup half empty. Getting lit tonight. You scored the game-winning goal. We have to celebrate. I know. I was there. Josie steps forward to speak over the music. Congratulations. Thanks. My friends step up behind me, finally making their way through the party. I introduce everyone and we make one big circle. Huh. I think this is the first time I've ever been out with my friends at a party with a girl. When Carrie visited, we usually kept to ourselves. This is nice. Since we're taking it easy, we mostly stick to our circle. Talking, hanging out, enjoying the night. My buddy's girls are all about Sienna and her friends. Two more skaters have joined us and they're all talking and laughing. Stealing her, Dakota says to me. We need her more than you. I highly doubt that. Sienna winks as they tug her away from me. I found the downside of your girlfriends, I say, when it's just the guys. Yeah, they tend to move in a pack. Don't worry. Adam tosses his arm around my shoulder. They'll be back. And come back she does, fifteen minutes later, arm in arm with Dakota and Josie. Sienna's laughing and her cheeks are flushed. I'm still milking my first beer. Giggling, she shimmies in front of me. Her phone in the front pocket of her shorts falls out onto the ground. I pick it up and inspect for damage before I hand it back. You are the biggest lightweight. My pockets are so small it keeps falling out. I've got you. I tuck it into my pocket. Thank you. She kisses me on the mouth, tasting like beer and wintergreen gum. I don't think she's drunk, but she's definitely feeling it. A new song comes on and she tosses her hands over her head. Oh my gosh, I love this song. Maverick bounces in place. Hell yeah. Come on, let's dance. Sienna takes my hand and pulls. Ginny and Heath are already moving that direction and Adam and Reagan are sort of sway-hugging to the beat. I stay glued to the spot. I don't dance. Lies, you were dancing the other night. Would we call that dancing? Mav asks with a grin. We wouldn't, actually. I was standing there and girls were dancing around me. Not exactly the same thing. I say as much. She closes the space between us, pressing her body to mine. All you have to do is stand there and I'll make you look good. Chapter 16 Sienna There's a long list of things I rarely do because of my heart condition. 
It isn't that I can't drink or do those other things on the list, but with so many things out of my control, I do the things I can to take care of myself. So Rhett is correct when he calls me a lightweight for the second time as we make our way to the dance floor and I stumble over my own feet. I've had three beers and I'm definitely feeling it. He holds me upright as we join his friends in the middle of Sigma's basement. Looking uncertain, he keeps his hands at my waist as I dance in front of him. He's just standing in place, but he makes it look good. Ripped jeans and a plain black t-shirt set off the blonde of his hair and those steely blue eyes. I took a lot of dance lessons growing up, but those mostly only get showcased on the ice. Without my skates, I've never felt that same confidence. But the way he stares at me like I'm this amazing, beautiful creature he can't believe he's with gives me the boost I need to cut loose. The alcohol is also probably helping. Olivia and Josie are still with us, squealing as they get right in the middle of the circle we've formed. Rhett's friends are nice, and they've been so welcoming to me and my friends. Speaking of his friends, Jenny dances behind me, rubbing her butt against me playfully. I turn so my back is to Rhett while I dance with her. You're a good dancer, she yells over the music. Rhett's hands rest low on my hips. Thanks, you too. I smile at her. I like Jenny. She's sweet. Her blonde hair whips around her shoulders as she moves. Her boyfriend Heath is like Rhett, standing behind her, not really dancing. Dakota, the only single one, I think, moves between us all as she dances, hands over her head. She has the kind of confidence that makes her fun to watch on the dance floor, regardless of if she has any skill or not. She does, though. Her cropped shirt lifts with each movement, grazing the bottom of her bra, Red, the same color as her hair. Josie joins her, and they are the center of attention. Rightfully so, she is a great dancer, and she's stunning with her light blue hair. Their ability to let go and live in the moment pushes me to be bolder. I swivel around and smile at Rhett, then dance backward toward Josie and Dakota. They welcome me by opening up to let me move between them. They grin and cheer me on as I dance in the middle of the circle, giving it everything I have and just having fun. When the music changes and I glance over at Rhett, his eyes flash with heat that makes my already accelerated heart rate speed up and my chest tighten. Holy shit, Sienna! Dakota steps in front of me, blocking Rhett from my view. You're amazing! Thanks. I gulp in air. This basement is hot, and the alcohol and dance workout I did makes my skin sticky. I lift my hair and fan my neck. I'm gonna sit the next one out. She's going to sit several out. Rhett appears beside me. His strong arms circle my waist, and he lifts me up, carrying me away from the group. What are you doing? I squeak and giggle in surprise as he moves through the basement toward the stairs. He doesn't answer or set me down until we're upstairs. Pinning me against the wall, one hand at my waist, the other on the wall above my head, he captures my mouth in a bruising kiss. I forgot I asked him a question until he pulls back and says, I needed to do that. You ready to go? We can stay longer, of course, if you want to keep dancing, but I have all kinds of things I want to do to you right now. Like, I ask, breathless and my sex clenching at his words. His mouth opens, he pauses, and then shakes his head. I can't come up with a nice way to say I want to fuck you into next week. He holds his hand out to me. What'll it be, Angel? Who needs nice? I think I've had enough dancing. We catch a sober ride to Rhett's apartment. It's quiet. Everyone else is still at the party, but we don't turn on a single light as we kiss our way through the living room, down the hallway, and finally into his bedroom. His phone rings. The screen lights up his pocket in the darkness. You're ringing, I say, not removing my lips from his. No, you are. He takes my phone out of his pocket and hands it to me. It's Elias. Shit, I know he's checking in on me. I texted him a picture of me drinking with the girls, and like the overprotective brother type he is, he's going to worry until I assure him I'm fine. Just give me one second. I answer, not moving away from Rhett. Hey. Hey, I'm headed to bed. Everything okay? Yes, I'm fine. With Roy? 
Mm-hmm. I press my lips to the man in front of me. Okay, be good-ish. Call me tomorrow. Bye. I slip the phone into my pocket. Sorry about that. He worries. Rhett's brow furrows. About you being with me? No, it isn't that. I shake my head. He knew I was out drinking. He waits for me to elaborate. Elias has the same heart condition I do. So when one of us does something that puts us more at risk, we get a little protective. He nods slowly like he's finally piecing it together. His hands slide under my shirt and lazily stroke my skin. Now that we're not in a frenzied lip lock, I'm nervous. I like Rhett. He's different than I expected. Nice, fun, stupid hot. Speaking of stupid, hooking up with him might be just that. I no longer think he's a player, but that doesn't mean this won't still end in heartbreak. We messed around a bunch last night, but tonight feels different. Sex is imminent, and I know myself well enough to know that taking it to the next level will only increase my feelings for him. And are you okay? He asks, sliding one of those hands up my back, sending a shiver up my spine. I'm perfect. Wrapping my arms around his neck, I jump into his strong arms and kiss him to show him just how okay I am. Josie is right. The regret of not knowing would be worse than any disaster that's heading my way. He lays me down on his bed, kicks off his shoes, and pulls his t-shirt over his head. I move to kneel on the mattress in front of him and undo his jeans. God, he has a great body. Anticipation and excitement make my fingers move fast, but Rhett's jeans are a real challenge to get over his legs. He chuckles, helping me, and then I'm eye-level with a serious bulge, covered only by black boxer briefs. He stands there, unmoving, as I inch them down. His dick springs free. I hesitate, swallowing. He's long and thick. A bead of pre-cum leaks from the tip. It's so pretty. His chest puffs out before the sound of his laugh fills the room. Pretty? <laughs> mm-hmm. I run a hand along the V of his hip. Are you going to tell me it's handsome or some other masculine term? Hell no. His voice is gruff and his ab muscles contract as I glide my hand south. You keep staring at it like that and you can use whatever adjective you like. Besides, girls like pretty things. That we do. As I bring my mouth to the head of his cock, I suddenly wish I were more of a drinker, because some liquid courage would be great about now. I'm all sobered up and second-guessing every movement. Oh, fuck. His words are deep and throaty. His fingers thread through my hair, and then one hand grips my neck, pulling me off his dick and guiding my face up until he slams his mouth down over mine in another crushing kiss. Guiding me with that big hand at my neck and another snaked around my waist, he forces me onto my back. He's muscular, but lean, and watching his body move over me is the sexiest thing. His hand stays at my neck as he kisses his way up my stomach, stopping to bite each nipple, and then slanting his mouth over mine in the most tender way that I'm not expecting. I shift my hips under him, grinding up into his dick. He groans, and the grip on my neck tightens. One second. He shifts to open a drawer on his nightstand, grabs a condom, and covers himself. At first, I think it's light from the window shining in, but when he positions himself at my entrance, I giggle at the neon yellow color of his dick. It looks like a banana. Glow in the dark, baby. Afraid I wouldn't be able to find it, I tease. The thick head of his cock pushes in an inch, and I suck in a breath. A wicked grin pulls at his lips as he pulls out that delicious inch. Sitting on the bed, he pulls me up and onto his lap. He lowers me slowly down onto him. His penetrating gaze is millimeters from mine, and he catches every whimper and moan as he fucks me. His fingers tangle in my hair, pulling my head back so he can suck on my neck, all while he pumps my body down onto his over and over. When my breaths come quicker, he grips both of my hips to increase the pace and angles my body backward so he can kiss and suck my boobs. I detonate in his arms. He's doing all the work anyway, but I'm a rag doll as my climax goes on so long it blends with his moments later. 
My heart flutters, and I lean forward and rest my head on his shoulder. He's still buried inside of me, and he wraps his arms around my waist and brushes my hair away from my face so he can place a kiss on my forehead. And his heart hammers against me in perfect rhythm. I fight a yawn as we get ready for bed. I finger brush my hair, and Rhett gives me a t-shirt to sleep in. Green, he says as he snuggles up behind me. What? I fight my eyes to keep them open. At the bar, you guessed my favorite color was blue. But it's green. Mine is blue. I wonder what the third question was. I don't know. I want to know you, he says quietly. All the things. I'm smiling when I fall asleep. It doesn't take long. Exhaustion pulls me under, and I can't remember ever being so content. I'm woken by a phone ringing. My first instinct is something is wrong with Elias, but this time it's Rhett's phone ringing. I nudge him. Your phone's ringing. Hmm? I nudge him again. Without opening his eyes, he feels around for his phone and then brings it to his ear. Hello? A feminine voice replies, zapping me from my happy, sleepy place. His eyes open and he sits up. He brings the phone away to look at the screen, then jams it back to his ear. What the hell, Carrie? It's three o'clock in the morning. I roll onto my back while he continues to talk to Carrie on the other end. My brain buzzes with possibilities, none of them good. Thirteen missed calls last night, and now this? I've zoned out, stewing in awful thoughts, until his deep voice, still thick with sleep, mutters a string of curses. I'm so sorry. I was half asleep, and I didn't realize who it was. Is everything okay? Yeah, it was nothing. I wait for him to say more, but like this morning, he doesn't seem to want to talk about it. He pulls me into his arms with a heavy sigh, and neither of us speaks again. I don't sleep well the rest of the night. When it's finally light outside, I creep from the bed and get dressed, then request an Uber. You're leaving? He sits up and runs a hand through his bed head. Yeah, I have practice this morning. He glances at the window to the early morning sky and then raises a brow. Pulling on my shirt, I kneel on the end of the bed. I didn't sleep, I admit. What's going on with the phone calls? He sits up. It's my ex, Carrie. She won't stop calling. I have a thousand questions. Why? What does she want? I'm not even sure anymore. It's been almost a month since we broke up, and she's blowing up my phone at the most inopportune times. Oh. I don't know why I assumed he'd been single longer, but knowing he was with someone just a month ago, someone who cares so much for him she still calls in the middle of the night, makes me uneasy. It's over, he says, and I'm sorry that I answered. I wasn't thinking. His arms circle my waist. Don't leave. I really do need to practice. He bobs his head slowly. Okay. Hang later. I hesitate. I'll text you. Chapter 17 Rhett Look who it is, Adam smirks from the kitchen when I finally get out of bed. Sienna had to leave for practice, but I went back to bed after she left to catch up on the sleep I didn't get last night. I grab a Powerade from the fridge and fall onto a stool at the counter. Heard you had a good time last night. I did. I take a long drink. Wait, who did you hear that from? You. I literally heard it. We all did. He waves the spoon in his hand around and points to a giant box of condoms I somehow didn't see when I sat down. Mav dropped that off for you. Fucking nosy roommates. I shake my head and chuckle as I pick up the box of glow-in-the-dark condoms. Does Mav just have these in bulk or what? Never mind, I don't want to know. Not sure I'm going to need them, though. I run a hand through my hair, pushing the long strands out of my face. What happened? Carrie, I grumble. She called a dozen times last night. Nothing ruins the moment quite like your ex obsessively blowing up your phone at three o'clock in the morning. Chick is relentless. No kidding. I don't know what to do. Talking didn't work. Ignoring obviously isn't working either. Sienna took off as soon as it was daylight. That sucks, 
I'm sorry. Still no to the blocking or number? That just feels wrong. You could always change your number. He smirks and goes back to stirring his oatmeal. Yeah, maybe. I stand, taking the power aid and condoms to my room. We have the day off practice, but a meeting with Coach to talk about our next game. We play the Ice Bombers at Regionals, another do-or-die game. Saturday night, when we get back to the apartment and Sienna still hasn't texted, I know she's avoiding me. Fuck, how did things with Carrie get so out of control? We've talked so many times about the breakup, hashing it out again seems pointless. I call Carrie, and while I wait for her to answer, I pace my room. Part of me hopes she doesn't answer, but if she doesn't, then I'm just delaying the conversation. Something has to give. I can't keep going like this. I want to move on. I want her to move on. Right. She answers after the third ring with a chipper tone that I didn't hear a lot of the last few months we were together. Hey, Carrie, you have a few minutes to talk. I answered the phone, didn't I? She laughs softly. Congrats on your game. I'm sorry I called so late. I went out with some friends and didn't realize what time it was when we got in. It isn't just that you called so late. I screw my eyes closed. You can't keep calling. She's quiet, and I feel like an asshole. We broke up, I add. This isn't healthy for either of us. I miss you, her voice softens. Don't you miss me? I miss the routine of it sometimes, but do I miss her? No, at least not the same way she misses me. It brings me no pleasure to be the one shutting her down. We can't keep doing this. We agreed that it was best to give each other space. Well, I don't agree anymore. I want to talk to you and tell you about my day. You are my best friend. She's crying, and fuck, that guts me. I think we should get back together. You don't mean that. You are miserable. We both were. Things were busy. I got overwhelmed. I took you for granted. I won't do that again. Carrie, I'm always going to care about you, but that isn't what I want. I don't think it's really what you want either. She sniffles. Neither of us can move on if we're holding onto the past. I know. I sit on my bed and hang my head. Are we good? I will try to call less, but I'm not giving up on us. I let out an exasperated sigh away from the phone. We talk a few minutes longer and I get off the phone not feeling any better about the situation than I did when I called her, but at least I've said what I needed to. I give Sienna the rest of Saturday, but she doesn't text. First thing Sunday morning, I head to the rink. If I know Sienna, she is already here, even though their practice isn't for a few hours. I'm not the least bit surprised when I spot her skating around the ice looking graceful and strong. I change into my skates and then hang off to the side watching her as she runs through her program. Chin held high, cheeks red from the chill of the ice, resolve and confidence radiates from her. She's stunning. This can't be over. I step onto the ice as she's coming around. She slows and stops in front of me. What are you doing here? She asks, smiling, chest rising and falling as she catches her breath. She glances down at her watch, something I've noticed she does a lot to check her heart rate. I shrug her shoulder. Might have missed you. In the 24 hours since I saw you last? Absolutely. She laughs lightly and skates over to grab her water. I'm sorry about yesterday. Red, I'm not mad at you. I get it. But you ran off at the ass crack of dawn with some vague bullshit about texting me later, then you didn't. You don't want to keep hanging out? I like you. I've had so much fun this past week, but I don't think I'm capable of being a rebound. I push off and go to her. You're not a rebound. Carrie and I are over. We've been over. It's been a long time since I felt the way I do right now. Which is? She smirks. She's fishing, but that's fine. About to get yourself a whale, girl. I like you. I tip her chin up with a hand and lean in, lower my voice. A lot. She lets me brush my mouth over hers, but then she shoves off from my chest, skating backward. Prove it. I arch her brow up and follow her to the center of the ice. Here? Yep, I'll skate you for it. How exactly is that going to prove I like you? Don't tell me you're scared. Is she serious? Maybe you weren't paying attention at the game the other night, but I'm pretty fast. Oh, I was paying attention. She runs a hand up my chest, seductively, and then circles around me. You in? Absolutely, Angel. 
few things I wouldn't agree to right now. We go to the goal line and I yawn, aching her on. In reality, blood is pumping through my veins. I love competing, and if it means winning more time with her, sign me up. Are you sure you don't want to warm up? I'll be fine. I roll my head side to side and lean forward slightly. Say when, Angel. She huffs a laugh, adjusts her headband, and focuses forward. When? I let her push off first. I have no intention of letting her beat me, but she's a damn sight as she speeds off from me. She glances over her shoulder, brown ponytail blowing around her face to see why I haven't moved yet. That's my cue. She's fast, but I'm faster. I reach her in a flash, then slow down so we're skating side by side. Her tongue peeks out and she pumps her arms faster. I pull ahead as we reach the goal line at the opposite end and stop. I sprang for my skates. Again, she says before she's even stopped. You think that was beginner's luck? Backward this time. She turns, arches a brow, silently daring me. I have a better idea. I cross my arms over my chest. I'm listening. She stands tall. God damn, she's beautiful, all determined and competitive. I'll skate your routine. She laughs. When I don't join her, she says, You're serious? Completely. You don't know my routine? If you're so sure of that, then it should be an easy bet for you to take. She conks her head to the side and narrows her gaze. If I can skate your entire short program, then you have to give us a real chance, deal? I can see her contemplating it in the second she gives in. Okay. I grin. But if you fall on any of the jumps, then it's an automatic disqualification. I won't fall. So sure of yourself. This should be entertaining. She skates away from me, steps off the ice, and leans against the wall. Want music? Yeah, turn it up. That way she can't hear the swear words I'll likely be muttering as I do jumps and leaps I haven't attempted in years. Now that this is happening, my nerves kick in. I've watched her skate a lot, little glances while we're practicing, and a couple of times we've gone early together and she's let me be her personal cheering section. I'm perfectly capable of skating her routine. Not well, mind you, but I'm 95% sure I can stay on my feet. You don't grow up with parents who teach figure skating and not think to yourself, hey, I'm gonna try that shit. Or I didn't, anyway. Sometimes out of boredom and sometimes trying to impress girls. It didn't work then, at least on the impressing girls part, but I'm hoping to change that today. Her routine starts staring down at the ice and then a whip of the head as the music starts. I glance over at a smug-looking sienna when the music begins, and then it's go time. She's graceful, which I'm not, and her program includes a lot of waving arms and fancy footwork that I'm sure look ridiculous with my choppy movements. But I can only focus on remembering the choreography and not acing it. And staying upright, I almost bite it on the first jump, catching myself in the nick of time. The next jump is the one I'm worried about, and it's coming up fast. I say a silent prayer to anyone who might be listening, then give it my best. I chuckle as I magically land it. I throw my hands overhead and then go into the spin. After that, it's cake. The only thing I can't manage is grabbing my skate behind my head, but I hold one foot up, imitating it the best I can, and then fist bump to the roaring applause I'm expecting. When I glance back at Sienna, she's not alone. My buddies, dressed in their workout gear, watch with expressions ranging from amusement to confusion. What the fuck was that? Jordan asks, brows raised. That shit's going viral, Maverick says, holding his phone up, probably recording me. I ignore all of them and focus on Sienna. Her expression gives nothing away as she skates out to me. You jacked up the choreography and your jumps are shit, but that was damn impressive. That thrill of success shoots through me. My parents own a skating camp, remember? Mm-hmm. She's still staring at me through a narrowed gaze. How do you know my routine so well? The same reason I'm sure this isn't a rebound. You're delusional? A hint of a smile appears, and I know I've won her over. This isn't over, not by a long shot. Yeah, probably that, too. I grip her waist hard enough she can't skate away from me like she's so prone to do. You're under my skin. She doesn't comment, but relents by leaning into me. Rothris, ready to watch some hockey, or are you switching sports? Heath calls. Coming, I yell, not looking away from Sienna. And what time are you coming over later? I wink, drop a kiss to her mouth, and skate backward away from her slowly, waiting for an answer. 
Seven. I have to finish slides for a presentation next week and take a nap. Awesome. A grin tugs up the corners of my mouth. I'm cheesing hard and I'm never going to live this down from the guys. But I don't even care. Chapter 18 Sienna Thursday evening, I go to Rhett's apartment. It's a busy week for the both of us, trying to manage classes, practice, and spending every free second together. Tonight is the last night we'll be able to hang for a few days. Tomorrow, I head off to Phoenix for a competition, and before I get back, he leaves for regionals. I have news, I say, while we work on school stuff. He's sprawled out on his side, studying management policies, and I'm sitting in the middle of the bed with my laptop, rereading the acceptance email I just sent. I accepted the job with Dalton. Really? Congrats. So you'll be in Appleton? Yeah. It doesn't feel real. I'm not as excited as I thought I'd be, but I know it's a good job, and it's the best starting salary that I've been offered by far. Awesome. We'll only be a few hours apart. Five. Yes, I already checked. His bedroom door is open and Maverick steps in. Sardines? I make a face of disgust. Yuck. No, thank you. Not the food. The game. Rhett clarifies. It's like hide and seek, but you have to squeeze into the space once you find people. Oh, yeah, I've played. We do it on campus, and it's awesome. Mav sing songs the last word. We don't have to play, Rhett says, but his knee bounces, and he's already got one foot on the floor. It's fine, I could use some fresh air anyway. On the walk to campus, Dakota slips her arm through mine and tugs me toward her. We're stealing her, she says. Get your own. Rhett tries to yank me back, but Dakota's quicker, and she's strong, too. She whips me away, leaving Rhett gawking after us. No, this isn't happening. You guys have forced me to hang out with you and your boyfriends and girlfriends. Hell, I even had to pair up with those two. He points to Adam and Reagan. I finally brought a girl, and I want to hide with her. Correction, he wants to make out with her in the dark, Heath says. That too, Rhett gives me puppy dog eyes. You kept her in your room all evening, and now it's our turn. Dakota smiles smugly at him. Boys against girls. Go hide. We'll even give you a few extra minutes. She's biting back that smile now and mutters, you're going to need it. The guys perk up at that. We get to hide? Rhett asks. Unless you're worried, Dakota challenges. Mav scoffs. Rhett rubs his hands together. They start off, already scheming where to hide. Remember the rules, Ginny calls after them. No going inside or on top of buildings. They don't answer, but she laughs and shakes her head. What are the odds that someone gets hurt? Adam will guarantee that doesn't happen, Reagan says. He's done nothing but stress over it all week. Sounds like my brother, she tilts her head, and her hand goes to the end of one blonde braid. You know, he's a pretty decent human sometimes. How long until we go find them, I ask. They've wandered off far enough I can no longer hear them talking. We usually wait around five minutes, Reagan says. She's nice, beautiful too. She has these dimples that I can't stop staring at. I have no intention of finding them. Dakota lowers herself to the ground and sits with her legs crossed. What? Jenny's laughter tinkles out into the night, but she sits beside her friend. Reagan shrugs, and we join them, sitting on the grass in the middle of campus. Dakota pulls out her phone and starts some music before answering. It was the only way I could get you three away from your men. They've been very clingy this week. Reagan sticks out her lower lip and leans her head on Dakota's shoulder. It's true, Jenny says. Heath sat in the bathroom today while I shaved my legs because he wanted to, she raises her hands and makes quotes, spend more time together. Anything not to think about the game, Dakota says. Not Adam. It's all he's thinking about, Reagan says. He watched game film all night long. All night. When I woke up for class this morning, his laptop was sitting on his stomach and he was passed out. Dakota snorts. 
They're all acting so crazy. The only one that seems normal this week is Maverick. He's his same ridiculous self. Reagan looks to me. How's Rat handling it? Oh, I glance around the circle. He seems fine. I don't think I know him well enough to know the difference yet. He's the most competitive one out of all of them, Jenny says, so it doesn't surprise me that he's handling the pressure well. And he's distracted by this one. Dakota nudges my foot with hers. I've never seen him smile so much. What? I can feel my face getting warm. No, that can't be right. Jenny nods. It's true. I mean, things are great, and we're spending a lot of time together, but it's still new. I'm happy for him, Reagan says. After the way Carrie treated him, he deserves someone amazing like you. Why? How did Carrie treat him? Aside from calling Rhett constantly, I don't know much about her. None of them speaks at first. We don't really know anything about her either, Reagan says. She only visited a couple of times, and she didn't make any attempt to get to know us. It was more of the way he was with her. Rhett spent 99% of his time on the phone with her. He always had to check in, even if we were out doing things. I've never done the long distance thing, so maybe that's normal. He was a really good boyfriend. Ginny speaks up for him with a reassuring smile like she's trying to convince me. You don't need to sell me on him. He's great. Trying to take the heat off me and Rhett, I look to the single one of the group, Dakota. So, Ginny and Heath, Reagan and Adam, and you and Maverick? No. Dakota's red hair catches the moonlight as she shakes her head. I'm forever single. Why forever? Reagan leans forward and holds a hand up to her face, then whispers loud enough for everyone to hear. This one is super picky. Dakota smacks her arm playfully. They're called standards. Reagan laughs and sits back. What about you? Have you dated a lot of people before, Rhett? No, not really. A couple of guys, but nothing serious. Why not? Jenny asks with a disbelieving arch to her brow. What she means is, you're hot and amazing. How are you possibly still unattached? Dakota asks. Fear of commitment? Long lost love? I giggle. <laughs> no, neither. They're all looking at me, waiting for me to elaborate. I guess between the heart thing, scaring people off, and skating taking up so much of my time, it just hasn't happened. I'm not a big drinker, so I usually leave the party before people start pairing off and going home together. You were waiting for Rhett. When Ginny smiles at me like she's doing right now, I feel about a hundred years older than her and super jaded. My default would be to make some sarcastic comment, but instead I smile back at her. Maybe I was. Ginny's phone lights up in her hand, breaking the moment. Heath? Reagan asks. Yeah, he told me where they are and said to hurry up. Clingy, Dakota says with a snort. Adorable, Ginny sticks up for her man. The four of us stand to go find the guys. Even if we didn't know where they were hiding, they're loud. I can tell they're trying to whisper, but the deep baritone of Maverick's laugh is impossible to mistake. When we reach them, all of them except Heath grumbles. I knew this spot was too easy, Rhett says. He's pretty cute, all competitive and frustrated. Well, that was fun. Heath jumps to his feet and walks to Ginny, takes her hand and drops a kiss to her mouth. We're out of here. Ginny has an eight o'clock class tomorrow. Oh, right. Blame Ginny. Maverick calls after him, but Heath and Ginny are already headed back. He told you where we were, didn't he? Rhett asks me once we've all started walking to the apartment. Lips pressed together, I glance at him, deciding if I should tell. I knew it. I didn't say anything. You didn't have to. I can read your face like a book, Angel. Oh, yeah? I lift a brow. What am I thinking now? His eyes darken and do a sweep of my entire body. That we need to hurry the fuck back. Later, we're getting ready to sleep when I notice Rhett turn off his phone. You don't have to do that. What's that? He places it face down on his nightstand and gets under the blanket. I motion toward his phone. No, it's fine. It isn't fair to you. 
I turn, sitting on his bed to face him. What does she want? Do you really want to talk about this? He asks with a sheepish grin. I promise it's over. We broke up over a month ago. I've only talked to her to ask her to stop calling. It's been like this every day for a month? Not every day, but pretty close. If you say that it's over, I believe you. But help me understand. You must have some idea what she wants. Me, I guess. He sets a hand on my knee, thumb absently stroking my bare skin as he speaks. We dated for a long time. How long is a long time? Six years. Six years? He nods. We grew up together in Minnesota. I've known her since kindergarten, and we started dating in high school. She went to college in Nebraska, and I came here. We stayed together, but it was hard. We built lives separately, and over the years we had less and less in common. Things deteriorated slowly. We hardly ever got to visit each other. Wow. So all of college you've been dating someone halfway across the country? Now the only sleeping with one person makes so much more sense. I should have ended things sooner. Honestly, the last few months, maybe longer, were pretty awful. But we were friends before, and I wanted it to work because I cared about her. I'm always going to care about her. But I don't want to be with her. He leans forward and presses a kiss to my lips. I want to be with you, Angel. I don't know what to say, and I really don't. Carrie is struggling to accept something I already have, but she will. I mean, I know I'm pretty bomb, but she'll find someone new. The next afternoon, I join Rhett and his friends at the dining hall for lunch. Is it on TV? Rhett asks about the competition tomorrow. We leave this afternoon to make the two-hour drive to Phoenix. No, sometimes people will stream it online. Just depends. Bummer we can't come, Mav says, propping an elbow on the table. The guys are heading to Icarus State for regionals. After a week of hanging out nonstop, I'm going to miss the crap out of Rhett this weekend. I'll get back just as he's leaving. His hand finds my leg under the table and squeezes. I think he feels the same. Do you have time to come over and hang before our practice? His thumb strokes my bare thigh and tingles spread through my body. No, I have to meet with my doctor before we leave. Everything okay? His blue eyes search mine. Yeah, it's just a precaution before every competition. I check my watch. Speaking of, I should get going. He stands with me and pulls me against his chest. Good luck this weekend. You too. I glance at his friends. They're watching with big grins on their faces. Laughing, I press my lips to his. I'll text you later. Bye, guys. Take care of him. Chapter 19 Right. Did you find it? Adam asks, taking a seat next to me in the living room. No, nothing. I've been searching for a Sienna's competition all morning. Someone somewhere asked to be streaming it. What time does she skate? Two o'clock. Here's something. Mab sits up on the couch. NAU is live. I move to sit beside him and look at his screen. They're showing their own girls. That makes sense. Maybe they'll keep it going all day, Adam says. I hum in my throat. I doubt they're going to keep sharing video of the competition all day long. Sucks you couldn't go, Mav says. Are you freaking out? Freaking out? Why would I freak out? Yeah, you know, her heart condition. Oh, yeah, she's fine. She saw the doctor yesterday before she left. Standard thing. No, I just really want to watch. She's been so great about Carrie and she came to our game. And I really freaking like her. Mav drops his phone between his legs. What do you mean she's fine? Just what I said. The doctor cleared her to skate. Right, buddy, he might have cleared her, but she's not fine. Have you seen the video of her fall last year? No, one fall. Mav blows out of breath and raises his dark eyebrows. He positions his phone so I can see it again, and this time he pulls up a video of Sienna skating at some competition last season. She's in a red outfit that sparkles as she moves along the ice. 
She has such a smooth, graceful way about her. Even if I weren't super into her, she'd be hard not to watch. Here it is, here it is, Mab says, reminding me that we're watching this for a purpose. Adam comes over and crowds in to see. I'm expecting her to jump and not clear the landing, but she's just gliding across the ice when her body crumbles. She goes down hard on the ice and the audience lets out a collective, Ooh. I stop breathing and my pulse speeds up while I watch the medical staff rush out, and then the video cuts off. Holy shit. Adam stands. I don't understand. My ears ring. Sienna said she's fine. This was last year? Yeah, early in the season, I think. She was in the hospital for a few days. How do you know all this? My tone is accusatory. What I really mean is, why don't I? She was gone from yoga for about a month. We had this awful teacher instead who... Focus, I raised my voice. What else do you know about her heart condition? Whoa, dude. I don't think I've ever heard you raise your voice before. He makes a face at Adam that shows his shock. That's pretty much all I know. How could you not tell me? How could she not tell me? I stand and pace the living room. It's quiet. Too quiet. I look to Adam. He's mostly reasonable. That may not be the type of thing that's so easy to bring up. Have you talked about her heart condition at all? He asks. I think back on all our conversations. Yeah, kind of. Fuck, I guess not. She told me she takes medication and that she has to be careful and listen to her body. She said she has episodes. But this? I wave my hand toward Maverick's phone. She didn't tell me that. I sit back down. My mind is spinning. Now what? She's about to skate. Can that happen again? She has the monitor now, right? I feel sick. The image of her slamming into the ice replays over and over. Holy shit. I'm going to call her. I do just that as I walk to my room, slamming the door behind me. Pick up, pick up, pick up, I mutter quietly. She does on the third ring. The background noise of the competition is so loud I can just barely make out her voice. Hello? Hey, it's me. It's Rhett. I know, silly. Right. Her happy, bubbly tone is such a contradiction to the picture of her lifeless face in the video that's now frozen in my head. You're okay, then? What? You saw the doctor and he cleared you to skate? She doesn't respond right away, but the background noise dims. Sorry, I moved somewhere quiet so I can hear you. I only have a minute. Olivia is up next. What's up? I was just calling to make sure you were okay. Yeah, I'm actually not that nervous. It usually doesn't hit me until right before I step on the ice. Then, bam. I flinch and squeeze my eyes shut. There it is again. The image of her slamming into the ice. Fuck. How's the heart? Doctor said it'd be fine, yeah? Yeah, he cleared me. I'm good. You're sure? She laughs. As sure as I can be, I guess. That is not inspiring. Oh, they just called Olivia. I have to go. I'll call you later. Her cheery voice chirps in my ear. I should feel better. She's fine. The doctor cleared her. He wouldn't do that if something could happen, right? Okay, stay safe. Yeah, like that isn't an awkward send-off. I hang up and stare at the wall. Stay safe? Real smooth. The bus leaves Sunday afternoon. I talked to Sienna long enough last night to hear about her day, but she was tired and I still hadn't figured out what to say about the incident, which shall never be watched again. Even still, it's replaying in my mind every time I think I'm past it. Uneasy and restless, I oversleep, and then in a rush to get out the door, forget my Nintendo Switch for the ride. I can't even distract myself with video games while I worry about Sienna skating. She's taking the ice any time now. I'm agitated and don't feel like making small talk. Silent and broody is the general mood on the bus, though, so I fit right in. Regionals is four teams, single elimination. Today we play Icarus State and then, hockey gods willing, the winner of Troy and Stonewall. Heath is in the seat next to me. Are you going to bounce your leg like that the whole ride? I still. Sorry, man. It's cool. Everything all right? I stare down at the phone in my hand. Waiting to hear how Sienna's final skate went today. I have cards. Want to play? Definitely. I'm still kicking myself for not asking more questions about her heart condition. She's waved it off like it was no big deal, but I should have known. A doctor asked to clear her for every competition. That should have been a major red flag. Not to mention all the small ones along the way. Checking her heart rate. Elias calling to check in on her every day. 
The bus stops at the hotel where we check in and drop our overnight bags. Home sweet home, Adam says, tossing his duffel on the floor. The adjoining door between our room and Heath and Mavs opens. Hey, neighbors, Mav says. My phone buzzes in my pocket and it's the first time in as long as I can remember that I rush to answer it. Sienna. Oh, thank fuck, I say before I accept the call. Hey, Angel. I'll go. Adam tips his head toward the other room. I hit the video button. I need to see her. I'm a mess, she says when her face fills the screen. She isn't. Her green eyes are highlighted with more makeup than usual, dark lashes and a fuck-hot red mouth. I haven't changed yet. I was too tired. You look beautiful. How'd your long program go? Good. Really good. My best score of the season. It moved me in the second, but there are still two more senior skaters. Wow, that's amazing. Congrats. What are you doing now? Hanging in the hallway trying to rest. Josie's with me. She's going to get us food across the street. She tilts the screen and her friend waves. Hey, Josie. Turkey no cheese? Light mayo? She asks Sienna. And chips. Ooh, and a cookie. I can no longer see Josie, but I hear her laugh. All right, back in a few. When she leaves, Sienna brings the phone closer to her face. You could go with her and call me later. I know it's crazy there. Here, too. We just got to the hotel. The bus is leaving for the arena in 30 minutes. No, I offered to go with her. She wanted to be alone. She's pissed at herself for falling on a jump today. That sucks. She hums. It happens. I hope we're back to Valley before your game starts. Signal on the way here was crappy. Oh, that reminds me. Dakota wanted me to invite you to their apartment to watch with them, if you're back in time. That was nice. She stretches her slim neck. I'm probably going to crash as soon as the game is over, though. Better to be in my bed when that happens. Are you okay? The niggling worry is back. Yeah, I'm just tired. I never sleep well in hotels. I can't wait to crash in my own bed. I can sleep anywhere. She smiles. Oh, I've heard. A chuckle shakes my chest. Two minutes ago, I wouldn't have thought I was capable of laughing. All day I've been worrying about her, but here I am smiling and feeling calmer. That's just what it's like with Sienna. She makes bad days better. She makes everything better. Chapter 20 Sienna I take Rhett with me to the locker room so I can grab my bag. It looks like we're going to take third overall, and I am going to take second in the senior division. Not a bad way to hang up my skates. Metaphorically, of course. We still have the Valley Classic, but it's more of a showcase with just one other university. This is the last competitive show of the season, and I'm happy with what I've accomplished. Did you watch it? I ask. I sent him a video that Josie took of my short program yesterday. About a hundred times, he says, lighting up my insides. Did someone take video for me today? Yes, I'll send it to you. He grins so big like I'm sending him nudes. His gaze drops. Can't wait. Green today, huh? I like it. Oh, thanks. It's an emerald green that Josie says makes my eyes pop. I step in front of the large mirror in the locker room and turn my camera to show him the full outfit, sans skates. I like it a lot. Wish I could have been there to see you skate. You see me skate all the time. Yeah, but this is different. He sits on the bed and leans against the headboard. Hey, I have a question for you. Shoot, I say, flipping the camera back around, then grabbing my stuff and heading back upstairs. How come you never told me about your accident last year? I still, even before I've processed the words, Rhett continues. When we were looking for your competition online yesterday, Mav found some old videos from last year. I told you about my heart condition, I say defensively. Yeah, but I didn't realize it was like that. Besides, knowing it and seeing it happen. He tilts his head and gives me a tight smile. I can't stop seeing it. I steal my expression and feel myself withdrawing from him. He isn't the first guy to get freaked out and decide it's more than they can handle. I was dating Mike, the more recent of my two boyfriends, when I fainted on the ice. He was great while I recovered and then peaced out as soon as I was feeling better. It's hard to blame him. Who wants to date the chick who could drop dead at any minute? 
Why didn't you tell me more? He asks. Because, I wave a hand in front of the screen, this happens. I'm fine. I have a heart condition and sometimes it stops me, literally stops me. I didn't want to scare you off with details that aren't important. It's pretty important. I get it. It's a lot to deal with and you already have enough on your plate. My eyes burn with tears that I will absolutely not cry. Not now. You should go and get ready for your game. No need to worry about me. Trying to shoo me away, Angel? I'm letting you off the hook. I promise I won't even badmouth you to my friends. Not much, anyway. Back up about 20 steps, Angel. I'm not ending this. You're not? But you're freaked out. I can see it all over his face, even if he hadn't said it. I didn't put it together yesterday when he was acting strange, but now it all makes sense. Yeah, of course I'm freaked out. I don't feel like I know anything about your heart condition, and I was caught off guard. I want to know those kinds of things. I'm tough. I can handle it. He flashes a sheepish smile. What do you want to know? Do you have to get cleared by the doctor every time you skate? Was he there today? No, he's in Valley. I just see him the week before a competition. Has he ever not cleared you? I had to take some time off last fall. He nods and looks to me thoughtfully. You are inspiring, Angel. Inspiring? Yeah, that's the one thing I've said today that I'm standing by. The rest is probably garbage, and I'm sorry if I said it all wrong. I like you, and I'm not going anywhere. Did I already say that? You did. Good. Don't forget it. He glances up, and I hear some of the guys talking. I've got to get ready for the game. Call you later? Sure. I know he said he's not going anywhere, but I try not to get too hopeful just in case. Good luck, he winks. Later, Angel. Monday morning, I go to the yoga studio. I'm not teaching any fitness classes today, but Coach gave us the next two days off practice, and with Rhett still gone, all my homework done, and my friends busy, I'm bored. The hockey team won their first game, and tonight they play again. It's the last game, standing in the way of them going to the Frozen Four. I talked to Rhett when they were heading to the arena for their morning skate, and he was so excited and talking so fast. It was adorable. I'm taking a break and sitting on my mat when the door creaks open. Hello? The door swings open and Dakota and Reagan appear. I thought that was you, Dakota says. What are you doing? Hey, I smile as they walk into the room. Messing around, mostly. What are you two doing here? She made me do a spin class. Reagan sits beside me and drinks from her water bottle. Made is a strong word, Dakota says and joins us. We missed you last night. What time did you get back? After eight, I say. I watched the end of the game in bed and then crashed. Thanks for the invite, though. Me and Josie were planning to watch at the hideout tonight. From what I've heard, that's where everyone will be. I look to the girls. Do you want to come with us? They look to each other and then me. We're going to the game. You have to come with us, Dakota says. To Troy? Reagan nods and smiles and her dimples appear. We're surprising the guys. Dakota leans forward. We're leaving this afternoon and staying overnight. You have to come. Rhett will be so excited to see you. Yeah, you absolutely have to come with us, Reagan says. I don't know. I have... All my excuses die on my tongue. I'm caught up in all my classes, and I already have the day off practice. You know what? I'm in. Chapter 21 Rhett Dude! Mav skates toward me after the final buzzer, his arms spread out, smile so big. Dude! My buddy is speechless. Guess so am I. We won. We're going to the Frozen Four. Something I've dreamed of since I was a kid. It doesn't seem real. The rest of the team joins us and we're one big huddle on the ice, screaming our heads off. The noise inside the arena could lift off the roof. So many Valley U fans made the drive, including my very favorite fan. 
As we skate toward the bench, I see her, decked out in blue and yellow, jumping up and down with Dakota, Reagan, and Ginny. It feels sweeter having her here. Coach tries to keep his smile small, but the crinkles along his eyes and mouth give him away. Great job tonight, boys. He bows his head and gives it a shake. Damn proud of you all, but let's not get too carried away. We've still got more work to do. Enjoy tonight. When we get back to Valley tomorrow afternoon, your lives belong to me for the next week. There's a chorus of agreement. He won't hear any arguing from us about buckling down. Not this week. Party in our suite, Mav says. Pass it on. Well, not after tonight, anyway. Sienna and the girls meet up with us at the hotel. They're staying at the same one. Thank fuck, I missed the shit out of her. Congratulations! She throws herself at me, yelling in my ear. You're going to the Frozen Four! I lift her and turn us in a circle. She squeals happily. When I put her down, she's got a goofy smile on her lips. Ready to celebrate? My gaze rakes over her body. Laughing, she swats in my chest. That is not what I meant. Damn, because that sounds like a way better way to celebrate. Later. She grabs a handful of my t-shirt. Maverick and Heath's room connects to mine and Adam's, so we open the door to make enough room for everyone to congregate between the two. Do you want something to drink? I ask Sienna. We're sitting on my bed, which has my mind going to all sorts of fun places. Unfortunately, the five other people also sitting here with us is really ruining the moment. No, I'm good. I feel drunk. I'm so happy. Sam. I raise my hand to catch a beer Adam tosses my way. She eyes the can with a smirk. Still have to sell it with the boys. I lean to whisper in her ear. Don't worry, only a couple and then we can sneak away. She turns in my lap to better face me. It's your night. Have as many as you want. We can celebrate after you win the next two games. My dick perks right up. Not sure if it's the mention of sex or winning the Frozen Four. I take her mouth. I haven't been alone with her in two days, and I suddenly need to be. Immediately, if not sooner. Be right back. I pull back and drop a kiss to her shoulder, then get up from the bed. Jordan and Liam are standing in the doorway between the two rooms. Hey, I tip up my head as I approach. Can I borrow your room for twenty? Jordan lifts a dark brow. Seriously? No, Liam answers without consideration. Don't act like the two of you haven't hooked up with chicks on my couch. And in your room, Jordan mutters around his cup as he takes a drink. I don't even want to know, I tell him. Okay. Jordan gives in. What? No. Liam punches his arm. Not on the beds, Jordan instructs me, ignoring his roommate. He hands over his room key. Got it. I back away before they change their mind. Taking Sienna's hand, I pull her to her feet and weave back through the people to get to the hallway. Where are we going? She asks, giggling as I practically drag her toward the room on the other side of mine. I wave the key card in front of the lock and push the door open. Whose room is this? Does it matter? No. She smiles at me. Not unless your coach is going to walk in on us. No more talking about my coach. I sweep her hair away from her neck and seal my mouth to her sensitive skin. I scoop her up and look for somewhere to set her that isn't my teammate's bed. I settle for the desk, dropping her to it and stepping between her legs. She fists my hair and presses her tits against my chest as I devour her mouth. My heart pounds in my chest, and if the way she's meeting me pant for pant is any indication, so is hers. You okay? So okay. She pulls me to her and goes for the button of my jeans, then pushes them down until my dick springs free. I'm frozen, watching as she hops down and pushes her skirt to the ground, leaving her in the smallest black piece of material I've ever seen. She hops back onto the desk, but the height's all wrong. Bed? She suggests. I have a better idea. I hoist her up and carry her to the bathroom. The vanity is covered in products, but I sweep a hand to clear it and set her on the stone top. What is it with you in bathrooms? She giggles through the question while I push her panties to the side and circle her clit with my thumb. It's you. I can't seem to bring myself to care where we are. I just need to be inside you. Her hands are braced on the edge of the vanity, showing me the front of her watch. It's some sort of sport watch she wears all the time to view her heart rate as well as the time. I glance at it, noting the numbers steadily increasing. That's normal, right? Mine is definitely thrumming faster. I try to go slow, but it's been several days without her, and I need her in every sense of the word. Also, my stomach growls. Was that your stomach? She asks with a laugh. 
but then moans as I push two fingers inside of her. I haven't eaten since the game, I admit. Maybe we should stop and feed you? I'm not that hungry, I protest, but my stomach makes another gurgling noise. Laughing, she pushes at my chest with a sigh. I saw a vending machine by the elevator. Let's feed you. She hops down from the counter and starts getting dressed. But, but, I motion to my dick. We'll come right back. Or we could keep going and then eat. Are you hungry? Yes, I admit. She tosses me my pants. What my baby wants, my baby gets. I put them on with attitude and she holds the door open for me. Then we're going the wrong direction, I mutter under my breath. She laughs. Come on, Rothris. We find the vending machine at the end of the long hallway. What are you feeling? Don't care. I run my hands over her hips. She feeds money into the machine and presses buttons. I'm not paying a lot of attention, particularly when she leans over to retrieve her selections. I follow her back to the room. Key? She holds out her palm. Oh, shit. I think I left it in there. Laughing, she drops to the floor and sits with her legs stretched out in front of her, ankles crossed. Joining me? I take a seat beside her and she tosses a bag of chips in my direction. The noise from the party on the other side of the wall drifts out, laughter and loud voices. Your parents could make it? No, but they'll be in Kansas City for the Frozen Four. You could meet them if you come. I bump my shoulder against hers. Really? I shrug. If you want. You're going, right? Yeah, I won. That sounds nice. Ginny's dad offered to drive us. It won't interfere with your practice? No, I don't think so. But I should check with Coach when I get back tomorrow. My last competition is the week after. Where is it? At Valley. It's a small competition, just one other college. But it'll be nice to compete one more time. Yeah, I get that. At least you'll be able to skate every day after college. I don't know what my life will be like without waking up early every day and going to the ice. Have you found an apartment yet in Appleton? No, I guess I should get on that or I'm going to be crashing with my parents. My phone buzzes in my pocket. Speaking of my parents, that's probably them. I dig it out of my pocket. Carrie's name flashes on the screen. Or not. Still calling, huh? First time in a few days, actually. She probably wants to say congratulations. Sienna nods. You can answer if you want. Nah. I slide it back in my front pocket. She can tell it to my voicemail. What was the final straw with you two? What do you mean? You said things slowly deteriorated, but obviously not for her. What made you walk away? I take my time chewing the Doritos way longer than necessary. She cheated on me. What? Sienna's back comes off the wall, and her eyes widen. She kissed some dude at a party. She came clean immediately, and I was pissed, of course, but mostly, I guess I was just upset that I didn't care more than I did. She was adamant that we could fix things between us, so I decided after six years, another few months trying to work on things wasn't much to ask. Needless to say, things didn't improve, so I ended things. Wow. I was not expecting that. No more talking about my ex. I crumple the empty chip bag in my hand. Sorry. She pulls a pretzel from the bag in her hand and I snatch it with my mouth. Kind of stale, I say as I chew. Fine cuisine, it isn't. Company's good, though. Should we go back to the party? I don't want you to miss out on it. Tonight's a big deal. It is, and I'm exactly where I want to be. Or just outside of it, anyway. She nods her head toward Jordan and Liam's room. Laughing, I pull her onto my lap. This isn't so bad, either. I slide my hand between her legs and underneath her skirt. Her panties are soaked and her green eyes darken when my fingers brush against the silky material between her legs. She climbs higher on my lap, pinning my dick under her luscious ass. I slip two fingers under her panties and we groan at the same time. Her lashes flutter closed and fan out on her skin and her lips part. My teammates are loud as hell on the other side of the wall, partying and celebrating. Anyone in earshot could tell they're having a good time but I wouldn't trade the feel of Sienna's slick, hot pussy squeezing my fingers for anything. She rests her forehead on mine as her breaths come faster. Red, she whispers my name. Yeah, Angel. I drag the pad of my thumb along her clit. She says my name again on a whimper, and I seal my mouth to hers as she falls apart in my lap. Chapter 22 
Sienna. Thanks for coming, everyone, I say to my yoga students as they pack up their mats and leave. I'm so tired. We got back three hours ago, and I had to rush straight to class, then here. Maverick walks to the front, his black mat under one tattooed arm. Good class today. You say that every day. And it's always true, he grins. Going to the apartment? Yeah, am I that predictable? He laughs. Want a ride? That'd be great. Maverick drives a shiny black SUV with leather seats and a sound system that makes my insides vibrate when the music starts. Sorry about that, he turns it down. I think I killed the zen of the moment. Pick whatever you want. I'm easy to please. That's what Rhett said. He covers his mouth with a fist. Sorry, it was right there. Hey now, I say as I laugh. I'm kidding, but for real, you're chill, and I think that's good for Rhett. He's got a big heart. Thank you, I angle my legs toward him. What does Rhett say about me? Walked right into that, didn't I? Pretty much. Maverick leans back in his seat, one hand at the top of the steering wheel. Not much, honestly, but to be fair, he's always been pretty quiet. Come on, you can't seriously be doubting that my boy is digging you. He was out of his mind when he saw that video of your accident. You know that point when you're spending all your time with someone and it's going great, but you're not sure if you're on the same page? You're afraid you like him more than he likes you? Yes. No, I don't know. The heart thing tends to freak guys out. It isn't a big deal when things are casual, but the second it's more, it becomes a real thing to them. The more time I spend with Rhett, the harder I'm falling for him. I still worry he isn't ready for something serious, and yet that's exactly how it's starting to feel. Last night, I had a dream that I called him to make plans, and he told me he was heading out on a date with Josie. Like, no big deal, just dating your friend— Josie forced it out of me this morning when I couldn't look at her, then laughed in my face, hugged me, and promised she'd never do that to me, and I felt slightly better. But I don't need a psychology degree to figure out my subconscious is worried that I'm in over my head. I can't speak for Rhett, but I know that he's never seemed happier since you two started hanging out. I don't think that's a coincidence. He parks the SUV in the apartment parking lot and turns off the engine. I have exactly zero experience with serious relationships, and I get that your heart condition adds complexity, but my advice? Tell him how you feel. Worst case, you're not on the same page. At least you'll know. I hum a noncommittal response as I get out of the truck and round the front. Maybe I don't want to know if it isn't the answer I want. He drapes an arm around my shoulders. You hiding from reality? Nah, you're too baller for that. I lean my head on his shoulder. Why haven't you had any serious relationships? Oh, no. He steps ahead of me to open the apartment door. That's way more than you want to get into in an afternoon. His grin is playful and full of mystery, which just makes me more curious. But Rhett's sitting in the living room playing Xbox when I step through the doorway. Hey, he presses pause on the game. Hey, Sienna, Adam calls from out on the back deck. The sliding glass door is open and he sits in a lounge chair. I wave, then look back to Rhett. He stands. I thought you were going to text before you came. I haven't showered yet. My gaze travels over his bare chest. I'm sorry, did you say something? Maverick chuckles. And I'll be outside, unless you two want to get into something freaky. I'm down for a shower, or I could just entertain Sienna while... No, Rhett says without waiting for Maverick to finish. So possessive of your girl. He winks at me and then laughs his way out to the back deck. Maybe I wanted to hear the rest of his offer, I say when we're alone. Well, by all means... I make like I'm going to get him, and Rhett hauls me to him with his arms around my waist. I'm kidding. I slide my hands up his chest. I've got my hands full with you. Shower and then movie? We may have to watch it out in the living room, though, because everyone got really excited when I told them you wanted to watch Mighty Ducks. Not want, being forced. You can't not see it, he says in the same tone he'd used when I told him I'd never seen it before. I chuckle at him. 
Actually, I need to call Elias back. He has a competition tomorrow, and I don't want to forget later. I tend to lose track of time around you. One side of his mouth pulls up. Sorry, not sorry. Can I use your room? Of course. While Rhett showers, I sit on his unmade bed, surrounded by his scent, feeling giddy and happy and not trusting either of those emotions. Elias answers, his face filling the screen. She's alive. I'm sorry I keep missing you. It's fine. He runs a hand through his dark hair. I figured you were off being happy, happy with your hockey hottie. His tone is too sarcastic and bitter for my friend. Uh-oh, what's wrong? Nothing. Elias Mason Hummer, he sighs. I kissed Taylor. What? When? Those weren't the words I was expecting to come out of his mouth. Last night? How? We were working late. It just happened. And now she's avoiding me. She was a no-show for practice this morning. Oh my god, E, don't you leave for France tomorrow? Yeah, the timing couldn't be worse. She won't even look at me and we need to skate our asses off for the judges in three days. Wow, what are you going to do? Do? Nothing. Doing got me into this situation. You have to find her and talk this out before you leave. I'd rather catch up with my best girl. How the hell are you? I know he's deflecting, but Lord knows I've done it enough times to him that I let it go for now. I'm good. I finally fixed the footwork sequence that was giving me trouble, and I think Coach is going to let me add the double Lutz back in at my last competition. That's awesome. What day is it? Maybe I can come down. You can't run away from your partner. What? I never ask for time off. I'm sure Taylor can manage without me for a couple of days when we get back. You will do no such thing. You're so close. Talk with Taylor and get back to work. I'm only friends with you, so I have a legit excuse to go to the Winter Games next year. Don't ruin this for me. That makes him smile, and I feel better. Because of Elias's crazy training and being away from home, he doesn't have a lot of friends, and I feel bad that I've been preoccupied lately. Do you like her? No, of course not. You know that I don't. She annoys the shit out of me on a regular basis. She does this weird thing when she kisses where she hums softly. Yeah, well, you wouldn't know that if you didn't go around kissing her. Touché. After Rhett is done showering, we go back out to the living room to watch the movie. The entire group is over. Heath and Ginny are curled up on the opposite end of the couch as me and Rhett. Mav sits between us with Charlie. Dakota's in the armchair, and Adam and Reagan laid a blanket on the floor, and she sits in front of him, her back resting against his chest. I can't believe you've never seen this, Jenny says. Doesn't your sister play hockey? Yeah, but this movie was made like 30 years before she was born. I have seen Miracle an obscene amount of times, though. Oh, that's a good one, too. Mav's eyes light up. We should watch that one, too. Rhett yawns, making the group laugh. What? He protests through a laugh. You guys insisted on turning the lights out. You know how I get. Real talk, Heath says, looking to me. Does this guy make you leave the lights on when you have sex? Jenny elbows him. You can't ask people that. You wanted to know, too, he says, tickling her sides. I have never fallen asleep on her, Rhett defends himself. That he remembers, I quip. The movie starts, and everyone quiets down and turns their attention to the TV. Rhett leans in to whisper in my ear, nipping the shell of my ear as he says, I could never fall asleep while naked with you. I might make you prove that later. You're on. He sits forward. Anyone else want a monster drink? It's still early when the movie ends, but we both have to be up in the morning for practice, so we duck out and head to Rhett's room. Despite the energy drink, my man is sleepy. I'm undressing and grabbing a t-shirt from his drawer when he steps up behind me. His palms glide over my hips and stomach, sending goosebumps racing over my skin. I didn't see him drop his sweats, but his dick pokes into me from behind. I fake a yawn. Oh, I don't know. You seemed pretty tired earlier. Sure you can stay awake? I'd bet my life on it.
I turn and wrap my arms around his neck. His blue eyes bore into me with such intensity my stomach flips. I take a small step back and let my arms fall to his chest, then give him a gentle push. He falls back onto the bed, sitting up. Kneeling in front of him, I stare up at him as I kiss the head of his cock. If you fall asleep on me, I warn. Angel, you don't have to have your mouth on my dick to have me captivated. But the fact that you do, there's no chance I'll be able to take my eyes off you. His words, mixed with the desire to be certain he doesn't doze off and mortify us both, makes me bolder in my movements. His hand threads through my hair and holds the back of my head tenderly, slowly guiding me down his thick length. Need to be inside of you, he says, gripping me by the neck and pulling me to him. Clothes are stripped and tossed, and then it's just the two of us, naked and wrapped up in each other's arms. His fingers brush along my skin tenderly, but his kiss is possessive and demanding. He lays me down and worships my body until I'm writhing and panting under him. I can't even make a witty comment about the glow-in-the-dark condom he covers himself with. I have no idea how he can move so slowly when my heart races for more. I arch my hips to get more of him, but he chuckles and pulls back. There's no rush tonight, Angel. But every cell in my body wants to rush. I want him, all of him, and I want him now. His brow furrows as he keeps up the slow rhythm, feeding his cock into me and pulling back. I'm whimpering and tears prick my eyes. It's emotionally and physically overwhelming being with this man. Finally, he gives me what I want. Picking up the speed, his kisses are harder and his moans match mine. Come for me, angel, he whispers. Give me what I want. And I do. I shatter underneath him. My heart is still racing, I say after we've cleaned up and gotten ready for bed. His arms tighten around me. You good? Anything I can do? I'll be fine. Just give me a minute. It's been a long week. Sleep. I'm going to grab some water and food in case you wake up later and need something. Thank you. I doze off while he's gone, but stir when he slides back into bed behind me. His arm cradles me and he kisses my shoulder. Night, Sienna. I'm so tired I don't respond. I'm almost asleep again when his deep voice sounds again. I think I'm in love with you. I keep my breathing even by some miracle and stay silent. Why didn't you say anything back? Josie asks me the next morning when I fill her in before practice. We stretch in the tunnel outside of the locker room. I wasn't going to tell anyone about Rhett's late-night confession, but I needed to tell someone before I burst. He thought I was asleep. I didn't want to ruin the moment for him. Besides, he said, I think. That's not the same thing. Her blue eyes light up. It's so sweet. I love this for you. I love him for you. Let's not get carried away, I mutter, more to myself than her. The hockey team has a full day of practice, skills, film, and who knows what else, so I don't hear from Rhett until I'm studying later in my room. He sighs, laying back on the bed, the phone perched in his hand hovering above his face. He looks freshly showered. The ends of his hair are wet, and he pushes the long top over to one side. I thought it was going to be a light practice. It was supposed to be until we started getting sloppy. Nerves, probably. Yeah, I guess. Hope we can work that shit out of our system before we leave. You will. I close the lid of my laptop. What are you doing tonight? Uh, he starts in a tone that makes me nervous. That one syllable sounds like guilt. The guys wanted to have a chill night, just the four of us at Prickly Pear. I could probably bail. He makes a face, an expression I can't read. Why would you do that? Go have a chill night with your boys. I have a quiz tomorrow anyway, and I need to pack for the weekend. I should go to sleep early and rest. It's going to be a busy weekend. My body is tired. All of the traveling and practice, late nights with Rhett. There's a beat of silence on his end. His brows raise. What? I ask finally. Sorry. I just realized this is what this feels like. What feels like? 
One second, he calls away from the phone, then sits up. I have to go before they leave my ass. I'll call you later, okay? Yep, have fun. I kiss the air, and he winks before ending the call. Chapter 23 Right. Just like that? Have fun. See you tomorrow. I wave my hand. Fuck, I was speechless. I like Sienna, Adam says. We all like Sienna, Maverick adds. Don't fuck this up. You know what the real mindfuck is? What? Heath asks. We're having a low-key night at Prickly Pear before we head to the Frozen Four in two days. Just a couple of beers to clear our minds and help us sleep. The place makes me think of Sienna now and our speed dating adventure, but it's empty tonight, save a few locals sitting at the bar. Now all I want to do is go see her. Is this some sort of reverse psychology she's using on me? They laugh at me. Damn, it feels good. Phone tucked away, hanging with the guys, not a single worry to be found among the lot of us. And Carrie? I lift my beer and take a sip before answering. I blocked her. Adam is the first to speak after several seconds. You blocked Carrie? Yep. Well, damn. I'm speechless. It was time, I say, by way of defending myself, because in all honesty, it doesn't feel great, but neither did ignoring her calls and feeling like an ass every time Sienna was around. We spend the next couple of hours hanging out at the deserted bar. We're slow to finish our beers, but it doesn't matter. We're all feeling good when Jordan shows up at the bar to give us a ride. I can't believe you assholes didn't invite me and then called me to drive you home. It was a roomy thing, Mav says, climbing into the passenger seat. Then why did you come? I ask, jokingly. Oh, Rothris, you're gonna miss me next year. Don't even pretend otherwise. Someone's buying me chicken nuggets, Jordan says as he pulls away from the bar. We make a stop for fast food and then Jordan takes us to the apartment. I catch the door before Maverick closes it. I think I'm going to the dorms. Heath makes a sound like a whip cracking. Oh, please, like you have any room to talk, Adam shoves at his shoulder. See you guys in the morning. Don't be late for practice, Adam calls over his shoulder. Sienna answers the door, eyes half open. What are you doing here? Surprising you. You look nice. Her eyes are slits. And I look like this. She waves a hand in front of her baggy t-shirt and bare legs. Her hair is piled on top of her head, making her look a foot taller than she is. Nice shirt. That gets a sleepy smile out of her. I got it from this boy who gave me a black eye. Now that sounds like an interesting story. I close the door behind me and follow her to her bed on the left side of the room. Oh, shit. I lower my voice to a whisper when I see Josie is sleeping in the bed on the opposite wall. Don't worry, she sleeps like the dead. I kick off my shoes and take off my jeans and t-shirt before climbing into her small bed. Now I understand why we always stay at my place, I say, moving closer to her. I cuddle her against me, breathing her in. Damn. I had no idea it was possible to miss someone like this. Carrie and I were always apart, and I still didn't miss her the way I missed Sienna today. How are you feeling? Better, she says, grabbing my hand and pulling it up under her tits. I was already sporting a semi just from being in the same room with her, but thanks to her soft, perky boobs, I'm now jabbing her in the ass with my dick. And her ass is covered by some silky panties that are absolutely not helping the situation. Sorry. I didn't come here for that, but my dick doesn't care about my good intentions. I close my eyes and try to think of anything but sex, but when Sienna grinds back into me, I lose that battle completely. Neither do I. The next afternoon, I corner Maverick in the weight room. I need your help with something. Lying back on the bench press, he finishes his set before racking the barbell and sitting up. Anything, what's up? After I've got Maverick on board, I head to campus to find Sienna. I wait outside of Morena Hall where she has class. When she comes out, her head is downcast and her phone in hand. Mine pings in my pocket and I retrieve it as I continue to watch her. Sienna. Hey, handsome. Want to grab dinner? I'm starving. Me. Sure do. You look good in red. She stares down at the message for a long time. Then her head pops up and she scans until she finds me. I push off the bike rack and meet her halfway. Stalk her much? I'm one of the friendly ones. I take her backpack and sling it over my shoulder. I have a surprise. Does it include food? Because that wasn't an excuse to make plans. I really am starving. 
I've got you covered. Chapter 24 Sienna Where are we going? We've been in Maverick's SUV for 30 minutes, and I have no idea where we are. You'll see, Red insists. Everyone else is grinning. They're all in the know, and I'm not. Have I mentioned that I don't like surprises? You'll like this one. He leans over and presses a kiss to my lips. Promise. We're here, Maverick calls from the front seat. Eagerly, I peer out the front window. Color lights up the night sky as we're waved into a dirt lot to park. A carnival? I can practically smell the popcorn and funnel cake from here. Rhett holds my hand, swinging it lightly, as we walk toward the sound of rides and games intermixed with happy squeals of delight. His friends push ahead of us to get tickets. Be right back. Rhett joins them, and Ginny looks back and notices I'm alone. Are you excited? She beams at me, and I want to be as excited as she wants me to be. Yeah, this is amazing. He really likes you, she says, looking over my shoulder. I follow her line of vision to Rhett. And so do I. She hugs me and then bounces off to Heath. Rhett's headed back with a Cheshire cat grin. Rhett, this is the nicest thing. I love it, really. Thank you. It's not over until we ride all the rides, Angel. He holds up a long string of tickets. I scan the carnival. Tall rides that spin and rock. We're standing next to the octopus, and a girl is screaming loudly while she holds her hands over her eyes. My stomach dips with unease. Let's do this, Maverick calls, heading off toward the rides. I think the Ferris wheel is about all I'm good for. Go with your friends. I'll watch. Are you kidding me? I'm not leaving you to ride shit with my friends. I can't. He stops me with a kiss. Trust me. We'll meet up with you guys later, he tells Adam, and we head in the opposite direction. I'm not paying any attention to where we go. My stomach aches, and I'm upset that I can't do the things he wants. That'll always be the case, and there's nothing I can do about it. All right, he drops my hand and rubs his palms together. What'll it be first, the roller coaster or the slide? I glance up to see we're standing in the kids' section a roller coaster made out to look like a caterpillar, and one of those slides you go down on a burlap sack. I can't help but laugh, and the knot in my stomach loosens. Rhett has a charming, knowing grin on his face. Rhett, my voice cracks. He steps forward and cups my cheek. I know it isn't the same, but I figured we could try it out anyway. It'll be good for a laugh. It isn't the same, I agree. This is better because of you, and also because 15-year-old me wouldn't have had the balls to tell you that I'm so going to beat you down that slide. You wish, he scoffs as we rush to the line. We climb up a tall staircase, smiling and laughing. On three, he says when we're in position. I nod, and he starts to count. One, two, I push off, giving myself a head start. He roars behind me and then chases me down. Giggling as I finish, I look over at Rhett, expecting him to threaten a do-over, but he's smiling just as big. We go on every single kitty ride, which is particularly hilarious when Rhett tries to squeeze his long legs into the mini roller coaster. He's so large, we can't even sit together. He wins me an orange unicorn at the horse races, and I win a goldfish, which I give to a little girl at the ping-pong toss. I'm eating my second cotton candy of the night when we wander back over to meet up with his friends. I can't stop smiling. Thank you, I kiss him. He wipes a hand over his mouth. Sticky. I kiss him again, but this time he captures me and holds me tight as he devours my mouth. Now we're both sticky. He smooths a hand down my hair and pulls me farther onto him so my head rests in the center of his chest. My heart flutters. I think I love you too. The drive to Kansas City for the Frozen Four takes two days. Ginny's dad has to hate us by now. We've taken over his radio, and the excitement for the upcoming games has us all loud and giggly. When we pull into the hotel parking lot, he checks us in while we load up the luggage onto a trolley. We brought enough bags to stay a week instead of the three days the tournament runs. Mr. Scott lets out a long breath and stretches. I'm assuming you girls have plans for dinner. 
We're going to crash the team dinner, she says, holding her hand out for the room key. I'll be at the hotel bar if you need me. Tell Adam to stop by and see his old man later. Ginny kisses his cheek. Can you take up the bags? We're already late. He shakes his head. Have fun, girls. The team is at a local restaurant next door to the hotel. Allison calls as we're about to walk in. There's a small waiting area between the doors and hostess stand. I hang back. It's my sister. I should answer. I'll meet you guys in there. I'll save you a seat, Dakota says. Hey, I answer, holding the phone in front of my face. Save me. Dad's decided to get in shape and wants me to run around the neighborhood with him while he listens to 90s music from a speaker which he carries while we run. Why can't he just use headphones like a normal person? Because then you couldn't share the experience together. I laugh, but there's a little twinge of sadness. I haven't seen my family in a few months, and that never seems to get easier. Where are you? Out to eat with your friends? You can call me later. Yes, but not in Valley. Where are you? Okay, don't freak out, but I'm in Kansas City. Her brow furrows. What's in? Her mouth falls open. No, I nod. Yes. Oh my gosh, I hate you. You're at the Frozen Four, really? There's a whine to her tone. What are you doing there? I came with some friends. What aren't you telling me? Her gaze narrows. You don't like hockey that much. I'm dating a hockey player, I mumble. I'm sorry, what was that? Allison has some serious sass when she wants to, and right now, she wants to. I'm dating a hockey player. She's grinning. Don't tell me, let me guess which one. She puts a finger to her chin. Adam Scott. No way. Okay, okay, don't sound so offended. He's cute. He's dating one of my friends. Okay, then Johnny Maverick? Rhett Rothrus, I say before she continues guessing. Oh, hey, he's from Minnesota. I know. Right, she says. How long have you been dating him? And can he get me a last-minute ticket to the final game? If you're there, I bet Mom and Dad would let me come. Did you need something, or were you just calling to catch up? Both, but I'll cut to the chase, since you have more exciting things to do. She stops. The first game is starting soon. Valley doesn't play until later. You're not even watching the other teams? She sighs. You so do not deserve to be there. Noted. So what did you want to tell me? I'm standing outside of the restaurant where the team is having dinner. Jealous times 1,000, she mutters. I was calling because I wanted to see if you were ready for your competition next weekend. Oh, I expected her news to be something bigger. Yeah, I'm so ready. I'm disappointed it's the last one, but I'm adding a double, we're coming. She grins and looks around, then leans closer to her screen. Mom and dad want to fly down and surprise you. Don't tell them I told you. Seriously? She nods. Don't act like you know. I won't. Thanks for the heads up. Our parents are always trying to surprise us. They think it's the coolest thing, even though both their daughters are very anti-surprise, especially on the day of a competition. It would be nice to see them, though. Are you coming with them? Unless they decide to start trusting me to stay home alone. Well, I hate to bet against your budding independence, but it would be good to see you. I hold up my hands where she can see I'm crossing my fingers. So here's hoping you're still untrustworthy. She laughs. I should get in the shower before Dad puts in a workout DVD and makes me join him. Wish you were here. I miss you. She sticks out her bottom lip. Me too. Love you, Al. Don't forget, you don't know anything. They're going to wait until Friday when we're getting on the plane to tell you. She smiles big into the screen. I won't say a word, I promise. Why couldn't your competition have been a month ago? I won't even be able to see a hockey game while we're there. Her smile gives away her tease. Love you too. Call me during the game later. I just want to hear the noise of the game. Yeah, we'll see. Bye, us. Inside the restaurant, the team is easy to find as they take up one entire side. A few other girlfriends and family members have crashed. There's an empty chair pulled up next to Rhett's, but I skip it and sit on his lap so I can hug him. Hey, he chuckles softly. Hey, miss me? Maybe. I squeeze him harder and then drop a kiss on his mouth. 
I'm well aware his teammates and coach are probably watching, but I don't care. He's at the Frozen Four. It's surreal, and I want him to know how excited I am to be here with him. Want to meet my parents? What? I jump up and look around. I thought they weren't getting in until late tonight. He stands and nods his head to a booth nearby. A man and a woman with a little boy sitting next to them stare back at us. They got in earlier than planned. Come on, I'll introduce you. Oh, God, and they just saw... You tackle, hug me, and shove your tongue down my throat, he nods. Yup. He chuckles when I cover my face with a hand. I'm so embarrassed, and I just got really nervous. You'll be fine. They're cool. He pauses. I told them you were my girlfriend. I smirk. Am I your girlfriend? I could refer to you as my side piece or my old lady, but those didn't have the same ring to it. I smack his arm playfully. And you're not the president of a motorcycle club. I joke back as butterflies swarm in my stomach. Rhett's mom has a friendly smile. Her eyes take in every detail of her son's body language, from his hand around my waist to how close we're standing. This is Sienna, he says. Sienna, these are my parents, and that is Ryder. It's nice to meet you, I lift a hand to wave. My brother is number 23, Ryder says, staring at my shirt. I glance down and my cheeks flame. Ginny made us matching shirts with our boyfriend's jersey numbers on them for this weekend, and I'd completely forgotten I was wearing mine to surprise Rhett. It reads, property of number 23. Are you excited to watch him play? I ask the adorable mini Rhett. He shrugs. Mom says I can have popcorn and a lemonade. Rhett chuckles. Who needs hockey when you have the snack bar? Are you staying for the weekend, Sienna? His mom asks. Yes, I came with the Scott family. She smiles warmly. I can tell they're beyond nice, but there's still a beat of uncomfortable silence where none of us know what to say. Rhett slides into the booth next to his mom and holds his arm out for me to sit next to him. There's only a sliver of space, so I'm basically sitting on his lap again. Mom, I forgot to tell you that Sienna skates. She took second in her competition last weekend. She's really good. I feel myself blushing at the attention. You do? His mom moves forward to see around Rhett. Oh, well, we'll have lots to talk about then. Mom skated in college too. Rhett nudges me. You never told me that. It was a long time ago, she says. Coach Myers announces that the boys have five minutes before they need to load up for the arena. Mr. Rothrus leans toward his youngest son. Your brother is leaving. Do you want to give him your present? The little boy nods and holds his hand out, offering Rhett a shiny black rock. This is for me? Rhett asks, taking and inspecting it. I found it at school. Sarah and Rachel wanted it, but I told them I was giving it to you for luck. Rhett's chest shakes with a silent laugh. <sighs> Thank you. Ryder smiles proudly. I stand, and Rhett slides back out of the booth. His parents and brother get up, too, to hug him and wish him luck. We hope to see more of you this weekend, Sienna, his mom says as Rhett and I start toward his teammates. Me, too. Nice to meet you all. We walk out with the team as they start to load up on the bus. You survived, Rhett says when we're outside. Shut up, I was so nervous. I've never met a guy's parents before. I've never introduced one before, he says. They already knew Carrie. Right. He wraps me up in his arms and hugs me. Thanks for coming. Are you kidding? They have popcorn and lemonade, he chuckles. Are you going over to the arena for the first game? We break apart and he takes a step toward the bus stairs. I don't know, I'm just along for the ride, but I imagine we're going wherever you guys are. He nods, and I realize he's starting to get nervous. You're going to be great. You have to be, otherwise I'm going to get my ass kicked in this shirt. He glances down at it and then fists it and hauls me to him for another kiss before getting on the bus. Chapter 25 Right. We win our first game, but it's close, and we head back to the hotel with grim expressions and the final game looming over our heads. The morning of, Sienna and I have breakfast with my family at the hotel. She has a jacket on over her property of number 23 t-shirt, which makes me laugh. My mom is asking her about skating, and it's nice. I knew they'd like her. 
My knee bounces with anticipation as I half listen and finish my food. One more game. Win or lose, this is it. What time are you going over to the arena? My mom asks, breaking my train of thought. Bus leaves in an hour, I say. Do you have my rock? Ryder asks. His face is covered in chocolate from the donut he ate. Sure do. I pat my pocket. Brought me luck last time. Can I see it? I hand it over and he inspects it, turning it over in his sticky hands. Maybe we could share it. I could have it for this game. A surge of panic shoots through me. I wouldn't say I'm overly superstitious, but when the stakes are high, I don't like to mess with something that's working. I kept the rock in my bag for the last game and touched it before every period. It probably wasn't the reason we won, but I'm not pumped about messing with probability today. Still, I nod. Yeah, we could do that. Hold on tight to it, okay? He grins. I push back from the table. I need to get ready. I'll see you guys there. Good luck, my mom says cheerily. I get a nod of luck from my dad and Ryder holds up the rock, then drops it. The chances of him holding onto that for the next four hours before we play seem slim. That was nice of you, Sienna says when the doors close on the elevator. And incredibly dumb. You don't really think that tiny rock is why you won the last game, do you? No, of course not. She's grinning. Maybe. You're adorable, and it makes the fact that you let him keep it even sweeter. I grumble quietly as we enter the room. Adam and Reagan are inside watching TV. I get my bag ready, check, and double-check it. Would you sit down? Adam says. You're making me nervous. Yeah, we'll join the club. I sit on the bed and then stand. I can't sit here. I need to move or do something. Adam sits forward. Come on, babe. Let's give them the room. We'll be back in 30. My brow furrows as my buddy and his girlfriend leave us. What just happened? Sienna climbs on my lap and threads her fingers through my hair. I'm pretty sure they just left so we could have sex. What? A rumble shakes my chest. Wild guess that's how your buddy releases his nerves before the game. Right. I shake my head. Don't take this the wrong way, but I'm not even sure sex could calm me down right now. Today is my last game. It's the last time I'm ever going to play with these guys. I didn't realize how much I was going to miss it. She massages my head and my scalp pricks with a chill that runs down my spine. My eyes fall closed. Now that my body is starting to relax, I'm very aware that her boobs are at nose level. I nuzzle in and she laughs. I thought sex wouldn't calm you down. Might not, but it's worth a shot. Besides, it was the captain's orders. Waterville is big and physical, and they boast the best record in Division I hockey. They're also last year's national champ, and that title gives them both the boost of confidence of being in this position before, and the hunger to hold on to it. I think I'm going to shit myself, Jordan says as we dress in the locker room. He jogs to the bathroom stall on the opposite side. Maverick has music going on his phone, and he dances around trying to keep the mood light, but the undercurrent of nerves is there for everyone. When we take the ice, I swallow down a lump in my throat as I scan the crowd. I find my family, and then Sienna and the girls, and then it's time to go to work. What do you say, men? Adam says, skating through us. Men today, huh? Instead of boys? Between me and you, if we're going to win today, we're going to need to play like men instead of boys. He stops beside me. Ready to do this thing? Yeah. I shoot a puck into the net. Well, that's not very enthusiastic. Did you not work out your pregame nerves? It isn't nerves. Well, not just nerves. This is all bizarre. I never cared about it all ending until now. He fires at the net. Yeah, I feel that too. The thing is, it won't be the same regardless. Next year, it'll be a new group of guys starting out, which means we might as well go out with a bang. Let's give them something to aspire to. Chapter 26 Sienna. Oh, come on, Jenny yells when Heath takes a hard hit from the Waterville defense. Sit down, someone calls behind her, and sweet Jenny turns and flips them off with such flair I have to bite back a laugh. Mr. Scott places a hand on her shoulder, and reluctantly, Jenny sits back down. They're going to hurt him, she throws a hand up. He's tough, Reagan assures her. Is she always like this? I ask Dakota. 
No, but I think seeing her all mini psycho is adorable. Waterville scores, and our entire row groans. This is not good, I say to no one in particular. Rhett comes off the ice and tosses his water bottle to the back of the bench. Dakota sighs. I didn't want to have to do this. She reaches into her bag and pulls out a t-shirt. It has Maverick's number on it. Did you make that? I ask. It looks almost like mine, Jenny, and Reagan's, but a little messier. No, of course not. Maverick did. She rolls her eyes. He was feeling very left out. No property of? I belonged to no one, which I made very clear when he said he was going to make me one. But I promised him I'd wear his number if things were looking bad. She pulls it on over her head. It can't hurt, right? My gaze goes to the valley bench. No, it can't. I stand. I'll be right back. Where are you going? The period is about to end. To get a good luck charm. Waiting outside of the locker room, I can hear Coach Meyer's voice bouncing off the walls inside. Silence finally falls, and the head coach pushes out of the locker room. He lets out a breath, hands on hips, composing himself before he starts down the tunnel. The team follows a minute later. The security guard that I begged to let me loiter in the tunnel watches me closely. I smile at him again, giving him my best, I'm not a stalker or a serial killer, smile, that probably conveys the exact opposite. Rhett appears, and I push off the wall. Rothrus! His head lifts slowly, and his brows scrunch together when he sees me. I stay put, as instructed by the guard, and Rhett walks over. Is everything okay? Yeah, no, I just wanted to give you this. I hold out my hand to give him the black rock his brother gave him yesterday, and then took back this morning. How? I sweet-talked a five-year-old boy, then bribed him with a foam finger. I'm not proud. But I knew how important it was to him. I could see his disappointment this morning. Thank you. His sweaty, heavily padded body steps forward, and he hugs me. Now go give someone a black eye. The security guard clears his throat. I was joking. It was a joke. He gave me a black eye. I stop when the guard's hard face remains impassive. I have not made a friend. I look back to Rhett, who is still standing in front of me, looking down at the rock in his hand like it's a diamond. Go, I tell him. Thank you. He smiles and jogs after his teammates. I get back to my seat as the second period is about to begin. There you are, Dakota says. Everything okay? Yeah, I take a seat, and the four of us join hands. They've got this, right? They've got it, Reagan says with more confidence than I feel. But as the second period begins and then ends, it seems like our optimism was on point. Valley fought back and now leads three to one, thanks to two goals by Maverick and some impressive saves from Ketchum. I'm so sweaty. Jenny fans her shirt away from her body. She looks to us. Why am I the only one sweating? You've been jumping up and down for the better part of two hours, Dakota says. I want this for them so bad. Jenny blows out a breath that puffs out her cheeks. The third period is chaotic. Both teams are skating hard and hitting even harder. The coaches are red-faced, standing at their opposing benches, shouting at their players and every person in the arena is glued to the action on the ice. It remains scoreless for the first 15 minutes. Every time Waterville has the puck, I hold my breath and hope they don't score. It's been close too many times, and Ketchum deserves a freaking medal for the number of saves he makes. At the two-minute mark, his luck runs out, and the red and black shirts stand and cheer around the arena. It's just one goal. We're still ahead. Reagan says. We've got this. The words barely leave her mouth before Waterville gets a breakaway and scores again. Oh, fuck, Reagan mutters. Her sudden worry and lack of conviction that we've still got this makes my chest ache. Should I take off the shirt? Dakota asks. Maybe I cursed them. You didn't curse them. They've got this, I say in my most convincing voice. There isn't a butt in the chair all around the arena. It hums with energy as the two teams take a timeout. 
The four of us are a bundle of nerves, swaying, clasping hands, but no one speaks. Rhett's line goes back in, and I hold my breath for him. Heath wins the face-off, and Valley takes the puck down the ice, looking for a shot on goal. There are so many bodies in front of the net, it's hard to see what's happening. But when a Waterville player skates hard in the other direction, my stomach drops. Rhett and another Valley jersey chase him, and the Wolverines lose control, allowing Rhett to knock the puck free. It's Maverick that gets there first, and Valley has a slight advantage as Waterville tries to reset to defend their goal. Mav passes to Heath, who shoots. It's blocked, but Maverick is there, ready to knock it in. The goalpost lights up, and the roar of the arena is deafening. With 15 seconds left, Waterville tries to tie it up. But when the final buzzer sounds, it's Valley by one. They did it. They won a national championship. I call my sister, and when she picks up, I can't even make out her hello. But I know she can hear the stadium and that she's smiling. I bounce around, hugging the girls, hugging strangers. Ginny's crying. Dakota's screaming so loud, she's the only voice I can hear over all the others. It's perfect. Almost two hours go by before I finally get to see Rhett and the team. There was the trophy ceremony, followed by cutting the net, and then whatever celebrating they did in the locker room. Valley fans fill the lobby area, waiting to see the team. When the first player walks out, the roaring applause and cheers starts up again. Maverick comes out looking more humble and shy than a guy who scored three goals in a championship game. Dakota rushes from my side and jumps into his arms. Who gets a hat trick at the Frozen Four? He drops his bag and hugs her back, finally laughing and looking more like the Maverick I expected. The guys are swarmed as they come out. Rhett and Adam are the last two. I don't charge him like the other girls did. I let his family congratulate him first, hanging back and watching as he hugs his mom and dad and then picks up Ryder. At last, it's my time, and he bear hugs me, lifting me off the ground. Are you ready to celebrate, Angel? He spins me around. Fuck, I love you. Before I can say it back, he seals his mouth to mine and keeps spinning. I chuckle. You're going to make me dizzy. He's smiling when he puts me down. His parents watch on. His mother looks not as happy as you'd expect for a mom whose son just won the Frozen Four. When Rhett picks her up and spins her around, she finally breaks into a smile. Put me down, she swats at him playfully. Me, me, Ryder says. Rhett spins him around even faster. When he stops, Rhett sways. Whoa, okay, maybe I need to eat something before I keep spinning people around. He's grinning so big, my chest feels like it might burst. I glance at my watch and take a few deep breaths. Are you okay? Rhett's happy grin falls and his gaze darkens. Yes, just a lot of excitement. He takes me in his arms and stills. Breathe. Relax. We can have a chill celebration. Are you kidding? I turn to face him. I'll be fine. Just give me a minute. And he does, holding me steady as we watch the team and their friends and family celebrate. Everyone's phones are ringing and pinging with calls and texts to wish them congratulations. Rhett's is nowhere to be seen or heard. Even his parents are blowing up. His dad has Ryder on his shoulders as he talks to his brother, Rhett's uncle, laughing and joking about how they nearly gave him a heart attack in the final period. Rhett shoots his dad daggers at that comment, since I'm currently feeling off kilter thanks to my own heart, but I'm not bothered. Nothing could ruin this night, this moment. It's perfect. His mom is trying to have a much more civilized conversation. She has a finger plugging one ear, phone pressed tightly to the other. She walks away from the commotion, presumably to hear better. Better? Want me to grab one of the trainers? I'm okay. The lightheaded feeling is starting to pass, but I still lean in to Rhett. All right, men, let's load up. Coach Myers stands next to the bus. I'll meet you there, I say, reluctantly stepping away from him. He hugs a sleepy-eyed rider. Thanks for letting me borrow this. Rhett hands him back the black stone. You can keep it, Ryder yawns. 
It seems like you might need it more than me. The three of us laugh. We're leaving early in the morning, so I guess this is goodbye until graduation. His dad slaps his back as they hug again. Thanks for being here, Rhett says. His mom finally finishes her call and comes over to say goodbye as well. Rhett hugs her. Thanks, Mom. We're going to follow the bus back to your hotel. There's something I want to talk to you about, she says. We can talk now, Rhett says. It'll take the guys a few minutes to load. It's fine, we'll just follow you. Rhett's features contort into confusion. You're being weird. What is it? That was Corey on the phone. Okay. Who's Corey, I ask when no one speaks. Carrie's mom, Rhett says. It's cool, mom. Sienna knows about Carrie. His mom nods and gives me a small smile. Her eyes look a little teary, and I'm so confused. What is it? She didn't drive down here, did she? He looks around. She can't seem to understand that it's really over. No, she's not here. Rhett motions with his hand impatiently. She tried to come. His mom's voice breaks. She left her dorm last night so she could be here today. Okay, well, where is she? She was in an accident near St. Joseph. Is she okay? His mom shakes her head slowly side to side, and she starts to cry. My skin goes clammy, and my heart rate accelerates. No, baby. She fell asleep and drove across a median. They took her to the hospital, but it was too late. She places a shaky hand to her mouth. Rhett's dad puts a hand at his wife's back and stares at the ground. Blood pounds in my ears, and I'm warm all over. What? Rhett asks like he's not sure he heard her right. His grip around my waist tightens. She didn't make it, baby. I'm so sorry. My breathing gets shallow and my knees buckle. Shit, Sienna, are you okay? He turns his attention to me. There's no look of sadness on his face, but his eyes are hard and his jaw is set. You're white as a sheet. Sit down, I'll be right back. He helps me sit on the high curb and he takes off. I'm so sorry, I say to his parents, and then I close my eyes and focus on my breathing. Chapter 27 Rhett I'm fine, really, Sienna says, trying to stand. Let's give it a few more minutes. Jeff places a hand up to stop her and sits with her on the curb. There's no reason for everyone to wait. The bus should at least go back. She ducks her head. I'm standing in front of her, shielding her from anyone who might look, but I don't really think anyone is paying attention. My parents and I can give her a ride, I say to Jeff. I'm thankful our trainer was here. He came just to watch as a spectator, but I grabbed him the second Sienna went limp in my arms. Are you sure you don't want to go to the hospital, just as a precaution? He asks her for the third or fourth time in the past thirty minutes. I'm sure. They'll only tell me what I already know. I need to rest. Okay. He stands and looks to me. Text or call me if she needs anything. Thanks, man. He pauses and lifts a hand to squeeze my shoulder. And I'm sorry for your loss. Swallowing the lump in my throat, I nod. Focusing on Sienna, I push out everything else. I can't go there right now. I'm on a teeter-totter with a 900-pound man. One second I'm flying high, winning a national championship with my team, and the woman I'm stupid in love with by my side. And the next I'm hitting the ground hard. Carrie's dead? No, it doesn't make any sense. Dakota, Reagan, and Ginny move forward when Jeff leaves, hovering over Sienna like three mother hens. Give her some room, I instruct, instructions that fall on deaf ears. I'm okay, Sienna says, stubborn woman. Adam appears at my side. Hey, I just heard the news. Are you okay? I'm fine. Listen, I'm going to stay with Sienna tonight. I already ran it by coach, and he said it was cool. Room's all yours. He stares blankly. Dude, Mav says, joining us. We're a freaking circus act. He hugs me tightly, squeezing the air out of my lungs. I'm so sorry for your loss. What can I do? His tone is soft and sympathetic, and I cannot handle it right now. I've got to get the hell out of here. I'm good. 
What's going on? Reagan asks. The girls don't know yet, and I don't want to be around when more people find out. I removed myself from Mav's hold and looked to Sienna. Angel, you ready? My parents will give us a ride. I'm going to stay with you tonight. Oh, she glances at the girls. It's okay. Go be with your family. No chance. She glances Dakota. I'm sharing a bed with Dakota. It's cool. She waves her off. You two can have the bed and the room. These two won't be sleeping in our room anyway. She points to Reagan and Ginny, and I can find somewhere to crash. That's settled then. I scoop her up in my arms. I can walk, Rhett. I know, Angel. But having her in my arms makes me want to punch something a whole lot less. I'm sorry. Sienna sits on the bed, her back resting against the wall. It's fun. I don't really feel like celebrating. I toss my hat and run my fingers through my hair. I meant about Carrie. Are you okay? I ignore her question because I don't know the answer right now. I open the mini-fridge. Do you need anything? Water? Food? Just for you to sit down. I'm okay. You don't need to worry about me. With a sigh, I go and sit beside her on the bed. You scared the shit out of me. I know. Her hands cut my face. I'm so sorry. It doesn't feel real. She smiles sadly. If you want to be with your family or by yourself, I'll understand. I kick off my shoes and drag my legs up so I'm beside her on the bed. I'm exactly where I want to be. I thought I'd have trouble sleeping, but I drift off while Sienna runs her fingers through my hair, letting me stew in silence. And I don't wake up until the sun shines through a crack in the curtains. I ease out of bed carefully so I don't wake her and pull the curtains together, shrouding the room in darkness. Dakota lets herself in as I'm pulling on my jeans. Sorry, she whispers. I thought you two would be up. She should sleep as long as she can. What time are you guys leaving? Noon? I nod. I need to go talk with my parents. You'll be here? Yes, I'll keep an eye on her. She walks forward and hooks an arm around my neck. I'm really sorry about Carrie. Thank you. I grab my shoes and glance back at Sienna. My parents are in the lobby when I walk down. My mom looks like she's been crying all night, and I don't know why, but it sets off my barely contained rage. I grind my teeth as she hugs me. How's Sienna? Still sleeping. I just came to say goodbye. Are you guys headed out? You're not coming with us? Why would I come with you? They haven't made arrangements yet, but they will soon. Corey said Tuesday if they can get everything ready. I don't think I should go. My mother rests a hand on my chest. Oh, honey, of course you should. We weren't together anymore, I say loudly, releasing some of my anger. If you want to go back to Valley with your team first, we'll get you a flight this week. Right, Julie? My dad takes her hand, a united front like they've always been. If that's what you want, she says slowly. I nod. Fuck. I know the right answer, but I'm not prepared to head back to Minnesota today. I'll just ride with you guys. It makes more sense. Give me 30 minutes. I head back upstairs with breakfast. Sienna's coming out of the bathroom with a towel wrapped around her thin frame. She finger combs her wet hair. I can only carry two plates. I set them on the TV stand. Reagan and Ginny are back and packing their suitcases. They both shoot me sympathetic glances and take turns hugging me. How are you feeling this morning? I ask Sienna. Better. You should eat something. She graces me with a small grin that loosens the boulder on my chest. I will. I raise my brows. She grabs half a bagel from the plate. Are you going back to Valley, or? Apparently everyone thought of the funeral except me. Funeral? What the fuck? Leaving with my parents. What day is the funeral? Tuesday, I think. I could maybe come with you. No, that's okay. Thank you. But I know you have practice in school and you need to rest up so that you're ready for your last competition. Will you still be able to compete? Yeah, hopefully. I made a doctor's appointment for Wednesday. I nod thoughtfully. All right. Well, I guess I should get ready. Are the guys still here? I don't even know what time the bus is leaving. They're still here, Reagan answers for me. I think Adam packed for you. I don't want to leave you like this, I say, hugging Sienna. I'm okay. You keep saying that. I close my eyes and inhale. One of these times you're going to believe me. Chapter 28
Red. The guys and I hang at the back of the room. It's packed, and so is the hallway outside. Most people I know, or at least recognize, some I don't. The sheer volume of people that came should be comforting. It isn't. I've been in this funeral home before a bunch of times. Stood in this very spot, sometimes with Carrie. Gone through the line and offered muttered words meant to help. But that I'm sure didn't. None of those times felt anything like this. She was only 21. It just doesn't make any sense. Adam and Mav both insisted on making the trip to Minnesota despite my reassurances they didn't need to. They flew in this morning, and now that we're at the visitation, I'm glad they did. They're providing excellent cover and stopping people from approaching me to offer their sympathy. As if this situation isn't awful enough, it's the first time I've been back home since Carrie and I broke up. Everyone is looking at me with these sad, pitying expressions. Clearly, they don't know that I no longer deserve those glances. Along the back wall, three tables are pulled together. Collages with pictures of Carrie from when she was a baby to the present fill the poster boards. Many with me. Carrie and I started dating in high school. She was this beautiful, brave girl. She stomped around like nothing scared her, and I was in awe of that. Everyone was. It takes a special kind of person to walk through the halls of high school already knowing who you are and feeling confident enough to be only that. That was Carrie. Confident and fascinating. Whoa, is that you? Mav asks, pointing to a picture of Carrie and me at a high school dance. She's in a sparkly dress, her hair curled, arm looped through mine. We were juniors. I was all arms and legs, scrawny, bad haircut. Clothes that my mom probably picked out and forced me to wear so I'd look nice for the dance. I wasn't exactly shy. It was more that I didn't care about being cool or fitting in. And I never liked bringing attention to myself outside of hockey. Not that I really needed to worry. If people were looking my way any other time, it was to stare at Carrie. That uncomfortable hideaway feeling never really went away until I got to Valley and gained 20 pounds. I still don't give a fuck about fitting in, but I found my people regardless. Yeah, sure is. I shove both hands in my front pockets to keep myself from running them through my hair, which is styled with gel for a change. Maverick covers his mouth with a fist as he laughs. Oh man, are those pleats? We can't all be as stylish as you were in high school. I've seen the photos of your nipple rings, Adam says, and nudges him playfully with an elbow. Mav scoffs. Those were awesome, but you wouldn't have caught me at a school dance. Well, maybe in the parking lot, passing around drinks and waiting for girls to get bored of the dance and come ditch with me. Of course, I say. A quiet chuckle escapes. We fall silent again. My gaze keeps being drawn back to the front where Carrie's family receives condolences. My own family hasn't arrived yet, but they'll be here. The whole town will stop by either tonight for the visitation or tomorrow for the funeral. I shove my hands even deeper in my pockets. I'm going to rip the seams before the night is over. Guilt seeps from my pores like yesterday's liquor, leaving my skin clammy. Carrie was on her way to see me, and I blocked her number so I didn't even know. Did she call? Could I have answered and stopped her? I know that I couldn't have prevented the accident, but maybe I could have stopped her from getting in the car altogether. Maybe I could have been a goddamn decent human and actually talked to her until she knew it was really over. Maybe I could have prevented the most awful thing to happen to her, or that will ever happen to her. Fuck, fuck, fuck. When my parents arrive, my mom wraps me in a big hug. Her eyes are teary, but she holds it together. My dad shakes my hand. Then the guys, all while wearing his best somber smile. Where's Ryder? We left him with your Aunt Leah, my mom says, then asks, Have you been up yet? I shake my head. Come on, you can't hide back here forever. She knows me well. I go with my parents, shuffling forward with the line. Every step closer, my nerves fray a little more. There's a large, framed picture of Carrie on a stand in front of the flowers. I can't bring myself to look at it or the casket next to it. But even out of my peripheral, I recognize the photo. Two years ago, she had headshots taken for her college newspaper where she wrote a weekly column. She was so damn proud. Her smile had been so big as she told me about it. She's not smiling in the picture, though. She wanted to keep it professional and serious. I'm glad it's not a smiley, happy photo. I don't know why. Not like it would make a difference. I manage through tearful hugs from her mom, dad, and grandparents, and I'm thankful that my parents do most of the talking, and that her mother doesn't yell and scream at me for breaking her daughter's heart. I have expected that sort of reaction from her. She is so protective of Carrie. Was so protective. 
Fuck. Actually, it's your dad I should be worried about. Cam is ex-military and could break me like a twig if he wanted to. Age has only made him stronger and scarier. He doesn't, though. No one seems to blame me. No one but myself. My family and I step off to the side near the doorway to the hall. Your hair is too long. I can barely see your face. Mom smooths back the long strands hanging in my eyes, hiding me. Are you doing okay? I'm fine, I say, because I am. And because I'm not allowed to be anything but fine. I broke up with her. Sure, I still care about her. Cared now, I guess. Fuck, fuck, fuck. I don't know what to think, let alone say out loud. I swallow around the lump in my throat. I don't feel like I should be here mixing with all the people that were still a part of her life. People that hadn't brought pain to her recently or cast her aside. I'm an imposter. A has-been. Maybe only by a couple of months, but I can't shake the uneasiness or desire to get out of here. My mom pulls her purse strap higher on her shoulder. We should get home. I'm making pies and casseroles for tomorrow, and I have a roast in the crock pot. We be back for dinner? I can't even think about eating. The guys and I will probably grab something before we head back. Okay. She leans forward and kisses my cheek. Don't be too late. Loosening my tie, I keep my head down as I walk back to my spot next to the guys. Even still, I'm stopped by a guy from high school, Jim or Jimmy, I think. He doesn't offer up his name as he leans forward and embraces me. I'm so sorry, man, he says. He smacks me on the back as he squeezes. Thank you. When I speak, my voice cracks. He pulls back and checks my expression. I duck my head and walk away before he can say anything else. Maybe that's rude, but so is hugging someone without warning. Mav hands me a bottle of water. I'm good. He keeps his arm extended until I finally give in and take it from him. I unscrew the cap and take a long drink, then promptly cough because this isn't fucking water. Vodka burns my throat and heats my chest. The guys huddle around me as people start to look in our direction. Little warning would have been good. I managed to get out. I glance around. Jim or Jimmy has broken the ice and more people I went to high school with are looking my way like they might come say hello. I'd rather eat Tide Pods. Let's get out of here. You sure? Adam asks. Yeah, I'm sure. Rhett! I look up as Carrie's mom, Corey, calls my name. She waves a hand in the air and holds her head up to see over the crowd. Go ahead, I'll meet you guys outside. I say to Mav and Adam. Adam squeezes my shoulder as they leave. Corey clutches a tissue in her hands. You're welcome to stand up front with us. People are asking about you. They want to offer their condolences to you, too. Oh, uh, thank you, but I wouldn't feel right. She tilts her head to the side. Why not? You're like family. She reaches out and squeezes my arm. Her eyes fill with tears, and I flex my jaw to keep my composure. She loved you so much. I can't imagine how hard this is for you. You'll come over tomorrow afternoon and be with us at least. We'll get through this together. Do you think they know we were broken up? I stare straight ahead at the bottles of liquor lined up behind the bar. My gaze keeps snagging on the coconut-flavored vodka. It was Carrie's favorite. I don't know, Adam says. Was she close with them? Yeah, pretty close. She talked to her mom every other day or so. Which means she definitely talked to her since we broke up. Mav slides another shot along the bar in front of me. So what if she didn't mention you broke up? What's the big deal? I glance around. Keep it down. What? It's not that big of a town and I'd rather Carrie's family not hear the news from the local gossip. Are you going to tell them? Adam asks. I don't know. How'd you bring that up? I shake my head. Get through the weekend and then... His words trail off. And then what? Grow a new heart and brain? Forget this ever happened? Thank you guys for being here. I toss back the liquor. Logically, I know I have to be drunk by now, but I feel nothing. Are you kidding? We fly together. Quack, quack, quack. Mav flaps his arms. Uh, what? I'm not drunk enough to understand whatever he's communicating. Or too drunk, hard to say. Mighty Ducks? No, Adam shakes his head. Never refer to us as the Mighty Ducks again. Why not? Mav looks crestfallen. You can be Charlie. Who does that make you? I ask. Please, I'm a bash brother, of course. Of course, I say, looking to Adam. Adam's phone pings. I'm sure it's Reagan. I don't ask. Just go back to staring down into my beer. Heard from Sienna? 
Adam asks, setting his phone on the bar. It pings again, and this time I glance down to see Reagan's name flash across the screen. Yeah, she's been great. I wish she were here so badly, but maybe it's a good thing, considering Carrie's parents might think we were still dating. I need to book my flight back tomorrow. What time you think? Mab asks. You guys don't need to stay. I appreciate it, but there's nothing to do. There's an 11 o'clock or a 5. 5 puts us back at what time? Adam asks. They're checking airlines to find the best option, and I'm wondering what the hell I'm even doing here. Let's do the 11 o'clock. I drain the rest of my glass and seriously consider ordering an entire bottle of Captain Morgan. The heavy silence and sad eyes Mav gives me is the only reason I don't. Isn't the funeral at ten? We'll never make it on time. Adam finishes his beer. You want another drink? No, I'm good. It's my new favorite phrase. Succinct and total bullshit. Book it. I've done what I came here for. I stand and stumble over my own feet. Whoa there. Adam steadies me, Mav goes to the other side, and they hold me up. See? Mav grins. He whispers, Quack, quack, quack. Chapter 29 Sienna Dakota and Reagan come to my late afternoon yoga class. Since the trip, we've been inseparable. They understand everything that's going on, which is nice, but I also just really enjoy being with them. Somewhere along the way, Rhett's friends have become mine. Is Rhett coming back today too? Regan asks when everyone else is gone and it's just the three of us sitting on our mats. Yes, I wasn't expecting him until tomorrow, but I cannot wait to see him. How is he? Dakota asks. Good, I think. It's hard to tell. Every time I ask him how he's doing, he turns it back on me. He sounds tired and a little off, but who could blame him? He cares about you a lot. You really scared him, Reagan says with a look that says that he's not the only one I scared. Do you still get to skate at your competition this weekend? Dakota asks. I nod enthusiastically. The one shining beacon in an otherwise crappy week. Thank goodness. I switched my days working at the Hall of Fame so we can come, Dakota says. Really? A smile splits my lips. Duh, we're not going to miss your last skating competition. My parents and little sister are coming too. They haven't seen me skate all year. I glance down at my watch to check my heart rate. Reagan leans back on one elbow. Your heart condition, is it hereditary? Sometimes, but in my case, it's not. My friend Elias is a third generation though. The pear skater? Dakota asks. That's right. Does it freak you out or no? Also, feel free to tell me to mind my own damn business, Reagan says. I don't mind talking about it. And no, it doesn't really freak me out. Only when I can't do something that I want to. But for the most part, I've adapted my life to a point that it doesn't feel like I'm missing out. Are your parents cool with you skating, even with the risks? Yeah, they have been great. The first year was hard, and we fought a lot with me trying to keep living the same life and them always panicked that something would happen to me. But you can't live in a constant state of fear and anxiety. We went to therapy, and we figured out what works for us. Namely, letting me do what I want. I grin. I had to decide what was important to me and what things I was just holding on to because I thought I needed to drive my parents crazy. I don't care about binge drinking, and I was pretty healthy even before I was diagnosed. The only thing I refused to give up is skating. Since I was already a skater, that helped too. Things that are outside of my routine seem to set me off more than anything. I think you're incredibly brave, Reagan says, flashing me her dimples. I go back to their apartment with them. I haven't heard from Rhett since this morning, but I want to be there when he arrives. Adam is standing outside of the apartment with a cocky grin when we walk up the stairs. Reagan takes off in a sprint, squealing. Is Rhett here too? I ask. Yeah, Adam manages to say and motion with his head before Reagan occupies his mouth. I go straight back to his room. He unzips the bag on the bed, looking up when I enter. You're back. He stands tall. 
I just got in. I was going to text you tomorrow. I'm so beat. He faces me, and I can see the exhaustion. His normally smooth face is sporting scruff, and his gray-blue eyes are hazy. Yeah, of course. I was with Dakota and Reagan, and we ran into Adam. I linger in the doorway, then finally step forward to hug him. It's the first time I've breathed easy in two days. His scent and his strong arms wrap around me. I missed you. I'm so glad you're home. Me too. I can't tell you how happy I am to have that behind me. How have you been feeling? And don't say fine. Better now. I squeeze harder. I don't know how long we stand there embracing, but he lets out a contented sigh. I'm gonna shower and go to bed. Can you stay? If you want me to. I wasn't sure if he'd want space after all he's been through, but I'm relieved when he looks at me like I'm ridiculous for considering any other option. Definitely. Maybe I'll be more fun after 12 hours of sleep. It's okay. I have some reading to do for class anyway. He nods and then goes to shower. True to his word, he showers and then climbs into bed and passes out. I read at his desk, using my cell phone as a light, then crawl in beside him. When I wake up, he's wrapped around me like a human teddy bear. And that's how the next couple of days go. Rhett goes to classes, skates or lifts weights for several hours in the afternoon, and then comes back to his apartment exhausted and ready to sleep. We cuddle, we have sex, we watch movies, and sit together while we do schoolwork. But we barely leave his room outside of the previously mentioned activities. When I ask him how he's doing, he says he's good, and then kisses me. I don't know if it's a distraction technique, but it's effective. Thursday evening, we're sprawled out on his bed. He's watching a movie on his phone, and I'm trying to read for class. Heath yells from the other side of the door and then opens it a crack. You guys want to play sardines? I look to Rhett. Nah, man, we're good, thanks. Heath glances to me, a flash of uncertainty in his gaze, and then nods. Are you sure? I'm just reading ahead so I can follow along better in class. I can be done if you want to play. He shakes his head, not really feeling it. You could let me beat you at Mario Kart. He snorts and then curls a finger around the front of my tank, pulling it down to show my cleavage. I'm good right here. Don't get me wrong. I love being with Rhett. I love being naked with Rhett. But his bedroom is starting to feel like our hideout. So I heard that there's a party tomorrow night for the hockey team. Are you going? Yeah, it's mandatory. The team is making an entrance. I promise we can duck out at a reasonable hour. I know you have the Valley Classic early Saturday. We, huh? I guess that means I'm invited. You go where I go. He leans forward and touches his lips to mine. A night out sounds fun, actually. I watch his expression carefully, but he's stoic. And I don't have to be at the rink Saturday until 10, so I'm good until at least midnight when I turn into a pumpkin. A small smile tips up one side of his mouth. I thought you'd be more excited about it. Excited about a night where I have to dress up and mingle with alumni and boosters? He cocks a brow. A night celebrating with your friends, since you didn't get to the night you won. He doesn't respond and goes back to watching his phone. I set my book aside and scoot closer to him. Are you doing okay with all this? Really? I can't tell, and I want to be here for you. You are here for me. He smiles and pokes me. Emotionally. You've barely said two words about Carrie or the funeral. He drops his phone to his lap. What do you want me to say? Anything. It sucked, and I feel awful about what happened. That help? Does it help you? No, which is why I haven't said anything. It's over and done, and I'm moving on. Talking about it is the opposite of what I want. Okay? I nod. Okay. Being with you makes me feel better. You're here for me, physically and emotionally. 
I kiss him. I'm hungry. Want something to eat? Mmm. He hums, kisses me again, and mumbles against my lips. And mentally, I was just thinking about food. You read my mind. Want to go out? I stretch my legs out. Nah, let's just order something. Chapter 30 Sienna I'm worried about Rhett, I confess to Dakota the next night as we get ready for the party. Yeah, the guys are too. Really? She nods. I wasn't sure if I should say anything. The pit in my stomach grows. I don't know what to do. He doesn't want to talk about it, and he isn't doing anything wrong. He just wants to stay in his room and make out. Dakota laughs. Most girls wouldn't consider that a problem. I know, I know. The last thing I want to complain about is my boyfriend wanting to have sex too often, but I just have this terrible feeling that he hasn't dealt with the loss at all. Maybe it isn't something he can just deal with in a week. I know they were broken up, but he was with her for a really long time. My mom died when I was 15, and it took me years to really deal with all the emotions I was feeling. Oh my gosh, Coda, I had no idea. I'm so sorry. Thanks. I got through it, but there's still moments where I miss her so much I can't breathe. I've never lost anyone that close to me. He'll be okay, she promises. Give him time. She stands from the vanity in Reagan's room. How do I look? Hot? The shoes are a nice touch, too. She kicks up one leg behind her, showing off the red converse. Somehow, paired with a short black dress, it works. Very Dakota. Reagan, hurry up in there, Dakota yells toward the bathroom. My hair is not cooperating. She emerges, spraying hairspray as she walks. Is Jenny here yet? Dakota shakes her head. Her red hair is at full volume, framing her face in big curls. She plays with a strand, twisting it around her finger. No, she's meeting us there. Somehow she got roped into helping set up. All right then, I think we're ready, Reagan says and smiles, looking from me to Dakota. We are some serious eye candy. Let's take a photo. We cram together, cheesing at the camera as Reagan snaps a dozen photos of us. The party is thrown in front of University Hall. A large open tent is set up with a buffet line and bar. The Valley U dance team and cheerleaders are in attendance, as well as the Roadrunner mascot. It has a whole Friday Night Lights vibe that I have to wonder isn't more about the alumni and boosters than the team that just won a national championship. The guys are set to make a grand entrance, so Reagan, Dakota, and I grab a drink from the bar and stand as far away from the cheering and dancing section as we can. Servers in white tux jackets bring out hors d'oeuvres on shiny platters. Old guys stand in groups, laughing and talking loudly. This is, I start, not easily coming up with the word. Excessive, Dakota says. I feel like I made a wrong turn into a 40th reunion class. You guys, Reagan stands taller in her red heels. She and Dakota nearly match with their red shoes and black dresses, but their styles are so different no one would ever notice. They won a national championship. They deserve excessive. What they wanted was a kegger with drunk girls in skimpy outfits, not shrimp cocktail with old dudes. Dakota downs her champagne. We should do that for them then, I say quickly. But the more I think about it, the more I like the idea. A do-over for Rhett to celebrate with his friends. I know it won't change what happened, but maybe he'll at least feel like he got one last hurrah in with his teammates. There they are, Reagan says. The three of us watch, along with everyone else, as they walk in. Music plays, and the cheerleaders and dancers move into action, making a path for them to a podium with a microphone. That's Maverick's dad, Dakota whispers when a man steps up and welcomes everyone. Or I guess he's Maverick Sr., Mr. Maverick. Weird. We chuckle together. How do you know, I ask. Have you met him? Are you kidding? Just look at him. 
the man introduces Coach Myers, and then Dakota's assumption is confirmed when Coach comes forward and thanks John Maverick for hosting the party tonight. As he goes on thanking everyone, Jenny steps up beside us. I thought they'd at least be in their jerseys. You made it, Reagan hugs her. I was on confetti duty. Confetti? You'll see, she says as the first pop sounds. Each of the cheerleaders has a confetti cannon in their hands, and they go off each time a player is introduced. Look at Maverick. Holy crap, Jenny says as his name is called. They're all dressed similarly in dress pants and shirts, but Maverick is striking in a white button-up with rolled sleeves showing off some of his tattoos. His dark hair is styled, and he has a hard set to his jaw. Sophisticated and pissed is a good look for him, even if it makes me sad to see an unsmiling Maverick. His dad squeezes his shoulder with a proud look on his face. He does not want to be here, Reagan says. Who could blame him, Dakota says. The first time his parents come to Valley and they've made a spectacle. Wow. That's all I get out before Rhett waves and comes into view. Unlike Maverick, he didn't bother styling his hair, but it doesn't matter. He's still the hottest guy I've ever seen. He runs a hand through that messy hair, and all I can think about is how I can't wait to spend the evening with him. It isn't exactly the celebration we would have had after the Frozen Four, but he's here, and I'm here, and that's celebration enough. After several more speeches, the guys are released. They mingle into the crowd, and by the time we get to them, Rhett already has two beers in hand, one stacked on top of another. Hey, I say cheerily as I step to his side. Hey, he wraps an arm around my waist, chugs the top beer, and then tosses it and pops the tab on the second. I'm surprised they have beer here, I say. They don't, Heath says. We had to bring our own cheap booze. Maverick takes out a bottle of Mad Dog, takes a long swallow, and passes it to Rhett, who does the same. He offers it to me. No thanks, kind of early for shots. He shrugs and passes it back to Mav. Our little group is interrupted by alumni and important people from the university approaching the guys to personally congratulate them. Rhett never lets go of me as he thanks each and every one of them, but his grip on me tightens to the point I feel like I'm the anchor keeping him from floating away. How long do you have to stay? I ask quietly. Coach said three hours, but I doubt anyone is going to miss me. Do you need to get back? I don't. Not really. I have everything ready for tomorrow, and it isn't like I'd be sleeping even if I were at home. But something tells me he needs to leave. I can feel it. The pain and frustration radiates off him. We can stay if you want. Nah, you've got to skate tomorrow. What's Coach going to do, kick me off the team? We say hushed goodbyes to our friends and then sneak out and walk back to his apartment. Rhett grabs another beer from the fridge and sits on the couch. He doesn't speak, but at least we aren't confined to his room for a change. I get a text from my sister saying they made it to the hotel. My family is in town. They'll be at the arena tomorrow if you're up for meeting them. Yeah, of course. I'm looking forward to it. Good, because my sister is so excited. She knows all your stats, and she's totally going to fangirl. He laughs like I'm kidding, but she totally will. I thought tomorrow night we could take her out somewhere or have a small party here. Saturday night. It won't be hard to find people drinking and hanging out somewhere. Rhett turns on the TV, and I text my sister, making plans to meet up with them in the morning. The rest of Rhett's roommates and their girlfriends aren't far behind us. First, Ginny and Heath appear, followed by Adam, Coda, and Reagan. Where's Maverick? I ask, looking at Dakota. He went to let Charlie out. I'm sure he'll be up soon. Adam sits between me and Rhett on the couch, and my boyfriend passes him a controller. Hey, buddy. Doing okay? You haven't said much since we got back from Minnesota. Not a lot to say, I guess. Was your mom pissed we left early? My ears perk up. What do you mean you left early? There's a flash of guilt on Rhett's face before he shrugs. 
We missed the funeral so we could catch the early flight back to Valley. My mouth gapes. She chastised me a little, Red admits. I don't see what the big deal is. I paid my respects to Carrie's family at the visitation. Staying wasn't going to bring her back to life. A heavy silence falls over the apartment. As long as you got the closure you need, Adam is the first to speak. Rhett scoffs and lifts the controller in his hand. Sure, man, whatever. Are we going to play or what? I'm on edge after that, trying to process this information. He didn't go to the funeral? Mav enters, still wearing his dress clothes, but the shirt is unbuttoned and untucked. He's got a box under one arm and carries a bottle of Mad Dog in the other hand. Did anyone make it the full three hours? Rhett asks. We told the freshmen if they left before midnight, we'd fill their dorms with that fucking confetti. Mav grins. He sets the box on the kitchen counter and opens the bottle of Mad Dog. The second, or maybe third, of the night. Roth Ross, that box is for you. Delivery guy fucked up and left it outside my place by mistake. Rhett glances up to the box. For me? Who's it from? Someone in Minnesota. He picks it up with one hand and tosses it across the room. Rhett stands to catch it. He stares down at the label and his face pales. What's wrong? Adam asks, picking up on the change in him. It's from Carrie's family. He sits and sets it on the coffee table, glaring hard at the small box. Are you going to open it? Heath asks. It's probably just pictures or something. I'll open it later. We're all here, and the booze is freshly stocked. Might as well open it now and get it over with. Mav sits on the arm of the chair across from him. We're all staring at him, so he proceeds. He rips off the tape and opens the flaps. His throat works before he reaches in. My pulse thrums quickly as he sets the contents on the coffee table. My first college goal. He holds up a hockey puck. No way, let me see. Mav grabs it. I remember that game, Adam says. I have to admit, I feel a pinch of jealousy for all the years I missed, for the history I'll never have with him. I could never admit that out loud, not now. But before all of this happened, I was jealous of Carrie and the time she had with Rhett. But as I watch him pull out mementos from their time together, I realize how stupid I was. He wouldn't be who he is now without her. He'll carry pieces of her with him forever. And I'll be thankful that he is who he is no matter how he got here. Among the other items he removes from the box is a Bruins hat that looks nearly identical to the one he always wears. A few newspaper clippings highlighting Rhett's high school hockey days. And the last item is some sort of collage or photo cube. Oh, hand that over. Adam grabs it. I need to show Sienna what your gumby ass looked like at 16. The pictures of them together are heartbreaking, as are the words cut out from magazines to say things like perfect couple, true love, and forever. But the real punch to the gut is the sound that comes from it. At first, there's a hint of confusion on Adam's face when a female voice giggles, I love you, Rhett. But when Rhett's voice repeats the sentiment back, we all stare at him, and then the cube where the sound is coming. Oh my God. The words tumble from my lips and I put a hand to my chest. They recorded it together, who knows how long ago. It doesn't matter. The look on Rhett's face is gut-wrenching. He doesn't say anything for too long. Adam holds the cube with two hands in his lap. Hey, man, I'm so sorry. I didn't know. Rhett stands, and his phone on the coffee table in front of him rings. I feel like I'm watching everything unfold in slow motion. I hold my breath as he picks it up, curls his fingers around it, and launches it at the wall above the TV. It ricochets and falls to the ground with a thud, screen up, and very much shattered. Adam pushes to his feet and places a hand on Rhett's shoulder. Save it. Rhett swipes a hand through the air and shrugs out of his embrace. You didn't even like her. None of you did. Rhett, we didn't really know her. 
Mav's voice is calm and steady. A bitter laugh erupts from him and he tips his head back. Fuck all of you and your weak-ass attempts to be understanding now. Little too late, don't you think? He storms off to his room. Adam looks to me. I'm sorry. I go after him. He's changing clothes and packing his hockey bag. Rhett, I ask tentatively. Not now, Sienna. I know that had to suck for you, and I'm sorry, but just not now. I stay in place until he's walking toward me to exit his room. Where are you going? The rink. I need to clear my head. Silent tears slide down my cheeks. I want to hug him or go with him, but he doesn't ask as he pushes past me. He's finally out of his room, and now I just want him to come back. Chapter 31 Rhett Anger vibrates through me as I stand under the hot water. Closing my eyes and unclenching my hands, I try to find release from the giant weight sitting on my chest. I thought I'd feel better after a couple of hours on the ice. Fuck, I thought that about coming back to Valley, too. That's really why I skipped the funeral. I wanted to get back to school and back to normal. Back to Siena. Instead, every day I just wake up and feel shitty all over again. I turn off the shower and wrap a towel around my waist. The locker room is empty and dark. I didn't bother turning any lights on when I came in. Adam sits in his stall, leaning back. Fuck off. I'm perfectly capable of dressing myself. He says nothing. I really wish he'd tell me to shut the fuck up or clock me. Maybe that would make me feel better. It certainly couldn't make me feel worse. I ignore my buddy as I get dressed, hoping he'll get the hint and leave. I'm in no mood to have a heart-to-heart. -heart. I'm in no mood to do anything but go back to the apartment where I can shut myself in my room and not speak to anyone. But Adam didn't come all the way here in the middle of the night to let me be a broody asshole. Well, I ask, antsy to get this over with. Say whatever it is you came to say. He sighs. I love you like a brother. You're my best friend in the whole world. I just want to be here for you. You didn't even like Carrie, I say again. It's petty as hell, but it's true. Adam never liked Carrie. No one was happier than him when we finally broke up for good. Because I know that she fucking cheated on you, he screeches, voice low. Immediately, his features morph and he lets out an exasperated sigh. Fuck, I'm sorry. Well, shit. How long have you known? I ask then. How do you know? I overheard you on the phone one day. I wanted to ask you about it, but I figured you'd tell me when you were ready to talk about it. Yeah, that never would have happened. I didn't tell a soul the real reason me and Carrie broke up. Until Sienna. Besides, it may have been the last straw, but we were heading that way for a while. We drifted apart, became different people, wanted different things. I guess I didn't want to give my friends any more reasons not to like her. So, yeah, I wasn't her biggest fan because I'm your biggest fan and I will always have your best interests in mind. I didn't think you should be with her, but I didn't hate her. I'm not glad she's gone. I know. I rough a hand through my hair. Fuck, I know. I'm so goddamn angry and I don't know why. Because you're hurting. You still cared about her. It doesn't make any sense. I can't wrap my brain around it. We're quiet for a beat. Sienna went back to her dorm. The knife in my gut twists, but I nod. Good, I'm shit company. You need to talk to her. And say what? Look, Rhett, I can't imagine what you're going through, but we all just want to be here for you, Sienna included. It wasn't your fault. I know, I grit out. Do you? He lets me get by without answering. Are you ready to head back to the apartment? Maybe you're right. I should go see Sienna. What time is it anyway? I pat my pocket for my phone and then remember I destroyed it. After two in the morning. Or tomorrow. She'll be up, he says, and claps a hand on my shoulder. Text me if you need anything. Despite Adam's encouragement, I don't go see Sienna. I wander to her dorm and then walk home slowly. She has to skate tomorrow, and as much as I want to see her, I know it's selfish of me. I send her an email, one quick line. Good luck tomorrow. Then I pass the fuck out and hope that tomorrow is better. I'm up early despite having gone to bed so late. Before I even open my eyes, the events of last night make my head throb. 
But worst of all, Sienna's not here. I check the time and hop into the shower. I have a lot of people to apologize to in a short amount of time if I'm going to catch Sienna before she skates today. Heath and Ginny are in the living room. Red, Ginny says, sitting up. She looks hesitant and I fucking hate that. I've known Ginny for years, since she was a junior high kid dropping off her brother at college. Now she looks afraid of me. I'm really sorry about last night. She gets up and hugs me. Heath tips his head. Feeling better? I shrug. A little, I guess. Don't feel like throwing anything. He chuckles. Good, because these thin-ass walls can't handle it. I glance up to the small hole in the wall where my phone hit. I'll fix it. Seen Adam? I'll back, Ginny says, letting me go. Adam and Reagan are sitting on the lounge chair together, talking and laughing. So happy. I want that. He looks up when I step outside. Hey, you're awake. Reagan turns and smiles at me. I should go get ready for Sienna's competition. She kisses Adam and leaves us alone. I'm sorry for everything, I say. I lost my head. It's no excuse. Don't worry about it. Already forgotten. Thank you for checking on me, even when I don't want you to. He chuckles. I'm going to remember you said that for next time. God, I hope there's not a next time like this. His expression sobers. Are you on your way to the arena? Soon. I have a few things I need to take care of first. I meant what I said last night. I always want whatever is best for you. I like Sienna. She's sweet and caring, and I've never seen you so happy. That must be hard, considering everything else. She's incredible. I love her. I love her in ways I never thought I could love a person. I thought it would be enough. Enough to move on and to not feel the agony of losing a girl I'd known my whole life. Adam nods. I should have made you stay for the funeral. I didn't know what you needed. I still don't, but I'm here. I know that, and I appreciate it. I should have stayed, but that's on me. He stands and hugs me. Whatever you need, I'm here. In that case, can I borrow your phone? I hold up what's left of mine. He laughs. Yeah, of course. Chapter 32 Sienna I'm sitting in the tunnel, talking with Elias, trying to calm my nerves. The competition starts in just a few minutes. I'm not set to skate until later this afternoon, but with everything going on, I'm a jittery mess. I'm back in the good old USA. He tilts the phone to show me his new weight room. He and Taylor are training at her home gym in South Dakota for the next month. Too bad her home gym wasn't in Arizona. You're so close. He snorts. Just a 24-hour drive. I checked. Looked at flights, too, but our training is crazy. And it's a two-hour drive just to the airport. There isn't even a McDonald's in this town. Oh, man, you really are roughing it, I tease. So the doctor cleared you for today, he asks. Yeah, once I told him I'd taken out all the difficult jumps, he and Coach were both good with it. I've been feeling stronger every day. Was changing the routine your idea? Yeah, it isn't worth the risk for a showcase event. He grins. Look at you, growing and shit. I roll my eyes, but I guess he's right. A few months ago, I would have been tempted to push through, even when I knew my body was weak. My phone pings with a text from my sister telling me they're walking in the building. I gotta go. My family is here. Hey, wait. His face gets closer to the screen. Forget about everything going on with Rufus. Today is your day to shine. My chest aches at the mention of Rhett. Kill it. He makes a cross over his heart, and I mimic. Good luck. I never understood why you two do that. A deep voice echoes in the quiet hallway as I end the call. Rhett! I scramble to my feet and hug him. I wasn't sure he'd come and wasn't sure how I'd feel about it if he did. I want to be angry that he ran last night, but I'm too happy to see him. Hey, Angel. He wraps me in his arms and smooths a hand down the back of my head. I wasn't sure you were still coming. I tilt my face up to him and he places a kiss on my forehead. I'm sorry about last night, but I wouldn't miss it. You've got a whole fan club out there. Dakota and Reagan even brought signs. I smile. I knew Dakota and Reagan were planning to come, but hearing it confirmed makes my heart squeeze. 
I'm so glad you're here. Today is going to be amazing. By the way, how do you feel about Italian for dinner? My dad has his heart set on some restaurant he saw driving through town. He smiles. About that. Too much? Do you not want to hang out with my family? It isn't that. He blows out a breath. I'm leaving Valley, Sienna. What do you mean? For the night or the weekend? For, I don't know. School is almost done. I talked to my advisor this morning, and he said I could finish my classes online and still graduate next month. I'm flying out this afternoon. All the air is knocked from my lungs. I don't understand. Can't you wait one more month to finish out the school year? I need to go home and deal with my shit. It isn't fair for me to keep clinging to you like a life raft. I'll take us both down if I keep going this way. I want to be your life raft, or at least your arm floaties. I get a small smile, but I can tell he's already decided he's leaving, and I can't stop him. What about us? I hope you can understand, but I get it if you can't. The last thing I want is to hurt you or bring more stress on your life. I'm stronger than you think. My phone pings again. My family is waiting for me. Do you still want to meet them? If you still want me to, yeah, I'd love to. My family adores Rhett. No surprise there. My sister grins so big when he asks her about her team's hockey season, and seeing my sister so excited wins over my mom. My dad is the last one to crumble, but when he finds out Rhett is from Minnesota, my dad welcomes him like a fellow neighbor. I have to go get ready and warm up. I'll see you guys after the competition. I get hugs from all of my family members, and then Rhett walks with me toward the locker room. Will I see you after? My flight is at four. So, no. Will I hear from you? Yeah. He hugs me. My phone is destroyed, so it might take a few days to get a new one. Okay. His mouth covers mine, and I live in the seconds before he pulls away. Later, Angel. With a broken heart, I walk into the locker room. Josie is sitting on the bench, lacing her skates. Hey. Her face falls when she gets a good look at me. What's wrong? Instead of answering, I sit next to her and lean my head on her shoulder. Life isn't fair. No, it definitely isn't. Anything I can do? Do I need to dick punch someone to even the karma scales? My laugh is short and clipped. No. Sadly, it doesn't have a revenge solution. Pity, she smiles. Skate it out? Absolutely. And that's what I do. Those moments just before I skate always go by in a blur. Music, applause, the chill in the air. It isn't until my name is called that I snap to attention. I take the ice and I skate for Rhett. I skate for my family. But most of all... I skate for me. Spending time with my family is nice, but my mind continually returns to Rhett. I replay the past week, wondering if there are things I could have done differently to have changed the outcome. They don't ask why Rhett doesn't come with us, but my sister notices I'm not my usual self. Do you still want to go out later? If you're not up for it, of course. I force some enthusiasm into my smile. Rhett's roommates are having people over, and we can crash in his room. Okay, she squeals. But no drinking. I promised Mom and Dad. Allison rolls her eyes. I don't drink. Beer is gross. It's a chill night at the apartment. Some of the hockey team is over playing Xbox, and the rest of us are sitting outside on the deck. Allison is quiet, but the giant grin on her face hasn't faltered since we walked in. Maverick, who miraculously still has his shirt on, sits next to me and throws an arm over my shoulder. It's weird, right? Rhett not being here? Very, I admit. He'll be back. He has to come back. I don't know. There's only a few weeks of school left. 
Yeah, but you two are in love. He won't be able to stay away for that long. I feel my face heat, and I look down to my lap. You are in love, yeah? Mav drops his arm. Please tell me you didn't drop kick the poor bastard's heart on his way out the door. No, of course not. It's just, I haven't told him that I love him. Oh, well, fuck. He backtracks when I shoot him a panicked look. I'm sure he knows how you feel. I want to kick myself. I should have told him. Now I may never get a chance. Cheer up, you'll get your chance. I know it. He stands. Allie, you look like a ringer. Want to be on my team for washers? My sister nods enthusiastically, not even bothering to correct the shortening of her name, which she usually hates. Sure. The next morning, I say goodbye to my family outside of my dorm. We'll see you in a month for graduation, my dad says, hugging me. Try not to flunk out before then. Funny. My mom always tears up when we say goodbye, and this time is no different. Love you, Mom. I'll talk to you soon. I made up your old bedroom in case you want to stay with us after graduation while you get settled into the new job. Thank you. I'll think about it. I've given such little thought to the job. I haven't even looked at apartments. It doesn't seem nearly as important as everything else going on. Thank you for letting me tag along last night, Allison says when it's finally her turn. Will you give Maverick my number? Definitely not. She smiles. Bye, Est. I've barely gotten back to my room and crawled into bed where I fully intend to spend the day feeling sorry for myself when there's a knock at the door. My stupid, hopeful heart convinces me that it's Rhett. It's another hockey player standing outside with coffee. Mav? Good morning. Coffee? He extends the cup in his left hand. It's decaf. What are you doing here? I thought about it all night, and I decided we should do it. Do what? Make the big gesture. I take a sip of the coffee while I give my brain a chance to work through the puzzle that is Maverick. What? We're going to drive to Minnesota, and you're going to make the big gesture. That sounds awesome, he says, as I say, like a terrible idea. Come on, I live for this shit. The look on his face will be worth the two-day drive. I can't ask him to come back. Then don't, but you have to tell him how you feel. I can't believe I'm considering it. Mini soda bound, he asks, dancing in place. Chapter 33 Sienna Road tripping with Maverick is as fun as you'd imagine. He has the best playlists. At every gas stop, he loads up on tons of candy and junk food. And he doesn't let me get too in my head and convince myself that this was all a terrible idea and we should turn around. Okay, he doesn't stop that last thing from happening, but he does laugh and make me feel better when I voice all the really awful thoughts churning in my brain. On the morning of our second day... I see a sign for South Dakota. Do you think we could make a stop? Yeah, we're about three hours away from Rhett. You want to have brunch and talk about the epic way you're going to confess your love? I stare at him, unblinking. No, but now I'm worried just saying the words is going to be a letdown. He chuckles. Where do you want to stop? Elias is training nearby. I've never met him and we're so close. Also, I think I need a pep talk from my best friend because my stomach is in knots. Maverick hands me his phone. Punch in the address. Thank you for doing this. All of it. Talking me into it and driving. Elias is going to lose his mind. How'd you meet Elias? YouTube? I grin. He was documenting his journey, living and skating with long QT. I stumbled onto it right after I was diagnosed, and we exchanged some messages. That led to texts, which led to us talking every day, sometimes multiple times a day. He's kind of my best friend. Always strictly friends? He studies me carefully. Always. You'll understand when you meet him. He's impossible not to like. Kind of like you. 
Throwing me off with a compliment, or is that sincere? He shakes his head. Doesn't matter. I accept. When we get to the arena where Elias is training, I end up having to call him so we can get in. Auburn, South Dakota may be a small, nameless city, but the arena is big and grand and heavily monitored. What? How? He stops six feet away and then rushes forward and crushes me in a hug. You're real. That would have been some impressive catfishing. We gawk at each other for a few minutes. His dark hair curls around his ears, and his brown eyes are a shade lighter than they'd seemed through the phone. He's tall, which I knew, and has that lanky but strong build of a typical male figure skater. He's the same in person, and any weirdness I felt at finally meeting him in person is quickly dissolved when I discover it's just as easy to be with him in person as it is on the phone. I angled my body to introduce the guy at my side. This is Johnny Maverick. Traded up already? Elias lifts a brow. Mav cackles. Traded up. That's hilarious. And thanks for saying up instead of down. The other one is currently on my shit list, so it isn't hard to look better than him right now. Elias, I slap his arm. I know, I know. His ex died. It's awful. But I'm still pissed he took off. The guys shake hands, and then Elias takes us on a quick tour of the building. It's impressive, and I find myself already missing the hours I've been lucky enough to spend on the ice the last four years. Oh, how I'm going to miss skating every day. I have to get back. How long are you staying? Can we skate together? I would love that, I look to Mav. Do we have time? Yeah, I wouldn't mind checking out that ice myself. Awesome, Elias grins. Sit wherever, don't talk to the mean-looking lady with the flaming red hair, and I'll be done in about two hours. Mean-looking lady with the flaming red... Ah, found her. Mav leads the way to a row about midway up. I snort. That's his coach, and she's amazing. There are two other pairs on the ice, but it's Elias and Taylor I focus on. I've seen videos online of their competitions and some clips that Elias has sent, but they're even better in person. Taylor has this presence about her, and Elias is a great partner, syncing with her and making every movement seem so connected and like it's all about her. What are you doing over there? I ask Mav a while later. We've barely spoken since we sat down, since I've been so enthralled with watching. He's leaned back, smiling at his phone. Sexting Coda. What? Well, that definitely has my attention. No way. Let me see. He sits up and shows me a picture of Dakota holding Charlie. Okay, I was expecting something a little sexier. She's watching her for me while I'm gone. That's nice, but how is that sexting? Trust me, I invented this move. What move? Sending chicks I'm interested in pictures of my dog to get their attention. It's a signal, and way more effective than nudes. Wait a minute. I pull out my phone and scroll up toward the beginning of mine and Rhett's text history, then show Mav. He covers his mouth with a fist. Worked, didn't it? Of course you traveled with your skates, Elias says as I step onto the ice. Mav did too. I nod my head to where he's skating around, hockey stick in hand. This place is incredible. I look up and take in the view from down here. And here I was feeling sorry for you being in small town hell. It's pretty nice, he admits. His gaze goes to Taylor. How are things? Good. We decided to give dating a shot. I stop. Dating? Yeah, it isn't a big deal. We figured the only way to keep things from being weird was just to date, give in to the chemistry. I laugh, the first time I've really, truly, genuinely laughed in a week. So hard, I can't stop for a full minute. I'm sorry, I say, clutching my stomach. I don't mean to laugh. Do you really think this is the less weird route? He flashes a sheepish grin. Probably not but she kisses like a damn goddess about to be struck down by Zeus. Is that good? It's, he holds his hands together in front of his face, so good. 
I'm happy for you then. It'll be good while it lasts, he says with forced lightness in his tone. I hope for his sake that it ends as casually as it started. He's so close to reaching his gold medal dreams. So, he starts, what's the plan? You're going to just show up at Rhett's house, and then what? I don't know, I admit. I just need to tell him to his face that I love him. Maybe he already knows, but until I've said the words out loud, I'm going to feel like I didn't do everything I could. You still haven't told him? You're dating your partner? He flashes a sheepish grin. It probably won't matter. He loves me, and that wasn't enough. I think he wants to protect me. From? My broken heart. Did he say that? Elias looks pissed at the prospect. No, not exactly. But he said that the last thing he wanted to do was hurt me or bring more stress into my life. He gives me a small smile. I guess I can't blame him for thinking I can't handle it, considering I nearly fainted when we found out Carrie had died. I hate so much that he has any question that I'm capable of being there for him, and I hate even more that I let him down when he needed me most. Honey, you're not broken. He knows that. Or he should. Don't even try to play the woe is me card. You're the strongest person I know. You're a motherfucking badass. He said it for the same reason you haven't told him you love him. I just haven't found the right time. Sorry your ex-girlfriend died, but hey, consolation prize, I love you. You're no one's consolation prize. I know, I sigh, and I know he doesn't think that. But what if... I place my hand over my heart. What if he can't deal with being with someone who could drop dead at any minute? It is a lot, especially now. We're all ticking time bombs. You're scared, he's scared, life is fucking scary. People don't like to be reminded of their mortality. True. Elias and I don't get the luxury of believing we're untouchable. We know better. But anyone that gets close to us has to accept that too, and that can be a really hard thing to admit. What if he can't get over this? What if he doesn't come back? Then Ricky really is a dumb hockey player. Elias takes my hand. It's so weird being here with him, skating, like we've done it a million times before. Do you want to meet Taylor? Oh my gosh, really? Is it weird if I ask her for an autograph? He laughs under his breath. Oh, she's going to love this. Mav and I climb back into his SUV. We're only a few hours from Rhett's house, and the nerves and anticipation slam into me. This was an awful plan. How did I let you talk me into this? I ask Mav when we're on the freeway. It's a great plan, and I talked you into it. All too soon, the signs for Rochester Town start appearing, indicating we're close. Maybe we should wait until tomorrow— he could still be busy or, I don't know, out with friends. Really? Mav asks with a chuckle. No can do. I've got to be north of the city for dinner. I have just enough time to drop you, say hey to Rhett, and get back on the road. You're leaving me? Relax, I'll be back later tonight. What's north of the city? The Wildcats, my team. He taps the Wildcats hat resting on the dash. Forgot I was a big shot pro hockey player, didn't you? He winks. I don't think you get to call yourself a big shot pro hockey player until you play an actual pro game. He grins. Do they let you drop in and practice during the Valley offseason? Nah, just have a meeting with the coach and my agent. I'm too worried about seeing Rhett to pry, but a few minutes later, Mav asks, Want to know a secret? I nod. I'm not going back to Valley next year. Why not? He shrugs a big shoulder. It's time. We won a national championship. There's no topping that. Wow. Does anyone else know? He shakes his head. It's our little secret. I blow out a shaky breath as he exits the freeway. He takes his eyes off the road for a second to look at me. You're gonna be fine. What if he isn't excited to see me? That's what you're worried about. I hate surprises. They never go as planned. 
Something Elias said earlier keeps replaying in my mind. Stop. Pull over. Mav's brow furrows, but he pulls into a coffeehouse parking lot just off the freeway. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine, but I can't do this. See, not because I'm afraid he doesn't want to see me. I turn to face him. I'm a motherfucking badass. Mav's body shakes with laughter. <laughs> yeah, you are. He asked this one thing of me. I can't roll up and try to convince him not to do it. What about telling him you love him? I will. But for now, I think I have to believe in what we have. If I show up there, I'm basically proving that I can't handle whatever life throws at us. I can. I'm strong enough. If he wants to run, that's on him. But I'm here. Or I was there. I was strong enough, but he wasn't. I'm not sure I follow, Mav says. I open the door, phone in the other hand. Give me five. Stay, I'll grab some coffee. Thanks. I shut the door and Maverick gets out of the vehicle. I have no idea what I'm going to say, but my finger hovers over Rhett's number when a text pops up. Rhett. Hey, Angel. Back in MN and have a new phone. A second one pops up while I'm rereading the first for a third time. Rhett. This is just something I have to do. I can't explain it. I know it's the worst possible timing with school ending, but I can't come back until I'm sure. Fuck, I don't even know what I need to be sure of. Rhett, I'm sure that I miss you. I type out a dozen responses. I want to tell him how I feel and beg him to come back. Of course I do. I miss him. But if he doesn't want to lean on me right now, I can't force him to. Me. I miss you too. I get it. Do what you have to do. But I'm here if you need anything. I power off my phone so I don't crack and tell him I love him over text message. He'll come back. He has to. Mav climbs back into the driver's seat, hands me a cup, and sets his in the middle console. Well? I'm sorry that I dragged you 1,500 miles from school for nothing, but I have to let him do this his way. He nods slowly. You're sure? Positive. All right, he slides on his sunglasses. Want to meet my new team? Chapter 34 Sienna Mav and I get back to Valley Wednesday night, and the rest of the week I'm playing catch up on my classes. It has been a crazy month, but luckily my professors are as eager for the semester to be over as I am, and I didn't miss any quizzes or major assignments. And without ret or skating to occupy my time, by Friday evening I'm caught up and bored. I finally meet up with the girls at the dining hall. I knew they'd have a million questions, and I'm not disappointed. The second we sit down at a table, they start asking me questions about ret. You went all that way there and then didn't even go see him? Jenny asks. I couldn't. I wanted to, but I just couldn't. Have you heard from him? Reagan smiles sadly. Just a couple texts. I shake my head. Hopefully he's dealing or doing whatever he needs to. It's only been a week, Dakota says. A week that has felt like an eternity. I hoped that from afar maybe he'd open up more, but it's been radio silence while he deals with this on his own. Yeah, I sit taller. I know. I just miss him. I can't believe you drove all that way, Reagan says. It wasn't a total loss. I got to meet Elias, finally, and the Wildcats roster. I'm not sure which was more exciting. Dakota leans forward. I know Elias is your best friend and all, but the locker room of men? One man is never better than a hockey roster full of them. Except when it's the right one, Reagan says. With a roll of her eyes, Dakota says, well, until then, she waves her hand, I need details. I tell them everything I can remember about Maverick's new team and the giant arena where they practice. I leave out that he's going to be playing for them sooner rather than later. As far as I know, Maverick hasn't told anyone else about his decision to leave Valley and go pro next year. 
Eventually, Reagan and Jenny leave us to sit with their boyfriends. Are you aware that Mav thinks you were sexting him while we were gone? I tell Dakota as we leave the dining hall. Um, what? The picture you sent him with Charlie. He has this whole theory on how sending a picture with his dog is better than sending dick pics. She stares blankly, as in more effective at getting him laid. So that's why he keeps sending me photos of him and Charlie. We both laugh. What's your night like? Dakota asks. Want to hang out? I'd love to, but I had to trade some classes while I was gone. Tonight, I'm teaching two beginner-level yoga classes. I'll come with you. I was going to run at the track, but the last class I took with you kicked my ass. How long have you been doing it? Yoga or teaching it? Both? My mom was always doing yoga around the house when I was growing up. I would do a pose or two with her, then get bored and go do something else. Then when I got to Valley, I took a more advanced yoga class. It was so hard, but I loved the challenge, and it really helps with skating. I swiped my card on the door reader to let us in the locked room. And I started teaching when I realized I could get paid for doing something I was planning on doing anyway. She laughs. It doesn't suck the joy out of it for you, being a job? There are days I dread coming, but once class starts, no, I love it. That's really cool, and you're good at it, so it works out well for everyone. I start the music and sit on the floor to stretch out. What are you going to do this summer? She lets her shoulders sag forward, and the end of her red ponytail falls over one arm. I have applied for so many internships, but so far they're either unpaid or the salary is so low I couldn't afford to feed myself. What kind of internship are you looking for? I ask. While we wait for people to join the class, Dakota tells me she wants to do public relations or marketing, and she's hoping to find something this summer to get some experience for her resume. It looks like it's going to be another summer working at the Hall of Fame. It's so quiet over the summer. The only people that come in for tours are alumni wanting to relive their glory years. Oh, that sounds kind of nice. A few people have joined us and are rolling out their mats and getting ready. It really isn't. Never fails. I get stuck listening to an hour's worth of stories about how much harder they partied back then or how much better the team was. I laugh at the visual. I'm whining. I'm sorry. It's a wonderful job, and I love it, but I'm starting to seriously stress about graduating and getting a real job. I feel that. I've spent many nights lying awake wondering if I should just get another degree and keep doing this for another couple of years. Working out and getting paid? I could get down with that, too. Dakota is athletic and in great shape, but after the first class, she falls back onto her mat and declares that she is done. That was beginner? She places a forearm over her eyes. You didn't have to do the modified versions. I was trying to keep up with you. I failed. Thanks for coming. It was good to chat and get my mind off everything. Anytime. I was thinking... She bites the corner of her lip. Uh-oh. I think you could do this as a job after college. The pay is crap. I'd be living in cheap apartments with 12 roommates. What if it wasn't? Then sign me up, but I've looked around. It's crappy pay and no benefits. I have an idea. Can I stay and record the next class? You want to record the class? Well, no. I want to record you. Maverick walks in and raises a hand in greeting before he joins us. Staying for class or just finishing up? he asks Dakota. Both? She looks to me. I'll only record you. I won't get anyone else, so you don't have to worry about getting waivers or permission or whatever. Record her for what? I want to show Sienna how great she could be teaching yoga online. I'm sorry, what? You'd be great at that, he says definitively. You can get me in the shots. I make yoga sexy. Dakota rolls her eyes. Don't deprive the world of my mad yoga skills. What do you say? She asks me, grinning hopefully. It's time to start class, and I don't have time to think through everything she's throwing at me right now. 
fine. Yes to recording, but try to make it look casual so it doesn't disrupt the class and only me and Maverick. Yay! She does a little happy shimmy. And no posting anything until I see it. Of course, it's going to be amazing, I promise. Mm Mm-hmm, I'll believe that when I see it. My class doesn't seem to notice Dakota filming from her mat, but I do. I spend the first five minutes stiff and robotic in my movements and instruction. Soon enough, though, I'm able to get into the flow and mostly forget that someone has a camera aimed at me. When class is over, I cringe as she approaches with her phone. It's okay, I don't need to see it to know how awkward that was. Mav stands beside her, staring at her screen. It's a little shaky at the beginning. I had trouble finding the right angle, but there's some good stuff here. Look at that perfect form, Mav grins. I hate to admit this, but the camera loves you, she says to him. His smile couldn't be any bigger as he throws an arm around her shoulders. Is the room free? Can we try a couple of things? You don't have to do this, I say. I want to. Why? Because, as your friend, I see potential in you that you cannot see. There are so many yoga videos out there already. Most of them crap, admittedly. When I'm not convinced, she adds, you have a story that makes people want to like and follow you, and you're a really good yoga teacher. Plus you're hot, Mav says. I laugh, but Dakota nods. He isn't wrong. That helps, too. Let me take some video and play around with formats. You're right, there are a ton of yoga videos out there, but they don't have you. Fine, okay, what else do I have going on tonight? That's the spirit, she says with a laugh. Over the next week, things get easier. I miss Rhett something fierce, but I keep busy with classes and Dakota's new obsession of turning me into a yoga influencer. I cringe every time she says the word influencer. We film videos, take photos in the studio and all around campus. I have to say, even if I never get the courage to post any of it, it was worth all the time and energy in distracting me. Let's go out tonight, Dakota says Thursday afternoon. We're video chatting as I walk back to my dorm from classes. I can tell by that look on your face you were planning to stay in and sulk. I'm not sulking. I just don't feel like being overly happy. She laughs at me. Noted. I will make sure you only have a decent time then. Nothing too fun. Okay, I'm in. I'm going to ask Josie and Olivia, too. They've also been pestering me about going out so I can please everyone at once. Cool. I'll see if I can pry Reagan and Ginny away from their men. We meet up at Dakota and Reagan's apartment. They've bought enough wine and mixed drinks to keep the whole group of us drunk for a week, and Dakota has dance music pumping in their living room. We have sparkling water, Gatorade, and Diet Coke, Reagan says as I enter the kitchen to survey the drink options. Thank you. She shakes her ass as she walks away, cup in hand. Meet you on the dance floor. For almost an hour, that's exactly where we stay. We have a dance party in the middle of their living room, belting out every lyric and jumping around. It feels good to get lost in the music and the moment with my friends. We move outside to take a break. Josie sits beside me and rests her head on my shoulder. I can't believe you're graduating and leaving me all alone. Hey, Olivia nudges her from the other side. We should throw a party to celebrate. Josie says, sitting tall. We could do it at Kate's house. You guys don't need to do that. This is perfect. Just my girls. We'll be there too, she says. And maybe some hockey boys. They tend to follow these two around, Dakota says and points to Ginny and Reagan. Please, Josie asks. It'll be so fun. Let us send you off with a proper goodbye. She kisses the air. I smile. Sure, that sounds great. Thank you. But my chest aches when I realize the only hockey boy I want won't be there. The next morning, I wake up early. 
My body refuses to accept that I no longer need to be up and at practice in the mornings. So I get dressed and head there anyway. I warm up and then fall into my old routine. It's weird to think that there will be no more new programs. I'm not sad about giving up competing or shows. I could do both of those things if I really wanted. And I know I'll still skate. I'll make time for it because I love it. But this, just being on the ice with nowhere else to be, I will miss it being such a big part of my daily routine. The lights are still dimmed and I'm the only person here. With both the hockey teams and our season being done, I can finally have a little bit of that solitude on the ice I've been wanting all semester long. Admittedly, it isn't as great as I thought it would be. I was used to keeping people at arm's length before a ret. I used a lot of things as an excuse. Needing to skate, my heart condition, and probably a million other things. But he changed me. I don't think I can ever go back to believing that I'm better off on my own. I'm strong enough to skate, to love, to give someone all of my heart, every imperfect piece. I just hope that when he comes out on the other side of this, he can accept it and accept me. Every imperfect piece. Chapter 35 Red. It's quiet at the rink. Summer camps haven't started and few people come in before late afternoon when school is done for the day. Probably feel small after all the big arenas you've been skating in the past four years. My mom appears at the gate. Still my favorite. I stop in front of her. Anything you need me to do? I could help with one of the classes later. We've got it covered. I know you do, but I'm here. I might as well help. You're not on the payroll for another month. Mom, come on. Let me help. I heard you and Dad complaining about the coach for writer's class. I can jump in there. I know that you're eager to be useful while you're here, but that's not why you came, and I don't want to have to replace you if you decide to go back. If you want to help today, fine, but just for today. I'm not going to up and leave you high and dry. I love this place. And it will be here in a month or two when you're ready. It's exasperating not having a purpose to the day. For years it's been school or hockey, and now I wake up each day, do whatever classwork I need to finish and submit so I can still graduate, and then come to the rink. I'm here when it opens and usually when it closes, but my mom has been adamant that I take this time for myself. Officially, my role will be teaching private hockey lessons and work in the camps. I'm excited to start. I have all sorts of plans for expanding the rink and making it better. But she's probably right. I used Sienna as a crutch in Valley, and here I'm doing the same, trying to keep so busy I don't have to really deal with it. I've been home for almost two weeks, and still I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Have you gone to see Corey and Cam yet? I hang my head and give it a shake. The look she gives me says more than her words ever could. Oh, shoot. Is that the time? She glances over my head to the clock on the wall. The repair guy still hasn't shown up and I have to get your brother in ten minutes. I'll get him. She gives me that look again. Fine, then at least let me call the repair guy and I will call Corey tomorrow, I promise. She's out of choices and she knows it. Invite them to dinner this week. Mom, you don't have to. It's going to be hard. Don't make it harder than it needs to be. She straightens. That locker room door has to be fixed today. We have a peewee hockey game here tomorrow morning, and I need a working door. If they try to put you off, call someone else. I will manage. Go. I give up after I get three answering services and one person who says they can do it, but can't get out until the week after next. Digging through the maintenance closet, I find tools and head off to the boys' locker room. The mammoth, solid wood door is heavy as fuck. I'm sweating and swearing as I try to remove it from the hinges. Anyone here? Someone calls from the front doors. Hang a right, I call and rest the door against the wall, thankful the repair guy finally decided to show his ass up. It's probably going to take the two of us to get it back on. I wipe my hands on a rag as he steps into view. His jeans are far too clean to be the repair guy, and there's no toolbox in sight. Rent? He juts his chin. Yeah? Who are you? He grins. A cocky smirk that flickers recognition in my brain. Elias. To what do I owe the pleasure? Wait, does Sienna know you're here? She'll be so pissed I met you before she did. No, she doesn't know, but actually I met our girl last week. 
Really? I smile, picturing Sienna's face meeting her best friend after all this time. He nods. I get the sense he's not going to give me more details unless I pry. How is she? Oh, no, you won't get any info out of me. I chuckle. Fair enough. Want to tell me why you're here, then? In time, Robbie. Kind of far from Toronto to swing by. We're training in Auburn for the next two months. It's my partner Taylor's hometown rink. Well, if you're not going to tell me why you're here, want to grab a side? This store is sticking. A little kid couldn't get out last night. Major catastrophe. Elias snickers. I'll bet. We work together to replace the warped hinge and then get the door back on. Thank fuck, I say when we test it out and the door swings open without issue. I toss him a dirty rag to wipe his hands and then grab a couple of straight chairs and motion for him to sit while I do the same. Place isn't half bad. He sits and glances around the arena. It's been in my family for four generations, skating and hockey camps in the summer, classes year-round, and we rent it out for teams. I have a lot of plans to expand and bring in more revenue opportunities, but in time. Reminds me of the rink I grew up skating at. His gaze continues to roam. She almost came to see you. She did? My heart kicks up a notch at just the idea. She talked herself out of it, decided you needed to work out your shit on your own. I nod. I guess I did say that, and I meant it. But in the time we've been apart, I just feel like I'm slogging through mud. I'm slowly losing my mind, or what's left of it anyway. I miss her. But? I don't want to drag her down with me while I work through my shit. Because you don't think she can handle it, physically? I stare at him. Her heart condition? It's cool, man. I get it. I can't tell you how many people have walked away because it's more than they can deal with. If you and Sienna have any chance together, you're going to have to lean on her. You're going to have to trust that she's strong enough. Of course she's fucking strong enough. I didn't leave because I don't think she's healthy enough to deal. Fuck, is that what she thinks? I'm angry and sad, and she doesn't deserve any of that. She's an angel. My angel. Do you want to know what makes me and Sienna so close? What makes any two people close, I'd wager. I don't respond, but he keeps going. Going through challenging shit together. Being vulnerable and letting the other person see all your fucked upness. For Sienna and me, it's our heart condition. We get to say things to one another. Scary shit that we can't admit to anyone else. Cross my heart, hope to die. I do the X over my heart I've seen them do a dozen times. Exactly. This is different. It really isn't. She just wants to be there for you, whatever you need. You said it was coming here, so she let you go. She's a tough chick. She'll always give you what you need, but is that really being thousands of miles away from her? You've been through some shit, and I'm sorry for that, man, truly. But girls like Sienna don't come around very often. I suggest you get your shit together, Rhett, and go get our girl before I have to see her sad face one more time when I call. I've got my own problems I need her to focus on. I chuckle, knowing that's exactly how Sienna and his relationship goes. She helps him. She's his rock. He stands and offers me his hand. I have to get going, but I'm glad I stopped by. You're not half bad, hockey player. Don't make me regret liking you. The following night, Carrie's parents come over for dinner. When we're finished, we all go outside. My mom and Corey walk around admiring the new garden mom put in this year. Dad and Ryder are playing catch in the yard, and that leaves me with Carrie's dad, Cam, sitting on the porch. I'm just waiting for him to dig into me for missing the funeral. School already done for the year? No, two more weeks to go. My professors are letting me turn in assignments remotely. He nods thoughtfully. Planning on going to graduation, or are you going to skip that too? He gives me a look as he lifts the bottle to his lips. Cam was in the military, a sergeant, and he has this glare that makes a man want to piss himself. I don't know, I say honestly. I wipe a sweaty palm on my thigh. I'm sorry that I left. I should have been there. That's why I came back. I know it doesn't change anything, but I felt like I needed to be here. How many lefts are you going to take to try to make it right? I'm still going to graduate even if I'm not there. I don't need to wear the cap and gown. I don't even need the degree. Not really. I've always known I wanted to work at the rink and someday take it over completely. And you don't need to go to a funeral to grieve. If you're looking for absolution from me, you won't find it. Hell, you don't need it. I know how much you cared about my daughter, and that's enough for me. I swallow. Thank you, sir. 
Knowing he doesn't hate me is a relief, but it doesn't make me feel as good as I hoped. He asks about the rink, hockey, school. We bullshit and keep the conversation light until my mom and Corey wander back over. We should probably get home, Corey says to Cam. She smiles at me. It was good to see you. Stop by the house sometime, huh? I will. I get up to walk them out. Corey hugs me a little teary-eyed. At the front door, my parents follow Corey out to her car, still chatting away, and Cam hangs back to shake my hand. You know, most celebrations in life aren't really about the person you're supposed to be celebrating. Funerals, baby showers, graduations. Your point? There are a few things I was looking forward to more than watching my baby girl walk across the stage and get her college diploma. He squeezes my hand a little harder. Understand what I'm saying? I glance at my mom and dad. Yes, sir. He hugs me. I think it's the first in all the time I've known him that he's ever embraced me. It's not his style or mine, but something tells me he isn't hugging me right now. He's hugging the closest thing to his kid he's got left. So I hug him back, and then I go inside and pack my bags. Chapter 36 Rhett The early afternoon sun soaks up the dew on the grass, and birds chirp in the distance. The soil underneath my feet is still new, and the grass hasn't had a chance to grow yet. I thought I'd know what to say by now, I whisper to Carrie's headstone. I guess I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I didn't know how to be your friend after everything we'd been through. I'm sorry that I hurt you because that's never what I wanted. I let out a sigh and look up at the blue sky. I'm mad at you, Carrie. I'm so mad at you for getting in the car. I know that doesn't make any sense. I hoped someday we could be friends. Maybe that was wishful thinking. I don't know. It doesn't make any sense to me. Why you? Why now? You were going to do such incredible things. That much I know for a fact. Your parents are going to be okay. Don't worry about them. I'll look after them. I wasn't always a good friend. I probably wasn't always a good boyfriend either. But you're the first girl I ever loved, and I'll never forget you. I back away from the grave and then turn to get in the car. Are you okay? My mom asks when I'm seated in the passenger side. Yeah, I'm okay. She hugs me. She's been doing that a lot lately. I think Carrie dying hit us all in different ways, and I don't know when we'll feel normal again. Not today, that's for sure. My mom starts for the airport, and I swivel in my seat to face Ryder. Ever since I announced I was leaving last night, he hasn't spoken to me. I'm going to miss you, Ry. But I'll see you in two weeks for my graduation, and then I'll be back for good. The only acknowledgement I get that he heard me is him turning his head farther away from me to look out the window. I was wondering if you wanted this. I pulled the Bruins hat out of my bag. I bought it for someone a long time ago, but she didn't really like it. I leaned closer to him. She wasn't really a fan of the Bruins. Can you imagine? You never could resist teasing her about the Bruins winning the cup that year. Mom smiles at the memory. Yeah, I guess I had bought it as a joke, but she held on to it, and giving it to Ryder just feels right. He didn't know Carrie that well, but I think she would have wanted him to have it. He squirms and eyes the hat in my hands. It's like yours, but cleaner. Yep, I hold it out to him, but he still doesn't take it. I'll tell you what, I'll set it here, and if you don't want it, just put it back in my room later, okay? Finally, he looks at me. Are you going away like Carrie did, or are you really coming back? I can't speak for a few seconds as I swallow the lump in my throat. I'm really coming back. He doesn't look convinced, so I unbuckle and crawl through the opening between the seats to the back. What in the world? My mother laughs as I try to squeeze through. It is not easy. You're too big, Ryder giggles as I struggle to sit beside him. And I laugh too. It feels good. I put the hat on his head and then hit the brim of mine against his. I'll see you soon. I get back to Valley late Sunday evening. Adam picked me up and I had him bring me straight to the arena. I knew she'd be here. I could feel her, and every step closer to the ice feels like I'm rushing to the finish line. She's it for me. She's my endgame. When I see her, it takes my breath away. 
Hiding in the shadows, I put on my skates and watch her glide around the ice. My heart hammers in my chest, and my stomach is in knots. It's crossed my mind that she might not be nearly as excited to see me as I am her. She stops in the center of the ice. Her chest rises and falls as she catches her breath. She places her hands on top of her head and scans the arena like she's memorizing it. Fuck, I missed her. I miss the way everything feels better when she's nearby. I thought I was relying too much on her, like she was a drug that I couldn't live without. I was so scared that staying would destroy us both. But the truth is, I can live without her, and she can live without me. We were both doing just fine on our own two months ago. I don't want to be fine. I want to know that I have a partner that will let me lean on her when life kicks me in the teeth, and the same for her. I want to be her person and kick life in the teeth when it tries to mess with her. Slowly, I walk toward the plexiglass. Seconds or minutes pass as she stands there, center ice, taking it all in. The click of the gate catches her attention and her eyes widen slightly when I step out. It's the only indication that I've caught her by surprise. Red? My name out of her mouth sets every part of me on fire. I thought I'd find you here. Habit? She still hasn't moved. You're back? I go to her. Yeah. I'm back. How are you? I mean, did you do what you needed to? Truthfully, I'm not sure. I'm still a little lost. I get that. Some days I feel like I dreamed the whole thing. I feel guilty and sad. I'm pissed at myself and at the world. I'm even pissed at Carrie, which I realize makes me sound like the worst possible asshole. You're not an asshole. I'm going to try my hardest not to be but I'm still figuring out how to move forward. Basically, I'm a mess, but I want to be here with you. But you said... I was wrong. You were trying to tell me that it was okay to unload on you and I couldn't bring myself to believe it. Everything is better with you, and that isn't me not dealing, that's just the honest truth. I know you think I'm broken, that my heart makes me weak, but it doesn't. I can handle it. I don't think that. I never thought that. I didn't leave because I thought you weren't strong enough. I left because I wasn't sure I was. You are the strongest chick I know, the strongest person I know. Your heart isn't broken, you're not broken. I hate that I ever made you question that. When people get close to me, they realize one of two things, that there's a good chance that I might die, or they internalize it and realize they're not bulletproof either. Which are you? I'm both. I can survive a lot of things, but not living without you. She blows out a breath and a small smile curves her mouth. Wow, you should disappear more often. I had some help getting there, I say, then add, Elias came to see me. He did? He's a good friend. I'm glad you have him. You're his rock. Turns out you're mine too. I don't know what to say. You caught me off guard. She wraps her arms around her middle, keeping her distance. It stings, even though I knew it was a real possibility she'd tell me to eat mud. I was hoping her response would be an enthusiastic yes, and then lots of kissing. I've missed kissing her and holding her. This is all so sudden. Maybe I could have some time to think about it. Damn, I really fucked this up. I nod slowly. Of course. I know how much you hate surprises, but I needed to see you as soon as I got back. I'll text you. Okay, yeah. Uh, you have my number. I give her finger guns, and then a little piece of me dies that I'm fucking this up so badly. I turn and skate off the ice as fast as I can go. When I get to the gate, she calls after me. Hey, Rothress. I compose myself, ball my hands into fists, and turn. No finger guns, asshole. Yeah. She skates to me, stopping short and spraying me with ice. Amusement twinkles in her green eyes. I'll skate you for it. A thousand pounds lifts off my shoulders and I bite back a smile. You want to race me? If you win, then you get my heart. And if I lose? She launches herself forward and hugs me. Air fills my lungs and I breathe in all of her. I love you so much. I'm so sorry I left. Never again. I'll prove it however you want me to, as many times as you want me to. You already own my heart. I don't know when it happened, but I'm madly in love with you too. 
I smash my lips to hers. We stumble around on the ice, kissing and hugging. It's impossible to get close enough. I need her. I want her. Forever. We might need to get out of here because I have a feeling getting my balls stuck to the ice would fucking hurt. She laughs into my mouth. Take me to bed then, Rothris. Or the bathroom, maybe? She pulls back and gives me finger guns. I groan. I'm never living that down, am I? Definitely not in this lifetime. And that's exactly how long I intend to keep her. This lifetime, and all the others, too. Chapter 37 Rhett Do you guys want to watch a movie or something? Adam asks from the doorway while giving me finger guns. I flip him off for mocking me. I'm the dumbass that told him, and I really regret it. The guys mock me with it hourly. Whatever. I got the girl, so what if I had to make an ass of myself to do it? I'm sure it won't be the last time. Nah, I have to watch some creepy-ass documentary. A pillow hits me on the side of the head. You said you wanted to watch it. I said I wanted to spend the night in bed naked. Not the same thing. This, she holds up her laptop, leads to this. She waves a hand in front of her. Adam grins at Sienna and then nods. I'll leave you guys to it then. Oh, wait. Sienna stops him before he leaves. Did Reagan tell you about the party Friday? Yeah, she mentioned it. She said you wanted me to spread the word? Yes, please. All the hockey players. Thinking of trading me in? I ask with the lift of a brow. No, but where the hockey team goes, others follow, and Josie wants this party to be epic. My buddy taps the door frame. We'll be there. It'll be my final order as captain. Thank you. Sienna beams at him. Her smile makes me smile, a big dopey grin that is basically the equivalent of finger guns. We lie in bed, Sienna between my legs, her back resting against my chest as we watch the documentary. It's about a serial killer who targeted people in their homes at night, and it is creepy as fuck. She doesn't seem phased. Of course she doesn't. I close my eyes for a second, but I must doze off, because the next thing I know I'm being woken up by a half-naked woman and a fully erect dick. Did you like the documentary? She purrs. Mm-hmm. My voice is gravel. I especially like the end part where you got naked. You fell asleep? I'm awake now. I slide my arms around her and press her into me while tilting my hips up. Her mouth covers mine in a sweet and slow kiss. She pulls back and green eyes stare at me for a long beat. What's wrong? Heart beating too fast? I reach for my phone and pull up the tracking app. Seems normal. Chest hurt. She gapes at the screen. Oh my god, Rhett Rothris, did you sync my watch to your phone? Damn right I did, Angel. I can't decide if that's serial killer creepy or sweet. Definitely sweet. I put my phone back and flip us so I'm on top. She's shaking her head but grinning at me in that way that makes my heart feel all fluttery. I love you. I love you too, Angel. I hop up and lock my bedroom door. Afraid someone is going to walk in on us? No, I'm afraid I'm going to be murdered in my sleep. Her sweet laughter fills the room. I'll save you, baby. She has no idea how much she already has. Friday night, we head over to Kate's house for Sienna's party. I don't think Adam had to do much convincing to get all the guys here. Sienna said free keg, and they all perked right up. My girl is looking extra fine in a short skirt that I intend to have my head under before the end of the night. Did you tell your parents? I ask as we walk up the sidewalk toward the house. Yep. My dad was a little bummed, but I promised him that if I failed miserably, I'd reconsider working at his company. You won't fail. Dakota took a bunch of photos and videos of Sienna doing yoga, and it blew up. There's this one where she's doing some pose on the ice, and it is fire. She's working on making a paid site where users can gain membership to online classes and uploaded videos. I'm excited for her. I'm also excited that I was able to convince her she could do that just as easily living with me. I have a surprise. Sienna stops short of the door. But you hate surprises. This is a good one, I promise. She pulls me through the house to the backyard. My teammates are all standing around in their jerseys. And damn, there's a lot of people here. People really do follow wherever we go. Surprise! 
I don't understand. I thought this was a party for you. It is, kind of. They wanted to throw me a party, and I figured out a way to celebrate both of us. I know things are still hard, but you have a lot to celebrate, too. You won a national championship, and you have a great job lined up. Plus, you got me. She pulls a wad of blue material from her purse and holds it up. It's my hockey jersey, or a really good replica. How'd you pull this off? I ask, pulling my jersey down over my head. Man, I never thought I'd get to wear it again. I swear I've got goosebumps. A mischievous grin pulls at her lips. I can't say, but if they aren't returned by noon tomorrow, I might not graduate. You're incredible. Thank you. You haven't seen the best part? She steps back and picks up a confetti cannon. A deep chuckle rumbles from my chest. Swiping it from her, I fire it into the air above us. It rains down as I kiss her. Now this feels like something worth celebrating. Epilogue Sienna The girl sitting in front of me shoots me a glare and plugs her right ear. I keep right on screaming, though, as Rhett walks across the stage with his diploma. He catches my eye and holds it up. I do the same. We did it. He comes down the side aisle, and I abandon my seat to meet him at the back of the gymnasium. I leap into his arms, tassels dangling between us. We graduated. Thank fuck. He picks me up and twirls. Ready to party, Angel? We have an early dinner with our parents. Our fathers have become best buds overnight. They both love their time on the lake, football, and their families. And I think our mothers have planned a vacation together this summer. Good thing I don't plan on getting rid of you anytime soon, Rhett whispers in my ear, because our families would be devastated. Get rid of me? I rest my hand high up on his thigh, dangerously close to his balls, and squeeze. I said I don't plan on getting rid of you anytime soon. Maybe I plan on getting rid of you. Oh, no. You're stuck with me for at least the next year. I smile at the mention of our lease agreement. I still can't believe it. We found the cutest condo not too far from his family's rink, and it has a lake view that is going to be amazing for recording yoga videos until I get a studio of my own. I can't believe this is my life. Can we steal Allison for the night? I ask as we're hugging our family's goodbye. I promise to return her before you need to leave for the airport in the morning. No drinking, my father says immediately, like my master plan was to take my 15-year-old sister out and get her plastered. Cleaning up puke is not on the agenda tonight. We head straight to the arena. What are we doing here? Allison asks as I hold open the door for her. Our friends are waiting in the tunnel. Allison goes a little starry-eyed when she sees all the guys in their skates with sticks. We're going to play a little hockey, I tell her and loop my arm through hers. You're on my team. Seriously? Her voice squeaks. Seriously. Mav steps forward and hands her a stick. Let's see if we can find you some skates in the equipment closet. The rest of us walk out onto the ice. Reagan's clutching Adam's hand, and Dakota is holding her arms out, yelling at anyone that gets within three feet of her. I've got this, she demands. Just give me a second. I'm going to miss this, I say, watching our friends as Rhett and I skate together, holding hands. Me too. It hit me when we stepped out here. I'm never going to play another game of hockey. He looks up into the empty stands. I mean, I knew it. It's been more than a month since our last game, but it finally hit me. In the weeks since Rhett's been back at Valley, there have been times he's battled his emotions. Sometimes he'll take my hand or hug me a little tighter, and I know that he's struggling a little more in those moments. And I'm just there. Right now it's my turn to be the rock, but I know there will be times I'll need him to be mine, too. When we skate around to the benches, I reach in and grab two hockey sticks. You'll play. You will. You've got beer league written all over you. He grins and lifts the hem of his t-shirt, showing off his six-pack. Top tier. I hand him a stick. Plus, you'll need to keep sharp if you're going to beat me. Yeah, 
one brow lifts. You think you can take me, Angel? Oh, I know it. It's all in the butt. His gaze is glued to mine as I turn and stick it out and take a shot. The ding of the puck hitting the post finally makes him look up and he lights up. Admiration burns in his eyes. It really is the best sound in the world. Or maybe it's the way he's looking at me like I'm his everything. He skates in a circle around me. Been practicing? No, I got lucky. I fist his t-shirt in my palm to drag him closer. I got really, really lucky the day Rhett collided into me. And every day since. Epilogue. Rhett. Three years later. 23, huh? I ask Ryder as he walks out to the bench wearing his game jersey. He shrugs it off like it's no big deal, but I love that my little bro is carrying on the Rothrus number. Are you ready for today? I ask, taking a seat on the bench. It's the mighty Cubs' first game of the season. I get another lift and fall of his shoulders. I might be more nervous than any of my players. It's my first time coaching, and even though it's just a bunch of local kids looking to have fun and play hockey, I feel the pressure like I did going into big college games. How much longer? My brother stands impatiently near the gate, ready to take the ice. They're almost done, I assure him, and find my wife at the other end of the rink teaching a group of three- and four-year-olds. They march forward toward a pile of toys in the center of the ice. Sienna marches in front of them in tennis shoes, showing how it's done and encouraging them to lift their legs higher. Her pregnant bump leads the way, and pride, excitement, and more than a little nerves spreads through my chest. She's 36 weeks and hasn't been able to skate since we found out she was pregnant around nine weeks in. But she refused to give up teaching. She's good at it, too, particularly with the younger kids. They love her. She started coaching figure skating the summer after we graduated. It began as a way to make money while she built her yoga business, and now she splits her days between the rink and her studio. I came up with a few more names for the baby, Ryder says, pulling my attention back to him. Let's hear them. I cross my arms over my chest. I was thinking Peter or Parker. The corner of my lips twitch with amusement. Spider-Man? He grins and nods. Or Bruce for the Hulk, Clark for Superman. There are so many good options, and how cool would it be if the baby was named after someone awesome? Sienna's class is finished. The kids clutch their toys in their hands, and she corrals them off the ice. I'll run them by the boss. Okay. He stands, anxious to get out there. Cool. Stay out of the way as Dad cleans the ice, all right? I head towards Sienna as he rushes out with his hockey stick and a handful of pucks. Hey, Angel. I palm her stomach and drop a kiss on her cheek. She whimpers and places a hand on her lower back. This kid of yours is misbehaving today. Smiling, I place my other hand on her stomach. Don't worry, little Angel, I'll protect you from your mom. I don't know a lot about being a dad yet, but I know this kid already has me wrapped around its finger. Only two more weeks until I get to meet him. Because of her heart condition, the doctor recommended a C-section. And because my girl hates surprises, she was all for having a date on the calendar. Are you staying for the game? I ask. Of course. I picked out a seat right next to the bench so I can heckle the hottie coach. I'm nervous, I admit. You're going to be great. Ryder's ready to carry you to victory. She nods her head where he's skating backward in front of the Zamboni like it's a defender. I start to yell at him to move, but our dad's grinning from the driver's seat. Good luck, coach. When the rest of our team arrives, I give the world's worst pep talk while sweating bullets, and then send them out to play. Some of these kids have been playing together since they were in preschool, which means they pick up the slack of my novice coaching. Ryder's incredible. At eight, he's already a great hockey player. By the start of the third period, I've relaxed. We're up by five, and I'm rotating my players through to give everyone a chance to play together. A tug at my elbow makes my gaze snap to the left. Sienna stands outside of the bench in the walkway to the tunnel. Angel, come to kiss the coach? I lean against the half wall and stare out at my players. I've come to steal him away, she says. It's time. Time for what? I'm still staring at the game as we talk. It's time. I give her my attention and her words sink in. It's time? She nods. Oh my gosh, it's time. My dad's right behind her and steps into the bench, 
grabs my shoulder and squeezes. I've got it from here, coach. We'll meet you at the hospital. Thank you, I rush out, taking Sienna's hand. I don't remember the drive to the hospital or getting her signed in. It isn't until they shoo me out of the room to administer the epidural that all of my worries and anxiety about being a dad and Sienna going through delivery hit me at once. I pace the hallway. My mom arrives and tries to calm me down, but I don't breathe easy until I'm back in the room. I rush to her bed and let out a shaky breath. Easy there, Dad, the nurse says as my knees buckle. Would you like to sit down? Sienna smirks, but then another contraction hits and her face contorts with the pain. No, I'm good. I take Sienna's hand and let her squeeze it until the bones feel like they'll break. I'm here, Angel. Just breathe. Her pain gives me something to focus on. I thought the epidural stopped the pain. It'll take a few minutes to kick in, the nurse says while Sienna continues to crush my fingers. When it's time, I'm given scrubs to put on over my clothes and a hairnet and little booties. I stay right by the side of her bed as they wheel her into the surgical room. She looks over to me with tears in her eyes. What's wrong? Does it still hurt? I'm ready to throw down in here until I find someone who can stop the pain. What if something goes wrong? I swallow thickly. Everything is going to be fine. What if I'm a terrible mother? No chance, Angel. I'm so scared. Distract me. I lean over her until my mouth hovers next to her ear. Then I sing. The same song I sang the first time she dragged me to a real karaoke night. And the same song I sang to her as we had our first dance at our wedding. Mr. Brian Adams has come through for me in some clutch moments. She closes her eyes and smiles as I sing heaven. That's exactly what she is. My heaven, my angel. Here he is, the nurse says with a soft smile as our baby cries out. We look up as they place our son on Sienna's chest briefly. He's got her dark hair, but the rest I don't make out through the tears in my eyes. My heart swells and I feel more pride and love than I ever have. He's perfect. Sienna puts her nose to his head and inhales. I kiss her temple. Absolutely perfect. The next morning, we are bleary-eyed from lack of sleep, but deliriously happy. Mom stayed most of the night with us, but had to leave to see to the rink. Dad brings Ryder by just as the baby is waking up. He walks in with slow, hesitant steps. Do you want to meet your nephew? Sienna asks him. Dad takes a seat next to me, and Ryder goes to stand next to the hospital bed. Mom wouldn't tell me what you named him. Did you go with one of my suggestions? About that. I stand and step up beside him. We talked about it, and Sienna and I decided you were right. He should be named after someone awesome. Ryder grins. Which is why we named him after you, Sienna says. Meet Ryan Ryder Rothris. My brother's eyes widen and his mouth pulls up into a smile. Cool. The four of us chuckle and stare at Ryan. Dad hands me a little blue teddy bear. From Corey and Cam. I take the soft, stuffed animal in my hands and feel a twinge of sadness for all the moments like this that they won't have. I've done my best to keep my promise to carry. I talked Cam into helping with our middle school hockey camps in the summer, and I have coffee with Corey every Sunday morning. It doesn't change anything, I get that. Somewhere along the line, my promise to look after them became a way to remember her instead. Ryder grins from ear to ear as he sits on the bed next to Sienna, and she carefully places Ryan in his arms. I can't wait to teach him to play hockey. Maybe he wants to be a figure skater. Sienna nudges him playfully. Ryder scrunches up his nose. Sienna's phone rings from the table and she lifts it with a smile. I know that smile. It's reserved for Elias. They still talk almost every day, and a few months ago he and Taylor spent a month with us while they prepared for a competition. The day continues with family and friends calling and stopping by to see us. Adam calls and I give him every detail from Ryan's dark hair to his tiny, perfect toes. Maverick texts congrats and makes plans to come see us as soon as he can. Even Heath gets the news and sends congratulations and best wishes from him and Ginny. When night falls and the hospital quietens, it's just the three of us. My little family. I crowd in next to Sienna on her small bed and Ryan sleeps in the bassinet beside us. The TV is on mute as we watch the Wildcats game. Maverick's having a great game, Sienna whispers with her head resting on my chest. He asked if he could be Ryan's godfather if he got a hat trick tonight. She lifts her head an inch. What did you say? I said, hell yes. She laughs quietly and then yawns. I don't think I've ever been so tired.
or so happy. Me either, Angel. I closed my eyes. Get some sleep. He'll be up again soon. Mm-hmm. I think it's the first time I've ever looked forward to being woken up by someone crying or screaming. I probably won't even sleep long enough to dream. Doesn't matter. Even the wildest dreams couldn't compare with this. This has been Broken Hearts, Campus Nights Book 3. Written by Rebecca Jenshack. Narrated by John Lane and Savannah Peachwood, both members of SAG-AFTRA. Produced by One Night Stand Studios. Post-production by Austin Halterman. Text copyright 2023 by Rebecca Jenshack. Production copyright 2023 by Rebecca Jenshack. All rights reserved. This is Audible. This is Wild Love, Campus Nights, Book 4, written by Rebecca Jenshack, narrated by Connor Crace and Elizabeth Louise. Chapter 1, Dakota. He's ridiculous. I'm getting back from my morning run when I spot him. The apartment complex is just starting to wake up. It's the last week of the spring semester, and between finals and the nightly end-of-year parties, everyone is exhausted and ready for summer break, me included. I slow my run to a jog as I cut through the parking lot of my apartment. It's hard to tear my eyes away from him, but I do as I navigate around cars and people. I pass a couple of fellow Valley U students heading out to their cars, backpacks slung over their shoulders, coffee in hand, eyes still bleary. Morning, I chirp, and receive mumbled greetings back. At the sidewalk in front of my building, I let my gaze return to the walk of shame in progress from his first floor apartment. Johnny Maverick is shirtless, athletic shorts hanging low on trim hips, tattoos covering his chest and arms. Ridiculous, but undeniably hot. The girls, because, yes, there are two of them, cling to him like their rumpled dresses from last night hug their curves. One blonde, the other black, both stunning. I bite back a smile at the three of them. Since he scored a hat trick in the final game of the Frozen Four, Maverick has been the center of attention at Valley U, and by the look on his face, he's very much enjoying it. I hang back as he says goodbye to his guests. Call us later? The blonde asks after she kisses him on the cheek. He says something I don't catch, and the girls walk hand in hand away from his front door. His gaze lifts as he stares after them. When he spots me watching him, a sheepish grin pulls at his lips. Good morning, Coda, he says, sounding far more awake than the people I tried to offer the same sentiment to in the parking lot. I laugh. Yeah, I'll bet he's having a good morning. I wait until his guests are out of earshot. Have fun last night? Always. Missed you, though. I was looking for you. I ignore that remark. I see how much he missed me. Hey, I'm not blaming him. Johnny and I have a complicated relationship. Complicated, but easily summed up as he hits on me and I turn him down, because clearly he isn't that serious. You're up early, he says, and his gaze rakes over my sweaty body. Out for a run? I nod, feeling the sweat pool at my lower back. Despite having just rolled out of bed, he looks as handsome as always. His dark hair is messy, but his hazel eyes are bright and his smile playful. His French bulldog Charlie races out of his apartment and circles my feet. I lean down to stroke her soft fur and scratch behind her ears. Hey, pretty girl. Did you have to avert your eyes all night long? Mav chuckles and runs a hand through his hair. The movement makes his abs contract and his bicep pop. I scoop her up to distract myself from checking out her owner. She's small, but heavy. 
Her coat is white with splotches of black. She's adorable. Charlie licks my face and I laugh and hand her over to her owner. Up this close, I can smell him, or rather the girls he was with. You smell like sex and vanilla. Vanilla. He snaps his fingers. I was trying to place the smell all night. She smelled like vanilla. Which one? I glance back at the parking lot, but they've already disappeared from view. Blonde. Does Blondie have a name? He squints one eye and smirks. Do you really care if she does? Good point. I'm still standing close, and Charlie rests a paw on my arm, looking for attention, which I absolutely give to her. Maybe you should let Charlie stay with me when you're entertaining. Or maybe we cut the other girls, and you could stay at my place and keep us both company. I roll my eyes. See what I mean? Not serious. I can't believe any line that comes out of your mouth actually works. I don't usually have to run lines. I mean, look at me. All this could be yours. He grins as if he knows how absurd he sounds. At least shower off the last girl. I'm sorry, girls, before you hit on me. He smiles at me, which always makes me feel a little off balance. Not just because he's totally hot. Maverick has this way about him that, despite all reasoning, he makes people feel important and seen. Or he does me, anyway. Our attention is drawn upstairs as the apartment door above his opens and my best friend and roommate, Reagan, and her boyfriend, Adam, tumble out. Arms around her waist, Adam walks her backward toward our apartment across the breezeway. He presses her against it, devouring her mouth. I gotta go, he says, but keeps kissing her. Mav and I are frozen, staring at them. The air crackles with the chemistry between them. A flight of stairs separates us, but I can feel how desperate they are for each other. Just ten more minutes. Reagan opens our door and they disappear into it, slamming the door behind them. Mav's deep chuckle sounds beside me. Want to come in for a few minutes? Not really, I mumble, but follow him. What is it with everyone this week? They're... I pause, searching for words. Mav drops Charlie in the living room and continues into the kitchen. Fucking like the world is ending? Yeah, that. I scan his living area for evidence from last night. I don't want to sit anywhere that he had sex in the past 24 hours. It's the end of an era. People are graduating, moving on. He holds out a Powerade and a bottle of water. I take the first, and he motions toward the couch. I think I'd rather sit outside. He cackles like he knows what I'm thinking. If he did, he'd be repulsed with himself and not smiling like a guy, well, like a guy who just had a threesome. To be clear, I'm not anti-threesomes. I'm not really anti-anything when it comes to sex. I'm just so over all of it right now. All of my friends are deliriously in love, and I feel like I'm the last single person. I might not be ready for my own happily ever after, but can't a girl find a decent guy to date? The last few guys I've met think foreplay is sexting, and dating is meeting up when it's convenient for them to get drunk and then go back to their place. How far did you run this morning? He asks, holding the door open for me. I push past him and sit on the second step leading up to my apartment. He falls into the narrow space beside me. Just two miles. I have a tour at the Hall of Fame this morning. Some hockey guy named Toby Russo. Oh, right. Coach is salivating over that kid. Not you? He takes a long drink from the bottle in his hands and then leans forward so that his elbows rest on his thighs. He'll be an asset wherever he goes but something about him rubs me the wrong way. You've met him? Yeah, he was at the Frozen Four. He came up to me after our first game and gave me some tips. I snort. He gave you tips? Seriously? Maverick is one of the best college hockey players. 
I'm not just saying that because we're friends. There's a list. Yeah. He nods his dark head. What did you do? I told him thanks and walked off. That's it? I've gotten really good at letting criticism and condescending assholes roll off my back. I think he means his father. I don't know a lot about John Maverick Sr., but I know that the few times Mav has talked about him, he lost a little of the playful, fun demeanor that he's known for. Well, I think you're doing okay. Plenty of people are waiting in line to ease the burden of your success and celebrate by getting naked. In pairs, apparently. He grins. Could have been you. We all hung out upstairs and then went to the hideout. I was looking for you. Where were you? I went out for a little while, then crashed so I could get up early and run before work. Date? Yeah. A guy I met online. Total waste of time. I knew within seconds we weren't compatible. I sigh. I cannot tell one more guy my favorite color or pretend to care about the places he wants to travel to someday. I'm so over it. I need a change of scenery. I spent $20 on drinks last night, and for what? What are you doing this summer? He leans back on one elbow. I applied for some internships, but so far, nothing. It looks like I'll be staying in Valley and working at the Hall of Fame. I bumped my shoulder against his. Maybe I could start a coffee and dry cleaning service for the chicks that come out of your apartment in the morning. Not unless you're moving to Minnesota. What? I pause, bottled to my lips. That's why I was looking for you last night. I wanted to talk to you. I stare at him, trying to make sense of the words coming out of his mouth. Talk to me about what? I, uh signed with the Wildcats, he says. Maverick came to Valley already drafted by the NHL team, the Wildcats. This isn't news, except, oh my gosh, signed as in, his eyes hold mine. I'm not coming back next year. I text the girls for an emergency group lunch, and we meet up on my hour break between work and classes so that I can fill them in on the Maverick news. I can't believe it. Reagan digs through her purse for gum and then offers it around the table. When did this happen? I'm not sure, I say, pushing away my plate. My stomach is a ball of knots. He told me this morning, none of you knew? Ginny raises a hand. Heath told me after the championship game. I would have said something, but he made me promise not to until Maverick announced it. Her boyfriend and Maverick are best friends, so it makes sense he knew before the rest of us. Still, I hate that I'm just now finding out. The championship game was weeks ago. Did anyone else know? Reagan asks. I don't think Adam did because he's terrible at keeping secrets from me. I did. Sienna raises her hand from the table the same way Jenny did. She's dating Rhett and the newest addition to our friend group. Newest, but no less important. I don't know what I'd do without these three. That's why he went to Minnesota, she adds, and the pieces start to fall in place as I think back to Maverick's actions over the past month. If he were anyone else, the signs would have been obvious. The trip to Minnesota, the extra partying doubling up on girls. I can't imagine him not living downstairs from me, or hanging out with all of us upstairs. He routinely makes me roll my eyes at his incessant flirting and over-the-top shenanigans, but he's part of our friend group, an integral part. All my friends are dating hockey players. I live next to them, I party with them, I even work with them doing recruitment tours at the Hall of Fame. It really is the end of an era. Is Heath leaving too? Reagan asks Ginny, her gaze narrowed. She shakes her head and fingers the end of her long blonde braid. No, he wants to finish school. And hang out with his awesome girlfriend, I point out. Heath and Ginny have been inseparable since they started dating last fall, and I can't imagine a world in which he goes anywhere without her. That too... She smiles, a little smitten and doe-eyed. 
The three of them talk about all the changes happening while I am lost in my thoughts. There is this underlying excitement as they talk about it, even though their words are sad, and lunch includes no less than five group hugs. Sienna graduates next week with Rhett and Adam, and now that I know Maverick is leaving too, I feel an odd pang of sorrow. Up until this moment, I've had a hard time feeling the same sadness as my friends that things were changing. Maybe because I'm so ready for change myself that I couldn't wrap my brain around what they were feeling. No matter where Sienna goes, we'll stay friends. And being friends with her, I'll also get tabs on Rhett. And since Adam is staying in Valley for medical school and dating my roommate, I know I'll see him too. Things were changing, but they didn't seem so permanent as Maverick leaving does. Ginny leans forward and rests her palms on the table. Heath is throwing him a party tonight at the apartment. Shirts are optional, but fun is not. I feel my brows lift. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? She giggles, and her brown eyes light up with humor and excitement. It's seriously the tagline for tonight. And you should see the amount of Mad Dog we bought. A party where MD2020 is the drink of choice and shirts are discouraged? The knot in my stomach loosens at the ridiculousness that I've come to love about our group. Only a party for Maverick would require a tagline. Chapter 2. Johnny. A knock at the front door sends Charlie running toward it, barking. Heath's voice calls from the other side. Mav, are you home? I pull open the door and step back to let him in. My buddy sits a large box on the coffee table in the living room. I think I got everything, but I'm going to do another pass to make sure. I move forward and open one of the flaps to see inside. What is all this? Your shit? He plops down on the leather couch. Video games, headphones, books. He shakes his head. I had no idea I was hoarding so much of your stuff. You should see how empty my room looks now. I pull out a pair of Beats headphones. I gave these to you. Loaned, he says definitively. He has a hard time accepting gifts, which is too bad for him because I like giving them. I thought you might say that. I walk over to the kitchen counter and pull a new pair of headphones out of the box they shipped in yesterday. I toss them at him. He sits up and cradles the box, turning them over and then sliding the headphones out. No way. He smiles, but his excitement is short-lived. He sets them on the table next to the box. Mav, no, I can't accept these. They're like $300. So? So? He chuckles. Take your pick, but I'm leaving one of them behind. And whatever is in that box is yours too. The less I have to move, the better. He sits back on the couch and glances around the apartment. It was never very lived in. I spend most of my time hanging out at his apartment with Rothris and Scott upstairs. But it's been home for the past year. The dorms the year before that. Two years I've been at Valley U, two of the best of my life. And now I'm leaving. It's surreal. Classes are done Wednesday, and when everyone's done partying and heads off for the summer, I will too. I don't need to be in Minnesota for another two weeks, but I've already signed a lease on an apartment. And Coach Miller said I could start using the workout and practice facilities as soon as I want. The Wildcats season is over, and camp isn't until July. No rest for the wicked, though. If I want to keep myself from being sent down to the minor league team, I need to start contributing immediately. It isn't going to be the same without you my buddy says. It wouldn't be the same regardless. I'd take a seat in the recliner next to him. Rothriths and Scott are both done, and there'll be a new group of rookies. My voice trails off, and I'm hit with the finality of my decision. I've signed, and there's no going back now. I hope I made the right call. My dad, for all his faults, is a smart man, and he seems to think I made a good decision. And believe me, he doesn't approve of many of my actions. I know. I miss playing with you, though. It isn't too late. You can come with me. We can start our pro careers together. I smile and pretend that I think there's a real chance he might take me up on it. He won't. He isn't going anywhere until he has a degree. I respect that. Heath hasn't had the easiest path getting to where he is. 
He doesn't take any of it for granted. He wants a fallback plan. Me? Well, I guess the money in my bank account gives me the freedom to not worry about what happens if hockey doesn't pan out. And they say money can't buy happiness. He points at me and then waggles his finger. Two years, and then I'm coming for you. Can't wait, I say honestly. He's already been drafted by the Coyotes, and I'm looking forward to meeting him on the ice. Who knows, maybe someday we'll even be on the same team again. The guys want to have some time, just the four of us, before everyone comes over. You ready? His gaze drops to my bare chest with amusement. You said it was a shirtless party. I run a hand across my pecs. I even put on some of that shimmery lotion Ginny's always leaving around your apartment. It really does catch the light and accentuate my best assets. He laughs, shaking his head and smiling at me. Fuck, I'm going to miss you. Upstairs at their apartment, we find Adam and Red outside on the deck. It's hot today, but there's a nice breeze. They stand and show off their shirtless torsos. I laugh and Heath pulls off his t-shirt as well. Aw, oh, you're all going shirtless for me? That's the best going away present ever. Maybe we should just make it a naked party. Let's get weird. Keep your pants on. Adam Scott comes forward and hugs me, slapping me on the back twice. Congrats, man. Thank you. Rhett Rotheris is next. He embraces me quickly and then steps back and adjusts the Bruins hat on his head. I might have to start cheering for my home state team now. Eh, I don't care if you cheer for the team. Just coming to watch me play will be enough. He's from a town not far from the Wildcats Arena and moving back there after graduation to work with his family. He laughs quietly. Definitely. Heath brings out the Mad Dog, my favorite drink, and hands us each our own bottle. Oh, fuck. I don't know if I can drink an entire one of these, Scott says as he gets a whiff of the sweet liquor. Party rules, Heath tells him and holds up his bottle. He's the only one staying. Technically, Adam will still be in Valley while he goes to medical school, but the team won't be the same. It's been a wild ride playing with the three of you, living together, drinking, just hanging out. Congrats to all of you. Cheers. Rothrus is the first to clink his bottle against Heath's, and Adam and I follow. Cheers. I take a long swig, swallowing down the emotion swirling with it. Let's get redonkulous. Their girlfriends are the next to arrive. Ginny, Reagan, and Sienna file out together and go straight to their boys. Dakota is with them, and when I get a good look at her, I bark out a laugh. That for me, sweetheart? I heard shirts were optional, she says, batting her lashes and doing a spin that sends her red hair whipping around her head. The shirt, or scrap of white material barely covering her tits, is held up by two thin straps around her shoulders leaving most of her back bare, too. She's lean and toned from running, and her skin looks soft and tempting. She's gorgeous on any given day, but when she's trying to impress, she could kill a man. I approve. Every day should be a no-shirt day. You can't handle all this every day, Johnny Maverick, she says with a teasing tone. Man, but I'd love to give it the old college try. I scoop my arm around her back and pull her against my hip just like I thought her skin is soft, and she molds perfectly to my side. She swats in my chest. I think I might miss you. I'm definitely going to miss you. Someone starts the music and more people join us outside. Dakota starts to move away, but I tighten my grip. Dance with me? Now? She looks around. No one else is dancing, but I give zero fucks. I'll take any excuse to keep her at my side. Yeah. Now? Later? All night? She has a slender but athletic build, and she's a great dancer. I can't think of a better way to spend my last party at Valley than dancing all night with the best chick I know. Maverick! A freshman teammate calls out to me as he approaches, holding up a bottle of Mad Dog. Coda opens her stance to acknowledge him, and I reluctantly let her go. I always let her go. She's too beautiful, too smart too rad, too everything for me. Yeah, I'm definitely going to miss her. With one last look in my direction, she hits me with those sexy blue eyes. Enjoy your party, Johnny. Chapter 3. Dakota. 
The guy's apartment is packed tonight. People crowd out onto the deck and into the living room. It's a real possibility we're over capacity on this creaky deck, but at least we're only on the second floor. Okay, so I know we were mocking the optional shirt tagline for the night, but holy shit, why did we not think of this sooner? Reagan looks around from where we sit on a couple of loungers on the right side of the deck, and I follow her gaze. She's not wrong. Most of the guys took off their shirts in honor of Maverick, and some girls, too. When I pulled the smallest shirt I owned out of my closet, I had no idea I'd be one of the most dressed people at the party. I should have. Everyone loves Maverick. He's easy to love. He's fun and generous, and he has this way about him where he makes people feel included and important. When he's talking to you, he gives all of him. He's a shameless flirt, and I'm not sure how much of what comes out of his mouth is actually serious, but he makes people feel good, and that's worth something. First order of business next semester, throwing a shirtless party in our new apartment, I say to Ginny and Reagan. The three of us are moving in together now that Ginny can move out of the dorms. We're staying in the same complex, just moving into a three-bedroom place. They nod eagerly, as if they don't have hot boyfriends they see shirtless on the regular. I don't call them on it. It's a rare moment that my friends are by my side at a party and not with their boyfriends, and I'm enjoying it. Everyone is trying to soak up time with the people they won't see, and my friends will see their boyfriends. Each one of them is not only coupled up, they're deliriously in love. And I feel like I'm never going to get past the talking phase. Reagan says I'm too picky, but I really don't think that's it. I just want more than, hey girl, what's up, texts that are followed by a string of get-to-know-you questions that tell me nothing about the guy I'm talking to. There has to be a better way. Is that the same girl Maverick left with last night? Ginny asks. I'm already aware of exactly where he is and who he's with, but I watch with the rest of my friends as Vanilla Fields places a hand on his forearm and leans forward. She's beautiful. Curvy, big blonde hair that looks like she walked off the stage of a beauty pageant, and she skipped a shirt altogether and wears a black lacy bra that barely contains her boobs. One of them, I say, and force myself to look away. I feel the girl's questioning gazes on me, and I explain how I stumbled onto him walking two girls out of his apartment this morning. He was looking for you last night, Sienna says. It could have been you in that Johnny sandwich. My chest flutters. No chance. I would have gladly taken Charlie to my place, though. The things that poor dog has seen. Well, Jenny stands. My man is looking far too sexy to be left alone. Reagan nods in agreement. Yeah, I need to go intervene before that girl standing next to Adam touches him one more time. Does anyone have bail money just in case? I snort laugh. <laughs> no, behave yourself. He loves you. He does, doesn't he? Dimples dot her cheeks on either side. You good? I'm good. Have fun. Reagan and Ginny make a beeline for their men, but Sienna stays sitting beside me. Go, I say, aware she's probably staying so I'm not alone. I'm going to get another drink and then do a lap and scope out the ab situation. Did you see Liam? I did not expect all those muscles under his polo shirts. Are you okay? She asks. Her brows pinch together and she studies me closely. Yeah? I smile and shift uncomfortably. Of course. Why? You and Mav. I thought maybe the two of you... She doesn't finish either sentence, and I hang on her words, wondering why she might possibly think the two of us would be a good fit. Me and Maverick? I ask, disbelief in my tone, but that fluttering thing happens in my chest again. Why? Just a feeling when you two are together. She shrugs and looks from me to him. 
There's more to him than he puts out for most people to see. There is? I take in his muscles and tattoos. Vanilla Fields is still talking to him, and he laughs at something she says. His whole body shakes with it. Sienna angles her body and rests her knees against mine. When I had my skating accident last year and was in the hospital for a month, Maverick sent me flowers every single day. Every day. It was always some bright, happy bouquet. Sounds like he was into you. That wouldn't surprise me. Sienna is sweet, beautiful, and a super talented figure skater. No, that's the thing. He never sent a note or said anything about it. He didn't want me to know they were from him. I don't understand. I got curious and called the florist. They wouldn't give his name, but their description was enough for me to put the pieces together. I tried to picture Maverick walking into a flower shop and ordering a dozen bouquets. Surprisingly, I can see it. The thought makes me smile. People don't give him enough credit. He loves big and wild. And often, I point out. Jealous? She smirks. No, definitely not. I could never be with someone like that. He doesn't take anything seriously. All right. She places both hands on her thighs. If you're not going to stop Mav from having a repeat with Blondie over there, then do you want to dance with me? Dance? Where? It's packed out on the deck and in the living room. Rhett's room. He pushed everything to one side for us. She grins. One last dance party? She holds out her hand and I place mine in hers. Absolutely. It's just the two of us at first, but the music calls to more people, and by the third song, Rhett's room is packed with girls dancing and singing along. And where girls gather, boys are sure to follow. Smiling and feeling free and happy, I glance over and catch Maverick watching me from the doorway. His signature smirk is in place, but his eyes don't light up with humor in the same way they usually do. My breath catches in my lungs, and I blame Sienna for the seconds that I hold his stare, wondering just for a moment if there could have been something more than friendship between us. He strides toward me, and I pause my dancing. Having fun? It's rhetorical. Johnny always has fun. It's his only mode. I'm sticky and breathless from dancing, and my throat is thick, making it hard to breathe. All the talk of lasts and people leaving has made me emotional. The alcohol probably isn't helping. Johnny moves to the beat in front of me. We've danced before, but I've never felt this awkward about it. I'm so aware of every breath and the strum of my pulse growing faster with every second. His chin dips and he circles my waist with a strong arm, taking over and swaying us to the music. My body tingles everywhere his warm skin touches mine, which, thanks to the lack of shirts, is a lot of surface area. I stare anywhere but at him, down at our feet, at Sienna who flashes me a smile as Rhett pulls her from the dance floor, probably to a secluded corner somewhere to make out. I look anywhere but up at Johnny's face until I can't take it any longer. The tips of my ears burn with that feeling of being watched, and I lift my head and lock my gaze on his. I wonder if he feels it too. This sadness that we won't have chances like this again. Sure, we might see each other again someday, but it'll never be like this. It's a now or never moment, and you can't be in that moment and not wonder what if. Right? I can't read anything on his face. The smell of vanilla hits my nostrils, and I turn to see the blonde from last night dancing beside me. When I glance back, Mav's gaze slides from her to me again, squashing whatever moment we were having. Vanilla falls in behind him, and he presses closer against me. I lean in so he can hear me over the music. I'm going to get some air. Want some company? A light laugh escapes my lips as Vanilla glides her fingers around his stomach. No Johnny sandwich for me tonight. 
I'm good, I say, and step away, letting her have him. I blow out a shaky breath. It's probably time to switch to water. When I reach the kitchen, Adam's pulling on a t-shirt and Reagan has her purse on her shoulder. There you are, she says. Are you in for one last late night game of sardines? I nod. The fresh air should help the heat coursing through my veins. Have you seen Mav? She asks, looking around. I don't think he's going anywhere except to his apartment for a repeat with the chick from last night. And I'm pretty sure Sienna and Rhett are off somewhere having sex. I'll grab everyone, Adam tells us, and drops a kiss to Reagan's lips. Meet you outside. I run into my apartment to grab my phone. I left it earlier tonight when I headed to the party because I don't have any pockets and couldn't wear a bra either to stick it in. I'm scrolling through notifications as I walk back outside. In the short time I was gone, Adams managed to gather everyone, even Maverick. The eight of us walk toward campus in the dark. We've done it a hundred times before. It's sort of our thing. Late night parties often led to some combination of us and whoever we were talking to at the time playing sardines on campus. But tonight, as the school year is coming to a close, everyone is paired up except Mav and me. I'm surprised you came, I say, as I fall in beside him. It's a short walk, but we wander slowly. The happy couples in front of us spend as much time hugging and kissing as moving their legs forward. Are you kidding? This was my idea. One last time. He stares straight ahead and his jaw flexes. What about Vanilla? He shrugs. Maybe she'll still be around later. Of course she will. The party won't stop without us, and when we get back, he'll have a selection of girls to pick from. Besides, he moves closer and his arm brushes mine. You're my favorite partner, and we get to hide tonight. I have the perfect spot. Been saving it up for this. When we finally reach campus, Maverick leads me to his perfect hiding spot while the rest of the group gives us a head start. Over the years, we've set some boundaries to where we can hide, but we've never lacked creative ways to play the game. Inside fountains, under tables, behind trees and columns. It's so much more than finding a good hiding spot. Staying quiet and still, things Maverick always struggles with, are what usually get people caught. Tonight, staying quiet isn't a problem. I'm lost in my thoughts, wondering what next year will be like. Will those of us still at Valley come here? No, probably not. It won't be the same. I can't believe I've fallen into the same bout of melancholy my friends have. It isn't sadness that they're all leaving. I'm happy for them. They're all going to do incredible things. The problem is, I'm not. Everything okay? Mav asks as we approach the library. They're doing construction on one side. Heavy, translucent plastic hangs down, covering the work area. Yeah. I force some pep into my tone. Yeah, I'm good. Not sad we're all leaving? He sticks out his bottom lip into a pout. <laughs> I am, but I'll still talk to Sienna, and she'll fill me in on Rhett, and Adam isn't going anywhere. And me? I'll miss Charlie, I say with a cheeky grin. Will you send me pictures of her occasionally? Babe, if you want dick pics, then you just gotta ask. I laugh despite myself, and he holds back the plastic to let me go ahead of him. A light hangs above me, casting a soft glow on the area, but otherwise the space is open. What are they doing here? I ask as we both step in, and Maverick lets the sheet fall back into place. I'm not sure. Maybe outdoor seating? Ooh, that'll be nice. I picture it. Sitting outside, studying or chatting with the girls. That makes me think of Sienna not being there, and my heart hurts again. When I turn to face him, Maverick's gaze is pinned on me. Like earlier, he smirks, but his eyes are hard and swirl with emotion I can't decipher. I'm blaming the shirt. This shirt was designed with college boys' dirtiest fantasies in mind. Won't they be able to see us with the light? 
I don't think so, he says, staring out. From our side, it's only darkness. I couldn't see the guys working yesterday when they were in here. Go outside and tell me if you can see me. The sheet makes a crinkling noise as he steps to the other side. Anything? I wave my hands at my side. Little bit of movement, but when you stand still, I can't see anything. What about now? I step closer to the plastic, but keep my hands next to my body. No. One step closer, so that I'm almost standing directly against it. Now? He chuckles. No. Can I come back in before they spot me standing out here? I glance at my phone. They shouldn't have left yet. Yeah, well, they're all going to be anxious to find us and go back and bang. And you are not? Vanilla might have found another set of abs to go home with by now. I'm coming back in. Wait, I order. His footsteps outside stop. Curling my fingers around the bottom of my shirt, I roll the fabric up. The breeze buds my nipples, and I smile at the daring move, knowing he's clueless. Anything? His response is delayed, and I panic for a second, thinking maybe he can see me. Nah, nothing, babe. The light flickers above me, brightening and then dimming again. Quickly, I right my shirt and pull back the plastic separating us. I think we're all good. Mav and I sit side by side against the library wall. He pulls out a bottle of Mad Dog from his jeans pocket and offers me a drink. Humoring him, I take a small sip before handing it back. I'll never understand why that's your drink of choice. It's sweet and sticky. He winks and caps the bottle, then sets it between us. Actually, I drink it because it pisses my dad off. Why does it piss him off? It isn't exactly the kind of alcohol you serve at a black tie function. Let me guess. I find myself smiling. You would sneak it in just to get a rise out of him? He doesn't answer, but his expression says everything. The wind blows my hair around my face, and I tuck it behind my ears and then hug my knees to my chest. Despite the warm weather during the day, the night air is chilly. When are you leaving? I ask, keeping my voice low in case our friends are now looking for us. Not sure. He bends his legs and rests his elbows on his thighs. You're staying all summer? Looks like it, I say glumly. I got another, so sorry, we've gone with another candidate letter today from an internship I applied for. The last one. I'm officially out of options. There's got to be something out there. I've tried. I applied all over Arizona, and anywhere I thought my car could make it without breaking down. Either it's unpaid or it's so coveted that they have their pick of the best candidates. You're the best candidate, he says. Thanks, I mumble. My grades are good, but since I quit track, the only other selling points of my resume are intramural spike ball champion and working at the Hall of Fame. It's a great job, but at this point, I could do it in my sleep. The phone in my hand lights up with a dating app notification. W-Y-D, sexy. I literally cannot, I groan. It's the last straw. I swipe the screen angrily and delete the app off my phone. Mav's upper body shakes and he smiles, holding back laughter. I take it online dating isn't going well? Every single conversation I've had goes the exact same. I lower my voice. Hey, girl, what are you doing? Want to exchange pics? I don't trust online dating. Afraid of being catfished? Nah, it's just a vibe when you're with someone. You can't know that through a few texts. He might be right about that. All I know, I feel nothing for these guys that I'm talking to. Well, I'm done. Talking to guys is bullshit. Maybe you have the right idea. Hooking up, no feelings, and no chatting about hopes and dreams. I glance up at him. He's still staring at me, but he's not laughing. It isn't really like that. What's it like? I humor him. Tell me all your moves, Johnny Maverick. He stares at me intently, a small smile on his lips. Playful, 
cocky, charming. Reaching out, his fingers push back the hair that's blown into my face again. My breathing quickens as the calloused pads of his fingers scrape against the nape of my neck. He moves closer, and I swallow. The wind carries the sweet scent of liquor on his breath, and something clean and masculine. His soap, I think. For a split second, I think he's going to kiss me. He doesn't, of course. That would be crazy. Instead, he tilts his head to the side, eyes searching my face as his fingers are still on my collarbone, spreading warmth across my skin and low into my belly. The light flickers above us and I quickly look up. I don't know why. Reaction, I guess. When I drop my gaze, he pulls back, and then Rhett's voice slices through the night. There they are, behind the plastic. They found us. I'm thankful for something to say that breaks the awkwardness between us, but then Rhett's words register. Really? Register? Oh. My. God. I turn to Mav and he bites his bottom lip and his eyes dip to my chest. He totally saw when I flashed him. Chapter 4. Dakota. The following morning, I'm up making my morning smoothie an hour later than normal, thanks to the late night party. Life hack. A jug of protein powder and a tub of peanut butter will feed you for weeks. Also, it's cheap when you factor in the number of meals for the price. I'm not exactly destitute, but money is tight. I have student loans that pay for school and the apartment, but my Hall of Fame money has to cover everything else. Reagan stayed at Adam's apartment, so ours is quiet. I take my drink to the couch and pick up my phone. Out of habit, I look for the dating app, then remember I deleted it. I toss my phone on the cushion. It is better this way. I was going to end up on one of those TV shows for women who snapped if one more guy asked me if I was DTF after the second text exchange. A knock at the door gets me up, and I don't even question who it is. You never know around here. But Maverick is the last person I expected as I pulled the door wide. Hey, what are you doing here? He does a quick scan of me. I'm still in a tank top, no bra, and running shorts, and he isn't bashful about soaking up every inch of bare skin. I have a proposition for you. His deep voice rumbles down my spine. I step back to let him come in, then cross my arms over my chest to conceal how much my nipples seem to like his voice and the way he scopes me out. Propositioning a girl this soon after one left your apartment is a bold move, I say, as I grab a sweatshirt draped over the back of the couch and pull it on. I sit, and he does too. Not that kind of proposition. I note that he doesn't try to deny he took Vanilla home again last night, whose name, I sadly learned, is Claudia, and now I feel bitchy calling her Vanilla. Shame, it was so catchy. I angle my body to face him now that he can't see my nipples saluting him. What's up? How would you like to intern with the Wildcats this summer? The Wildcats? As in, the professional hockey team located in Minnesota? That's the one. His mouth curves up. I tried the Coyotes and the minor league team in town, too. My advisor said those internships get hundreds of applicants and fill up early. The Wildcats have spots still open? He runs a hand over his messy, dark hair. Yeah. They've already interviewed a bunch of people, but Blythe said if you sent over your resume this morning, she'd take a look. Blythe? She's the VP of marketing. Seems cool. My lips spread into a wide smile. It's dumb to get my hopes up, not to mention all the logistics of an internship in freaking Minnesota, but I can't help the butterflies in my stomach. Really? You're not screwing with me. Not screwing with you. She's waiting to hear from you. There are a couple of hours ahead of us, so I wouldn't wait too long. You did this? I just asked. I had to call and get some information this morning anyway. I lunge forward and hug him. Thank you, Johnny. 
A few seconds pass with me squeezing him before he returns the gesture. I feel his laughter and the words as he speaks them. You're welcome. I pull back, stunned and giddy at the prospect of getting out of Valley for the summer. I need a change of scenery. I glance at my laptop on the coffee table. I want to grab it and look up everything I possibly can about the Wildcats and Blythe, but he's still sitting here, and it feels rude after what he's done. He must be able to tell, though, because he juts his chin and says, Go. I have to get to class anyway. Isn't it kind of pointless to go to class now? Nah. He gives his head one quick shake. I mean, yes, it's probably pointless, but I want to soak it all up before I leave. His hand falls to my thigh and he squeezes. Text me later and let me know how it goes? Absolutely. Within five minutes of emailing my resume to Blythe, I get a call from the woman herself. Reagan's back home, and she smiles at me from the kitchen while I talk to Blythe. I love her. She's already my hero. 29 and the VP of marketing for an NHL team. The internship is eight weeks, working here in the main office. We try to give you opportunities in all areas, from selling tickets to creating content for our social media accounts. The longer she speaks, the more excited I become. It sounds amazing. Seriously, it's my dream job. I work at the university's Hall of Fame doing tours now. Johnny mentioned that. He also said we'd be crazy not to hire you. My laugh is stilted, and I cringe a little at what all he might have said. He's a good friend. It sounds like it, but I also think he might be right. You have all the qualifications and ambitions I was hoping for, and honestly, I just have a good feeling about you. You do? My smile widens, and I do a happy dance that she can't see. Reagan giggles from the kitchen. What do you say? Do you want to work for the Wildcats this summer? Oh my gosh, yes, yes! She laughs. Perfect. I will let our human resources manager know we filled our last spot, and she'll send over some information on the dates, housing options, and probably a million other things I left out. She usually does these interviews, but she's out today, and I wanted to talk to you before someone else pushed through another applicant. Thank you. I am so excited. Truly, this is a dream come true. I have no idea how I'm going to get there or how I'll afford two apartments, but I'll take a bus and live in a crappy budget motel if I have to. Speaking of, she didn't mention the pay, and I'm embarrassed to ask, especially as she's congratulating me and telling me that she can't wait to meet me in person. When we hang up, Reagan bounces over to me. You got it? I got it! I bounce back. I really got it! I have to go to class, but I want to hear all of it again later. She starts for the door and pauses with one foot outside. Don't forget, we're moving our stuff upstairs to the new apartment tomorrow. She hits me with a big grin again. Ah! I'm so excited for you. We are so celebrating later. The past few weeks have been one celebration after another, but I'm not complaining because this one is all about me. My excitement lasts through my morning classes and into the afternoon as I lead a few tours at the Hall of Fame. That's what I do, convince top recruits from all over the country to come to Valley University. I take them around the workout facilities and training rooms, to the field, sand pit, arena, or wherever their sport is played, and then I bring them into the hype room for the pièce de résistance, the Hype Room is where we show these epic videos, showcasing the current and past players. It's different for each sport, but the vibe and the reaction are always the same. The setup alone is impressive. The circular space requires a code to get in and out and is completely soundproof. The screens take up every inch of the walls from top to bottom and three quarters of the way around. The recruit and their family stand in the back, lights dim, and I just hit play. Okay, that isn't all I do. I am knowledgeable on all kinds of important facts for every sport on campus, but this room has proven to be the deciding factor on more than one occasion. And no matter the sport, golf can look badass in a hype video, fight me, 
And no matter how many times I see the videos, when the music starts and it begins to play, even I get caught up re-watching. I'm always a little awestruck by the athleticism and sense of team that these videos capture. Sometimes it even makes me miss the time I was a college athlete. They didn't have the hype room four years ago when I came to Tour Valley University and the track team, but I think I would have signed a lot sooner if they had. I'm waiting for my last athlete, a tennis player named Natalie and her family, when the email from the Wildcats Human Resources Department comes in. I open it, barely registering most of the standard contract language, but the word unpaid jars me back to reality. Oh, shit. I slow down and force myself to read it more carefully. Each word makes my smile fall and smacks me back to reality. Eight weeks unpaid. I can't go that long without a paycheck. I have some savings, but not much, and definitely not enough to do that and cover the housing and basic living expenses. I swallow down the lump in my throat and force a smile as Natalie and her family walk through the doors. I better get used to it. It looks like I'm going to be right here all summer long. I know I'm lucky, and I'm genuinely grateful for this job, but the thought of spending the next two months watching my friends fall even deeper in love with their boyfriends while I tag along like a fifth wheel makes me ache for something new and exciting and all mine. Chapter 5. Johnny Talking to my father is a little like playing hockey without pads. Everyone knows it's a bad idea, but occasionally you're fucking around, feeling lucky, and decide a quick no-hit game is fine. Everything is going great, and then all of a sudden some asshole gets pissed and slams you into the boards or you take a puck to the knee. You never see it coming. But after, when you're hobbling off in pain, you feel like an idiot for ever considering the idea. My dad isn't an asshole. At least he doesn't mean to be. I don't think. To be honest, I don't know him well enough to be the best character reference. Our conversations are few and far between. What I do know, I always hobble away feeling like an idiot. Did you get the samples? I hear him puff on the cigar and then the ping of a driver hitting a golf ball in the distance. Yeah. I glance over the unopened box with the Maverick logo on the side. It just got here today. Great, great. I sent some to the Wildcats office, too. Cool. I lean back on the couch. The family business has never interested me. Probably because it was often the reason I was alone. Mom and Dad would be at the office working or at events networking, and I was left home with nannies. By the time I was old enough to have any interest, I resented it too damn much. Now that I've got my own life and career, some of that baggage has lifted. And hey, free shampoo and deodorant. I'll have the company lawyer send the contract to your agent. We'll need to set up a professional photo shoot once you get to Minnesota. It takes a minute for his words to sink in. Oh, I sit forward. You want to endorse me? Of course we do. Maverick Company has been endorsing you for 21 years. Who do you think paid for school and hockey gear? It's great timing with a new mail line. We want to launch it in early August, so there's a lot of work to do. There it is. The sneak attack. Puck to the stomach. You're nothing without me and my money. My first endorsement deal and I can't even be excited about it. The company's just capitalizing on their investment. Right, sure thing. I gotta go, Dad. Me too, I'm about to tee off. I'll set up the shoe with you. Without a goodbye, he ends the call. I slump into the leather cushion and let out a breath, then push to my feet and open the box to see what the hell I'm going to be endorsing. I order pizza for the group and go upstairs, taking an armful of the free products with me. I drop them on the kitchen counter and wave my arms around. You too can smell like me. Heath quirks a brow. It's my first endorsement, I explain. He smiles. Congrats. Rothris pushes forward and swipes the deodorant, uncaps it, and brings it to his nose to smell. Maverick, he reads the label. This is your family's brand, yeah? A nod. New male hygiene line. It was unisex and female geared before now. 
He lifts his shirt and rolls it onto his pits. Well, I ask, how is it? He angles his body and Heath and I lean in and sniff his armpit. Manly, Heath backs off with a smirk on his face. It kind of smells like coconuts, I muse. I grab one of the body sprays and squirt it onto my shirt. It's not bad. Not great, either. We're proud of you, my man, Heath says. If I weren't so hungover from all the partying we've done the last couple of weeks, I'd suggest celebrating. But I don't think my body can take another night of drinking. Let's do something chill, I suggest. Grab the girls, and we'll watch a movie. The guys agree without any protest, and their girlfriends come over as the pizza arrives. Dakota, too. She doesn't look as happy as when I saw her this morning. When we settle in the living room, I take a seat next to her on the couch. How was the interview? It was great. Thank you again for connecting us. Huh. She said great, but she doesn't seem very excited. So are we Minnesota bound this summer? Her laugh is quiet. The movie is starting, and she leans closer and lowers her voice. No. It didn't work out. Why not? Did you not like Blythe? Not like her, Dakota snorts. I think I fell a little in love with her. Did you know she was on the Forbes 30 under 30 list? She's incredible. She turned down jobs at a ton of really high-profile places to work for the Wildcats. Okay, so you got a lady boner, and I know she loved you. What's the problem? No, she loved me. Yep. There isn't a doubt in my mind. Dakota is a hard worker. Coach Myers routinely requests that she does the tours for any hockey recruits. And I told Blythe as much. She sniffs the air and tilts toward my shirt. What is that smell? Did you trade vanilla for... coconut? Body spray. You like? I duck my head, bringing our faces close. It's... interesting. Why would you want to smell like suntan lotion? I shrug. What's the problem with a job, Coda? She sighs and sinks back into the couch cushion. Her shoulder rests against mine, and I reposition us so my arm is around her. Our friends are lost in the movie and each other. It's an unpaid internship. Oh. Shit. I hadn't thought to ask about the salary. Is that normal? Are they even allowed to do that? Yeah, it's more common than you'd think. And I do the job for free in a heartbeat, but I can't afford living expenses here and there. Besides, logistically, it was a stretch. My car probably wouldn't make the trip to and from in one piece. You could ride with me. Shit, you could stay with me, too. I am not living with you. Her icy blue eyes narrow at me, but her mouth twists into a playful grin. Why not? I'm a great roommate. Ask any of the guys. I jump my chin toward our friends. You don't even live here. I basically do. I squeeze her shoulder, which brings her farther into my chest. Come on, it'd be great. I could start my dry cleaning and coffee service for all of your conquests. Conquests? I arch your brow. I most definitely don't think of them like that. They're beautiful, smart women who want to have fun. And I am fun. Thank you, but it wasn't meant to be. I'll be fine. I have my job at the Hall of Fame, and I have Blythe as a contact now. Maybe next year they'll have an entry-level position. I nod, holding her gaze. She looks away first to the TV. I'm bummed for her. She was so excited this morning. Charlie's on the floor at my feet. I pat my lap and she jumps up, makes a circle and lays down. Dakota reaches over and scratches under her chin. Charlie wiggles forward so her face is on Dakota's leg. And that's how we watch the rest of the movie. The next morning, I'm packing up the kitchen in my apartment when my agent, Hugh, calls. I accept the call and put it on speaker. Talk to me, Hugh. He chuckles. Hey, Johnny, how are you? Good, I say instinctively, packing up my apartment. When are you headed out? This weekend, maybe? Glad to hear it. Listen, I have some paperwork for you on the endorsement deal. I emailed it to you, but I thought I should call. I'm concerned. My brows pulled together and I stopped packing, pick up my phone, and opened the email he mentioned. Why? I scanned the contract from Maverick Enterprises. I don't know much about endorsement deals since this is my first, but nothing sticks out. I know this is your family's company, so I don't want to overstep. 
I'm paying you to overstep, my friend. Frankly, Johnny, it's the lowest sum I've ever seen for a pro athlete. My gaze drops to the number in question. Fifteen grand for doing nothing? I'm a rookie. You said yourself you didn't expect any big endorsements for me until next year. I did, you're right. But once you accept your first endorsement, others will look at that and your earnings from it to determine your worth. If you take a lowball offer out of the gate, you're telling others that this is all it takes to get you. Yeah, but it's my family's company. Of course, I understand, but I wouldn't feel good about you taking the deal if I didn't caution you first. I mull over his words as I consider the number. I may not like how my dad phrased it, but he was right. Maverick Enterprises has been endorsing me for years. I don't care about the money. He chuckles again. Ah, I love rookies. In two years, I'm going to remind you of this conversation when we're renegotiating your contract. I don't even need it. Can't I just give it all to charity or something? Would that help? Yeah, we could do something like that. Do you have a charity in mind? No, but I'm sure my parents have one they like. He's quiet for a beat. What is it? I prompt him. We're still getting used to one another, but I gather that Hugh isn't someone who freely speaks his mind without a lot of thought and consideration. You're not Maverick Enterprises. You're Johnny Maverick. I know. Oh, how I know. All right, then let's pick out a charity that means something to you. Give it some thought, and I'll check in later. Yeah, okay, I can do that. So we're accepting the offer. There's a knock at the door and I call. It's open, before responding to Hugh. Yeah, let's do it. Dakota comes in with Charlie. She stopped by to take her on a short run. She's sweaty and her cheeks are red. Her tank top is rolled up to the line of her sports bra and her shorts sit below her belly button. Charlie's tongue hangs out as she trots to her water bowl. Mine too, girl. Dakota waves and disappears back out the door without speaking. Great. Hugh's voice breaks the silence. I'll get to work then. Actually, hold up. I have another idea. Chapter 6 Dakota I'm getting in my car after work when an unknown Minnesota number calls. I start the engine and blast the air conditioning while staring at the ringing phone in my hand. The vent blows warm air. It likely won't cool down until I get home. I switch it off and roll down the windows instead. Hello? I answer when the breeze flows through my car. Hi, Dakota. This is Catherine Holland. I'm the human resources manager at the Wildcats. Oh, crap. I wonder if they didn't get my email declining the position. I am sorry I was out and didn't get a chance to talk with you. Blythe had great things to say. Thank you. I enjoyed talking with her very much. I pinched the bridge of my nose. Ugh. I had almost put that opportunity out of my mind, but now I'm back to feeling sorry for myself. I got your email declining the offer. Oh, yeah? This is beyond awkward. The job sounds great. Perfect, actually. But I didn't realize it was unpaid. I pull my hair away from my neck and let the breeze cool me off. I completely understand that. But what if we could offer compensation for a similar position? Would you still be interested? Yeah. I don't even need to hear what the job is. Having a foot in the door at the Wildcats would be huge. I was hoping you would say that. She laughs softly. We have a unique situation with a sponsor-paid internship. They're endorsing one of our players and want someone to assist with the campaign, marketing materials, and social media content. There's even a photo shoot with the player scheduled. Ooh, I would get to work directly with the players? Why wouldn't they just hire me directly instead of going through you? Good question. Normally they wouldn't, but this is a unique situation, as I said, and Blythe pushed hard to make this happen. The sponsor paid work likely won't take up all of your availability, and we're hoping to use you in our intern pool still when you're free. So, more work, but you will be compensated. What's the compensation? I close my eyes. Please be enough. Please be enough. 
$12,000 for the summer paid in weekly increments. And it covers housing, too. <laughs> I'm sorry? I chuckle as the number floats in my head, taunting me. It sounded like you said $12,000. $1,500 a week? That can't be a thing. Her laughter loosens the tension in my neck that I've been carrying since I had to decline the internship. I did. It's a great opportunity, and honestly, not one that's passed my desk before. I looked over the contract myself, and the deliverables don't feel out of line or beyond what I think you're capable of. Due to confidentiality, I'm not able to say the player or endorsement until after you've signed the contract. It sounds like she's shuffling papers as she continues. I can tell you that you'll be required to assist with a photo shoot and marketing and advertising copy for each of their social media platforms. If there's anything you're worried about, we can talk about what that would look like. I can handle it. All of it. Whatever is needed. I love your confidence, and I'm sure you can. Blythe has agreed to supervise it, and there's nothing she hasn't seen before. The two of you will have no problem. If you'd like a day or two to think it over, yes! I mean, no, I don't need time. I'm a yes. I still have to figure out how to get there, but I will duct tape this car together and roll in on fumes if I have to. After I tell Reagan and Ginny the news, and we spend a good 20 minutes jumping up and down celebrating, I head downstairs to Maverick's apartment. I knock, but the music inside is so loud I doubt he can hear me. I open it a crack and poke my head in. Boxes are everywhere, stacked up on one another in the living room. I walk all the way in and shut the door. I can hear Charlie whining, but have to step through a cardboard maze to find her. She yips, and I bend over to pick her up before continuing through the apartment. It's a one-bedroom, so there aren't a lot of places he could be hiding. I follow the music to his bedroom, but I still don't see him. Mav? Charlie wriggles out of my hold and runs toward the attached bathroom. I am so not going in there. I linger awkwardly. The song ends, and I hear his voice croon at his dog. Hey, pretty girl. I know, I know, I'm going to miss this place too. He walks out, shirtless, no surprise there, and pauses when he sees me. Coda. I knocked. He grabs his phone and turns off the music. Mikasa Asukasa. What's up? I was just about to take a food break. We walk out to the kitchen and he opens the fridge to survey the empty shelves. Looks like I'm ordering. Want anything? No, I just came to tell you the good news. He puts his phone on the counter and leans back against it, giving me his undivided attention. I accepted an internship with the Wildcats. No way. His lips pull into a broad smile. Congrats. Thank you. I'm so excited. Technically, it's an internship with a company called JM Holdings, but I'll be in the intern pool and just doing that on the side. They're endorsing one of the players. I wonder what they sell. It's probably hockey equipment or something equally boring. He grunts. Boring to me, I clarify. But I'm so excited. I knew everything would work out. I am in shock still. It's too good to be true. The pay is incredible. And it covers housing. Where are you staying? He bends down to get Charlie's water bowl and refills it. It's across from the arena. The Legends, I think? It's a one-bedroom. Looked pretty standard, but I won't have to worry about transportation, which is a plus. That's where I'm staying. We'll still be neighbors. Oh, good! I'll have my side hustle as a fallback plan. He chuckles. Let's order some food and celebrate. The girls have already claimed all of my remaining hours until I leave. We're staying in tonight and then going out dancing tomorrow. No boys allowed. Boo, that's no fun. I do have a favor, though. Shoot. Could I still take you up on the offer to ride up together? I'll leave my car here and then rent something to drive back. Yeah, of course. When do you have to be there? Monday. I say tentatively, hoping he hasn't made plans beyond that. 
Perfect. We can leave Saturday morning, be in Minnesota Sunday night. Great! I squeal. I cannot believe this is all working out. It's too much. Nah, you deserve it. Oh, just one more tiny request? He grins. What happens on road trips stays on road trips. What? If you want to share a hotel room, maybe get naked and wrestle, then by all means. He winks. Tempting, I say sarcastically. But my favor does solve the shared bed situation. I need to stop by my dad's house and get a few items for the apartment. It's on the way, and that will save me from having to buy a bunch of stuff when I get there. We can stay there Saturday night. Oh, shit. The apartment isn't furnished? He looks stunned. No, but I don't need much, and my dad said I could borrow a few things for the summer so I don't have to take stuff from the apartment here. The couch is Reagan's anyway. He nods thoughtfully. Sure, I have room in the trailer for whatever you need, or you can borrow anything of mine. Maybe just crash with me. His eyes light up. One bed. It was meant to be. There isn't enough room in your bed for me and the girls that hop in and out of it. He chuckles softly. A bed, a chair or couch, and I'll be fine. I step forward and hug him. His body is warm and hard. Thank you, Johnny. A second passes with me squeezing his waist before his arms wrap around my back. When he speaks, the words vibrate against my cheek. You're welcome. Reagan plans a whole night of drinks and dancing for the four of us Friday night before I leave. It's the first summer we've been apart since we met. My best friend holds my hand as we watch Ginny and Sienna on the dance floor. We're taking a breather and having our third shot. The bartender hates us. We keep making her split the shots into two glasses so we don't get hammered too fast. Plus, it's cheaper because they almost always fill the glasses more than halfway. It's like a shot and a half combined. Score! We toss back the half shots, and then Reagan takes my other hand. I know that I've been preoccupied with Adam and all the drama with my mom, but I love you so much. I don't know what I would do without you. Ray! I squeeze her hands. My best friend is tough as nails. She had to be thanks to an absent mother who only shows up when she wants something from her beautiful and talented daughter. It's only two months. I know. She pulls her honey blonde hair over one shoulder and fingers a strand nervously. It's just that with everyone graduating and leaving, it's starting to hit me that we won't be roommates forever. Promise we'll always be friends no matter where we live or how long we have to go without seeing one another. It's an easy promise to make. I swear it. I get to my feet and pull her into a hug. She had a shitty mother, and I lost mine at 15. We're so much more than roommates and friends. Neither of us has siblings, but I love her like I imagine sisters do. And there's no future I can imagine that doesn't involve us remaining close. Have you given any thought to the hockey hotties you're going to be working with? She fans herself. I saw the roster. Damn. I'm there for work, not to hook up. But she's right. I took a look at the roster too, and wow. Yes, but you need the full wildcat experience. I shake my head. Come on. Let's get one last dance party in and make it good because it's going to be six long weeks without seeing you shake it. She smiles and shakes her boobs at me. Nope. We're going to do virtual dance parties. I just decided. Once a week, mandatory attendance. I'm in. Chapter 7. Johnny. Dakota's eyes are closed, brows pinched together as I drive. We just crossed into Oklahoma and we're an hour from her dad's house in Kansas. It's been a long ass day in this vehicle, and Dakota's so hungover from last night that she hasn't been much company. I need to stop and let Charlie out. Do you feel like eating yet? She moans without opening her lids. 
A little grease to soak up the alcohol and you'll be good as new. Fine. She sits up and stretches, sticking her boobs out in the process. Where are we? I don't know. All these small towns look the same. I pull into the parking lot of a fast food restaurant and kill the engine. As soon as I open the door, the air outside takes my breath away. The humidity is killer, I always forget. Oh, right, you grew up in Chicago. Arizona suits you so well. She gives her head a little shake. Actually, scratch that, I think you could fit in anywhere. I'm choosing to take that as a compliment. We walk Charlie around in a grassy area between businesses. Dakota sits as if we haven't been doing that all day. What exactly did you girls get into last night? I can't remember ever seeing you this hungover. Shots. So many shots. We swore our loyalties to one another by dancing our hearts out and drinking rumplemans. Girls are weird. She nods. What did you guys do? Played Xbox and ate four large pizzas. She snort laughs and then stops and holds her stomach. Did you hear that? My stomach just growled. I think it's finally awake. And wants pizza. That does sound good. She bites the corner of her lip. There's this really great pizza place in my hometown. All right, let's load back up then because I am ravenous. When we get back on the highway, Coda is more alert and plays with the music while I drive. I'm going to let my dad know we're getting close. What are your parents like? She hesitates. They're great. It's just my dad and me now. My mom died when I was 15. I had no idea. I'm sorry. A heavy feeling settles in the bottom of my stomach. It's okay. I mean, I don't know. I never know how to respond to that. Thank you? She smiles. It occurs to me that for as much time as I've spent with Dakota, hanging out, partying, joking around, I don't know that much about her. And I want to. What does your dad do? He's a firefighter. Badass. Technically, he's my stepdad, but he married my mom when I was five, so he's just dad. And your real dad? Real dad. She rolls her eyes. He wasn't really into the family thing. He popped in occasionally when I was younger. I get a birthday card and a call on Christmas. I'm sorry. No, don't be. Be sorry that my awesome mother died if you want, but not that my sperm donor isn't part of my life. Some people just weren't meant to be parents. My real dad is one of those. I wonder if my parents fit that criterion. They always made sure I had what I needed, but they were never very interested in doing the traditional parent activities, like spending time together. When we get close, Dakota navigates me through her hometown. I stop at the pizza place, and she runs in to get our order. Charlie puts her paws up on the dash, watching her. Someone stops her at the doorway, and they embrace. Charlie and I look on. My dog whines. I know, I know, she's coming back. I pat her head. Charlie is a pretty friendly dog, but she's got a major crush on Coda. <laughs> Who could blame her? Dakota watched her for me recently when I had to make a trip up to Minnesota, and she always gives her attention, pets her, takes her on runs. <laughs> We're easy to please. I check email on my phone. Hugh sent the final signed contract for my endorsement and my lease agreement. I lucked out being able to find a sublease for Dakota in the same building. The Legends is usually booked up solid, but one of my new teammates was looking to offload his place while he moved back to his hometown to recuperate from surgery. I didn't even think about him taking his stuff with him. I just assumed it was furnished. She's going to find out eventually that the endorsement is for the Maverick Corporation, but I couldn't risk her passing because of pride. I could see how much she wanted the job, and she shouldn't have to give that up because of something stupid like money. She comes out a few minutes later with two large pizza boxes. I lean over to open the door for her, and the smell that takes over my truck is divine. Oh, man, my mouth just started watering. Right. She sits and flips open the lid, revealing a sausage pizza. She frees a slice and takes a bite, then groans loudly. You have to try it. She holds out the pizza to feed me, and I take a huge bite that makes her laugh. You almost got my fingers. I'm so hungry, I hope one of those boxes is all mine. 
I reach for another slice and she smacks my hand. Only one bite. We have to save the rest to eat with my dad. Dakota's dad lives in a quiet subdivision on the east side of town. I park the SUV along the road, grab our overnight bags and Charlie, and follow her up the sidewalk to an entrance at the back side of the house. The screen door creaks open, and a big burly guy with a gray beard steps out. DJ! Dad! She holds the pizzas with one hand to her side and hugs him with the other. Her dad looks at me over her shoulder and gives me the appropriate dad once-over. Charlie growls in my arms. Dakota laughs and pulls back. Dad, this is Maverick. Maverick, meet my dad. Maverick, huh? Johnny Maverick, but everyone just calls me by my last name. I drop Charlie to the ground and step forward to shake his hand. He stares at the tattoos along my arm as he reaches to take my hand. Jerry, thanks for driving my DJ. Coda rolls her eyes. He always wanted a son, hence the nickname. Jerry smiles and holds the door open for us, or, well... Her. I get the feeling old Jeremiah let it slam in my face if it weren't for Dakota holding it open with her foot while I shuffle through with Charlie in the bags. The house is small but has a homey feel. Everything is tidy and clean, but there are stacks of papers and clutter that my parents always kept out of view for guests. We drop our stuff and I feed Charlie while Dakota and Jerry catch up. I try to hang back and give them some time, but Coda calls for me. And it's a good thing because one whole pizza is gone by the time I sit down. Can I get you something to drink? Jerry asks. From the kitchen table, he reaches over and opens the fridge. I've got Coke or beer. He wants beer, Dad, Dakota says at the same time I say. Coke will be fine. Jerry looks between us. Either one is great, thanks. I wipe my palms and my thighs. I don't have a lot of experience with fathers, especially girls' fathers. I mumble my thanks as he sets a Bud Light bottle in front of me. I think I'm sweating. Must be the humidity. Charlie jogs in circles around the living room, then the kitchen, checking everything out. I whistle lightly and pat my thigh to get her attention. Come lie down, girl. Ah, oh, let her be, Jerry says. She's been cooped up in the car all day. So, DJ... Tell me about this job. My friend lights up and goes into it, telling her dad every single detail. You don't know which player or what they're endorsing? Her dad leans back in his chair and takes a long drink of beer. No, but I checked out all the guys on the team and their endorsements, and there wasn't anything crazy. My guess is that it's some diva who needs a handler to make sure he shows up to set and looks pretty. Maybe Jack Wilde. She looks at me. He's got quite the reputation for partying. Jack's a nice guy. I doubt he'd do anything to jeopardize a lucrative relationship. The guys I've met have all been level-headed and cool. Hockey players and level-headed. Jerry grins. That's funny, Maverick. The way he says my name is almost like he's mocking me. Now I really am sweating. I pull at the collar of my t-shirt to get some air. More ink, huh? What do all those mean? Mean? I draw my gaze to the tattoos on both arms. Back in my day when a man got a tattoo, it meant something. Now you're all covered in them and it loses the sentimentality, don't you think? Dad. Dakota pins him with an annoyed glare. No, it's fine. My dad said basically the same thing when I got my first sleeve done. I stretch out my left arm. The truth is, some of them have special meaning. Others don't. Like decorating a house, Dakota pipes in. Some items are sentimental and others you buy because you thought they were pretty. She places her elbows on the table and looks at Jerry. Do you still have the pink sofa? In the basement, he nods. Oh, you have to see it. Dakota reaches out and touches my arm lightly. The salesperson called it Dusty Rose, but it's the color of bubblegum. Everything in my parents' house was white or gray. I think I might like a bubblegum pink couch. Jerry retires to an old recliner in the living room, and Dakota rinses the plates while I finish off the pizza. Going downstairs, Dad, she calls as we start down the creaky stairs. Leave the door open, he yells. Oh my gosh, so embarrassing. She mumbles and flips on a light in the stairway. Welcome to my teenage hangout. 
I spent many hours down here watching TV and hanging out with friends. Boy friends, I ask. Sometimes. She walks straight to the pink couch and sits down. She runs a hand along the fabric cushion as I take in the rest of the space. My head grazes the ceiling fan in the middle of the living area. The furniture is mismatched, as if it's a collection of old furniture pieces Jerry couldn't bear to part with. A worn leather armchair, a plaid upholstered love seat, and the pink couch. A flat screen TV is mounted on the wall and a bookshelf sits underneath, holding dusty books and games. Did you have a basement where you took girls in high school? Kind of. I take a seat next to her on the couch. It's hard, not a lot of give, and it sits low to the floor, making my ass sink down below my knees. I had a pool house. Oh my gosh, of course you did. She rolls her eyes, but smiles. This is a great color, I say, and mean it. Could be more comfortable, though. This thing is hard as a rock. I try to bounce on it, and then wiggle to get situated, but it's like sitting on a bleacher seat. My mom always wanted a pink couch. I have no idea why. It was a running joke every time we picked out new furniture. She plays with the hem of her shorts, staring down at the material between her fingers as she continues. The day she found out her cancer had returned, she went straight from the doctor's office to the furniture store. I came home from school and she was sitting on it and just smiling. She died two weeks later. I'm so sorry. I cover her hand with mine. She lets out a breath and nods. It is pretty uncomfortable. The worst, I admit. But I dig it. My parents were all whites and grays. I like color. She squeezes my fingers. How come you don't have any colorful tattoos? I scan my arm. I'd never thought about it before. I guess I'm whites and grays too. Oh no, she smiles. You are a pink couch, not quite right, but all about making people happy. Chuckling, I move my hand. Jerry seems nice. Nice, really. Okay, he seems like a hard ass, but he loves you, that much I got. He loved my mom so much, even if I were a holy terror, because, let's be honest, there were some rough high school years when I was awful. He'd still love me, if only because I'm her daughter. She was going through chemo when they met. Can you imagine the kind of love that takes? He had no idea if she'd get better. But she did. Yeah. Dakota nods. They had ten amazing years, and I guess that's more than most people get. Dakota grabs two more beers, and we eventually move to sitting in front of the couch. It's a real bad sign for a piece of furniture when you'd rather sit on the floor than on it, but I'm having a great time. She rests an elbow on the pink couch and angles toward me. Tell me about your parents. We're not close. They were busy building the company when I was a kid, but they gave me a lot. I saw your dad at the Frozen Four celebration party. He seemed proud of you. A laugh breaks free. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to laugh. He is proud in his own way, but I don't think he's ever said the word. He should. You've done some amazing things. Were they disappointed that you were quitting college to sign with the Wildcats? Nah, they were all about it. I shrug. I was never going to be anything but a hockey player. Don't sell yourself short, Johnny Maverick. I think you could be anything you want. Chapter 8 Dakota He lines up the empty beer bottles between us. Upstairs is quiet. Dad must have gone to bed. It feels good to be home. Not a lot has changed in the three years since I moved away to college, but the basement feels smaller with Maverick in it. He has that way about him, filling up space. Not just physically, because he's a big guy, but his personality is even bigger. The conversation has bounced from every topic imaginable, from my mom to all the horrible horrifying things guys have said to me on dating apps. No way. He didn't say that. Mav throws his head back and laughs. He did. I would prove it to you, but I deleted the app. I asked him where his favorite place he'd visited was, and he said, 
the womb. Like, (laughs) what do I do with that? How do you ever make a guy like that happy? I can't give that to him. Is he going to have some weird obsession with my womb when I get pregnant? So many questions. Again, this is why I don't do online dating. You do have a certain charm that might be misunderstood via text. Right? He laughs and stretches out a long leg in front of him. Charlie is snoring at his side, and he absently runs a hand along her back. It's different now, I say. Now that our friends are all coupled up, I see how happy they are. I want that. You know what you need, he asks. Oh my god, I swear if you hit on me right now, I'm going to break one of these beer bottles and beat you over the head with it. First of all, ouch. That's some crazy bar brawl shit, Coda. I laugh. I've seen Patrick Swayze in Roadhouse one too many times, admittedly. Second, Stop trying to force it. Enjoy the weirdos and the cringe stories. Have fun with it. Things will happen when they're supposed to. Life is a series of events that you can either let push you down or shrug them off and move on. I'm single and making the most of it. Oh, I know. I've seen you making the most of it. Two girls at a time. How does one girl compare after that? Seriously. You know the great thing about two girls instead of one? Oh, man, I feel like I should be taking notes. I cannot wait to hear this. No, Johnny, what's the great thing about two girls instead of one? Outside of the obvious two vaginas to stick it in thing, he shakes his head. It takes off the pressure. From everyone. The pressure? Seriously? You poor thing. Performance anxiety? I knew it. Think about it. You're hooking up with someone and it's just the two of you. Every movement, every word is a back and forth, trying to read one another and wondering how the other thinks or feels. Casual sex, especially when you get more than two people, is all about fun. No one calls the day after a threesome to see if you want to grab a coffee. I give my head a shake, but I can't hide my smile. I understand what he means, though. It's about expectations. You take people at their word, and sometimes they disappoint you. They make you feel special and wanted. They say all the right things, but you don't really know their heart. The upside? Eventually, people always show you their true colors. And it isn't just in dating, either. We have expectations in all kinds of relationships— I learned this lesson at 18 when a man that I trusted, my high school track coach, made me believe that I was a talented runner who had a bright career ahead of her. Maybe I did, but he never really believed that. He was saying and doing whatever he thought would get him in my pants. It's kind of incredible the lengths some people will go to to keep you from knowing they only want sex. Expectations. He grins back. Besides, two chicks wanting me at once? So hot. And there it is. I'm going to be single forever. I appreciate your honesty, though. We fall quiet. The only sound is Charlie snoring. We should probably get some sleep. I struggle to get on my feet from the awkward position I'm sitting. Mav hops up and takes my hands, lifting me with ease. He's so tall that he can't quite stand all the way up without knocking into the ceiling fan. Thanks. He drops his hands but holds on to mine, lightly running his thumbs along the backs of my fingers. He smiles, the same friendly maverick smile he always does, but my heart rate speeds up. Let me show you to the guest room. I change my tone to speak to Charlie. Come on, girl. Why, yes. I am using the dog to get out of this situation. I've got images of Maverick with two girls stuck in my head, and I don't hate the view. What is wrong with me? My room is the last door on the right. Dad is last on the left, and he does own a gun. You've been warned. He drops his bag on the bed, and Charlie climbs right up, does a circle on the end of the mattress, and lies back down. Night, Mav. Hey, wait. 
He grabs my hand as I turn to leave. Oh, right. The bathroom is across the hall. You can go first. Thanks, but that's not it. He looks uneasy as he shifts from one foot to another. You're making me nervous. What's wrong? You told me not to hit on you or you'd bust a bottle over my head, so I'm choosing my words carefully here. I snort loudly, then remember my dad is sleeping. I wiggle my hand free from his and then hold both up to show him. No beer bottle. You're safe. As long as you don't invite me to a threesome. Don't knock it till you try it. He grins, then his lips fall into a more serious line. You're fire, Coda. You won't be single forever. You could have any guy you wanted. I try to laugh it off, but he steps closer, and the bubble around us loses all the oxygen. It's good to keep your standards high, but people can surprise you if you let them in. So they don't get it right over text, or they occasionally like to indulge in threesomes. It doesn't mean they aren't also capable of giving you the things you want. He stops, but I can't find my voice to respond. I can't move either. That's it. That's all I wanted to say. He moves first and sits on the bed. Charlie sticks a leg out in his direction, wanting to be closer to him, but too lazy to get up. Johnny is kind of like that. People extend themselves to be near him. I force my feet backward and hold onto the doorknob as I twist my lips into a friendly smile. Thanks, Mav. I'll see you in the morning. When I wake up the next morning, it's to Dad's and Johnny's voices. I check the time, then get up and change into my running clothes. I make a quick stop in the bathroom to brush my teeth and put my hair up into a ponytail. The smell of bacon greets me as I walk into the kitchen. Johnny is at the stove, shirtless, and Dad sits at the kitchen table with a bottle of Icy Hot and ibuprofen in front of him and his back brace on. Oh no, what happened? Eh. Dad waves me off. I tweaked it when we were loading the trailer. Why didn't you wait for me? Mav and I could have done it. It's barely seven o'clock. Are you that eager to get rid of me? His smile softens and I slump into one of the chairs and steal a piece of bacon off the plate in the middle of the table. These came for you. Dad slides three identical envelopes in front of me. I lift the top one, see the return address, and let it drop. Still bugging you to be in the school's hall of fame? I nod and fill my mouth with another piece of bacon. For six months, the high school has been sending me invites for the school's athletic hall of fame. I thought I'd successfully dodged them since the ceremony was last month, but apparently not. Mav spins around. That's awesome. It's unnecessary and unwarranted. I stand and drop them unopened in the trash. I'm going for a run. Do you want me to take Charlie? I look around. Where is she? Maverick's lips twitch and he points with the spatula to the floor. I lean down and see Charlie next to Dad's feet. You made a friend. Dad grunts a response but bends down and scratches behind her ears. Before I leave, I glare at Dad. No more moving things while we're here. He holds his tongue, but the unimpressed look on his face tells me he's going to do whatever he wants. Stubborn old man. I get only a few feet from the house when Mav falls into step beside me. Hey, I say, surprised. Need to get away from my dad? Nah. He pushed me out the door and told me no respectable man lets a woman run by herself. Something about the neighborhood not being what it used to be? Oh, jeez. I'm sorry. Also, I'm good. I can outrun most people. It's cool. I have to get back into the routine a bit again anyway. I start down my old path toward the high school. The neighborhood is older. Lots of retired couples live here, and the streets are quiet this time of day. At the end of the block, we turn right. I take us up and down each street, scoping out the changes instead of taking the direct route to the school. The morning air is heavy with humidity. The sky is clear, and the sun is already hot on my skin. By the time the track and football field comes into view, sweat drips down my back. 
Wow, Johnny says beside me. He's been quiet. Nice field. The football team is like everything here. I mock in my best high school cheerleader voice. You don't sound bitter at all, he says sarcastically. Eh, I'm not really. They redid the field my sophomore year, and that included the track, so I benefited. We come up short at the chain-link fence, staring in. A few morning walkers are moving along the rubber circle. How come you don't want to be inducted into your school's Hall of Fame? I didn't say that. You tossed the invite in the trash. He quirks a dark brow. I don't even run anymore. Not for real, you know. I don't deserve to be in it. And even if I did, it's silly. So? Who cares if it's silly? And don't even get me started on the I don't deserve to be in it nonsense. Who are you, the selection committee authority? Let them celebrate your general ballerness. I mean, you work at a Hall of Fame. You know how much it means. I'm quiet. It's so much more complicated than that. But I appreciate him thinking I'm baller anyway. Come on, we should get back. It's another long day on the road. We take a more direct path back to the house. A block before Dad's house, a guy has his back to us with the hood of his sports car up. Maybe the neighborhood has aged down since I lived here. Teenage me spent a lot of time running these streets hoping for a new hot neighbor. He turns as our feet hitting the pavement get closer, and my breath hitches. He takes me in, recognition dawning and his mouth curving up. Dakota? My high school track coach leans down to grab a water bottle at his feet, his eyes never leaving me. I don't want to notice the sweat beating up on his chest and abs, but I do. Hans Hoat, Coach McHottie is what we called him, and the name still fits. I manage to wave and keep my feet moving, one in front of the other. I push my legs harder as my pulse kicks up another notch. Morning. Johnny says, keeping my pace. My lungs burn as we round the corner to my dad's street. Want to tell me who the hell that was and why we sprinted away? Nobody, I lie. Come on, I'm starving. Shortly after breakfast, Maverick and I walk outside, ready to make the last leg of our trip. Miss you, DJ. Knock him dead up there in Minnesota. I will. I wrap my arms around him and soak up the smell of his aftershave. Thanks for letting me borrow the furniture. I didn't see what they put in the trailer, but Johnny said they got a couch, chair, nightstand, and bed. The apartment will still be bare, but it's everything I need. I pause before I get into the passenger seat. Maverick's already behind the wheel with his sunglasses on. Dad stands in the front yard. I miss him. I miss my mom. Years later, and I still sometimes forget that she's gone. Bye. I wave. Don't let him talk you into any tattoos, Dad warns. A small smile tips up the corner of his lips. Drive safe with my DJ. His voice softens. Bye, Charlie. I'm pretty sure your dad likes my dog more than me, Maverick says as he pulls away from my childhood home. Oh, he definitely likes Charlie more than you, I confirm. Chapter 9. Dakota It's dark when we get to the apartment. I'm too tired to scope out the surrounding area appropriately. We still have to get our stuff inside, and I have to unpack at least the essentials so that I can get ready for work tomorrow morning. Work. Squee! I'm so excited about my first day. Maverick pulls into a parking spot in the underground lot. Four guys lean against the wall, pushing off when Mav kills the engine and opens the door. Uh, I start uneasily. Are we about to get shook down? Maverick shoots me a funny look, then calls to them. Hey guys, thanks for- His voice cuts out as he closes the door and greets the guys. I stay in the truck, but I look them over more closely. They're in matching green shirts with the words, making moves on the front. The guys listen to Maverick. 
He points to the trailer, and two of them head toward it, while the others walk to a work truck and pull out a tarp and straps. Well, that makes more sense. He hired people to move him in. Maverick returns to the truck and opens the door. Ready to see your new place? Yeah, um, I can grab my stuff first, since it's at the back of the trailer. Can you help me with the big pieces? I think I can get the bed frame on my own, but not the mattress or the couch. Probably not the chair, either. He gives me a confused look. You think they're going to move my stuff and not yours? I, well, yeah. I called earlier. I figured as late as it was going to be, it'd be easier if we could bring in the small stuff and start to unpack while they get the furniture. You have a big day tomorrow. You didn't have to do that. Thank you. He smiles big. Come on, let's check out your new digs. We take the elevator to the second floor. Mav tells me that the first is a lobby, and the front doors open to the arena on the opposite side of the street. There is also mail, dry cleaning drop-off and pickup, coffee, there goes my side gig, and a concierge desk. The building locks down overnight, and I'll need the key card he flashes me to get in after nine. I'm giddy with excitement as he points to a door and says, That one is yours. He hands over the key and I swipe it. A clicking sound and green light tell me it worked and I push inside. It's empty as expected, but the space is huge. So much bigger than I expected. I walk through a large entryway. The kitchen is on the left and the living area stretches out in front of me. I move straight through to the windows on the far wall. The downtown lights up below and my stomach flutters. Holy crap. I want to twirl, and I'm so not a twirler. This is amazing. Setup is a lot like mine. He points to the right. Bedroom and ensuite. He stands next in an open doorway and flips on a light. It's a normal sized bedroom with a decent walk in closet and an attached bathroom. I can't stop grinning. Laundry closet is here. He opens a door to where a washer and dryer should be, but it's empty. Oh, shit. It's okay, I say quickly. I'll figure out laundry. This place is incredible. You can use mine. I definitely won't be schlepping my dirty panties up to Maverick's apartment, but I appreciate the offer. We continue to explore. There's a small half bath on the other side of the kitchen and a dining area. It's perfect. I've never lived alone, and I'm suddenly really excited about it, and a little nervous. This place is all mine for the next eight weeks. Someone must knock because Johnny goes to the door and pulls it open for the movers, but I don't even hear it because I'm still too wrapped up in checking out every detail of the place. I'm opening all the cabinets in the kitchen while they come in with the furniture. Where do you want it? One of the guys asks. I turn and see them holding the pink couch in my new living room. I can't help but laugh. Right there is fine. Two more guys come in with the matching chair. My heart squeezes. Dad, you sneak. By the window. He insisted, Johnny says. You're going to have the most uncomfortable furniture in all of Minnesota, but I figured you wouldn't have it any other way. My eyes are teary, and I shake my head, unable to speak for a few seconds. It's perfect. Like my mom is here watching me. Let's go get the rest. I can't wait to sleep in my new apartment. We get all the bags in one trip. Maverick wheels my oversized suitcase into my room. Thank you. I take it from him and try to lift it onto the bed. It is heavy. He moves in to help. I'd invite you up to see my place, but it looks like you're in a zone here. He isn't wrong. I've got tunnel vision to get this place exactly how I want it before going to bed. I have to find everything for tomorrow. What floor are you on? Eleventh. He scoops Charlie up in his arms. She's been busy checking out the place, too. What time do you have to be at the arena? Nine. Just enough time to run and eat breakfast. Oh, crap. Food. I didn't even think about groceries. 
We can go grab some stuff now if you want. No, it's fine. I have my protein powder and peanut butter somewhere, and my blender is in here. I pat the suitcase. No wonder it was so heavy. He smiles. So you're good? Yep. I'm going to unpack and then try to sleep. Text me if you need anything. Thank you. I walk him to the front door. He steps out into the hallway and then hits me with a grin. Welcome, neighbor. I skip my morning run and spend the time freaking out about my job and setting up the kitchen. I didn't bring a lot of kitchenware since it's just me, but I have a couple of plates, bowls, glasses, and a handful of silverware. I also grabbed one pan, one spatula, a whisk, and a potato peeler. Although the latter was an impulsive grab, and I have no real plans to use it. I set up my blender to make my smoothie. I can't find my jar of peanut butter anywhere, and I know I packed it. Reagan was making fun of me, tossing it into the air while I packed shoes. Ooh, I bet it's in the shoe bag. The doorbell rings, and I freeze on my way to the bedroom like I'm caught in someone else's house. I wait for a second, and then quietly pad over to the door and look out. No one is there, but there is something on the ground in front of the door. Curious, I unlock and open the door. Several Trader Joe's bags filled with groceries sit outside, and on the very top, a jar of peanut butter. Score! I could kiss Maverick. When it's time for work, I make sure I have my purse, phone, and key card for the apartment, and then take the elevator to the first floor. I smile at the white marble and the sunlight that streams into the open space. A man stands at the door, holding it open for people, coming and going, and there's a young woman behind the counter that I assume is the concierge Johnny mentioned. I smile at her, and then the doorman greets me. Good morning. Morning, I reply as I step outside. The street between the apartment and the arena is busy, and I walk up to the corner and cross with the others waiting. I take in the downtown area. Other tall buildings with company names surround us. Some I know, and others I don't. I feel underdressed next to some of these people in their formal business attire, suits and no-nonsense pumps. I opted for a simple black dress and my red chucks. Catherine in HR said it was business casual with an emphasis on casual, so I'm not too worried. Besides, who is going to see my shoes while I sit behind a desk? I get a text from Reagan as I'm about to enter the front doors of the arena. I pause and move to the side to let people pass. Have a great day with the hockey hotties. I expect roster details. Explicit details. She added six eggplant emojis, a briefcase, and a kissy face. I love her. Inside the door, I stop at the front desk and give them my name as I was instructed to do. They make a call and tell me to wait in the lobby, and a few minutes later, Blythe herself appears. She's stunning, even more so in person. Power suit has nothing on the jumper she owns with every long stride of her legs. Her dark skin is beautiful against the cream color of her outfit, but the best part is the bright red heels on her feet. Oh, I think I've just found my new role model. Dakota. She smiles and extends her hand. Simple gold jewelry, a bracelet and a ring, not on her ring finger. I am so thrilled you're here. Thank you. I can't believe it. I keep waiting to wake up and be back in Valley. Her dark brown eyes light up as she smiles. She hands me a badge and leads me past the front desk. This is the main entrance. You can also come in through the back near the training rooms, but this is probably easier coming from the apartment. Did you get settled okay? Yeah, we got in late last night. We? Oh, uh, I drove up with Johnny Maverick. Right, of course. We catch an elevator to the top floor. Everyone we pass smiles at Blythe or tips their head in greeting. I'm happy to see lots of people in more casual attire, and lots of sneakers. This is me. She walks into a large corner office. 
The view from her window looks down to the same street as the apartment and a crossroads. I'll run through all the details of your contract tomorrow, after orientation, but this is where you can find me if I'm not in a meeting, and if I'm in here, then I'm always available if you have any questions. Her office is tastefully and beautifully decorated, very modern and chic, and so her. The white desk has gold metal legs and is entirely clutter-free except for her laptop and a cup of tea. She motions to a large box behind me. That's the product for the endorsement. I will bring it down to you this afternoon or tomorrow morning once you get your desk assignment. My fingers itch to see what's in there. Protein bars? Athletic wear? The suspense is killing me. We head back out of her office and she leads me to a conference room. Let me introduce you to the other two interns in our group. Inside, people are moving around. Long tables are pushed together and face the front of the room where a projector displays a welcome PowerPoint slide. Today is a general session for all interns. They'll go over everything and show you around the building. Lunch is catered and she trails off. Am I talking too fast? Sorry, I tend to do that. No, I laugh softly. I think I got it all. I'm really excited. She smiles so genuinely at me before stopping next to a girl with shiny brown hair, dressed to kill like those people on the street that looked like they were off to bust through the glass ceiling, only far more fashionable. She's career Barbie. Dakota, this is Quinn. I greet Quinn and get a polite smile and once over. Blythe takes a step next to a guy wearing a wildcat tie that I don't think he's wearing ironically. And this is Reese. Hello, he says, and does a one-arm wave that's a little goofy, but I can tell already suits him. I take a seat between them. This is so surreal. I cannot believe I'm here. Blythe grins at her dutiful interns sitting together. I'll check in with you all this afternoon. Welcome to the Wildcats. Chapter 10. Dakota. After several more welcome speeches from various members of the Wildcat front office, we're given a quick tour of the facilities. We start at the ticket office and then see all the main offices where most of us will be working. From there, we go down to the practice rink, which is sadly not in use. Then we're guided to the game ice, which is also woefully empty. But wow, is it impressive. Actually, the whole building is remarkable. From the green bleacher seats in the main arena to the fabulous paint job in the hallways with framed black and white photographs of the team over the years. It's like the Hall of Fame back at Valley decided to have a baby with a hockey arena, and that baby got all the functional qualities of the arena and all the extra fabulous genes of the Hall of Fame. There's even upbeat music playing softly over the speakers in the hallways. I am in awe. There's a buzz about the upcoming season. These people really love their hockey team, and I grin when Johnny's name is mentioned several times with other newly signed players they're excited about. Admittedly, with every corner we turn that doesn't have a big, burly hockey player on the other side, I'm more disappointed. It's increasingly possible that my bestie got in my head with the whole hockey hottie nonsense. But come on, we haven't had one player sighting this morning. Then, when I can practically smell the sweat and pheromones, they just wave a hand toward a long hallway where the players work out, watch film, and dress, and instruct us to turn around. I was really hoping for a peek into the locker room. Not for a glimpse of a perfect ass, although that would have perked this tour right up, but because I want to see if it's as over the top as I imagine. And now they're shuffling us back to the conference room. The slide on the projector reads Wildcat History and has a picture of a team from back in the 80s, if the Burt Reynolds mustaches and mullets are any indication. Ooh, maybe now we'll get to meet some players, I say, as I take my seat between Quinn and Reese. I've got this whole image in my head where they parade them in front of us to show us what all our hard work is really about. 
Maybe Jack Wilde gives us a touching speech, and then we all get a fist bump and an autograph. Go team! Quinn shoots me a weird look. Doubtful. Not after last summer. Reese's voice is quiet as he mutters the sentence out of one side of his mouth. What happened last summer? I'm whispering, but I have no idea why. Last page of the handbook. He offers at my confused expression and points the end of the green Minnesota Wildcats pencil in his hand. I flip through the little paper booklet we were each given first thing this morning and skim the paragraph on workplace relationships. Seriously? I whisper as I reread it, homing in on the we strongly discourage dating between any Wildcat employees clause. They provided helpful examples of Wildcat employees to further drive home the point. Manager and team member, co-workers, and intern and player. It doesn't explain what happened last summer, but the result is pretty straightforward. It isn't like I was really going to date a player, but I am surprised to see it in black and white. Jack does not come in to give us a rousing pep talk. Neither do any of the other players. After many more slides on the Wildcats and the internship program, we're finally shown to our workspaces, and all my hopes of a famous athlete sighting on my first day are dashed. Exhausted from sitting too long, but still so giddy I can't stop smiling because OMG, I work here, I sit at my new cubicle in the intern pool. We're grouped with the other interns in our department, so it looks like I'm going to be spending a lot of time with Quinn and Reese. I spin in the chair, and Quinn gives me an amused smirk. I think I'm growing on her. She hasn't said much today except to let us know that her dad is friends with the owner, and she scores an invite to the season kickoff party every year. Am I jealous? Not at all. Am I going to befriend her in hopes she gets a plus one? Maybe. Kidding. I think. I really need to get Reagan out of my head. I've worked around athletes for years. Still, this feels different. Reese is also local, like Quinn. It's his second year interning at the Wildcats, but he's a lifelong fan, backed up by the many random stats and records he recites about the players any time one is mentioned. The first thing he sets on his new desk is a hockey puck. It's after five, but we're waiting for Blythe to get out of a meeting and give us instructions for tomorrow. When she appears, the entire floor stops to watch her. She's got that something about her, and I swear she walks like every space is her personal catwalk. I'm so sorry. I got held up in a meeting. How was your first day? She glances between us. We mutter a chorus of tired, good. Go home and let your brains recover from information overload. We'll get started first thing tomorrow. She smiles, hands clasped around her cell phone. See you in the morning. Reese loosens his tie and pulls it off over his head. Some of the other interns went to Wilds, the bar down the street. You guys want to grab a drink? I'm in, I say, getting my purse. I'm too excited to go sit in my empty apartment. Quinn stares down at her phone as she answers, The players won't be there. They avoid this area during the summers, even the ones that come into the arena. Reese and I exchange a look, and Quinn stops messing with her phone long enough to look up and roll her eyes. There are so many better bars in the area. The only appeal of Wilds is the hockey player sightings, but whatever. Sure. I have a nail appointment downtown at 7, so I might as well stay. Great. Reese tucks his tie into his pocket. Let's do it. I text Reagan while we walk. She tells me that she and Adam are at the library, but promises to call when she gets home to hear all about my day. I consider texting Maverick to see if he wants to join us, but I doubt he wants to be accosted by a bunch of eager interns. If they're anything like me, salivating for a first run-in, then he'd be sorry he showed. Or maybe he wouldn't. Johnny would probably eat it up. Wilds has a cool vibe. It's your basic sports bar. TVs tuned to sporting events, Wildcats memorabilia on the walls, dartboards, and pool tables. It's bright inside instead of the usual dim lighting that gives off that 
don't look too closely at the grime mood of some bars. The table we sit at isn't sticky or rickety. I guess when you have pro hockey players hanging out, you have to step up the cleanliness. Are you a Wildcats fan? Reese asks me. In a surprising move, Quinn offered to grab the first round and is at the bar getting our drinks. I guess so. He chuckles, deep and throaty but friendly, then points to Quinn standing on the quiet end of the bar next to two guys. The bartender brings the drinks and she gives them a parting glance before heading back to us. Do you know Declan Sato or Leo Lohan? No. I shake my head and then give the guys another up and down. Oh, shit. Are they players? He nods as Quinn sets our drinks down with a triumphant smile. Guess they do come out in the off-season, Reese says to her. They aren't exactly the most social of players. They're no Jack Wilde. Why? Because they don't chat up random puck bunnies at the bar? Oh, snap. Does he mean Quinn? I am not a puck bunny. I'm with her in the horrified expression on her face. Slut-shaming is so 90s. Reese's face pales. Shit, I didn't mean you. I meant... Never mind. I'm sorry. She picks up her drink and fingers the straw. Besides, if I were, my standards would be Jack Wild High. Oh, Quinn, I think I might like her. Anyway, Reese says, now you've had your first official sighting. Not like it matters since they're off limits this summer, Quinn frowns. I note she says, this summer, as if she fully intends to bag a hockey player someday, a top player by the sounds of it. Reese drops his voice. You can thank Jack for that rule. What do you mean? I ask. He shifts in his chair and leans in, resting one elbow on the table. Last summer, there was an intern, Chrissy, who was rumored to be hooking up with a player. Jack? Quinn asks. I doubt it. Probably some chick looking for attention. Maybe. He nods. I didn't know her. I was in the media department last summer, but Chrissy was doing a rotation in the social media department like us with Blythe at the same time she posted the picture. He sits tall and uses his hands like he's painting the scene for us. Her, with a sheet pulled up to cover her, but obviously naked, and then someone, allegedly Jack, lying in the bed behind her. Allegedly? I ask. Just a back and part of a shoulder. Impossible to make out, Reese clarifies. She posted it from the team's page, though, with the caption, Cheater. It blew over pretty fast, since no one could be sure it was him. Besides, our captain can bang the entire state as long as he keeps playing like he's been. But they put the no-dating players rule in right after that incident. First of all, Jack doesn't do exclusive relationships, so the idea that he cheated is silly. Quinn purses her glossy lips. And second, Reese prompts. It's dumb that they made a rule because one person couldn't keep their shit together. Wow, I say, stunned. I'm shocked at the gall it would take to do that, and to risk the job. I've seen pictures of Jack, and he's gorgeous, but to go to that extreme and publicly call him out? We sit in silence for a few moments before Reese breaks the silence again. Arizona. What led you to Minnesota? The job, of course. I mean, lots of internships out there. Why one so far from Arizona? Running from something? Quinn asks. There's a sparkle in her eyes. I could have guessed she likes the drama, but it's confirmed when I see how ecstatic she is at the prospect. No. A friend from college recommended me for the job. Where do you go to college? Reese asks. A burst of pride sparks under my skin. Valley University. His smile spreads. They won the Frozen Four this year. I nod. Yep. Man, they had a great season. I wanted to be in Kansas City for the final game, but I couldn't make it work. I was there, and it was awesome. Wait. A friend from college. 
You don't mean... Yep. Another dose of pride. It was amazing to hear Maverick's name dropped so many times today. The people of Minnesota are really excited that the Wildcat signed him. What? Quinn looks between us. What am I missing? Who do you know? She narrows her eyes at me. Johnny Maverick. We went to college together. It's weird to think of that in the past tense. He won't be there when I go back. The corners of her mouth pull down into an unimpressed frown. Never heard of him before today. You will, Reese says and lifts his beer bottle to the center of the table. To the Wildcats. Quinn and I touch our glasses to his. To the Wildcats. I stick with Reese and he introduces me to a lot of people. Since he interned last summer and is local, he has all the inside knowledge, and I feel like I'm drinking from the end of a fire hose. I want to do such an amazing job this summer. Quinn eventually dishes us for her nail appointment, but I'm glad she came out. She's unlike any of my other friends, but there's something about her brazenness that I kind of dig. Speaking of friends, Reagan calls while we're playing darts. I excuse myself and find a spot at a quiet section of the bar. My best friend's face fills the screen and I smile back at her. Ray! Coda, I miss you. She sticks out her bottom lip. Tell me about your first day. Was it amazing? Did you meet any hockey hotties? I miss you so much. I miss you too. And I do. We've been inseparable for the past three years. There are few days since we met that I haven't seen or talked to her. And hockey hotties? Her mouth pulls into a wide smile. A couple of sightings here at the bar, but just backs of heads. It's just as well. They made it clear at our orientation today that fraternizing with the hockey players is not cool. You can't date the players? Her mouth forms a perfect O and her eyes widen. You'd think I just told her I can't leave my desk to use the bathroom. Oh, come on. It isn't like I was in a real position to do that anyway. The only player I will be spending time with this summer is the one I'm working with on the endorsement. And Maverick, of course. Well, assuming he wants to hang out, he might be busy with team stuff. Please, you have WAG section written all over you. She teases. The way you wore Maverick's number at the Frozen Four and then he scored a hat trick? That's enough to convince any guy you meet there that you are the perfect accessory to a great season. I snort laugh, <laughs> except I won't be here once the season starts. I believe in you. Make it happen. Channeling my dramatic friend, I place a hand on my chest. Hey there. Do you want to casually date for the next two months? I'm leaving at the end of the summer, but my vagina is so magical. I guarantee that you'll have a great season. I giggle and look to Reagan, who I expect to be laughing along with me. Her brown eyes are even wider now. Uh, Coda? What? She points, and I swivel in my chair and come face to face with Johnny and Jack Wilde. Maverick is chuckling under his breath, and Jack has an amused smirk. Holy hell, he's good looking up close. The same height as Maverick, but broader and sporting just the right amount of scruff. His dark hair is slicked back. He's sex on legs. I retract my earlier words because I can see exactly how he might make a young girl go crazy and toss her sanity and job out the window. How much of that did you hear? Enough to want to buy you a drink. Jack lifts his hand to signal the bartender. I'm going to hang up now. Reagan's voice draws me back to her smiling face on the phone. She sings songs, Have fun. She disconnects, and I have no choice but to face Johnny and Jack. Maverick takes the seat next to me. Jack, this is my friend Dakota. Coda, I'm guessing you know Jack. No, I say, then shake my head. I mean, yes, I know who you are. Jack extends a large hand. Nice to meet you, Dakota. 
Chapter 11 Johnny You should see your face. I bite back a laugh as Dakota stares slack-jawed at Jack moving across the bar to Deck and Lohan. I so didn't expect you to be starstruck. I... Her mouth opens and closes a few times before she continues. I was just caught off guard. Jesus, he's a lot. She shakes her head, making the long red strands fall over one shoulder. She composes herself and hits me with a killer smile. What are you doing here? Jack Holden said a couple of the guys were here. I lift a shoulder and let it fall. I spent the day unpacking and getting settled into the apartment. Hearing from the captain of my new team was a welcome interruption. Do you think you can handle yourself meeting a couple more of my teammates? She rolls her eyes. Of course I can. We stand and I lead her over to the guys. Johnny Maverick. Leo Lohan addresses me from his perch in a bar stool. Good to see you again, man. You too. The last time I was here, I met most of the team, but only a few are still in town during the off-season. Declan tips his head in greeting. I'm not sure I've heard him speak yet, but he has a friendly mug. Guys, this is my friend Dakota. She's interning with the Wildcats this summer. Hey. Dakota smiles and waves to the guys. How do you two know each other? Jack asks her. I toss an arm around her shoulders. Oh, we go way back. Jack's brows lift and he nods slowly. Magical vagina. I think I'm following now. She's the reason you got a hat trick in the championship game. Dakota groans and her body wilts under my arm. That's right, I say. We didn't sleep together, but she did wear my number in the final period. So, magical boobage. Jack grins and puts out a fist for Dakota. She taps her knuckles with his, though not very enthusiastically. Well, this has been mortifying. It was so nice to meet you guys. Let's forget this conversation ever happened, yeah? Done, Leo says and adjusts the wildcat's hat in his head. Ignore Jack, we do. She should be good at that, if she's friends with Maverick. The quiet Declan pipes in. I'm rescinding that friendly mug comment. If they were handing out degrees for it, I'd have a doctorate. She confirms and knocks me with her elbow. Can I steal you? I want to introduce you to someone. Gotta go, guys, I say. She wants to show me off. I dodge the elbow I know is coming and take a sidestep to safety. I've only been to Wilds one other time, but it's busier tonight than it had been then. Dakota weaves through tables and stops by the dartboards. A guy smiles at her in that way guys do with Dakota that she never seems to notice. And then his gaze slides to me, and his eyes bug out of his head. Johnny, this is my new friend and fellow intern, Reese. Reese? Jo Johnny Maverick, he interjects. Man, I am so glad you're here. Could have used some of your points last season. Reese is a fan, Dakota says, eyes twinkling with amusement, like she wasn't just fangirling over Jack a few minutes ago. This is the guy you're so pumped about? A chick steps up beside him and gives me a once-over that makes me feel like I should shower. It isn't sexual so much as it's invasive. I thought you left, Dakota says, lips pulling into a big, mocking smile. Johnny, meet Quinn. Nice to meet you. I shake both their hands. I came back after I heard Jack made an appearance, X-ray vision Quinn says. This Quinn chick smells like trouble. Hairspray, perfume, and a variety of other makeup and body products. Lots of products. It has a smell, I swear. She's gorgeous, and done up in a way that says she's down for wherever the night might lead her. But like she's hoping that's a six-course meal on a yacht. When a chick looks like money, it either means she's rich or she's looking to be. I'm polite as Dakota tells me how the three of them are working for Blythe this summer. Reese really is a fan, and he knows some of my stats from last season which Dakota thinks is amusing and I think is awesome. We were about to start a new game. Reese holds up a dart. You two want in? Yeah, let's play doubles. Quinn's eyes light up and she reaches for my arm. Dakota backs up, eyeing Quinn's fingers latched onto me. We probably shouldn't be seen getting too friendly with you. Why not? Do I smell I showered today and everything? Dakota rolls her eyes. I love it when she does that. Don't tell her. We're not supposed to fraternize with the players, she says. What? Why not? Long story, 
Dakota says at the same time Quinn insists it's fine. You guys go ahead. I was about to call it a night anyway. She looks at her new friends. See you tomorrow. Quinn takes a step closer to me and her nails dig into my bicep. I'm starting to get the feeling she's hoping to fuck herself into some Louboutins. I don't like to judge, but she's a little too eager. I think I'll head back too. I'm pretty beat. You don't need to do that, Dakota insists. No, I want to. I untangle myself from Quinn's grasp. Ready, babe? When we step out onto the sidewalk, Dakota bursts into laughter. Babe? Did you just babe me to stop a girl from following you home? Or did you get her number and she's following in five? She turns to look back at the bar entrance. That chick is dangerous. Quinn, I think she's all false bravados. Uh-huh. I don't buy it. Oh, come on, like you've never hooked up with a puck bunny. These are professional puck bunnies, Coda. It's a whole new league. We shuffle down the sidewalk. The sun's setting and the foot traffic has slowed from earlier. Did you eat dinner? No, not yet. You? I step ahead of her to open the door, but Larry, one of the doormen, beats me to it and opens the lobby door wide as he greets us. Hey, Larry, did you meet Dakota? She's interning at the Wildcats this summer. You're the new second floor tenant, he asks her. Yes. Pleasure to meet you. Inside the elevator, she presses the numbers 2 and 11. What do you feel like eating, I ask. Are we really hanging out? I thought that was an act to get away from Quinn. The elevator stops on the second floor and she steps out. I don't feel like going out. Let's order in. I place a hand on the door so that it won't close. My place or yours? I shake my head. Never mind. Mine. I'm not sitting on that pink couch. She laughs. See you in 15. I order from the first place I find that delivers and take Charlie out for a walk. Declan is coming back from the bar at the same time. A few of the guys, including him, live here, but the others are gone for the summer. It's still weird living somewhere without any friends nearby. Except for Coda, of course. He kneels and holds out a big hand to my dog. She plods forward happily. Not a lot of people she doesn't like, but it's a few extra points for my new teammate. Are you getting settled okay? Oh yeah, I dig Minnesota. He smirks. Good. Let me know if you need anything. I'm on 12. Thanks, man. I catch the delivery guy coming into the building, grab the food, and head back upstairs. Dakota is waiting outside my door with one long leg crossed over the other. She changed out of the dress she was wearing earlier and has on shorts and a baggy t-shirt. Her hair is pulled back in a ponytail. Everything about her says comfort and casual, but she's a rocket no matter what she wears. I got food, I say, holding up the bag. She takes it and I let us into the apartment. Once Charlie's off the leash, she jogs around the place, still scoping it out. Neither one of us has gotten used to this being our new place yet. Tell me all about your first day, honey. I say playfully as I grab plates and silverware from a box. I haven't unpacked much in here yet, but my TV is set up. Priorities. Dakota's walking around the apartment checking it out. She speaks without looking at me. It was great. Most of the day we sat in a conference room going over the details of our intern rotation and boring human resources stuff. But then they took us around and showed us all the facilities. The arena? She turns to face me. Her expression is adequately impressed. It's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. I know, right? I bring the food and utensils out to the living room. I have a dining table, but Coda doesn't seem bothered by sitting in the living area. In fact, she sits on the floor, crosses her legs, and keeps on talking while I set a plate in front of her and then pull out all the food containers. It was my favorite thing we saw today, hands down. I didn't expect it to be so big. That's what she said. It's out of my mouth before I can stop it. Dakota crumples up the receipt on the table from the food and tosses it at my face. It's the locker room for me. No matter how many I've seen, it's always something special when you walk into a new place. And the Wildcats locker room is pretty epic. They didn't let us in there, she says with a frown. They kept us very far away from anywhere players might be. I scoop a big bite of noodles into my mouth and chew. Dakota takes a much smaller bite and her face twists up in disgust. Uh-uh. What is this? I thought you liked Thai, I say, mouth still mostly full. I'm so hungry, I can't even taste it. 
I skipped lunch while trying to get the living room set up. I do, but something is funky with that. I offer her some off my plate and she takes another bite and runs to the kitchen. She holds a hand over her mouth and mumbles something as she searches around. Trash can is under the sink. I think. I hope. Because I hear her spit it out and then she pops back into view. That is not edible. A spitter, huh? I'm so disappointed. Before she can roll her eyes, oh, well, almost before, I put my fork down. Do you want me to order something else? No, I'll find something. She opens a cabinet, then another, before hitting me with one of her no-nonsense glares. Johnny Maverick, did you buy me groceries and not yourself? How do you... Oh, please, you're the only person I know here. I smile. I was planning on doing it tonight. Okay, let me come with you. I need to get a few more things anyway. Can I finish this first? Do you really want to? My stomach rumbles. Yeah, maybe it's not the best plan. Something is definitely funky. Or she's appropriately psyched me out anyway. Thank you, by the way. Dakota grabs a cart for us inside the grocery store. For what? The groceries. Oh, that was nothing. She drives the cart over to the produce section and stops at the bananas. It wasn't nothing. It was really nice. This is the part I hate about gifting things. I don't know what to do with the thanks. It was $50 worth of food, not a Rolls Royce. Welcome, I say, and set a bunch of bananas in the cart. Oranges, too. What do you need? Everything, I say. And healthy shit. I start working out with the guys tomorrow. My contract is a two-way, so if I want to stay in Minnesota and not be sent down to Iowa to the AHL team, then I have to step it up. Okay, me too. Good, healthy food for a hot girl summer. She walks ahead of the car, putting things in the front. I'm going to put my stuff here so we can keep it separate. That lasts all of ten minutes when I've forgotten and filled the car with so much stuff I have to encroach her space, and I don't even know what's mine or hers. We stare at the overflowing cart. Did you get everything? She asks. Yeah, I think so. I look over the veggies and meat piled up, and then glance toward the chip aisle that we purposely didn't go down because we both decided against it. You know, she starts, we could get a couple of bags of chips and candy. Maybe some ice cream, I add. She nods enthusiastically. And start fresh tomorrow. Hell, yes. I jog the cart down the aisle, stepping on the bottom rung and riding it until I get to the ones I want. Sour cream and onion potato chips. What was I thinking not indulging one last time? The shelves are ransacked, like before a winter storm or holiday weekend. I spot the ones I want on the top shelf, but even those have been picked over and I can't reach them. I step back in the cart, but even then it's not happening. Fuck, I had my heart set on those. Dakota clutches a bag of pretzels in one hand and Cheetos in the other. Which one? I plug them both from her hands and toss them into the cart. Hop on my shoulders. What? She laughs. I need that bag of chips, Coda. It's a matter of life and death. Can't we just ask someone for help? Time is wasting. We still have to get to the ice cream aisle. Laughing, she shakes her head but walks behind me. I squat down and she lifts one leg over my shoulder while holding on to my head for balance. This feels like a terrible idea. I won't drop you, promise. She groans but links her other leg over, and I slowly stand with her sitting on my shoulders. I grasp her thighs. They're silky and smooth under my touch. I try not to concentrate on that because dropping her would really kill the moment. Also, I probably wouldn't get my chips. I step up close to the shelving and she leans forward, one hand in my hair and the other reaching for the chips. I glance up and her t-shirt gaps, giving me a view straight up. Oh, fuck. I'm going to hell. All the sensations. Her perky tits covered by some sort of lacy black bra, the feel of her sexy, silky legs, and the way she's fisting my goddamn hair. It's my new favorite porno situation. You know, the innocent encounters that you wish ended with the pizza delivery girl ripping off her shirt, or, in this instance, Dakota climbing off my shoulders with my chips and feeding them to me. Naked. Got them, she shouts. I step back and she tosses them in the cart. Now put me down. 
I don't know, I got a pretty good view when you lean forward. Maybe I want you to grab a few more things for me. She smacks my forehead. Oh my god, I was doing you a favor. I didn't mean to see, they were just there. They? She covers her face. Oh my god. I crouch down so she can get down. Relax, not the first time I've seen them. Ah, uh, shit. I knew you saw them that night. I didn't see much. I saw everything. Her eyes narrow, but she's still smiling at me. I know she was flashing me behind that construction plastic back in Valley. When the light flickered, I could make out just enough to get a semi. To be fair, looking at Dakota fully clothed could do that to a guy. Okay, fine. It does it to me. I'm the guy. She's a rocket. I dig her red hair and fair complexion and the way she rolls her eyes, but smiles when I flirt with her, which is often. She thinks I'm joking. I'm not serious about much, but I've never said anything to her that I wasn't prepared to follow through on. Chapter 12. Johnny. Tuesday late morning, I head over to the arena. Jack mentioned the guys still in town are working out, and truth be told, I need an excuse to get out. I don't like being alone. In Valley, it was the best of both worlds. I had my own apartment, but I was only a flight of stairs from Heath, Adam, and Rhett. Fuck, I miss those guys. I pause in front of the arena doors and take a selfie, then send it to the group. Heath is the first to respond as I walk down the hall toward the weight room. Pain. Sweet new digs, bro. Ice isn't the same without you. He attached a picture of the valley rink, and I have to admit, even being in this fancy-ass arena, I'm hit with a bittersweet feeling that I won't ever play there again. Scott, you left a giant box of glow-in-the-dark condoms in the apartment? Want me to mail them? Rothrus, we're in the same state again. Let me know when you're free, and me and Sienna will come down for dinner. Maverick, that was a parting gift, Scott. Enjoy. Payne, love you, bro. FaceTime later? Rothrus, yeah, man, let's make plans as soon as camp is over. Damn, this is weird. I was only at Valley for two years, but it was more my home than any other place I've lived. I glance around. This isn't too bad, though. Not bad at all. Jack, Declan, and Leo are lifting weights, music blasting. I stop in the doorway and take it all in. Goosebumps climb my arms as I glance around the weight room. It's fucking huge. So many machines, top-of-the-line shit. No expense was spared in here. Johnny Maverick. Jack checks the clock on the wall. Nice of you to finally join us. Your text said you'd be here from nine to two. The captain of the Wildcats drops the dumbbells in his hands and steps forward. Just messing with you. You're in time for weights. Nice of you to conveniently miss the five-mile run. Leo smirks as he mops the sweat off his forehead with a towel. Deck finishes guzzling from his water bottle and uses the back of his hand to wipe his mouth. And the hour mobility session. Five miles. Mobility. Already? Fuck. I ate a bowl of Lucky Charms and chased it with a dozen donuts while I watched The Price is Right. I know, I know, the healthy food was supposed to start today, but I couldn't let the junk food go to waste. I step to the only guy I don't know in the room and offer him my hand. Hey, I'm Johnny Maverick. He's a big guy, several inches taller than me and like twice as wide. His grip on my hand is painful. Hercules. No shit. Hercules drops my hand and walks over to the squat rack. He proceeds to put 45 plates on either side, until I'm not sure the bar can take it anymore. He doesn't talk much. Jack picks up his weights and goes back to curling the 40s while chatting. Ready to get to work? Yeah. I nod and take a seat on an empty bench. We don't have to report for camp for another two weeks, but I am anxious to get started. Well, don't just sit there. Grab some weights, rookie. Declan smiles at me in the mirror. Let Hercules have a little new blood. The trainer in question grins. Don't worry. His voice is thick with an accent. Austrian, I think? He sounds like Arnold, just about as big as him back in the Mr. Olympia days, too. He tips his head, indicating I should come closer. Let's get some meat on those legs, huh? Ah, uh, fuck. This is going to hurt. Jack huffs a laugh. You made a friend. That's more than he said to me all day. Hercules doesn't respond, but one corner of his mouth tilts in amusement. 
The giant trainer may not say a lot of words, but he doesn't need to. I finish one set, he adds more weight, and then waves a hand basically telling me to get a move on. Jack finally takes pity on me after an hour of sweating out the pound of sugar I inhaled this morning. I'm killing myself trying to keep up with everything Hercules throws at me. He tosses me a towel. All right, Herc, you've had enough fun with a new guy. For now. He looks at me. Tomorrow, nine o'clock. I'll be here. I might not be able to leave. I'm not sure I can walk. My legs are donezo. I lie on my back in the middle of the floor. Everything hurts and I'm dying. I've got a lot of work to do. Less beer, less pizza, and way more weight training are in my future. He crouches down and offers me his hand. You need to meet Elsa. Elsa? Trust me. I take his hand and he pulls me to my feet. Wowzer, my thighs burn, but I follow him into another room to a waiting ice bath. Seven minutes with Elsa and you'll be good as new. He slaps me on the back and I stumble forward on wobbly legs. See you tomorrow, rookie. While Elsa isn't the magic cure, I do feel better after a soak. I find Hercules still in the workout room and ask him to create a plan for me this summer. He grins, and I regret it immediately. Lastly, I have a meeting with Coach, and then somehow, the day is over, and it's five o'clock. I head upstairs to the main offices looking for Dakota. I have no idea where she sits, but I see lots of other people I assume are interns and wander until I spot her red hair. She stands outside of an office, shoulder leaning against the wall. What are you doing here? She looks around. Picking you up from work. Let's go to dinner. Now that I'm in not so much pain or in a threat of puking up breakfast, I'm starving. I'm going to need to get my nutrition on lock to survive training with Hercules. I'm waiting for Blythe. What are you doing here? I work here. I wink. Right. I meant... I know what you meant. I lean against the wall next to her. I worked out with the guys and then spent seven minutes in heaven with Elsa. Dakota's brows lift and she pops a hip. Do I even want to know? Ice bath. I shift and hold out my arm. Standing still makes me realize how weak my legs are. I should have spent more time with Elsa, or less with Hercules. Ready to rock? She wakes the screen of her phone and checks the time. Blythe is running late. She has the boxes and all the details for the endorsement. I still don't know which hockey player I'm working with. The suspense is killing me. Her beautiful eyes light up. My gut twists. I should have told her I know, but then she might not have come to Minnesota. Can you get it tomorrow? One more day of ignorant bliss. Yes, her shoulders slump forward. I guess so. Great. I move my legs as fast as possible, which isn't all that fast right now, to get us out of Dodge before Blythe returns. When we're outside, I breathe a sigh of relief. Where do you want to go? I was planning on cooking. We did just buy a ton of groceries. Yeah, but I already ate all the good stuff. Man, I'd love another donut right now. I think I'm going to bake some tilapia and make a nice salad. My stomach growls audibly, and I give her big, pleading eyes, the kind that says, please feed me and keep me company. Dakota rolls her eyes. Fine, you can come, but only if you bring Charlie and no complaining about how uncomfortable my couch is. Ooh, I inhale with a hiss. I'm not sure I can promise that. It's the most uncomfortable. I slam my lips shut when her eyes narrow, and my dreams of a home-cooked meal start to disappear. I make a motion like I'm locking the key on my closed mouth and follow her home. Chapter 13 Dakota after dinner, I go with Johnny and Charlie on a walk, and then they come back to my apartment. I get the feeling my place has become his new home away from home. I don't mind. I've had a roommate for so long, I've gotten used to always having someone around. He collapses on my couch, groans, and mutters under his breath about how hard it is. I fill a bowl with water for Charlie and then grab the nearly empty tub of ice cream from my freezer. We put a major dent in this last night. I wave a spoon in front of his face. Want some rocky road? Ooh. His hazel eyes widen with excitement, and then he shakes his head. Can't. Hot girl summer. He lifts the hem of his t-shirt. 
Time to start treating this body like the temple that it is. His flat stomach taunts me. Maybe I could lick his abs and save myself the calories. What? No! Ew! No! Okay, not you. Johnny is hot, but I need to get out and meet more people. If I spend every night holed up with him for the next eight weeks, I might do something stupid. I laugh and sit in the chair with the tub, eating straight from the container. He watches me lick the spoon, and I just know he's thinking something dirty. It's probably true 99% of the time. I roll my eyes. I didn't even say anything. His deep laughter fills my living room. I could tell what you were thinking. He smirks and sits up. Doubtful. He snatches me around the wrist before I realize what he's doing and pulls me on top of him, ice cream, spoon, and all. Johnny! I squeal as he sets me in his lap, arms around me. I changed my mind. Feed me, Coda. He leans his head over my shoulder and opens his mouth. No, this last bite is all mine. I bring the spoon toward my lips and he whines. Coda. I take a small bite and then feel bad and hold the rest out for him. Sweet, your mouth touched it too. Bonus. My saliva on your ice cream is a bonus? He nods with a cocky glint in his eyes as he swallows. Absolutely. The next morning, I get to work 15 minutes early, hoping to catch Blythe before rotations start. Again, I find her office empty. The lights are on, so I know she's here somewhere, but it looks like another day without finding out which player I'm working with this summer. Thanks to Maverick, I know most of the guys aren't around for another week or two anyway, but ugh, I want to know. I head to my desk since I have time to kill. We don't start our rotations until next week, which means this week we're with Blythe learning all things marketing department. While I wait for everyone else to arrive, I scroll through the Wildcat's social media pages. They're well done, with a good mix of content, news announcements around game schedules and contracts, then there's game footage, photos and videos a lot like what we compiled for the hype videos back at Valley in the Hall of Fame, and finally, more personal touches like birthdays and casual photos of the team and staff. Blythe and her team have created an engaging and visually stunning space on all the platforms. There are a lot of cool jobs at the Wildcats, and I'm excited to do all of it, but none of it more than working with Blythe. I click on the team page to find some of the guy's personal pages. Jax is the most obviously curated. He doesn't have any private photos or really anything that looks like he posted it himself. Still, he has almost a million followers. Reese is the next to show. He drops into a chair with his sunglasses still on. Morning. He slides the shades up and rests them on top of his head. Morning, Arizona. I'm actually from Kansas. It's too late. You're Arizona in my brain now. Quinn walks in just before Blythe. My new boss looks as stylish and gorgeous as ever. I'd kill to see her closet. She carries a box on her hip. This is for you, she says, dropping it on my desk. Sorry I didn't get a chance to bring it by yesterday afternoon. No problem. Ah, finally. Is everyone ready to get started today? I nod and bite my lip, anxious to dig into the goodies. The three of us gather around while Blythe gives us a basic rundown of the day. Reese and Quinn are assigned the task of brainstorming content ideas for social media posts between now and when the development camp starts in two weeks. And thank the hockey hotties, she tells me to spend the day familiarizing myself with the endorsement campaign. Quinn and Reese huddle together at his desk next to mine, and Blythe stands by while I open the box for my big hockey guy's endorsement. We'll need to work around the camp schedule to get a photo shoot, she says. The sooner, the better, because as the guys all return from break, things will get busier around here. As she speaks, I dive in with enthusiasm to finally figure out what the heck is inside. My hand slides past the packing peanuts, and I wrap my fingers around the first item. 
I pull it out and smile. Body wash? I keep going, pulling out more products. Deodorant, body mist, aftershave lotion, and sack spray. There are a few different scents, all with names like Starry Night, Wild Fields, and Hailstone. Each fragrance is available in all the products so that you could have an entire collection of Starry Night, for example. Of all the things I imagined, this wasn't anywhere on my radar. I'm relieved, though. This is going to be fun. I hold up the deodorant spray for balls for Blythe to see. She laughs. <laughs> Charming. What is it? Quinn asks. I toss it to her, and she reads the label, mouth twisting into disgust. Ew. She tosses it to Reese like she's playing a game of hot potato. Reese catches it easily and chuckles. <laughs> awesome. Which player is endorsing ball deodorant? Quinn lifts a brow. She stands and comes over to get a better look at all the products scattered on my desk. I don't know, actually, I admit, as I empty the box and set it on the floor. I glance at Blythe. She tilts her head to the side, a confused expression on her stunning face. Do you know? I ask her. Yeah, I... She smiles hesitantly. Johnny Maverick. This is the Maverick Company's new product line for male hygiene. He didn't tell you? Heat rushes to my face. I shake my head side to side. An unsettling feeling takes hold of my chest. I look back at the products. The Maverick name and logo sit proudly on each one. Oh. My. God. Quinn huffs, shoots me a suspicious glare, and goes back to her desk. Well, I'll leave you three to get started. Dakota, let me know if you need anything. She waves, indicating the Maverick campaign and the tiny little bottles on my desk. As soon as she's gone, I pull out my laptop and bring up the contract for my internship. J.M. Holdings. Oh, my God. How could I be so stupid? John Maverick. Did Johnny do this? Of course he did. But why? And what else did he do? I grab my phone. Me. Are you at the arena? Maverick. Yep, I'm in the weight room. What's up? Me. Have a minute? Maverick. Of course. Come on down. I'll see if I can sneak you into the locker room for a tour while you're down here. I stand and grab the wild field sack spray. My cheeks burn with humiliation and rage. Everything okay? Reese asks, looking up from his notepad. Quinn doesn't spare me a glance. I can't blame her. I know exactly how this looks. Perfect. I am going to take a walk while I brainstorm. And I might maim a hockey player while I'm at it. Chapter 14 Johnny Jack and I have music pumping in the weight room. Hercules is working with Declan and Leo on the other side of the massive room. I asked Hercules to come up with a training plan for me, and he did not disappoint. I'm not going to be able to feel my arms when I leave here, but the man came through. When Dakota appears in the doorway, I smile and drop my weights. She scans the room for me, and while she does, I appreciate today's outfit. A light pink dress paired with those red chucks again. She is smoking. Coda, I call. Her expression morphs into anger. Those sexy blue eyes narrow, and her chin drops as she glares at me across the room. Ah, uh, shit. You! She marches over to me and pokes my bare chest with a pointy finger. What? What? I rub my chest and take a step back. She holds up one of the products from the male hygiene line I'm now endorsing. Oh. It's a dumb thing to say. I knew she'd find out, and I knew she'd be pissed. But I hoped when the time came, I'd know what to say. I don't. Oh? Oh? She comes at me again. She uncaps the spray and starts spritzing me with it. I back up and put my hands up. Does that stop her? Hell to the no. I trip over a dumbbell and catch myself on a nearby bench, sitting and saying, Stop, okay? You're pissed. I get it. Pissed? You think this is pissed? Uh, why am I working for your family's company? 
Jack, who was doing squats, stops and rests his elbows on the bar, watching our interaction in the mirror with a grin. They needed someone to... She spritzes me again. Wrong. Try again. Blythe. Another goddamn spritz. Fuck, Coda. Cut that out. It got in my mouth that time. Serves you right. She holds it up like a weapon. I'm going to ask you one more time. Why am I working for your family's company? Because I didn't want you to miss out on an internship with the Wildcats. So you talked to your dad and got him to sponsor my internship? Ah, uh, fuck. This is going to be bad. Her eyes are tiny slits of ice. It wasn't my dad. I sponsored your internship. I used the money they paid me for the endorsement. She goes on a spritzing rampage, growling and cursing at me. Standing, I grab her wrist. We wrestle with the bottle, but I get it and hold it up high where she can't reach it. She looks like she might hit me, so I hold her against my chest with the other arm. You deserve the internship. It's a great opportunity for you. And it isn't like I'm not getting anything out of this. My endorsement campaign is going to be baller. You're the best, and I wanted the best. She wiggles in my hold. Let me go, Maverick. I comply, and she steps back, still glaring at me, but it doesn't look like I'm in immediate danger. I'm sorry, okay? Sorry? My entire internship is a big, fat lie. It isn't. Blythe wanted to hire you. I don't want your money. Find someone else to do the endorsement. Coda? This is precisely why I didn't want to tell her. Wait. No. I would have been perfectly happy working at the Hall of Fame this summer. Maybe they can still get me on the schedule. She starts toward the door and I jog in front of her, blocking the doorway. You can't go back to Valley. Why not? Because this internship is a great opportunity. Blythe is the best. You said so yourself. A summer working for her will look great in your resume. Let me tell you how much I care about my resume right now. I assume the apartment was also you? I don't speak, but she nods once and sighs. I might need a couple of days to arrange everything, but I will be out by the weekend. Come on, don't do this. I have to get back upstairs. She pushes past me. Fuck. I like her, Jack says as Dakota disappears down the hallway. Ah, Rook. He claps me on the shoulder. You really screwed this one up, huh? Yeah. I suggest groveling. A lot of it. You grovel? For a chick like that? I think I just might. What is that smell? Hercules says as he waves a hand in front of his face. It's growing on me. Lavender? Sandalwood? I toss him the sack spray. Wild fields. I'm gonna... I jab a thumb to the door. Go. I'll catch you later, Rook. Jack smiles as I head to catch Dakota. I get upstairs before I realize I don't have on a shirt. A couple of corporate guys give me a once-over and I slow my roll. Dakota isn't answering her phone, and I don't know where she sits up here in the maze of offices. I head back downstairs and finish my workout. But my head isn't in it. When I don't hear back from her by the end of the day, I go back to the apartment and text the guys for help. Maverick. Pissed off Coda. Help. Scott. What the fuck did you do? Pain. Ouch. Bet that had painful consequences. Scott. Sorry, that was Reagan. She's looking over my shoulder now, FYI. Don't say anything that's going to get me in trouble for your stupidity. Rothris. Ah, shit. I hope you're wearing a cup. Scott. Oh, fuck, you paid for her internship. Maverick, how do you already know? Scott, Reagan's texting Dakota. You're right, she's pissed. Payne, you paid for her internship? Rothris, oh, shit, you paid for her internship? Maverick, yes, great, glad we're all on the same page now. What do I do? Payne, I got nothing. Rothris, shrug emoji? Maverick, Scott? Maverick, help me. Scott, dude, I don't know. When Reagan gets mad at me, I kiss her. I don't think that's going to work in your case. Pain. Oh, yeah, kiss her. That always works. Rothris, I take off my shirt, but I'm guessing you've already done that. Maverick, shirtless selfie, flipping them off. You guys are useless. Maverick, I still love you. Xbox later. Pain. Meet you online at 8. Kissy face emoji. Rothris, I'll be there. I might even let you win. 
Probably not. Scott, brainstorm session before? I'll see what I can get out of Ray. I shower and wait outside of Dakota's apartment for her to get off work. I bring Charlie as backup. She can't say no to Charlie. When she steps out of the elevator, I push off the wall and wait for her to come at me, fists flying. What are you doing here? Her tone has lost all the anger, but she isn't happy to see me either. She opens the apartment and I follow her inside. I'm sorry. I should have told you. Yes, you should have. She crosses her arms over her chest and leans against the kitchen counter. I knew you wouldn't take the job if you had any idea that I'd arranged it, and I wanted you to take the job. I get that you think you were doing me a favor, but now all I can think about is how I didn't earn this job. You did, though. Blythe offered you the job, remember? No one will believe that. You should have seen the way Quinn looked at me today. I wanted my talent to stand on its own. And it will. I am just providing the opportunity. I can't stay. But since I have already cost you money with the move and apartment, I spent the day working on concepts for your endorsement photo shoot. I emailed them to you. I have no idea if any of the ideas are feasible, but it should be a start for whoever you get to take my place. She starts toward her bedroom. I follow her. So does Charlie. She's a loyal little creature, and she knows something is up. Let me buy you dinner to make it up to you. You think buying me something else is going to fix this? The scowl on her face tells me no. I'm going for a run. I need to clear my head. She shuts herself in the walk-in closet. I don't know how to make this right. Think, Johnny, think. I haven't come up with anything when she steps out dressed in her running clothes. I'm so sorry I didn't tell you before. I wanted to, but I also really wanted you to take the job. Her glare softens, only slightly. I was trying to do you a favor, that's true, but it's because I really believe you're the best person for the job. She grabs her phone and ear pods. I shout her back out of her room and through the apartment. She says nothing as she leaves for her run. Stay, I tell Charlie. I'm not dressed for a run, but I'll keep up with her step for step for as long as it takes to make her understand. She's halfway down the stairs to the lobby. Damn, she's fast. I can't lose her. I have to fix this. I take the stairs three at a time. They're an odd size and curve around. I'm almost to the bottom. When I lose my footing, I jump the rest of the way and catch myself by ramming the left side of my body into the wall. She glances back at the commotion. Are you okay? Fine. Her gaze flicks to my leg as I put weight on it and limp forward, still trying to get to her. I rub at the outside of my knee. Fuck that hurt. You're not fine. Sit down. She points to the bench in the lobby. I just need a second. I hobble over to it and sit. Does it hurt to touch? Her eyes search my face as she places her fingertips on the side of my knee. I'll be fine in a minute. I hit it against the wall. It hit back harder. I lower my voice. Please don't go. I wince as I get to my feet. I think you should have that looked at. If I do, will you stay? She laughs and I breathe a tiny sigh of relief that she's no longer trying to run away. Who do we call? Your coach? Your agent? I'll check in with a trainer first thing tomorrow. She silences me with a sexy little growl. I've seen you get slammed to the ice and look like you're in less pain than you do right now. You need to have it looked at now. I'll call Hugh. He'll know what to do. I'm still holding her hand hostage while I dial. She points for me to sit again, and she takes the seat beside me and brings my hurt leg up to her lap. I like her when she's all bossy and takes charge, and when she's not glaring at me. Scratch that. I like her all of the time. Chapter 15 Dakota Hugh sends Maverick to see the team doctor. I help him out to his SUV. It takes us more time to drive around and park than it would have to walk, but since I'm taking as much weight as I can handle off his leg, it seemed the safer choice. I pull up to the back entrance of the arena where the team doctor is waiting for us. After only a few minutes, Dr. Anderson tells Maverick that he thinks he has a sprained MCL and sends us to the hospital for an MRI to determine the severity and ensure he didn't tear the ligament. Mav is quiet in the passenger seat as I drive. I don't think he really expected the doctor to find anything, and I can't imagine the thoughts going through his head. 
When we get to the emergency room, I force him into a chair while I sign him in. Dr. Anderson said you could be back as quick as a week or two, I tell him. Great, he says in the most mundane tone I've ever heard from him. It's going to be okay. I rest a hand lightly on his thigh. It has to be. I feel awful. I know it wasn't my fault, but it would never have happened if I hadn't been running away from him. He looks down at my hand, and then his stare locks on mine. Don't leave. I'm not going anywhere. I'll be right here. I scan the magazine selection and pick up a copy of People. That isn't what I meant. Stay here in Minnesota. Don't go back to Valley. I set the magazine back on the table and sigh. He angles his body, holding an ice pack to his knee. I did it for you, but I did it for me too. There are lots of people that can do the job, even better than I can, but I leave that out. I would have worked my ass off for that job. Maybe, but they're not you. I wanted the best, but I also wanted you. I try to read his serious expression. Why? Because leaving Valley was hard. The guys, you, Reagan, Ginny, Sienna, you were more than just my friends. I nod. I get that. I love my dad, but outside of him, my family is made up of my crazy friends. I shouldn't have lied to you, but I want you here. You're like a little piece of home. Mav. My voice cracks. Don't go. Not now. I need you. He drops his head into my lap. My heart splits open, and he nudges a little farther in. He's vulnerable and unsure and so unlike my friend. Okay, I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. Thank you. He doesn't move his head, and I slide my fingers through his thick, dark hair. I'm not taking your money, though. We'll figure it out, he says. Just don't go. It's late when we get back to the apartment. No terror, thankfully, but he did sprain his MCL and needs to rest for at least a week, maybe longer. He crutches to the elevator and we start toward the second floor so he can get Charlie. We left her at my place when we went to see the doctor and she is very excited to see her owner return. I pick her up and let Maverick give her a few pets. I'll take her out and then bring her up to you. Cool. Thanks. He sits on the couch and blows out a long, tired breath. I'm just going to rest here for a second. It's hard to see him like this when I'm so used to the happy-go-lucky guy I've been friends with for two years. I take Charlie outside and then up to the 11th floor. I knock on Maverick's door and wait. When he doesn't respond, I try the doorknob in case he left it open for me, but it doesn't budge. I didn't bring my phone, so I can't call him. I knock and try again, a little louder. Mav? Are you in there? He must have been exhausted if he passed out without his dog. Charlie curls up in my arms. Guess you're staying with me tonight, I tell her. She snuggles in tighter against my chest. Back on the second floor, I push into my apartment and come up short. Maverick lays on the pink couch. His mouth gapes open, and one tattooed arm is over his eyes. Correction, I say quietly, putting Charlie on the ground. She jogs over and jumps up next to him. He doesn't open his eyes, but wraps an arm around her in his sleep. I guess you're both staying with me tonight. I wake up to the whirring sound of my blender in the kitchen. I left my bedroom door open in case Maverick needed something, but I slept through the night. I glance at my phone for the time. I have an hour before I need to get to work. I swing my legs off the bed and move toward the kitchen. Morning, he says when he sees me. He's leaning on one crutch. Did I wake you? My alarm was going off in 15 minutes anyway. I hop onto the counter. A couple of bar stools would have gone great in here. I scope out his concoction. What are you making? 
Instead of answering, he grabs two glasses and pours half into each. Try it. You should be sitting down and icing your knee. I will all day, he grumbles. I'm sorry I fell asleep here. Boy, am I sorry. He raises one arm and rotates it. He lost his shirt at some point, and the button of his jeans is open. I can see just the band of his black boxers. My body tingles. Maverick has a great body. I've seen him shirtless more times than I can count, but after last night, watching him be so vulnerable and mixing that with the ripped guy standing in my apartment making me a smoothie that tastes, well, delicious, I'm a little too aware of how hot my friend is. I'm going to get ready. I start back toward my room, taking my smoothie with me. Yeah, I should head upstairs and get comfortable, I guess. Do you need any help? Nah, Charlie will follow. He finishes off his smoothie and places the empty glass in the dishwasher. How are you going to take Charlie outside during the day? I'll manage, he clips, and I slam my lips together to keep from smiling or calling him broody. A broody maverick. I never thought I'd see the day. Okay, well, if you need anything, just text me. And we should talk later. We still need to figure out everything with the endorsement and the apartment. I wave a hand around my fabulous new place. I really do love it. After only a few days, I'm going to be sad to leave it. I did some searching last night, and I found some apartment listings I'll check out this week. This place is already paid for, he says. His tone and insinuation make it clear he thinks I'm being silly. You can sublease it. He chuckles. God, you're stubborn. And the internship? I lift my heel and curl my toes into the hardwood floor. I will continue on one condition. Name it. I want to be unpaid like all the other interns. You're doing more than the other interns. Do we have a deal? No. He leans on his crutches. Look, the job you're doing for me is worth every penny I'm paying. If you want to reimburse me for the other bullshit, fine. But I'm not letting you go unpaid all summer for a job I'd hire out regardless. The Maverick Company could have done all of it for you. My being here is pointless. Not to me. He hobbles over, so he's standing in front of me. I was always going to hire someone else to oversee the endorsement. I don't want them calling any more shots than is absolutely necessary. Why? Because. There's a bite in his tone that makes me hold my tongue. He roughs a hand through his hair. My dad looks out for the Maverick Company first and foremost. I don't have anyone. I guess I wanted a third party to look out for me. And I knew you'd do that. Johnny. I reach out and rest my hand on his chest. I'm angry at his dad and sad for him all at once. Also, I think he severely overestimates how much power I have. The Maverick Company has the final sign-off on everything I create. You have lots of people, me included, although I'm a little nervous about how much faith you're putting in me. I don't have any idea what I'm doing. I trust you. One side of his mouth hitches up. I hope that trust isn't seriously misguided. I should get ready for work. We can figure out all the details tonight. Are you going to be okay on your own today? I'll be fine. He heads toward the door. Have a good day at work, honey. I shake my head as I watch him leave and then wander back into my room. He's back a minute later. He doesn't knock and I scream as he walks into my bedroom while I'm taking off my t-shirt. Oh shit. Sorry. He hops around on one foot and faces the other direction. What are you doing back? I ask, fumbling for my shirt and pulling it over my head inside out. I had an idea. My heart still races as I kick my bra toward the closet. You can turn around now. He smirks. Three times now you flashed me. I think you're doing it on purpose. You wish. Hell yeah, I do. You've got great tits. Are they fake? 
I'd like to toss a pillow at him, but don't because he's injured. What's the idea, and why are you back in my apartment? I was thinking, maybe you could move in with me? My brows lift, and he continues. Hear me out. I have a two-bedroom, and we're obviously going to be hanging out most nights anyway. Obviously, I parrot. Would you rather live with me or some stranger? I laugh, and his smile gets bigger. It'll be fun. Come on, just give it a chance. We can do a trial run today. He hops to the couch and sits. I thought you wanted me to move in with you. My place is a one-bedroom. I do, but if I hang here today, it'll be easier to take Charlie out. That elevator is slow as fuck, and the stairs are not my friend right now. Plus, I can rummage through your panty drawer. Oh my god, perv. Stay out of my room. Kidding. His smile falls. But in all seriousness, my knee is screaming this morning. You can stay as long as you want. I point toward the couch. In the living room only. And I will think about the rest. Thanks. This is going to be great, Rumi. I spend the morning working with Reese, looking through approved photos to go with the content he and Quinn created yesterday. Then we mock up all the posts for Blythe to approve. So Arizona, I heard Maverick got injured. You did? It was in the sports section this morning. MCL sprain. That's right. Sucks. Right before camp is not a good time to be getting injured. He lifts his brows. He should be fine in a week or two. He's tough. Reese leans back in his chair, pen lifted in his hand. He clicks it as he says, Yeah, but by then they may have already decided to send him to Iowa. Really? Just like that? Three days ago, everyone was talking about how he was the future of the Wildcats, and now they're ready to cast him aside? I knew it was important that he get treated and back on his feet quickly, but I had no idea they'd write him off so fast. Brutal. After lunch, I review the endorsement contract more closely. The deliverables are outlined, but otherwise, it's vague. They want photographs of Johnny with some of the products for the launch, and they even provided examples from some of their print and online ads. There are a lot of smiling women putting lotion on their hands, others with shiny, just-styled hair. It's a little stiff and boring, if I'm honest. But whoever designed the new line for men did so with a new, younger vibe. The names of the products themselves are fun, and the colors and bottles are more modern. Johnny is the perfect person to endorse it, despite his reservations, which I totally understand. I can't imagine what it's like to feel as if your parents care more about their company than you. For the rest of the day, I think of nothing else. I take everything I know about my friend and build a campaign that puts him and his personality front and center. Maybe the endorsement has no merit on whether the Wildcats keep him or send him down to the AHL team, but I work like it might be the difference. Before I leave, I email Blythe my rough concept and then stop by her office on my way out. Come in, she says. Her feet are kicked up on her desk, and instrumental music plays quietly. She brings her feet to the floor and sits upright. I was just looking over your ideas. They're good. Really good. They are? She nods enthusiastically. I especially like your idea for the photo shoot. It's perfect for Johnny. Your knowledge of him really comes through. I could practically hear him in your summary. I'm not sure if that's a compliment, channeling my inner maverick, but I had fun coming up with it. It shows. It's a little different than their other campaigns. Do you think it's too far? One of her shoulders lifts slightly. No, I think it's exactly what they need to sell this new line. But we should run it by them before you do the photo shoot. Okay. Yeah, I was planning on doing that after I had it all detailed out. The tricky part will be scheduling and finding locations for the shoot. The Wildcats have agreed to let us do it here, but it can't look like it was shot here. Nothing that seems like the Wildcats themselves are endorsing the products. 
That sort of endorsement costs a lot more than what they're paying. While we're on the topic, I want you to know that I appreciate what you and Johnny did to get me here. You didn't know, she says, and I shake my head. I pieced that together yesterday. I wouldn't have taken the job if I had, I admit, but I am going to do my best to prove I'm the right person to be here regardless. I'm glad you're here, Dakota. I suspect Johnny had ulterior motives, but I think his career is going to benefit. She points to her laptop. You've already proven it, at least to me. Thank you so much. I can talk to Coach Miller about letting us use the locker room for the photo shoot. It's probably going to be a hard no the week of camp. What about next week? Her brows lift. You think you can get it ready that quickly? Absolutely. I'm so excited to work on this. Okay, then. I think you'll be okay with that, but I'll double check. She cocks her head to the side and studies me. You and Johnny Maverick. Heat floods my face. We're just friends. I don't like telling people what to do with their personal time, but unfortunately, relationships between players and interns have caused issues in the past. My heart flutters in my chest. I understand. You don't have anything to worry about with me. Good. See you tomorrow, Dakota. Chapter 16 Dakota When I get back to my apartment, Maverick and Charlie are still here. Maverick's hurt leg is stretched out along the couch and his laptop is in front of him. He's wearing a headset and playing some video game. Hey, I call, dropping my purse and laptop bag on the counter. Die, Rothrus, he says and tips his head up to me. Aw, oh, fuck. Fuck! Damn it! The screen goes red. You win again, fucker. I'm going to get you. I gotta go. Dakota just got home. I'll catch you guys later. Hey, he says with a sheepish grin. How was work? It was good. How's the knee? I pick up a warm ice pack from the floor in front of him. Fine. He runs a hand over his messy hair. I didn't realize it got so late while I was fucking around with the guys. I hope you don't mind Charlie and I stayed here all day. I don't. I told you it was fine. But it looks like you went up to the 11th floor. I point to his laptop. Yeah, I got really bored. You need a TV. I don't point out the obvious that he could have stayed in his apartment instead of schlepping his laptop back down here. I'm glad to see him. Let me help. I can grab whatever you need. You've done enough. It was easier taking Charlie in and out only going up and down the one flight of stairs. He stands and grabs his crutches. We'll get out of your hair. Hand me that. He juts his chin to the laptop. How are you going to carry it? Stick it in the back of my jeans. Mav, this is stupid. Just hang out here. I resist reminding him that it's technically his place since he paid for it. Really? You don't mind? No, I think I'd like the company. I'm not used to living alone. I'm starving, though. I go to the kitchen and look for something to eat. We bought so much food the other night, but I don't feel like cooking. I grab mini rice cakes and take the bag to the living room. You really need a TV, he says. I could show you my plan for your endorsement. I read over your email. It looked good. Well, today I expanded all of it to give it more maverick personality. I pull it up on my laptop and I talk him through it while we devour the bag of rice cakes. I was thinking it would be cool if they named one of the scents after you. I don't think they're looking to redo anything. Then one of the scents they've already named. You could be Starry Night. He chuckles. I go to my purse and bring out a few of the samples. I hold the one in question under his nose. Uh-uh, he says. That one burns my nose. Okay, what about this one? I uncap another deodorant and let him sniff. I like that one. He inhales a second time. It's my favorite, too. Yeah. What's it called? Hailstone. That one. But I can't ask them to rename it. 
that'd cost money, and they've already given me enough. No problem, it was just an idea. But let's use this scent in all the pictures. It will create a believable and cohesive campaign. Johnny Maverick wears hailstone. Done. Now, can we talk about the TV situation? Specifically, the lack of one in your apartment? I found a steal online. It can be here in an hour. I can't afford a TV. Besides, this is nice. Be nicer with the glow of a 70-inch flat screen. I'll never beat Rothrus playing him on this tiny screen. He lifts the laptop and lets it drop back to the couch cushion. How is he? How's Sienna? They're good. Really good. Sienna's teaching figure skating and yoga, and he's running hockey camps. I'm hoping they'll come down sometime next month if they get a break. It would be good to see them before I go back to Valley. Who knows how long it will be before we're all back together. I'm not worried. You girls can't go very long without seeing one another, and the guys won't want to leave their girlfriends. True. I think if you carry the laptop and Charlie, I can stand to crutch up the stairs one last time tonight. Then we'll have TV. Charlie likes TV. Oh my god, you're hopeless. Surely we can find something to do. We sit silently for a few seconds. Do you want something to drink? Definitely. He follows me into the kitchen. All I have is wine or vodka, but I didn't get a mixer. We'll chase the vodka with the wine. That sounds like a terrible idea. Or a really great fun idea. Come on, what else do you have going on? The answer to that is nothing. And two hours later, I'm drunk and back in the kitchen, dancing and looking for food that doesn't require microwave or oven usage. Somewhere in my inebriated brain, I'm aware that I can't be trusted with either. I grab the Cheetos and take them to the living room. Maverick is kicked back, shirt off, staring at me with hazy eyes. It's almost gone. He hands me the wine. I tip it back and finish it off straight from the bottle. A little drips on my shirt and I wipe at it, then say fuck it and pull my shirt over my head. I spilled, I say, as if that's a good reason to be in my bra around my friend. It's cool. Nothing I haven't seen before. We match now. I point between us. You look better shirtless than I do. I look down at my cleavage and then at him. His chest is defined, abs chiseled, plus all that ink. I don't know. Ty? He smirks. You think I look good shirtless? Of course you do. You're hot, Johnny Maverick. And he is. But I don't think I've ever said that out loud before. You too. Like, fuck hot. <laughs> what does that even mean? I ask through laughter. It's pretty self-explanatory. Fuck hot. Yes, but you say it like it's an exclusive list, not half the population. He snorts. Learn to take a compliment, woman. Thank you. I set down the bottle and squeeze my boobs together. They're not fake. No? Let me feel. I drop my hands, not really expecting he'll do it. Although this is Johnny Maverick we're talking about, so of course he does. His big palms cover the lacy material of my bra and he squeezes lightly. Damn, Coda. These are good. Thank you. I grew them myself. He keeps squeezing, and the longer his big hands manhandle me, the tighter my nipples become. He notices and glides a thumb over the peak through my bra. Okay, that's enough show and tell, I say through a shaky breath. I find my shirt on the floor and cover myself. Sorry, been thinking about your boobs for so long. I wanted to make sure I copped a real good feel to last me the rest of my life. I snort laugh. <laughs> You've been thinking about my boobs? I think about lots of people's boobs, he says with a grin. Right. Of course. I'm suddenly really aware of how drunk I am. 
I should sleep or I'm going to be a wreck for work in the morning. He's quiet and now I'm all flustered. I don't know how he's always so cool and casual. You can crash here if that's easier or I can help you upstairs. This is fine. Awful couch is growing on me. I grab him a pillow and blanket. He's taken off his jeans and is just in his boxer briefs. He's hard, and I don't want to notice, but I do, and my body warms everywhere. Here you go. He takes one end of the pillow and uses it to tug me onto the couch next to him. Running away? Being the sane one, I say. His gaze drops to my lips, and I wet them with my tongue instinctively. Sane is boring. Let's be wild. Take off your shirt again. Chuckling, I shake my head slowly from side to side. I'm going to bed. Fine, he calls, lying back and crooking an arm behind his neck. I walk across the apartment to my bedroom, pause and look back at him. And locking my door. No worries there, Coda. You're safe. I'm waiting for the day you beg me to kiss you. He's out of his mind. You're going to be waiting a very long time. Maybe. Maybe not. Night, Dakota. You know where to find me. The next night, I come home to an empty apartment. Reagan calls as I'm sitting down in the living room. Hey, I hold my phone out and smile at my bestie. What are you doing? We're going to the hideout tonight. You? No plans. I run a hand along the pink fabric of the couch. I swear I can smell maverick and hailstone. Everything okay? Yeah, I'm tired. Maverick and I drank wine and vodka last night. Two out of ten stars. Do not recommend. She laughs and something shifts in my chest. I miss her something fierce. I wish you were here. Ditto. It isn't the same not waking up to the roaring noise of a blender every morning. She plays music in the background and sets her phone down. Ready? For? Dance party. Come on. She motions for me to get up. Reluctantly, I do. I place my phone on the arm of the couch and dance. Any more hockey hottie run-ins I should know about? No, I say. Well, unless you count Maverick, I uh, may have let him feel me up. Her brows raise, but she continues dancing. I need more information. We were drinking. I spilled on my shirt and thought it was a good idea to take it off. Then I told him to feel my boobs to prove they weren't fake. You do have great boobs, she says. Then what happened? I went to bed. I cannot hook up with Maverick. He's Maverick. Do you want to hook up with him? My boobs were certainly into the idea. My body tingles just like it did last night. There is no way. Not happening. Okay, well, then you need to go out with someone else and let them feel you up before your boobs start calling the shots. You've deprived them for too long. I snort. She might not be wrong. Who would I possibly go out with? I work all day. The hockey guys are off limits, and I'm not hooking up with another intern. That'd be a weird work environment. Dating up? I deleted it. The options weren't great. So reinstall it. She smiles at me. You are in a new zip code. New options. Better options, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Talking to Reagan loosens me up. We sing and dance through two more songs, smiling and laughing at each other as we show off our moves. Coda? Mav calls. The door is open a crack and Charlie pushes through. I'm here. Come in. Maverick walks in on his crutches. Reagan turns down the music. I gotta go, she says out of breath. Love you. Love you too. I end the call as Maverick takes a seat on the couch. Were you at the arena? He nods. Yeah, 
I had to talk to Coach. How did that go? He's pissed I hurt myself. Will you be ready for camp? Hope so. He rests an arm along the back of the couch. What are you doing tonight? Do you want to go out? Dinner? Drinks? He grins. Dancing? You can't dance right now. I can sit in a chair and let you dance for me like you were just doing. In fact, maybe we should just do that here so you can take off your shirt again. I roll my eyes. About last night. I shouldn't have let that happen. We're friends. Could also be friends that bang. Even if that weren't explicitly against the rules of my internship, it isn't a good idea. Why not? You said you think I'm hot. I think you're hot. There's no TV. He waves to the empty wall in front of us. What the fuck else are we going to do? I chuckle lightly. I love how it's just that simple for you. It's as simple as we make it. He shrugs. I'm not going to suddenly stop being your friend just because we have hot, freaky sex. Hot, freaky. I give my head a shake to stop the images flashing in my head. Not happening. All right. Well, next best thing. Dinner? Chapter 17. Johnny. Dakota insists we order in so I can rest my knee. She's probably right. Coach Miller was not happy that I'd managed to injure myself so close to camp, but I'm already tired of sitting around all day long. Coda is sitting in the chair with her laptop while I scroll through my phone. The food should be here by now, she says, and now is her gaze at the door as if she thinks that's going to help speed up the delivery person. Maybe they left it at the door. Without knocking? I stand and hop toward the door without my crutches. Mav! She yells after me, but she laughs. There's a knock at the door when I'm one hop away. Perfect timing, I say, pulling open the door. Uh, hi. A woman stands in the hallway holding a brown takeout bag. I think this is yours. I ordered from there, too, and they dropped both at my place. I didn't realize until after I ate one of your egg rolls. Sorry. I smile. Seems like a fair trade. Thank you. She hands over the bag and then lingers. You're Johnny Maverick, aren't you? Yeah, have we met? I'm giving her a discreet once-over to decide if she's one of the hundreds of people I've met this week at the arena. No. She places a hand on her forehead and laughs lightly. She's pretty. Late 20s, maybe, and has thick black-framed glasses that make her look a little like a librarian. This is embarrassing, but I'm a fan. I was so glad when the Wildcats signed you. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't catch your name. Right, oh my gosh, I'm Annika. I live in the apartment next door. Nice to meet you. I open the door wider. This is my friend Dakota's place. She lets me hang out and annoy her. I'm on the 11th. Dakota walks toward us and waves. Hi. I'm sorry to have interrupted, Annika says as she returns the wave and takes a step back. Have a good night. You too. After I shut the door, Dakota giggles and takes the food from me. You have fans. Don't worry, you'll always be my favorite. I hop back to the living room and sit down. Dakota gets everything else, bossing me around and insisting I sit still while she plates our food and brings it to me. She eats with one hand, messing around with her phone with the other. Are you going to work all night? I'm not working. She sets her phone down. I'm signing up for a new dating app. I thought we agreed those were trash. This one is for people serious about dating and not just looking for hookups. So it's for old people? She glares. Let me see. I beckon with one hand. I can help. You said you don't do dating apps. I don't, but I still know what dudes like. With a sigh, she hands over her phone and then comes to sit next to me. She hovers, crowding my space as I tap out answers and write a bio. I had good intentions when I offered to help, but when she's this close, I remember how much I want her and decide to fuck with her instead. Granny panties? You said I wear granny panties? She tries to get her phone, but I turn and hold it out of reach. People in serious relationships want this. Trust me, thongs scream hookup. 
I trust you to know Jack about serious relationships. She climbs over me. Her hair falls over my shoulder and her face is so close to mine. I stop messing with her and turn to hand it back. But her lips are shiny and right fucking there. I wanted to kiss her long before last night. But since then it's all I can think about. And the way she hesitates, gaze dropping to my mouth before she snatches her phone, I'm pretty sure she's thinking about it too. We settle back in our spots, me on the couch and her in the chair. I'm lost in fantasies where she tosses the phone down and begs me to kiss her. I guarantee I'm a better option than whoever she's going to find online. Fuck that noise. You should ask out Annika, she says without looking up. It takes me a few seconds to remember who she's talking about. Your neighbor? Yeah, why not? She was pretty and seemed nice. I know you think I pursue every chick that meets that criteria, but I do have some restraint. She raises both brows and smirks at me, before going back to her phone. I should head up to my place. Why? Um, because that's where I live, unless you've decided you want to be roomies. You're welcome to sleep on the couch as long as you want, Mav. I knew you didn't want to get rid of me. So, roomies? She bites on her bottom lip. Are you planning on hanging out at my place every night regardless? Pretty much, I say with a nod. What about... She stops herself and blushes. What about what? Girls, Maverick, are you going to be bringing random girls home? The color in her cheeks creeps down her neck. The thought hadn't even occurred to me. Not when I can spend the evenings with Dakota all to myself. I hold up my hand like I'm taking an oath. I will not bring random girls back to the apartment. Then yeah, might as well. I'll feel less guilty if you can find someone to sublease this place. With that, she stands and heads toward her room. Does the spare room at your place have a locking door? She grins playfully. What did I tell you, Coda? I lie down and tuck an arm behind my head. Not until you beg me. The next morning when Dakota wakes up, I have Jack, Declan, and Leo over to help move her stuff upstairs. She comes out of her room wearing a big t-shirt, red hair all must and sexy as hell. Oh, no. Oh, yes, Jack says, and his gaze drops to her long, toned legs. I see you all continue to travel in a herd, even after college. She runs a hand over her bedhead. I'm going to need coffee, a lot of it. Already on it. I pick up the tray and offer her a cup. Part of the deal for getting the guys to help was coffee. The other was agreeing to go to a party at Jack's house next weekend. Like, a party is a real imposition. I think Jack just wanted to make sure I'd come and get to know some of the guys outside of workouts. That, and he was probably hoping for another run-in with my hot new roommate. What are you all doing here so early? She looks at me. We're going to need some ground rules on acceptable times for your friends to come over. Don't worry, babe. It's a one-time occurrence and for a good cause. They're moving you in with me. I dangle a key card in front of her face and then put it on the counter. Jack picks up the chair in the living room, and Deck and Leo each grab an end of the couch. She watches them carry her mom's furniture out of the apartment with a sleepy, dazed look. What is up with you this morning? I ask. You're usually all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed first thing. I didn't sleep well. No, that sucks. I lean against one crutch. Everything okay? Her blue eyes lift to mine, then drop to take in my bare chest. I fight off a smile. Ah, shit. No way. Is that guilt? Embarrassment? <laughs> this is awesome. You dreamed about me, didn't you? Her face flushes. No, of course not. No, absolutely not. You're a shit liar, Coda. I let the smile break free. She rolls her eyes. And if I had, it would just be further proof that I need to get out and meet some new guys. I think the lady doth protest too much. After we get Coda moved in, the guys take off, and then so does she to meet up with some of the other interns for brunch. I'm on the third day of sitting on my ass, and I am bored. I don't like being alone. It doesn't take a genius to make the connection between how much time I spent by myself as a kid and my need for people and attention as an adult. I flip through the channels, take Charlie for a short walk, text the guys to see if anyone's up for some video games. Everyone's busy except old Mav. 
Scrolling through my contacts, I decide to call my mom. She probably won't answer, but at least I can leave a message. It's been a while since I've checked in. I move Dakota's pink couch and lie down, staring up at the ceiling as it rings. Hello? My mother's voice answers from the other end. I love how she always answers like she doesn't know it's me calling. Hi, Mom. Johnny, oh, I've been meaning to call you. You have? I thought you were in Italy. I was expecting to get your voicemail. I am. Doris and I are outside of the restaurant waiting for a table for dinner. But I talked to your father yesterday, and he said you had some sort of injury. I assume you're calling to get the name of some doctors to get a second opinion? No, I just wanted to catch up and see how you're enjoying Italy. Nonsense. We have some great contacts in the city. I've got it under control, really. Dr. Anderson is great, and we did get a second opinion just in case. I shift on the couch and extend my leg out to elevate it, like I was instructed. How's Italy? How much longer are you there? She doesn't answer right away, and I can hear her talking to someone else in the background in Italian. Sorry, Johnny, she says when she turns her attention back to me. Our table is ready. I'll have my assistant send you a list of top doctors. Tell them who you are and that if necessary, your dad and I will fly them to you. There is zero chance I'm doing any of that, but I understand that it's just her way of showing she cares. Time and attention aren't on the table, but money and resources, they're happy to share. Thanks, Mom. Love you, honey. I'll call you when I get back to Chicago. She hangs up before I can say it back. I toss the phone to the end of the couch and then reach down to the floor to pick up Charlie and place her on my chest. Love you too, I say quietly. Charlie licks my face. What are we going to do, girl? She licks again in response, eliciting a chuckle from me. The TV is on as background noise. My stomach growls, but I don't feel like moving. I must fall asleep because the next thing I know, Dakota is standing in front of me with an amused smile. If you think the couch is so uncomfortable, then why do you keep sleeping on it? She dangles a bag in front of my face. I sit up and the smell of something greasy and fried hits my nose. My mouth waters. What is this? It's lunch. She drops it in my hands and then goes to the kitchen and gets a cold ice pack and swaps it out with a warm one on my knee. Is that okay? Do you need anything else? She takes a seat on the chair, kicks off her shoes, and pulls her feet up under her, her brows pinched together. Maverick? The concern in her tone snaps me out of it. Sorry, what? Are you okay? You look a little pale. Yeah, I clear my throat. Perfect. She keeps staring at me. My chest tightens and I'm struggling to come up with something funny or teasing to reassure her I'm fine. I am fine, but I'm caught off guard that she thought of me while she was gone that it occurred to her that I might want something to eat. It's dumb, really. You brought me food. Yeah, she says, slowly drawing out the word. I thought you might be hungry. No biggie if you're not. It's grilled chicken and sweet potato fries. I know sweet potato fries aren't healthy, but... Thank you, I interrupt her, and my voice cracks, so I clear it again. She hits me with a smile that chases away the loneliness. Welcome. Chapter 18 Dakota I throw myself into my new job and ease into living with Johnny. He made room in the living room for my furniture, which we never use, but I love seeing it every day. Another thing I love seeing every day? Johnny shirtless. I know, I know. I hate myself a little for admitting it, even to myself. But I'm going on a date tonight with a guy I met online. Marco is 23 and a grad student at UMN. He seems nice, and he's cute-ish. I'm not sure he's my soulmate. Our conversations so far have been stilted and a little awkward, but I'm holding out hope that we're better in person. And even if it's a total waste, hopefully it'll clear my mind so I stop having dirty fantasies about my new hot roommate. Dressed and ready for work, I walk out of my room to find Johnny three feet away doing pull-ups in the doorway of his room. He put up some adjustable bar and, wow, his back is impressive. Morning, 
he chirps as he continues to lower and lift his body. I force my gaze down and mutter the greeting back. Smoothie is on the counter. You're too good to me. I pick it up and take a drink. He has really improved on my morning drink, and it tastes even better when I don't have to make it. He joins me in the kitchen, hopping around on one foot. Where are your crutches? My bedroom, I think. I don't know. I'm good. I shake my head and move closer to him so he can lean on me. When do you go back to the doctor? Today, actually. You didn't say anything. Do you need me to drive you? He grins. Nah, I'm good. Though I do like when you go all mama bear on me. I roll my eyes. You really make a girl regret being nice. He chuckles. Before I leave, I find his crutches in the living room and hand them over. Later, loser. At work, I spend the day running errands for Blythe with Quinn and Reese. There are a million things to do in preparation for camp, which starts next week. There are goodie bags to put together, signage to hang, setting up rooms, and finalizing schedules. So many schedules. By the time we're finished, I am so ready for a chill night in, but I go home and get ready for my date with Marco. I text the girls to calm my nerves while I wait. Jenny, what's he look like? What's he do? Reagan, what are you wearing? Sienna, where is he taking you? Their rapid-fire questions make me even more nervous. Marco said he'd text after he got out of class and was on his way. We're meeting at a bar not far from the apartment. I wanted to be close enough that I could walk or Uber home if it's late, but far enough away that I wouldn't have to worry about Johnny and his teammates stopping in and embarrassing me with their ridiculousness. Two nights ago, Marco and I were having our first phone conversation after exchanging a few texts. Jack and Declan stopped by the apartment to see Maverick. They've been checking in on him almost every day. Anyway, they must have read it on my face that I was talking to a boy because they proceeded to yell out things like, Honey, come back to bed, until I locked myself in my bedroom. I'm not sure what their plan was. They probably don't know either. Ridiculousness. Right now, I could use a dose of Maverick's ridiculousness, though. He isn't home, and... Holy crap, I am so nervous, I can't stop the butterflies in my stomach. He always knows what to say to take my mind off things. I respond to the girls and then text Johnny to see how his appointment with the doctor went. Maverick. Good. I'm at Wilds. Come hang out? I hold off another five minutes, waiting for Marco, then say screw it, grab my purse, and say goodbye to Charlie. I can leave from Wilds when Marco is close. I find them on the far side of the bar, Jack and Johnny. Johnny swivels on the stool when he spots me and hops down. His big grin makes my insides mushy. He wraps me up in his arms and pulls me to his chest. You made it. What are you having? I'm buying. I'm temporarily too distracted by him to speak. Listen, Johnny Maverick is a good-looking guy. My not wanting to hook up with him has absolutely nothing to do with how he looks. From his dark hair, to his smile, to the tattoos. Oh, the tattoos. He's chef's kiss perfection, if we're going just by the hot scale. I couldn't build a better guy. He's fuck hot, to steal his phrase, but he doesn't take anything seriously. To him... Sex is just an activity like watching TV or dancing. Who he does it with doesn't matter as much as the activity itself. I want more than that. I want the sex, but the who matters to me. Tonight, though, sigh. Tonight, he is in dress pants and a black collared shirt. The sleeves squeeze his biceps and show off some of the ink, and his hair has gel in it. He's dressed up and not in his usual jeans and a plain t-shirt, or honestly, more often than not, no shirt at all. I can't stay, I say when I find my voice. Woman, if you go back to that apartment, I will follow you and drag you out. We need a night out. It suddenly dawns on me. Where are your crutches? He raises his arms to his side. 
I'm good to go. He rocks his head side to side. Dr. Anderson says I'll be ready for camp. Mav, that's great news. I know. Now what are you having? Champagne? I want to celebrate. I really can't. What? Do you have a hot date or something? Jack asks. Actually, yes. I'm going out with Marco. The guy you met on Hinge? Yes. I don't like it, Mav says. Well, too damn bad, I laugh, nerves breaking. You don't know anything about the guy. What if he's a creep? I can handle myself. He tips his chin up and looks down at me. Where are you going? I'm not telling you that. Share your location with me. What? I promise I won't use it unless you don't come home or answer later. I'm quiet as I consider it. What would Reagan say? Should I text her and see? Ugh. Fine. But I swear, if you show up, he holds up his hands. I won't. I look to Jack. No promises here, he says. Johnny leans against the bar. Is this what you're wearing? Yeah. Why? Maverick has me second-guessing the navy skirt and white tank top I'm wearing. I want him to know I tried, but not too hard. You look perfect. I can tell he's holding something back. What is it? Just tell me. I still have time to change if needed. Nothing. Honest. You look gorgeous. I'm just glad it isn't the black dress is all. What black dress? The one you wore to the Frozen Four party? Short? Straps cross in the back. The idea that he knows my wardrobe shoots a zap of excitement through me. I don't even want to know how you remember that. Babe, that dress. He places his hands together, fingertips touching his lips. That fucking dress. He groans. I'm not sleeping with him. Good. He barks out a laugh. Then maybe you should wear it. The poor guy will be miserable sitting across from you all night. He pushes off and stands tall. I get a glass of wine, and in the time it takes me to drink it, several more of Maverick's teammates show up. And as more of them arrive, girls make their way around us. I check my phone. Still nothing from Marco. Are you sure you can't blow off this guy and hang? Johnny asks. We're going to dinner, and then... who knows? I really can't. Why not? I'm a way better date. Behind Maverick, I spot Annika, my neighbor from the second floor, among the girls that have corralled around the players. I raise my hand to wave to her, and Maverick turns, tipping his head. Hey, neighbor. Johnny Maverick, she says and smiles. I didn't recognize you. Same. You look great he tells her. One thing I love about Johnny, he never shies away from giving people compliments, and he means them, always. Thanks. She smooths a hand along the spandex of her black dress. She is dressed to impress tonight. What are you two up to? I haven't seen you around. I'm trying to convince Dakota to come out to Beverly's with me. Oh, her eyes light up. I've heard that place is great, some friends and I tried to go last week, but they're booked up for months. The girls she's with start to walk off, and she steps after them. It was good to see you guys. Wait! I call to her before she leaves. You should go with Maverick. Me? Her smile broadens, but she ducks her head a little shyly. Yeah, it's perfect. I can't go. I have a date. I look at Johnny. But you two should go out and celebrate getting rid of the crutches. It's a big deal. I've put him in a position where he can't say no, but Annika is beautiful, seems nice, and I don't get any Puck Bunny stalker vibes from her. She's a fan, sure, but that's probably half the nearby population. Uh, yeah, if you're up for it, he says. Really? He nods and places both hands in his pockets. Okay, yeah, I just need to tell my friends. Sure, Mav says. When she walks off, he closes the space between us and lowers his voice. What was that? I'm sorry, but she seems really nice. 
And she's beautiful. Those glasses with that dress? I give him a thumbs up. He chuckles softly. This is good. You need to go celebrate, and this way we're both out meeting new people. I slide from my chair. I'll see you later. Outside, I let out a long breath and start back toward the apartment. As I enter the building, my phone pings, and somehow, I just know, I know he's blowing me off at the last minute. Confirmed when I pick up my phone and read the apologetic text, claiming something last minute came up at work and he's so sorry, let's reschedule, blah, blah, blah. I kick off my shoes inside the apartment, scoop up Charlie, and call Reagan. Are you calling me from the bathroom to tell me how great he is? I can hear her smiling on the other end. Or do I need to text you in five and claim there's an emergency? He canceled. Oh, honey, I'm so sorry. I'm not. I hit the video button, needing to see her face. She accepts and appears on my screen, brows scrunched together as she studies me. You're not? No. Ask me why not. I lie down on the pink couch. Johnny's scent still lingers from the night he slept on it. Or maybe it's from being in his apartment. I wonder if it'll always smell like him now. I kind of hope so. Why not? Freaking Johnny Maverick. That's why. I consider going out so that I'm not sitting at home thinking about how I forced the guy I like to go out with someone else because I don't want to like him. Maverick and I don't make any sense. We want different things. Instead, I go to bed early. I'm lying awake listening for him to come home when it occurs to me he might bring her back here, and I'll have to listen to them having sex. He said he wouldn't bring random girls home, but it would really serve me right. Maybe if he sleeps with Annika, I'll be able to get the thought of kissing him out of my head. I doze off at some point and wake to Mav's deep voice saying hello to Charlie. I sit up and listen closer, trying to tell if there's someone with him. It's quiet, and I tiptoe to the door and press my ear to it. Coda. His deep voice makes my heart race, and I jump back. He raps slightly on the other side. I don't answer, and he says, I know you're in there. Or your date dumped the body back at your apartment. Smart move, actually. Stepping back, I open the door. He smirks, one arm resting against the doorframe. You're alive. Yes, I'm alive and home safely. He walks in, pushing past me. Please come right in, I say sarcastically. He sits on the end of my bed and unbuttons his shirt so it hangs open. How was your date? Great. Yeah. How was yours? Don't bullshit me, Coda. I checked in a few times. You either invited him here or left your phone behind. You weren't supposed to check on my location unless I didn't come home. I had a feeling something was off, so I checked. Okay, so he canceled. Whatever. His loss. Maybe, I say, then change the focus to him. How was your date with Annika? She's nice. Cool chick. Works as a nurse. Said if I hurt my knee chasing after you again, she'd take a look for me. I sincerely hope that doesn't happen again. Depends. On? What it's going to take to get you to admit that there's something between us. I feel it, and I know you do too. Otherwise, you wouldn't have pawned me off on someone else like I'd invited you for a weekend orgy instead of dinner. I set you up to avoid confronting my feelings. I roll my eyes. Damn it. Am I that transparent? Yeah. I think that's exactly what you did. And she's nice and beautiful, but I'm not going to see her again. Or anyone else. Not until you tell me this isn't happening. What isn't happening? Us hooking up once and ruining our friendship? No thanks, Maverick. He stands and walks toward where I'm frozen to the spot near the door. 
Why is it so hard for you to separate sex from everything else? Because it is. That's a bullshit answer. If you're not into me and I misread you, then fine. But don't play it off like I'm not offering more than some quick fuck. Give me a little credit. I dig you. You dig me. What's the problem? You're exasperating. I throw up my hands. I'm not interested in casual sex. Not with you. Not with anyone. Fine then. It won't be casual. Nothing about the way I want to fuck you is casual. His hand reaches up and caresses the curve of my neck. My skin tingles and warms at his touch. Is he serious right now? Does he even know what he's saying? We can't. It isn't a good idea. We're friends. I have my internship to think about. I step away from him, cross my arms, and avoid his gaze. Drop it. Okay? My pulse thrums loudly in the seconds before he speaks. Sure thing. He stops in the hallway. See you in the morning. Night, Coda. Chapter 19 Johnny Dakota avoids me something fierce for the next two days. She comes home from work later than before and goes out with Quinn and Reese in the evenings. We're in deep avoidance. And I'm the ridiculous one? I've been keeping busy, though. After feeling sorry for myself and my bum knee for a few days, I decided to suck it up and get to work. I'm working on my upper body and core and doing therapy on my knee. I can start working out for real next week. And it couldn't come any sooner. Camp starts Tuesday. Damn, that was a close call. One more fuck up like that and I'll be spending this winter in Iowa. Today's going to be a good day, though. We're shooting the endorsement photos so Dakota can no longer avoid me. I don't understand her. No, actually, I think I do. Which is why it baffles me that she won't admit she wants to have sex with me as much as I want her. I get to the shoot a few minutes early because I'm dying to see her in a place she can't run away. Outside of the locker room, Quinn clutches a clipboard to her chest. Hi, Johnny Maverick. Hey. I tip my chin to the door behind her. Is Dakota in there? Yeah, they're all waiting for you. She holds the door open for me and follows me inside. The Wildcats locker room has been quiet the past couple of weeks, but today it is chaos inside. Her instructions were simple. Be in the Wildcat locker room wearing swim trunks. I'm intrigued. Dakota spots me immediately and hurries forward, weaving through the people standing around doing who knows what. What is all this? I ask when she steps in front of me. It takes a lot of people to make you look good, she teases. I rake a hand through my hair. This isn't what I was expecting. Would you prefer I take some photos of my cell phone? Uh, I was kidding. She wraps a hand around my forearm and pulls me with her. This is going to be a big promotion for Maverick Enterprises. They pulled out all the stops. I keep my mouth shut, but I highly doubt dear old dad is responsible for any of this. This is all Coda. I don't know what I'm doing, I admit. It's a little intimidating as more people turn to look at me and start yelling for everyone to get into position. It'll be easy. Just do what you do best. She smiles, her blue eyes dancing with mischief. She's sexy as hell, and this is not a great time to be noticing, but seeing her in action at work all lit up like she is now is a major turn-on. What I do best. Her smile gets impossibly bigger as she walks backward, and I follow because there's just about nothing I wouldn't do for her. She comes up short next to the showers. Take off your shirt. When Dakota moves to the side, I get the full effect. Big standing lights and other photography equipment are angled toward the middle shower. Dividers block off the rest of the open space, and in the cubby underneath the shower head, the entire new product line is displayed. Coda, this looks killer. Blythe steps up beside her, fingers clutched around her cell phone as she speaks quietly. We only have the room for an hour. Let's make sure we get what we need before Coach Miller kicks us out. Right. Dakota straightens. Let's get a few of you standing in the shower first, and then we're going to do some with the water on. It'll be like you're taking a shower with no one watching. Except we'll be watching. And filming. So, don't embarrass me. I chuckle and she continues. 
There is bottled water, that cherry energy drink you like, and some fruit and other food over there if you need anything. She points. Reese and Quinn will be helping me by taking some behind-the-scenes footage. The two other interns wave awkwardly behind her. I think that's it. Just be you. Just me, huh? I'm not sure anyone has ever encouraged me to be myself. People start moving into position, music starts playing, and a bright flash goes off. Whoa! I lift a hand and blink away the stars that are now flickering behind my eyelids. Sorry, just checking the lighting, someone says before another couple of flashes pop. Dakota's hand takes mine. I know it's hers even before I open my eyes again. Are you okay? She asks. This is weird, and what is this music? Her brows lift and she smirks. Johnny Maverick doesn't want to be the center of attention. I know, crazy, right? No one is more surprised than me. You're going to be great, I promise. Trust me. I glance around at all the people waiting for me to get my shit together and nod. Yeah. Okay. Let's do it. Good. Now take off that shirt, Johnny Maverick. Chapter 20 Dakota Maverick removes his t-shirt, a shy grin tugging at his lips. I can't believe I'm having such a hard time getting him to take off his clothes. Who would have thought? He balls up the fabric and tosses it at me. I hand it to Reese, who stands by, shaking his head. All morning, he's been giving me the same look, like he can't believe I'm putting a great hockey player through this. I don't care. This is going to be gold. I've seen Maverick without his shirt on, and it's hot enough to sell just about anything. A room full of women would kill to be you right now, Reese says, passing me a clear bottle. I'm the only one that can do it without swooning at his feet. I roll my eyes, but my stomach flips as I open the baby oil and step into the shower with Maverick. What you got there? He asks, eyeing me warily. Oil. It'll give us that wet look without water. I squirt some of the cool liquid into one palm. Sorry it's a little cold. I start on his chest and rub the oil into his skin in small circles. On a scale of one to ten, how badly do you want to make a joke about me finally having my hands on you right now? Shh. You'll ruin this moment for me if you speak. He meets my gaze and grins. My face warms as my hands slide down his abs. Okay, so maybe a little swooning. His muscles are hard and his skin is warm. The oil makes every single part of him pop, each muscle and line and every tattoo. His body is covered with ink. I've seen them all numerous times in his shirtless debacles, but I've never inspected them this closely. I run a finger along the outside of one on his side, tracing the hockey stick. It isn't new, but the ink inside of it is. Four numbers, 13, 44, 19, and 23. His Valley Jersey number, as well as Heath, Adam, and Rhett's. When did you add these? Right after the Frozen Four. It's really nice. Turn around and let me get your back. You scratch mine and I'll scratch yours, he mumbles as he complies. Sorry, only so many things I can hold back at one time. I deserve a freaking medal. You can have a cookie when we're done. Will you feed it to me with your shirt off? I rub harder, digging my fingernails into his skin. Sorry, sorry, out of line. But actually, I kind of like that. Mark me up, baby. Oh my god. I smack a hand down on his lower back. I'm working here? I know, I'm sorry. If I don't say them out loud, my dick will take action, and I cannot get hard right now. He whispers. Although his whisper is loud enough, I turn around to make sure no one heard him. Oh my god, Maverick. Shh. I will send Reese in here to finish oiling you up if you hit on me one more time. Hooking up with players is not allowed, remember? We're not hooking up, he says, and then mutters, 
You made that abundantly clear. Yes, I know that, and you know that, but I don't want it to look like, you know. He turns his head to look over his shoulder. Like we're super attracted to each other and might break the rules at any moment? Yes, I admit. I've thought of nothing else for the past two days. I know it's a terrible idea, but it doesn't stop the fantasies from playing in my head on a loop. He holds my gaze for a beat, nods, and faces the other direction again. Got it. You want me, but no one else can know. Sexy, secret romance. I can dig. I growl under my breath and drop my hands. That'll have to do, because if I keep touching him, it's going to end with me wringing his neck or shoving him up against the shower wall to shut him up with my mouth. And why am I starting to like the sound of the last one a lot more than I do the first? The photographer, Lindsay, introduces herself to Maverick, and then it all begins. He stands awkwardly, hands at his sides, with the sort of half-grimace and half-smile on his lips. I can't imagine how I'd feel with a room full of people standing around staring at me with my shirt off, but I really thought Maverick would feed off the energy. I give it a few more minutes. He finds me in the crowd gathered around watching him, and I can't read the expression on his face, but I know he's uncomfortable. Hey, Lindsay, I say, approaching the photographer. Can I have one second? Sure. She stands tall and drops the camera to her waist. More oil? He asks and shoots me a sheepish grin before looking at the ground. Do you have your phone on you? Yeah. His dark brows pinch together. Why? You were right. This music sucks. He pulls out his phone, unlocks it, and hands it over. I scan the playlists. There are so many. He used to put together music for the morning skate on game days back at Valley, and I've heard they're pretty entertaining. He'd let each of the guys pick one song, and he'd compile it. Just another of the many charms of Maverick. Any favorites? He crowds my space, and I hold out the phone so that he can see it better. His silky smooth arm covered in oil brushes against mine. Heat radiates from him. Shit. This is not good. Do I really want to hook up with Maverick? He smiles and, fuck my life, I know the answer. I do. I really, really do. That one. He points. Okay, I'll get it going. Loosen up. Have fun with it. I'll try, he says. I don't want to mess this up for you. I pop a hip and rest my free hand on it, then give him a quick but blatant once-over. Not possible. Switch the music playing over the speakers to this, I say to Quinn, handing her Maverick's phone. And do not snoop in his phone. She chews her gum, jaw working while she stares at me with an annoyed and disbelieving glare as I boss her. Things have been friendly between us, and I don't want to ruin it, but I have to fix this, and I don't have time to worry about how much she might hate me when this is over. Ignoring her, I look to Reese. Can you grab a hockey stick from wherever they keep hockey sticks? Bonus if it's Mavericks. We need to get him comfortable and fast. On it. Reese claps his hands and jogs off. Blythe holds back a smile. Do you have what you need? I think so. I want this to work. It has to work. It will. Her ever-present phone rings in her hand. I have to step out to take this. You have it under control here. I hope so. I whisper as she leaves me scrambling. The bass of the music changes the mood almost immediately. Everyone, including Johnny, relaxes a little with an old, catchy Pitbull song. But when Reese places the hockey stick in his hands... I want to cry with relief. His shoulders relax, and his smile is genuine. He wraps a big hand around the end and holds it up, aiming the other end at me and winking. Swoon. Damn it all to hell. Swoon. 
I roll my eyes and cross my arms over my chest. Okay, everyone, let's do this. The rest of the shoot goes well. Really well. Lindsay takes a bunch of shots with Maverick and his hockey stick, and then Quinn and I start handing him products. He poses with them in all sorts of ways. Some are silly and ridiculous, others serious. How does one spritz ball spray and make it look sexy? But by far, the best material is when we turn on the shower and have Maverick wash himself. Okay, it sounds seedy. It isn't. I mean, he looks so good, but he has fun with it, smiling and keeping the vibe really cool and casual. His dark hair slicked back, his hands working over his chest. Maverick meets my eye and smiles. I try to smile back, but I don't seem to have control over any part of my body. If I did, I'd surely be able to ignore the ache between my thighs. I can't imagine what he sees in my expression. I don't even know myself what I'm feeling. But whatever it is, that smile on his face falls and is replaced with heat that has a direct line to the butterflies swarming in my stomach. I want him, and he wants me too. Chapter 21 Johnny I'm shocked when Dakota comes home early from work. I'm doing sit-ups in the living room, and instead of heading straight to her room, she plops down on the couch with a tired groan. Long day, I ask, stopping at the top of a rep. Being in charge is exhausting, she grins. But totally awesome. You killed it. I actually believe you. She kicks off her shoes and goes into the kitchen. I follow her and she pulls out two wine glasses and then uncorks a bottle of wine, pouring two and handing me one of them. She hops up on the counter. Energy and excitement vibrate off her. Even Quinn told me good job before we left. Look at you making friends. Yeah, she invited me to hang out tomorrow. I make a sound like a buzzer going off. Wrong answer, you're booked tomorrow. She cocks a brow and takes a sip of her wine. I am? Yep, Jack is having a pool party. Starts early, we'll definitely go late. I don't think that's a great idea, she says, pulling that wall back up between us. I promise not to let you strip off your clothes and sleep with anyone. I say with a playful roll of my eyes as if I'm doing some noble deed instead of keeping her from hooking up with any of my teammates. It has the desired effect, and she smiles. Ha ha. I'm serious, it'll be fun. We cannot stay in this apartment another day. My couch is going to have a permanent indent of my ass. Her gaze drops to my butt, and then she catches herself. Spending time at a pool does sound fun. I clap my hands. All right, it's settled. Is it okay if I bring a friend? You're bringing me. Aren't I enough? I pretend to be seriously injured and she rolls her eyes. I want to invite Quinn. She's the only sort of friend I've made here. What about Reese? He has plans. Fine, but if you need any help with sunscreen or... She holds up a hand. I've got it. The tension between us seems to have eased, and I'm glad she isn't avoiding me anymore. What do you want to do tonight? I'm not sure. I'm tired. I don't think I want to go out. Let's order in. I grab my phone. When I look up at her to ask what she wants, she has a weird expression on her face. What? Thanks, Mav. For? It would have been a lonely first couple of weeks here without you. Right back at you. The next afternoon, Dakota comes out of her room with a beach bag under one arm and a hesitant smile. Are you sure this is a good idea? Should you even be swimming? Yeah, I'm good. It isn't like I'm going to be diving off the side and getting crazy. She doesn't look convinced until I add, I'm not drinking, so that should help me behave. Mostly. I feel like I'm going to regret saying this, but let's do it. Jack lives about 20 minutes away in a ritzy neighborhood where the homes are big and the yards are bigger. A few other teammates live nearby, and I can see why. It's a cool spot with a private lake. This is a house for a single person, a bachelor no less? 
Dakota shuts the passenger door and comes around to the front of the SUV, all while gawking at the mansion in front of us. A single person with lots of friends. Cars are already lined up in a circle drive, and I recognize a few of them as teammates. Jack himself answers the door, pulling it open before we have a chance to knock. Hey, come in. Glad you two could make it. Thanks for having me, Dakota says, slipping into her professional voice. Phone's in the basket. James has the paperwork, and booze and food are in the kitchen. Enjoy. Paperwork, Dakota asks. James, Jack's agent, steps forward with a tablet. Standard NDA. You're kidding. Her blue eyes widen. I'm not signing that. I don't think James knows what to say or do at her refusal. On second thought, I have a feeling James has seen it all. I'll vouch for her, I say. Plus, she works for the team. I take her phone and mine and drop them in the basket, then grab her hand. Come on, before they toss your delinquent ass out. We stop in the kitchen for drinks. I don't miss the way Dakota runs her hand along the marble countertop, taking it all in. I know it's an impressive kitchen, but seeing her response makes me appreciate it a little more. What do you want? I ask and grab myself an energy drink. What are my options? She asks, still walking around touching appliances and cabinet handles. Anything your tiny black heart could want. Let's go with vodka and tonic. Any limes? Yep. Of course there are limes. I make her drink and then take it to her. Are you going to mock everything? Sorry, I'm still spinning on the whole NDA thing. Do you make chicks sign those? Me? No. But I didn't just sign a $16 million contract. She mouths the word $16 million. Yeah, and that doesn't even include his endorsements. I hold out my arm for her. You ready to do this? She takes my arm and the smell of her fruity shampoo floats under my nostrils. Ready. Outside, the party is already going strong. A lot of the guys from the team are here. Some of their friends and girls. So many girls. If you want to inspire young kids to grow up and be hockey stars, just drive by one of Jack Wilde's pool parties. Ass and titties galore. The music pumps and people shout hello from the pool. Dakota sticks with me as we make the rounds. I chat with everyone, introducing her when needed. She already knows most of the team, but I make sure to talk her up to the guy she hasn't met yet. Easy to do, if I'm honest. It's late afternoon and the sun sits high in the sky. Dakota pulls her long hair over one shoulder and squints. I forgot my sunglasses, she says. Do you want my hat, I ask. It'll keep the sun off your face. What about you? I shrug. I don't burn, and I have my shades. I place my wildcat's hat on her head. It's too big and falls down low on her eyes. <laughs> Adorable. I'm pretty sure there's an eye roll, but I can't quite make it out under the brim of the hat. Should we brave the pool? You don't have to babysit me, she says. I can mingle and make new friends. Trying to get rid of me so you don't have to admit how attracted you are to me right now. I tug in the collar of my t-shirt. I kept it on just for you. I don't want you to embarrass yourself drooling over my hot bod. Yeah, that's it, she says sarcastically. You figured me out. Just for that, I take off my shirt. And man, is my grin big when her gaze sweeps over my bare chest. I don't know who she thinks she's fooling. <laughs> Not me. Okay, go away now. My friend is here. She points to Quinn coming out the back door. I hold a hand over my heart like she's wounded me. Ouch. I'm sorry, but you know the rules. I can't have them wondering if something is going on between us. Knew you couldn't handle all this temptation. I'll be in the pool. Come find me when you're ready to admit defeat. Declan is sitting on the edge of the pool with his feet dangling in the water. I take a seat next to him. From this position, the whole party is in view. It's kind of like you're the lifeguard sitting up here watching over everyone. He chuckles quietly. Might need to be. How's the knee? Good. I stretch out my leg. I did a light workout this morning, and I should be able to participate in camp this week. I'm getting excited. Vacation always feels too long. Declan is a quiet guy, so usually when he talks, I listen. He's going on about hockey in the upcoming season but it's background noise because across the yard, Dakota's stripped off her dress and is standing talking to Quinn. 
The black material of her bikini top pushes up her tits, and the tiny bottoms are just a step above a thong. And my hat? Damn, her wearing my hat in that outfit shouldn't be so fucking sexy. Why is everything she does such a turn-on? It's really inconvenient in this battle of her not admitting the attraction between us. As if she can feel my eyes on her, she angles her body and meets my gaze. I don't know if she can see my eyes pinned on her ass from behind my shades, but just in case she can't read the lust pumping through my veins, I dip my chin and push my sunglasses down so she knows I see her. I always see her. I swear she shakes her ass at me as she flips her head and turns back to Quinn. <sighs> it's going to be a long fucking day. Chapter 22 Dakota This party is nuts. It's a lot like the huge parties back at Valley, but with better alcohol and more girls that look like they model on the side. <laughs> Who am I kidding? They probably do model on the side. The sheer number of girls is pretty incredible. There are easily two girls to every guy. I doubt that's an accident. Threesomes for everyone. As afternoon turns into evening, the music gets louder and more people strip down to their suits. Quinn and I sit in lounge chairs next to the pool. Every once in a while we get sprayed with water, but we have a great view without being in the middle of the team and puck bunnies. Come with me to pee, Quinn says. Despite how she rubbed me the wrong way when we first met, she's growing on me. She wears her insecurities like armor, and it makes her a tough nut to crack. But underneath all the name-dropping and obvious hero worship of the players is a cool girl. All right. I swing my legs to the side and stand. My skin is warm from the sun, and the ends of my hair are still wet from a dip in the pool earlier. Maverick stands between us and the pool house at the back of the property. He's with Jack and Leo and a group of girls that just arrived. I swear... Every group of girls that walks outside is somehow more gorgeous than the last. These girls aren't playing. They strut out, already stripped down to their suits. Hair done, high heels, and a waft of perfume floats around them. I'll give it to them. They know how to make an entrance. A tall brunette with legs that never end and boobs that even I'd like to cop a feel of, smiles at Maverick and leans in closer, resting a hand on his forearm. Listen, I've got nothing against puck bunnies. You do you, girl. But can you just not look at Maverick like he's the next conquest on your list of players? I will cut a bitch that does him dirty. I waggle my fingers as we pass by. His head turns to watch me, and I have to admit... It feels good to have him check me out when there is an endless supply of drop-dead gorgeous girls here. At the pool house, sliding doors open to a large, open-concept space. There's a bed on one side and a living area on the other. There's even a small kitchen. It doesn't look like it's used often. It has a whole just-staged vibe with lots of whites and blues. Quinn goes into the bathroom and I sit on the edge of the bed to wait for her. I wish I had my phone. I'd love to talk to Reagan right now. I miss her. Two of the girls that were talking with Maverick come in while I'm still waiting for Quinn, including the boobalicious brunette. They don't see me initially, or just don't acknowledge my presence. His contract is less than a mil, the brunette's friend says as they walk back toward the bathroom. When they realize it's occupied, they linger. I don't care. I want to make my own money. She pushes up her boobs and adjusts her bikini top. She's working it. I would too. They really are something. And Johnny Maverick would be a great career boost. His family already has money anyway. I bet he'd invest in my fashion line. Yeah, you just have to make him fall in love with you first. They both laugh. Quinn reappears as I'm imagining all the different ways I could make this girl disappear without going to jail. Ready? Yeah. I stand and glare at the backs of the two girls as they walk into the bathroom together. Did they say something to you? 
You look murderous, even more so than usual. I feel it, I mutter as we walk outside. My gaze goes right to Johnny. He's smiling and laughing, totally oblivious to the chick inside who's ready to con him. I have to pee. What? We were just in there. I'll be quick. Go ahead and make sure no one steals our seats. Okay. I catch Johnny's eye and he shoots me a confused look as I turn on my heel and head back inside the pool house. Tapping my foot impatiently, arms crossed over my chest, I stand outside of the bathroom door. When it opens, the brunette's smile falls and she lifts two perfectly arched eyebrows. Can I help you? Actually, yes, you can. I say so sweetly that she buys it for a second. Her lips are coated in a super shiny nude gloss that reflects on the light as she smiles. I take a step toward her, and she backs up, even though she's got a good foot on me in those heels she's wearing. Stay away from Johnny Maverick. <laughs> okay, she laughs. I can stay away from him, but I can't guarantee he'll stay away from me. I'm sure you are a lovely person, and truth be told, your boobs are the best I've ever seen. I pause to collect my thoughts. I'm getting off topic. I swear I understand why guys end up sleeping with girls like her. Even I feel a little dumb with them sitting up staring at me. I can't focus, and I have my own amazing boobs I could stare at all day if I wanted. Back off. Why? What's he to you? What, like he's a thing instead of a person? He's my friend. Aw, I'm sorry you got friend zoned and now you want to ruin every other girl's chance with him. I want to smack the smug look off her face. How about we let him choose? She gives me an unimpressed once over and then looks over my head. I whip around to see Johnny watching our interaction with a shocked expression. I flatten myself against the wall, wishing I could disappear into it. Boobalicious and friend saunter past me in a victory walk toward Maverick. Come on, Johnny. Let's take a swim. Yeah, uh, I'll be out in a minute. I just need to talk to Dakota. He tips his head toward me and waits for them to leave. He shuts the sliding doors. I don't move. Crap. I know I overstepped going all psycho chick on them, but I'm so angry about how blatantly they want to use him like nothing else matters but his money. I'm sorry, I blurt out when he starts stalking toward me with a dark expression on his face. She was talking about getting you to fall in love with her so you'd invest in her dumb fashion line. I lost my shit. Temporary insanity. I've been in the sun too long. He doesn't say anything as he crowds into my space. I'm sorry, I say again, in case he missed that part. Don't be. You're fuck hot when you're jealous. His lips finally twist into a cocky smirk, and he steps within an inch of our bodies being flush. It wasn't jealousy. I was being a good friend. I don't want to see you get played. I've been rich my entire life, Coda. I know how to spot a chick that's only into me because of money. Oh. He rests a hand against the wall and leans in. The brim of his hat that I'm still wearing on my head keeps him from getting closer. Admit it. Admit what? My breaths come in quick gulps as his hazel eyes lock on me. Admit you were jealous. He fingers a strand of my hair with the hand on the wall, and the other comes up to caress my cheek. Admit it, and then I can finally kiss you. I'm not kissing you. Hockey players are off limits, remember? I bring my palms to his chest to push him away, but in a swift movement I don't see coming, he picks me up and carries me into the bathroom. After he shuts us in and locks the door, he deposits me on the ground and backs me against the wall. What are you doing? I ask, pressing my shoulder blades into the cool wall. I need to hold on to any anger I can because my body feels anything but angry. The door is locked and no one can see us or hear us, he whispers, 
resting a palm on the wall above me and leaning down so his mouth hovers near my neck. I know your internship is important to you, and I don't want to fuck that up, so I need to hear you say the words. Your ego will be fine. I roll my eyes. This has nothing to do with my ego. I know you want me, the same way I want you. So are you only holding back because of the internship, or is it something else? Johnny, my voice breaks. I can't give him what he wants. Internship rules aside, we're not a good match. He lives for the moment and doesn't take anything seriously. I want more than that. Plus, we're friends and roommates. It's a lot to risk. Dakota? The hand not on the wall skims across my cheek, and he drags a thumb across my bottom lip. They part, and the tip of my tongue touches his skin. He brings his thumb farther into my mouth like he wants me to suck on it. I do, heat pooling in my stomach, and then bite it. He pulls back, chuckling, and smears his wet thumb down my neck to my collarbone and dipping into the valley of my breasts. You're stubborn and very sexy. He slides that hand back up and cups my neck, holding my face in place as he brings his lips so close to mine I can almost feel them. Admit it, Coda. I want to taste you. I shake my head and issue my own challenge, one I'm most definitely going to regret. Make me. Maverick doesn't respond right away and the faint sound of the music outside is the only noise interrupting the quiet pulsing between us. He takes the hat off my head and places it on his backward. Then he resumes his position, crowding into me. One of his legs goes between mine and forces my feet farther apart. He tucks my hair behind my ear and toys with a strand near the nape of my neck. I keep my hands at my sides, refusing to break. This feels so much bigger than a kiss. Giving in now and admitting I want him? It'll be disastrous. He lifts my left arm over my head and pins it against the wall while his nose grazes along the side of my neck. Then he brings my other hand to meet it and works the elastic hairband on the left over the right, effectively tying them together. My breaths come in quick, shallow gulps. The barest hint of a smile tugs at his lips. One of his large palms continues to hold mine against the wall, while the other caresses my face and then my neck. Somehow, that hand seems to be everywhere and not in the right place either. I lift my chin to show him I'm not backing down. I will not be the first to break. He tilts his head like he's going in for a kiss and then pulls back. His lips move and I realize he's mouthing the words of the music outside, something about not wanting to be my friend. My heart is pounding in my chest. I want to kiss you until I lose my breath. He's full on smiling now as he whispers the words against my lips. And despite how much I want to resist him, I smile too. I still don't give in though. I push against his hand and bring my hands around his neck, caging him in now and bringing my face closer. Just like he did, I zone in on his mouth and tilt my head, only redirecting when my lips are millimeters from his. My hands, still tied together with the elastic, are around his neck, and I finger the thick locks, pulling a groan from him. I don't think I've ever been so turned on in my life but I'll die before admitting how much I'm enjoying this. He growls and uses his chest to push me back until my shoulders bite into the wall. If he gets any closer, he'll be flattening me into the drywall. Admit it. He holds his mouth over mine. Please. My heart hammers in my chest. I was jealous. He rubs his nose against mine and hums lightly. He drops the quickest, softest kiss onto my lips and pulls back. I melt into it, but it isn't enough. 
I need the ravenous, desperate kiss that was leading up to. He's going to make me beg, and I will. He was right. Damn him. Chapter 23 Johnny A noise outside of the bathroom catches my attention. Fuck, I mutter. I didn't lock the outside door. She stills in front of me. Motherfucker, she was seconds from begging me, I know it. I'll go out first, I tell her a nip at her bottom lip. Meet me at the truck. I don't think that's a good idea. Fuck, good ideas. This is happening. I step into her one last time and run a single finger from her neck to the middle of her suit top and slip my finger under the string. Get in the goddamn truck, Coda. She ducks under my arm and goes out the door. I blow out a breath and count to 30 before I follow. Jack is in the kitchen mixing a drink. He looks toward the now open sliding glass doors and then back to me. Seems one of us is having a good time. I'm going to take off, man, I say. Thanks for having us. Already, things are just about to get wild. Yeah, they are, but not here. We'll do it up another night when I'm not nursing an injury. I'm holding you to that. He tosses back the drink and then holds out a hand. I take it and he pulls me closer. Do I even want to know what's going on with you and the intern? Probably not, I say honestly. Not my pussy, not my problem. Thanks for coming, Rook. See you Monday. Dakota is nowhere in sight, so I take that to assume she took my instruction. I wave to the guys. Most of them are too busy drinking or hooking up to care anyway. Coda sits in the passenger seat with her phone. I can feel the distance she's put between us as I slide into the driver's seat. I play music, knee bouncing. It's a short drive, but every second I worry she's changed her mind. Not about us, I know she feels it, but about acting on it. She has a lot better impulse control than I do. And also more to lose. I get the need for discretion. At the apartment, I whip into a spot and cut the engine. She still doesn't speak as we take the elevator to the 11th floor. I unlock the door and scoop up an excited Charlie. She steps inside and looks to her feet. Maybe we should get some distance and talk about this in the morning. Running away? Being responsible. Being responsible or hiding behind it. She glares. Setting Charlie on the floor, I step to Dakota. Tell me what you're afraid of. I cup her neck. When I touch her, the blue in her eyes darkens like two giant mood rings. This job is important to me. I know. I won't say a word. It stays between us. What if they figure it out? How? We're friends. They know we're friends. No one is trying to catch us, baby. I rub my thumb along her cheek. That rule is meant to keep crazy interns from lashing out at players who fuck them over. You're not crazy, and I'm not going to fuck you over. I smile at her. Well, you're not that crazy. I want more than one night. Good. I'm going to need more than one. Her expression still doesn't give. We'll still be friends? Always. I just plan to know you a little more. Intimately. My hand slips under the hem of her dress, and I slide a palm up her thigh to her hip and then untie the side of her bikini so it falls open. Then do the same to the other. It drops to the ground at our feet. Say you'll be mine for the summer. I bite her shoulder and walk two fingers across her hip bone and down to the apex of her thighs. When she doesn't answer, I glide one digit over her sensitive clit. A hand shoots out, and she grasps my forearm, steadying herself on me. While teasing her, I drop kisses along her neck and collarbone. Hop on, baby. Let's go for a ride. I curl one finger inside of her and then add another. Slowly, I pump in and out of her. She drenches my fingers as her pussy squeezes them tight. She wraps her arms around my neck and rolls her hips. Pinching her clit, I ask again. Be mine. Johnny, she gasps. She's close. 
and I want nothing more than to feel her come on my fingers. I take care of what's mine. I don't need you to take care of me, she says even as she rides my fingers harder. Need and want, baby. Look up the difference. I push a third finger into her tight pussy. Her body shakes and she lets her head fall against my chest. I need to come. And I want to be the one that gives it to you. Be mine, Dakota. She nods. It isn't the enthusiastic screaming answer I was hoping for, but I put her out of her misery anyway. Rubbing my thumb along her clit, I continue to pump her until she cries out and goes limp against me. With the hand that was inside of her, I lift her chin so I can finally kiss her the way I've been dying to. Her eyes are still a darker blue and hooded as I lower my mouth to hers. She opens immediately, and I tangle my tongue with hers. Fuck, this is going to be a good summer. I gotta take Charlie for a walk and feed her. Stay mostly naked. I can read the hesitation on her even before she says, I need to take this slow. Slower than riding my hand like a joystick? She narrows her gaze. Chuckling, I kiss her softly. We've got all summer. We can take it as slow as you want. I take her hand. You can slowly fuck my hand again in my big comfy bed. Chapter 24 Dakota I shower and then hide out in my room while Maverick takes care of Charlie. I'm stalling, giving myself time to talk myself out of it, but 30 minutes pass and I still want to do this, whatever it is. Friends with benefits? Fuck buddies? I don't like any of the labels, but I want a lot more of his hands on me, and inside of me. My face warms, a summer of sex and fun. Maybe it's exactly what I need. When I finally emerge from my bedroom, I wonder if it's going to be weird between us. But my question is answered as I spot a shirtless Johnny in the living room holding up two bottles of lube. Do you like a tingling sensation, or are you more all natural? What happened to slow? I just want to be prepared like a good Boy Scout. You were never a Boy Scout. No, but I'm just as good with my hands. I laugh, and the worries I had disappear. We can do this. We can be friends and also have a little fun exploring the chemistry between us. But I meant what I said about needing to take it slow. Insane chemistry or not, jumping straight from kissing to letting him put his dick inside of me in one day isn't something I'm comfortable with. Maybe we can just watch a movie or something? He tosses the lube on the coffee table. Yeah, movie. We can do that. While he flips through options, I sit on the couch with Charlie. Which one? You pick. Crazy Stupid Love. The other is a Tarantino film, and gore is not my thing. You just want to stare at Ryan Gosling for two hours. He sits next to me, and Charlie crawls over me to get to him before settling on the other side of him. Duh. He tickles my sides and pulls me so my back rests against his chest. His arm circles around me, and his palm splays over the top of my thigh. I keep waiting for the weirdness, but it never comes. For the next two hours, he doesn't make any attempt to make out with me, and somehow that makes me want him even more. Did I say I wanted to take things slow? Because what I really think I meant is I'm not ready for sex. I want everything else, though. The bottles of lube are taunting me. I love Steve Carell, he says. We should do a binge of The Office. Yeah, I agree, not really thinking about it. He sits forward and grabs the remote so he can navigate to it, and he plays season one, episode one. When he sits back, I place my hands on his shoulders and sling a leg over him, so I'm straddling his lap. An amused smile tips up the corners of his mouth. Need something? 
sex is off the table. For now, I clarify. But I want to take care of you. I took care of myself while you were stalling in your room. He winks. I'm good, Coda. His arms circle my waist. I can feel him hard underneath me, despite him saying he's good. I lean back and grab the lube. Which do you prefer? That one. He nods toward the one that tingles with a giant smirk on his handsome face. I toss the other one back on the coffee table and scoot off his lap, then drop between his legs. Oh, fuck, he says, as if he can't believe this is actually happening. He stands and pulls me to my feet. Bedroom. I've been fantasizing about having you touch my dick in there for so long. He pulls me along behind him. It smells like Johnny in here. I don't get a good look around because the lights are off, and he kisses me while bringing us down to the mattress. His kisses are possessive and hungry, nipping, licking, biting, groaning. Just like he does everything else, it's all out with nothing left to the imagination. When I do something he likes, he makes sure I know it, either by verbally responding in grunts and groans or pumping his hips against me. We lie on our sides, kissing until I hook a finger under the band of his sweats, letting his dick spring free. He helps me get them off and continues to kiss me. I turn my head and he lavishes my neck while I uncap the lube and squirt some in my hand. He's thick and long, and it twitches when I wrap my fingers along the base. I work my hand up and down, coating him in the liquid. I'm wearing another baggy t-shirt, and he ducks his head under it, eliciting a laugh from me. It's cut short when he bites my nipple through the lace of my bra. He does the same to the other, and then sucks hard until my nipple peaks. While I pump my hand around his length, he kisses everywhere he can access. Does it tingle? I ask. He pops out from under my shirt and pulls my bottom lip between his teeth. Touch yourself and find out. I hesitate, and he guides my hand down my shorts, encouraging me. My fingers are wet from the lube and warm from his skin, and I don't know which is hotter. That or the way he watches me while gripping himself and pumping in slow, steady jerks. Does it feel good? I liked your fingers on me better, I admit, but yeah. Tradesies? Smiling, we switch, and he dives his fingers eagerly into my shorts, taking over as I try to mimic the way he was jerking himself. For the second time tonight, my orgasm builds as he rubs my clit. Are you close? I ask. Want my mouth? I want your tits, he says. You want to fuck my tits? Oh, fuck. He groans. That isn't what I meant, but damn right I do. I won't last that long, though. Show them to me. You have the best tits. I lift my shirt and bra for him. He rubs harder and pumps into my hand. Oh, God damn, Coda. This is beyond anything I imagined. So far beyond. He waits for my orgasm and then leans forward and suctions his mouth around my nipple, sucking hard while I explode around his fingers. He follows a few pumps later, still holding my nipple hostage as he shoots on his stomach. So fucking beyond. He repeats. I wake up Sunday morning with Maverick's lips on my neck. I don't know how many times he made me orgasm last night. That's a lie. I was totally counting, and it was four. But my body doesn't care. The light touch of his mouth on my skin already has my insides on fire. Want to go out for breakfast? He asks. What if someone sees us? Then all they'll see is two friends out sharing a meal. Okay, I agree readily. I'm starving, and I need some fresh air to decide how I feel about everything that went down last night. He hops up and tugs my hand to pull me to a standing position. We slept shirtless, 
and he appreciates the view for a few seconds before sliding his gaze back up to my face. See something you like? Yeah. Sorry. You mentioned fucking your tits, and now it's all I can think about. Did you mean it? My nipples harden. I guess I did. Maybe not before breakfast, but yes. Something to live for. He winks and steps back. I'm gonna shower. Joining me? I think I'll go back to my room. I need clothes anyway. Okay. He pauses, then grips my hip and yanks me forward until I'm flush against him. His mouth covers mine, and he kisses me hard before pulling back again. It feels so easy and simple and good. Pick you up from the living room in 30. We shower and get dressed separately, then head off in search of a restaurant with an outdoor patio since we brought Charlie along. Are you nervous about camp? I ask when our food comes. Development camp starts this week, and everything I've learned about it from working with Blythe and Reese is that it's a grueling week for rookies. Yeah, but excited too. He takes a bite of eggs and then breaks off a piece of bacon for Charlie. No wonder she likes you so much, I say. Girls like to be fed. Duh. He breaks off another piece and holds it across the table for me. No thanks. He pops it into his mouth and leans back with a huge grin on his face. I've got something else you can put in your mouth after breakfast. Ew, I'm eating here. He busts up laughing. I'm sorry. I can't hold them in when they're that easy. I roll my eyes. Yeah. I think Mav and I are going to be just fine going back to being just friends after this summer. Tuesday morning, Blythe gathers all the interns to work for the first day of camp. She splits us up into different areas. Check-in, lunchroom, floaters to walk the floor in case anyone has questions, and Reese even gets assigned to Coach Miller as a backup equipment runner. The camp is open to the public, so there are people at the ticket office and even working the concession stand. I'm starting to understand now why Blythe was running around frantic for the past two weeks, I say to Quinn. We're placed on player check-in. They're set to arrive by bus from the hotel any minute. Two long tables are pushed together and we stand behind it, ready to cross off names and show them where to go for breakfast. It's quiet and we're standing around waiting. And then suddenly... It's chaos. A huddle of men stands in front of us, and Quinn and I check them off as fast as we can. When Johnny shows up, my pulse jumps higher. He smiles and gets in the line next to mine. I feel his eyes on me as I check in Tyler Sharp and point him in the direction of the breakfast area with a goodie bag. Johnny Maverick, Quinn says as he steps up to the front of the line. The party was boring after you two left Saturday. I never thought you'd be one to leave a party before it ended. He smiles, and I can feel how much he wants to look at me, but doesn't. Called it an early night. Too bad. It was fun. She holds out the goodie bag. I had a good time too, he says, and finally slides his gaze to me. Thanks. He pauses. Hey, Coda. I woke up next to him this morning. His big, beefy arms trapping me in place and not letting me get up for the day until he did, and somehow he's able to play it off like we haven't seen each other all weekend. I waggle my fingers. Hey, Johnny. Good luck at camp this week. Thanks. I had my lucky charms this morning. His lips twitch with amusement. I'm pretty sure he's referring to the multiple orgasms he gave me with his mouth, and heat pools in my stomach at the memory. He lifts the bag. Later. Chapter 25. Dakota. Wednesday morning is the same. Camp runs all day long, but after check-in, Quinn and I are able to go back to our desks. I check my email and see that Lindsay, the Wildcats photographer who shot Maverick's endorsement, has sent me proofs. I squeal as I open them. Hundreds of photo thumbnails fill the screen, and even before I click on one, I know they're good. I start at the beginning, laughing when I see the deer-in-headlights expression on Johnny's face for the first 20 or so photos. 
Even stiff and unsmiling, he's handsome. As the photos progress, I watch him relax and grow more comfortable. Lindsay captured so many good ones, but the scenes where he's in the shower are by far my favorite. His dark hair slicked back, smirk in place, holding the maverick hailstone body wash in one hand, the other sudsing himself up. I find the photo where his dark eyes cut through the camera, and I know it's the one where he's making eye contact with me. My whole body tingles. This should have been a freaking commercial. I'm buying it. All of it. After I go through it twice on my own, I call Quinn over. Damn, the camera loves him. I know, they're so good. Even better than I hoped. Nice job, she says. I'm a little thrown every time she gives me a compliment. Thanks. Oh, hey, can you send me the behind-the-scenes footage you and Reese captured? Technically, all the endorsement contract asked for are photographs with the products and ad copy concepts. Still, I want to put together an entire social media campaign for them with the footage, if any of it's usable. They signed off on my photo shoot concept, but they instructed me to focus on the products, whatever that means. Yes, I went through all the photos and put my favorites in a folder. I'll send everything, though, in case you have a different eye. Design isn't really my thing. Really? I give her outfit a once-over. She looks like she's wearing something straight out of a magazine. This was put together by the sales lady, she admits. She lifts a foot to show off her strappy sandals, right down to the shoes. Cute, I say. There. Sent she says after clicking a few buttons on her laptop. I'm going to do a coffee run. Want anything? I'll go. I stand and wave her off. I promised Maverick I'd stop by and let Charlie out since he will be at camp all day. I do that first, spending a few extra minutes petting Charlie. She's a great midday boost. Then I stop at the coffee shop next door to the arena. I look through the photos Quinn sent while I wait for my order. I open the favorites folder first. She might think she doesn't have a good eye for design, but so far, all the ones she selected are great options. They show off another side of Johnny that the professional photos don't. In one, he's smiling while talking to the photographer as they both stare down at the display on the camera. In another, he's high-fiving Reese. He's good with people, and these photos show that. It humanizes him in a way the posed images don't. Next, I look through the folder with images that didn't make the cut into the favorites. My body warms, and I don't need a mirror to know I'm blushing as I click on a photo of Johnny and me. My hands work over his stomach, spreading the oil. He looks up at the ceiling with a pained look. My face isn't visible, but I bet it matches his. Dakota, the barista calls, and I can tell by her expression it isn't the first time she's tried to get my attention. Sorry. I put away my phone and thank her for the coffees. I spend all afternoon selecting images for the endorsement. I'll be sending them everything we took, but I still take extra care to highlight my favorites and even recommend some behind-the-scenes ideas for their social media, which is not very exciting from what I've seen. Johnny has more followers on nearly all platforms than they do. I take everything to Blythe's office late after camp is over and almost everyone else is gone. Do you have a minute? Yes. She waves me in. I was just looking over the photos from the Maverick campaign. You got some great content. I know. I'm really excited about how it turned out. I put together a whole plan. Can I show you? She laughs slightly and indicates I should sit. I walk her through all my ideas, talking a mile a minute. She listens, nodding along. At the end, I take a breath. What do you think? I think it's great. Honestly, you made the most out of the limited time and resources available. The behind-the-scenes photos and videos alone should capture a lot of buzz. Send it over as is. Really? It isn't too much? It's way more than they asked for, but I couldn't help myself. I want Johnny's first endorsement to be amazing. Yeah, Dakota, really. The worst they can do is not use some of it. More is better than not enough. Do you have the contact in their marketing department? Yes. 
I've already composed a dozen messages in my head to Linda Main and played out her response back, which will hopefully include lots of exclamation marks and wild praise. Where are you scheduled tomorrow for camp? I'm on concession duty. I'm pulling you to work with me tomorrow. We booked Lindsay and will be grabbing content all day long for the Wildcats' social media pages. Oh my gosh, that would be amazing. Don't thank me yet. It's going to be a long day. Tomorrow afternoon, they are going to the local library for story time. It's a way for us to give back, and the guys to get a small dose of the required community service. That's great. My head is already spinning with the images of Johnny reading to small children. Swoon. Be here at seven, she says. Her gaze drops to my shoes. I guess I don't have to tell you to wear comfortable shoes. I click my heels together. Forever a Kansas girl in my ruby slippers. Before I head home, I send everything to Linda and cross my fingers and toes that she loves it. I see Reese on my way out. Hey, how's working with Coach? I ask him. I think I ran more than the players. He runs a hand along his forehead. His hair is disheveled and his eyelids are droopy. Are you with him again tomorrow? All week. Wow. He must be doing something right. (laughs) Yeah. He chuckles. The other guy with me today had to see a medic for a twisted ankle. Ouch. We push outside and he salutes me as he walks toward the parking garage. Reagan calls as I'm getting to the apartment. Johnny's in the kitchen with an ice pack wrapped around his knee, shirtless, of course, and holding his phone to his ear. Why have you been avoiding my calls all week? My best friend shouts in my ear. And why did you decline the video chat? Where are you? I smile at Johnny and mouth Reagan, then sit on the couch while she continues to toss out questions to me without waiting for the answers. Well... She pauses finally. I'm sorry. It's camp week and I've been working crazy hours. I send her a request to start the video. You're forgiven. How are you? She lies on her stomach on her bed and man, do I miss her. I'd love to be in Valley right now so that I could tell her all about the crazy weekend and every detail of my job. It isn't the same over the phone. I laugh at her quick mood change. That's Reagan, quick to get riled up, but also quick to forgive. Good. I glance at Maverick across the apartment. He's holding the phone between his ear and shoulder and twisting off the top of a giant jug of protein powder. The muscles and veins in his forearms pop and flex. Really good. Charlie steps on my lap, waiting for me to pet her, which I do. Are you with Mav? I freeze. She knows we're roommates now, but not about everything else that's happened recently. Uh, yeah. He's on the phone with the guys. I can hear Adam's voice in the background and then Johnny's response from the other room. What have you been up to? I ask her. Just hanging out with Adam, mostly. She smiles. I can't see her boyfriend, but his hand comes over and pats her ass and then rests there casually. You two are adorable. Have you done any more online dating? No, I haven't even opened the app, I say honestly. What about? Her eyes widen. I bite the corner of my lip and glance to the kitchen. Johnny and I haven't mentioned telling our friends, but I can't imagine he'd care if I tell Reagan. She must be able to read it on my face. No. Her head pops up. Really? Shh. I hold my finger up to my lips. I'll tell you later. Oh my god! She squeals. It's been the wildest week, I say. I'll bet. Friday morning, Johnny and I head over to the arena together. He holds my hand as we go down the elevator, swinging it playfully and scrolling on his phone. I heard you sent over the endorsement stuff. Hugh was happy with what you got. What about the Maverick Company? I pull out my phone to see if Linda responded. She didn't. I assume they approved it. Hugh forwarded me an image and text that they want me to post on my accounts, teasing the launch date. He tips his phone for me to see, and I take it, eager to see what they are using. 
They went with one of my favorites from the first shoot before he got under the shower. He's holding up the deodorant with a half smile that somehow comes off as confident and humble at the same time. That's it? Just one image? I sent hundreds. What about the behind the scenes stuff? I don't know. He pockets his phone. Maybe they're going to send more closer to the launch date. I'm quiet as we step out into the lobby. I have an unsettling feeling that they weren't as happy with the shoot as I was. Are you okay? He asks, shooting me a side glance. Yeah. I shake my head. Of course. I'm glad they're happy. I just thought they'd use more of the content. We got that image in the first 30 minutes. He stops and tugs me closer to drop a kiss on my lips. I look around, but we're alone. Whatever they decided to use or not use is more about me than you. You did an amazing job. Yeah, so good they didn't use it, I mumble. I told you that you should have gotten someone with more experience. He laughs, the shake of his chest loosening the pit in my stomach. He tilts up my chin and forces me to look at him. My slam piece has mad skills. Don't be hating on her. Oh my god. I smack his chest. He laughs. That's better. I don't think you can call me your slam piece when we haven't slammed. Could change that right now. I've got two minutes. I roll my eyes and start toward the door. Orgasm, buddy? I don't answer, and he keeps going. Personal assistant? Chapter 26. Johnny. Coach divides us up into four teams to scrimmage. All week the guys and I have been looking forward to it. The workouts and the drills were necessary, but this is where it'll be decided. Everyone wants to prove they deserve to be here, and no one more than me. My team is resting while two others play. I catch Dakota and Blythe at the media bench with a photographer from my shoot, Lindsay. The stands are filled with people today. More than have been here all week. Diehards, mostly, who want to see what the future of the team looks like. Statistically, most of us will end up in Iowa, where we'll continue to duke it out and try to impress the coaches to get our shot. A couple of these guys I played against just a month ago at the Frozen Four. Morris, from Waterville, would like nothing more than to embarrass me and send me packing if his pissed-off stares all week or anything to go on. He's a great player, and I think he has a decent shot at staying. Either way, there's a good chance we're going to be teammates one day, so hopefully a little shoving on the ice will make him feel better about the loss I helped deal at the college championships. Coach blows the whistle. Green and black teams, you're up. White and red, hit the bench. I skate out and take a knee. Assistant Coach Peters puts us in our positions to start. Some of us will have to switch from where we're most comfortable, and that's kind of the purpose of this week. Yesterday, we had to skate on one leg for 30 minutes, then switch for the next 30 minutes. Discovering weaknesses and knowing what to work on this week and beyond will, in the long run, make us all better pro players. Still, everyone wants to look good for the coaches and media watching our every move. After getting our assignments, I skate into position, passing Dakota as I do. Lindsay and Blythe are looking elsewhere, and I can't help but wink at my girl as I do. I run my hand along my stick suggestively, and she rolls her eyes. I love doing dumb shit to make her laugh. This week has been, honestly, even better than I could have imagined. And I imagined in vivid, pornographic detail. I had my own reservations about our relationship changing. Not enough to stop myself, mind you. But the only thing that's changed is I get to feel her up and watch her orgasm on the regular. I'm dying to have sex with her. But even if it's just handies and dry humping for the next month, it's going to be the best summer ever. After scrimmaging, we hit the showers, then lunch, and then load up on the bus for our required community service gig. Dakota's coming with us, and I pass her at the front of the bus, tugging the end of her red hair as I go. I fall into a seat next to Tyler. He's coming from the junior league. The guy's a wicked slap shot. Nice goal today, I say. Thanks. You had a couple of good ones yourself. Appreciate you saying so, but that last one was ugly as hell. Ugly still counts, he says. 
I haven't seen you at the hotel. Did you already rent a place? Yeah, I'm at the Legends. You like it? I still haven't found a place. I'm waiting to make sure I'm not heading to Iowa instead. No chance, man, and yeah, it's great. Come by sometime before you head out and see for yourself. Before we get off the bus at the library, Blythe gives us instructions. Split up, talk to the kids, read to them if you want, play puppets, just don't stand in the corner. I promise you, the more you try to hide, the more they will seek you out. They smell weakness. She laughs. Have fun. Dakota and I will be around if anyone has questions, and Lindsay is with us for pictures, so smile pretty. Mora smiles wide beside her, his front tooth missing, and the bus laughs. The kids are a trip. Some of them rush us and others eye us warily. I don't blame the ones in the latter group. We're a bunch of big dudes who don't know jack about kids or how to interact with them. Thankfully, some of the older guys came. Jack is great. He crouches down in front of one adorable little girl with pigtails, and four more kids crowd around. Leo's got two kids fighting for a seat in his lap as he reads a book on space. Blythe was right. The guys that try to hang back end up with kids seeking them out and shoving books in front of them. Some of the littlest children are with their parents. One woman has a tiny little thing strapped to her chest and a kid tugging her along toward Declan. The defenseman surprises me, kneeling and holding out a fist. Kids don't scare me. I mean, I'm a big fucking kid myself, but I haven't had to carry a conversation with one recently. Tyler and I end up standing together. Neither of us makes a move, and Blythe encourages us, waving us towards some kids near the toy section. After you, I tell him, not really thinking he'll take the bait. Ty is a quieter guy. Besides the bus ride, he hasn't said much during our off-ice time, but he strikes up a conversation with two kids about dragons like he's an expert on the topic. I stand behind him, listening to him debate if girl or boy dragons are stronger, like he's done deep thinking on the topic. He looks over his shoulder and hands me a pink dragon puppet. He slips the blue one on his hand. I don't know. Let's find out. He mock attacks me, biting my puppet on the neck. It's short-lived, but the kids laugh. I catch Dakota's eyes across the room. She smiles and lifts her phone like she's taking a picture of me. I wink which makes her eyes widen and she glances around, looking for Blythe, most likely. I already know where the boss lady is. I'm not stupid. I don't want to get Dakota caught any more than she wants to be caught. She must come to the same conclusion I did. Blythe is too busy to notice us, because she glances back and gives me a haughty, sexy stare with pursed lips before turning on her heel and resuming her job. I make the rounds, smiling tentatively at kids and saying hello to all the parents and staff. But every time I glance at Dakota, she looks up from what she's doing and we share a heated stare that makes adrenaline and lust pump through my veins. Leo's finishing a book as I near him. The kids he was reading to have lost interest and are jumping the carpet tiles. I take a seat next to him on a bright blue beanbag. Ah, oh, fudge, I say. I didn't think this through. Not sure I'm going to be able to get up. Why do you think I'm still down here? He laughs. I look through the books on the floor in front of him. Space, U.S. history, math, and finance. Well, aren't you a barrel of fun? I lift the one on finance that's as thick as a textbook. That one is mine. He snatches it from me. I was hoping I could disappear and study for a test I have tonight. I'm trying to finish up my degree. I nod. Leo came to the Wildcats after his sophomore year of college, like me. That's cool, man. He shrugs it off, so I don't press. Go. I tilt my head to the study room across the library. I'll cover for you. Thanks, Rook. All the kids are occupied for the moment, so I sit back and watch the chaos around the library. This is pretty cool. I extract myself from the beanbag chair and circle around until I'm back with Tyler. He's still working those puppets hard. He tosses me one, and we slip back into action, acting out scenes from the books. Dakota steps up next to me with her phone. She smiles as she aims it at me and takes a picture. Miss me? I whisper, using the puppet as a decoy. I'm taking some behind-the-scenes pictures for the social media pages. Mm-hmm. I am, she insists and takes another. Then maybe you should take pictures of more than just me. She rolls her eyes but doesn't try to deny it. You're good with kids. Yeah, I guess. 
They're pretty cool. I can see you with a minivan full of them someday. Me? A parent? I shake my head. I'm more the fun uncle. What about you? Do I want kids? She asks. I nod. Definitely. Not a whole minivan full, but a couple. You've got the death glare for it. No kid is sneaking out on your watch. Tyler finishes the book, and the kids grab the puppets and entertain themselves. I step closer to Dakota. We're quiet, watching the kids around us. Seems like a lot of work. The mom with a baby and kid pulling her around looks exhausted. Dakota leans down to say hello to the kid, and the mom gives her a thankful smile. Do you like dogs? She points to the book in his hand. It has a pug on the front. The kid nods enthusiastically. You know who else does? She turns to me. Johnny Maverick. He's a big dog fan. Do you want him to read this to you? My palms sweat as his chubby little hand holds up the book. She snaps another picture as I sit on the floor beside him. Don't underestimate yourself, Johnny Maverick. From the library, we're bused back to the arena. Tonight, instead of getting to go home and rest, we've got scheduled team bonding time. I catch Dakota as we're getting off the bus. Hey, I'm going to be late tonight. Can you let Charlie out for me? Yeah, I'll take her on a short run with me. I missed my run the last few mornings. She smirks and blushes. Sorry, not sorry, I say, remembering exactly how we spent that time. Later, Rumi. One of the media rooms has been set up with video games and food. All the older guys that are in town stop by, but the coaches and staff are absent to give us time to talk and get to know one another without them. I fill a plate full of grub and sit between Declan and Tyler. Boys, I say in greeting. What's up, Mav? Dex says. Me holding up? Yeah, it's a little sore after that slam into the wall earlier today. I give him a pointed stare. He grins. I had to make sure you could stay in one piece with a little check. Little. He's one of the biggest guys in the league. I thought it was nice of him to stop by until I realized he was giving us a taste of what it'll be like playing against defenders like him. Ty laughs. It's been a fun week. I'm sad to see it coming to an end. The real fun will begin in September, I tell him, and hold up my fist for a bump. Chapter 27 Dakota Okay, start at the beginning, Reagan says. Ginny crowds in next to her. Don't leave anything out. They're sitting on Reagan's bed, and I feel a twinge of melancholy. I am loving my time in Minnesota, but I miss them. I'm leaving a few things out, I warn, as my friends wait for details about Maverick and me. Sienna joins our Zoom with a smile. Sorry, I'm helping teach a figure skating class, and one of the kid's parents showed up 15 minutes late. Poor kid. Poor me. What did I miss? Tell me everything. You haven't missed anything. She's holding out on us, Reagan says. I huff a laugh. I just didn't want to have to repeat myself. Well, we're all here now, Ginny says. Spill. There really isn't that much to spill. Reagan groans. Ugh, you're lucky you're so far away. I want to shake you. I could drive down and force it out of her, Sienna offers. Nobody needs to force anything out of me, I say. We kissed and messed around a little. It's the worst description ever for the amazing, hot, fun week of daily orgasms at the hands and mouth of Maverick. Threesome connoisseur wasn't on my dating must-haves list, but holy crap, maybe it should be because all that attention focused on me? It's mind-blowing. My mind, totally blown. Ginny squeals. Oh my god, I love it. Do the guys know? Heath hasn't said anything. I don't think so, Sienna says. No. Reagan shakes her head. Huh. I'm surprised that he didn't text them the second it happened to gloat. When has Maverick ever gloated about hookups? Ginny shakes her head. Not his style. Yeah, I guess you're right. Can we keep this between us? I don't want him to think that's what I'm doing either. 
So are you dating, or was this a one or several times thing? Sienna asks. For the summer, I guess, or until we get sick of one another. The second may happen first. Though, as I say it, I don't believe it. At least not on my account. Johnny is unpredictable and silly and just fun. Then what? Reagan asks. I'll come back to Valley and he'll stay in Minnesota, I shrug. They don't look happy with my answer. We'll still be friends. I did not see this coming, Ginny says. But I love it. You two are all sexy banter. I bet the sex is amazing. They look to me for an answer with hopeful, eager faces. We haven't had sex, just lots of other stuff. Stuff like? Reagan's head bobs, indicating she wants more details. Let's just say he's very good with his hands. Johnny doesn't get home until late Friday night, and I have to be at the arena early Saturday morning with the other interns for the last day of camp. I'm on floater duty and don't cross paths with him until it's all over. I'm helping break down tables and putting away displays and extra chairs. I smell him before I see him. The hailstone scent I told him I like is all he wears now. Maybe he's really into doing his due diligence for the endorsement, or maybe he just likes teasing me. I have an emergency, he whispers next to my ear. What's wrong? I straighten, and he takes my hand and hauls me through a doorway into a closet that smells like dirty feet and cleaner. His mouth descends onto mine, and his big hands frame my face. You said there was an emergency. I speak the words into his mouth, trying not to break the kiss more than I have to. There is. He takes my hand in his and rubs it over his crotch. I woke up like this and can't seem to do anything about it. That sounds like a personal problem. Maybe you should see a doctor. He pulls my bottom lip between his teeth. The problem is, my hand is no longer doing it for me. I need yours. Such sweet talk, I say sarcastically. You want sweet words? He asks, holding my face and looking into my eyes. I don't know what I want, but my body likes everything he's doing right now. I drag my palm down his length through his athletic pants. Mmm, sweetheart. He groans. Baby. Ah, oh, fuck. How does that feel so good through two layers? He presses a soft kiss to my lips. Baby doll. Bay. That's enough sweet talk, I say. I was just getting into it, he says, trying to find an endearment I like. What happened to Slam Peace? You know you aren't just my slam piece. No. I slide my hand under the band of his boxers and touch his dick. He hisses through his teeth. You can be whatever you want. Just don't stop touching me. Won't take long. Charming. Don't pretend like you don't love that I'm hard for you all day. His hand slides under my skirt, and he teases me through my panties. You're so wet. Have you been this wet all day? He shoves them to the side and wastes no time dipping his fingers inside of me. I shut him up by covering his mouth with mine. Every word out of his gorgeous lips makes my head spin. We frantically rub and jerk as our mouths slant, and we suck and lick and play. I have been turned on all day missing him, but I missed being with him too. And that's a lot scarier thing to realize. I hope we're not screwing everything up by screwing each other up. The following week is much calmer at the arena. I'm with Reese today working the ticket office. We make calls to past season ticket holders to see if they're interested in renewing. We send emails to businesses interested in booking suites or sponsoring games. Sponsors get signage around the ice and special callouts during the game. It's way more involved than I thought, 
but I do not love being on the phone. So many people hang up or put us off. After four hours, I've only secured one deal. She didn't even let me get through the first sentence, I whine after another hang up. Come on, Reese says. Maybe people will be friendlier after lunch. In the hallway, we see Blythe talking to Wildcat President and CEO Mr. Albert. She smiles and opens her stance. Brad, these are two of my interns, Dakota Lawrence and Reese Beck. Pleasure to meet you. Reese extends his hand first, and after they shake, I offer mine as well. I hear you've got the making of a great equipment manager, Mr. Albert says to Reese, and then to me, and you're the one that got the great behind-the-scenes content from the library outing last week, right? Oh, uh, I got a few. Mostly of Johnny. He was right. Even though I was convinced I got an even number of photos of all the guys, half the photos I took had Maverick in them somehow. She has a great eye for what's trending on social media. The library has already asked us to come back. I didn't know that but it makes me happy it went over so well. Glad to hear it. The stars have twice the following we have on social media. I'd like to change that this year. Maybe you can help. I'd love to. I'm only here for a few more weeks. You've both done a great job this summer, Blythe adds. Keep it up, Mr. Albert says. And I hope the two of you will consider coming back to help us out once you've graduated. Reese and I walk away, neither speaking until we're outside. We turn to each other, smiling, and scream, ah! Sunday night, Maverick and I are watching The Office. We've already made it halfway through season two, and it's become our nightly thing, followed by multiple orgasms. It's a good way to spend an evening, I have to say. What are you doing Wednesday night? He asks. He lays with his head at the opposite end of the couch, Charlie on his chest, and his feet are in my lap. At this rate, watching season four. How about coming with me to a ball game? He sits up. I was invited to throw the first pitch at the Twins game. Seriously? My lips pull up into a big smile. Yeah, it's a trip, right? Blythe cornered me and added so many events to my calendar. She's a hard woman to say no to. That's really cool. So you'll come with me? I don't think that's a good idea for us to be seen out together. Everyone knows we're friends. Besides, Jack is going too. Is he bringing a date? No. He laughed when Blythe told us we got a plus one. He slides his hands around my waist. Come on. It'll be fun to hang out with you like a real date. If I come, it cannot be like a date, I say. Just two friends hanging out at a baseball game. I bat at his hands. I'm not shaving my legs or wearing deodorant. Do you really think that would scare me off? We both laugh. I know it wouldn't, and I won't go through with it anyway. One more date I need you to pencil in. Johnny, I protest. I ran this one by Blythe, but I asked if I could be the one to tell you. Well, now I'm intrigued. There's a black tie thing next weekend hosted by the Wildcats Foundation. I asked Blythe if you could come since you helped with the endorsement, and she agreed. She said you could grab some good behind-the-scenes images and content. That woman is going to be sad to see you go. He nips at my collarbone. Me too. Black tie, huh? So you'll be in a suit. He flashes me a sexy smirk. That's right. And you in a sexy dress. Maybe the black one. I don't think that dress is black tie. It stops about two inches above my vagina. That's my idea of black tie. He kisses my shoulder and collarbone while I consider it. Are you sure it's a good idea? Afraid you won't be able to keep your hands off me in public? I'm sure there's a dark corner I can shove you in if needed. He crawls onto my lap. All six feet of him wraps around me. What are you doing? I ask through a grunt. He attacks my neck with playful kisses and bites. The doorbell rings and he stills, lips still on my neck. Expecting someone? He asks. That's probably just Declan. 
I called him about a threesome. I say casually. He's quiet as if he's giving my words deep thought. Oh my God, I'm kidding. He jumps up to get the door. I thought you'd be more into two girls with one guy, but two guys? He bobs his head. I can get down with that as long as we don't cross swords. He opens the door, and when Declan's voice sounds from the other side, I have to slap a hand over my mouth to stop laughing. I grab a bottle of lube from the coffee table from our earlier activities and creep from my position on the couch toward my room in case Declan comes into the apartment. What's up, man? Mav asks. Thought I'd see if you want to hang out. My internet's down. Oh, uh... Mav sneaks a look at me. I nod, encouraging him, then toss the lube in his room and pop back out to say hi to Declan. I give them the living room and go to my room. One of the downfalls of us hanging out every night and keeping our relationship a secret is that he hasn't spent that much time with the guys, and I know he needs to bond with his new teammates. I sit on my bed, smiling as I hear the guys talking in the living room. It almost feels like we're really dating. Weird. I'm not overthinking it. Johnny has a way about him that makes me not obsess too much about the details. Maybe it's his, it's whatever, personality rubbing off on me, or maybe I just have too much fun with him to dissect it. No matter the reason, I'm going to enjoy the hell out of the rest of the summer. Chapter 28 Johnny Heath, you and Dakota tell me it's true? Adam Oh, it's true. Rhett, yeah, congrats, buddy, but while we're on the topic of your awesome new relationship, I'm going to need you to take it down a notch. You're making me look bad, and I have plans that I need you to not fuck up for me. Maverick. Coda told me she told them and that she told them not to tell you. Your girlfriends are all terrible at keeping secrets. And what the hell are you talking about, Rothrus? Heath, I'm a little hurt that Ginny knew before me. I want my BFF necklace back. Adam, seriously, Mav, why are you holding out on us? Maverick, I wasn't sure if we were telling people, and unlike your girls, I'm an awesome secret keeper. Adam, you're so fucked, you've got it bad. Rhett, Dakota sent the girls a picture of the dresses you bought her. I can't compete with Oscar de la Renta and Valentino. Heath, who the fuck is Oscar de la whatever? Adam, he bought Dakota a bunch of expensive dresses, all pretty woman style. Maverick, I wanted her to have options. Which one did she choose? She won't tell me. Heath, I just asked Ginny, but she won't say. Adam, Reagan either. Rhett, Sienna's not here, but if Dakota swore them to secrecy, she won't tell me. Maverick, oh sure, now they're good at keeping secrets. Wednesday night, we get the VIP treatment at Target Field. We meet some of the team, and then they show us to a room where we wait to go out on the field. Jack is chatting with one of the event coordinators in the hallway, leaving Dakota and me with a little privacy. She's looking sexy as hell in cut-off jean shorts, a white tank top that stops an inch above her belly button, and an open twins jersey over it. Her red hair is pulled back in a ponytail, showing off her neck, and all I can think about is sucking on it. She sits about a foot away from me, insisting on playing this off like we're just friends, even though Jack pretty much already knows something went down between us in his bathroom. I walk my fingers across the leather couch toward her. She arches a brow as I reach her smooth legs. Johnny, she admonishes. You're so far away, I whine. I sat closer to Jack on the ride over than I did you. Not that I minded. He smells fantastic. He really does, she says. Maverick? Jack steps into the room and Dakota stands so quickly you'd think the couch caught on fire. They're ready. As Dakota and I follow him down the tunnel to the field, she brushes her fingers against mine and gives me a slight smile. Good luck. She's led to our seats and Jack and I go out on the field to get a few practice throws in. I played baseball as a kid, so I'm not too worried. I would like to impress a certain redhead in the crowd, though. I find her in her seat, eyes glued on me, 
and I give her a little hat tip. I can't believe she's with me, even if it's only for the summer. Luckiest guy ever. Tossing a baseball in my hand, I stand next to Jack, watching the teams warm up from behind home plate. So, you and Dakota, are you two a thing now? Because I feel like I should warn you, being in a relationship your rookie year will be hard, especially if she's planning to go back to Arizona at the end of the summer. We're just having some fun, I say. We're friends. She's cool. He doesn't look like he believes me, but I don't need him to. I know no matter what, Dakota and I will be cool. We have to be. I can't imagine any scenario where we end on bad terms. I'd do anything for her. Throwing out the first pitch is wild. I managed to get it over the plate, but I'd say about half the crowd isn't even paying attention. They're getting beer and hot dogs, finding seats, and anxiously waiting for the game to start. But as I wave to polite applause, I can see Dakota standing, hands up to her mouth, screaming for me like I just hit a grand slam. I can't wait to sit down beside her and watch the game, almost like we're on an actual date. But the media are waiting for pictures and sound bites, then there's a lot of handshaking. When Jack and I finally make it to our seats, it's already the bottom of the second inning. Dakota stands, hesitates, and then hugs me. That was amazing. Thanks. I didn't want to embarrass my girl. She looks at Jack like he might be listening in on her every word. We take our seats, Dakota sitting between Jack and me. The game is good, the beer is cold, and the three of us have a good time cheering and chatting. It's more difficult than I imagine keeping my hands off her. I keep finding myself absently reaching for her or wanting to lean over and kiss her. I'm going to go crazy before the end of this game. I stand. I need another beer. Does anyone else want anything? I'm good. Dakota lifts her mostly full cup. Jack tips up his head. I'll take another. I wander around the lower deck, scoping out merchandise. I grab some souvenirs for Dakota and then the beers. I'm walking back to our seats between innings. The kiss cam's going, and I slow my steps to watch the monitor. They stop on an older couple in matching twins' jerseys. The husband plants a big old kiss on his wife, hands on her cheeks, not letting her go until the stadium erupts in cheers. Old people still hot for each other? Yeah, I want a little of that. I pull my gaze from the screen to Dakota. She's watching the old couple like I was, with a big smile on her gorgeous face. I have a flash of Dakota and me with gray hair, still unable to keep our hands to ourselves, and my chest tightens. I slide into my chair and lean forward to deposit everything on the ground. Dakota squeaks beside me. I sit tall, beers in hand, ready to hand Jack his, but the look on my girl's face stops me short. What? I didn't even get the question out of my mouth when I spot Dakota and Jack on the kiss cam screen. She ducks her head and blushes, which only makes the announcer and crowd more determined. Jack wears an amused smirk, arm casually resting on the armrest between them. They look great together. Well, she looks great. She could carry any guy a couple goals. Dakota manages a side glance at me as the people around us chant, Kiss! Kiss! I don't have a lot of options. I could push Jack out of the way and kiss her myself in front of all these people, or drag her all caveman-like out of the stadium. I doubt Dakota would like either of those options. I'm frozen watching the two of them, just like everyone else. Finally, Jack leans over, puts a hand on her face, shielding most of her from the camera, and brings his mouth to hers. Every cell in my body pulses with waves of anger and frustration at the roaring applause as their kiss is captured on the big screen for everyone to see. No. Just fucking no. Her lips are wet and shiny and her face has that just kissed flush. The only time she should look like that is after I kiss her. God damn it. I should have pushed Jack the fuck out of the way. Chapter 29 Dakota Maverick and I leave before the game is over. We all took an Uber together on the way here, but Jack said he was going to stay and get his own ride back. Really? I think he's graciously bowing out after the kiss cam fiasco. Once we're away from the stadium, 
Johnny pulls me over into the middle of the back seat so that I'm sitting next to him. Gonna have to keep you glued to my side from now on. He wraps a hand around the back of my neck and drops his mouth to mine. No warm-up, no tenderness. His kiss is hard and demanding, and I am here for it. Sitting next to him all night and not being able to touch him was frustrating, a lot more frustrating than I thought it would be. Years I've hung out with him and not thought about kissing him, and now I can't do it for five minutes without wanting to jump him. Did you like it when he kissed you? He pulls my bottom lip between his teeth while I shake my head. Jack and I barely kissed. His lips brushed mine like a whisper, but even from that soft touch, I know kissing Jack, really kissing Jack, wouldn't feel like this. You looked good kissing him, and I didn't like it. You're mine. If you want to kiss another guy, it's on my terms. Like a threesome? I ask, as his lips skim down my neck. Liquid heat pools in my lower belly at the idea. Mm-hmm, he murmurs against my collarbone. Whatever you want, as long as I'm a part of it. I don't want to miss out on a single kiss or orgasm. The Uber driver stops at the curb outside of the apartment complex. Johnny thanks him, and we step out onto the sidewalk in front of the arena. It's quiet on the street in front of our building, but up ahead I can see people walking to and from the bars and restaurants. My arms are full. Between the things the twins gave us and all the extra stuff Maverick insisted on buying me, I'm flush with merch. Inside the elevator, he pins me against the wall and keeps showing me just how much he wants me. I'm so hard thinking about you in a threesome. I can feel just how hard. I don't think I could go through with a threesome. But you like the idea, I can tell. I do, but not for the reason he thinks. I lean forward, stopping when my lips hover near his. Right now, I like any idea that includes sex with you. He stills, face searching mine. You mean... I close the distance and place a kiss on his lips, then softly whisper, Fuck me, Johnny. He says nothing for too long, and I think maybe he's going to tell me no. The elevator dings, and the doors open on the 11th. The doors start to close, and he's still staring at me, unblinking. We don't have... Fuck yes. He hauls me out of the elevator and to the apartment. I think I dropped a foam finger back there, I say, giggling as he shuts us inside. I'll buy you five more. He takes everything else from me and drops it all to the floor, then scoops me up, tosses me over his shoulder, and heads for his bedroom. He smacks my ass. It's go time, Coda. I'm laughing when he lays me down, but then he begins undressing me, and everything shifts. He starts at my shoes, kissing my calves and knees as he does it, then working his way up. He's slow and deliberate, dropping more kisses and murmuring how gorgeous I am, and reminding me I'm his over and over again as if I would be anyone else's, not when this is an option. I'd trade away everything else for another few weeks just like this. Summer is blazing by, and I am through denying myself anything. My heart rate skips as he covers me, adoring every inch of skin. By the time his lips skim over the heated skin at the apex of my thighs, I'm trembling. His big shoulders push between my legs. He hooks an arm around one and brings his mouth down, kissing me softly on the mound of my pussy. He groans, the sound vibrating against my sensitive flesh. Johnny, I whine. I need more, and I need it now. <laughs> Patience, slam piece, he chuckles, and his tone softens. He runs a finger along my swollen slit. Fuck, baby. You're so wet. 
tell me what you want. You. Just you. The honest admission slips from my lips. And, uh, shirt off, obviously. He leans back on his knees and pulls the jersey over his head. He really does have a great body. Better? Keep going? I stare at the bulge in his jeans. He shakes his head side to side. Uh-uh. Not yet. I need to make sure you're ready for me. I feel pretty damn ready, but before I can voice it, his mouth covers my pussy, and I can't form words. He licks and nips while dragging the pad of his thumb over my clit at a slow, torturous pace. I grip his shoulders, digging my fingernails into his skin until I'm certain he will have tiny crescent moons indented on his flesh. That's it, baby. He tightens his grip on me, latching on as my orgasm rocks through me. I've barely melted into the mattress when he places a kiss at my belly button and says, Turn over. I comply, boneless and satiated but excited for more. I can hear him undressing behind me. I glance over my shoulder, slightly turning so I can appreciate the view. He catches my gaze as he stands at the end of the bed, naked, stroking his dick. I thought I told you to turn over, he says with a sexy smirk. The view is better this way. You've been staring at the one-eyed monster for weeks, baby. I don't want to miss any of this, I say. He gives my ass a smack that's just above playful and places a kiss on the same spot. On your stomach. You're not ready for me yet. I am, but I fall back to my stomach anyway. His body covers mine. He runs a hand down my ponytail and then wraps his hand around it until my scalp pricks. He kisses my neck and down my spine. He's a heady mixture of playful and bossy, commanding me to get on all fours one minute and the next blowing raspberries on my ass. He gives me another smack and then slides his hand between my legs. I'm slick, and his fingers glide easily through my folds. My shoulders sag as the next orgasm builds. Johnny, I whine as his hand disappears. I'm so close. His laughter caresses my skin. What, baby? You know what? I push my hips back until his dick pokes my ass. He groans and bites my neck, then kisses it. Playful and bossy. I need another orgasm out of you before I know you're serious. What? I'm deciphering his meaning as he rolls us, so he's on his back and I'm straddling him. Ride my face, baby. He wriggles down and smacks my ass to get me into position. My muscles clench as I lower onto his eager mouth. I hold still, letting him lick and suck. I said, ride my face, baby. You want my dick? Show me what you're going to do with it. My face flames, but I roll my hips and rub myself on his mouth. My second orgasm hits with barely any warning. Johnny holds my ass in his palms as he sucks hard on my clit while I ride it out. I cry his name as I slump against the headboard. Fuck, that was hot, he says, as I lift my leg to fall onto the bed beside him. Fuck hot? I ask, trying to catch my breath. Everything about you is fuck hot. Are you sure you want to do this? I can get you off about a thousand more ways with my hands or mouth. The MacGyver of orgasms, I joke. I'm ready. He reaches over to the nightstand and grabs a condom. I lean forward and place a kiss on the head of his dick before he can cover himself. His head falls back, eyes closed. One hand caresses my face and then tangles in my hair bringing me down on him until he hits the back of my throat. Tears prick my eyes and he lets go, stealing my hair tie from my ponytail and letting my hair spill free. On the bed, 
hands above your head. He finishes covering himself with the condom and then loops the tie around my wrists, keeping them together over my head, resting on the mattress. He frames my face in his big hands, kissing me deeply as the head of his cock nudges my entrance. He rests his forehead on mine as he slides inside. Fuck, Coda. You're so goddamn tight and perfect and fucking mine. He growls the last part as he pounds into me, finally hitting the spot deep inside of me that's been aching for him. I bring my arms up and loop them around his neck. He bites my bicep and then kisses it, before finally giving all his attention to my mouth, kissing me so hard and stealing all the air from my lungs. I come with tears welling behind my eyelids. Too many orgasms and too many emotions. I'm overloaded on Johnny Maverick. He groans, sliding his mouth down and clamping onto my neck, sucking hard as we come together. I'm going to have a mark for sure. His. And I like it a little too much. I silence my alarm and try to sit up. Johnny's arm at my waist weighs me down, and even through his light snores, he's holding on tight. Charlie is curled up between our legs, and I encourage her to come closer by patting the comforter lightly. She wiggles as if she's too lazy to walk, and I pick her up and put her in my spot, then lift Johnny's arm around his dog. The sneak out, huh? You gonna at least leave some money on the nightstand? He opens one eye. Ha, ha. I pull my tank top over my head. I need to shower and change. I smell like sex and hailstone. Look and smell pretty fucking good to me. He rolls onto his back, lifts his arms, and makes a window with his thumb and pointer finger on each hand, then looks at me through it. I finish dressing and lean over to place a kiss on his lips. He captures my legs and pulls me on top of him. I have to go, I insist, but don't try to pull away just yet. Thanks for last night, slam piece. He grins and rubs a finger along my neck. I'll be your slam piece any fucking time. I can't stop smiling as I get ready and head to work. The more I replay last night, the more details I remember, and wow, I want to do it all again. I consider going straight to Blythe's office and faking a stomachache to spend the day in bed with Johnny, but there are only two and a half weeks of the internship left, and I guess I actually like my job because it's a close second to spending the day in bed. Quinn and Reese are at their desks when I get to our area in the intern pool. Morning, I say cheerily. I come up short when I see the big flower arrangement sitting on my desk. Twelve stunning red roses. Are those for me? My face heats. I'm going to kill Johnny. And how exactly did he pull this off so fast? The card mocks me, but I don't dare reach for it. Reese leans back in his chair with a pen poised in one hand up near his mouth. Morning. Quinn stands and comes to sit on my desk. Reese rolls his chair closer. What's going on? I remove my laptop from my bag and set it on the desk, avoiding their stares. Are those from Jack? Quinn asks. She makes like she's going to take the card, and I block her. Jack? Jack Wild, the guy you made out with on national TV? Ringing any bells? Quinn raises one accusatory eyebrow. Right. The kiss cam. I'd all but forgotten it. Who would have thought that'd be the least interesting part of last night? No, they aren't from Jack. That was nothing. It didn't look like nothing. Quinn holds up her phone to show me. I take the device and my stomach twists at the photo evidence of Jack and me kissing. It really was nothing, but I can see how it looks, especially knowing Jack's history. Where did you find this? There are a bunch more. 
People tagged Jack and the Wildcats. You're everywhere. Her gaze drops to my neck. Nice hickey. My hand shoots to my neck, and I brush my hair over my shoulder to cover it. It isn't what it looks like. Quinn shrugs. Okay, what is it? I went to the game with Jack and Maverick to watch Johnny throw the first pitch. That kiss lasted all of a second, and it was nothing. I'm not hooking up with Jack. Neither speaks. I'm not. Quinn stands, and her gaze lifts over my shoulder. Look less guilty. Good morning, everyone. Blythe, stunning as always, steps into our area. Her body language gives nothing away, but I stand in front of the flower arrangement on my desk. Morning, we say in unison. Before you head off to your work assignments for the day, I wanted to make sure you all got the invite for the charity gala next Friday night. I breathe out a sigh of relief that she isn't here for me. Also, another point for Johnny. I told him I'd only come to the gala if he made sure Quinn and Reese were going too. It'd look too suspicious if I were the only one. I already bought my dress, Quinn says. It will be a great opportunity for you to see another aspect of the job. And, she pauses, it's a small way for me to thank you for all the hard work you've done this summer. I'll pull you three from your rotation next Friday to help me set up. We groan. I've lifted enough tables and chairs this summer to last a lifetime. She laughs. Everything will already be in place. No heavy lifting required. Great job, everyone. The reports from your rotations have been wonderful. You make me look good. She takes a step closer to my desk, her smile never faltering. Dakota, before you head to your rotation, can you stop by my office? It'll only take a minute. Heat creeps up the back of my neck. Sure, I'll be right there. With a nod, she leaves, and I let out a shaky breath. Oh, shit. Quinn shoots me an I-told-you-so look. I grab my stuff for rotation and snatch the card from the flowers to read later. Blythe is standing in her office next to a fancy-looking espresso machine fresh out of the box. Come in, she says when she sees me. Shut the door. I gulp and force a smile as I close the door behind me and take a seat. I went to the store to buy an electric kettle and ended up with this, she says, and holds up some sort of attachment. What do you think this is? I don't know. I'm not much of a coffee drinker unless it has a whole lot of cream and sugar. Do you like tea? Yeah, sometimes. Oh my gosh, why am I here? I can't seem to relax, and I'm afraid I'm going to blurt out I slept with Johnny Maverick any second if she doesn't get to the point. Someone knocks on the door, and she looks up and waves. Catherine from HR walks in, and I feel like I'm going to throw up. Hi, Dakota, Catherine says. Hi. I look between them. Am I in trouble? Sorry, I should have explained, Blythe says, as Catherine takes a seat beside me. We saw the photograph of you and Jack last night at the Twins game. I'm silent, forcing her to say it. The kiss cam? I nod. It wasn't what it looked like. Jack said the same thing, but we had to talk to him and you per protocol. Blythe gives me a reassuring smile. Catherine angles her legs toward me. It's just a reminder that while you're interning with the Wildcats, any relationships with players or co-workers need to be disclosed. I thought we weren't allowed to have relationships with players. My brows pull together. So you are having a relationship with Jack Wilde? Catherine asks. No, I shake my head. Definitely not. If you were involved with a player, you would be reassigned for the duration of your internship. In other words, Moved somewhere, I can't do any damage to the reputation of the company. I curl my fingers around the card from the flowers. I am not involved with anyone. Great. That makes my job easy, then. Catherine sits tall. If you ever need to talk, you know where to find me. She and Blythe stand and walk me out. Thanks, Dakota, Blythe says, as I move down the hall away from her. 
Only when I turn the corner out of view do I finally pull the heavy cardstock from the tiny envelope. My stomach flips, and a smile tugs at my lips. Mine. Yours. Chapter 30. Dakota. I'm crossing the street to the apartment after work when a motorcycle catches my eye. It idles in a no-parking zone right outside of the building. The driver has on a helmet, but I can almost feel him watching me. I pull out my keycard and phone as I approach, but then he lifts the helmet and shakes out his dark hair. Johnny. Johnny on a motorcycle. That's a fantasy I didn't know I needed in my life. He rests the helmet on his thigh and flashes that maverick smile that makes me want to roll my eyes and kiss him in equal measure. Want a ride, baby? His tone is all sorts of innuendos. Where did you get this? He swings a leg over and stands in front of me. Declan is letting me try her out. I'm thinking about getting one. What do you think? I think they're dangerous. Worried about me? Worried about the bike. It's so pretty. Come on a ride with me. Where are we going? I move the strap of my purse so it's across my body. Don't know. We'll just see where the night takes us. He lifts the helmet carefully onto my head, then stands back and looks at me through a window he makes with the thumb and pointer finger of each hand. Sold. He gets on, and then I do, tucking the hem of my dress under me so it won't blow up, and then wrapping my arms around his waist. A thrill shoots through me as he starts it up. I tighten my grip, and he takes off. Johnny navigates through the busy city traffic, and then I lose track of where we are and what direction we're heading. On a quieter road, he turns his head and yells, Hang on, baby. Then the bike accelerates, and we're moving fast. The wind whips my hair around, my heart hammers in my chest, and the smile on my face never leaves. At one point, one of his hands drops from the grip to stroke my leg, then rests on top of mine clasped around his chest, and I think I could get used to this. The spontaneity, the fun, spending evenings with Johnny. There's good and bad to knowing the end point of a relationship. On the one hand, it forces you to really appreciate every moment. But on the other, each moment feels bigger than it might if you didn't know it could be the last. I guess it's just that summer is coming to an end, and I'm sad about leaving my friend. Johnny slows inside a little town and pulls off into a parking lot and kills the engine. I remove the helmet and stand on wobbly legs. What did you think? He asks taking the helmet and setting it on top of the bike. I think you're going to pick up a lot of girls driving that thing around. It's the first flash of jealousy I've had, thinking about him doing this with someone else when I'm gone. He laughs it off. Come on, let's grab dinner and have some fun. When he walks into the restaurant and gives his name, it's clear that this was not just a joyride. It's a small, cozy place, but it's packed, and obviously by reservation only. We get a table for two in the back corner, and Johnny stretches out his long legs in front of him, circling mine. He stares across at me with a smirk. What? You've got sex hair. Another plus for the bike. I run a hand along my knotted hair. I don't think there's any fixing it without a brush. I have a serious rat's nest. This is a plus? Hell yeah. Just fucked is my new favorite look on you. My body tingles and thighs clench. Um, check please. Why are we so far from the apartment where I can kiss him? The bike suddenly seems like the worst idea he's ever had. After dinner, we get back on the motorcycle, but instead of heading toward the apartment, he heads farther in the opposite direction to a bowling alley. Seriously? I ask. You bowl? This place is supposed to be fun. He slips on a baseball hat, pulls it down low on his eyes, and then takes my hand. I'm touched that he put so much effort into this, but I really shouldn't be surprised. 
Johnny is a considerate guy, and also, as it turns out, an awesome date. Again, inside, he gives his name at the desk because every lane is booked. It's dark with neon lights and upbeat music plays loudly over the sound of bowling balls knocking into the pins. A concession serves food like pretzels and pizza, and there's a full bar. We get shoes and pick out our balls, and then Johnny leads me to the bar where he orders me a Pop Rocks cocktail. It's bright blue and served in a tall glass with the candy around the rim. I take a hesitant sip. It's sweet and bubbly and delicious. He kisses me while the rocks pop in my mouth, making us both laugh. You're good at this, I say, as he punches in our names to start the game. Bowling? No. This. I motion between us. This is the best date I've ever been on. I feel the instant need to correct the word date because I'm not even sure that's what this is. Do you go on dates with your slam piece? But Johnny's smile lifts slowly. Yeah? I nod. How come you don't date more? He shoots me a look and laughs it off. I'm serious. In the two years that I've known you, I've never heard you talk about going out with a girl and doing something like this. I haven't. Not really. I was pretty content hanging with my boys in Valley. He smiles. And you and the girls. I wonder how things will change now that he's left the college atmosphere behind. After I go, he'll spend more time with his team and meet new people. New girls. Lots of girls. I'm getting to see this side of him he hasn't shown anyone else yet, and I feel fiercely protective over it. You're up first, he says, and leans back. Show me what you got. What I have isn't much. I'm a terrible bowler, but too competitive to give up after the first game where he destroys me. We start the second, and I decide to go with distraction and frustration to beat my opponent. It's my turn, and I walk in front of him, sticking out my butt in exaggerated form. I only manage to hit three pins, but when I turn around, he's chuckling, brows raised. It's going to be like that, huh? Like what? I play innocent as I take a seat next to him and reach across him, brushing my boobs against his arm as I get my drink. It's my third. They aren't very strong, but the pop rocks are fun. He licks the side of my drink and then kisses me. His tongue sweeps in and tangles with mine. The sweet candy pops and tingles. I'm breathless when he pulls back. His voice deepens and his gaze pins me in place. Two can play that game, Coda. Neither of us moves. The air between us feels thick. He cups the back of my neck and kisses me again. His hand travels over my shoulder, down my arm, and to my thigh, where he inches along the hem of my dress. I hold my breath as his fingers disappear underneath and brush against my panties. It's dark, and we're sitting so close that I'm not worried about anyone seeing, but I glance around to make sure no one is looking this way anyway. His thumb makes a slow circle over my clit. My body shakes as he pushes one finger under the lacy material. You should have worn a dress, I say, as I dig my fingernails into the denim covering his thighs. No fucking kidding. I slide my hand higher and he groans. My panties fall back in place as he stops what he was doing and stands. Let's go. He takes my hand and heads off. I think we're leaving and grab my purse, but he leads me down a hallway to the bathrooms. I try to drop his hand as he enters the one labeled men's, but he pulls me through and shuts the door. As soon as I'm inside, he backs me against it and kisses me hard. Then he lifts me by the waist and I wrap my legs around him. His bulge hits at the perfect spot. My eyes fall closed as he grinds into me. When my orgasm is close, I scramble to undo his pants, and he pulls a condom from his wallet and then helps me push his jeans and boxers down far enough that his cock springs free. Every move is frantic. He covers himself, 
shoves the soaked material of my panties aside and pushes inside of me. We both cry out with such relief. I hang on to his neck, burying my face and breathing him in as he fucks me against the bathroom door. He murmurs quietly, You're mine. I can't believe you're really mine. And I relish in the feeling of being his, even if it's only for a short time. The next week goes by in a blur of orgasms and laughter. We hit happy hour with Jack and Declan one night, and another night we video chat with our friends from Valley. It's a happy little bubble. Friends in public, and then kissing every second we're behind closed doors. I know it can't last much longer, but I've done an impressive job not worrying about it and just enjoying the time together. Friday evening, I'm getting ready for the gala while talking to Reagan, Ginny, and Sienna. Your makeup looks A+, Ginny says, giving me a thumbs up. I learned from the best, I tell her. She is the makeup queen. Reagan, how's my hair? Big and badass. Put on the dress, Sienna says. I smile at their eager faces on the screen of my phone. I miss them. Okay, one second. It's hanging in the closet. Maverick has been trying to sneak a glance at which dress I picked all week. He had so many options sent over, I was a little overwhelmed. All different colors and cuts, all my size. I think he's going to be surprised by my selection. I slide the silky material over my head and ease up the zipper on one side. I walk back to my bedroom where my phone is propped up on my bed. What do you think? Ginny gasps and Reagan's jaw drops. Damn, Dakota, Sienna says finally. Not too much. I smooth my hand over the skirt. It's lacy and sort of poofy and girly and nothing that I ever would have picked out. It's perfect. You are stunning. Are you wearing your red converse? Ginny asks. Nope. I kick up a foot to show her the red strappy shoes I bought. Still red, just a little sexier. It's like I don't even recognize you. Reagan holds a hand over her heart. I knew there was a vixen in there dying to dress up for the right guy. Maverick prefers me undressed, I say, and then my face goes hot. I've been careful to draw a line between how much I tell our friends. When I go back, I don't want it to be weird for anyone. I should go. He's probably waiting. Take pictures, Reagan yells. I want to see you two together. I'll see what I can do. We're still walking the careful line of being friends in public, but not making it obvious, where I grapple with how to describe our relationship. Tearing into one another on the regular, Sienna asks with a smug grin. Something like that. I pick up my phone and my clutch for the night. I'll call you guys later. I kiss the air and end the call. I glance in the bathroom mirror one last time. I hope I didn't overdo it. Coda. You ready? Johnny calls from the living room, right on cue. One second, I yell, blow out a breath, and walk my vixen badass self out to the living room. Chapter 31 Johnny I'm staring down at the text my dad sent an hour ago, trying to figure out how the fuck to feel about him showing up tonight for the gala. On the one hand, he paid the ridiculous plate fee in support of the cause, which tonight is underprivileged youth. Still, it doesn't escape me that his travel plans include rolling in an hour before the gala and leaving first thing tomorrow morning. Distracted and annoyed, I've nearly forgotten that I've been dying to see which dress Dakota picked out for tonight, until she steps out into the living room. The fucking world stops. At least my heart does. Her red hair is curled and her makeup is heavier than normal. Bright red lipstick that I'm definitely hoping to have all over me tonight coats her lips and contrasts with the black dress. I was hoping you'd pick this one, I say, walking slowly toward her. You were. She runs a hand along the fluffy skirt. 
it's like nothing I've ever worn before. It has the same straps as that little black dress you wore to the Frozen Four party. She smiles. I wondered if that's why you chose this one. You'd have looked killer in anything. What about you? She rests a hand on the lapel of my maroon jacket. This suit is, well, it's something. You clean up nice. Don't worry, baby. Still the same dirty boy underneath. Respectable on the outside, little less so on the inside. I like you the same either way, she says. And it means more than she could know. I never feel like I have to be anything but myself around her. Sure, she might roll her eyes or whatever, but the next second, she's smiling and staying despite whatever dumb shit I said or did. Should we go? In a minute. I take her hand and force her to do a spin for me. Damn, I feel like the luckiest guy alive showing up with you and getting to come home with you. Maybe even sneaking into a closet somewhere during dinner. I bring her body against mine and let my hands wander. Three feet of distance, she warns. That's her new rule anytime we're at the arena together or out with friends. We can be close, like friends, but not so close we can touch. I may have been the one that needed that rule. I can't help it. When she's standing next to me, I want to touch her. Maybe we should just walk in hand in hand and march right up to Blythe and tell her we're together. You're kidding, right? Her blue eyes widen and she studies my face to gauge my seriousness. I shrug a shoulder. Summer is almost over and you said they were cool about the whole Jack thing. Because I swore I wasn't dating him. Yeah, I guess so. Johnny, I get it. I would love to be able to hold your hand all night. But we cannot tell them. Two more weeks. That's all I have left. I don't know if she means with the job or me. Okay, if that's what you want. But the second we get home tonight, I wrap one of her red curls around my finger. You're all mine. Maverick. Sorry, boys, I snagged the hottest date. Attached picture of Maverick and Dakota, Dakota's pressing a kiss to his cheek. Pain. Looking sharp, buddy. Scott. Thumbs up emoji. Rothrus. You're definitely dating up. Maverick. Oh, like you're one to talk, Rothrus. Rothrus. Picture of Sienna lying on his chest, smiling at him. Noted. Don't care. Rothrus. Also, we're coming up next weekend before Dakota heads back. Dinner? Somewhere nice. Maverick. Sounds good. I know a place. Send me your travel deets. You can stay at my place and crash in my room. I'll bunk up with Coda for a night or two. It's a real inconvenience. My dad is coming tonight, I say as we cross the street to the arena. He is. I nod and adjust my cuffs. I just found out about an hour ago. What about your mom? Nah, she's in Italy for the next month. She has a sister there. My aunt, I guess, although I don't really know her. Did she come to the Frozen Four or the party at Valley after? No, she was in... I think back. She's always traveling somewhere. Fuck, I don't remember. You don't talk about them a lot. Not much to say. They live their life in Chicago and traveling the world, and I'm here. Occasionally, they drop in. Usually when it benefits the company somehow. I don't mean to sound bitter, but I guess I am. She takes my hand and squeezes. I'm sorry. I lace my fingers with hers, wishing I could hold on all night long. It's fine. They're busy running an empire. The gal is held in a suite at the arena that's been transformed for the event. Cocktail tables are set up around the room's perimeter, and a live band plays in one corner. I spot Deck near the bar, and Dakota and I walk toward him. She's serious about her three feet rule. Every time I step closer, she moves another step away. Two feet? I turn my head and whisper. Three feet. She smiles. You're terrible at following the rules. It's a stupid rule. Hey, you two. Declan greets us. Got roped into suffering through this tonight, too, huh? It isn't so bad, I say. He grunts. They all start to look the same after a while. I see some of the other interns, Dakota says. I'll see you guys later. She walks off and I watch her go not even trying to hide it. When she disappears behind a crowd of people, I turn my attention back to Declan and find him grinning at me. What? The whole kiss cam thing moved you to action, I see. 
I don't know what you mean. I get a beer from the bar and take a long drink. Oh, please, you've been circling each other all summer. I don't confirm or deny it, but he huffs a laugh and says, Relax, I don't care, and I won't say anything. What about you? I haven't seen you with anyone. Do you have a girlfriend you keep chained to the bed in your apartment? Or boyfriend? Nah, too busy right now. It's the last year on my contract. The next one I sign needs to take me into a nice retirement. I lift my beer. Cheers to that. There's no dancing, which is a real shame because I love to have an excuse to wrap my arms around Dakota. I convince her to sit with me during dinner, but she's mingling around the room until then, and I'm avoiding my dad. As soon as he walked into the room, he started chatting up Coach Miller and Brad Albert, the president and CEO. I'm with some of the guys on the team, smiling for photos when he finally decides to approach me. I thank the photographer and walk over to where he stands waiting for me. Hey, you made it, I say, adjusting my cuffs. He shakes my hand. Just got a tour. Not a bad arena here. It's a little smaller than the one in Chicago, but not bad. Sorry it doesn't live up to your expectations. I grip my teeth. One sentence out of his mouth and already I feel like I'm bracing for a puck to the face. He laughs it off and squeezes my shoulder. Let's get a drink. My dad has this way about him where no one is a stranger, and he's totally at ease in any situation. He works the room like he's the most important person here. I plaster on a smile and keep a fresh beer in my hand at all times. When they start to bring out dinner, we take our seats, and I let out a long breath. Dad's on one side of me and Dakota is on the other. I've never been happier to have her next to me. She brings Quinn, ever eager to look like just another intern, and Jack joins us too. Dad, this is Dakota. She worked on the endorsement. I make the introduction, placing my hand on her elbow. I'm thankful for an excuse to touch her. Ah, he says, nodding politely. You're responsible for the photos of my son taking a shower. He makes a face, one I've seen often, disapproval dripping from it. She inhales sharply and her cheeks dot with pink, and I want to punch him in the jaw. They are hygiene products, I say. Yes, yes, I know. We're looking to go in a different direction. Something a little classier, upscale. He waves a hand and picks up his scotch. Something like that ad you did for Givenchy, Jack. Now that was a good ad. That was for a clothing company, I say. It isn't anywhere near the same thing. He makes a dismissive humming noise. I like the photos we got. Dakota did a good job. Even the head of publicity here said so. It's fine. Dakota shoots me a wide-eyed glare and her lips pull into a brittle smile. The campaign should fit the brand. See? She gets it. Dad winks at her. I brought a couple of suit options with me tonight. Maybe after dinner we can snap a few pictures, see if we can get something nailed down. Is he for real? Well, that explains a sudden desire to see his son. He needed something for his company. I push back my chair with a loud scrape against the floor. Excuse me, I'm going to get another drink. Dakota's heels click-clack behind me as she tries to keep up. She whisper hisses my name. Johnny, Johnny. I don't stop until I get into the hallway. She starts to reach for me and then stops herself, which just further pisses me off. I don't want any rules on when and where I can touch her, especially not right now. He wouldn't know a good campaign if it hit him upside his head. It's bullshit. Johnny, it's fine. You worked your ass off on that campaign, and it's good. I'm not just saying that. I should have listened to what they wanted. I had my own vision, and it didn't meet the client's expectations. That's on me. She might be playing it off like it's fine, but I know she's upset. I want to kiss you right now, I say, bringing my hand up to her cheek and grazing it with the back of my fingers. I want to kiss you always. Johnny. She leans into my touch and then steps back. We should get back inside. I'm not reshooting the campaign. It's bullshit. You signed a contract. Fuck that. She laughs quietly. Don't be pissed on my account. Seriously, I am proud of that shoot. Do I wish they loved it as much as I did? Of course, but they didn't, and it's their call. It's fucking bullshit. She takes a step in. Three feet, young lady. I joke, wrapping an arm around her waist and pulling her flush against me. She drops a quick kiss to my lips and wiggles out of my hold. I'll see you inside. 
The rest of dinner goes by smoothly, because I keep my mouth occupied with food and alcohol. I answer direct questions from my dad in grunts and focus on Dakota. As soon as the dishes are cleared, he stands and rests a hand on my shoulder. Shall we, son? I grind down on my molars, but Dakota places a hand on my thigh under the table and squeezes. I follow him, downing the rest of my drink on my way to a room down the hall. It's set up with a backdrop and lighting, and the photographer is waiting for us. I'm pissed that he made it seem like he was coming to see me, when really he was dropping in to get something for his company, something I don't want to give him. Blythe smiles at me as I step into the room. If you need anything, let me know. I'll be right outside. Dad thanks her and I shrug out of my jacket and untuck my shirt. There's a row of shirts and jackets hanging on a rack, traditional cuts and expensive fabrics. Each one looks exactly like something my dad would and does wear. They reek of money and importance. They're nice, but I don't see how they're going to sell body wash. I dress and stand in front of the backdrop. The photographer snaps a couple of photos and I blink back the flashing dots. I tug at the collar, wishing I could rip off the bow tie, lose the jacket and roll up my sleeves. I can do formal, but right now my skin crawls. This whole situation just pisses me off. I catch Dakota standing in the doorway with Blythe. She smiles at me, twisting her fingers in front of her. She's so goddamn beautiful and fucking perfect. I want her. Not just for the summer. Longer. So much longer. And I'm tired of not being able to tell the world. How much better would tonight be if I could have her by my side for everyone to see? A little bit less of a smile, my dad says, wiping whatever smile was there off my lips. I didn't even realize I was smiling, but I guess staring at Dakota does that to me. Can we Photoshop his hands later? My dad asks. The tattoos are distracting. I glance down at the small amount of ink visible. That's it. I've reached my limit. I stand and undo the bow tie, unbutton the shirt. I'm not doing this, I tell him. Doing what? This. I pull off the jacket and toss it toward the rack. Pretending to be this guy you want me to be. Someone rushes to pick it up and place it on a hanger and I feel like a dick for throwing a tantrum. My dad sighs and lowers his voice. What the hell does that even mean? Sit down. You don't want me in this campaign. You want some version of me that doesn't exist. Someone who wears suits every day and doesn't have tattoos. Someone like you. Don't be ridiculous. The campaign was great. Dakota's ideas were amazing. But you can't see that because they highlighted too much of me. It isn't the direction we want. Why? Because it showed the real me? Highlighted all the things you don't want me to be and are embarrassed to be associated with? I'm a tattooed hockey player who prefers being shirtless to wearing suits. That's who I am, and you're not going to change me to fit your agenda. You don't want me in your campaign, and I don't want to be, okay? Find someone else to be the face of Maverick Corporation's sack spray. I'm tired of apologizing to him for who I am. I spent the last two years finally feeling free of those expectations with people who accepted me. I'm not wasting another second trying to be anything but who I am. A hockey player? A joker, a guy who thinks tattoos are badass, someone who thinks life shouldn't be taken too seriously, and a guy falling in love with a girl who makes him feel like all of that is okay. Chapter 32 Dakota We say hurried goodbyes and walk back to the apartment. Johnny's quiet as we ride the elevator. I don't know exactly what was said between him and his dad, but I know that it resulted in Johnny storming off the photo shoot, and that alone makes me want to scream at John Maverick Sr. Since I can't do that, I hug Johnny's side. Are you okay? He nods and presses a kiss to my temple. He takes Charlie for a quick walk while I pace the apartment, brainstorming how to cheer him up. I grab... Every bottle of lube he owns, more condoms than any two people could possibly use in a single night, my vibrator that has seen little action this summer thanks to Johnny, a bottle of Magdog from the kitchen, and my laptop. I'm browsing porn when he gets back, and at the sounds coming from my computer, he lifts a brow. What you got going on over there? I wave a hand in front of the coffee table. I thought to myself... How does one cheer up Johnny Maverick? 
He drops onto the couch beside me, chuckling, and slides his arm around my waist, holding me close to him. I lift the hem of my dress and straddle him. The video playing is of a couple taking a vacation and, according to the very succinct description, having a threesome with, gasp, the maid. Not very original, but it was the best I could find on short notice. We should go on a day trip tomorrow. Drive out to the lake or somewhere. Just the two of us, and Charlie, of course. I start on the buttons of his shirt, and he leans back into the cushion. Okay. His expression is still broody, but he shifts to pull out the hem of his shirt and groans as I glide my palms along his chest. I lean forward and kiss the spot over his heart and then unbutton his pants. Scooting back, I drop to my knees in front of him and grab the tingling lube. I finally get another light chuckle as I free his dick and gasp in exaggerated, porn-worthy fashion. The video is past all the cheesy talking and the couple starts having sex. Feminine moans fill the apartment. Johnny's gaze flits to the screen, but instead of holding there while I take him into my mouth, he uses his foot to close the lid of the laptop and then he threads his fingers through my hair gently. Not doing it for you? You can pick another video. Right now, the only sexy little sounds I want to hear are the ones coming out of your mouth. Come here. His hands lift me gently by the neck until I'm back straddling him. He covers himself with a condom and then guides me down onto him. Johnny. His name comes out with a whimper. We both go still. I drop my forehead to his, feeling so full of him I can't breathe. He lifts my chin with a thumb, staring into my eyes with an expression that makes my heart race and my pussy clench around him. Thank you for wanting to make this shitty night better, but it already is just being here with you. He places a soft kiss on my lips, and his voice softens and comes out gruff. This is perfect. You're perfect. A lump forms in my throat, and the back of my eyes burn. I don't know what to say, so I lavish him with kisses, and then bite his bicep playfully to lighten the moment. He responds by slanting his mouth over mine and holding me hostage with the sweetest, toe-curling kiss. He holds me close as he continues to slowly lift my hips and drive into me from below at a pace that's unhurried and savoring. Sex with Johnny is always consuming in a way it never has been with anyone else, but tonight is different. It's intimate and real. I moan into his mouth as I fall apart around him, and he whispers, Perfect. I wake up early, naked and smiling, to Johnny's deep voice. Morning, baby. The bed dips, and he drapes an arm across my waist. Wake up, gorgeous. It's Saturday, I murmur, snuggling Charlie closer to my chest. We want to sleep in. No can do. Charlie's got a hot date, and so do you. I pry my eyes open, ready to joke about not seeing a hot date anywhere, but that would be a lie. Johnny's shirtless, and well, he's hot. Our day date? I ask, a wave of excitement washing over me to get out and spend the day with him. Can I wear what I have on? I ask, dropping the sheet to flash him my naked body. He drops a kiss to each nipple. Cover these up. Then he places a tender kiss on my lower stomach. And this. They're mine. He stands, lifts his arms, and pushes his thumb and pointer finger together to make a window, then looks at me through it like he's memorizing the moment. I love when he does that. You're a hard woman to resist, but I have a surprise. I'm going to take Charlie upstairs. Declan is going to watch her for the night. Why? Where are we going? He grins and rubs his hands together. Pack a bag, little lady. We're going to Vegas. We take a mid-morning flight, arriving in Las Vegas a few hours later. Johnny dons a twin's hat instead of the usual Wildcats one he wears and sunglasses. 
He might be trying for incognito, but people still stare at him like he's someone famous. I guess he is. Inside our suite, I gape and walk around, taking it all in. A living area with couches and a dining table and small kitchenette, and a separate bedroom that's as large as my apartment with Reagan and Jenny back in Valley. Johnny Maverick, what did you do? He chuckles. Like it? Like? It's amazing. I walk to the window where a view of the strip lies below. It's going to look incredible at night with all the lights. What do you want to do first? He asks, joining me by the window and wrapping his arms around my lower back. We only have one day, and I want to see it all, and leave plenty of time to enjoy this room later. After walking through the casino downstairs, we head outside and cruise the strip and malls. We go into stores where Johnny insists on buying me things no matter how much I try to protest. I get new shoes, sunglasses, a blinged-out trucker-style hat that made him laugh, and a necklace with a star charm on it that he surprised me with. I didn't even see him buy it. It's gold with what I hope aren't diamonds in the center, but knowing Johnny... I'm sure they are. Oh, we gotta get one last thing. He's wearing my many shopping bags around his arms. No more, I say. I don't need anything else. Need and want. Totally different things. He winks. You need and want this one, though. Trust. Somehow, he fishes out his wallet and gets us two large drinks the size of my arm with bright yellow crazy straws. Well, that looks dangerous, I say, and taste it. Oh, wow. Hello, I'm drunk. He laughs and takes a sip of his. Sweet and strong, like you. We continue strolling through the city, drinking and laughing until the sun starts to fall. Back at the hotel, we shower together, and then I shoo him out of the bathroom to get ready. It's been a day of him surprising me, but tonight, I have one for him. I peek out of the bedroom into the living area. He's parked in front of the TV, looking seriously hot in a white button-down with the sleeves rolled up his forearms. His dark hair is styled and free of the hat he wore all day. I'm silent, but his gaze slides over to the doorway and he sits up. Ready? I ask. Always. He stands as I walk out, moving toward me in slow, measured steps while his gaze rakes over me. The black dress finally makes another appearance. It's a simple dress. I think I paid all of $40 for it, but it's short and tight, and, well, the way he looks at me... I feel like a million bucks. I paired it with my red Converse because they just felt like me. Fuck, Coda. He makes a circle around me. I had big plans of showing you off downstairs, but now... He stretches his hands out around my waist. Maybe we should stay in. Or maybe a little delayed gratification will make it hotter. Hotter? His brows raise. Baby, I don't know if you've noticed, but I run hot. I might have noticed. And you. He cups my ass and takes my mouth, pressing a far softer kiss on my lips than his grip and words suggested. You're a rocket, and I just want to hold on tight and let the flames melt my face off. I laugh at his ridiculous words. He moves to the dining table and pulls a bottle of champagne out of a bucket of ice. Do you want a drink before we go? I bite my lip. Maybe we save it for after? His eyes darken. You're killing me. I'll make it up to you later, I promise. He doesn't drop my hand all night. We play a few games, but mostly we drink and engage in public displays of affection that have been so limited in Minnesota— being his date or girlfriend or whatever I am is fun. So much fun. Having all of Johnny's attention for the world to see is not something I think I'll ever get enough of. I do have a niggling worry in the back of my mind that someone might recognize him and post a picture of us, 
but I push it away and just enjoy our time away. Once we get back, I only have two weeks left of the internship, and then goodbye Wildcats and Maverick. I'm happily drunk and enjoying his big hand splayed out on my lower back while we sit at the bar on the lobby level of our hotel. I feel like doing something crazy, I say. It must be the Vegas air. I think it's the alcohol. We should feed you. I'm not hungry. I drag my fingernails across the top of his thigh. He groans and throws back the rest of his drink. Can I get you another? The bartender is quick to take the empty glass. Two shots of Rumplemans, Johnny says. That's my favorite shot, I squeal. Almost like I ordered it on purpose, he chuckles, and I realize I'm definitely drunk. My face is hot, and I feel so free and happy. Four shots, I call out. Johnny's mouth twists into an amused smirk. The bartender sets the four shots of the clear liquid in front of us. Johnny picks up one and hands it to me and then takes the other. His knees close my legs in on either side and he leans forward. To getting to spend the day with you and touching you anytime I want. He places a kiss on my lips and then takes the shot. I do the same, enjoying the minty liquid on my tongue. On the opposite side of the bar, a man with gray hair walks up a girl on each arm. They are young and beautiful, and their combined age probably doesn't equal his. But the three of them look perfectly content as he orders drinks, and the women hang on either arm like accessories. Look, it's you in 40 years, I joke. He laughs it off. What's the craziest thing you've ever done? He gets a deer in headlights look, like maybe he doesn't want to tell me. Threesome? Foursome? Three is plenty of people. After that, it starts to feel a little gangbangy for me. He juts his chin. What about you? What's the craziest thing you've ever done? I don't know. I'm a little embarrassed to tell him it's probably one of the many times he's gotten me off in public. My sexual experiences have been far less exciting than his, and for reasons I refuse to think about, I want him to think of me, too, when he thinks about all the crazy, fun times he's had. I want to be his number one. I have an idea, I say, heart racing before I've even told him. What's that? His lips caress my shoulder as he waits for my answer. Let's do something crazy. I mean, we are in Vegas. If we can't top both of our lists tonight, then we're not trying hard enough. His deep laughter boosts my excitement. Think of the possibilities. Sex in public, or maybe a sex club. Are those really a thing? Ooh, what about a threesome? We'll have to figure out how to make that crazier than a foursome, but I believe in us. His head lifts slowly, and he studies my face. You're serious? You want to have a threesome? I thought you weren't into the whole idea. And I thought you'd jump at the chance to add another person to our sexcapades. Seriously, I thought Johnny would be all about a threesome, especially with me after I've given him so much crap about it. Do you not want to? You should do it if it's something you're curious about, and of course I'd want to be there to experience it with you. You're a pretty great guy, Johnny Maverick. Agreeing to a threesome doesn't exactly make me a saint. You underestimate yourself a lot. I rest my hands along his forearms. This summer, hanging out with you, the fun, the sex, I start to choke up. Jesus, I must be drunker than I thought. It's meant a lot to me. Same. I don't want it to end. Be mine after the summer. His arms circle around my middle and squeeze until I'm basically in his lap. What? My heart races. But I'll be in Valley and you'll be in Minnesota. So what? I could be a baller long-distance boyfriend. Johnny, I... My head spins. Just 
think about it, okay? I nod, pick up the last two glasses, and hand him one. To doing something crazy. We leave the bar drunk and giggly and go up to the club on the top floor. The music is loud and we get lost in each other, moving to the rhythm, hands roaming. I'd call it dancing, but if there wasn't music, it'd just be called foreplay. Ready to get our crazy on? I ask him. All right. A threesome for the lady. You're sure you want to do this? Yeah, it'll be fun. I want to know what the big deal is. Okay, then. What's your type, baby? I don't know. I look around at all the beautiful girls. I'm easy, apparently, because I can picture kissing any number of them. But the second I picture their grubby paws on Maverick, I'm rethinking this idea. Take your time. The night is young. There's another club next door. Maybe we can find some other ways to make this night the craziest yet. Want to take a walk? I lace my fingers with his and we leave the hotel. Heat radiates off the sidewalk. From inside me, too. I'm bubbling with energy and lust and so many emotions I feel like I might burst with it all. We get in the back of a line for a dance club. We're waiting outside, neither of us really caring that we're not inside. I'm turned around, not paying attention to the line, as I kiss Maverick. I have never been a clingy partner, but I'm flush against him and still can't seem to get close enough. The girl in line behind him clears her throat, and I look up to see the people in front of me have moved and were holding up the line. Sorry, I say. It's okay. She smiles and tosses her shiny black hair over one shoulder. If I had one of those... I wouldn't need to go inside the club. Johnny ducks his head bashfully, playing it off with a small grin. I bite my lip and look at him to see if he's thinking what I am. She's beautiful and curvy, and knowing how much Maverick likes boobs, he'll be able to dive right into the double D's she's sporting. I feel a little ragey about the two of them touching, but fair is fair. I know how a threesome works. Maybe it'll be hot watching them together. Then again, perhaps I'll toss her out. Game time decision. Why don't you go ahead of us? He says. Need to chat with my girlfriend. He pulls me out of the line. Where are we going? I ask, stretching my legs to keep up with him. She was perfect. Don't you think so? He runs a hand through his hair. She was gorgeous, yeah. Let's ask her to come back to our room. That's what you want? Yes. I laugh at his resistance. You want me to kiss her. Fuck her. I ball my hands into fists at my side. As long as I get to be a part of it. He takes my hand and places it over his heart. I'd do anything for you, Coda. But don't ask me to do this. You don't want to any more than I do. Boring Dakota didn't, but drunk fun Dakota does. You've had threesomes. I want to know what it was like. It was impersonal, and he struggles for words. Hot? Yeah, sure, that too, I guess, but it wasn't anywhere close to being as amazing as it is with us. What you and I have is special. I try to laugh it off, but he won't let me. I'm serious, baby. If you need to do it so you understand, then I want to be there. But not tonight. Today is about us. I just want you. I throw my hands up in the air. We're supposed to be having a wild and crazy summer. This all feels too heavy right now, and that isn't what we signed up for. Fun, casual and fleeting. Best summer of my life. I wouldn't change a thing about it. Relief washes over me, and I know there'll be no threesome happening tonight. Maybe someday, but not when I'm holding on to the days left with him like sand slipping through my fingers. He's right. Tonight is just about us. He kisses me and then leans his forehead against mine. 
I do have another wild and crazy idea, though, if you're up for it. It would top the list for sure. Does it include sex? Because this day has been one big cock tease. His laughter tickles my face. It sure does. But first, want to get hitched? Chapter 33 Johnny Dakota laughs. Okay, not the reaction I was hoping for. You're serious. Her cheeks are flushed from the hot Vegas night. Yeah, let's get married in Vegas. It'll be awesome, and then I can fuck my hot wife upstairs in our room. You can fuck your hot slam piece anytime you want. No paperwork necessary. Wild and crazy, remember? She keeps looking at me like she thinks I'm going to change my mind. I'm so serious. She grins. I don't know. Be mine, Coda. All mine. She glances back at the chapel. This is crazy. Exactly, I say. Sex against the window in our hotel suite as Mr. and Mrs. I'm not sure it gets crazier than that. You're insane. Probably, I agree. Marry me anyway? She shakes her head side to side, and a slow smile spreads across her face until she's grinning up at me. Let's do it. Really? My chest expands. Yeah, when in Rome. She waves a hand. Or in this case, Vegas. We giggle all the way to the chapel. It's busy, but I'm able to slip some extra cash to the lady at the desk and get us to the front of the line. This might have been my best idea yet. Do you have a ring? She asks as we're picking out packages. They have everything. Dresses, flowers, photos, the works. Ah, uh, shit. A ring. I don't need one, Dakota says. She steps closer. Absolutely do not buy me a ring for a fake wedding, Johnny Maverick. I pull the hair tie from her wrist and loop it around her ring finger three times. That'll do for now. And it's a real wedding? Last chance to back out. No way, this place is amazing. I wish I had some white chucks. She kicks the heels of her red converse together twice. It's gaudy and smells like cigarette smoke in here, but I don't care. Dakota opts for no flowers but picks out a veil that clips into her hair and drapes down to her shoulders. You never dreamed of having a big wedding? We wait at the back of the chapel for the couple in front of us to finish their ceremony. No. Her voice is quiet. When my mom died, I struggled to picture a wedding day without her there with me, you know? I do, in a weird sort of way. Can you imagine what my dad would say if I called him and told him to hop in his jet for a Vegas elopement? She cups my cheek. It's his loss. You're a good man. When it's our turn, Dakota and I walk up to the front and stand looking at one another as the guy talks about love and marriage. I'm only half listening because I'm lost in her. She's gorgeous. The black dress of my dreams and that white veil clipped into her red hair. Her cheeks are flushed and she smiles at me so big that my heart thumps loudly in my chest. Mine. One word that sums up exactly how I feel about her. Mine. Not because I want to keep her all to myself, though for the rest of the night that's exactly what I plan to do. But because there's no piece of her that I don't want to know. I want all her words and every inch of her body. Her thoughts. Her dreams. All her fantasies. I want to know them and I want to make them come true for her. The man stops talking and looks at me. Oh, right. That's my cue. I do. I wink at my bride. He starts in on his spiel again, this time facing Dakota. I hold my breath. This is it. It didn't occur to me until right now that this summer might not have been as epic for her as it has been for me. Maybe she doesn't want to be mine and everything that comes with it. I do, she says, and bites her lip like she's trying to keep herself from laughing. I kiss her before the guy finishes pronouncing us husband and wife, then pick her up and carry her out of the chapel to recessional music. Outside, underneath the lights of Vegas, I place her feet on the ground. My chest feels so full staring at her and seeing her mirror back everything I'm feeling in her expression. I lean down and whisper, 
so much better than a threesome. She throws her arms around my neck and kisses me. Neither of us seems to be able to stop. We're a smiling, giggling, kissing spectacle as we hurry back to the hotel. Oh my God, did we just do that for real? She asks when we get into the room, and she sees herself in the mirror. Yep, wifey. I drop a kiss on her shoulder. Husband? Her fingers work the buttons on my shirt, and she slides it off my shoulders. I hold still as she undresses me at a slow, torturous pace. She runs her fingernails down my stomach and cups my balls. They're heavy with lust, and my dick leaks as she starts to get on her knees. Uh-uh, I say. Turn around and place your hands on the window. Her eyes spark with desire. She does as I command, and I make her wait, popping the champagne and bringing the bottle with me. Open, I say as I get close. Her perfect red lips part. I take a long drink and then spit it into her mouth. It drips down her face and onto her cleavage. I push up her dress until the black material bunches at her waist and drop to my knees to place a kiss on her ass while I work down her panties. I cover myself with a condom and stand tall. Can I borrow your wedding ring, wifey? She giggles and pulls the hair tie off her ring finger. I place the tie around her wrists, smiling at the red rubber band. Hands together, on the window. A fucking hair ties a wedding band. Yeah, she's definitely going to need something a little flashier, but it was the perfect solution at the moment, and fits us, somehow. That little hair tie has seen some things. She moans as I push inside of her from behind. All. Mine. I nip at her neck around the lacy veil, enjoying the feel of its cheap, scratchy material as I pump in and out of her. It may have been a drunken decision, but it feels like the best one I've ever made. I wake with a champagne hangover and a smile on my face. Dakota is wrapped around me, her red hair fanning out on my chest. Her dress never made it all the way off, neither did her shoes. We were a fucking mess last night. I grab my phone to check the time and then snap a picture of her long legs tangled up with mine and her hand, complete with new finger accessory, in view on my chest. She stirs with a cute little groan. Wakey, wakey, wifey. I place a kiss on the crown of her head. Gotta leave for the airport soon. She curls into my chest. Oh, my head is pounding. Her voice is husky with sleep. What the hell did we do last night? Just the usual. I slip from bed and grab some Tylenol and water for her as she sits up. Drank her asses off, almost had a threesome, and then decided to get hitched instead. I kiss her and drop both medicine and water on the bed in front of her. Her lips don't move under mine, and when I stand tall, she's staring at me with a weird expression. Did you say, get hitched? I point at her head and she runs a hand over the veil as if she can't believe what she's feeling. She gasps audibly, rushes to her feet, and goes to the mirror. You don't remember? I sit on the edge of the bed as I pull my t-shirt over my head. I remember drinking rumple mints, then dancing and standing in line at another club. She trails off, rubbing the lace of the veil as she studies the floor. I wanted to bring that girl back for a threesome and then... She looks at her finger and the red rubber band on it and squeezes her eyes shut. Oh my gosh, Johnny. She pulls the veil from her hair. How are you not freaking out? I shrug because I don't know how to answer that. I knew she'd been drinking, but I guess I didn't realize how drunk she was. I was drunk, but I knew what I was doing. I'd do it all again, too. Last night was incredible. I wouldn't change any of it. You want to be married to me? We aren't even together. I mean, not really. This was supposed to be a summer fling. I told you last night I want you to be mine. I think we skipped a few steps. I could be your girlfriend, for starters. Girlfriend, wife. I shrug. Seriously, Maverick, what are we going to do? You are a professional hockey player who has assets to protect, and I'm... Oh, God, my internship. Breathe, baby. I rub her shoulders. 
I'm not worried about my assets. You wouldn't even let me buy you a real ring last night. I doubt you're going to clear out my bank account when I'm not looking. And this actually helps your internship. They can't fire you if you're married to a player. She needs her forehead with two fingers. I know this is hard for you to understand, but I need them to believe I'm the right person for the job because of my work, and not because I tricked some hot hockey guy into letting me work his endorsement and then married him to keep my job. You and I both know that isn't how it went down. But that's what they'll think. I've never cared much what other people think. Her eyes fall closed again, and her chest rises and falls with each deep breath. We should keep this between us until we figure out what to do. All right. Little bit of a kick in the gut to see her second guess being with me. When we get back, we'll figure it out together, okay? Let me bask in my newlywed glow a little longer. I can't believe you'd want to be married to me. She melts in my arms and I hold on tight. Easily. The best decision I ever made. We get back Sunday afternoon and lie around the rest of the night. Monday morning, Dakota is up with the sun, lacing her sneakers and taking Charlie for a run. She hasn't said anything else about her Vegas wedding, but I know she's still spinning. I'm making her smoothie when she walks through the front door, sweaty and red-faced. She lets Charlie off the leash and my girls move toward me. For you? I hand her a glass and then set Charlie's food bowl on the floor. And for you. Thanks. She sets it on the counter. I need to catch my breath first. I'm out of shape. It hurts. When you ran track, what distance did you do? The 800 was my best event. High school stay record. I grin. How come you quit? She shrugs, picks up the glass, and moves into the living room to sit in the leather recliner. Avoiding. Interesting. I always assumed she quit because being a college athlete is a lot of fucking work. Coda? I sit across from her on the couch and kick up my feet on the coffee table. Wifey? She glares at the last endearment. Come on, tell me. I've never heard you talk about it, but you obviously still love to run. Was it too much with school? Bad coach? She meets my gaze on my last guess. Bad coach, I repeat. Good coach. Bad human. I raise my brows, waiting for her to elaborate. She sighs. If I tell you, you have to promise to never mention it again. Ever. Charlie trots in and lies at her feet. We'll see. I'm not promising anything until I know the details. When I was in high school, I had a close relationship with my track coach. Adrenaline starts coursing through me. I don't know where this is going, but I already know I'm going to be pissed. He was good to me. He stayed late and came in on weekends to help me improve. He was young, in his mid-thirties, and all the girls thought he was hot. We called him Coach Hottie. God, we were so young and naive. She stares into her lap. I stay quiet, grinding down on my molars. One night after the last track meet of my senior year, he asked me to come to his office. Up until the very minute it started, I convinced myself that any romantic vibes I was getting from him were just my overactive teenage brain. Once he started undressing me, I don't know. I can't explain it. I was horrified and realized how stupid I'd been. My jaw feels like glass, and rage like I've never felt before builds in my chest. The fucker raped you? No. Her voice hardens. I stopped him before it went that far, but I was so ashamed. I totally flirted with him and was inappropriate, so I don't blame him for thinking I wanted him. But you have to believe me when I say I never thought it would go anywhere. Tears fill her eyes. After my mom died, I was lost for a while. I didn't even realize how lost I was until that very moment when I was confronted with how far I'd go to feel that type of attention from someone. Anyone. He made me feel special. I thought that he saw something in me. I was an okay runner at best when I started. Without him, I'm not sure I ever would have won any races. He even helped me get into Valley. My dad didn't know anything about applying for colleges or financial aid, and he was still a mess too. Of course, I believe you. What happened was not your fault. I know. Her voice is too quiet, and she still doesn't look at me. Bullshit. Okay, fine, I'm working on it. 
I know that he was wrong, but what I did wasn't right either. And so you quit because you didn't feel like you earned it? I'm starting to get a feel for Dakota, who she is inside, why she's so adamant that she prove herself with the Wildcats internship, and her desire to always be on an even playing field with her peers. I know it doesn't make sense. I won those medals fair and square. I trained my ass off. But would I have done all that if he hadn't taken a special interest in me? And did he only do that because he wanted to sleep with me? I'm so embarrassed that I let it go that far. I didn't want anything that he'd been a part of or that reminded me of how dumb I'd been. I thought when I got to Valley, I could put it behind me, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I didn't deserve any of it. I sit with her in the chair, pulling her into my lap and smoothing a hand down her ponytail. She's still slick with sweat and sticks to my bare chest. I'm so sorry, baby. Thank you. I want to kill him. I hate that you quit something you love. I don't even have to know you broke the state record to know you deserved it. You give your all to everything. It turned out okay. I stopped running altogether for a while. Then when I realized that just made me more miserable, I picked it back up. I still run almost every day, or I did until recently. I can't seem to pry myself out of bed as easily these days. Her lips tip into a half smile. A memory floats back to me. That was the prick we ran into when we were out running by your dad's house. I clench my hand into a fist. Yeah, that's the first time I'd seen him since I graduated. They've been trying to get me to come back and be inducted into the Hall of Fame, and I just can't bring myself to do it. I don't want to face him. As your husband, I will happily drive to Kansas and beat him with my hockey stick. As my slam piece, I'm going to need you to play it a little cooler. I'd run through hell and back for you, wifey. I know. She cups my cheek. How about showering with me instead? Chapter 34 Dakota I'm assigned to tours at the arena with Reese for our second to last week at the Wildcats. We're a good pair, him with tons of history about the team and me with experience leading groups. It's good to be away from my desk, and I have very little time to overthink everything going on. Namely, I am Mrs. Johnny Maverick. How weird is that? I haven't told a soul, not even Reagan. Johnny plays it off like it's no big deal. He asked me to give it a week and think about it, but what's there to think about? We've been messing around for a month. We haven't even said I love you, and he wants to be married? I think a threesome might have been a saner choice. What's the worst way that could have gone? On Friday, Rhett and Sienna come to stay with us. It's so good to see you. I hug my friend. I can't believe you've been this close all summer and I'm just now seeing you. She's positively glowing. She's so happy. We're going to make up for it tonight. I glance at Rhett. Girls' night. Always stealing my girl away. You've had her all to yourself for weeks. He smiles and looks at Sienna with hearts in his eyes. I love their love. Go drop off your stuff. I can't wait to catch up, I tell her. She and Rhett take their stuff to my room, where they're staying for the weekend. We were going to have them stay in Johnny's room, but mine is cleaner since it's used less. I guess we did only need one bed this summer. My guy lies on the pink couch, something he only does when he's trying to get my attention and holds his arms out for me to join him. Maybe you should repurpose this couch into a throw pillow or something. I have to get ready. I'm taking Sienna to Wilds, and I want to get there before it's too busy to find a table. That's where I was going to take Rothra's, Johnny says, still wiggling around on the couch, trying to get comfortable. Called it. I walk over to him, and he takes my hand in his, closing his eyes and smiling. Are you going to tell Sienna about... He runs his thumb over the hair tie on my ring finger. His dark eyes open while he waits for my answer. I don't know, I admit. Probably not. I don't want everyone to get in the middle of it when we haven't even figured it out ourselves. Are you going to tell Rhett? Not if you don't want me to. But you want to? Yeah. 
He shrugs. It's pretty epic news. He's so all in with this, and I don't understand it. You can tell him, but make him swear he will not tell Adam. If Reagan finds out from someone that isn't me, she will show up here and beat me to death with a shoe. He chuckles. She'd have to get through me. Please, you're the biggest softy ever. I let him tug me down onto the couch with him. She'd fake tears and you'd be a goner. I'm no softy, he says, rolling his hips into me to show me how not soft he is. Sienna and I walk to Wilds, linking arms and chatting a mile a minute. Are you loving Minnesota? She asks as we slide into a table with our drinks. I am, actually. I'm so glad. Now you can move here and I'll have a friend. A friend you haven't seen in almost two months, even though she's been 45 minutes away. I know. I'm sorry. We have been so busy at the rink and... She smiles, just hanging out at the new apartment. How's living together? Amazing. She gets that dreamy look on her face. They're so in love. I'm happy for you. Thanks. She leans forward with her elbows on the table. Now, I've waited an appropriate amount of time before harassing you for details, but spill. What is going on with you and Maverick? My eyes fall to the red rubber band looped around my finger, and I curl my hand so it's out of view. We're hanging out. Is it still just for the summer, or are you thinking it could be more serious? I don't know, I answer honestly. I consider telling her about the wedding, but I just can't bring myself to say the words. Oh, hey, Johnny and I got married on a whim in Vegas. Seriously. Who does that with a guy she's just hooking up with for a summer? He's totally smitten. I could see it all over his face. He does seem to be, but come on. It's Johnny. He lives in the now. You don't think he could do a real relationship? I don't know. And if I asked him that, he'd be like, this is real, baby. I roll my eyes, but smile. Everything is real to him. He's unconventional and spontaneous, and I love that about him, but I'm not. I like traditional. It's how I always pictured it. Plus, I'm going back to Valley, and he's going to be here and traveling. It would be hard, but not impossible. You were supposed to be the other level-headed one of the group, I tell her. You're as bad as the other two now. She grins. I can't help it. Love changes people. I don't think we change so much as we realize what it is we really care about. Everyone has their quirks. You have to figure out your deal breakers. She tips her drink toward me. You like traditional, but is spontaneous and unconventional enough to make you walk away from someone you love? Apparently not. I mutter as I turn the glass in my hands. So you do love him then? He's Maverick. Everyone loves him. You should see the people at the Wildcats. Most rookies walk in needing to prove themselves, or that's what my friend Reese says. He's another intern. But Johnny just stepped right into a team that is so excited to have him. He has this effect on people where they change their expectations for him without even meaning to, I think. He's charming and fun, and people want to like him and be near him, me included. And we all thought you were immune to the Maverick charm. He chipped away at my better judgment. Or maybe you realized that your better judgment was getting in the way of you being deliriously happy. It was a fun summer. Let's leave it at that for now. Okay, but I'm rooting for you two, just so you know. Johnny and Rhett join us a few hours later. Rhett and Sienna go to the bar to get drinks, and Johnny crowds in beside me, resting an arm around the back of the booth. 
It's weird not touching him in public after letting our guard down so much in Vegas. But in here, people would definitely notice if we showed any signs that we're together. Did you tell her? He asks. No. I shake my head, expecting disappointment to be etched in his features. But instead, it's relief. Oh, good. Good? He chuckles. I didn't tell Rothrus either. So if you told her, I was about to get an earful. Yeah, probably better we don't tell anyone. None of our friends can keep secrets from each other. It'll be around the group faster than you can say holy elopement. Holy elopement, he says, grinning. I know we're supposed to keep things on the low, but can I convince you to be my date tomorrow night? Rothrus wants to take Sienna to some fancy-ass restaurant downtown. I had to make a call to get us in. Throwing your name around in this town, huh? Just for a good cause. I think it's sweet. And yes, but three feet rule. I look at the small space between us. Scooch. Yes, wifey. He whispers and moves down the wooden bench. The next night, we're led through an elegant restaurant where the sound of wine being poured into glasses overpowers that of the polite conversation around us. I feel like I need to whisper. As usual, Johnny fits right in. He stands behind me as I take my seat and then takes the chair beside me. He looks too good to be true. He skipped the suit jacket and wears gray dress pants and a black dress shirt that's open at the collar and rolled up over his forearms. Rhett looks nice, too, but his nervous expression tells me he isn't as comfortable in this place. Johnny orders a bottle of champagne, which makes me laugh. Yeah, he fits in just fine here. I hear congrats are in order, I tell Rhett after we have drinks in front of us. His eyes widen, and he looks from Johnny to me. I feel like I'm missing something. I try again. Sienna told me that your hockey camps this summer were fully booked, and you already have a waiting list for next year. That's so exciting. Oh, that. Yeah, it went really well. I guess having a national champ running it is good for business, Johnny says and lifts his glass. Congrats, buddy. The food is terrific and we go through an entire bottle of champagne, then order another with dessert. I'm feeling happy and frustrated that Johnny is so far away, and I can't touch him in here. Times like this, where we're not hiding and we're out doing things other couples do, I can see it. I can picture us doing this for real, but I don't know what that would look like with us a thousand miles apart. He catches me staring at him and lifts a brow. See something you like? Maybe. I inch my chair closer. He smirks. Tisk tisk. Three feet. Two and a half, I say, and slide my foot under the table so our legs touch. He drops a hand to my knee and grazes his fingers across my smooth skin. I'm lost in his touch when Rhett clears his throat and Johnny's hand on my leg stills and then squeezes in warning. He rushes to get his phone and aims it across the table. I look up in time to see Rhett get down on one knee. Sienna brings both hands to her mouth in a gasp, her eyes full of tears. Rhett's words are sweet, though I hear little of them because I'm too stuck in my own head thinking, I want that. All of that. To date, fall in love, move in together, get engaged. We've done things all wrong, Johnny and me, and there's no taking it back. Can I really go back to Valley as his girlfriend after this summer? It all feels too messy. Yes! Sienna shouts and frames his face with her hands. Yes, I'll marry you. There's polite applause around the restaurant. Rhett slides the big diamond on Sienna's finger, and then they go back to kissing. I run my thumb along the elastic on my finger. It isn't about the diamond. It's about the thought that went into it. Rhett probably spent weeks planning this moment, 
He was sure about his decision before he acted. It wasn't a drunken whim. Congratulations. Johnny refills our glasses with champagne and we toast to the happy couple. I feel sick to my stomach, but I plaster on a smile for my friends. We leave soon after. Johnny invites them to hang out with us and continue the celebration, but when we get to the apartment, they're so lost in each other, I'm not surprised when they decide to spend the rest of the night alone. Crazy night, right? Johnny asks as we get ready for bed. You knew. He nods. Yeah, Rothrus told me last night. It's why I didn't tell him about us. Right. Yeah, I'm so glad I didn't tell Sienna now. We can tell them in a week or two when their news has died down. I almost missed the whole thing with your sexy legs taunting me. Rothrus would have been pissed. It's sweet that you did all of that for them. It was nothing. I'm happy for them and happy to be a part of it. It made me realize that's what I want, I say, taking a seat next to him on the bed. Check. He traces an imaginary check mark in the air. Wifey. I mean, all of it. I want to date someone, fall in love, then get engaged. We've done everything out of order. Yeah, but it was all pretty great. He shrugs. You're not hearing me, Johnny. I want that. This summer has been amazing, but it's ending. And maybe we should stick to the original plan and leave it at that. You want to break up? Are we even together? My laugh is brittle. We decided to use each other for sex all summer, and then we got married in Vegas. I was there. I know what happened, Coda. Your description isn't accurate. It was never about using each other, and you know it. But whatever it was we did, I don't regret any of it. Do you? I don't regret it. Not really. But if we hadn't gotten married in Vegas, would he still be trying to make this work? And the real kicker, the thing I can't shake, is the image of Johnny the first week in Minnesota when he got hurt. He begged me to stay because I was comfortable and familiar, a piece of Valley and his friendships that he'd made at college. When I leave, he'll go out more and make friends, meet new people. He'll start his new life here, and then will he still want this? I don't answer, and he nods slowly. Guess that's my answer. He sits up. We're good together. I've never had this with anyone. Ever. Maybe it doesn't fit into whatever box you're trying to force it in, but it doesn't make it any less. Johnny, I... My voice cracks as I realize he's not just talking about me right now. I've done exactly what his dad does to him. Made him feel like he isn't good enough. He holds up a hand and moves toward the door. Where are you going? I'm going to take a walk. Believe it or not, sometimes I do know when to walk away. I go to bed feeling like an ass, hoping he comes back. He does two hours later. The bed dips with his weight, and he lies beside me. I'm sorry, I whisper. Me too. His mouth slants over mine, and then there are no more words. We spend the rest of the night speaking our love language of kisses and touches that make promises and dreams neither of us dares to say out loud. Chapter 35 Johnny Monday morning, I stare down at the picture I took of Dakota in Vegas, draped all over me, and then I glance over at where she sleeps on the other side of the bed currently. Yesterday, we spent the day with Sienna and Rhett, and last night, instead of rehashing our shit, we fell into bed and had sex instead. I want this to work. I'll give her whatever she wants. She wants a diamond ring and an elaborate proposal I'm on it. 
She'll never even see it coming. In fact, I'm a little pissed at myself for not going bigger the first time. I was in the moment, a little drunk, and I just wanted her to be mine. But as soon as she goes to work, let the planning begin. The most epic of proposals. I'm thinking something big. I'll make a movie trailer starring our friends, rent out a theater, fly in everyone, and have five or six different rings for her to pick from. No. Something even bigger. I'll work out the details later. I have an email from Hugh asking what I want to do about the marriage. His way of nicely asking if I want to file the paperwork for an annulment. I don't respond. Not necessary, Hugh. I'm going to fix this. But first, I open up Instagram and post a picture of Dakota, cropped so it's just a sexy leg tangled in the sheet with one single word. Mine. She's mine. And it's time to figure this out so I can tell the world. I shower and make her morning smoothie. I can be an epic husband. I've already been an epic summer hookup, if I do say so myself. I just need to show her how serious I am about this. Big and bold gestures, baby. Bring it. I grab my phone and scroll through local jewelry stores while I wait for her to wake up. I'm anxious, foot tapping, mind racing with possibilities. Is she a round cut or a square cut kind of girl? Regular diamond or was she like a yellow or black or something totally different than a diamond? What the hell, Johnny? I look up from my phone as she rushes out from the bedroom, still in the oversized t-shirt she slept in. Morning, baby. Sorry about the noise. I tried a new smoothie recipe. It sucked, so I had to start over. I'm not talking about the noise. I'm talking about this. She holds out her phone to show me my post of her leg on my Instagram. You should see the original. Your veil is covering your face, and your arm is around my chest. Why would you post this? I wanted everyone to know I'm taken. I'm in this, not just for the summer, for real. And I didn't show your face or tag you. She closes her eyes and blows out a breath. They know, Johnny. They know it's me. Who, our friends? I shrug. They already know. No, my boss, your teammates, my co-workers. I look at the picture again. Your legs are memorable, but I doubt they're going to be able to tell from a grainy picture. I blurred it a little, so it's harder to tell. I wink. I thought of all of this already. I get another sigh. The shoes, Johnny. They know because of my shoes. I bring it up again and see the red converse at the bottom of the photo. There's such a staple in her wardrobe I didn't even notice. You said you wished you had white ones that night. She places a hand on top of her head and paces. Oh God, I'm going to be fired. I come around the counter and stand in front of her. They're not going to fire you. Why don't you understand how serious this is? She raises her voice. This is going to cost me my job. It won't. I'll take it down. Fuck, I just wanted to tell someone. I'm tired of keeping this to myself. I'm crazy about you. I'm in this. Someone? You told everyone. Her phone pings and she whimpers as she looks at it. That's Blythe. She wants to meet with me first thing this morning. Already? Damn. Panic makes my throat tight. I'll talk to her. No. Her tone is stern. You might as well tag me in it if you show up to talk to her. I know you don't want to tell people, but we are married, Coda. If you tell her, she can't fire you. You really think I want to pull the Johnny Maverick card again to keep my job? I wanted to earn this job. I wanted to do things the right way. Fuck the right way, Coda. It's bullshit. Do whatever makes you happy. Like you? She scoffs and then sighs. I'm Johnny Maverick, and I do whatever I want on a whim. Fuck the consequences. She stops, eyes wide like she can't believe she said that out loud. I didn't mean that. No, you did. And I guess I deserve that. I haven't done things the way I wanted with you, but I don't regret it because of where it brought us. I have to go to work, she says, voice small and broken. I'm gutted. I can't believe I screwed this up so epically. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to fuck this up for you. I just wanted you to know how much I want this. I hug her to my chest. I will fix this. Somehow. Everything is going to be okay. You'll see. Chapter 36 Dakota Everything is not okay. 
I take a seat in Blythe's office, stomach clenching and acid rising in my throat. Reese and Quinn both texted, along with Reagan, Sienna, and Jenny. I'm blowing up. And Johnny thought no one would know? Seriously? Catherine will be here soon, but I wanted to talk to you first and get ahead of it. I can't tell you how much I despise prying into my interns' lives, but the news that Johnny Maverick is off the market is big news, made bigger by the fact these red shoes look a lot like yours. She glances down. I wore them today because not wearing them made me feel too guilty. We're together, I confirm. I'm sorry. I know I should have told you. She gives me a sad smile. Catherine will want you and Johnny to sign a form disclosing the relationship, and I can work with you both to draft a statement if you'd like, but I'm afraid I will have to reassign you to another department. I can make some calls, but it's the last week. What do you want to do? I can't imagine working for anyone but you. This summer has been amazing. You're talented and hardworking. You'll be okay. But it doesn't feel okay. This was my chance to prove myself. And all I did was become an urban legend like Chrissy before me. I think about Johnny's advice. Tell her we're married. The thing is, Blythe has become my role model. I respect her, and I can't bear to see the disappointment on her face that I would expect if I told her I got married in a hush-hush ceremony drunk off my ass. All I have to do is picture my dad's reaction, and I feel like the lowest human alive. Besides, she'd probably still have to reassign me. I think I want to go home, I say, and mean it. Thank you for this opportunity. She stands and hugs me. It was my absolute pleasure. Stay in touch, Dakota. I have to suffer through an awkward exit interview with Catherine, and then I walk out of the Wildcat's office for good. As I get on the elevator at the apartment building, I bite back angry tears, ready to unload on Johnny, but I know it isn't him I'm angry with. This is all on me. I should have told Blythe weeks ago. I go up to the 11th floor, and by the time I get there, I realize all I really want is for Johnny to hold me and tell me everything is going to be okay again. I don't believe it, but I still want to hear it. I want to live in our summer of fun just a little longer. But he isn't home, and I can't bear to be here without him, so I get back in the elevator, not sure where I'm going, but not wanting to be alone. When the elevator stops, Declan and Leo are waiting inside. I wipe my tears and step into the small space. Hey, Dakota, Leo says in his soft, deep voice. Both guys give me a nervous once-over. I wave, not trusting myself to speak. I clench my jaw in the silence of the ride, willing myself not to cry. I almost make it, too, but when the doors open on the first floor, I can't move. Everything okay? Leo's voice is laced with hesitant concern. Yes, fine, I say, but the words end on a sob and I burst into tears. He rests a big hand on my shoulder and lets me cry. The three of us ride the elevator together, me crying harder with every passing second, Leo trying to comfort me, and Declan pressing the close button and barking, take the stairs, to anyone else trying to get on. I fucked up. I fucked up so badly. Johnny may have dealt the final blow, but I put us in this position. Me and Johnny Maverick? We don't make any sense. We're too different. When we get to the first floor a second time, neither guy gets off. I hold up my hand to stop the doors from closing. Thank you. I'm good now. They still don't make a move to get off the elevator. Are you sure? Leo asks. Do you want me to call Johnny? No, 
I say quickly and shake my head. No, I'm okay. Thanks, guys. With a nod, they exit. Just in time, too, because I start to cry all over again when the doors close between us. I call Reagan, tears running down my face as my best friend's concerned gaze fills the screen. Oh, honey, she says. Then her features harden. Who do I need to kill? Me. I fucked everything up. I'm booking a flight. She stands from the bed. The familiarity of it all tugs at my emotions. No, don't. I'm coming home. Her smile is tinged with sadness. You're sure? Positive. Okay, she says. I'll be here. Chapter 37 Johnny Jack tries to take my empty glass for me to refill it, but I motion to the bottle in his hand. Don't be stingy. Are you sure she left? He asks after handing over the half-empty bottle of Don Julio. The only thing left in her room is the furniture, I say. I was at the jewelry store trying to pick out a ring when Declan called to say that he and Leo had seen her in the elevator crying. And I just knew. By the time I got back to the apartment, she was gone. I came here not really sure where to go or what to do. It's all my fucking fault. I couldn't keep it to myself for one more week, I say. I feel like someone reached in and ripped out my heart, stomped on it, and then tried to put it back. What did compel you to post a picture of her mostly naked except those little red shoes obviously in bed with you? Stupidity? Maybe love? Hand in hand, my friend. Where do you think she went? If I had to guess, Valley, maybe Kansas to see her dad. Did you call her? About a hundred times. I drink from the bottle, spilling a lot of it on my bare chest. No idea where my shirt went. I think I ripped it off and said something about not being able to contain my emotions. I'm a sad case. I can't believe she left. All I got was a Dear Johnny note that said, Thanks for a great summer. Okay, now you're not even making it in your mouth. He takes the bottle back from me. I've got some Patron around here somewhere if you're just going to waste it. What do I do, Captain? You're asking me? Couldn't hurt. Forget about her. Focus on hockey. Want me to call some girls? Scratch that. Worst advice ever. Got any mad dog? Yeah. He laughs. I bought a couple of bottles. Really? I hadn't expected him to say yes. You really are a good captain, stocking your boy's favorite drinks. He brings me a bottle of MD-2020. Never know when you're going to have to step in with words of wisdom and booze. So far, your words of wisdom are shit. Yeah, I do better when it's related to hockey, hence the booze. I unscrew the cap and take a long drink. It doesn't hit the same way, and I groan. I've lost the ability to taste. Ah, oh, jeez. Jack runs a hand through his hair. I might need to call in reinforcements. Ash and Leo show up next. They live in the neighborhood just down the street. They show their support with sad smiles and drinking in solidarity. Ash offers to take me to the strip club. I accost Leo for every detail about his interaction with Dakota earlier. By the time I finish the bottle of Mad Dog, the party is huge. When girls start trying to cheer me up by sitting in my lap, I'm out. Declan offers me a sober ride back to the apartment, and I accept it. He drives my SUV and says he'll come get his motorcycle tomorrow. You'll have your vehicle in case you decide to go after her, he says. But promise me you'll wait 12 hours or so and let the alcohol ooze out of your system? Promise. I hold up my pinky, but he doesn't link his with mine like Heath would have. I miss him. I miss Dakota. I miss my life before I screwed everything up. What was so wrong with being her secret slam piece? At least then I had her to go home to. Inside, I grab Charlie and we lie on the god-awful pink couch. Charlie jumps down with a whine and jogs around as if she's looking for Coda. We'll get her back, I promise her, and pat my chest until she hops back up to keep me company. Somehow. I call Heath Friday afternoon when I still haven't heard from her. Yes, I've resorted to using our friends for information. She hasn't said a lot, at least not to me. 
Last night they kicked Adam and me out to have girl time. Ginny is hungover as fuck today. I hadn't really expected her to sit on the couch and recount the entire thing to our friends, but I wonder what she's told them. Do they know we got married? I'm guessing not, or Heath would be giving me so much shit right now. Did she get the flowers and the balloons? Yeah, man, their place is one flower arrangement away from looking like someone died in there. Someone did. I'm lying on the pink couch, my new favorite spot, arm thrown over my face. I don't have to look at the screen of my phone to know Heath is holding back laughter. I can hear it in his voice. Dude, no one died. You're going to be fine. You two will work this out. She just needs... He stops mid-sentence, and I hear Dakota and Ginny's voices in the background. I can't make out their words, but I can hear her. And everything inside of me lights up and then dies all over again. Fuck. I miss her. Chapter 38 Dakota There are three weeks before the fall semester starts. The apartment building is starting to fill up again, and most of the jocks are back for preseason training, which means there is no shortage of things to do and parties to attend. Not that I have any interest in any of it. Jenny and Reagan have been great. I've never been the one that needed consoling, and they keep looking at me with big, sad eyes that I know are from a good place, but make me feel worse because I know I must look as awful as I feel. Two nights ago, we had a night in and watched sappy movies and ate ice cream and all of the queso in Valley. Not together, but it was still glorious. But after too many days of feeling sorry for myself, it's time to do something. I lace up my shoes and go for a long run. Running has always been an outlet for me. I was a sporty kid, but I didn't start running competitively until after my mom died. It was one place where no one asked me if I was okay or questioned my silence. If you sit alone in the cafeteria at school, people whisper, but not when you run. I didn't realize at the time how much those runs allowed me to escape. But as I once again find myself searching for solitude, I realize this is where it's always been okay for me to not be okay. When I get back to the apartment, I feel lighter than I have since returning to Valley. Reagan is in the kitchen, standing and eating a bowl of cereal. Another delivery came. She points to a box on our kitchen counter. All the lightness fades in an instant. Want me to open it? Jenny asks from where she lies on the couch. I pull my earbuds out and drop them next to the box. No. Yes. No. Come on. You don't want to know what's inside? I'm dying. Jenny hops up and comes to the kitchen. She runs a finger over the packing tape and looks at Reagan. Back me up here. It has been interesting. Who could have predicted an entire box of hair ties? My already tight chest constricts a little more. A hundred hair ties, to be exact. All red. I look down at the one I haven't been able to remove from my ring finger. Or the pop rocks. Do I even want to know? Jenny asks. Open it, I say. As much as it hurts, I do want to know. Every single gift has been over the top in true Johnny form, but also more sentimental than I pegged him for. Ginny tries to hide how giddy she is about it, but fails spectacularly. She rips open the box and stills. What is it? Reagan asks. Instead of answering, Ginny holds out the box to me. White converse, covered in rhinestones or crystals, Oh, God, they better not be crystals. Either way, they're custom and expensive. So very Johnny. I pull one from the box to show them both. Those are cute. Reagan smiles. But why white? I shrug like I don't understand the significance, put it back in the box, and hand it to her. Set it with the others. I can't deal with that right now. Do you think you'll ever forgive him? Jenny asks. Of course I'll forgive him. I'm mad and I'm hurt, 
the second more than the first. I know he didn't do it maliciously, but he still did it. No thought beyond the moment, and no consideration for how it might impact me. I know he's sorry, and yes, I know that I will forgive him, but right now, I can't forgive myself. I knew it was a bad idea to get involved in a summer fling and break the rules of my internship, but I gave in and let his carefree and wild attitude overturn my better judgment. My phone rings, and I don't even have to look to know it's him. He calls every day, leaves rambling voicemails telling me about his day, and then signs off by apologizing and asking me to call him back. He messed up. Reagan reaches over and squeezes my hand. We never should have happened. We were two people in a new city, clinging to each other out of loneliness and forced proximity. We're too different. It's better to cut things off now, and maybe someday we can be friends again. I can't admit to Ginny and Reagan that I think we're beyond ever going back to friends. I know myself well enough to know that seeing him will break my heart all over again. Maybe with enough time. I'm going to shower. Their gazes, full of pity and sadness, follow me into my bedroom where I shut the door and then lean against it to let out a shaky breath. I miss him. There. I've admitted it. Woo! Go me! What do I win? Another day filled with sad memories and heartbreak? Because I've apparently turned into a masochist, I bring my phone to my ear to listen to his most recent voicemail. Hey, Coda. It's me. It's Johnny. His deep voice drives tiny daggers into my heart. I'm out for a walk with Charlie. Went to a twins game last night with Jack. Thought of you. Saw Quinn and some of the other interns at Wilds. Thought of you. Oh, and get this. You know how there was a rumor that Jack hooked up with an intern who went all psycho on him and blasted it on social media? It wasn't Jack. It was Declan. Can you believe it? He told me himself. It's a crazy story. He pauses. I wish you were here so I could tell you in person. I don't think it'd be the same over voicemail. I miss you. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Call me back. He's quiet, but I hear his sigh, and then the recording ends. I head over to the Hall of Fame to talk to my boss and see if I can get on the schedule sooner rather than later. She's ecstatic to have me back, which makes me feel a tiny bit better about everything. Maybe I blew my dream job, but this one isn't so bad. And Blythe did say she'd write me a reference letter, so maybe the summer wasn't a total waste. There are only so many ways to kill the day, and I end up back at the apartment, resigning myself to another night of watching my happy roommates text or hang out with their boyfriends. I swear I saw Adam and Heath less when they lived across the breezeway from us. Now that we've moved into a three-bedroom a floor up, our apartment has become the new hang spot. And I'm happy for my friends. I really am. Even more so after the amazing summer I had. I had a little piece of that this summer. I get it now. Heath is in our living room by himself when I walk in. Hey, I say, dropping my keys on the counter. Where is everyone? Ginny is talking to her mom on the phone. Adam and Reagan are in her room. I nod and grab a sparkling water from the fridge. Ginny comes out of her room, falling onto the cushion next to Heath. Hey, you're back. Where'd you go all day? I stopped by the Hall of Fame. Regina got me a few hours this week helping with events and doing office work. It's boring, but it's better than sitting around waiting for summer to end. The days are long, even as I try to fill them full of activities. When Sienna and Rhett group call us later, I wander out to the living room and plaster on a happy face. It's the first time since their engagement that they've come up for air, and we huddle around Ginny's laptop in the living room so everyone can hear all the details. 
I was there, of course, but I stay and listen to them retell the story. Maverick helped arrange everything, Rhett says. Where is he anyway? Might have been my bad, Heath says. I wasn't sure if... He glances at me and I drop my gaze to the floor. Let me text him to hop on. A minute later, Johnny's face appears on the screen. He's got on a wildcat's hat pulled low on his eyes, but his smile is easy and light. Hey guys, what's up? Since the rest of us have already caught up, the questions turn to Maverick. I can tell by the background and noise that he's at Wilds, clinking glasses and people talking. Declan's big shoulder is in half the frame. How's Minnesota? Adam asks him. Uh, it's okay. Johnny briefly looks at me. Most of the guys are still on vacation, but I'm working out hard every day, and they've got me doing a lot of press leading up to the season. Miss you, buddy, Heath says, and makes a heart with his hands. Right back at ya. The conversation bounces back around to Rhett and Sienna. When are they getting married? Where? My stomach twists with sadness and a little guilt that I haven't shared with my friends the biggest thing that's ever happened to me. When the call is over, I ask Reagan and Ginny to come into my room. Normally, Heath and Adam would whine and complain, and the fact they don't makes me feel like poor, pitiful Dakota. But whatever. Right now, I don't care. I need to tell someone. We sit on top of my bed. I can't figure out the right way to say the words. It still sounds so ridiculous in my head. I go back and forth on whether I should call Sienna. I don't want to steal any of her thunder from the engagement, but I don't want her to feel excluded either. Screw it. I'm calling Sienna. I hold out the phone as Ginny and Reagan share a worried look. Are you okay? Reagan asks. Was that hard seeing Maverick? Brutal, I say honestly. Sienna answers and I angle the phone so that she can see everyone. What's going on? She asks. I swallow and look around at my best friends in the whole world. Johnny and I got married in Vegas. It's so quiet, I can hear the guys in the living room and the TV. They're watching the NBA playoffs and something big must have happened because they are excited about it. I'm finding a million things to focus on, Anything but the silence and disbelieving, jaw-dropped faces of my favorite girls. Sienna is the first to recover. When you say married, you mean... I hold up my left hand. Married. Ginny starts giggling. She slaps a hand over her mouth and waves a hand. I'm sorry, she gets out before erupting into laughter again. Soon, Reagan joins her, and then Sienna and I do too. <laughs> I know, I say. Tears that are some weird mixture of happy and sad stream down my face. It's absolutely ridiculous. I wanted to tell you guys, but I don't know. I was afraid that you'd tell me how wild it was. I mean, I know. I knew then, but... Some small part of me wanted to be happy about it, too. And then this one went and got engaged. I motioned to the phone. I'm so happy for you, and I'm sorry that I'm dimming your excitement with my marriage disaster. You're getting married, and I'm getting an annulment. Wait. All the laughter dies as Reagan rests a hand on my leg. You're going to get it annulled? Well, yeah. It was a summer fling and an impulsive, drunken decision. I share a picture with Sienna and then show Ginny and Reagan. It's the only picture I took the night we got married. We didn't want to risk the chapel releasing photos and outing us, so we only took them with our phones. We were coherent enough not to make headlines with a Vegas wedding, but not for much else. You look beautiful and really happy. Ginny tilts her head and lays it on my shoulder. Are you sure you two can't work it out? And then what? He's there. I'm here. But you're married, Reagan whines. Oh, 
the white blinged out chucks make sense now. And wait, this is your wedding ring? Ginny touches the red hair tie. It was a whole thing, I say, blushing as I recall a hazy memory of him fucking me against the window of our Vegas suite, my wrists bound by the flimsy elastic. Do you love him? Reagan asks. I stare at my hands and nod. I do. I really, really do. Chapter 39 Johnny If I had it my way, I would have left to win Dakota back days ago. But Blythe has filled my schedule with media and promotions, so instead I spend the week fulfilling obligations, moving anything scheduled the following week, and planning. I've never planned so much in my life. I think I have a real knack for it, though. So far, I've sent flowers, chocolates, balloons, gifts that somehow reminded me of her, and approximately one million photos of Charlie and me with accompanying, I'm so sorry, please forgive me texts. Dakota hasn't responded to any of them, but I didn't expect her to. I fucked up bad. A few gifts aren't going to make her forget that. Besides, we need to hash this out in person. The gifts and texts are just to make sure she knows how sorry I am. Saturday morning, I wake up to knocking on the door and someone yelling on the other side. Nobody's home, I yell and roll over. I've slept on this awful pink couch every night just to feel closer to her. I've probably jacked up my back permanently. It's so uncomfortable. Open the door, Maverick. I still. The disdain and amusement drip off his deep baritone and recognition dawns. My pulse races and I sit up. Charlie, the traitor, jogs to the door and actually looks happy as I open it for Dakota's dad. Hi, Jerry. Good to see you, sir. I run a hand over my bedhead and sneak a glance back at the messy apartment. You're missing a shirt, he muses and steps inside. Uh, come in. Dakota's not here. No kidding. He looks around the place while I find my t-shirt and pull it on. He zeroes right in on the empty liquor bottles in the kitchen. I... Wasn't expecting anyone, I say. Clearly. What are you doing here? I toss a bunch of empty takeout containers and bottles into the trash. I came to get her furniture. Oh, I nod. I would have gotten it back to her. He wastes no time finding her room and taking the nightstand out first. He's got old man freaky strong muscles, the kind that have been developed over a lot of years of constant use. But I remember how his back hurt him last time, and I jump in. He lets me, wordlessly, and together we load up her furniture in the trailer attached to his truck. I step back in the curb, hands in my pocket. It feels so final now. I always knew she had to go back for school, but I guess maybe I hoped that was the temporary thing and not us. Dakota, tell me what you did, Jerry says, and my heart drops to my stomach. How are you... Got her the internship and the endorsement contract. Oh, I guess of all the things she could have told her dad that I did, that's the safest one. She deserved it. She's a hard worker and so smart. It's difficult not to be able to give your kid everything they want. Some things are just out of your control. Thank you for what you did. He stares at the ground as he delivers the words. It hits me. Jerry's uncomfortable thanking me. Somehow that makes me feel worse. I don't deserve his thanks, and he wouldn't be giving it if he knew how I ruined it for her. She did an incredible job. That much is true. He watches me with those parental I-know-things eyes. I'm hungry. Somewhere around here to get breakfast? Yeah, there are quite a few places within walking distance. He hits the lock on the key fob and starts down the sidewalk, stopping a few feet away. Are you coming or what? I take Jerry to the cafe where Dakota and I came on several Sundays with Charlie. He orders the same thing she always does too, but I keep that to myself. So, you screwed up pretty good, huh? He asks, catching me off guard again. You know? Oh, shit. Maybe he brought me here to kick my ass with an audience. No, she didn't tell me anything, but she's not here. And you look like shit. I'm old, but I'm not stupid. Man, he doesn't hold back. 
so I decide not to either. I tell him everything. Okay, almost everything. I give him the short version of how I got her the job and then how I ruined it for her. I leave out how we decided to be slam buddies all summer. In truth, it was never just that. We both knew it. Keeping the focus on sex made it easy for us to give in. The traditional route was never going to work for us. We are different, she's right about that, and those differences would have kept us from seeing how alike we really are underneath. I love her, and I miss her something fierce. How is she? She's back in Valley. Sounds okay. Sorry if you were hoping she was crying her eyes out over you every night. I don't hope that at all. I don't ever want her to feel like this. I wave a hand in front of me. He chews his food, watching me carefully. I'm going to win her back, or at least try. I would have already left, but I had a few commitments here I couldn't bail on. With a thoughtful nod, he says, Sometimes people need to come around on their own. Are you saying that I shouldn't go see her? Because I don't think I can stay here hoping she'll change her mind. I need her. No, I'm not saying that. But what she might need is time. I respect that, but I have to tell her how I feel. I drop my gaze to the table. Tradition and family. I know they're important, Dakota. She talks about you so fondly and her mom. That awful pink couch. He actually laughs just a tiny bit. My parents were not close, but Coda, she's like family. That's how much I love and need her. I screwed up, I did. That's kind of my thing, just ask my dad. I ruined her job, but I have to make it right somehow. The pit that's been in my stomach all week grows. It was so dumb. I wanted everyone to know she was mine. She asked me not to, but I did it anyway, and she paid the price. I don't know why I'm telling Jerry this. He's never going to approve of me, so he might as well hear just how big of a fuck-up I am. Have you ever been so excited about something you just couldn't keep it to yourself? You had to tell someone or you'd burst? I don't wait for his answer. That's how I felt. I didn't think. I just wanted everyone to know how much she means to me. I shift in my chair, remembering that morning and wishing it had gone differently. If she'd have just told them we were married, they couldn't have fired her. My head snaps up. Oh, shit. Jerry's brows raise and his fork clatters on his plate. I'm gonna need you to repeat that. Start from the beginning and don't leave anything out this time, Maverick. Chapter 40 Dakota On Sunday morning, otherwise known as the end of my sanity, I wake to Heath and Ginny in the kitchen making breakfast together. Well, Ginny is. She was so excited about moving out of the dorms and into an apartment where she could cook something besides noodles that tastes like cardboard. Her boyfriend sits on the counter next to her while she fries bacon in a pan. What are you making? I ask, standing on the other side of the counter and flipping through yesterday's mail. Omelets? Want one? I shake my head as I pull out an envelope addressed to me from my high school. Looks like they finally found me. Not that I wasn't getting the mail they were sending my dad, but I felt like I could pretend I wasn't. I open it and read the letter inviting me to a Hall of Fame inductee ceremony at halftime of the homecoming football game in two months. Anything else come? They exchange a look before Ginny says, That's it. Huh. The flowers and gifts from Johnny have stopped. Nothing new has come since Friday. Maybe he's finally given up. I wish I felt better about that outcome. I've started to call him so many times, but part of me needs to give him space to see if he really wants me or if he just fell into this thing because I was his little piece of home. Oh, my friend exclaims, breaking me from my thoughts. We're going to the movies tonight. To see what? Neither answers right away. Heath clears his throat. There's this new action movie. Pass, I say, and Ginny smacks her boyfriend on the arm. He meant a rom-com. She turns and gives me a pouty lip. Please? You have to come. We're all going. It'll be fun. 
I'm not really in the mood for a big group date. Besides, I'm working at the Hall of Fame. Tonight? Yeah, there's some sort of event for the basketball team. Anyway, thanks for the invite. I take the letter to my room and put it on my desk. Maybe it's time to face the past and move on. That's the thing about having your heart blasted to smithereens. All the other cracks and fissures you've been walking around with seem a lot less significant. When I arrive at the Hall of Fame, I'm able to jump right to work and put everything else out of mind. The Valley basketball team is having a fancy party for a promotion on the coaching staff. There's dinner and cocktails and lots of laughter. I weave through the guests, making sure everyone is happy. I could have left already. I only needed to stay for setup. But my friends went to the movies tonight, and sitting home by myself sounds worse than working. I smirk when I see the man of the hour hiding in a corner away from the people who came to celebrate him. I grab a beer from the bar and take it to Wes Reynolds, the new head coach of the men's basketball team. He's the youngest head coach in the history of the school. Thanks. Thought I was going to have to decide between abandoning my spot in the corner and grabbing a fresh drink. No problem. Any particular reason you're hiding? Is there something we can do? No, this is great. I've never had a party dedicated to me. It's a little overwhelming. I wanted a few minutes to take it all in without having to talk to anyone. He stares out at the party. I can't read his expression. Excitement? Nerves? Amazement? Congratulations, coach. My boss beckons me from across the room. Enjoy tonight, I tell him. Don't hide out too long. A lot of people want to share this with you. Thanks. He doesn't move. Maybe just five more minutes. Laughing, I head over to my boss, Regina. I thought you'd already left, she says with a smile. She hasn't said a word about the extra hours I've been putting in or even asked why I'm back early. I decided to stick around. I timed out. Don't worry. No, I'm glad you're here. We need to preview a new video for the hype room, and I'm all tied up. Tonight? She hesitates. We have an early tour in the morning, and I'm hoping to use it. Okay, sure. I can do that. Really, what is my other option? Go home and sulk? Pass. Thank you, Dakota. She hands me a tablet. I labeled it Dakota Preview. Should be easy to find, I say with a small laugh. I punch in the code to get in the hype room, and the door slides open. It's a little weird being in here by myself. I've done it before when we were testing something or working out kinks, but usually we just preview the videos on the computer. Or maybe Regina does this, and I've just never had to. Whatever. I select the Dakota preview video. I didn't even ask her which sport it was for. They're all pretty great. These hype videos could make a sports fan out of just about anyone. The music comes on first. It's a slower beat than the others, but with the heavy bass. I'm digging it. Also, it's familiar, but I can't put my finger on it. When the first image fills the wall of screens, I gasp. It's me. I've never seen the photo before, but it's from the summer. I'm sitting on the pink couch with a playful smirk aimed at the person taking the photo. Oh, Johnny, what did you do? Photos from our summer together, so many that I'm shocked by how many he took, display before me. They're more than just random images of two people over eight weeks of their lives. They're a montage of two people falling in love. It hits me seeing it like this, that I never stood a chance. I would do it all again, even knowing the heartbreak that was coming. I'd risk everything for him. No, I did risk everything. And sure, I can blame him for the way it ended, but I knew what I was doing, and I decided he was worth it. Why was that so hard to remember when everything I feared would happen did? Three minutes and twelve seconds. That's how long it takes for me to fall in love all over again. Tears in my eyes and a smile on my face, 
I have to punch in the code twice because my fingers are trembling. I already have my phone to my ear to call him as I exit. I come up short when I spot him. I don't know why it didn't occur to me that he might be here, but I'm so glad he is. Johnny stands alone in dark jeans and a white t-shirt, hair combed and styled. His jaw is tight and brows slanted with nerves as he watches me. I spent a summer seeing him in so many different ways. Dressed up, casual, shirtless, at home, at work out with friends, playing with Charlie, and just the two of us. I've seen him mad, sad, happy, serious, content, playful, tired, hurt, and a million others. He gave me all of him, always. He never holds back. So neither do I. I run to him and throw my arms around his neck, breathing him in. Johnny! Coda. His arms wrap around my back and his mouth covers mine. He apologizes over and over again as he kisses me softly, hands roaming over my back and my hair and then framing my face. I am so in love with you. Tell me I didn't blow my only chance. I need you too much. I need him too. I need him despite his ridiculousness and because of it. I love you too. Like a really crazy, wild, ridiculous amount. He grins. And all the rest? I don't have the answers, but I know I'm not giving up on us without a fight. We'll figure it out. But right now, take me home, Johnny Maverick. We don't come up for air until the following afternoon. I'm sorry, I say quietly, tracing the outline of a new tattoo on his chest, a pink sofa and my name in cursive along the edge, his first colored ink. For what? He threads his fingers through my hair. I shouldn't have left. It wasn't just because of everything with the wildcats. I was scared. It all felt too fast, and I wasn't sure how much was real and how much was this maverick-induced, crazy, fun lifestyle. His deep laughter shakes his chest. I know. I'm a lot. I lift up so I can stare into his hazel eyes. I love you. I'm sorry I didn't give you more credit. You might be a lot to handle, but you're also the most genuine and reliable person I know. He places a hand on my forehead as if he's checking my temperature. Do you have maverick fever? Did we have sex so much you've overdosed on the D? I'm serious, I say, when he pulls me down onto him and cinches his arms tighter around my waist. The things you do for people... The way you make them feel, it's big, and it's important. You are a good man. The best, actually. I angle my face to his, and he kisses my already swollen lips. Eventually, I fall back on his chest, head resting over his heart. When do you have to go back? Tomorrow. Let's stay here all day, then. He kisses the top of my head. Can't. We have a lot to figure out. I groan. Look at you, avoiding planning. Never thought I'd see the day. Can't we just enjoy today without talking about how I'm never going to see you again? Reagan is the drama queen, babe. I sit up. I'm serious. I've seen your schedule. It's nuts. Yeah? So? So, I laugh, we'll never see each other. Phone sex, remote vibrators, weekend trips, dirty letters, sexting, the possibilities, babe. We've barely scratched the surface. He looks so genuinely excited about all of it that I can't help but smile. Aren't you looking forward to life as a big-shot NHL star? 
traveling and puck bunnies and, I don't know, threesomes galore, he barks a laugh. I straddle him. What if you start to resent having a ball and chain a thousand miles away? I won't. We could do what we did this summer. Fuck like bunnies in spring? When we're together, yes. But all the rest of the time, you'd be free to do what you want. I'm slammed with visuals of social media capturing his hookups, and I have to hold on to my resolve. And you'd get to do the same here in Valley? Yeah. I shrug. Where does one go after Johnny Maverick? Who could possibly compare to him? Fuck no. I don't have the kind of money I'd need to bail me out of jail every time a guy hit on you. And truth be told, I don't want to be free to do whatever I want on the road. I want you. It's only a year. Then you can be my trophy wife. I raise a brow. Or girlfriend, whatever you decide. I want to work. Fine. He sighs. I was really looking forward to a 1950s type housewife that answers the door in high heels and an apron with a beer in her hand to ask me about my day. I pinch him and he laughs. Kidding. Though maybe we could do some role playing because the visual that just gave me was pretty spectacular. He holds me, and I stare down at the new ink. I still can't believe this man tattooed my name on his body. I'm always going to support your dreams. Hopefully, some of them are naked dreams, but I digress. My contract is two years. After that, we'll make decisions together. You want to be a big-shot boss lady? Then I'll stay home and be a house husband. Maybe I'll wear the apron and high heels. Now there's an idea. Just say you'll be mine, Coda. I'm flexible on all the rest. I nod. Yeah? One side of his mouth pulls into a boyish smirk. How could I say no to having a house husband? Husband? Did you say husband? Legally, that's still what you are. He leans over the edge of the bed and grabs his jeans. Your response to that is to get dressed? Really? I admire the view of his tight ass and the muscles of his back. When his head pops back up, he cradles a black box in one hand, and all the air is sucked from my lungs. I was going to wait. Take you out on a bunch of really baller dates first. Wine and dine you, impress you with all sorts of really romantic shit. I was going to do it the right way this time. But it's the quiet moments like this that I feel the closest to you. He opens the box and a beautiful ring sparkles back at me. Marry me, Dakota. Today, tomorrow, in a year from now or five, whatever you want. I promise I'll never stop showing you how much you mean to me. Over the top, Big and wild love. I wouldn't have you any other way, Johnny Maverick. I stare at the ring again. It's gorgeous. He plucks it from the box and slides it down my ring finger. Your dad helped me pick it out. He did? After I accidentally told him we eloped, I gasp. You didn't. I did. Sorry. He winces. Oh, no. But you're still in one piece. It was touch and go for a few minutes, but I told him what you mean to me and promised that I'd spend my entire life making you happy. What do I do with this? I twist the red elastic around my finger. I haven't removed it since the night in Vegas. He lifts it over the diamond ring and then wraps his lips around my finger, gliding the elastic up my finger. He holds the red hair tie with his teeth as he covers my body with his. Hands above your head, baby. Chapter 41 Dakota Two months later Johnny's handsome face stares back at me through the phone. 
Are you wearing it? Yes. I roll my eyes but lower my phone to show him I'm wearing the Wildcats jersey he sent me. His. Maybe you should wear the shirt from the Frozen Four instead. The one I made with the Valley Colors. Already thought of that. I lift the jersey to show him it's underneath. You've got this. He blows out a breath that puffs out his cheeks. His dark hair is slicked back and he's in his pads and jersey for their first game. I wish you were here. Me too. Bone sex later? Yes, and I'm sending you a little something right now. I send the text and wait for him to get it. He chuckles. My two favorite girls. I pat Charlie's head and Johnny coos at her, slipping into the sweet voice he only uses for his dog. We decided since he's traveling so much, it would be easier for Charlie to stay with me for a few months. She and I get along great, but she misses her guy. Me too. Now go crush it. I want to brag about my super hot, super talented husband to all my friends. They're coming over to watch, and we're doing a Zoom call with Rhett and Sienna. My dad's even watching. We're all so proud of you. I knew I'd win Jerry over. He smirks, and then it falls. Okay. Love you. I'll call you later. We gather in the living room for the game. Sienna and Rhett are watching in Minnesota, but Ginny pulls them up on her laptop, so it's almost like we're all together to watch Johnny's pro debut. All his nerves were completely unwarranted. The Wildcats get off to an early lead. Johnny gets an assist in the first period, and seconds before the end of the game, he fires a shot that sneaks by the goalie and lights up the goalpost. Heath jumps to his feet and screams. He does a lap around the living room and rips off his t-shirt and swings it around his head. While our friends celebrate, I stare at the TV with tears in my eyes. I'm so proud of him. He calls me as soon as he's done with interviews and headed to the airport with the team. Congratulations! He grins. You're my lucky charm. You have to call Heath. He was out of his mind when you scored that goal. I will. First, check your email. My email? Mm-hmm. I just sent something to you. Okay. I move to my desk and find the email from Johnny. It's a foreword, and I skim quickly, stopping when I get to the bottom and see the photo of him in the shower from the photo shoot we did this summer. I don't understand. My dad called me after the launch. Apparently, it didn't do as well as they expected. I bite my tongue. I'm still pissed about the way his dad handled that. Not about the photos. I can handle my work being critiqued, but I cannot handle my man being shit on by someone who is supposed to love him unconditionally. He wanted to renegotiate, and I told him... The only way I was going to be the face of Maverick Corporation's new line was if they used your ideas. All of them. I scroll up and read more carefully as he speaks. They created a new scent called Rebel. Johnny Maverick wears Rebel. It goes live tomorrow. They're using all of your content. The image you selected, the behind-the-scenes videos, everything. Your check is in the mail. My check? A little bonus to show J.M. Holdings' appreciation. Johnny, I admonish. I know we're married, but I'm not sure I'll ever get used to his money being our money. If you're opposed to buying something for yourself, then use it to come see me next weekend. Invite the whole gang. And there it is. I'd wager just about anything that when that check arrives, it'll be for the exact amount to fly me and all our friends to Minnesota. I love you. Love you too, babe. I'll call you as soon as I get home. Be naked. And that's how the first few months apart go. We talk every day. I cheer him on from afar, and in the Wildcats arena that I spent so much time at this summer, I hang out with my friends, Work at the Hall of Fame, study, and count down the minutes between every visit and call. On a crisp fall weekend, Johnny has two days off, and we travel to Kansas together. 
The ceremony is held during halftime of the homecoming game. Dad and Johnny watch from the sidelines. I'm nervous as I walk out onto the football field with the other former athletes being inducted into the school's Hall of Fame. Mr. Hote, my old track coach, is probably here somewhere in the stands, but I specifically requested that he not be the one to give me the award. I keep my eyes trained on Johnny and my father, standing and clapping. They both look so proud. It's a silly award, but it means everything that they're here. Maybe life is less about accepting the award and more about the people who are there for you when you receive it. It's over in minutes, and it feels a little childish that I waited all these years to come back. Do you want to stay for the rest of the game? Dad asks me when I make my way back to our seats. No, I think I'm good. Thank you both for coming. Dad hugs me tight against his chest. Your mother would be so proud. Johnny takes my hand as we walk out to the truck. Dakota! I turn at my name and find Coach Hote jogging after us. He really is a handsome guy. Age has been kind to him. His hair is a dusty blonde, and his blue eyes are bright, only the faintest wrinkles giving away he's now in his forties. Coach, I say, squeezing Johnny's hand tighter. My husband takes a step, so he's standing in front of me. I avoid looking at my dad. If he knew that this man, a man that used to frequently pick me up and drop me off at home, tried to have sex with me, he'd kill him and maybe me for keeping it from him. Coach Hote must understand the situation isn't altogether friendly. He holds up both hands. I just wanted to offer my congratulations. You were a great runner. I was sad to hear you gave it up. I hope it wasn't because of our misunderstanding. He looks to my dad. Sometimes crushes like this happen. The teenage years can be very confusing for kids, especially girls. His gaze sweeps back over me, and I'm frozen. Oh. My. God. Is he trying to play this off like I was crushing on him, and he turned me down? I'm so angry, I can't breathe. You look good. How long are you in town? Maybe we could catch up. Johnny's hold is a vise, and I squeeze back equally as tight to keep him at my side, I do not need him to get in a fight and get suspended or fined. You son of a bitch. Dad takes a step and throws a punch that none of us see coming, least of all Coach Hote. He winces and shakes his hand. Stay away from my family or I'll borrow my new son's hockey stick and let him show me how to use it on your kidneys. Coach wipes at the corner of his mouth where his lip is split. I'm speechless as I stare at my dad. Holy shit! Johnny tugs me away, and dad wraps his arm around my shoulders as if nothing happened. Who wants pizza? Epilogue. Johnny. On a beautiful July weekend, I throw a party. A very big, very over-the-top party, Mr. and Mrs. Maverick style. You have really outdone yourself this time, Heath says, sitting next to me at a table covered in white linens and colorful floral arrangements. So many floral arrangements. Roses in every color. Candles, fairy lights, music, dancing food, and a four-tier cake. All of it for her. Dakota meets my gaze from the dance floor. She and the girls are in a circle moving to the beat, and belting out the lyrics. I can't hear her from here, but I feel the place she's belting it out from. Bliss. Home. I found my person. One year after our Vegas wedding, we're celebrating our anniversary with a wedding I should have given her the first time. I have regrets, but it's hard to add that one to the list. Still, I wouldn't be me if I didn't try to give her everything she missed out on. What about you and Ginny? I asked my buddy. You buy a ring yet? Without your help? He laughs and tips back the beer in his hand. After he's drained it, he stands. Soon. I just want to finish school first and get my signing bonus so I can buy a huge diamond. 
He moves his hands apart wider than his body. Without warning, Ginny throws herself between his arms and wraps her arms around his chest. Come dance with me. He tosses his empty bottle and sweeps her off her feet. Great idea, baby doll. I find Adam and Rhett standing shoulder to shoulder on the edge of the dance floor, watching their girls. Gentlemen, I say, stepping between them. The man of the night. Adam holds up his drink. Congratulations. Thank you, I appreciate you guys coming. Are you kidding? We wouldn't miss it. Red rocks back on his heels. Who would have thought you'd be the first to get married? What can I say? I'm more worldly and mature than the rest of you fools. I bust up laughing. Yeah, that isn't it. I'm a lucky guy. Got the girl, got great friends, and I look damn good in a tux. You clean up nice, Rhett confirms. You'll have another chance to wear it next month. Can't wait, I say. He and Sienna are up next. They're getting married in a church in Sienna's hometown. It's the summer of love, the second of many. I might just keep right on throwing an anniversary party every year. I'm going in. Meet you guys in five like we planned? I don't wait for an answer. I know they've got my back before I move toward my wife. Now that she's graduated and moved to Minnesota, I see her every day. I wake up with her, come home to her, and still she takes my breath away. Wifey, I say as I circle an arm around her waist and pull her to me. She's wearing a white dress and the chucks I bought her. Yes, handsome husband of mine? I have a surprise for you. Her eyes light up with excitement and humor. Of course you do. I lead her away from the dance floor. Her hand takes mine and I interlace our fingers. Because the car and the jewelry and... I silence her with a kiss. Her sweet laughter spills into my mouth. Okay, so I bought a few things for our anniversary. Sue me. I'd like to spoil my girl. This one is different. Some of my teammates are hanging outside of the tent with their dates. Jack juts his chin as we approach. Congratulations. Thanks, man. Declan shakes my hand and then hugs Dakota. Leo, Ash, and Tyler offer fist bumps. Quinn and Reese made it too. Together. That's a pair I didn't see coming. We'll be back, guys. I squeeze Dakota's hand. Enjoy the booze. Inside our house, yeah, that's right, we're homeowners. I pause in the entryway and kiss my wife. We bought a place not far from Jack's. I can walk to half my teammates' houses. Johnny Maverick, did you pull me away from our party to have sex? Is the surprise your penis because I've seen it? She leans in and lowers her voice. A lot. Baby, my dick is always a gift, but no. I tug her into the office on the first floor. We just moved in last week and have a few projects going to make this our dream home. Dakota wanted a workout room in a killer kitchen. And I wanted, nay, needed, a living room to hold the biggest TV you can buy and enough seats for all my friends and teammates. And one more thing. On the bookcase, there's a framed picture of Coda and me from one night years ago at Valley playing sardines. I push on the back of the shelf directly behind the picture, and the entire bookcase moves. Dakota jumps back as it swings open, revealing the secret room behind it. Johnny, she gasps, walking in slowly. I follow her, raise my hands and look at her through a window I make with my thumbs and pointer fingers. Perfect. This is incredible. She turns in a circle with a grin that makes it all worth it. We finally have the best hiding spot. Got about five minutes before they start looking for us. You did this for a silly game? Nothing silly about it, I say. A lot of great memories from the nights I spent hiding in the dark with you. She wraps her arms around my neck. And a lot more to come. Thank you for listening to Wild Love, Campus Nights Book 4. Written by Rebecca Jenshack. Narrated by Connor Crace and SAG AFTRA member Elizabeth Louise. Produced by One Night Stand Studios. Post production by Demetra Hardavella. Text copyright 2021 by Rebecca Jenshack. Production copyright 2023 by Rebecca Jenshack. All rights reserved. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.